Squash matches are supposed to be a standard piece of business. Over and done with before you really have time to even think about them, they're not necessarily designed to live long in the memory. There have been thousands of televised squash matches over the years, and the vast majority of them are innocuous. <laughs> not these bad boys, though. Whether it was due to the participants, the content of the match itself, or the result, the following bouts may have been short, but they sure were spectacular in their own way. I'm Adam Pacizzi from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 infamous pro wrestling squash matches. Join us! Number 10. Rick Rude vs. Mark Starr Right near the top of my list of wrestlers I would try to avoid pissing off at all costs sits Rick Rude. Big, ripped, mean, and with one of the most impressive moustaches in the game, Ravishing Rick was a feared man in any locker room. Now, I'm not entirely sure just what English journeyman Mark Starr did to irk Rude before they clashed in a WCW International World Heavyweight title match at the April 21st, 1993 Saturday Night Time tapings, but something was clearly off from the start. Rude stared down his opponent and then proceeded to beat the ever-loving jobber out of him with brutal clotheslines and a rib-shattering punt to the midsection after Starr made the mistake of catching the champ's kick and forcing him to hop around on one foot. Starr made another mistake when he attempted to fire back with slaps, earning him a straight punch to the jaw for his troubles. In some ways, it was totally routine as Rude got the win within four minutes, but watching it back, there is clearly something amiss. In Interestingly, this was Rude's second last match ever, as he suffered a career-ending back injury in Japan just a couple of weeks later. Number 9. David Sammartino vs Ron Shaw David Sammartino might not have been close to the star his legendary father Bruno was, but you would still expect him to beat the lowly Ron Shaw, wouldn't you? Well, Ron Shaw certainly did when the two met at the Philadelphia Spectrum on November 22nd, 1985, as did WWE management. Sam Martino had different ideas, though, and decided to throw a spanner in the works by having his opponent go over instead. Rather than win as scheduled, he first tried to lose by pinfall, only for Shaw to pull him off the mat at the last second, which the commentators covered for by claiming that he was being arrogant. But when Ron put him in a bear hug, the son of the living legend very quickly and very clearly submitted. Cue a lot of confusion on the part of Shaw, the referee, ring announcer Mel Phillips, and announcer Gorilla Monsoon. Years later, David would admit to throwing the match as a way to stick it to Vince McMahon, who he felt was arrogant and playing politics with his career. Well, all I can say is you sure showed him, mate. I don't think Vince was ever quite the same after you lost to Ron Shaw. Number 8. Daniel Bryan vs Sheamus Daniel Bryan and Sheamus had to have been disappointed that their United States title lumberjack match was shunted onto the WrestleMania 27 pre-show. Even more disappointingly, they were only given a shade over four minutes, and it ended in a no contest. Thankfully, they would be given the opportunity to run it back a year later on the main card, with the 2012 Royal Rumble winner Sheamus challenging for Bryan's World Heavyweight title. But rather than the pace-setting banger of an opener that we were all expecting, D. Bryan instead dropped the gold to the Celtic Warrior in just mere seconds courtesy of a single brogue kick. Well, and a kiss from AJ Lee. Good news for myself, having always harboured the belief that kissing always leads to nothing but trouble, but bad news for Daniel Bryan, whose first world title reign ended in controversy. It did get people talking, and it could be argued was the spark that led to the groundswell of support that birthed the Yes movement, but at the time it was a seriously contentious decision, and it remains an infamous squash match. Number 7. Big Van Vader vs Antonio Inoki New Japan Pro Wrestling founder Antonio Inoki wasn't wasn't just a star, he was an icon and a cultural institution. One of his country's most cherished wrestlers, Inoki rarely, if ever, lost. If he did, you can bet your massive chin he didn't go down without a fight or due to some serious shenanigans. Well, he certainly had a fight on his hands when he met a debuting Big Van Vader on December 12, 1987. Inoki had just beaten Ricky Choshu by disqualification in a short but feisty match when he was challenged by the Mastodon. The big man proceeded to completely swallow him up, ending Inoki's long winning streak by pinning him for the first time in years after a completely one-sided match in a paltry 2 minutes and 49 seconds. 
Disbelief turned to anger when Vader continued his assault after the bell had sounded and the Japanese fans rioted in protest. It took police an hour to calm the situation down and Sumo Hall subsequently banned New Japan from running the building for close to two years. On the plus side, the convincing victory established Vader as a major star from the get-go and he would go on to be a money-spinning draw for the promotion for years to come. Number 6. Brock Lesnar vs Zack Gowan Zack Gowan was overmatched by, well, every member of the WWE roster during his short, improbable stay in the company. One-legged and undersized, Gowan nonetheless managed to pull off some miraculous upsets during his brief time in the promotion. And then he ran into Brock Lesnar. Or rather, Brock Lesnar ran into, well, almost through him when the vindictive Vince McMahon booked poor Zack against the next big thing on the August 21st, 2003 episode of SmackDown. Brock had freshly turned heel and was due to clash with WWE Champion Kurt Angle at SummerSlam just a few days later, so WWE knew that they had to put over the challenger strong. Wrestling in his hometown and with his mother at ringside, Gowan was like a lamb to the slaughter and took a savage beating that included one of the most brutal chair shots in WWE history. The way Zack was manhandled and left in a bloody heap on the floor was too uncomfortable for some who felt that Lesnar had crossed a line. Ironically, Brock actually lost the match by disqualification. I mean, sure, Gowan had his remaining leg broken in two pieces, but he got the moral victory, didn't he? Number 5. Goldberg vs Brock Lesnar It is no surprise to see Brock Lesnar steamrolling through anyone given his explosiveness and legitimacy. As well as the fact that, you know, he isn't exactly paid by the hour. However, it is altogether more jarring to see someone else dominate him. When it was announced that Goldberg would be returning to face Lesnar at the 2016 Survivor Series, it was hard to know what to expect. After all, the two had stunk out the joint at WrestleMania 20 over 12 years earlier in what was assumed at the time to be Demand's last WWE match. Would they now try to go out and have the epic encounter they failed to deliver on the grandest stage all those years ago? Eh, not quite. One shove, two spears and a jackhammer later and the former WCW heavyweight champion had knocked off his old rival in 86 exhilarating seconds. It was awesome, yes, but also came out of absolutely nowhere and was an unprecedented loss for the Beast Incarnate who had been protected and definitively beaten everyone over the course of the preceding two and a half years. Number 4. The Skyscrapers vs Avalanche and Mike Blackwell If you were a jobber back in the day, you turned up, you got beaten by the real stars, and then you went on to the next one, if you were lucky enough to be invited back, that is. No questions asked, no ambiguities. Sounds simple enough, but the quality of the job guys fluctuated massively, from the very good to the downright incompetent. Like Mike Blackwell, the man who decided to no-sell the offense of, let me just check my notes here, Sid Vicious and Dan Spivey. Despite being half the size of both members of the skyscrapers, Blackwell thought it would be in his best interest to shrug off their moves and strikes and bounce back to his feet the second he hit the mat. It was not in his best interests. Taking matters into their own hands, Sid and Dan decided to give him a legitimate kicking after they finally managed to get him down long enough to win the match. Spivey, in particular, seemed to relish throwing a couple of live rounds at the uncooperative Blackwell, who, it should be noted, promptly disappeared off the face of the earth. Now, I'm not suggesting that the skyscrapers killed him or anything, but our man Dan did cryptically say things got worse for Blackwell when he got backstage. Number 3. The Ultimate Warrior vs Triple H Feeling the heat as WCW gained ground in the Monday Night Wars, WWE called upon one of their biggest and most problematic stars from the past in the run-up to WrestleMania 12. The Ultimate Warrior had twice left WWE in acrimonious circumstances before, but there was a war going on, damn it, and star power was required to fend off that evil billionaire Ted Turner. Or something like that, anyway. Making his grand return after almost four years away, Warrior certainly looked the part and, true to form, completely brushed past a hot young prospect named Hunter Hearst Helmsley, putting him away in a minute and 39 seconds. This ruffled a few feathers, since Triple H was clearly super talented and Jim Helwig had supposedly put the kibosh on any suggestion that the two have a more competitive match. As far as he was concerned, the match was all about him and his return, so why not completely shrug off a 
pedigree and then triumph with minimal effort, eh? The game's seething likely didn't subside when the Warrior WWE relationship predictably soured just a couple of months later. Number two, The Rockers vs. The Genius and Chuck Austin. It's amazing to think now, but decades ago, it was not uncommon for barely trained wannabe grapplers to wrestle on global television. WWE needed a constant supply of warm bodies for their stars to squash, and they often were not properly vetted and their inexperience went unquestioned. That was the case for Chuck Austin, just six months into his training when he somehow convinced WWE officials to let him perform at their television tapings in Tampa, Florida on December 11th, 1990. Tagging with Lanny the Genius Poffo against the Rockers, Chuck was, in theory, in great hands with three experienced pros around him. However, Austin took Marty Jannetty's rocker dropper finisher incorrectly, spiking himself headfirst into the mat. Paralyzed upon impact, Chuck Austin ended up suing WWE parent company Titan Sports and was ultimately awarded $10 million from them and $1.5 million from Jannetty. Following Chuck's accident, which has left him living in significant pain and means that he has to use a wheelchair, WWE changed their policy and only hired jobbers with a proven track record or significant in-ring experience. The tag match never aired on television, by the way, though clips of it were used in news broadcasts about the incident. Number 1. Perry Saturn vs. Mike Bell Mike Bell was a name familiar to those within WWE, having wrestled dozens upon dozens of squash matches for the company from 1992 all the way up until 2003. In that time, Bell stared at the ceiling for everyone from Bret Hart and Lex Luger to Bob Holly and Mabel. The most notable match of Mike's career, however, was with Perry Saturn at the May 7th, 2001 Jacked taping. Big Pez got his bell rung during an early experience exchange and, according to him, entered fight-or-flight mode and began shooting on his opponent before forcefully chucking him through the ropes to the floor. It was an ugly landing for Bell, but it gave Saturn a minute to get his bearings. After the former European champion got the last of his aggression out by chucking poor Mike into the stairs, they finished the match as planned. Saturn was reprimanded as soon as he returned through the curtain and was subsequently given the amnesiac gimmick and moppy storyline as punishment. You're welcome. There are many different ways to win a pro wrestling championship belt. Pinfall, submission, knockout, climbing a ladder, putting someone through a table. All worthy methods of picking up the gold, I'm sure you'll agree. Not these methods though, these ones suck a big fat one. Wrestling history is full of performers capturing titles in rotten ways and we are here to celebrate the very best of the very worst. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling and these are the 10 lamest ways wrestlers won championships. Join us. Number 10, winning a fictional tournament. We are starting this list with literally the oldest trick in WWE's book. When Vince McMahon Sr. and Toots Mond broke away from the National Wrestling Alliance in 1963, they needed a champion to represent their new promotion. Their choice was Buddy Rogers, the former NWA champ, but just how were the company going to get their belt onto him? With an actual tournament? No, stupid, with a made up one, of course. Rogers was crowned the first ever WWWF champion, as it was known at the time, by beating Antonino Rocker in the finals of a fictional tournament in Rio de Janeiro. Why Rio? Who knows, maybe the promoters thought it was far enough away that nobody would question it? 16 years later, WWE pulled this stunt again when Pat Patterson won another fake tournament in Rio to become the first ever intercontinental champion. At least this time there was the pretense that he had unified the existing North American title with the fictional South American one? These fake brackets are now heavily ingrained in WWE's mythos, but that doesn't change the fact that neither of these men actually beat anyone to win their respective belts. Number 9. Pinning Vince McMahon On the September 16th, 1999 episode of SmackDown, Vince McMahon beat Triple H to become world champion of his own promotion. And people say Vince has an ego problem. McMahon vacated the belt just four days later, meaning that he was never pinned to lose the championship. Weirdly enough though, he was pinned to lose somebody else that same title the following year. King of the Ring 2000 was headlined by a six-man tag pitting WWE Champion Triple H and Vincent Shane McMahon against The Rock and the Brothers of Destruction. The rule was that whoever got the pin for the babyface side would become champion, no matter which of their opponents they beat. 
Sounds a tad unfair, but whatever. Vince, who was about two months away from his 55th birthday, was correctly identified as the weakest link in this match. The chairman foolishly went for his own version of the people's elbow, but was scooped up by the great one and planted with a rock bottom for the one, two, three. Congratulations, Rock. You won the belt by pinning a middle-aged non-wrestler. Bet you feel great about yourself. Number 8. Pinning Eric Bischoff Just a couple of months before The Rock pinned Vince McMahon to win the WWE title, fading rival promotion WCW pulled a similar stunt with their version of the genetic jackhammer. On the April 25th, 2000 edition of Thunder, a tag team match was scheduled where whoever got the winning pinfall would become the WCW World Heavyweight Champion. In one corner was former champion Jeff Jarrett and WCW bigwig Eric Bischoff. In the other was reigning champion Diamond Dallas Page and his partner... Oh no, not him. Not David Arquette. The star of Scream had been pulled into WCW's orbit through the cinematic masterpiece that was Ready to Rumble. Arquette's character in that film gets covered with raw sewage, which is still a hundred times better than what went down on Thunder. After some typical WCW nonsense, Arquette pinned Bischoff at the same time as Jarrett pinned DDP. The referee then had to crawl all past Jarrett to count the three for the film star who was your new WCW champion. What makes this even worse is that Paige then celebrated with Arquette, despite the fact that he had just lost the world title. Sometimes I miss WCW, sometimes I'm glad they're dead. Number 7. Hot Potato with a Pensioner Hot Potato with a Pensioner sounds like the title on a very specific kind of website. No kink shaming from me, you do you, pal. What we're referring to is that time in 1999 when actually good wrestler Ivory lost her WWE Women's Championship to the 76-year-old old fabulous moolah. And no mercy 1999, the old biddy pulled off the upset of the century by pinning Ivory in a title match. I use the word upset because that's what everybody was after the bell had rung. Moolah, who was born in the same month that the Hollywood sign was erected, had been a star back in her day, but this was far from her day. She held the belt for just over a week before Ivory won it back on Raw. Honestly, Ivory was a fantastic wrestler who was way ahead of her time. Unfortunately, though, that was apparently a massive disadvantage as she was stuck doing bollocks like this when she should have been stealing the show like the female workers of today. Did she gain anything at all by beating a woman old enough to be her grandma? No, no she didn't. No wonder she joined Right to Censor the following year. Number 6. Finding it in a bag WrestleMania 15, Shane McMahon vs X-Pac for the European Championship The DX member looks like he's about to dethrone Shane when Triple H does the unthinkable and turns on his little pal. The shock, the horror, the betrayal. After narrowly escaping with the belt, Shane O'Mac decided that he wanted to retire it as undefeated champion. And that was the end for the European title, until about three months later. On the June 21st, 1999 edition of Raw, Midian of the corporate ministry misplaced his belt. Thank God he wasn't naked Midian by this point, otherwise we all know where this would have ended up. He asked his boss Shane if he could borrow a belt that he had found in his bag, which the young McMahon agreed to. That belt would just so happen to be the reactivated European Championship. Midian actually held the gold for a month before dropping it to D'Lo Brown at the fully loaded pay-per-view. I'm sure D'Lo loved that he'd just won a belt off a guy who found it by mistake. Ah oh, well, at least the belt wasn't in the trash or anything like that. No company could possibly be that stupid. Number 5. Finding it in a bin And we're back to WCW. The WCW World Television Championship could trace its roots back to the NWA way in the early 1970s. It was held by some of the greatest performers of all time, including Steve Austin, Ricky Steamboat, Rowdy Roddy Piper, Dusty Rhodes, and Ric Flair. Scott Hall won the belt off Rick Steiner at Mayhem 1999 when, eight days later, he decided that he was bored with this historic championship and so gave it to Kevin Nash, who promptly chucked it in the bin. Then, in February of 2000, Hacksaw Jim Duggan was going through a dumpster, don't ask, when he found the title and decided decided to keep it. Let's break this down. Nash binned the belt in Denver, Colorado, whilst Duggan found it in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Those two cities are 1,731 miles apart, so how the hell did that happen? 
The way in which Duggan lost the belt also sucked, as he was stripped of the title during the Great Champion reset brought about by Eric Bischoff and Vince Russo. The title was promptly forgotten about, never to be seen on TV ever again. Number 4. Picking it out of a random box Every so often, a new wrestling stipulation comes around that changes the way the sport operates forever. The Lockbox 8 Knockout Elimination Tag Team match was not one of them. On the April 5th, 2010 episode of TNA Impact, eight women squared off in a, shall we say, unique match type. If you eliminated someone, then they would have to leave the ring, but so would you. Right. The four women who scored elimination would be granted a key. Each key corresponded to a mysterious box, one of which had the Knockouts Championship inside. Not only did you not have to be on the winning team to win this match, but you could also be a winner and still not become champion? Right. The four survivors were current champion Tara, Angelina Love, Velvet Sky, and Daphne. Sky won a contract for a match of her choice, Daphne won the opportunity to do a strip tease, and Tara was thrilled when she found out her box contained her missing tarantula. But wait, that means she's just lost the title. What is going on? Love's crate was the one with the belt in it, meaning that she was the new champ. Unfortunately for her, nobody really cared anymore. Number three, having your dress removed. Wrestlers removing each other's clothes to win a match is a time-honored tradition. We've seen it with tuxedos, with bras and panties, and with whatever the hell Patterson and Briscoe were wearing in their hardcore evening gown match. I guess they were evening gowns, but still. Ugh. WWE decided to change this formula up for the May 10th episode of Raw in 1999. Although they didn't tell anybody beforehand that that was what they were going to do. Deborah was facing Sable for the latter's women's championship in an evening gown match. After a few seconds of action, Sable ripped off her opponent's dress and successfully retained her title. Or did she? Out came Shawn Michaels, who was WWE commissioner at the time. He announced that, in his eyes, it was the woman who had her dress taken off that was the actual winner. He then announced Deborah as the new women's champion. Remember, dear viewers, if you want to be a champion, you could work hard and give it your all, or you could just look good in a set of skin piece. That's the moral here. Number two, getting kicked in the nuts. He may seem pretty chill these days, but there was a time where Randy Orton was a very angry snake. Orton often struggled to control his temper both behind the scenes and on camera. You only have to ask Kofi Kingston about that. The Viper's anger management issues were woven into his character and played an important role in several of his high-profile feuds, including when he was battling Christian over the World Heavyweight Championship in 2011. The Apex Predator had beaten Christian mere days after he won the title in the wake of Edge's retirement. This led to a match between the two at Money in the Bank, with the stipulation that if Randy got too angry and got disqualified, then Christian would become the champion. And guess what happened? Captain Charisma wound Orton up so much that he flew completely off the rails. After Christian spat in his face, the champion punted his opponent right in the knackers to lose the match and the title via DQ. Christian Cage, an absolutely excellent, highly decorated wrestler, won his final world title in WWE by getting kicked in the plums. Wow. Number 1. A Present From Eric Bischoff When WWE unified their world title with WCWs in 2001, they created one undisputed championship that would float between both Raw and SmackDown. That was, of course, until Brock Lesnar took the belt to the blue brand and refused to give it back. This left Raw GM Eric Bischoff in quite the pickle. He needed a new belt and he needed it fast. Luckily, he remembered he had one sitting in his attic. On September 2nd, 2002, Bischoff reintroduced the world to the big gold belt. This beautiful piece of history would now be called the World Heavyweight Championship and be exclusive to Monday nights. So how would the first ever champion be crowned? A grueling tournament? A mammoth Iron Man match? A hot dog eating contest? Nah, let's just give it a Triple H and be done with it. In a shocking move, Bischoff just went, here you go, and handed the game the belt. He didn't have to do anything and he was the new world champion. How is that fair? We know wrestling is scripted, but you could have at least put some effort in, guys. Hell, a fake tournament in Rio de Janeiro would have sufficed. As Della Sol once said, three is the magic number. All the best things come in threes. Primary colors, stooges, tweenies. Look, I'm sorry, but I refuse to acknowledge that snake fizz. She knows what she did. Wrestling is no exception to this rule, as some of the best stables and groups in history have been made up of just three members. In this list, we will be running 
down the greatest trios to ever set foot in the squared circle. I'm Adam, Adam, and Adam from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 greatest three-man teams in wrestling history. Join us. Number 10, Too Cool. Being great isn't just about winning, it's about being beloved and entertaining. The combination of Scotty Too Hotty, Grandmaster Sexay, and Rikishi were far from successful in terms of big matches and championships won. However, when it came to making people happy in the Attitude Era, there were few better. Scott Taylor and Brian Christopher had been teaming for a while before the so-called newcomer Rikishi Fatu joined them in late 1999. Of course, the big man had actually been there for years under various different gimmicks, but when has WWE ever let the truth get in the way of a good story? Their fun-loving antics and dance routines got seriously over with Attitude Era fans to the point where they were on most pay-per-views in 2000 in one form or another. Whether it be teaming with The Rock and Mick Foley on Raw or dancing together in the Royal Rumble, Too Cool always delighted their fans, and we think that's great in its own right. Number 9. Team Angle in terms of presentation and technical acumen, you really couldn't get much more different than Too Cool and Team Angle. In December 2002, WWE Champion Kurt Angle was given a holiday gift by his friend Paul Heyman. Rather than a pair of novelty socks or another Lynx gift set, Heyman's present was two strapping young lads from OVW. Charlie Haas and Shelton Benjamin were now at Angle's disposal. Both fit the champ's vibe perfectly as they were acclaimed amateur wrestlers with a penchant for snazzy singlets. Haas and Benjamin quickly established themselves on SmackDown by winning the brand's tag team titles just weeks into their run. Now, the stable known as Team Angle had all the gold and all the power. Though they weren't together as long as many others on this list, the group made quite the impact. Not only did they win all the belts, but they established themselves as an elite wrestling unit who could beat anyone on their best day. Plus, they were a million times better than when Angle was running with Luther Reigns and Mark Jindrak in 2004. Number 8, The NWO At WCW's Bash at the Beach 1996 pay-per-view, something happened that changed the wrestling world forever. The Nasty Boys beat Public Enemy in a double dog collar match. Oh, and Hulk Hogan turned heel as well, I suppose. In the main event, Scott Hall and Kevin Nash revealed that their mysterious third man was actually the Hulkster who had turned his back on the fans for the first time in years. As the New World Order, or the New World Organization as Hulk incorrectly called them, this group of ex-WWE lads were ready to run riot throughout the company and take the wrestling business by storm. But wait, how often did they actually compete as a trio? Once! And that was in WWE? So what the hell are they doing on here then, Adam, you ask? Well, they are here because that moment at Bash at the Beach did more for wrestling than any match ever could. The sight of these three in the ring together, garbage raining down on them is one of the greatest wrestling images ever and it set in motion some of the most important events in the history of the industry. So there! Number 7, The Wyatt Family Though they went through many different incarnations over the years, we are focusing on the original three members of Bray Wyatt's Wacky Backwoods Cult. Formed in NXT, Wyatt, Eric Rowan and Luke Harper, aka Brody Lee, made their presence known on the main roster by targeting Kane. And also through a shonky in Inferno-style match at SummerSlam, but we will move swiftly on from that. As a unit, this terrible trio was quite the sight. Three giant hairy men slowly advancing toward you in the pitch black is enough to make anyone soil themselves in fear, and this unique presentation won them legions of fans. The group broke up, came back together, and added more members as the years went on. Braun Strowman, Daniel Bryan, Randy Orton, no matter who came and went, it always came back to the three originals. The the fact that we will never see a full-on Wyatt's reunion is truly heartbreaking, but they left behind a slew of great memories that fans will cherish forever. In particular, a series of matches with another group who will be on this list just a little later. Number 6, The Bloodline Though it would expand to include Solo Sokoa and that red-headed traitor Sami Zayn, the original incarnation of The Bloodline was just Roman Reigns and The Usos. This trio of Anawahi family members first came together on screen in 2015 when Reigns was still the world's least popular good guy. They were a part of his storyline struggles against the authorities.
authority and later his feud with AJ Styles as a counter to Luke Gallows and Carl Anderson. But it was in 2020 when things started to get juicy, or should that be oozy? After a series of emotional matches with Reigns for the Universal Championship, Main Event Jay and the rebellious Jimmy finally acknowledged the Tribal Chief and stood by his side. With the Usos in his corner, Reigns was even more unstoppable than before. They have since been instrumental in keeping him at the top of the company, helping him win matches against the likes of Edge, Drew McIntyre, and Brock Lesnar. And let's not forget the brothers' record-breaking tag team title run as well, which has included epic matches against teams such as The New Day and The Street Profits. Number 5. Los Vianos You might think that a team whose name literally means the baddies would be kinda rubbish, but they are actually one of the greatest units in the history of Mexican wrestling. Famous luchador Rey Mendoza had five sons who all followed him into the business. Rather than try to make it on their own, the three eldest all banded together to form the evil group Los Vianos. So what did they call themselves? Viano 1, Viano 2, and Viano 3, of course. Because why waste time in coming up with complex names? As a unit, Los Vianos were feared and respected across Mexico. They were known for their despicable heel tactics and bloody battles, capturing tag team and trios championships as they went. And then they were later joined by their two younger brothers. Guess what they were called? If you guessed anything other than Viano 4 and Viano 5, then you clearly haven't been paying attention. From early success in CMLL to legendary clashes with Los Brazos and the Hawaiian Beasts in UWA, any combination of Los Vianos is a worthy inclusion on this list, as they were all trailblazers who are still remembered fondly to this day. Number 4. The Shield Dunna, 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 dun, dun. Sorry, but it's so bloody catchy, isn't it? At Survivor Series 2012, three handsome young men in dashing turtlenecks appeared at ringside to lay waste to Ryback. Seth Rollins, Dean Ambrose, Roman Reigns. The Shield had arrived on the WWE main roster. The trio stuck around for the better part of two years, trading in their comfy casual wear for riot vests. A wise choice, I think we can all agree. They went from CM Punk's lackeys to muscle for the authority to three of the most overstars in the entire company. It was The Shield who had those excellent matches with the Wyatt family we mentioned earlier, by the way, just in case you were still wondering. What is even more impressive is how successful each individual member has become since the group folded. All three went on to become WWE Champion, as well as splitting several other titles, Money in the Bank briefcases, and Royal Rumble wins between them. Roman Reigns is possibly the biggest star in modern wrestling today, while Rollins and Ambrose, now known as John Moxley, remain two of the most popular and important names in WWE and AEW, respectively. In terms of accolades, few groups have ever been this successful as a team and as singles competitors. Except 3MB, obviously. Two former WWE champions in there as well, so justice for 3MB. Number 3. The Von Eriks The Von Eriks were the very heartbeat of wrestling in the Texas area, headed up by Patriarch Fritz. His sons Kevin, Kerry, David, Mike and Chris all became wrestlers to varying degrees of success. WWE fans will probably be most familiar with Kerry as the Texas Tornado. The brothers won various different tag team championships in various different combinations, including six-man and trios titles. They are perhaps most fondly remembered for their legendary feuds across the South against the fabulous Freebirds, while Kerry achieved a great individual accolade by defeating Ric Flair for the NWA title in 1984. That said, any three-man combination of the legendary family was guaranteed to draw a huge crowd. They were essentially royalty in their prime, winning over fans with their all-American good looks and athleticism. Sadly, the story ends in tragedy for the family, as all but one of the brothers passed away at a young age, but their imprint on wrestling history still lives long in the memory. Number 2. The New Day When Xavier Woods recruited Big E and Kofi Kingston on the July 21st, 2014 episode of Raw, few could have predicted where it would lead. After starting out as a weird pseudo-gospel act preaching positivity, The New Day quickly became delusional heels. This act got so over that they turned babyface in 2016 and have remained monstrously popular fan favourites ever since. Their list of accolades together as a team is mouth-watering. NXT Tag Team Champions, 7-time SmackDown Tag Team Champions, 4-time Raw Tag Team Champions, including 
including the longest reign in that title's history. And let's not forget that they were there for each other when Kofi Kingston and Big E won the WWE Championship. You'll have your day soon enough, Woods. We believe in you. That the New Day have stayed together for so long in a company renowned for breaking up stables is a testament to just how popular the act is. It's also a testament to the real-life friendship between the three men and how genuinely pleased each member seems to be for the success of the others. I'm not crying, you're crying, damn it. Number one, the fabulous Freebirds. When you have your own rule named after you, you know you've made it in wrestling. In 1979, promoter Bill Watts paired Michael P.S. Hayes with Terry Bam Bam Gordy. They later added Buddy Jack Roberts to the group, despite his nickname being much worse than theirs, and the Freebirds were born. A three-man group was extremely unusual in wrestling at the time, but the Freebirds didn't just make it work, they changed the very business. Portraying themselves as ultra-flamboyant heels, the charismatic team drew massive heat across several territories. They worked for Mid-South Wrestling, Memphis Wrestling, and Georgia Championship Wrestling, before eventually winding up in world-class championship wrestling in Texas, home of the Von Erics. Their feud elevated both stables to iconic status and is still talked about to this very day. Members cycled in and out of the Freebirds, but the Hayes Gordy Roberts lineup is the most famous and beloved. For their innovation, their body of work, and their impeccable legacy, we reckon this fabulous trio is the greatest to ever do it. We might like to think of wrestlers as superhumans with no weaknesses, but they are just as vulnerable to being poorly as the rest of us. You can't put microbes in a headlock, although if science could one day make that happen, then I would be truly grateful. Sometimes a wrestler's immune system can get put down for the three count, and a star is forced to work a match whilst under the weather. We've rounded up 10 examples of some of the sickest wrestlers we could find, and we don't mean that in a cool young people speech kind of way. I'm the perfectly healthy Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 times wrestlers worked through an illness. Join us. Number 10, Bronson Reed on Raw. In a tale as old as David and Goliath themselves, some tiny germs very nearly felled a mountain of a man on this April 2023 episode of Raw. Bronson Reed was inexplicably cut from WWE in 2021 before Big Daddy Triple H put things right and brought him back around a year later. After languishing in limbo for a while, aka a storyline with The Miz, Reed got everyone's attention when he was booked in a match with Bobby Lashley on this show. Did somebody say big meaty men slapping meat? No, just me? All right then. Both men had a great showing, but some fans noticed that the Australian obelisk looked a little out of sorts. Reed later took to Twitter to confirm that he had been sick with the flu all week in the lead up to the match. Get used to hearing the word flu, by the way. Wrestlers can't seem to stop catching it. Even though he was under the weather, Reed still put on a great match. Good lad. Number 9, Britt Baker at Full Gear 2019 Full Gear 2019 was AEW's first pay-per-view after the launch of Dynamite and was home to many memorable moments for the company. Chris Jericho defeated Cody Rhodes to ensure that the American Nightmare could never challenge for the world title again, Kenny Omega and John Moxley battered each other in a brutal lights out match, and Ricky Morton did a goddamn Canadian destroyer at the age of 63. With all this going on, you could be forgiven for missing Dr. Britt Baker DMD taking on B Priestley on the kickoff show. The wrestling dentist got the win with the lockjaw, but she was actually fighting a war on two fronts in the match. Baker was also suffering with the flu when she fought Priestley, as she revealed on Twitter later on. I won't repeat what she called B because I'm very scared of what she will do to me if I do. Baker seemed to make a speedy recovery from the illness, which was great news for her and all of her patients. Number 8. Ryback on the $1 million Tough Enough before he was the big guy, before he was Skip Sheffield, and before he was routinely embarrassing himself on social media, Ryback made his first WWE-related appearance in 2004 as part of the Million Dollar Tough Enough. 
Under his birth name of Ryan Reeves, his actual legal first name is Ryback now, by the way, how mad is that? He was one of the eight contestants to make it through to the SmackDown portion of the reality contest. Despite having an impressive look and an appetite equivalent to that of a small hippos, he was ultimately unsuccessful and the competition was eventually won by Daniel Puder. Although, considering what happened to him, maybe Ryback got lucky. One thing that certainly wasn't lucky was what happened to the Goldberg lookalike during the first week of training for the show. Reeves not only suffered a groin injury whilst preparing for his big moment, but he also developed a case of bronchitis. Goodness me, that is a big one. Luckily, the future Nexus member was able to take the disease down with a shell shock and carry on in the competition. Clearly, feed me more in this instance applied to antibiotics and lemon tea. Number 7. Drew McIntyre at Crown Jewel 2022 Crown Jewel 2022 will go down in history as the show where, in kayfabe, Logan Paul almost ended Roman Reigns' world championship reign. Imagine pitching that to a wrestling fan five or six years ago. Other matches on this Saudi Arabia showcase included Braun Strowman vs. Omos, Bianca Belair vs. Bayley, and a steel cage encounter between Karrion Cross and Drew McIntyre. The two former NXT champions had been beefing ever since Cross returned to the promotion as yet another Triple H rehire. This was only Cross's second pay-per-view bout since coming back, so most of the focus was on him. Thankfully, this meant that nobody really noticed that McIntyre was as sick as a dog during the entire thing. According to a report from PW Insider, McIntyre had been extremely sick in the lead-up to this match and even had to miss some of the run-throughs of it because he was so unwell. However, because Scottish people are made of gravel and solidified iron brew, McIntyre soldiered on and completed the match. Honestly, we are very grateful that Drew pulled out all the stops to make this happen and get the definitive win, otherwise we might have been subject to this feud for even longer. Number 6. Bray Wyatt in a Raw Dark Match There is some ambiguity surrounding this one, but what we can say for certain is that something was up with the Eater of Worlds during this dark match after an episode of Raw. After Raw went off the air on February 16th, 2015, Wyatt took on John Cena in a special match just for the live crowd. The cult leader also had a surprise in store for those in attendance, although it wasn't a particularly pleasant one. As seen in fan footage of the incident, Wyatt hit Cena with a move before pausing to sell. Selling then turned to panic as he quickly rolled out of the ring to vomit down at ringside. Apologies to anyone eating their dinner whilst watching this. Despite blowing chunks just a few seconds prior, again apologies, Wyatt then got back into the ring to finish off the match. Considering there wasn't even being televised, nobody would have blamed the third generation star for getting the contest called off. I guess it's a testament to the tenacity of wrestlers or the toxic culture of the business that encourages performers to continue performing even in the face of serious injury or illness. Or maybe he just ate some bad tacos. You decide. Number 5. Bret Hart at SummerSlam 1993 It was often said that at his peak, Bret Hart could have gotten a great match out of anyone. But could he have put on two back-to-back -back matches on a pay-per-view while suffering a serious bout of the lurgy? Well, yeah, that's exactly what he did at SummerSlam 93. Hart, who was suffering with that damn flu at the time, was supposed to take on Jerry the King Lawler at the event after suffering months of tormenting at the hands of the heel. Lawler had other ideas, though, coming down to the ring on crutches and making his court jester doink fight Brett instead. The hitman put on a pretty decent nine minutes with the clown before Lawler thwacked him with his walking aid. This led to their scheduled match taking place and Hart wrestling another six minutes with his immune system in the sharpshooter. Number 4. Shawn Michaels at the 1997 Royal Rumble Never one to be outshone by his fiercest rival, Shawn Michaels also wrestled a match at a Big Four pay-per-view whilst out of sorts. The 1997 Royal Rumble was essentially built around the Heartbreak Kid. Michaels would be getting his World Championship rematch against the villainous Psycho Sid, and it would be going down in none other than his hometown of San Antonio, Texas. So, the perfect time for the showstopper to come down with a bug. Michaels confirmed in a 2022 interview that before this match, he was suffering with, you guessed it, the flu. 
The two-time Hall of Famer said that he was up all night prior to the event and it was the worst he had ever felt before a show. However, he then remembered that he was one of the most naturally gifted wrestlers of all time and put forth a customarily great performance anyway. What's really weird about this is that this match took place just a handful of months before Michael Jordan played his famous flu game in the NBA playoffs. Does this mean that Shawn Michaels and Michael Jordan are actually the same person? No, of course it doesn't. Why would it mean that? Number 3. CM Punk on Raw Anyone who has played the showcase mode in WWE 2K15 will know that the section covering John Cena and CM Punk's rivalry ends with a match on Raw in the build-up to WrestleMania 29. Punk had just lost the WWE Championship to The Rock, while Cena had won the Royal Rumble and was heading for a rematch with The Great One. This bout was set up to determine who Rocky's sole challenger for the event would be. The match was simply incredible, one of the best seen on Raw ever. Both men left it all in the ring, and the years of storyline animosity between the pair helped drive this emotional encounter. Punk even hit a rarely seen pile driver, as much to try and win the match as give Vince a heart attack in Gorilla. According to Jim Ross, Punk was really ill going into this match, worn down from extensive travel and yet another case of the flu. However, the straight edge superstar reached deep into his bag of tricks and pulled out yet another fight for the ages. Number 2. John Cena at WrestleMania 29 Skipping ahead to that Mania match now, and wouldn't you know it, John Cena is now the one combating an illness ahead of a big match. And before you start anything in the comments, no, Punk did not pass his illness onto Cena out of spite. Although that is probably something he would do, to be fair. Instead, the leader of the C Nation ate something funky in the week leading up to the big night, catching food poisoning just days out from his planned main event match. For most normal human beings, this would have been enough to keep you out of action and throw the entire show into a state of disarray. But remember, this is the guy who came back four months after tearing his muscle completely off the bone. You think a little case of the chunders was going to stop him? In true Super Cena fashion, Big Match John fought through the discomfort and defeated The Rock to win the title and avenge his loss from the previous year. Maybe next time stick to the boiled chicken and broccoli and lay off the petrol station hot dogs, John. Number 1. Stone Cold Steve Austin at WrestleMania 19 A decade before Cena was hunched over a toilet prior to his big Mania match, another generational icon was also in a bad way going into a match with The Rock. Stone Cold Steve Austin was set to face his arch-rival for the third and final time at the 19th edition of the Showcase of the Immortals. This excellent match almost never happened, though, because the Texas Rattlesnake had spent the previous night in a hospital bed. According to the man himself, Austin's heart had wigged out right before his big match. Wigged out is definitely the correct medical term here, right? Basically, Austin hadn't been looking after himself and his body was fighting back against his hedonistic lifestyle. However, in true Stone Cold spirit, the legendary wrestler discharged himself from hospital and made his way to the stadium. Austin was never cleared to compete against The Rock that night, and this match could have easily gone very, very wrong. Thankfully, though, it didn't, and ended up being the perfect swan song for the bionic redneck as a full-time performer. However, for the love of God, people, please listen to your doctor. You might be bald and like to flip people off and drink beer, but you are not Stone Cold Steve Austin. To be successful in WWE, or in the wrestling business in general for that matter, a performer must have an ego. Well, to some extent anyway. Ego doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing, but sometimes they can get out of control when a talent buys into their own hype, thinks they're above someone or above doing something, or starts acting in the interest of self-preservation to maintain their top-tier status. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 WWE stars whose ego Egos ran wild. Oh, no Hulk Hogan in here. It's just too easy. Join us. Number 10, Triple H. 
It's been over two decades since the peak of Triple H's infamous reign of terror, where the cerebral assassins seem to be perpetually in possession of either the WWE or World Heavyweight title belts and sledgehammered his way past everyone who got in his way. Often, literally, there were constant accusations that Hunter, as the son-in-law of Vince McMahon, used his clout to ensure that he was always in the prime position, regardless of whether there was a hot new act catching fire or fans were, you know, just sick to bloody death of seeing the game in the main event. And when you look at how strong he was booked and presented on WWE television, despite many believing it wasn't in the best interest of the company, including Pat Patterson, who temporarily quit WWE in late 2004, largely in protest at the seemingly never-ending push of Mr. Helmsley, it's hard not to see merit in those claims. Add in how he put an early kibosh on the love triangle with himself, Stephanie, and Kurt Angle, because he didn't believe his badass character would get cheated on, WWE making sure he didn't display weakness in video game still images, and countless other stories of politicking paints quite the picture, doesn't it? Number 9. Buff Bagwell the blink and you'll miss it WWE career seems generous of Buff Bagwell was a textbook case in how to lose friends, alienate people, and annoy the powers that be so badly that your chances of ever being rehired explode like a dodgy calf implant. Which we must never forget actually happened to Bagwell in 1995. One of WCW's biggest stars during the promotion's dying days, Buff came over to WWE for the ill-fated invasion, very much believing that he was still the stuff. That, in his mind, meant that he shouldn't have to report to company-mandated training sessions for the WCW crew to help them get used to WWE rings and shake off any ring rust. Bagwell started a fight with Shane Helms at one of the practices, then continued to endear himself to his new employers by turning up late for house shows, refusing to take any sort of blame for that disastrous Raw main event with Booker T, and the kicker of the whole thing, having his mother and former WCW Tag Team champion champion Judy call in sick on his behalf. Future endeavoured after a whopping eight days on the payroll, Bagwell to this day contends that the man in the mirror was not to blame for his own demise. Number 8. Sunny there were women wrestlers, managers, and valets before her, but Tammy Sunny Sitch was WWE's first female in the diva mold. Not bad for someone who was studying to be a plastic surgeon when she decided to follow her boyfriend Chris Candido into the business. Sunny managed Candido in WWE as well as other acts like the Smoking Guns, Farouk, and the Legion of Doom, but she was a star in her own right and often stole the attention away from the wrestlers she was seconding. AOL's most downloaded celebrity of 1996 was popular all right, and didn't she know it? According to just about everyone who was around her at the time, Sitch's opinion of herself got loftier and loftier with each passing week, and she became something of a nightmare to deal with backstage. This would have never happened if they didn't give her that best bun slammy, I swear. Her spiraling ego problem wasn't helped by substance abuse issues and a fierce jealousy of Sable, the new shiny toy who would herself develop quite the ego as time went on. More more of a prima donna than a body donna, Sonny's WWE exit was widely celebrated by colleagues who at one point decided to poop in her food as a means of humbling her. Number 7. CM Punk there is a school of thought that if a professional wrestler is to truly break into that elite upper tier, they need to fully believe that they are the character they portray. So when CM Punk confidently bellowed about being the best in the world, it's very likely that he properly meant it. Rob Van Dam certainly got that impression from the straight edge superstar anyway, and also recalled how Punk would call locker room meetings during their time working together on the rebooted ECW, despite the fact that Phil Brooks had only been on the main roster for a cup of Pepsi at that point. Punk has long been a man of principles and conviction, and has rarely, if ever, been willing to compromise his values for the business. Some see this as a virtue, while others see it as the so-called Second City Saint unjustly believing his own hype and taking himself too seriously. While Punk did put over his fair share of wrestlers in WWE, his list of enemies seems an awfully lot longer than his list of friends, and most of that is down to an abrasive personality and an allegedly inflated opinion of himself. And if you don't like that, come fight me, Phil. I'm also winless in the UFC. Number 6. Bret Hart 
Perhaps CM Punk was taking cues from one of his idols. Bret Hart didn't just boast about being the best in the world, though. Oh no, according to the Hitman, he was the best there is, best there was, and the best there ever will be. And you know something? Many would agree with him. A perfectionist who was intensely protective of his character, Brett rubbed some people the wrong way with how he, in their opinion, seemed to put his own interests above the interests of others. Hart took great pride in portraying a hero, especially in his native Canada, which led to, shall we say, a sticky situation at the 1997 Survivor Series? Brett's critics point to his refusal to drop the title to Shawn Michaels in Montreal as the perfect example of his selfishness and putting himself in front of the business. There's more than one side to that story, of course, but it's hard to deny that the excellence of execution is the president of his own fan club and knew just how special a talent he was. Number 5. China Don't treat me like a woman. Don't treat me like a man. Just treat me like I'm Stone Cold flipping Steve Austin, complete with comparative main event positioning and pay. Those were the demands of China not long before her acrimonious WWE exit in 2001. The ninth wonder of the world had gone from D-Generation X's silent bodyguard to a massive individual star, winning the Intercontinental title and gracing the cover of Playboy magazine during a whirlwind year. There's no doubting that Joni Law his alter ego was a draw with a large fan base, but she was not quite at the level of the biggest star in the industry, even if she herself believed that to be the case. According to then talent relations head Jim Ross, China demanded a seven figure downside guarantee to re sign with the company, while also expressing her disinterest in wrestling the other women on the roster and a preference for being in storylines with headline male talent. The uncomfortable working environment stemming from Triple H leaving her for Stephanie McMahon obviously did and help matters, but good old JR believed that China was asking much more than she was worth and ended negotiations. Number 4. Sable I alluded to it earlier when talking about Sunny, but sod it, let's take a look at the woman who basically took her place, shall we? Rina Mero was famously hired after dropping the jaws of everyone with Sway when she accompanied her husband Mark to his contract negotiation meeting. First acting as the valet of the wild man, Sable soon caught fire, went solo and became one of the hottest acts in the promotion during the burgeoning Attitude Era. A merchandise machine and rating sensation, Sable was made women's champion champion, scored the cover of Playboy magazine, and was one of the focal points of WWE TV for a time. And it all went to her head in spectacular fashion, leading to instances where Sable refused to drop the women's title, refused to take bumps in the few matches she would wrestle, and ended up dictating the way she did drop the title on her way out the company. Suing WWE for $110 million as she walked through the door, Rena Mero thought she had become the next Pamela Anderson in Hollywood, but soon realized that most of her mystique was created and preserved by the WWE machine. Number 3. Shane McMahon if you are the son of the owner of a billion dollar wrestling empire, you might easily assume it's your birthright to be able to do what you want, when you want to do it, backstage. Shane McMahon put that theory to the test at the 2022 Royal Rumble, when he showed up and used his influence to make himself look stronger than full-time talents by changing booking plans. His unprofessional and self-serving conduct infuriated the others involved with performing in and putting together the Rumble match, including eventual match winner, Brock Lesnar. He's top of my list of people I would try to avoid annoying, for what it's worth. Shano's antics got him exiled from WWE for over a year, but it wasn't the first time he's shown that, though his ego isn't quite as big as his father's, it's still suitably McMahon-sized. Just look at the way the man who was once crowned the best wrestler in the world has been scripted to look competitive with Kurt Angle, Olympic gold medalist, Kane, terrifying horror movie villain, Randy Orton, menacing psychopath, and a host of others, not to mention his penchant for performing spotlight hogging stunts on major shows. Number 2. Shawn Michaels I mean, how can a guy who thinks he's cute and knows he's sexy not have a very high opinion of himself? Shawn Michaels is undisputedly one of the absolute greatest in-ring performers of all time, a Hall of Famer who, even on his worst day, could drag the most limited sports entertainer to their best match ever, but he was also a self-admitted prick of the highest order. Insisting he win titles he was never scheduled to, telling the man who had just dropped the world title to him to get the flip out of the ring 
after a one-hour Iron Man match, deliberately overselling as a protest to losing a pay-per-view main event. Seriously, do we even have a time limit on this video? I could happily sit here all day and fire off every instance of the Heartbreak Kid making it all about the Heartbreak Kid. He may have mellowed a bit after his first retirement and finding Jesus and all that good stuff, but in his first run, Michaels was every bit the tyrant you've heard about. And then some. Number 1. The Ultimate Warrior a bodybuilder who saw the professional wrestling industry as a way to make good money and nothing else, the Ultimate Warrior was only ever in the business for himself. Possessing an incredible look and a keen understanding of crafting and marketing his persona, Jim Helwig's creation caught on during WWE's cartoon era and he became at one point the biggest star in the promotion not named Hulk Hogan. Helwig, meanwhile, believed he was at the level of the Hulkster and was so sure of it that he demanded, among other things, that he got paid Hogan money for all shows in a letter that he sent to Vince McMahon in 91. That was not long before Vince McMahon fired him, the first of three times he would have to let Warrior go within a five-year period. Outside of monetary demands, Helwig was also, according to many who worked with him, condescending, short-tempered, and flat-out rude not just to the people who worked in the company, but ordinary civilians too. Warrior was an attraction and made WWE a lot of money, no no doubt, but he was never bigger than the company or the business that made him a star, even if he felt that he was better than the guys working lower than him on the card. The list of people who speak glowingly of Jim Helwig as a person is sadly shorter than the majority of his matches. At one point in time, World Championship Wrestling very nearly dethroned WWE as the top dog in sports entertainment. They didn't, obviously, but if they had done, we would have these great feuds to thank for playing their parts. For this list, we are limiting things to one entry per wrestler, and we're counting WCW as anything from Wrestle War 1991 onwards, as that's when the company seceded from the National Wrestling Alliance. Just trust us on this one, because that is a minefield you do not want to navigate. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 best rivalries in WCW history. Join us! Number 10. Brian Pillman and Jushin Thunder Liger When WCW launched its own weekly TV show, Nitro, in 1995, the very first match they put on was a cruiserweight clash between Fly and Brian Pillman and the owner of one of the greatest masks in wrestling history, Jushin Thunder Liger. This would actually be the final time these two men would meet in a ring, as the bulk of their feud had taken place years earlier. Pillman and Liger first met in New Japan Pro Wrestling, but would feud in America over the WCW Light Heavyweight Championship, which the Masked Man beat the Loose Cannon for on Christmas Day 1991. What a present that was. The two would continue to tussle over the title into 1992, with Pillman winning it back at Super Brawl 2. They would also team up as part of a tournament for the NWA tag titles, where in the first round, they faced the tandem of Chris Benoit and a wrestler named Beef Wellington. Beef. Wellington. Though it wasn't the longest feud ever, Liger vs. Pillman helped put lightweight wrestling on the map in WCW, something the company would become famous for in later years. Number 9. Ricky Steamboat and Stunning Steve Austin From Fly and Brian to his Hollywood blondes partner and a man WCW cared about so much they fired him whilst he was injured. Sure nothing major happened as a result of that decision. Before he was stone cold in the WWF, Steve Austin was stunning in WCW where he had an amazing feud with Ricky Steamboat spread over two years and multiple championships. Their first encounter was for Austin's World Television Championship, which he retained via DQ. This was in December of 1991, and Steamboat didn't win the belt until September 1992. Now that is long-term booking. In the meantime, the pair fought in numerous singles and multi-man matches, including the legendary War Games main event of Wrestle War 1992. After a tag title feud pitting Steamboat and Shane Douglas against the Hollywood Blondes, the two would engage once again over the United States title, which Ricky beat Steve for at Clash of the Champions 28. The veteran clearly had the up-and-comers number, but the results were secondary to the wrestling art they painted on WCW's canvas. Stunning Steve was the perfect devious foil for the Dragon's down-to-earth persona, and it was during this rivalry that we got our first glimpse of how great Austin would become. Number 8. Sting and Lex Luger 
Everyone loves a good will-they-won't-they they storyline, from Ross and Rachel on Friends, to Mulder and Scully on The X-Files, to Paul Hollywood and Prue Leith on The Great British Bake Off. Now there's a soggy bottom I'd pay big money to see. In wrestling, a great example of this is the turbulent friendship between the total package Lex Luger and the man called Sting. Sting and Luger first paired up in 1988, which was in the NWA era of WCW, but the union would continue long after the two promotions parted ways. When Luger returned to WCW in 1995, the team immediately reunited, even though Luger would soon turn heel and Sting was one of the most popular babyfaces in the company. This unique dynamic made for some seriously compelling TV, as Sting would constantly be caught between his friend and his squeaky clean morals. This wasn't a feud in the traditional sense, but the underlying tension between these two pals was always exciting to watch, even though they didn't have their first pay-per-view singles match against each other other until 1999. Was it a good match? <laughs> eh, not really, but that's besides the point. Number 7. Hulk Hogan and Ric Flair At WrestleMania 8, WWE had a chance to run world champion Ric Flair against challenger Hulk Hogan. Did they? No, they didn't. Instead, fans would have to wait another two years to see these legends duke it out on pay-per-view for rival organization WCW at Bash at the Beach 94. In his WCW debut match, Hogan pinned the Nature Boy to win his first WCW title and begin a rivalry that would crop up again and again and again and again and again. Unfortunately, Flair and Hogan would fight each other way too many times over the next seven years or so. Whether in singles matches, tag team bouts, or yappy pie Indian strap matches, dude brother, what began as a dream pairing quickly turned into a nightmare. However, you cannot dismiss how important that initial Hogan Hogan Flair feud was in establishing WCW as a major force in American wrestling. Nate would also be among the first men to stand up to the Hulkster after his heel turn, playing a vital role in the early days of the New World Order. See, wasn't all bad. Number 6. Vader and Cactus Jack what happens when you put one of the toughest men in wrestling history against one of the most fearless men in wrestling history? In a word, carnage. Having wrestled in various tag team matches, both on the same side and against one another, Big Van Vader first met Mick Foley's Cactus Jack persona one-on-one -on -one in a World Heavyweight Championship match on an episode of WCW Main Event in 93. Though Jack never beat the Mastodon for the gold, the two would wage some epic wars, most notably at Halloween Havoc 1993 in a brutal Texas deathmatch. It was during this feud that Foley got powerbombed by Vader onto exposed concrete, giving him kayfabe amnesia and probably a fair few legitimate bumps and bruises too. Of course, you cannot talk about this rivalry and not discuss that faithful house show in Munich, Germany in 1994, where Foley accidentally lost a portion of his ear in a hangman rope spot gone awry. For being one of the most violent feuds in all of wrestling history, Vader and Jack have more than earned their spot on this list. Number 5. Chris Jericho and Dean Malenko There are many reasons why this cruiserweight feud was one of WCW's all-time greats. In fact, there are 1,004 of them. At Uncensored 1998, after weeks of animosity between the two, cruiserweight champion Chris Jericho humiliated Dean Malenko by making the master of submissions tap out to the Lion Tamer. In his embarrassment, the Iceman vanished from TV for two months, although that didn't stop Y2J from continuing to dump all over him. Jericho carried on feuding with Malenko even though he wasn't there, constantly reminding the audience that he had made Dean tap. Then at Slambury, fans were stunned when relatively unknown masked wrestler Ciclope won a battle royal to earn a shot at Jericho's title. But it wasn't Ciclope at all. In fact, he was... Oh, come on, you know exactly who he was. You've seen wrestling before. The mystery man pulled off his mask to reveal himself as none other than the returning Dean Malenko, creating one of the loudest pops in the company's history. He would then go on to beat Jericho and win the belt. Sure, he would have to vacate it shortly thereafter because of his deceptive actions, but still. Number 4. Eddie Guerrero and Rey Mysterio Jr. 
If you asked a random person on the street what the best match in WCW history was, they would probably say, what the hell is WCW? Get the hell away from me, you smelly freak. If you asked a seasoned wrestling fan what the best match in WCW history was, then there is a good chance they would say Eddie Guerrero versus Rey Mysterio Jr. at Halloween Havoc 97. With both the Cruiserweight Championship and Rey's mask on the line, these two Latino legends showed everyone how high-flying Lucha Libre was supposed to be done. In a match as psychological as it was physical, Mysterio countered a second rope crucifix powerbomb to pin Eddie and win an utterly incredible bout. The story didn't stop there though, as Eddie would actually win the belt back off Rey just a couple of weeks later. This led to a rematch at World War 3, as well as several more encounters on TV. TV. Though it wasn't especially long, the Guerrero Mysterio rivalry gave us some breathtaking matches and helped promote Lucha Libre on the world stage. I mean, the only thing that would have made this dispute even better would have been the fate of the custody of a small child hanging above the ring. Number three, Booker T and Scott Steiner. Like a well-cooked leg of lamb, sometimes a good wrestling feud takes time. Booker T and Scott Steiner were involved in the final ever episode of Nitro, where the Booker Man beat Big Popper Pump to win the WCW World Heavyweight Championship, although this was far from the first time the two parties had shared a ring. Harlem Heat and the Steiner brothers were mainstays of the WCW Tag Division in 1996, even swapping belts with each other a couple of times throughout the year. Every tag team must split, though, unless they're the new day, but even without their respective brothers, Booker and Scott continued to cross paths. At Spring Stampede 1999, Freakzilla defeated G.I. Bro in a tournament final to win the United States Championship. Then the pair traded the world title back and forth during the promotion's dying days, eventually culminating in the aforementioned Nitro Finale. To be able to feud up and down the card at various levels takes some serious skill, and it was a pleasure to watch both of these men evolve alongside each other over the years. Number 2. Diamond Dallas Page and Macho Man Randy Savage Alongside Bill Goldberg, Diamond Dallas Page was probably the biggest star WCW ever created on their own, but he did need some help from an ex-WWE name to really get to that next level. After learning to wrestle aged 35, which is about 200 in wrestling years, DDP bopped around the mid-card until he came face-to-face -face with Macho Man Randy Savage in 1997. Page had recently turned down an offer to join the New World Order, which Savage took great offence to, leading to Page's first ever pay-per-view main event at Spring Stampede 1997. In a fantastic battle between two immaculate workers, DDP walked away with the win, cementing his status as a new top guy in the company. He would continue to battle Savage until that year's Halloween Havoc, where Savage beat Page in a Las Vegas sudden death match. For its amazing matches, memorable moments, and for elevating Page to his rightful place in the top spot, his feud with Savage gets a big ooh yeah from me. Number 1. Sting and the NWO Alright, alright, I know I said that it would be one entry per person on this list, but come on, could we really have left off the defining rivalry of WCW's most successful period? Swerve, bro! When Hulk Hogan turned heel and formed the New World Order, Sting took one look at the Gathering Darkness and went, FIA! WCW's neon-drenched painted hero walked out on the company he had helped build, taking a leave of absence from the ring that would last over a year. Though he didn't wrestle, Sting was still a presence on WCW. WTV, lurking in the rafters in his best crow cosplay, watching the NWO do their dirty work before finally he had had enough. After descending from the heavens at uncensored 1997, the face-painted Avenger set his sights on Hollywood Hulk Hogan, culminating in a match at Starcade, which, actually, we don't need to go into that right now. Though they did bungle the finish, WCW created something magical with Sting versus the NWO. The ultimate heel group against the ultimate underdog babyface. So many great moments came from this storyline, and had it ended right, the course of the Monday Night Wars might have changed forever. You never know. A long time ago, in a land far, far away, unless you live in Pennsylvania, a plucky little wrestling promotion tried to stand up to the big boys using truth, honesty, and buckets and buckets of blood. This was Extreme Championship Wrestling, or ECW for short, and as much as its penchant for violence made it popular, it was also home to some of the most compelling characters and stories you would find anywhere during the Monday Night War era. For this list, we've limited things to one entry 
per wrestler, and we're only counting feuds that took place between 1994 and 2001. Apologies to Christian vs Ezekiel Jackson, but you're just not what we're looking for right now. I'm Adam Pachiti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 best rivalries in ECW history. Join us! Number 10. Steve Carino and Dusty Rhodes Though they only had five matches together over the course of three months, the rivalry between up-and-comer Steve Carino and polka-dotted legend Dusty Rhodes did wonders for both men. Having not wrestled in half a decade, Rhodes left WCW in 2000 and made his first ECW appearance at their Guilty as Charged pay-per-view in January, saving Jerry Lynn from a beatdown. Unfortunately, the numbers game was too much, and Dusty ended up getting battered by Carino and his cronies. They had their first and only pay-per-view singles match at Living Dangerously, and because a Rhodes was involved, it was naturally a bull rope match. Dusty had, of course, been in his fair share of bloody battles by this point, so did not hold back when fighting the King of Old School. The American Dream got the win here, but he put over Carino in his final match for the company at Cyber Slam 2000. This was a great example of an old versus young feud that added some serious credibility to Carino and showcased Rhodes to a whole new generation of fans. Number 9. The Dudley Boys and the Gangsters The Dudley Boys very nearly got onto this list for their feud with Little Spike, but that gets complicated once you factor in the carousel of partners that the runt of the litter was paired up with. Instead, let's talk about three of the maddest men to ever set foot in ECW, Mustafa Saeed and New Jack. Hey, I know that's technically only two people, but New Jack was so mad he counts for double. Collectively known as the Gangsters, Saeed and Jack first came into contact with Bubba Ray and Devon when they beat their brothers' dances with Dudley and Dudley Dudley in 1995 before coming face to face with the main incarnation of the team at Cyber Slam 1997. They battled for the tag titles multiple times, switching belts in a weaponized steel cage match at Heatwave 97. Saeed left the promotion shortly after this, cutting the rivalry short, but this did lead to Jack teaming up with Cronus of the Eliminators to form the fan fantastically named Gangstonators. It didn't last too long, but you'd better believe this rivalry was as violent as it gets. Number 8. Chris Candido and Lance Storm Lance Storm and the late great Chris Candido first crossed paths in Smoky Mountain Wrestling, where Storm beat Candido for the promotion's TV title. Clearly, neither man had forgotten their time in Smoky Mountain, as when they met again in ECW, they could not stand each other. The pair were at odds over a rumor that Sonny, Candido's partner, had a thing for the world's most serious man, which made things a little bit awkward considering that they were tag team champions at the time. Despite their hatred for one another, per the word of Paul Heyman, neither man was allowed to cost the other the belts. Cue several title defenses where Candido and Storm would beat each other up as much as their opponents, but would somehow find a way to pick up the W. This was a very entertaining dynamic, helped by the fact that both men were excellent workers. After they dropped the straps, the former partners would have a series of matches that saw the introduction of Dawn Marie, or as she was known at the time, Tammy Lynn Bitch. You know, like Tammy Lynn Sitch, Sonny's real name, beautiful. Number 7. Eddie Guerrero and Dean Malenko Dean Malenko, who is also in contention for the Lance Storm Award for Excellence in the field of seriousness, was actually part of ECW before it was the bloodthirsty chair-swinging beast we remember it as today. The Iceman was there during the crossover period from Eastern Championship Wrestling to Extreme Championship Wrestling, and alongside Shane Douglas and Chris Benoit, was part of one of its first major stables, the Triple Threat. It was during these early days that Malenko would reignite an old feud he'd had in Japan with a wrestler by the name of Eddie Guerrero. The future Radical members would have an excellent series of matches over the TV title, as the two traded the belt a number of times. Unfortunately for ECW, WCW were lurking in the shadows, and due to their working relationship with New Japan Pro Wrestling, were able to snag them away from Heyman while their series was still in full flow. Even so, these matches were vital in proving Extreme Championship Wrestling wasn't just about blood and guts, it was also the home of state-of-the-art Japanese-style graps. However, it was mostly about blood and guts. 
Number 6, Rey Mysterio Jr. and Psychosis Speaking of ECW not always being about brutal death matches, here are two men who helped establish the promotion as the place to watch Lucha Libre-style theatrics in the United States. Following the departure of talents like Guerrero and Malenko to WCW, Paul Heyman asked Conan to recommend him some Mexican performers, and two of the names K-Dog came up with were the bull mask-wearing Psychosis and a lad in his early 20s named Rey Mysterio Jr. Junior. Don't get used to either of those spellings, by the way, because they would change a lot over the next few years. The pair wrestled their first singles match against one another on American soil in September of 1995, and then would have a series of acclaimed bouts throughout the year, which included a two-hour three falls match on TV and a Mexican death match at November to remember. And then, wouldn't you know it, WCW swooped in and signed both wrestlers. That's right, again. No wonder Heyman went off on one at Bischoff at the first one-night stand. Snack Matched away as they were, Mysterio and Psychosis were leading lights in the US Lucha Revolution of the 90s, a revolution that started down in ECW. Number 5. Taz and Bam Bam Bigelow Though today he's about as threatening as a penguin wearing a funny hat, Taz used to be a monster. Back when he had one Z instead of two, the former Taz maniac was a force to be reckoned with in ECW, earning the nickname the Human Suplex Machine and choking fools out left, right and centre with his pattern. Taz mission. Though he wasn't big in stature, he exuded Hoss energy, which made him the perfect match for another unconventional behemoth, Bam Bam Bigelow. The Beast from the East made a beeline straight for Taz when he first appeared in ECW in 1996, setting up a series of matches that would remain in the memories of fans for years to come. Across their many battles, the most memorable spot these two put together came at Living Dangerously 1998. With Taz on his shoulders, Bigelow threw threw himself down at the floor, sending both men crashing through the canvas in an all-time great visual. I just hope they took out insurance on that ring, although knowing ECW, they definitely didn't. Number 4. Super Crazy and Tajiri When WWE revived the ECW brand for One Night Stand 2005, they booked a three-way dance match, which is not the same as a triple threat. A three-way dance has eliminations. Learn the difference, people. Anyway, the three men doing the dance were Little Guido, known as Nunzio in WWE, and the subjects of this entry, Super Crazy and Yoshihiro Tajiri. Though all three men had helped revolutionize the three-way dance in ECW, the singles feud between Crazy and Tajiri was strong enough to land them the spot. Each man was the other's first major feud after they had arrived in ECW, Tajiri from Japan and Crazy from Mexico. They fought each other many, many times across 1999, including four times on pay-per-view. The feud spilled over into the year 2000, bringing the TV title into its orbit, and the two men also battled each other on the final two ECW shows with one win apiece. Sometimes Sometimes two wrestlers just fit each other perfectly, and that was definitely the case with these two. Number 3. Mike Awesome and Masato Tanaka Elsewhere at the first one night stand, legendary Japanese wrestler Masato Tanaka made his first ever WWE appearance. His opponent? Former 70s guy and fat chick thriller Mike Awesome, baby! Okay, when I use those nicknames, the match doesn't sound nearly as exciting. Before he got totally nerfed in WCW, Awesome was an absolute demon demon in the land of extreme. A big man who could dive over the top rope to the floor as easily as he could perform a powerbomb, he sure could throw it down with the best of them, but his greatest dance partner had to be Tanaka. The two had previously feuded in FMW before transferring over to the US. They went to war multiple times at live events, on TV, and on pay-per-view, with their clash at Heatwave 1998 being a particular standout before trading the ECW title back and forth toward the tail end of 99. Tanaka and Awesome Styles meshed perfectly, and both men were always willing to give 100% when facing each other. The fact that they were chosen for a match at one night stand speaks volumes, and guess what? That one was an absolute barn burner as well. Even a slosh JBL had no choice but to applaud. Number 2. Rob Van Dam and Sabu We've seen the partners who struggled to coexist trope on this list already with Candido and Storm, but the ultimate example of frenemies in ECW with a whole flipping show and the suicidal, homicidal j- you, you, you know who it is, it's Sabu. The two had crossed paths as early as 1989, but met for the first time under Paul Heyman's employee in 1996, where they had a series of epic matches across the summer. They would spend the next three years as on-again, off-again 
Wargame tag team partners under the managerial watch of Bill Alfonso. They won the tag team titles twice, and Van Dam helped Sabu win the ECW World Heavyweight belt, but that didn't stop them from wrestling each other on multiple occasions, including for RVD's TV title. Because of their real-life close ties, they were both trained by Sabu's uncle, the original Sheik, it was always so believable whenever these two worked together, either as bitter enemies or cherished chums. The matches were usually pretty damn good, provided that Sabu didn't almost kill himself by botching something, but it was the underlying story that always made these two risk-takers so entertaining to watch. Number 1. Tommy Dreamer and Raven Proud son of New York and dark side of the ring superfan Tommy Dreamer has often been described as the protagonist of ECW. If that's the case, then that would make Raven, the grumpiest wrestler of all time, just look at him, cheer up mate, the promotion's primary antagonist. Presented as former childhood friends, Dreamer and Raven were the polar opposites of one another. Raven, the dark brooding outcast, and Dreamer, the symbol of the everyman. Whether they were fighting over beauty Beulah McGillicutty, breaking each other's fingers, or kicking the hell out of each other in the ring, these two just never let up. Dreamer would always come up short against his grungy adversary until Wrestlepalooza 1997, where he pinned Raven for the first time in a Loser Leaves ECW match. Even this couldn't keep them apart though, as Raven would rejoin ECW in 1999 to team with Dreamer, with the odd couple winning the tag belts. Dreamer's feud with the Sandman was also top drawer. I'm gutted we can't include it here, rules are rules, but if you want his longest, most emotional, and overall greatest enemy, then you simply have to quote the Pachiti. Nevermore. Historically, the Survivor Series pay-per-view has relied on numbers. With at least one or two multi-person tag team elimination matches being used as a selling point, most of the time anyway, WWE have in the past utilized members of their roster who I'm sure appreciated the rare pay-per-view paycheck. Good for them, of course, but we would be lying if we said this didn't lead to some particularly unmemorable appearances at one of WWE's original Big Four events. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 Forgotten Survivor Series Tag Team Members. Join us. Number 10, Mike Knox. All right, we might as well kick things off with a match and moment that has a lot to unpack. At the 2006 Survivor Series, Team DX, Triple H, Shawn Michaels, The Hardys, and CM Punk took on Team Rated RKO, Randy Orton, Edge, Johnny Nitro, Gregory Helms, and Mike Knox. Obviously, looking at the star power disparity, the odds weren't great for the heels. Orton and Edge were established stars, yes, and while recent Intercontinental Champion Nitro was starting to find his feet as a singles performer, and Helms was in the midst of an epic cruiserweight title reign, they were collectively no match for the clean sweeping babyfaces. As for poor old Mike Knox, well, he was new on the scene and trying to make a name for himself on the lowly ECW brand. And that's a show that the Heartbreak Kid clearly didn't watch, since he questioned just who he had eliminated after a single sweet chin music right as the bell rang, audibly asking the game, who was that? Was he in the match? You can actually pinpoint the second Mike Knox's WWE hopes and dreams broke in half. Number 9. Sam Houston Back in the early days of Survivor Series, every match on the card was a traditional multi-man elimination match. And though there were only four bouts on the bill in 1988, three of them were five-on-five -five affairs, while the other was a mammoth 10 versus 10 offering. Some quick math that I totally didn't need a calculator for tells me that's 50 bone benders needed for the night. Though many on hand were larger-than-life characters and future Hall of Famers, there were a couple of curious names mixed in. For example, Sam Houston, the pencil-thin dancing cowboy who never got above prelim level during his WWE run. And, of course, he was in the opener here, tagging with the Ultimate Warrior, Brutus Beefcake, the Blue Blazer, and Jim Brunzel. That's about as cobbled together a babyface squad as you are likely to see right there. Our man Sam managed to last about 10 minutes before being the fourth person eliminated by Ron Bass. The match was all about the insurgent warrior, of course, who won the match as sole survivor. Number 8. Jojo 
You can definitely be forgiven for forgetting about Jojo Offerman's 2013 Survivor Series appearance since it was one of six whole matches she had during her short in-ring career. The diminutive announcer was only 19 when she debuted on WWE television as a personality, first showing up as a cast member of Total Divas. She also appeared in some non-wrestling segments and did some lovely singing before getting involved in a storyline between the cast of Total Divas and the so-called True Divas, leading to a 14-person showdown at Survivor Series. JoJo scored no eliminations on the night and was eliminated 10th by AJ Lee, however her team were victorious when Natalya and Nikki Bella survived. Jojo didn't really do a whole lot prior to being sent packing, which isn't surprising considering she just had two matches under her belt at the time. During the rematch the next night on Raw, she was permitted to shine a little more and eliminated Tamina. All told, Jojo only had three televised main roster matches before heading back to NXT, where she became a full-time ring announcer. It's pretty random that one of those took place at Survivor Series. Number 7. K-Quick Oh, you didn't know? You better call somebody! The D-O-double-G and K-Quick getting rowdy. A little bit too rowdy for my taste, but some people are into it, I suppose. So, K-Quick then, better known as Wrong Killings or R-Truth, had only made his WWE debut six days before the 2000 Survivor Series by coming to the aid of his new tag partner. The two then had one tag match between then and the pay-per-view, where K-Quick found himself involved in a quasi-DX reunion teaming with Road Dogg, China, and Billy Gunn. This would turn out to be K-Quick's highest profile match during Ron's first WWE run, though he scored no eliminations before being sent back to the locker room by Chris Benoit. He got to show some stuff out there before eating a bridging German suplex, but really it was just a couple of spots that weren't exactly impressive enough to linger in the memory. Road Dogg would be suspended and then fired a month later, derailing K-Quick's momentum. He would have to wait another eight years for his next Survivor Series appearance. Number 6. Scott Casey Back to 1988 now, where, lest we forget, WWE needed 50 wrestlers to fill out a four-match card. And if Sam Houston was a forgotten Survivor Series team member, then Cowboy Scott Casey may as well never have even existed. Now listen, I have respect for just about anyone who gets in a WWE ring, let alone wrestles on a WWE pay-per-view, and the work of undercard guys, be they enhancement talents or jobbers, should never be discounted. The veteran Scott Casey was in the autumn of his in-ring career, when he found himself on the pay-per-view by chance as a replacement for a replacement. Junkyard Dog was originally scheduled to be on Jake Roberts' babyface team, but he was fired following a tour of Europe. B. Brian Blair of the Killer Bees was then drafted in, but he up and quit shortly afterwards, forcing WWE to dig deep into their reserves. And so Casey got the nod for his sole WWE pay-per-view appearance. He was the second person eliminated by Dino Bravo and exited the company not too terribly long after. Number 5. David Otunga when Cody Rhodes went down with a pretty serious shoulder injury just days before the 2012 Survivor Series, it was a blow to the man himself for WWE and for Team Ziggler, which he was scheduled to be a member of. As we all know, the sports entertainment world stops for nobody and WWE quickly set about finding a replacement. Several names were rumoured in the days leading up to the show, including Tensai, Fandango, Mark Henry and wrestler-cum-referee Brad Maddox. In the end, WWE opted for David Otunga, a man seen jobbing to Santino Morella, Sheamus, Great Carly, and Ryback in his previous four televised matches. What a push! Somewhat surprisingly, Harvard Boy wasn't the first person eliminated and managed to last a whopping 7 minutes and 11 seconds before being tapped out by Daniel Bryan. WWE needed a body for the match, and I suppose Otunga's body was as good and as hefty as anyone's, but his in-ring work wasn't half as impressive as his beautiful muscles, and he didn't really add much to the match. Number 4. Nathan Jones WWE were going to get Nathan Jones on television come hell or high water, whether the Australian giant could string two moves together or not. The Colossus of Boggo Road was first introduced as a disciple of The Undertaker, but was deemed such an in-ring risk that WWE removed him from their advertised tag match at WrestleMania 19. 
He was sent back to developmental and returned six months later as one of SmackDown general manager Paul Heyman's big beefy boys, joining forces with WWE champion Brock Lesnar, A-Train, Big Show, and Matt Morgan. The fivesome teamed up at the 2003 Survivor Series to take on Kurt Angle, Bradshaw, Chris Benoit, John Cena, and Hardcore Holly in the show's opener. Looking at that lineup of primo talent, Jones sticks out like a sore thumb, even next to fellow greenhorn giant Matt Morgan, who would eventually come good years years later in TNA. Nathan racked up zero eliminations, but on the plus side, didn't manage to trip over his massive feet en route to being eliminated by the Olympic hero. Jones would depart WWE mere weeks later. Number 3. Boris Zukov Pseudo-Russian tag team the Bolsheviks locked horns with some of WWE's most famous duos of the day, having memorable matches with the likes of the Hart Foundation, the British Bulldogs, and um, the Bushwhackers. Once Nikolai Volkov began embracing the despicable US of A, however, that was the end of his alliance with Boris Zukov, who was still proudly flying the flag of the Soviet Union. Their split set them on a collision course, and they clashed on house shows and in a couple of short TV bouts on shows like Superstars and Wrestling Challenge. A good place to blow it off would have been at the Survivor Series, where Zukov formed part of the Mercenaries, captained by that dastardly turncoat Sergeant Slaughter, as they took on the alliance headed by Volkov. Curiously, Zukov wasn't in the match long enough to tangle with his former comrade, as he was eliminated first by Tito Santana after less than a minute of action, I guess you would call it. Number 2. Maven The co-winner of the first season of WWE reality TV show Tough Enough had some big moments during his short but memorable career. Maven most famously eliminated The Undertaker from the 2002 Royal Rumble and had a decent run with the hardcore title which got him on the WrestleMania 18 card, even if he never did quite break out of the mid-card pack. WWE did have plans for Maven further up the card mind, and at one point he was mooted as a new addition to Evolution. That obviously never happened, but Maven found himself in the mix with Triple H, Batista, and Ric Flair in the fall of 2004. He was due to join Randy Orton and Chris's Jericho and Benoit to go up against the game The Animal, Edge and Gene Snitsky in the 2004 Survivor Series main event, but he was attacked backstage before it began, meaning that it started as a 4-on-3 handicap match. Maven came out midway through mind, hitting Snitsky with a brutal flying forearm, breaking the baby punter's orbital bone in the process before getting absolutely battered with a stiff chair shot. Soon after, Maven was eliminated by Triple H. Perhaps he was just a little bit too consumed with his fantasy. Number 1. Salvatore Sincere 1996 was a big year for a WWE that was in transition, especially as far as up-and-coming talent was concerned, with Steve Austin, Mick Foley and The Rock all debuting, while Triple H continued to make great strides. All were involved at that year's Survivor Series, the show where the Great One famously made his in-ring WWE debut. The day after Survivor Series, Rock would make his Raw debut against none other than Salvatore Sincere, a man you probably struggle to remember in general, let alone the fact he was also on the Survivor Series card. Well, he was in the pre-show free-for-all match actually, which was a traditional 4-on-4 elimination match, so it counts. The alter ego of veteran journeyman Tom Brandy, Salvatore Sincere was just a step above enhancement talent and was easily the least noteworthy member of the match. And bear in mind Aldo Montoya was standing on the opposite side of the ring. When you're lower down on the pecking order than old jockstrap face, you have to ask yourself some pretty sincere questions, don't you, Salvatore? Since it first came around in 2010, the Money in the Bank pay-per-view has been all about ladder matches. And we're not just talking about the scramble for the briefcase. Seth Rollins fought Dean Ambrose for the WWE title in a ladder match in 2015, the belt was also suspended above the ring in 2014, and, well, that's it. But you get the point. There have been plenty of matches to take place at this show that haven't involved a house painter's best friend, and we think it's about time they get elevated to the top rung. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 best non-ladder matches at Money in the Bank. Join us! 
Number 10, The New Day vs. The Usos in 2017. Move over, Kevin Owens and Chris Jericho. Get lost, Brock Lesnar and Samoa Joe. See you later, Sami Zayn and Mike Kanellis. The best feud of 2017 was easily between The New Day and The Usos. The two contenders for the best teams of their generation, these groups fought each other multiple times across the year and never disappointed. They even managed to have a banger on the SummerSlam pre-show. The pre-show, for goodness sake. That's where good wrestling goes to die. Their first tussle was at Money in the Bank, and admittedly, it was probably the worst of the bunch. Still though, when the feud is this great, even the worst is pretty damn good. Both teams had fought before, but that was when the Usos were boring babyfaces and the New Day were goofy heels. The two sides were a bit more serious now, and that was on full display here. Their chemistry was off the charts, as Jimmy, Jay, Biggie and Kofi left it all in the ring as they battled for the SmackDown tag titles. Dodgy booking got in the way when the Bloodline brothers retained their belts with a count-out loss, but everything before that was top-notch. Number 9. John Cena vs Mark Henry in 2013 I've got two words for ya. No, not those ones. Instead, this story is all about the now infamous Salmon Jacket. On the June 17th, 2013 episode of Raw, Mark Henry came down to the ring in his finest fish-colored attire and gave an emotional speech about how he was going to retire. Hey, that rhymes. Neat. He suckered everyone in, including WWE Champion John Cena, who he then hit with a World's Strongest Slam to reveal the whole thing as one giant trap. Rap. Seriously, highlight of Henry's entire career. This led to a title match at Money in the Bank, with Henry chasing the one major championship he had never won. The fantastic build really helped create a buzz around this match, even if the face heel dynamics were a little off, as 2013 was peak We Hate Cena time for many fans. Though we were a few years removed from his Hall of Pain glory days, Henry still played the role of monster villain to perfection. Cena struggles to deal with the big man made for compelling viewing as fans wondered if WWE would put the belt on Mark for one last run. I mean, they didn't, but this was still bloody good. Number 8. John Cena vs Kevin Owens in 2015 Two years after he fought a wrestler from the past at Money in the Bank, Big Match John took to the ring against one from the future. As in he was the future of the company. He hadn't travelled back in time that we know of. Kevin Owens had made a hugely impactful main roster debut earlier that year by specifically targeting Cena. Owens had berated John for making a mockery of pro wrestling and had fought him in his first pay-per-view match at Elimination Chamber. And you'll never guess what, he won! Clean! Nobody did that to Cena in 2015. A couple of weeks later, Cena got his revenge by beating Owens in a rematch. Cue loads of booing. Still, these two were absolutely dynamite in the ring together and built expertly on their previous encounter. Even though KO didn't score the double over Cena, this was still a promising sign that he could have multiple great matches with a big name. All this led to one more match between the two at Battleground with Cena's United States Championship on the line. And guess what? Cena won this one too. Oh, can't have everything, I guess. Number 7, Charlotte Flair vs Rhea Ripley in 2021 In between their pair of Mania matches, Charlotte Flair and Rhea Ripley squared off at 2021's Money in the Bank for Ripley's Raw Women's title. This was the first pay-per-view to have fans back following COVID, and they, well, they kinda crapped all over this match. To be fair, WWE had done themselves no favors. A terrible build-up left fans chanting for Becky Lynch as this match started, someone who wasn't even on the card. However, things would soon change. Flair and Ripley worked so well together that they were able to get the crowd back on their side. By the time Flair submitted Ripley to win the belt, the crowd were hanging on every single move. A great example of two performers letting the wrestling do the talking. Flair vs Ripley was an absolute joy to watch. Number 6. Seth Rollins vs AJ Styles in 2019 Remember when WWE booked Seth Rollins and Kofi Kingston in a winner-takes-all match the night after both men won world titles at WrestleMania? You know, the one where the bar interfered and nobody actually won. 
God, that was stupid. The company made up for this baffling decision by having Rollins' first pay-per-view title defense be against AJ Styles at Money in the Bank. On paper, you couldn't have asked for two better opponents, and thankfully, this promise was more than met inside the ropes. Both men could get a good match out of a wet paper bag, so putting them together was truly inspired. Their back and forth was simply incredible, even if nobody actually thought Seth was going to be dethroned this early into the run. One highlight came when AJ somehow defied physics to counter a stomp into the Styles Clash. Don't ask me how he did it, because I genuinely have no idea. I just know that it was rad as hell, bro. In the end, Rollins got the win, but both men came out of this encounter looking like absolute superstars. The champ would then go on to feud with... Baron Corbin. Ah. Number 5. The Usos vs. The Street Profits in 2022 Though their greatest rivalry might have been with The New Day, The Usos' greatest match at Money in the Bank happened against Angelo Dawkins and Montez Ford of The Street Profits. After beating the undisputed tag team champions via countout, they love that finish, don't they? The Profits earned a match against The Usos at the upcoming pay-per-view. It was obviously going to be fun, but nobody expected it to go quite this hard. For 23 minutes, Minutes, both teams put on an absolute clinic. All four shone as individuals and in their respective units, creating a display so fluid it's amazing that they didn't just soak into the mat. The crowd was also phenomenal, wholeheartedly supporting the idea that Ford and Dawkins could have beaten Jimmy and Jay that night. Sadly, it wasn't to be though, as Montez took a 1D from the champs and was pinned for the three counts. Wait a second, his shoulder was off the mat. Why is it with the Usos and wonky finishes at Money in the bank. Better call Jeff Jarrett and tell him to be the special guest referee at SummerSlam. That should sort this whole mess out. Number 4. CM Punk vs. Daniel Bryan in 2012 Whilst John Cena was dicking about fighting John Laurinaitis and The Big Show in 2012, we somehow missed a multi-month world title feud between CM Punk and Daniel Bryan. The two Ring of Honor originals first met on pay-per-view at Over the Limit, which was main evented by Cena losing to a middle-aged executive in a morph suit. Great stuff. Their feud got blown off in style at Money in the Bank when WWE gave them almost half an hour in a no disqualification match. Be still, my little indie loving heart. Punk and Brian batted seven shades of stuffing out of each other as the straight edge superstar's future wife AJ Lee watched on as special guest ref. Oh, isn't it cute when couples do things together? After all the violence and some great technical wrestling, Punk put D Bry away with a devastating superplex through a table. This was enough to finally end the match and put their beef to an end. Was this the main event? No, of course not. That went to John Cena winning the Money in the Bank briefcase when it accidentally came loose from its hook. You can sort of see why Punk left, can't you? Number 3. AJ Styles vs John Cena in 2016 The wrestling universe glitched out on the May 30th, 2016 episode of Raw when John Cena and AJ Styles shared a WWE ring for the first time. Both men had been the faces of their respective sectors for the last decade, and seeing them occupy the same space was totally surreal. And then AJ knocked Cena's head off. The Phenomenal One's heel turn and alignment with the Good Brothers led to the two icons squaring off for the first time at Money in the Bank. As you can imagine, fans were more than a little excited to see them fight. To the shock of absolutely nobody, these two made magic together. Cena was really hitting his stride as a big match performer at this time, and as we said earlier, Styles could have won a Match of the Year award competing against a cardboard cutout of a horse. Styles went on to win with a huge assist from Anderson and Gallows, but this match was still great and was the first step towards their epic encounter at SummerSlam a few months later. Job well done. Number 2. Seth Rollins vs Roman Reigns in 2016. The main event of Money in the Bank 2016 was a match between two former members of one of WWE's most popular stables. Seth Rollins had returned from injury at Extreme Rules and had immediately thrown down the gauntlet to WWE Champion Roman Reigns. Rollins had been forced to vacate the belt the previous year and was very keen to get it back from his ex-colleague. 
Air World title match had a proper big fight feel to it, with the crowd all too aware of each man's history with the other. I mean, it helped that they were both really great wrestlers, no matter how much we wanted Roman Reigns to go away and never come back at the time. This contest more than lived up to the hype, as these two gave it their all. After several false finishes, including an insane spear into pedigree counter, Rollins picked up the win and the gold by pinning Reigns to the mat. Not that it was technically part of the match, but while we're here, let's talk about Dean Ambrose cashing in on Seth immediately after the conclusion of the bout. Seriously, watching Dean get his revenge on his fiercest rival was the best kind of satisfaction. Number 1. CM Punk vs John Cena in 2011 I mean, come on, it had to be, didn't it? WWE's first Dave Meltzer five-star match in 14 years. The high point of one of the most exciting stories in company history. The match that got so many lapsed fans back into wrestling. Sorry, but our hands were tied. The story of CM Punk vs John Cena at Money in the Bank 2011 is woven into the fabric of wrestling's DNA. Cena was the corporate face of WWE's bland PG era. Punk was the edgy rebel who wasn't afraid to speak truth to power. He sat on the ramp, said hi to Colt Cabana, and then announced that his contract was running out and he wanted to take the WWE title with him. The match itself was fantastic, and that Chicago crowd were absolutely rabid and genuinely might have torn the building down had their hometown hero not won. For its place, in wrestling history, Punk vs Cena will go down as the single best match in the history of Money in the Bank, ladders or not. Wrestling fans are a lot of things. Handsome, intelligent, virile. Oh wait, no, that's just me. We can also be very judgmental, making our minds up about things before we've seen the full picture. The following performers all had their doubters at one stage or another, but through tireless work and dedication, with the occasional good break here and there, were able to overcome the negativity, succeed, and become stars. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 wrestlers who proved the naysayers wrong. Join us! Number 10. Dominic Mysterio After first appearing on WWE TV as the spiky-haired object of a custody battle, Dominic Mysterio became a regular part of the show in 2020 during Rey Mysterio's feud with Seth Rollins. This led to his debut match with the Monday Night Messiah at SummerSlam, a short run with the Tag Team Championships, and a part in Logan Paul's debut at WrestleMania 38. Logan that night was teaming with his father, The Miz. I think that's right. Despite all these high-profile moments, fans did not take kindly to the second-generation star. Well, that was until he turned heel and joined up with the Judgment Day. Ever since he took out Ray and Edge at Clash at the Castle and developed a completely psychologically healthy relationship with Rhea Ripley, Dom has completely transformed. He is way more effective as a snivelling heel than he ever was as a good guy and is now one of the most reliably entertaining performers every single goddamn week. Completely throwing himself into the role, he has quite shockingly become one of WWE's best bad guys and his star is only set to grow going forward. Papa Eddie must be watching and smiling up in heaven. Number 9. Braun Strowman In 2015, WWE took a page out of Itchy and Scratchy's book and decided that the way to revitalize the Wyatt family was to add a new character. Instead of a rapping dog, though, fans were faced with a beta version of Braun Strowman. Less than a year after his first ever wrestling match, Strowman was dumped onto TV as the newest member of the Backwoods cult. He was nicknamed the Black Sheep, although his moniker should have been the Deer in Headlights. Strowman looked totally out of place, and to be fair, can you really blame the guy? Here he was, mere months into his WWE career, pushed to a level that he just wasn't ready for. Luckily for him, wrestling fans are famously forgiving and were willing to let him find his feet. <laughs> Nope, crowds dumped on Strowman from a great height, taking a sadistic pleasure in his lumbering appearance and total lack of skill. All that changed in 2016, though, when a newer, more confident version of Strowman appeared on Raw and started munching through jobbers like they were on special offer. Sorry we ever booed you, Mr. Strowman. Please don't eat me. Number 8. AJ Styles 
From the closure of WCW until the 2016 Royal Rumble, one man who helped carry wrestling outside of WWE on his back was AJ Styles. Whether in TNA, New Japan, or Ring of Honor, the Phenomenal One wowed audiences with his flashy moveset, freakish agility, and adorable little face. Oh, look at it. Such a cutie. At the aforementioned Royal Rumble event, fans got a moment almost 20 years in the making when Styles strode out to a WWE stage for the first time ever. It would have been nice to actually see this moment, but Kevin Dunn clearly thought Roman Reigns' stupid, although admittedly handsome mug was more important. However, as soon as Styles rocked up in WWE, fans got worried. Vince McMahon had a long history of burying so-called outside talent, and longtime admirers were afraid that the same would happen to their boy. However, those naysayers were proved wrong, because by the time 2016 was done, Styles had beaten John Cena twice and was the WWE champ. Even better, WWE have continued to treat AJ like a big deal since, finally snapping the curse that had affected so many other so-called indie darlings. Number 7. Sheamus On June 30th, 2009, Sheamus made his debut on ECW, defeating an enhancement talent. On December 13th, 2009, Sheamus defeated John Cena at TLC to become WWE Champion. If you would like to file a claim for Whiplash, please call the number on screen now. Vince McMahon was clearly in touch with his Irish heritage at this time because he booked Sheamus to look like an absolute monster. This was what WWE fans had been wanting for years, a fresh new star to shake up the dusty old main event scene. Sadly though, the company went for the wrong fresh new star. Seamus wasn't bad, he was just a bit bland. His character at the time boiled down to, I am Irish and I like to kick people, which is hardly what you look for in a top guy. It would take another decade or so until public opinion on the Celtic Warrior really started to turn. Through a series of hard-hitting matches with Drew McIntyre, fans began to come around to Sheamus. One series of brutal battles with Gunter later, and they were practically worshipping at his feet. The luck of the Irish must be real, although it could have kicked in a little sooner. Number 6. Hangman Adam Page Moving away from WWE now, we find ourselves at AEW's All Out event from 2019. The final match of the night was a huge one, the battle to crown the first ever AEW World Champ. On one side was Chris Jericho, a veteran name with dozens of championship reigns in his back pocket. And on the other side was Hangman Adam Page, who was friends with the Young Bucks. Oh dear. Many thought Paige was pushed way too hard way too soon, and the fans did not take kindly to it. Not only did it make the result of All Out thoroughly predictable, but it actually set Hangman's career back a good ways. And then came Kenny Omega. Through his outstanding long-term feud with the best bout machine, the anxious millennial cowboy managed to get across his personality and help fans resonate with his nervous, self-destructive character. By the time Full Gear 2021 came around, fans were threatening to riot if their new fave didn't beat Omega for the top prize. All this goes to show that if you give somebody a little bit of time and team them up with a bunch of weirdo ex-cult members, then they too can soar. Number 5. Diamond Dallas Page It's him, it's him, it's… oh wait, I've done this wrong. Before he was an in-ring competitor, Diamond Dallas Page was a successful manager for acts like Kurt Hennig, the Fabulous Freebirds, and a young Scott Hall. In 1991, it seemed as if Page's managerial opportunities in WCW were drying up and that he may soon be let go. Instead of handing in his CV at the local supermarket, though, the 35-year-old Page made the utterly bonkers decision to learn how to wrestle. Just for context, Seth Rollins is 36 now. Against all the odds and the laws of biology, DDP not only completed his training, but would go on to have one of the most extraordinary careers in WCW history. He feuded with Randy Savage, Goldberg, Hulk Hogan, and many more on his way to winning 10 titles with the promotion, including three runs with the top prize. It's been said many times, but it bears repeating just how inspirational DDP's story is in showing that it is never too late to follow your dreams. Number 4. The Miz 
Hopping back to WWE now, and a man who has been with the company for almost two decades. God, time is relentless, isn't it? Mike the Miz Mizanin was first introduced to WWE audiences as part of 2004's Million Dollar Tough Enough. Let's just gloss over when he made a total tit of himself whilst hosting the Diva Search and move on to his time as an actual in-ring competitor, eh? In the years that followed Tough Enough and that embarrassing moment, Miz has won just about everything there is to win in WWE. The WWE Championship, multiple IC and US Championships, a bunch of different tag belts, the Slammy for Best WWE.com Exclusive in 2008, all the big ones. He managed to achieve all of this despite constant bemoaning from fans, critics, and even fellow wrestlers. Yes, JBL, we mean you. Whether you love him or hate him, there is no denying that Miz has made the very most of a wrestling career that began as a spot on reality TV. There is no chance that this man isn't going into the WWE Hall of Fame one day, and you know what? He more than deserves it. Number 3. Daniel Bryan From The Miz to his ex-NXT rookie, Daniel Bryan famously faced some pretty tough opposition in his time working for WWE. After kicking people to death for fun on the indies, Bryan Danielson made his proper WWE debut in 2010 as one of the NXT rookies. He was promptly fired for choking a man with a tie, but don't worry, they hired him back shortly thereafter. Bryan was never earmarked for greatness in WWE. He was an outstanding wrestler, but didn't fit the mold of what a traditional top star in the company looked like. He was in a system that was working against him, but that system didn't count on one thing. Men from their 20s to 40s with too much time on their hands and access to the internet. <laughs> That's right, through an overwhelming groundswell of support from fans, WWE were forced to push Bryan to the moon and give him the biggest win of his career at WrestleMania 30. The American Dragon had overcome all the odds and had solidified his place amongst the modern wrestling elites. Even if maybe that's not what WWE had in mind. Number 2. John Cena It's almost weird to think about now, but there was of course a time when John Cena was public enemy number one in the eyes of wrestling fans. And not in the cool ECW public enemy kind of way. He was almost the total inverse of a Daniel Bryan. The company absolutely adored him, but lots of fans couldn't stand to watch him succeed. To be fair, WWE did little to help Cena's case. They gave him win after win after win, often at the expense of more popular stars, and watered down his once edgy character to a collection of catchphrases and multicolored t shirts. Everyone was convinced that fans would hate John Cena for life until he started doing something called the United States Open Challenge. Suddenly, Big Match John was putting on pay per view quality matches every single week on Raw with some of the best talent around. Sure, he would still win, but this was the most interesting thing he had done in years. So there you have it. John Cena overcame the odds, never gave up, and got through the tough times with hustle, loyalty, and respect. Good God, the propaganda's deeper into my brain than I first thought. Number 1. Roman Reigns Take all the animosity fans felt towards John Cena for so long, apply it to Roman Reigns, and multiply it by about a hundred. As soon as WWE started to push the X-Shield member as a top star, fans called him out as Cena 2.0. In the wake of multiple attempts to get Roman over as the new blue-eyed babyface, literally look at those contact lenses, fans wholeheartedly rejected their new hero and many years of main event stories were ruined as a result. And then he went bad. Since coming back in the summer of 2020 as a heel, Roman's perception has undergone a total 180 degree flip. As the callous, manipulating head of the bloodline, the tribal chief has evolved into one of the most compelling three-dimensional characters wrestling has ever seen, and fans have loved going on that journey. Although we were all crying out for a Reigns heel turn for years, nobody could have expected it to go this well. The Big Dog never rested on his laurels and worked so hard to change people's minds on him, and for that, we can't help but acknowledge him. 
First impressions are incredibly important. Imagine if you had just started a new job and turned up on the first day severely hungover with dribble and kebab splattered all down your shirt. Anyway, that's enough about my first day at What Culture. Let's talk about some wrestlers. The following 10 wrestlers were all massively unpopular at some point in their careers only to turn things around and win the adulation of the audience. Whether they changed up their look, gimmicks, or in-ring style, fans changed their minds on these 10 wrestlers and thank god they did. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling and these are 10 beloved wrestlers who fans initially hated. Join us. Number 10, Gold Dust. In terms of divisiveness, few characters have ever come close to Dustin Rhodes' portrayal of Gold Dust. A face painted, overtly sexual, gender fluid embodiment of Hollywood, Gold Dust used every trick in the book to get heat upon his debut in 1995. Most of those tricks involved gay panic, which would absolutely not fly today, but this was the mid-90s, it was the style at the time. For one reason or another, fans did not like Gold Dust. Whilst many admired Dustin's commitment to the character, he was nobody's favourite wrestler, despite his long list of achievements. That all changed when Rhodes came back to WWE in 2002 and began teaming with Booker T. Their odd couple chemistry endeared Booker and Goldie to the fans so much that that they scored a World Tag Team Championship reign out of this pairing. Since then, Goldust has evolved time and time again, until Dustin found perhaps his greatest success as himself in AEW. He has rightfully taken his place as a cherished veteran of the sport, but things could have gone very differently if it wasn't for those backstage skits where Goldust dressed up as Darth Vader. Number 9. Braun Strowman Whilst his recent antics might have soured a lot of folks on him, it is important important to remember that there was a time when we all loved the monster among men. Braun Strowman first appeared on our screens in 2015 as an addition to the Wyatt family. The Black Sheep was quite frankly a lumbering oaf who had hair like he'd been electrocuted and a constant look of, is this where I'm supposed to be? on his face. However, come the second brand split, fans were treated to a very different version of Braun. On the July 25th, 2016 edition of Raw, Strowman made his way to the ring with a very different look. He had gotten into amazing shape, trimmed his beard, and got on a trendy new haircut. More importantly, he had also completely changed up his in-ring style, matching his insane power with freakish agility and speed. Seemingly overnight, Braun went from petrified tree to unstoppable behemoth, and fans were delighted. This led to his excellent feud with Roman Reigns, his performance at SummerSlam 2017, and his time in the main event scene. If only he had stayed off Twitter, maybe some people would still like him. Number 8. Britt Baker Hated might be a strong word for how fans felt towards Britt Baker during the early days of AEW, but they were definitely not thrilled about how she was treated as their poster girl. The Doctor became the first woman to sign with AEW in early 2019 and was pushed hard as a babyface. Unfortunately, Baker didn't really connect with the crowd as a hero, and it also didn't help that a concussion caused her to try and tag in the wrong person at Fight for the Fallen. Wrestling fans don't care whose fault it is. If there's a botch, they will laugh. Things took a step in the right direction when Baker turned heel in early 2020. She began to berate Tony Schiavone, mostly because he used to work in a Starbucks, and slowly started to win fans over with her heelish charisma. This all paid off at Double or Nothing 2021, when Baker captured the AEW Women's Championship. Despite being the heel, the audience went absolutely bonkers for Baker's win, as she had become one of the biggest stars in the entire a company. I guess you could say she fought tooth and nail for their acceptance. I'll see myself out. Number 7. Santino Morella Whilst he may not have been the greatest in-ring talent of all time, Santino Morella excelled at comedy wrestling. With an Italian accent thicker and faker than 20 slices of American cheese, Santino debuted for WWE as a fan selected by Vince McMahon to take on Umaga for the Intercontinental Championship. In a shock twist, he actually beat the Samoan Bulldozer thanks to a huge assist from Bobby Lashley. This earned him the belt,
results and the nickname the Milan Miracle. Unfortunately, this mega push combined with Santino's lack of character led to fans turning hard on the new champion. After losing the title back to Umaga, Santino underwent a change in personality from serious competitor to serious goofball. It all started when he took issue with Steve Austin's performance in the upcoming film The Condemned. This is the moment performer Anthony Corelli started to play up the broken English parts of Santino's character, resulting in plenty of hilarious imitations of Austin's famous catchphrases. Once Santino turned to the comedic side, there was no going back and the fans absolutely lapped it up. He was never taken seriously again, which isn't as bad as it sounds in this case. Number 6. The New Day Our only group entry on this list, the difference between how this team were perceived in their early days versus how they're seen now is night and day. Night and New Day, that is. <laughs> yeah. Formed off the back of all three men going on losing streaks, Big E, Kofi Kingston and Xavier Woods first appeared as the New Day in 2014. Under a sort of gospel gimmick, the trio started promoting the power of positivity in promos so sickly sweet they could rot your teeth. Fans hated this act, booing it heavily whenever they got the chance. But that all changed when the New Day turned heel in 2015 and began embracing the more ironic side of their slogan. And nobody could have predicted what came next next for the group. Through catchphrases, unicorns, trombones, cereal boxes, pancakes, booty, and more, The New Day became one of the best acts in the company and one of the greatest stables of all time. They were so over his heels that they had to turn face again in 2016 and they've never looked back. The idea of them ever going bad again seems ridiculous these days, which is mental when you think about where they came from. Number 5. Jay White Two-time IWGP heavyweight champion, leader of the Bullet Club, owner of one of the best goatees in wrestling history. Switchblade Jay White has done it all and shows no signs of slowing down. However, it was a very different situation when White returned to New Japan in 2016 following his excursion to Ring of Honor. He was immediately put into a program with Hiroshi Tanahashi and fans struggled to accept that the young Kiwi was on the same level as the ace. His mega push continued with wins over the likes of Kenny Omega and Kazuchika Okada until White finally toppled Tanahashi for the IWGP title in 2019. Many assumed that White was just a placeholder, a Kenny Omega stand-in after the cleaner decided to leave New Japan for AEW. And you know what? They would be right, as White lost the belt to Okada just 54 days later. White was pushed too hard too soon, but he has now matured into one of the best heels in the world. Confident, cocky, and with the skills to back up his words, Switch Blade might have started off dull, but now he's razor sharp. Number 4. Triple H For the longest time, the only game Triple H was interested in playing was the how many promising young wrestlers can I keep down this month game. Between 2002 and 2005, Trips had a stranglehold on the main event title scene of Raw. The World Heavyweight Championship was pretty much surgically grafted to his waist, with promising talent like Booker T, Rob Van Dam, and Goldberg all sacrifice to the reign of terror. Through his marriage to Stephanie McMahon, Hunter earned himself a reputation as a backstage politicker supreme intent on keeping himself at the top by any means necessary. Who would have thought that all it would take was three little letters for fans to change their minds on the King of Kings? N. X. T. Triple H took what was a campy reality game show and turned it into a breeding ground of fresh new stars and exciting imports from the independent scene. Honestly, NXT put on some of the finest wrestling in the land between 2012 and 2018, and Triple H got a sizable chunk of the credit for it. Don't get me wrong, he deserved that credit. It's just funny how quickly we forget things sometimes. Number 3. John Cena Chanting John Cena sucks to the man's entrance music might be done in good faith today, but there was a time when fans were deadly serious about the man in the luminous shirts. Initially adored as a white boy rapper, Cena's perception in the eyes of the fans changed almost as soon as he became WWE Champion in 2005. Gone was everything that made him cool and edgy, replaced with a can-do positive attitude so manufactured you could smell the plastic residue through your screen. Cena became everything WWE fans hated about the company, a corporate 
Shill, who was there to sell wristbands more than anything else. However, that all changed once he won the United States Championship at WrestleMania 31. Through his US title open challenge, Cena put on the best match every single week with some of the best new talent around. Yeah, he still beat most of them, but they were elevated as a result, and this was a far cry from the Cena of old. Now Big Match John is seen as an elder statesman, someone who is willing to take time out of his movie schedule to pop in for a match and put someone over. And he's not the only Hollywood name on this list. Number 2. The Rock Before his net worth and muscle mass were the size of Germany's, Dwayne the Dwayne Dwayneson was one of wrestling's biggest stars. The Rock was arrogant, he was nasty, a bully who would put people down with zingers so severe that some people have never recovered from them. And the fans absolutely ate it up. However, before he was a staple of the Attitude Era, Rock looked and acted very differently indeed. Debuting at Survivor Series 1996, Rocky Maivia was a happy-go-lucky babyface who just wanted everyone to have a nice time. Fans, of course, hated it, and they let everybody know. Chants of Die Rocky Die routinely filled arenas when Maivia performed. No amount of matches or championship reigns could persuade people to cheer for the young star, so he was forced to turn to the dark side. Turning heel was the best thing The Rock ever did, and I'm including singing You're Welcome in that list. If he never got to show off his bewitching promo skills as a baddie, then there would have been no feud with Austin, no multiple world title reigns, no tooth fairy. That is not a world I want to live in. Number one, Roman Reigns. Like cousin, like, well, cousin. Although they were much, much more hesitant to do so, WWE inevitably discovered that Roman Reigns' true calling was as a nasty mob boss. After years of being shoved down our throats as the blue-eyed babyface WWE desperately wanted, Reigns returned at SummerSlam 2020 as the brutish, sadistic killer we all knew he could be. This return quickly evolved into the Tribal Chief gimmick, which brought Paul Heyman, then the Usos, then Sami Zayn and Solo Sokoa into the fight. Reigns' heel turn allowed WWE to build one of the best stables in years with the Bloodline, which has been responsible for some of the biggest and best moments and matches of the 2020s so far. We all knew that this was what Reigns was capable of. We had seen glimpses of it in The Shield and were desperate for Cool Roman to come back, but WWE just would not stop force-feeding us their squeaky clean image of the big dog. The difference between Roman's reception at WrestleMania 31 and WrestleMania 37 is unbelievable. In six years, he went from a hated hero to a revered godlike villain, and thank goodness he did. Let's just say his former incarnation was anything but Usi. Of the 53 men throughout history that have officially won the WWE Championship, only 30 of them have managed to win it more than once. Those 23 one-timers include some of the all-time greats. Pedro Morales, Superstar Billy Graham, Diesel, The Ultimate Warrior, Eddie Guerrero, all of these names only had one reign with the gold, and crucially, they made it count. Not these 10, though. Not these 10 at all. Even if some of them really did deserve better from their time with the title. I'm Adam Pachisi from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 worst one-time WWE Champions in history. Join us. Number 10, Big E. Well, this feels terrible. At the time of recording this video, beloved New Day member and owner of the sexiest thighs in all of wrestling, Big E, has still not returned to the ring after suffering a broken neck in March 2022. This fateful accident came just a couple of months after another travesty, his first and so far only run as WWE champ. Big E won the title from Bobby Lashley on an episode of Raw, cashing in his Money in the Bank contract to a huge ovation. He beat Lashley in a steel cage rematch and then successfully retained over Drew McIntyre at Crown Jewel. But wait, what's that Roman Reigns shaped outline in the distance? As everyone does, E came up short against the Tribal Chief at Survivor Series, losing clean as a whistle in a champion versus champion encounter. He then had a few more matches as champ before dropping the belt to Brock Lesnar at day one. Big E's time with the gold started off so promisingly, but quickly went downhill. Basically, he always felt like he was playing second fiddle, eventually losing the championship as part of WWE grander plan. Here's hoping he gets another run with the gold one day. We love you, E. 
Number 9. Sergeant Slaughter Before it was revealed that most of what he told people about his military career was a barefaced lie, Sergeant Slaughter was a respected legend amongst the wrestling community. In his heyday, he was a huge star in the AWA, NWA, and WWE, winning over fans with his all-American persona and tendency to call people maggots. His one and only title reign for Vince McMahon happened thanks to one man, and his name was Saddam Hussein. Slaughter switched allegiances from the US to Iraq as the very real Gulf War raged on. WWE capitalized on the molten heat this angle was generating by having Sarge beat WWE Champion The Ultimate Warrior at the 91 Royal Rumble. This was done with the sole intention of giving Hulk Hogan a feel-good victory at WrestleMania 7, which is exactly what happened. In total, Slaughter held the title for just 64 days and wrestled on TV just four times while champion. The short length of his reign, combined with his position as an obvious transitional champion, means that Slaughter's credentials as WWE's top star are about as strong as his ones as a Marine. Number 8. Dean Ambrose before he was shedding blood and not being blown up in AEW, John Moxley was the lunatic fringe Dean Ambrose. Debuting alongside Roman Reigns and Seth Rollins as The Shield, Ambrose became a firm favorite who fans were desperate to see achieve similar success as his fellow Hounds of Justice. At Money in the Bank 2016, they finally got their wish as Ambrose cashed in his newly won briefcase to take down Rollins and become WWE Champion. And then… bleh. After an underwhelming Shield triple threat at Battleground, Ambrose would carry the title over to SmackDown during the second brand split. Who was his first opponent on the blue brand? It was Dolph Ziggler. Nothing against Dolph, but they had a pretty disappointing encounter at SummerSlam, and then Ambrose finally dropped the belt to AJ Styles after the phenomenal one hit him right in the chutneys. Across 84 days as champion, Ambrose brought very little to the party. His matches were lackluster, his feuds even more so, and he was always much better positioned as a chaser rather than a holder. Safe to say, his time under Tony Khan has been much more fruitful. Number 7. Bray Wyatt Bray Wyatt became the first member of his historic wrestling lineage to win the big one when he captured the WWE title at Elimination Chamber 2017. This was off the back of his incredibly hot storyline with Randy Orton, which saw the Viper join up with Bray and Luke Harper as part of the Wyatt family. All of this would set the stage for the Eater of Worlds to battle his former follower at WrestleMania 33. Wait, I know this match. Ah, oh, it's the Insects match. In a now infamous face-off, Bray thought the best way to get one over on Randy would be to project images of creepy crawlies onto the ring canvas using all the PowerPoint skills two hours on the internet could grant him. He thought wrong as Orton handily beat Wyatt and took the title off him. The cult leader managed just one successful defense of the belt in a reign that lasted a measly 49 days. Most of his time as champion was spent crying because Randy burnt down his shed, which says it all really. Ah oh, well, at least his two Universal Championship reigns were much better. Oh. Number 6. Kane Both of Big Glenn's World Championship runs in WWE were pretty poor, but for entirely opposite reasons. His time with the World Heavyweight title in 2010 was arguably too long, running out of steam long before it actually ended. As for his sole WWE Championship reign in 1998, that was over far too quickly. The Big Red Machine won the title in very impressive fashion, ending the first reign of a certain Stone Cold Steve Austin at King of the Ring. Granted, this was in a first blood match with interference from everyone and their mums, but this was the Attitude Era. It was the style at the time. Feeling hard done by, Austin invoked his rematch clause the very next night on Raw. This turned out to be a very smart move, as the Texas Rattlesnake unseated the Big Red Machine to become a two-time champ. Despite being in the company for yonks after this, Kane never got another chance to hold the main title. This means he will forever be known as the 24-hour stopgap in Steve Austin's first two reigns, which is a damn shame for such an excellent performer. Number 5. Stan Stasiak Stan the Man Stasiak is best known for two things in wrestling. Firstly, he sired meat, and secondly, he was the man who Bruno Sammartino beat to become WWE Champion for the second time. 
After making his debut in 1958, Stasiak toured various promotions across his native Canada and then the United States. He had three stints in the World Wide Wrestling Federation, as it was known at the time, the second of which resulted in him becoming champion. He beat Pedro Morales in Philadelphia to end the Puerto Ricans 1,027 days with the gold. Then, nine days later, he faced San Martino in Madison Square Garden and did the job for the living legend. Of all the short-lived champions of the pre-Hulk Hogan era, Stasiak is the least remarkable. Buddy Rogers was the first, Ivan Koloff got to end the longest reign in the title's history, and the Iron Sheik? Well, there's no way he was ending up on here. I value my back too much. Unfortunately for Stan the Man, this was as good as it got. He knew it too, once describing his title reign as the happiest nine days of his life. Little Sean probably felt pretty disappointed with that statement, to be honest. Number 4. Jinder Mahal you knew he was going to be on here somewhere, you just didn't know where. On some level, you have to feel sorry for Jinder. He was thrust into a title reign for the sole cynical reason of exploiting his Indian heritage. He was given no extra training, his feuds were god-awful, and everybody hated him. And none of that was particularly his fault. On the other hand, we all had to sit through the five and a half months of Jinder Mahal as WWE Champion. Yes, it was funny at first, but the joke did soon get old. Mahal was frankly incapable of performing at the level he was pushed at, his moveset not good enough, his character not strong enough, his booking definitely wasn't great either. The fact that WWE thought bringing back the Punjabi prison would be a way to get Jinder over shows just how ill thought out this whole project was. There is no way he should have main evented so many pay-per-views. There is no way he should have stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with so many great wrestlers. There is no way he should have handed Shinsuke Nakamura his first main roster loss. Jinder, I love you, seriously, but this was a bad time. Number 3. Vince McMahon Vince McMahon Sr. famously warned his son against getting involved in the actual performance element of wrestling. Naturally, Vince Jr. booked himself to win his own world title at the grand age of 54. Take that, pops. After returning to TV as a babyface to stand up against the evil Triple H, Vince McMahon found himself in a match with the game for the top prize on a September 99 episode of SmackDown. After a buttload of help from his old foe Stone Cold, Vince's lifeless body was dragged on top of his future son in law whilst his actual son made the three count. Nepotism, the strongest finishing move there is. If this wasn't bad enough, Vince relinquished the belt just six days later. So not only did he win the championship, but he was never actually pinned for it. That puts McMahon alongside the elite few to have never been beaten while reigning as WWE Champion. All of this is, of course, objectively hilarious, but it also massively devalues the so-called greatest prize in wrestling. Luckily, WWE and Vince were Teflon at the time. Number 2. Andre the Giant in terms of wrestling as a spectacle, there were few greater and more important than Andre Rusimov. Billed as anywhere between 6 foot 11 and 7 foot 4, Andre the Giant was the attraction to end all attractions. His phenomenal size and power was simply awe-inspiring during the 70s and 80s as his unique traits made him a cross-cultural megastar. The star of The Princess Bride famously turned heel on Hulk Hogan to set up their WrestleMania 3 main event match, the contest made any attribute to the long-term success of WWE. Almost a year later, Hogan and Andre faced each other once again on the main event. In the most viewed American professional wrestling match ever, Andre shockingly beat the Hulkster after some industrial-scale shenanigans to end his three-plus years as champ. And then he went and sold the belt to Ted DiBiase about 30 seconds later. Were it not for this wrinkle, Andre might not have been on this list at all. What he did and how he did it were historic, but as a champion, he was rubbish, holding the title for less than a minute. Number 1. Rey Mysterio the other man to hold the WWE title for less than one day in total is the polar opposite of Andre in many ways. The diminutive Rey Mysterio overcame his significant size disadvantage to win two World Heavyweight Championships in WWE. He also won the WWE title, but that is something he's less keen to discuss. In the wake of Money in the Bank 2011, the company needed a new top champion. Mysterio and The Miz were the participants in a tournament final for a new 
version of the belt, which Ray won to secure the grand prize for the very first time. But soft, what light through yonder Cena breaks? Big Match John took a big old dump on Ray Ray, immediately challenging the luchador for the title. Later that night, Cena beat an already knackered Mysterio to win his ninth WWE Championship and shatter Ray's dreams into tiny little pieces. I mean, at least Andre had the honor of ending Hogan's mammoth reign and setting up the entirety of WrestleMania 4. All Mysterio did was prove how much of a sucker he is and, on one level, how much of a dick John Cena was. WrestleMania is all about excess. The biggest matches, the biggest spectacles, the biggest Flow Rider concerts. However, not every contest from the Showcase of the Immortals can be an epic. The following 10 matches all had entrances longer than their actual in-ring time as they all clocked in at well under a minute. Some were just meaningless fillabouts added on the day, but some were actually four championships, world championships at that. But hey, length doesn't matter, right? At least that's what I've been told. I'm Adam Pacisi from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 shortest WrestleMania matches ever. Join us. Number 10, Earthquake vs. Adam Bomb at WrestleMania 10, 35 seconds. One was named after a natural disaster, and one was created by a man-made one. The storyline writes itself. Supposedly a survivor of the Three Mile Island nuclear meltdown, Adam Bomb was the name used by future WCW star and one half of Chronic, Brian Clark. Mr. Bomb made his one and only WrestleMania appearance at the 10th edition of the show when he and manager Harvey Whippleman came out to chastise ring announcer Howard Finkel. They even had the nerve to put their hands on the Fink suit. Oh, the humanity. This was clearly too much for Earthquake to Earth take as the behemoth hurtled down to the ring to challenge the Atomic Man to a match. And what a bloody match it was. Not, because it only went 35 seconds. The big boy ran to the ring, flattened Bomb with a big splash, and that was it. Thanks for coming, see you later. In reality, Ludwig Borger was meant to wrestle here, but he was out with an injury. Earthquake took his place, but why this meant he had to totally squash Bomb is beyond me. It was the mid-90s, I suppose. Not much made sense. Number 9, Butterbean vs. Bart Gunn at WrestleMania 15, 35 seconds. Would you believe it? Two matches on this list went the exact same amount of time. Coincidence? Yeah, probably. Five years after Earthquake flattened Adam Bomb in a worked contest, poor old Bart Gunn was squashed for real by the terrifying Butterbean. This whole thing came about because Gunn had the audacity to win the ill-fated Brawl for All tournament months prior. If you don't know what that is, then look it up elsewhere because I just do not have the energy right now. Basically, Gunn wasn't supposed to win it, with Steve Dr. Death Williams expected to walk the thing and was fed to the wolves here as a result. In this boxing-style shoot fight, the bell rang, Gunn got his own bell rung, and he was knocked flat on his cowboy rear end in just over half a minute. This essentially spelled the end for Bartholomew as nobody was going to take him seriously after this one-sided drubbing. He was released shortly after this match and would spend the majority of the rest of his career wrestling in Japan. Number 8, The Red Rooster vs. Bobby Heenan at WrestleMania 5, 31 seconds. Bobby the Brain Heenan claimed that he was never actually trained to wrestle and that it all just came naturally to him. Normally, we'd call BS on a statement like this, but honestly, the brain could have told me that the sun was cold and I would have believed him. Love you, weasel. This experience meant that Heenan wasn't afraid to get physical when a storyline required it. Outside of taking some pretty insane bumps for his clients, Heenan would occasionally get in the ring himself, like he did against the Red Rooster at WrestleMania 5. During that pretends to be a chicken phase that we all go through, Terry Taylor called out the weasel for a spot of revenge after Heenan turned his back on him. He got that vengeance in quick fashion, countering a running attack to pin his former manager in 31 seconds. It's worth mentioning that Heenan had already been out to manage several clients earlier in the night and had taken a brutal press slam from the Ultimate Warrior. So, Terry Taylor, dressed as a farmyard animal, needed the warrior to soften up a middle-aged manager for him to beat. Go cluck yourself, Double T. Number 7, King Kong Bundy vs. SD Jones at WrestleMania 1, 23 seconds. The first ever WrestleMania, a seismic shift in the landscape of sports entertainment, one of the most memorable nights in WWE history. Okay, alright, most of WrestleMania 1 was actually kind of rubbish, but still, 
Mr. T was there and Liberace. What more could you want from a wrestling show? Because WWE hadn't figured out what it wanted WrestleMania to be yet, so the company put on some very odd matches in MSG that night. One of which was an honest-to-goodness squash match pitting veteran jobber Special Delivery Jones against resident monster King Kong Bundy. The walking condominium utterly murderized poor SD, defeating him in a blistering nine seconds. Wait, nine seconds? My notes say something else. Somebody's gonna get fired over this. Nine seconds was the official WWE time for this match, but in reality, the bout went 23 from bell to bell. WWE lying about numbers at WrestleMania? What a shocker. Regardless of the giant pork pie the company told, this is still an impressive feat that stood as the shortest WrestleMania match for a good eight years. In kayfabe terms, it was the shortest WrestleMania match for like 20 years, but shut your mouth. Number 6, Hulk Hogan vs. Yokozuna at WrestleMania 9, 22 seconds. It's okay, said my therapist. The controversial ending to WrestleMania 9 isn't real. It can't hurt you. Thanks a lot, Dr. O'Halloran. The subject of my walking nightmares was when Hulk Hogan came out at the end of the night to challenge newly minted WWE Champion Yokozuna for the title. Did he have a reason for doing this? Did it matter that Yoko had just gone through a match with Bret Hart? Of course it didn't. This was Hulk Hogan. Nothing else mattered. The Hulkster got in the ring, dodged a salt attack from Mr. Fuji, and dropped the leg to win the match and the title in under half a minute. In doing this, Hogan broke all sorts of records. Shortest main event in WrestleMania history, shortest WWE Championship match in WrestleMania history, biggest douchebag move in WrestleMania history. In a match that was meant to put over new main event talent, Hogan stormed in and completely stole everyone's thunder. It might have been okay had he gone through with his promise to put Hart over at a later date, but guess what? That never happened. Anyone got a number for a new therapist? Number 5, Rey Mysterio vs JBL at WrestleMania 25, 22 seconds. After trying and failing in numerous ways to get on the WrestleMania 25 card, John Bradshaw Layfield finally punched his ticket to Texas by beating CM Punk for the IC title. A title match was made against Rey Mysterio at the granddaddy of them all, where JBL promised one of the most dominant victories in Mania history. And brother, he wasn't wrong. After healing on his home state for a while, JBL jumped Mysterio before the bell. However, this backfired, leading to Mysterio knocking him down with a 619 before flattening the champion with a splash to win the match in 22 seconds. Mysterio must have spent longer putting his contacts in than he actually did wrestling on this night. Utterly humiliated by this defeat, JBL looked devastated, then, out of nowhere, decided to quit. At the time of writing, this was JBL's final non-Royal Rumble wrestling appearance for WWE. He must feel pretty disappointed that no one's driven a lorry full of Saudi money up to his house yet. Number 4, The Hart Foundation vs The Bolsheviks at WrestleMania 6, 19 seconds. Up to this point in the list, there's been at least one thing worth saying about the very short matches that we've talked about. Not this one though, this one was just short. WrestleMania 6, The Sky Dome in Toronto, Canada, the night Hulk Hogan faced the Ultimate Warrior in a winner-takes-all main event for the ages. That match was fantastic, this one not so much. The Bolsheviks, consisting of Nikolai Volkov and Boris Zukov, was set to take on Bret Hart and Jim Neidhart of the Hart Foundation. As they often did, the Bolsheviks began singing the Russian national anthem before the match. However, these die-hard patriots weren't going to stand for this. They jumped the Bolshies, hit their finishing move, and won faster than you can say Cold War tensions. In terms of why this match went so short, the only explanation I can come up with was to give the local crowd a feel-good moment watching their boys pick up the win. Except only Brett was actually from Canada, Jim was born in California. I don't know, maybe the Bolsheviks were too exhausted from their interactions with comedian Steve Allen a few minutes earlier? I don't know, let's move on. Number 3, Sheamus vs Daniel Bryan at WrestleMania 28, 18 seconds. Well hey, a match with some actual substance to it. The opening match of WrestleMania 28 was iconic for all the wrong reasons. Royal Rumble winner Sheamus was challenging Daniel Bryan for the American Dragon's World Heavyweight title. Fans were looking forward to a hard-hitting affair between these two young workhorses, but nobody could have predicted what happened next. 
After the bell rang, Brian took some time out to receive a good luck kiss from his on-screen girlfriend, AJ Lee. Then, when he turned around, he immediately got hit with a brogue kick, covered and beaten in just 18 seconds. That'll show you for kissing a girl. Everyone knows that's seven years bad luck. These 18 seconds would become integral to the next two years of WWE programming. It's this match here that ignited an organic groundswell of support for Brian as many felt that his talents were going to waste. This helped birth the Yes Chance, helped put together Team Hell No, which then led to Brian facing John Cena at SummerSlam 2013, WrestleMania 30, you all know the rest. So Brian getting squashed here was actually a good thing, right? Right? Number 2, Kane vs Chavo Guerrero at WrestleMania 24, 11 seconds. Here it is folks, the shortest championship match in WrestleMania history. On the pre-show for WrestleMania 24, the Big Red Machine last eliminated the world's strongest man to win a battle royal and become number one contender to the ECW Championship later that night. He won that match in 6 minutes and 22 seconds, which is almost 35 times longer than it took him to win the actual belt. As champion Chavo Guerrero was standing in the ring, his challenger's music began to play. Whilst the champ was staring up the ramp, Kane slid in behind him and stared him down with those big evil eyes. The bell rang, Chavo ran straight into a choke slam, and Kane pinned him in just 11 seconds to win the once prestigious prize. Not only was this the shortest title match in Mania history, but it was also the only time that this particular championship was ever featured on a WrestleMania card. Snooki got more time at Mania than the ECW Championship. The world can be a cruel place sometimes. Number 1. The Rock vs Eric Rowan at WrestleMania 32 6 seconds WrestleMania 33 from Dallas, Texas set a record attendance number for the show of shows, a heavily disputed 101,763 fans. The actual figure is supposedly around 93,000, but let's not spoil the fun. The Rock made his surprise return to announce this gargantuan number, but also to set his own name on fire with a cool flame gun. He was then ambushed by Bray Wyatt and his goons, leading to a promo battle between the two masters of the microphone that, in all honesty, went on a bit too long. Rock then challenged any member of the Wyatt family to a match, ripping off his sweatpants, Chris Pontius style, to reveal his Brahma bull trunks. Up stepped Eric Rowan, who tried to hit the Great One, only to eat a rock bottom, get pinned in 6 seconds, and lose the fastest match in WrestleMania history. Yeah, this was great for The Rock, but what about Rowan? Not only was he in a WrestleMania match with one of the best of all time, but his name will forever be associated with a record-setting moment in the show's history. Nice job, Mr. Redbeard. We salute you. With WrestleMania out of the way, let's turn our attention to the real biggest show of the year, Backlash! With the 2023 event set to emanate from Puerto Rico, fans are expecting big things to happen to mark WWE's long-awaited return to the island. The show immediately following the big one has often thrown up some pretty interesting scenarios as the company looks to take its new creative plans to the next level. Will anything on the card this year top these memorable moments? We'll have to wait and see. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 greatest things to happen on the pay-per-view after WrestleMania. Join us! Number 10. Spotlight on Cena at Backlash 2009 One month after John Cena won the World Heavyweight Championship in a triple threat at WrestleMania 25, he would put the belt on the line at Backlash against the man he took it from. Edge took on the leader of the C-Nation in a last man standing match which, as you can imagine, got pretty bloody intense. Just when it looked like Big Match John was going to win the day with an attitude adjustment, there was a run-in, which was actually more of a jog-in, from none other than the world's largest athlete. Big Show had also been in the world title match at Mania and wanted to exact his revenge on the winner. He picked up Cena like he weighed nothing at all before hurling him into a giant spotlight that blew up in a shower of sparks. This was easily one of the more adventurous spots of this time period and one of the biggest bumps John Cena has ever taken. Seriously, he sold this like he was half dead. 
At least I hope he was selling. Number 9. The Inferno Match at Unforgiven in Your House The penultimate match to take place at WrestleMania 14 was the first time one-on-one -on -one meeting between The Undertaker and his demonic half-brother, Kane. Technically, the two had fought in a singles match back in 1995, but that's when Kane was a dentist, so it doesn't count. The Undertaker was able to overcome his satanic sibling after hitting him with three tombstone pile drivers. For their rematch a month later, WWE needed to up the stage and so decided to turn up the heat. Do you get it? Because they put fire around the ring. At the first ever Unforgiven event in April 1998, Taker and Kane went to war once again in the first ever Inferno match. There were no pinfalls or submissions here. The winner would be the first person to set their opponent ablaze. Unfortunately, the in-ring action wasn't especially brilliant here as the match's gimmick severely limited how much space the wrestlers had to perform. Still, the sight of a wrestling ring surrounded by flames was every 14-year-old wrestling fan's dream come true. And if you think I have the time or energy to argue with a bunch of teenagers, then think again. Number 8. Nash's Leg Up at In Your House 7 Good Friends Better Enemies as its title would suggest, the seventh in your house was themed around two former pals having a bust up. The friends in question were the newly minted WWE champion Shawn Michaels and his former bodyguard and real life click pal Diesel. They would be wrestling on a show that also saw the Ultimate Warrior take on Gold Dust in what can comfortably be described as the worst match of the whole year. In fact, to even call it a match is a bit of an insult. Anyway, Michaels vs. Diesel was much better as the two buddies had incredible in-ring chemistry. The whole match deserves a place on this list, but if we had to pick just one moment, it would be this one. Before the match started, legendary wrestler Morris Mad Dog Vachon was shown sat in the crowd. This played into the bout itself when Diesel accosted the future Hall of Famer, throwing him out of his seat before pulling off his prosthetic leg to use as a weapon. The sight of Kevin Nash wielding a man's fake limb like a lightsaber is truly one for the ages and something that could only happen in the wacky and wonderful world of pro wrestling. Number 7. Goldberg's First Match at Backlash 2003 The Rock was riding high the night after WrestleMania 19, having finally defeated Stone Cold Steve Austin at the Showcase of the Immortals. Finally, he thought, The Rock is done with massively over bald-headed men with goatees. Well, not quite. Rock's victory speech on Raw was cut off by a debuting Bill Goldberg. The hottest homemade star in WCW history had finally arrived in WWE and set his sights firmly on the People's Champion. This was gonna be juicy. After Goldberg speared Dwayne so hard that the microphone glitched out, it was clear that these two were going to face off somewhere down the line. And the two icons fought in the main event of Backlash 2003. They were given 14 minutes to play with, which is about 10 minutes too long for your average Goldberg match, but that is besides the point. Bill won the match with his trademark combo to send The Rock back to Hollywood and put himself on a collision course with the World Heavyweight Champ. If only we'd known then what we know now, we could have all warned Goldberg to stay as far away from that belt as humanly possible. Number 6. Titus World Slide at the Greatest Royal Rumble It doesn't feel quite right, but the Greatest Royal Rumble was the first pay-per-view to take place after WrestleMania 34. WWE's first major visit to Saudi Arabia was headlined by the gigantic titular match. 50 men would all compete for the chance to win the biggest Rumble match of all time and take home a hideous green belt that would never be seen again. Seriously, is that thing still in Braun's attic or something? When the time came for the 39th entrant to make his way down to the ring, the Saudi Arabian crowd was treated to the music of Titus O'Neil. The former primetime player ran down to the ring and in one moment of pure joy changed his career forever. We all know what happened, the big man lost his footing and slid headfirst under the ring. This event, dubbed Titus World Slide, would capture the attention of the wrestling internet like few other things ever have, and Titus became a walking meme overnight. Forget any of his actual matches or his amazing charity work, this is Titus's greatest contribution to the world. Number 5. Bailey Cashes In at Money in the Bank 2019 Technically, the first WWE live streaming event after WrestleMania 35 was The Shield's final chapter, which played host to Dean Ambrose's farewell bout. However, we are not counting that because A, it wasn't on pay per view, and B, we really don't want to. So let's skip ahead to May 19th, don't tell Kane, and the 
2019 Money in the Bank show. Having won both the Raw and SmackDown Women's Championships at WrestleMania, Becky Lynch was set to defend her two belts on the same night. She successfully retained the Raw strap over Lacey Evans, but dropped the SmackDown one to Charlotte Flair immediately after. Never fear though, a certain hugger was around to save the day. Bailey had won the women's briefcase earlier that night and swooped in to cash in on her fellow horsewoman. The crowd popped several times throughout the segment, once when Bailey's music hit, once when it became clear that she was cashing in, and once when she pinned the queen off an elbow drop to become the new champion. This could be the best women's money in the bank cash in of all time. Although if you look at what it's up against, then that really isn't saying much, I guess. Number four, the Shield clean house at Extreme Rules 2013. We might not be talking about their final chapter, but we can discuss when the Shield swept the board at the 2013 Extreme Rules pay-per-view. Seth Rollins, Dean Ambrose, and Roman Reigns all made their WrestleMania debuts in the opening contest of Mania 29. After beating the slapdash trio of Seamus, Randy Orton, and The Big Show, the three upstarts then set their sights on some titles. First up was Dean Ambrose, who took on Kofi Kingston for the United States Championship. After a fairly short match, Ambrose would win the belt and then go on to barely defend for almost a year. Then came Reigns and Rollins, who teamed up to challenge Team Hell No for the WWE Tag Team Championships. The men in vests overcame Daniel Bryan and Kane to win the gold, completing the faction's clean sweep. With titles around the waist of each member, the Shield now looked more dominant than ever. Surprisingly few factions in the history of WWE had ever managed to hold championships at the same time, putting the Hounds of Justice up there with the very best. And speaking of groups winning lots of titles, number three, the power trip hold the gold at Backlash 2001. WWE fans were not overly receptive to the idea of booing Stone Cold Steve Austin following his heel turn at WrestleMania X7. That would be like asking them to boo a kitten in a hat. Impossible. To make Austin the healiest heel that ever healed, they paired him up with Ultra Dick Triple H to form the two-man power trip. This new partnership set up a very intriguing match for the main event of Backlash 2001. WWE Champion Stone Cold and Intercontinental Champion Triple H against World Tag Team Champions The Brothers of Destruction for all the marbles. Why not throw in some vouchers for WWF New York whilst you're at it? After a whole bunch of interference and shenanigans, the power trip won the match and confirmed their position as the most powerful group in all of WWE. Granted, this didn't last long as Triple H's leg exploded shortly after, but for one brief moment, this was awesome. Number two, Orton vs. Foley at Backlash 2004. Randy Orton was a right little punk in 2004, and not in a cool split pin through the nose kind of way. He was a jumped up little prick with a fixation on destroying legendary wrestlers. One wrestler that crossed his path was Mick Foley, whom the young Viper humiliated at every possible turn. At WrestleMania 20, Orton and his evolution buddies defeated the Rock and Sock Connection in a handicap match. Tired of having other people fight Randy's battles, Foley challenged the Intercontinental Champion to a match at Backlash. Only it would be no disqualification and he would be wrestling as Cactus. Jack. Uh oh. In much the same way as he'd done with Triple H four years earlier, Foley used his signature match type to give Randy the rub. This brutal affair, filled with thumbtacks and barbed wire, tested the limits of what the youngster was capable of and gave him a huge win over an established name. Also, the match itself absolutely ruled. It was bloody, it was brutal, it was, well, it was a Mick Foley match. It was never going to be soft and fluffy, was it? Come on. Number one, The Rock beats Triple H at Backlash 2000. Oh, WrestleMania 2000, what could have been? Despite playing host to the likes of the Triangle Ladder Match and the Eurocontinental Triple Threat, the rest of WrestleMania 2000 felt a little off. And that includes the main event, the McMahon in every corner match for the WWE title. Many felt that the addition of Mick Foley in the Big Show overcomplicated things and that this spot should have gone to a singles match between WWE Champion Triple H and The Rock. Well, one month later, that's exactly what we got. 
With the deck firmly stacked against him, the Great One challenged the game for the top prize. Interference by the Bucketful meant the Rocky was in a tight spot, but that all changed when the glass shattered. A still-injured Stone Cold made his way to the ring, clobbering everyone in sight with a steel chair. This gave the Rock the chance to hit the people's elbow and pick up the win to the delight of the crowd. See, this should have been the end of Mania. Honestly, WWE, you boggle my mind sometimes. A good old-fashioned wrestling war tends to bring out the best and worst of companies as they battle for supremacy and, in many cases, their professional lives. In the heat of battle, every minor interpromotional incident can get put under a microscope, but once the dust settles, some things tend to be consigned to history as a grand scheme of things approach takes hold. Well, I say sod the grand scheme of things, let's open old wounds, examine past beefs, and look at the contention on-screen and backstage moments that are too interesting to be mere footnotes. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 Forgotten Wrestling War Moments. Join us! Number 10. Heyman Sue's WCW as the proud owner of Extreme Championship Wrestling, Paul Heyman had to deal with his fair share of lawsuits. But Paulie Dangerously, himself the son of a lawyer, was also far from afraid to litigate. And it didn't matter if you were a feared bully with a reputation for not giving a toss about much of anything. For example, when he sued Bill Watts and WCW after the new booker allegedly made some pretty anti-Semitic comments towards the manager. Watts didn't like Heyman and made sure that the new New Yorker knew as much. Far from an isolated incident, the cowboy reportedly lashed out in an uncouth way on several occasions prior to Paul's dismissal. Heyman retaliated by suing his former employer for wrongful termination and ethnic discrimination. The suit was settled out of court, with Heyman supposedly earning enough to fund the running of ECW. You know, until the check started bouncing and people started serving him with summons anyway. Heyman had every right to file against Watts and WCW, but but it's often overlooked how the outcome would shape the future of the supposed mid-90s wrestling war. Number 9. Sabalicious Speaking of lawsuits, Sable left WWE in acrimonious circumstances in June of 1999, subsequently filing a $110 million lawsuit against the company, citing sexual harassment and an unsafe working environment. The Playboy cover girl was one of the hottest properties on the planet, both figuratively and literally, and so of course there was interest in her from WWE's closest competition. On the June 14th, 1999 episode of Nitro, the blonde bombshell was filmed sitting in the Front row. Though never referred to as either Sable or Rena Mero, her appearance caused a huge stir in the arena as well as a couple of hundred miles away in Titan Towers. Rena was still under contract with WWE at the time and, well, Vince McMahon was not happy about her showing up on the other show. The appearance was brokered by Kevin Nash, who felt like Rena could be a game changer at a time that WCW was really starting to struggle. Big Sexy made sure it was all good with Turner's legal department with the former women's champion herself claiming that she bought her own ticket to the event. It got people talking and probably almost gave Vince a heart attack, but ultimately, Mero's brief and sole WCW appearance was probably more trouble than it was worth for Eric Bischoff and company. Number 8. Failure to Fly Though they were, in reality, always a very distant second, TNA did give WWE reason to glance over their shoulders from time to time. Like in the run-up to WrestleMania 24 in 2008, when Dixie Carter's company planned to fly a plane over the Citrus Bowl advertising Impact on Spike TV. TNA had done a lot of promotion while WWE were in town for Mania, but their big banner idea wouldn't get off the ground. Literally. The publicity stunt never ended up happening after WWE got wind of the idea and shut it down. They tracked the company that was going to fly the plane and somehow convinced them not to take off. The plane people told TNA management that they couldn't perform due to weather, even though several other businesses flew banners overhead at the showcase of the Immortals. TNA were naturally quite peeved by their big plan being foiled, so at the Arena for Raw the next night, they sent a truck with a large screen showing TNA clips. W WWE duly had it kicked out of the car park as Dixie pondered the price of a parachute. Number 7. The Mole 
While the Monday Night Wars were primarily fought between WWE and WCW, the role of ECW should not be forgotten. Whether it was influencing the creative decision of the two majors or producing talent that would then move to the big time, ECW more than played their part in the mid to late 90s. And while Vince McMahon had a not-so-secret agreement with Paul Heyman's promotion and would compensate ECW when they signed one of their wrestlers, Eric Bischoff had no such relationship with the Philadelphia-based promotion. WCW did, however, have people working with someone on the inside of ECW to help them poach talent. The so-called mole was none other than ECW founder Todd Gordon, who assisted some roster members in secretly brokering deals with front office WCW people like Kevin Sullivan and Terry Taylor. There was even talk of a potential ECW invasion of WCW. Pfft, that would never work. But the whole scheme blew up when Tommy Dreamer overheard a damning voicemail from Taylor to Gordon. Todd was fired, while his reported accomplice Bill Alfonso had to fight for his job in that brutal bloodbath with Beulah McGillicutty. Number 6. RVD Refuses to J-O-B WCW might not have gotten their ECW invasion in 1997, but WWE certainly did. Simultaneously freshening up a stagnant WWE product and promoting ECW's maiden pay-per-view, Barely Legal, it was short-lived but served its purpose. The interpromotional rivalry would sort of continue following Barely Legal, with Rob Van Dam rebranding himself Mr. Monday Night and showing up on Raw, managed by Jerry Lawler. It was a good showcase for RV D and ECW, but things soured rather quickly when the whole flipping show refused to do the whole flipping job for Jesse James on an episode of Shotgun Saturday Night. Van Damme felt that it wouldn't benefit him as a main eventer in ECW to lose to a lower card WWE guy, even if it was suggested that he would be counted out and not pinned in the middle. His refusal to do the honors rubbed backstage officials the wrong way, with Heyman attempting to smooth things over while simultaneously egging his own star on. This pretty much killed Van Damme's WWE run, and the company were at pains to remind him about who the bosses were when he went to negotiate with them a few years later. Number 5. Cookie Gate Remember when DX invaded WCW on a tank? Well, of course you do. WWE have shown it approximately 50,000 times since, and yes, it was a tank. Do you remember when TNA invaded WWE's 2005 West Side Story-themed Royal Rumble commercial shoot with cookies and balloons? Probably not, because there was no tank, so really who cares? Well, WWE did at the time, actually, even though they should have probably expected it since they were filming on a Universal Studios soundstage not far from where TNA taped their TV. Tracy Brooks, Abyss, Shane Douglas, Conan, and BG Road Dog Jane showed up to greet the WWE crew with the idea that there would be some juicy confrontation, but nothing much came of it. They did film several members of the WWE roster, including Luther Reigns, Eddie Guerrero, and a maskless Rey Mysterio, which prompted WWE's legal department to request the footage be handed over, lest Jerry McDevitt start flexing his legal muscles. TNA didn't surrender the tape, and in fact aired a heavily edited version several weeks later at their Turning Point pay-per-view. It wasn't exactly a home run or anything, but it did annoy people within WWE, so mission accomplished, I guess? Number 4. Game Over for Goldberg Come June of 2000, the would-be Monday Night Wars were, for all intents and purposes, long over. WWE was on fire, while WCW, and ECW for that matter, were circling the drain. The distance between Raw and Nitro was vast, but the distance between Triple H and Bill Goldberg was pretty short when they both attended the same licensing fair in New York that month. The man had been seething at the Cerebral Assassin since Helmsley made some negative comments about him in interviews, referring to the former WCW heavyweight champion as a one-hit wonder and inferring that Vince McMahon wouldn't take him even if he was available. Good one, Hunter. Goldberg decided to vent his frustrations at the game, yelling at him and looking mad while Trips reportedly just laughed the whole thing off. Stephanie McMahon, who was at the fair with her on-screen squeeze on the other hand, was incredulous. Most who witnessed the confrontation agreed that Goldberg came off really badly and that Triple H handled it in the right way. The residual heats persisted until they eventually worked together three years later. Number 3. When Worlds Collide 
Just because Paul Heyman took Ted Turner's money in 1993 and used it to help fund ECW didn't mean that he was done sending letters to WCW's legal department. A year later, Heyman threatened to sue WCW for copyright infringement after they co-promoted the AAA pay-per-view When Worlds Collide, which was a name ECW had used for one of their big events many months earlier. In a bit of irony, ECW had named their show that in reference to a talent exchange agreement they had in place with WCW. WCW, as they were loaned Arn Anderson and Bobby Eaton, with Terry Funk and others working WCW events in return. The talent exchange agreement fell apart when ECW ran a show in Florida, which WCW claimed was their territory. But in order to defuse tensions due to the When Worlds Collide fiasco, WCW agreed to send three of its contracted wrestlers, Kevin Sullivan, Steve Austin and Sherry Martell. The injured Austin was ultimately replaced by Brian Pillman, but Heyman was satisfied and agreed not to sue WCW for at least two weeks. Number two, naughty old JR. All right, before we start, no, we are not talking about the Hall of Fame announcer's saucy Twitter activity. Instead, we are talking about the rather innocent pre-social media year of 1993, when Jim Ross was unceremoniously dumped by World Championship Wrestling thanks to a shakeup in upper management. Relegated from being the voice of WCW to a glorified salesman for the syndicated TV department, Ross saw the writing on the wall and asked for his release in February. However, JR still had control over his Wrestling with Jim Ross radio show and, after negotiating with WWE, used an episode of it to introduce guests Vince McMahon, Shawn Michaels, and Bobby Heenan. Vince used the opportunity to reveal that Ross would be signing with the World Wrestling Federation, hyping him up as the best commentator in the biz. The rest of the show functioned as a preview for the upcoming WrestleMania 9, where Ross would make his on-screen WWE debut. And that's all fine and dandy, but the main sponsor of the show, which aired on at Atlanta's WSB station was WCW. Even though JR hadn't formally been given his release at that point, he used a legal loophole to make the jump and then stick it to his ex-employers on the air. The boys at Turner Broadcasting could consider their knockers well and truly slobbered on this one. Number 1. Burning Bridges and Title Belts TNA were a company on the rise in the summer of 2006, and so WWE's decision to relaunch ECW as a third brand must have put them on their toes, especially when some of their former stars like Sabu and Monty Brown decided to sign on for it. One wrestler who didn't come back for the revival was the last official ECW champion. Rather than accept an offer to come back to work for Vince McMahon having been released a year prior, Rhino and TNA instead used their platform to throw down the gauntlet to the genetic jackhammer. Opening the July 13th, 2006 episode of Impact, the Man Beast took shots at Vince and ECW and praised TNA. Going one step further, Rhino went to the backstage area and threw the original ECW World Heavyweight title belt into a flaming garbage can, proclaiming death to ECW, long live TNA. Medusa, eat your heart out. Of course, the war machine didn't actually set the thing on fire, but it was an impassioned promo nonetheless and a reminder that TNA weren't going away anytime soon. Because friendship is a disease in the eyes of Vince McMahon, WWE has seen plenty of tag teams split up over the years. While some partings have gone down in history, see that coward Marty Jannetty trying to escape Shawn Michaels through the barbershop window, some have been far less impressive. Today we are ranking the breakups based on how they went down, what happened after, and all the money that was left on the table. Trust me, there was a lot of it. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 worst WWE Tag Team Breakups. Join us! Number 10. The Smoking Guns before Billy was daddy ass and before Bart was cannon fodder for Butterbean, this pair of kayfabe brothers were a tag team by the name of the Smoking Guns. The pair debuted together in 1993 and would go on to win three sets of world tag team titles. Cracks started to appear in the siblings' relationship when manager Sonny abandoned them in 1996. This led to Billy walking out on Bart during a match, costing his team the win. Hang on a second, Bart won the match anyway. So what was the point of Billy walking out on him like that? Anyway, the two men continued to butt heads throughout the rest of the year. They were on opposite sides of a match at Survivor Series, well, the pre-show anyway, and then squared off in a singles match on Raw, which ended after five minutes when Bart dropped Billy on the top rope and gave him a neck injury. 
By the time they finally had a conclusive blow-off match, the tiny amount of momentum from their underwhelming split had fizzled out and died. In fact, Billy was even calling himself Rockabilly by this point, which should tell you all you need to know. Number 9. Why 2 AJ when AJ Styles first debuted for WWE at the 2016 Royal Rumble, the minds of fans ran amok with ideas of dream matches and feuds for the phenomenal one. He soon settled into a program with Chris Jericho, whom he beat at Fastlane. Jericho then extended the olive branch to his adversary, saying that they should form a tag team together. Thus, Y2AJ was born. Y2AJ quickly picked up a pair of wins over tag champs The New Day, leading to a title match between the two duos on Raw. The champions retained, which led to Jericho turning on his partner after all of three weeks together. Styles and Jericho went through about half a year's worth of storyline beats in less than a month. They feuded, got together, split up, and then they had a match at WrestleMania. Putting these two in a team in the first place was a bit of a weird idea, and their breakup shortly thereafter was even stranger. By the way, if anyone out there actually bought one of those Y2AJ t-shirts, then please tell me. I'm so curious. Number 8. The Primetime Players the primetime players of Titus O'Neil and Darren Young have the notable exception of being part of not one, but two failed breakup storylines. First appearing as a unit in 2012, PTP went on a decent little run in the tag division, coming close to winning the straps on several occasions. Unfortunately, even with their million dollar moves, O'Neill and Young didn't stay on the same page for long. Titus attacked Darren in early 2014, turning the big man heel and leading to a major grudge match at Elimination Chamber. That battle was so intense, so violent, so emotional, that their rematch ended up being on an episode of Main Event. What an upgrade. A year later, the two former friends reunited once again and even ended up winning the WWE Tag Team Championships. After that reign ended, they fell into obscurity, and then guess what happened? O'Neill turned on Young again. When will you learn, Darren? Anyway, this feud didn't even get a pay-per-view blow-off, instead culminating in a lackluster match on Raw. But hey, Bob Backlund was involved this time. That's gotta be worth something, right? Right? Number 7. The Bella Twins Nikki and Brie Garcia, as they are now known, turned on each other so many times in WWE that it would be impossible to recount every single story beat in one entry. And it would also be really boring. At SummerSlam 2014, they actually provided fans with quite a bit of excitement. Brie was wrestling Stephanie McMahon after the former came to her husband Daniel Bryan's aid against the authority. Just when it looked like she had the boss's daughter beat, Brie was viciously assaulted by her own sister and Steph picked up the win. Wow, what a shocking moment! I hope the rest of the storyline's this good. Well, what followed was months and months of unbearable television. The twins had a pair of failed interventions on Raw, including the infamous Died in the Womb segment, before Nikki beat Brie in a match that made the loser the servant of the winner. And what happened after that? Brie sided with her sister again by kissing AJ Lee at Survivor Series to help Nikki win the Divas Championship. We are so far removed from that great SummerSlam moment that it is but a mere dot on the horizon. Number 6. Heavy Machinery Many an eyebrow was raised when Otis won the 2020 Men's Money in the Bank, and not in a cool Dwayne Johnson kind of way. Otis was popular, but was he really ready to be the next world champion? The answer was, unfortunately, no. WWE seemingly realized they had made a mistake and booked the big man to lose his briefcase to The Miz at Hell in a Cell. Just to make Otis look even more of a loser, they had his long-term partner Tucker turn on him too. Starting in NXT as heavy machinery, Tucky and Otis were called up to the main roster in 2019. They never won tag team gold, but were solidly over thanks to their obvious chemistry. This all came to an end when Tucker betrayed his ham-loving friend because of… reasons. Something about him playing second fiddle? I don't know, it was all done a bit half-heartedly. So, did the two men ever get a chance to fight each other in the ring? Like balls they did. Tucker essentially vanished from our screens, made an appearance in the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal on SmackDown, and then got released a week later. Chad Gable would never. Number 5. Rusev Day You there, boy! What day is it? Why, it's Christmas Day, sir! 
No, you moron, it's obviously Rusev Day! Because every day is Rusev Day. What began as a silly little joke quickly turned into a wildly popular tag team and stable featuring Rusev, Aiden English, and Lana. The reaction Rusev and English got at Clash of Champions 2017 was insane, and the company should have just put the tag belts on them then and there. But they didn't. However, WWE did decide to clunkily break up the group about a year later. Things got a bit weird when English turned on the future Miro and began proclaiming to have slept with his wife. Thankfully, this wasn't true, so after debunking the affair, Rusev beat English on a random episode of SmackDown, and that was that. He would turn heel and join forces with Shinsuke Nakamura shortly thereafter. How WWE didn't make a bigger deal out of Rusev Day is still baffling. It was a bona fide phenomenon that elevated every person involved, and yet it led to nothing. Number 4. Enzo and Cass W-A-S-T-E-D Wasted Potential Those two words perfectly sum up Enzo Amore and Big Cass, who were easily one of the most popular tandems around at the time. From their rise in NXT to their transfer to the main roster, Enzo and Cass wowed crowds with their charisma, solid tag team wrestling, and never-ending conveyor belt of catchphrases. Over the summer of 2017, both men were mysteriously attacked backstage. After Corey Graves decided to lead an investigation into the assaults, it was revealed that the man behind it all was… Big Cass. Turns out he had attacked Enzo and then faked his own attack to cover it up. Bit elaborate, but alright then. They had a pay-per-view match at Great Balls of Fire, which Cass won. Then came SummerSlam, where Cass fought Big Show whilst Enzo was suspended above the ring in a shark cage. How the hell did that happen? The feud ended unexpectedly when Cass legitimately hurt himself during a street fight on Raw. The thing is, the worst part of it all was that this breakup never really needed to happen in the first place. The act was actually fine as it was. As I said, wasted potential. Number 3. The Legion of Doom Sometimes, weaving a wrestler's personal life into a gimmick can be a highly effective way to add realism to a story. However, when their personal life includes a very real addiction to drugs and alcohol, maybe it's best left alone? Because WWE have all the tact of an elephant being dropped from a plane, they decided to incorporate Road Warrior Hawk's substance abuse issues into the breakup of beloved tag team The Legion of Doom. In storyline, Road Warrior Animal was sick of Hawk's unreliability, and so replaced him with Darren Drozdov, whose nickname was Puke. Again, tact. Things were already bad when the promotion decided to really push the boundaries of good taste by having Hawk climb up the Titantron on Raw and claim that he was going to jump. Droz went up to save him, but ended up pushing the Road Warrior off instead. I mean, that's one way to break up a team, by killing off one of the members. The whole thing got over like cholera, so the angle was dropped and both men left the company shortly afterwards. Number 2. The Miz and Damian Mizdow When it comes to creating chicken salad from chicken, well, you know, there are few better examples in wrestling history than Damian Sandow and his stunt double gimmick. In 2014, the newly branded Damian Mizdow was brought in as a second to The Miz during his Hollywood A-lister gimmick. As his stunt double, Mizdow would take all the same bumps as his employer during his matches, despite the fact that he himself wasn't actually wrestling anyone. This duo got massively over and even landed the pair the WWE Tag Team titles at Survivor Series. After months of being belittled by the wannabe megastar, Mizdow finally snapped and threw Miz out of the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royale to a huge ovation. And that is when it all started to go downhill. Sandow, who reverted back to his original name, got the better of Miz a few times, but would eventually lose a match on Raw to determine the owner of the Miz name. He then went back to his old impersonator gimmick, vanished for an age, and got cut in 2016. They seriously had one of the hottest storylines in the company at the time, and they didn't even get a pay-per-view match out of it. What a bloody tragedy. Number 1. The Dudley Boys 
We try to avoid tag teams being split up by drafts on this list, as they happen all the time. However, one example stands out above the rest in terms of how stupid an idea it was. Bubba Ray and Devon had always been presented as a cohesive unit following their WWE debut in 1999. Then, during the inaugural 2002 brand split, Bubba was drafted to Raw and Devon to SmackDown. I mean, if you were Vince McMahon or Ric Flair, why would you not just draft both men over as a team? Actually, scratch that, both of those guys have a history of making very bad decisions. Bubba fought in the hardcore division for a bit, whilst Devon became a reverend and introduced the world to Deacon Batista. They achieved very little on their own and were back together on Raw before the year was out. Sure, it's nice to try new things, but can you really call what WWE did with the Dudleys trying? If they were going to split them up, then they should have had better plans for them, but at least they were put back together before too much damage had been done. You know what they say, if you can't join them, beat them with a steel chair. Some of wrestling's biggest ever moments have come courtesy of a good old fashioned heel turn. Andre the Giant ripping Hulk Hogan's shirt, Steve Austin siding with Vince McMahon, Goldust breaking up the golden truth. Wait, how did that one get in there? NXT is no stranger to this phenomenon, and today we are looking at some of the best times wrestlers from developmental went to the dark side. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 biggest heel turns in NXT history. Join us! Number 10, Bron Breaker. The most recent turn on this list took place the night after NXT's Adamant-themed extravaganza, Stand and Deliver. The third event under that name went down a treat, thanks to the numerous great matches and moments taking place across the show. Wesley retained the North American Championship in a fast-paced five-way match, Johnny Gargano returned to his spiritual home to exact revenge on Grayson Waller, and who could forget the heartwarming moment where Chase U defeated Schism to save the school? Honestly, just thinking about it now is making me tear up. The night was closed out by an excellent match that saw Carmelo Hayes beat Bron Breaker to become the new NXT champion. On the next episode of NXT, it looked like Breaker was taking his loss well. He congratulated the new champ, raised his hand, and oh wait, he's just clotheslined him. Never mind. Since turning heel, Breaker's character has undergone a much needed shift. His more aggressive persona is a far cry from the clean cut babyface he used to be, and it all started with this well timed switch to the naughty side. Side. Number 9, Io Shirai. Before she almost left WWE, changed her name to Io Sky, and added a Y into her first name for no good reason, Io Shirai was one of the most popular women down in NXT. She was engaged in a feud with Shayna Baszler for the NXT Women's Championship, but was constantly thwarted by the champ's buddies Marina Shafir and Jessamine Duke. Never fear though, because Shirai had some huge backup on the way. Well, not huge in terms of height, but you know what I mean. Candice LeRae helped even the odds at TakeOver 25, but this still wasn't enough to give Io the win. A few weeks later, Shirai lost another title match to Baszler, this time in a steel cage. Losing your third straight title match must not feel great, but that's no excuse to attack someone who's trying to help you. Sadly, nobody told Io this because she started leathering Larray, turning evil in the process. Not only was this a shocking moment at the end of a hard-fought match, but it also set Shirai's character in an interesting new direction. She would beat Larray at TakeOver Toronto, cementing her status as a baddie. Number 8, El Hijo del Fantasma One of the many, many unforeseen issues brought about by the pandemic was that NXT Cruiserweight Champion Jordan Devlin was stuck in Ireland and unable to defend his title on the show. NXT worked around this by holding a tournament to crown an interim champion, the finals of which came down to Drake Maverick and El Hijo del Fantasma. The masked Mexican defeated Birmingham's finest to pick up the gold leading to an in-ring celebration the following week. However, just like my last birthday party, the moment was ruined when two blokes in masks showed up. I still have no idea how they found me. Just as it looked like the two finalists were about to team up, Phantasma turned on Maverick and joined the Luchadors in attacking him. All three men later removed their coverings, unveiling themselves as Legado del Phantasma. Nobody cared that this was disrespecting Lucha tradition, because look how bloody handsome they are! <laughs> this turn worked wonders for the newly christened Santos Escobar, as he now had a title and his own stable. It set him up as one of NXT's major players, and did so in style. 
Number 7. Dakota Kai The first ever women's war game match in WWE history took place at the titular NXT event back in 2019. On one side, you had Shayna Baszler, Bianca Belair, Io Shirai, and Kaylee Ray. On the other, there was Rhea Ripley, Candice LeRae, Tegan Knox, and that slimy little rat, Dakota Kai. Maybe I should explain myself. Kai and Knox have been best buds leading up to war games, with the former even helping the latter when she was out with an injury. Sadly, Kai's jealousy grew too strong, and she snapped. When it was her time to enter the match, the Kiwi star instead started laying waste to her Welsh counterpart. Dakota brutally beat down her former friend's injured leg, taking her and herself out of the match to leave her squad high and dry. The turn was executed perfectly. Nobody saw it coming, it was well justified within storyline and added significant jeopardy to the match. It also birthed a singles feud between Kai and Knox that would blow off in hardcore fashion at the following takeover. So there you go, now you know why I was so angry at Kai earlier. I don't just hate people from New Zealand. Number 6. Johnny Gargano To be clear, we don't mean that heel turn that led to all the one final beat nonsense in 2020. That was way too much. Instead, we are looking back at when former NXT champion Alistair Black got taken out ahead of his scheduled triple threat bout at TakeOver Brooklyn 4. Who could have done this? Perhaps it was Tommaso Ciampa, the cold-hearted NXT champion who had beaten Black for the belt in the first place. Or it could be his former DIY partner a man many assumed would never turn to the dark side. On the October 24th, 2018 edition of the show, it was revealed that it was in fact Johnny Wrestling who had assaulted Black in the Big Apple. The future Malachi hit the ring, screaming at William Regal to tell him where he was. The he in question turned out to be Gargano, who confirmed his heel turn by planting a superkick right on the Dutchman's chin. Johnny justified his actions by claiming that he was doing what was necessary to get to challenge. The delusional heel trope has worked wonders in wrestling in the past, and this was no exception. Number 5. Finn Balor for the entirety of his first run in NXT, Finn Balor had been presented as an uncompromising, stoic good guy. However, being on WWE's main roster will do strange things to a man. Balor returned to the black and gold on the October 2nd, 2019 episode of the show, which I'm sure had absolutely nothing to do with the fact that it was running head-to-head -head with AEW Dynamite that week. The Demon King made it seem like he was going after Adam Cole's NXT Championship as a face, but that all changed a few weeks later. During a stare-down between the undisputed era and DIY, Balor made his way to the ring to even the odds. Well, almost even them, it was still three on two. Things got even more uneven. Whilst going to take off his jacket, Balor swiftly dropped Gargano with a Pele kick, allowing the era to mob Champa. Balor hadn't joined the heel faction, presumably because he'd never wrestled in Ring of Honor, but he had established himself as the brand's new top cool loner villain. Number 4. Samoa Joe Speaking of Finn Balor, four years before he laid out Johnny Gargano, he himself was on the receiving end of a heel turn beating. The great historical alliance of Ireland and Samoa reared its head in the first ever Dusty Rhodes Tag Team Classic, which was won by the team of Samoa Joe and NXT champion Finn Balor. The champ had promised Joe a title shot if they won the tournament, but like a dad telling his kids he'd take them to the park next week, that promise meant nothing. One go on the swings, that's all I wanted. Joe eventually got tired of waiting, and so on the November 4th, 2015 episode of NXT, he raised his grievances with Balor in the most Joe way possible, aka he beat the living piss out of him. The Samoan submission machine had been beloved ever since he first arrived in NXT, so fans were certainly displeased to see him lay Finn out. However, he was so bloody good as a heel that everybody quickly got over it. Joe fought Balor at two takeover events before winning the title off him at a house show of all places. Number 3. Roderick Strong The Undisputed Era were in quite the pickle at TakeOver New Orleans. Bobby Fish and Kyle O'Reilly were scheduled to defend their tag team titles in a three-way match, but hit a bit of a speed bump when Fish got injured before the show. Adam Cole could have stepped in, but he was already scheduled to be part of the ladder match for the North American Championship. Hmm, what to do? What to do? Cole took Fish's place in the three-way, despite the fact that he had been pulverized earlier in the night. It looked like the numbers game had gotten too much for the UE when Pete Dunne hit O'Reilly with his bitter end finisher. However, the bruiserweight was about to learn a valuable life lesson. Never trust anyone called Roderick. Roddy Strong shocked the world when he took out his own partner to hand the ear of the win. Strong had finally given in to the group's demands and announced himself as their new 
newest member. This turn was simply a masterstroke. It made perfect sense, it got the company out of a sticky spot, and nobody saw it coming. Least of all, Pete Dunne. Number 2. Kevin Owens This turn is amazing because it was so effective despite the fact that Kevin Owens had only been a babyface for about an hour or so when it happens. You can tell the story of 2014's R Evolution in three parts. Part 1. Kevin Owens has his NXT debut match against CJ Parker in the opener. Fun fact, Parker, the future Juice Robinson, legitimately broke KO's nose here with a palm strike. Part 2. Sami Zayn defeats Adrian Neville to become NXT champion in a title versus career match. Zayn had been desperate to win the belt, and finally he had done it. Part 3. Owens comes out to celebrate with his real-life best bud, only to turn on him almost immediately. The emotional whiplash of seeing Zayn celebrate his big win and then have his moments stolen from him straight away was unlike anything WWE had done in years. Owens had just gone from a newcomer to the most despised man in all of NXT in the space of just one night. Also, this was the match that introduced the whole copyright logo fake out spots, paving the way for that technique to be used to great effect by number one, Tommaso Ciampa. In perhaps the most famous copyright logo busting moment of all time, and the major reason we all have trust issues with WWE nowadays, Tommaso Ciampa became the most hated figure in all of wrestling when he assaulted best friend Johnny Gargano at the end of TakeOver Chicago. The pair, who wrestled under the tag team name DIY, had just fought the Authors of Pain for the black and gold brand's double straps. After giving it everything they had in a brutal ladder match, Gargano and Ciampa came up short and failed to wrest the belt away from their mammoth adversaries. As the two defeated men stood atop the ramp, the show seemingly about to end, something changed in Champa's eyes. He swung Johnny around and launched him into the LED board behind them, sparking genuine outrage from the crowd in attendance. Champa's turn wasn't just initially heartbreaking, but it also set up about three years worth of storylines in this one moment. This was so powerful that NXT were able to capitalize on it nine months later after Champa returned from injury. The blackest of black hearts. More than just watching on from ringside, a good manager should do whatever they can to accentuate their clients and make sure the spotlight shines brightly on them. Rather than attract the right kind of attention, however, some misplaced managers have ended up detracting from the very people they were supposed to be assisting. A bad clash of personalities can lead to some brief but lamentable coalitions, as we have seen throughout the decades. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 Weirdest Wrestler Managers combinations. Join us! Number 10. Ricardo Rodriguez and Rob Van Dam An outspoken loner by nature, it's no surprise that Rob Van Dam hasn't really had many managers besides Bill Alfonso in ECW, and let's face it, he did a lot more whistleblowing than talking. The RVD and Alfonso combination, odd as it was on the surface, worked a charm. Van Damme's strange and forgettable alliance with Ricardo Rodriguez, on the other hand, most certainly did not. The two joined forces not long after the whole flipping show's WWE return in the summer of 2013, and it made a bit of sense since it led to Van Damme targeting Ricardo's former client, then World Heavyweight Champion Alberto Del Rio. Rodriguez himself didn't understand the creative direction and thought it was a rib by Dean Malenko at first, but was simply happy to be back on television. Ricardo didn't really add anything to Van Damme's presentation, and the two couldn't be accused of having overwhelming chemistry together, with the most notable thing about their union being just how dorky Rodriguez looked wearing his RVD shirts. If nothing else, at least it was short-lived, as they got together in August and split by October. RVD has smoked joints that have lasted longer than that. Number 9. Zeb Coulter and Alberto Del Rio Ricardo Rodriguez and Rob Van Dam may have been a mismatch, but the Ricardo and Alberto Del Rio pairing was simply great stuff and helped define both men's WWE careers. Fans would have been happy seeing Rodriguez come back with Del Rio when the Mexican star made his return at Hell in a Cell 2015, but they were instead treated to the nonsensical twosome of Alberto and Zeb Coulter, also making his return after an absence. Ah yes, the classic trade of the young Hispanic personal ring announcer for the aging Zen 
xenophobe. It made not a lick of sense, something Dutch Mantel freely admitted, while also noting that the two didn't have a spark between them, something that the crowd picked up on from the get-go. It was hardly a shocker when they went their separate ways after less than two months, with Coulter written out of storylines and ultimately being released without making another appearance. It speaks to just how unpopular this act was that for Del Rio, joining the ill-fated League of Nations was viewed as a massive upgrade. Number 8. Oliver Humperdinck and Bam Bam Bigelow to establish him as a big deal from the word jump, WWE presented a storyline where various managers battled for the signature of Bam Bam Bigelow. Everyone from Bobby Heenan and Slick to Jimmy Hart and Mr. Fuji wanted to bag the beast from the east, so it was only natural that Bigelow should end up with… Oliver Humperdinck? Yes, the menacing man with the flame tattoo on his actual head went with the ginger wizard. Now, it must be said that Bam Bam wasn't the greatest promo in the world at this point and could have definitely benefited from someone doing his talking for him. And Humperdinck, to his credit, was good at what he did, but what he did was typically manage heels. The combination just didn't work, and Humperdinck couldn't hide his unease at being a good guy behind his Technicolor dream coats. Bigelow proved throughout the rest of his career that he was also far more astute at being a heel, and bringing him in as a baddie alongside the Weasel or the Mouth of the South would have worked a treat. Incredibly, Bammer and Sir Oliver stayed together on the Indies and in the NWA after their WWE run. Number 7. Roddy Piper and Sean O'Hare after a spell in WWE's developmental system, Sean O'Hare re-emerged on the main roster as a member of the SmackDown brand in early 2003. Appearing with an intriguing Devil's Advocate gimmick, the former WCW Tag Team Champion would use his powers of persuasion to encourage WWE stars to perform sinful deeds. Despite its novelty, the gimmick was quickly dropped, and O'Hare was instead paired with the recently returned Roddy Piper for reasons, I'm sure. The rowdy Scott was likely recruited to cut promos for the big tattooed bruiser while O'Hare could act as Piper's muscle. A simple concept and one that had worked countless times before, but everything about this was just a little bit off. Granted, they both had a penchant for leather jackets, but that's about where the similarities ended. The two occasionally teamed, and opposites didn't exactly attract in the ring either, though they did challenge the odd couple team of Eddie Guerrero and Tajiri for the tag team titles. The Piper and O'Hare connection met an abrupt end when Hot Rod was fired for telling us nothing we didn't already know during an appearance on an HBO Real Sports episode on premature wrestling deaths. Number 6. Sonny and Farouk 1996 was a big year for Sonny, who guided three teams to tag title glory, the Body Donners, the Godwins, and the Smoking Guns, while also being named AOL's most downloaded celebrity of the year. 96 wasn't all sunshine and rainbows for the blonde bombshell, however, as her brief dalliance with Farouk was a rare misfire. Now, without stating the obvious of how goddamn ridiculous the former WCW heavyweight champion looked in that stupid gladiator helmet, the act just didn't work and was a decidedly random way to debut the Farouk character. According to Sunny herself, hardly the most reliable source out there, but hey, WWE wanted her and Simmons to be more of an on-screen couple, something she protested. According to Bruce Pritchard, Vince McMahon himself had the idea of putting Sunny with Farouk as a way to get him heat from the off, though soon conceded that the audience wasn't buying what he was selling and changed back. Before long, Farouk had formed the Nation of Domination and Sunny had transitioned into more of an on-air personality rather than a man. Manager. Her next and final WWE clients would be the Legion of Doom. Go figure. Number 5. Bob Backlund and Darren Young not too long after his improbable world title win and feud with Bret Hart, Bob Backlund became a manager, helping the Iron Sheik and the Sultan to untold glory. It's untold glory in this case because there was no glory, and thus I can't tell you about it. After a brief period where he tried to teach a rookie Kurt Angle the value of a cross-faced chicken wing, Backlund came back in 2016 to make Darren Young great again. Look, nothing against the bloke, but I'm not sure if Darren Young was actually ever great in the first place. In any event, Mr. No Days Off enlisted Bob's help as a life coach, and the former WWE champion did everything he could to further Young's career, which wasn't much. In truth, this was simply the latest attempt to make the one-time primetime player a singles star. It, like all previous attempts, did not come off. You know what? The Young and Backland partnership could have been a fun one, but fans were not convinced. 
Credit to Darren, whose idea the whole storyline was in the first place for being proactive in trying to give his career a shot in the arm, but his association with the Hall of Famer never properly clicked. Number 4. Jim Cornette and Mantar Jim Cornette, for all his faults, and there are plenty of them, will go down in history as one of the best professional wrestling managers of all time. His list of clients is legendary, and he counts multiple champions among those who have benefited from his wisdom. That said, one thing he couldn't do is make a half-man, half-bull any less preposterous than it inherently was. The Prince of Polyester was given his new task 20 minutes before Mantar's debut and initially believed that it was a rib at his expense. Probably because, and I cannot emphasize this enough, he was being asked to manage a half-man, half-bull. The new generation was littered with wacky characters, but Mantar was the wackiest, making Corny's candy-colored suits seem tame by comparison. They were not affiliated for long, with Mantar only making a handful of televised appearances during his six-month stint. Jimmy, meanwhile, tried to erase any memory of managing the beast by focusing on Camp Cornette thoroughbreds Vader, Owen Hart, and the British Bull. Dog. Cornette, if you're watching this, and I'm sure you are, please respond to my assessment with a rambling, expletive-filled 40-minute video of your own. Number 3. Davari and Kurt Angle WWE were faced with a bit of a problem when Kurt Angle challenged WWE Champion John Cena in the autumn of 2005. The Olympic hero was, by this point, almost universally adored by WWE fans who were thankful for five years of first-class entertainment. The Doctor of Thugonomics, meanwhile, was starting to hear a smattering of boos from the dissenters in the crowd. To try and swing the tide, WWE brought back Davari, recently the manager of the controversial Mohammed Hassan, to act as Angle's personal referee before then becoming his manager. You can appreciate the intent here, but the fact is Kurt didn't need anybody to do his talking for him and his program with Cena didn't benefit from the added distraction. The partnership also failed to make fans boo angle, as evidenced by the rapturous response he received at New Year's Revolution 2006 following the infamous over-the-top promo where he basically conceded to being beloved. Kurt turned babyface soon after and kicked Davari to the curb, with the heat seeker finding solace in the massive arms of Mark Henry, the world's strongest shoulder to cry on. Number 2. Brother Love and The Undertaker one of the definitive manager-wrestler combos in all of professional wrestling was Paul Bearer and The Undertaker. A match made in heaven, if heaven were filled with death and destruction and populated by zombie morticians, the dead man and his keeper complemented each other perfectly. They're so inextricably linked that fans tend to overlook the fact that the Demon of Death Valley debuted with a different man leading him to the ring. When The Undertaker emerged at the 1990 Survivor Series, he was accompanied by his original manager, Brother Love. And I mean, yeah, the giant, terrifying funeral director next to the human tomato was a bit of a contrast, wasn't it? The man behind the makeup, Bruce Pritchard, voluntarily left his post because A, he wanted to devote himself fully to backstage duties, and B, he knew the act wasn't gelling. And so, on an episode of the Brother Love Show, the white suit-wearing televangelist sold Taker's contract to Bearer, ending their unholy union after just a couple of months. Bearer, meanwhile, would manage Taker, as well as Mankind and Kane, to great success. Post-WWE, he also tried to give the rub to a future star, which brings us to… Number 1. Paul Bearer and L.A. Knight Years before he transformed into super over WWE superstar LA Knight, Sean Ricker was trying to make a name for himself on the independent circuit. Under old alias Percy Pringle III, Bearer managed Ricker for the NWA Championship Wrestling from Hollywood promotion. From 2010 until shortly before his passing in 2013, Bearer stood ringside and cut promos with and for Ricker. The two clearly formed a connection, since Bearer asked his assistant to keep some stuff for Knight while he was practically on his deathbed with Bearer himself calling Ricker and assuring him that big things were in his future. LA Knight would later note how working with William Moody made him want to raise his game so that he could be considered in the same class as some of the other iconic talents the Hall of Famer had managed. Though the very idea of LA Knight being managed by Paul Bearer seems like something from some wonderfully weird alternate universe, it's clear that Moody recognized potential and wanted to use some of his own star power to help him advance in the business. Oh! Oh, yes! Yeah! There are only three certainties in life. Death, taxes, and Hulk Hogan doesn't do a job for no one, brother. 
However, did you know that there's a species of jellyfish that can essentially live forever? And as for taxes, well, the world's billionaires certainly seem to have gotten around that issue, haven't they? So that just leaves the Hulkster, and wouldn't you know it, even he isn't as immune to defeat as we thought he was. Hogan losing a match is one thing, but for him to lose one clean is practically unheard of. The Pastamania mogul was notoriously protective over his image and held enough backstage pull to quash most suggestions of him taking an L. However, even the 24-inch pythons weren't strong enough to fight these booking decisions. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and what you gonna do when 10 times Hulk Hogan lost clean runs wild on you, brother? Join us. Number 10 versus The Ultimate Warrior at WrestleMania 6. Whilst Hogan had lost clean a few times in the late 70s and early 80s, once he became the poster boy for WWE, these defeats dried up quicker than Hogan's event booking circa 2015. His first major clean defeat in WWE's pay-per-view era took place during the main event of the biggest show of the year, WrestleMania. And not just any main event, this was the ultimate challenge. Hogan was putting his WWE Championship on the line against the Ultimate Warriors Intercontinental Championship. Whoever won the match would walk away with both belts and all the glory. In a shocking moment, Warrior pinned Hogan after one of his patented splashes, crowning himself the new champion and effectively usurping Hogan's role as number one babyface in the promotion. Well, that was the plan anyway. Hogan managed to get the belt back just a year later, but in the moment, it felt like the guard was changing. This was an incredible ending to a great match, even if Hogan did try and ruin it by kicking out at 3.000001 and making sure that the spotlight was on him walking away in despair. Number 9 versus Roddy Piper at Starcade 1996 Alongside his eight WrestleMania main events, Hogan is also a three-time headliner of WCW's equivalent to the show of shows, Starcade. The second of those main events came in 1996, when Hogan took on one of his oldest foes. Rowdy Roddy Piper had shown up in WCW just a few months after Hogan had formed the New World Order alongside Scott Hall and Kevin Nash. He proved to be quite the thorn in the NWO's side, even outing Eric Bischoff as secretly being in cahoots with them. WCW champion Hogan was forced to battle his longtime nemesis at Starcade. Despite throwing every ounce of outside interference at Piper that he could, Hogan could not overcome the hot rod and passed out to his sleeper hold. Piper had done it. He had beaten Hogan at the biggest show of the year and had won the world championship. But no, wait a second, he didn't actually make Hogan agree to put the title on the line, even though it was the main event of Starcade, and he was the one to draw up the match contract. I guess all that bagpipe playing must have deprived Roddy's brain of oxygen. Number 8 versus Sting at Bound for Glory Despite picking up a myriad of wins over Hogan in WCW, Sting had to wait until Hulk's last ever televised match to finally score a clean pin over the Immortal One. At TNA's flagship show, Bound for Glory, the two Hall of Famers locked horns in what was, on paper, a mouth-watering clash, if that paper was from 1997 instead of 2011, that is. With Ric Flair at ringside, the combined age of everyone involved in this match was older than most European nations, so it's hardly surprising that the match ended up the way it did. Let's just say it was so punch-heavy that you could slap some Mike Tysons on it and sell it for the NES. It ended when the insane icon put Hogan in the Scorpion Deathlock. The Hulkster's surgically repaired spine came crashing down and hurt inside, so he was forced to tap out. You could argue that this win wasn't entirely clean, as Sting used a foreign object to cut Hogan's forehead open. However, we would say that Sting already had the match won by this point, and the actual finish didn't come until over a minute after the spike was used. Also, Sting deserved to get his win back after what went down at Stark 897. Just saying. Number 7 versus Lex Luger on Nitro. Shortly after forming the NWO and going Hollywood, Hogan captured the WCW Championship from the Giant. Thanks to Roddy Piper's poor contract writing skills, Hogan held on to the gold for the best part of a year, defeating everyone in his path. 
That was until he ran into the perfectly chiseled torso of Lex Luger. At Spring Stampede 1997, Luger won a four corners match to become number one contender to Hogan's world title. He and the Giant then teamed up at Bash at the Beach to defeat the champion and basketball star Dennis Rodman in a tag team match. Hogan technically lost that match too, tapping out to the torture rack. There ain't no way Rodzilla was gonna get beaten, Jack. Luger followed up this victory by facing Hogan for the title on the August 4th episode of Nitro. After overcoming a shed load of NWO interference, Luger once again hoisted Terrible Terry up and made him submit to end his reign of terror. This was a great win for Luger and produced one of the biggest crowd reactions in WCW history. Unfortunately, the good times just didn't last for Lex as Hogan won the belt back just five days later. Because of course he did. Number 6 versus Goldberg on Nitro Another episode of Nitro, another huge title change involving Hulk Hogan. Bill Goldberg was one of the hottest properties in all of pro wrestling in 1998. He was on an undefeated streak so impressive it really didn't matter that it was ludicrously inflated. His short explosive matches made him a megastar and thrust him directly into the main event scene. He squared off against Hogan for the WCW Championship in the main event of the 6th of July episode of Monday Nitro. With an absolutely rabid crowd at his back, Goldberg crushed Hogan with the classic one-two of a spear and a jackhammer to pin the champion and claim his prize. Hogan may have been a world-class politicker, but he clearly knew that Goldberg as champion was the money move. He was so over at the time that any result other than him winning the gold would have been a catastrophic mistake. He may not have liked it, but at least Hulk knew that he wasn't the man to end Goldberg's undefeated streak. If only his NWO buddy Kevin Nash shared that opinion. Number 5 vs Triple H on SmackDown 2002 as a whole was an odd year for WWE as the old vestiges of the Attitude Era crashed headfirst into the oncoming ruthless aggression period of the company. Hogan's return to the Fed in that year meant that he mixed it up with a bunch of names we had never expected to see him work with, including when he tangled with the game on an episode of SmackDown. It was a number one contenders match for the Undisputed Championship, as well as a clash of two of wrestling's finest barriers. Both men had a reputation for busting out the golden shovel, so who would be left covered in dirt when this encounter was said and done? Trips proved that his spade was the biggest as he pinned Hogan after a pedigree. And let me tell you, the sight of a 48-year-old Hulk Hogan selling for a pedigree is like something out of a different dimension. This would be the last time these two legends ever met in the ring, so Hogan never got to have his revenge. However, considering he was the man who ended Triple H's WWE title reign just a few months earlier, I would still say that Hogan managed to come out on top, as he tends to do. Just ask Mrs. The Love Sponge. Number 4 vs Kurt Angle at King of the Ring 2002 Despite embodying two very different wrestling philosophies, Hulk Hogan and Kurt Angle actually have a lot in common. They are both American icons, they are both six-time world champions in WWE, and they both went bald gracefully. Okay, maybe not that last one. Still, you would be forgiven for forgetting that these two had a match with each other, let alone on pay-per-view. The bout stemmed from Hogan's partnership with Edge, another weird alternate reality thing that happened in 2002. After weeks of assaulting each other and interfering in each other's matches, Hogan vs. Angle was on for King of the Ring. Not only did Kurt defeat Mr. Belair on this show, but he did so in history-making fashion. He forced him to submit to the ankle lock, making him the first first WWE wrestler in history to beat Hogan by submission. Also, considering that Hogan's only clean wins over Angle came at house shows, Angle is one of the very few wrestlers never to get their receipt from the Hulkster when the cameras were rolling. Even in TNA, Hogan's only wins over Angle came in non-televised tag team matches. Number 3 vs Brock Lesnar on SmackDown Our final Bizarro World 2002 matchup comes courtesy of another number one contender bout from the August 8th episode of SmackDown. Hogan was facing a match 
man whose own run of dominance and backstage power would rival his own in the decades to come. The next big thing, Brock Lesnar. Lesnar had been on a tear since his debut earlier that year and was fresh off winning the King of the Ring tournament. He now had his sights set on The Rock and his undisputed championship, but he needed to get through Hogan first. The Suburban Commando could have been made of jelly for all we know because Brock cut through him like a hungry kid at a birthday party. Seriously, he tore Mr. Nanny to pieces, eventually winning the match with a bear hug so powerful it made the Hulkster pass out. Like with Goldberg four years earlier, Hogan knew that Brock Lesnar was the future of the business. In giving him such a dominant victory, he helped affirm Lesnar's status as a monster and made the upcoming championship battle with The Rock even more exciting. However, Hogan balked at doing a second job to the Beast Incarnate, forcing WWE to scrap a planned rematch for Survivor Series. Number 2 vs Jacques Rougeau at a WCW house show No, really, we haven't made this one up. Easily the weirdest name on the list of wrestlers who have beaten Hogan clean is Jacques Rougeau, a man who was primarily known for competing in tag teams for the WWE. He was also the Mountie, you know, the bloke who won the Intercontinental title because Bret Hart had a storyline case of flu. Whilst he was working for WCW, Rougeau faced off against Hogan at a house show on April 11th, 1997. To everyone's surprise, the Canadian actually beat Hogan clean as a whistle, whilst he was still WCW champion. Wow, kayfabe flu sure is a powerful disease. Many theories have circulated as to how and why this happened. The Mountie himself said it was because Hogan had a lot of respect for his family, so did the job in his homeland as a sign of goodwill. However, if you believe Kevin Owens, who broke into the business training under Rougeau, it was because he paid Hogan an extra $10,000 to lie down for him. I mean, after red and yellow, Hogan's favorite color is definitely green, so that figures. Number one versus The Rock at WrestleMania 18. Let's end our list where we started it, at WrestleMania in the Sky Dome in Toronto, Canada. After eight and a half years away from WWE, Hulk Hogan returned to the promotion in which he made his name at No Way Out 2002. Alongside Hall and Nash, Hogan was part of a rebooted version of the original NWO, who promptly set their sights on the two biggest names in WWE at the time, Steve Austin and The Rock. This led to a match dubbed Icon vs. Icon at WrestleMania 18, when Hogan and The Rock met one-on-one for the first time ever. Hogan was supposed to be the heel, but even him trying to murder the Great One with a truck didn't stop the crowd from cheering him like he just ended world hunger. This inverted dynamic led to one of the most fascinating spectacles to ever go down in a WWE ring, which ended when The Rock pinned his adversary with a people's elbow. The end result of the match isn't what was important because people remember the feeling and the experience, not that Hulkster did the honors. From No Mercy on the N64 to the SmackDown vs. Raw series to 2K's recent efforts, WWE video games are always a total blast. Well, except for 2K20, that was just a train wreck from start to finish. With so many titles out there, you would have thought that every single major star would have made an appearance in digital form. Well, dear viewer, at least 10 of them haven't, otherwise we wouldn't have a list. But before we start, we are only counting official WWE release console games, so no arcade games and no mobile games like Supercard or WWE Champions. Sorry, DSP. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 biggest stars to never be in a WWE video game. Join us. Number 10, Giant Gonzalez. Whether as Giant Gonzalez in WWE or Eligante in WCW, there is one thing you can say about Jorge Gonzalez. He was very tall. Aside from his astounding height, Gonzalez had pretty much nothing going for him between the ropes. He couldn't bump, he couldn't sell, he could barely walk convincingly, and yet he was gainfully employed by several of the world's top wrestling companies. The big man is perhaps most famous for his match against The Undertaker at WrestleMania 9. Despite being a victim of the legendary streak, WWE have made absolutely no effort to immortalize Gonzalez in game form. Wrestling games have been pretty generous towards lumbering giants in the past, so there was definitely scope for them to do the same with this one. 
He may have only been on WWE's books for less than a year, but Gonzalez actually has a glittering career to draw from. Over the course of his career, he shared the ring with the likes of Ric Flair, Sting, and other legends. That said, I'm not quite sure how his finisher of using a chloroform-soaked rag would translate into a game engine. Number 9. James Ellsworth before you get on our case about how James Ellsworth wasn't a big star, let me remind you that he holds several victories over AJ Styles and turned heel in the main event of a WWE pay-per-view. You know who else did that? Stone Cold Steve Austin. So there. After first appearing as a jobber for Braun Strowman to consume whole, the chinless wonder started appearing regularly on SmackDown as part of Dean Ambrose's feud with the Phenomenal One. After turning bad, Ellsworth would join up with Carmella and serve as her valet slash pet during her big push in 2017. He also won the first ever Women's Money in the Bank ladder match, but we really don't need to cover that travesty again. Ellsworth was featured on WWE TV from 2016 to 2018, giving him a decent window to get into a game. However, this never happened, not even as a manager. I mean, you would have thought he would have been a game developer's dream. I mean, his head is basically just one giant polygon. Number 8. Zach Gowen In 2003, one-legged wrestler Zach Gowen was signed to a WWE contract. Mind you, this was only after John Laurinaitis accidentally tried to sign a different one-legged wrestler by mistake. Anyway, with that faux pas out of the way, Gowan was free to embark on his journey as a WWE superstar. This was a journey that included a feud with Mr. McMahon, getting his prosthetic leg pulled off by Roddy Piper, and getting chucked down some stairs by Brock Lesnar. The games he could have realistically been on were WrestleMania 19 for the GameCube, which would have already been in development when he joined, and Survivor Series, which was a Game Boy Advance game with limited capacity. Still, it would have been really interesting to see how Gowan's unique wrestling style would have translated to a video game format. Number 7. The Patriots Del Wilkes, aka The Patriots, aka that guy that had Kurt Angle's music before Kurt Angle did, made his name in various promotions across the US and Japan before rocking up in the World Wrestling Federation just as it was ticking over into the Attitude Era. A masked man with an undying love for all things Morica, The Patriot debuted as the perfect opponent for Bret Hart during his Yay Canada Boo USA gimmick in 1997. Wilkes was even given a WWE Championship match against Hart at the Ground Zero pay-per-view and was scheduled to face Team Canada at Survivor Series 97 before a torn triceps put the kibosh on that. That injury ultimately forced Wilkes to retire, but it did also pave the way for the debut of Steve Blackman. So, you know, swings and roundabouts. The criminally underrated WWE 13 featured a mode that took players through the Attitude Era, letting them play in key matches between SummerSlam 97 and WrestleMania 15. This would have been a great way to get the Patriot in a game, but sadly, Ground Zero was absent from this mode. You mean they didn't include Max Mini versus El Torito? Shame on them all. Number 6. Rocky Johnson To some fans, Soul Man Rocky Johnson's greatest contribution to wrestling was siring Dwayne The Rock Johnson. However, those fans are fools, because outside of helping to create one of Hollywood's biggest stars, Johnson was also a more than accomplished wrestler in his own right. Alongside Tony Atlas, he captured the World Tag Team Championships in 1983, the duo becoming the first black athletes to do so. Rocky played a huge role in breaking down racial barriers Areas in wrestling, and his achievements were recognized with a WWE Hall of Fame induction in 2008. If the company wanted to add to his legacy with a game appearance, there is a couple of ways they could do it. One would be to have a mode showcasing the notable achievements of black wrestlers throughout history, which could contain the match where Johnson and Atlas won the titles. The other could be as a feature at the end of a rock showcase mode, a bonus match to show how important his father was to the great one. Listen, if you want my CV to 2K, just drop me an email. Number 5. Bull Nakano One of the women responsible for just about keeping her division alive during the early 90s was Medusa, aka Alundra Blaze. WWE finally acknowledged her accomplishments by including her in 2K16. She was also in two WCW games, including the utterly dreadful Backstage Assault. Now all that WWE need to do is put some of the wrestlers that Blaze faced during those years, and they can start with the legendary Japanese star Bull Nakano. 
After rising up the ranks in All Japan Women's Pro Wrestling, Nakano debuted for WWE in a major way when she aligned with Luna to take on Blaze at SummerSlam 1994. Fun fact, this was also the first ever women's match to take place at SummerSlam, the more you know. A history of women's wrestling showcase mode would have to include the SummerSlam 94 match in it, which would be a fantastic way to let players finally control the Japanese icon. Hey, it could also feature the match where Nakano beats Blaze to win the women's title, which I mainly want to see included because it took place at an event called Big Egg Wrestling Universe, which is hilarious, obviously. Number 4. Juventud Guerrera did you know that Juventud Guerrera means Youth Warrior in Spanish? And that is pretty accurate. The guy hasn't aged a day since 1998. A pillar of WCW's excellent cruiserweight division, Juve mixed it up with some of the best lightweights in the world throughout the 90s. Chris Jericho, Rey Mysterio, Billy Kidman, Jushin Thunder Liger, Guerrera battled them all and looked pretty damn good whilst doing it. He would jump over to WWE in 2005 to to join the Mexicals alongside Super Crazy and Psychosis. There are plenty of ways to get Hoovy into a WWE video game, but a WCW Cruiserweight Showcase would be epic and would have to feature the juice in some form or another. WWE had the chance to include this man in the Rey Mysterio Showcase from 2K22, but unfortunately we are still waiting for the chance to hit our friends with a virtual Hoovy driver. Number 3. Dynamite Kid Technically, Dynamite Kid main evented WrestleMania 2. Well, sort of. In reality, he main evented one third of that cursed show, but it was a big match nonetheless. Teaming up with Davey Boy Smith, Kid defeated Greg Valentine and Brutus Beefcake to win the World Tag Team Championships with Ozzy Osbourne at their side. Bulldog made his in-game debut back in 1992 for Super WrestleMania for the SNES and Mega Drive and has appeared in plenty more games since then. As for Dynamite Kid, not a chance. The thing about this talented high flyer is that most of his greatest achievements came outside of WWE. His legendary matches with Tiger Mask took place in New Japan in the early 1980s, as did a lot of other matches he had that helped shape cruiserweight wrestling. He hasn't even been inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame, which may or may not have something to do with his reputation and behavior outside of the squared circle. One of the most underrated and innovative wrestlers of all time, fans of Dynamite Kid would love nothing more than to soar through the air as his character in a modern video game. That said, I don't see it happening anytime soon. Number 2. Bob Backlund Former WWE Champion, Presidential Candidate, and Certified Crazy Bastard, Bob Backlund is one of the most intriguing figures in pro wrestling history. A clean-cut All-American boy, a younger Backlund was effectively selected as the successor to Bruno Sammartino and carried the company as its champion out of the 70s and into the 80s. Then, after a gap of over a decade, he won the WWE title again by beating Bret Hart of all people at Survivor Series 1994. He would then lose the title three days later in an eight second squash against Diesel. As Vince McMahon would say, what a ride! How Backland hasn't turned up in a single WWE video game across his long and eclectic career is actually pretty impressive. He hasn't even appeared as a manager, which does a serious disservice to that time he tried to make Darren Young great again. Whilst he may not be so popular with younger fans today, older nerds like me would love to have the opportunity to lock in the cross-faced chicken wing in video game form. Number 1. Superstar Billy Graham Hulk Hogan has been in more WWE video games than I've had compliments in the comments section. And really, it is a crime that the Hulkster has been in so many games whilst one of his biggest inspirations has never graced a single one. Superstar Billy Graham did so much for the way that heels are presented in wrestling. An arrogant bad guy with a body chiseled out of marble, Graham was one of the most popular wrestlers around back in the 1970s despite being a villain. He also had dyed blonde hair, a moustache, and said brother a lot. Remind you of anyone? 
In 1977, Graham unseated Bruno Sammartino to become just the sixth different WWE champion in history. He would hold the gold for the best part of a year before dropping it to our old friend Bob Backlund. WWE have included older wrestlers like Sammartino in newer games, so they could definitely do the same for both Graham and Backlund. Though in Graham's case, some of his comments about the company in various shoot interviews might be the thing that's preventing this from happening. Anyway, putting these old timers in games would be a great way to grow their popularity amongst younger fans and shed some light on an oft-overlooked portion of WWE history. Only a few things in wrestling are as impressive as a good undefeated streak. Off the top of my head, Chris Masters traps and Kevin Nash's hair. One way to get a wrestler over as a certifiable badass is to have them go on a long run of matches without taking an L. And then when somebody does beat them, they also look like a monster. And that's how it works all the time, right? Right? Sadly, no, as wrestling companies throughout the ages have consistently messed up the ending to unbeaten runs, causing embarrassment instead of creating stars. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 worst endings to wrestling undefeated streaks. Join us. By the way, this list does not include pay-per-view specific streaks, so no Undertaker here. On with the list. Number 10, Chris Jericho on AEW Dynamite. During AEW's early days, no one was presented as strongly as Le Champion Chris Jericho. Not only did the leader of the inner circle become the first ever AEW champion at All Out, but he went on a lengthy undefeated streak that claimed victims such as Darby Allin, Kenny Omega, and Cody Rhodes. This all changed after Full Gear 2019. Jericho and Sammy Guevara challenged Frankie Kazarian and Scorpio Sky for their recently won AEW Tag Team Championships. SoCal Uncensored retained the gold after Sky pinned Jericho in a move that nobody saw coming. Mainly because it was a bit of a dumb idea. Jericho hadn't lost once since the company formed, and many expected his first defeat to come when he dropped the title. Instead, it was given to a wrestler who was already a champion in a random tag team match on Dynamite. The company tried to follow up on this by having Sky challenge Y2J for the world title, but the crowd just didn't get behind him. I mean, at least Sky will always have this accolade to celebrate, and we think that deserves a little bit of the bubbly. Wow, that's not been popular for a long time, has it? Number 9, Tatanka on WWE Superstars. Playing on wrestler Chris Chavez's real-life Native American ancestry, a rare piece of self-awareness from WWE at the time, Tatanka was a popular upper mid-carder during the early 90s. For almost two years, Mr. Bison, that's what the word actually means by the way, was unbeaten in WWE. I mean, he was actually only unbeaten on TV, but this is wrestling, so give over. This run of dominance came to an abrupt end on the October 30th, 1993 edition of Superstars, when Tatonka was finally beaten by Ludwig Borger. The Finnish powerhouse had recently debuted in the company under an anti-American gimmick, of course, and was on his own unbeaten run when he clashed with our man. Sadly, Tatonka had his legs thoroughly cut out from under him, losing in dominant fashion to the budget Brock Lesnar. This is a case of WWE hitching their wagon to the wrong horse. If Borger had turned out to be a bigger star, then maybe this moment wouldn't be on our list. Unfortunately, he would leave the company just a little while later, making all of this for nothing. Number 8. Bo Dallas on Raw Bray Wyatt's real-world little bro, Bo Dallas, made quite the splash in NXT when he reigned as their top champion for 280 days. He followed this momentum up by going on an unbeaten run upon his main roster debut in May of 2014. And my word, did he beat some big names! Fandango, Santino Morella, R-Truth, they all fell to Dallas's mighty hand! To his credit, he also beat the likes of Dolph Ziggler and Kofi Kingston, so fair play. To immediately remove that credit, though, the streak came to an end on a random episode of Raw against R-Truth, somebody he'd already beaten. It seemed as if WWE just completely gave up on Bo's push before it had even got going. The 18 and Bo gimmick he was running with had some serious potential, not as a main event idea or anything, but as a solid mid-card one at the very least. After a loss to Truth, it was downhill for the Bo Lever. Number 7, Charlotte Flair at Fastlane 2017. Is a streak really a streak if there are so many asterisks next to it? Well, WWE thought so throughout 2016 and 17, and who are we to argue with them? 
Between her call-up to Raw in 2015 and the Fastlane show in 2017, Charlotte Flair did not lose a match. Well, she didn't lose a match on pay-per-view. Well, she didn't lose a singles match on pay-per-view. The company made a huge deal out of the Queen being unbeaten on big shows, even though Charlotte had actually tapped out to Sasha Banks during a tag team match at Battleground in 2016. Everyone thought that this fake streak was going to end at the upcoming WrestleMania 33. Well, I guess we're all idiots because WWE ended it a month earlier for no decent reason. Whilst facing Bayley for the Raw Women's Championship, Flair looked to have the match won when the boss pointed out that she had got a handful of the champion's tights. This allowed the hugger to take the advantage and pin her opponent. So the streak that wasn't a streak ended before the biggest show of the year? Christ alive. Number six, Mr. Perfect at WrestleMania VI. As his surname would suggest, Mr. Perfect was pretty bloody good at wrestling, so good that he went unpinned or submitted on TV and pay-per-view for 15 months. Of course, there were all the house show losses to factor in, plus he didn't win the Royal Rumble in 1990, but like we said earlier, this is wrestling. Then, all of a sudden, Perfect's luck took a turn for the worse, and he got beat twice in the space of a month. He was pinned for the first time on regional television by the Ultimate Warrior when the two legends faced off for the Intercontinental Championship at Madison Square Garden. Okay, losing to Warrior, that's not too bad. Now what about the other one? Brutus Beefcake? You gotta be joking me! Sadly, the man of 1004 gimmicks handed Perfect his first nationally televised loss at WrestleMania 6. Did Beefers gain much from this? Hell no! Did Perfect suffer as a result? Hell yes! Still, Hogan wasn't going over in the main event, so I guess they had to give his best bud a win instead, brother. Number five, Ryback at Hell in a Cell 2012. An undefeated streak versus a lengthy title reign, it is the formula that made WrestleMania 3 such a success and has worked for countless other programs across wrestling history. However, for every Hogan vs. Andre, there is a Ryback vs. CM Punk. The straight-edge superstar was nearing a year as WWE Champion when he met the big guy inside Hell in a Cell. Ryback had been unbeaten since his main roster debut, unless you count all the Skip Sheffield stuff, which we definitely don't. So WWE faced a dilemma. Do they end Ryback's streak or give the incredibly green performer their top prize? Well, luckily for them, there was a way out. A really, really dumb way out. Just when it looked like the rookie had the match in hand, the referee of all people hit him straight in his nads. The referee in question was Brad Maddox, a wannabe wrestler who wanted to make a name for himself in storyline. Well, mission accomplished, kiddo. You will forever be known as the guy who ruined Hell in a Cell 2012. Well, and maybe one other thing. This incredibly stupid decision put the Ryback's momentum to a screeching halt in a clear case of WWE booking themselves into a corner. Number 4, Asuka at WrestleMania 34. Whilst WWE had to hide Bo Dallas's NXT losses to make his streak work, no such fibbing was required when it came to the Empress of Tomorrow. Come WrestleMania 34 in 2018, Asuka had not been pinned or submitted since her very first NXT outing all the way back in October of 2015. That is 914 days. Just don't ask us how many matches that actually was, because the internet has about a billion different answers to that. Asuka had booked her spot at Mania by winning the Royal Rumble, take that Mr. Perfect, and had selected SmackDown Women's Champion Charlotte as her prey. After an excellent match, Asuka won the title, continuing her undefeated streak until she dropped the belt to a young up-and-comer to build them up. Just kidding, obviously Charlotte won. With little build-up or reason, the most impressive modern undefeated run in WWE came to an end. Charlotte did not need this feather in her cap, and the mystique that surrounded Asuka vanished in an instant. Number 3. Brock Lesnar at Survivor Series 2002 10. No, Ty Dillinger hasn't just turned up. That is the number of people who have pinned or submitted Brock Lesnar in his WWE career. That list contains some of the greatest technical workers of our generation, but do you know who the very first name on it is? It's the bloody Big Show. Just three months after winning it off the Rock at SummerSlam, Lesnar put his WWE Championship on the line against the behemoth at Survivor Series, despite some stark warnings from Paul Heyman. Had Brock not disregarded the wise man's words, we might have avoided this disastrous chain of events. 
After less than five minutes of match time, Heyman turned on his charge to join up with the future star of the Big Show show. One choke slam onto a chair later, and Lesnar got pinned for the very first time, on TV anyway. I mean, do you really need me to explain this to you? The hottest young star in all of wrestling getting fed to the Big Show at one of the lowest points in his career? That doesn't sound bad to you. Fine, suit yourself, but stay away from me, all right? Number two, The Fiend at Super Showdown 2020. Bray Wyatt has had some truly awful things happen to him across his WWE career, but few are as bad as the time his most impressive creation was fed to a middle-aged man in tiny shorts. Under his Fiend persona, Wyatt defeated Seth Rollins for the Universal Championship in Saudi Arabia at 2019's Crown Jewel event. The spooky kettle had already gone off the boil following the train wreck that was Hell in a Cell a month earlier, but fans were hopeful that Bray's title reign would be a chance to reset. And then Goldberg came along. A match was booked for WWE's return to Saudi Arabia in February of 2020, pitting the champion against the company's resident nostalgia machine. Many expected the undefeated Fiend to breeze through Goldberg to continue his run of dominance, but the Crown Prince has no time for your logic. Big Bill beat Bray in just three minutes to win the title, snap the streak, and end any semblance of credibility the Fiend had left. This was a rough night, but it turns out the new champion was just getting his revenge from 22 years earlier, because number one is Goldberg at Starcade 1998. Wrestling's most famous undefeated streak, not belonging to a man named Mark, has to be the one Goldberg went on in WCW between 97 and 98. The widely accepted number of wins in a row is 173, but this could put a hot air balloon to shame with the amount that it's been inflated. Regardless of the actual figures, Goldberg's run of dominance was absolutely awesome. He would come out with his team of security guards, hit a spear, then a jackhammer, then be home in time for tea. A perfect formula that was impossible to screw up. Until they did. As WCW's World Heavyweight Champion, Goldberg was put in the main event of Starcade 98 with the belt on the line. His opponent was Kevin Nash, getting some help from Scott Hall and a taser in the process. And just like that, WCW's biggest homegrown success story was not from the top of the mountain. Makes you want to put your entire arm through a limousine window, doesn't it? WWE may be at the epicenter of the pro wrestling universe in the eyes of many, but that doesn't mean they always do things better than other companies. As one example, consider the many feuds that have captivated our minds through the years. WWE has certainly cultivated a large number of compelling rivalries, as have other promotions. Sometimes WWE puts together a feud that has been done in another company, or will be done in another company. The list ahead will look at examples of other promotions getting more out of a specific rivalry than WWE did, whether it was due to creative reasons or other factors. Some entries are subjective, of course, and maybe splitting hairs a little. Others, though, are undoubted and are a credit to those who build worlds outside of WWE's walls. A few honorable mentions before we start, though. Eddie Guerrero vs. Rey Mysterio, Macho Man Randy Savage vs. Ric Flair, Chris Benoit vs. Booker T, and Drew McIntyre slash Galloway vs. Bobby Lashley were each negligibly equal to their non-WWE versions. The following ten? A little less so. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 WWE feuds other promotions did better. Join us. Number 10, Kevin Steen vs. El Generico. When your slugfests inspire chants of fight forever, there is a good chance the animosity has spanned multiple territories. Indeed, long before Kevin Owens was ruining Sami Zayn's NXT Championship moments, Kevin Steen and El Generico were ripping each other apart throughout the indies. CZW, PWG, and others have provided the world with some of Steen and Generico's most violent battles, but it was in Ring of Honor that Steen Erico clashed best. The 2010 Fight Without Honor, the 2012 Ladder War, and Last Man Standing match, you are talking one of the greatest indie rivalries ever. In 2014, the renamed Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn renewed hostilities, and honestly, it's not too far off what they did in Ring of Honor and elsewhere. The NXT stuff was pretty great, but it's a little spottier on the main roster. Owens and Zayn did have that great match at Battleground in 2016, 
2019, and their WrestleMania 37 battle was fun, random inclusion of Logan Paul aside, it is hard to criticize the WWE version, except to say that it lacks much of the intensity of their earlier wars. Basically, it's impossible to get Owens vs Zayn wrong, but all told, Steam vs Generico is just a teensy bit more fun. Number 9, AJ Styles vs Shinsuke Nakamura When Shinsuke Nakamura won the 2018 Men's Royal Rumble, everybody collectively realized that Styles just so happened to be the WWE Champion and then did the math. Styles vs Nakamura for the WWE title at WrestleMania 34? WWE's going to have two men that briefly feuded in New Japan several years earlier face off for their richest prize at their biggest event? After the absolute classic they had at Wrestle Kingdom 10 for the IWGP Intercontinental title, the most excited among the fanbase were expecting comparable or exceeding greatness at Mania. And with all due respect to two of the greatest modern era wrestlers, it didn't quite work out that way. Styles and Nakamura at Wrestlemania could be considered very good, but it was viewed as a disappointment against those high expectations. Styles won cleanly and somewhat abruptly, both of which surprised many, so a rueful Nakamura struck him in the nuts afterward. Nakamura's random heel turn begat a ball-bashing streak, which he carried through several more, mostly heatless, pay-per-view outings with Styles fighting to non-finishes. Styles finally ended the feud in a pretty good last man standing match at Money in the Bank, but interest had long been killed off by then. Number 8, AJ Styles vs Samoa Joe now, it must be said that the idea of Samoa Joe as a lifetime movie-style stalker is a curiosity in its own right. However, in his WWE title feud with Styles in 2018, it felt like an unnecessary bit of drama designed to spruce up a feud between longtime rivals. Joe's sullen and creepy recitation of Wendy felt like a poor table reading of The Shining script at times, but this kitschy sports entertainment approach doesn't quite compare to the simple avenue that was taken when Styles and Joe faced off in TNA over a decade earlier. Joe came into TNA as an unbeatable monster, while X Division Champion Styles was the valiant David to his Goliath. Matches at Sacrifice and Turning Point are all-time classics, while their three-way match with Christopher Daniels at Unbreakable is probably TNA's greatest match ever. Granted, Styles and Joe's WWE battles weren't too far off their shared TNA DNA standard, but the stalker melodrama added soap opera elements where they just weren't required. Number 7, Cody Rhodes vs Dustin Rhodes So this one may be a bit of a cheat, since the brothers Rhodes didn't exactly have a lengthy feud in AEW, they had one singles match against one another at the inaugural event, Double or Nothing. In the month prior to the event, Cody and Dustin took part in vignettes where they spelled out the extent of their occasional estrangement and how their respective professional standings fed into their uneasy divide. The build was inspired, but not as inspired as the match, where Dusty's boys put on a highly emotional five-star epic that brought the house down in spectacular fashion. Contrast that to four years earlier, when Goldust and Stardust fell out with one another. There were plans to pit the brothers against each other at WrestleMania 31, but next to no compelling build and a very lukewarm match between the two at February's Fastlane killed the feud dead in its tracks. It's little surprise that over a year later, Cody would seek his release while Dustin left in 2019, just in time for Double or Nothing. While WWE didn't know what they could have had, it is fair to say that few were expecting Cody and Dustin's fantastic finished product. Number 6, Raven vs Perry Saturn When you see 1998 WCW do something better than 2001 WWE, your first instinct is to have a trade medical professional evaluate you for a concussion. Well, I assure you that is exactly what happened in the case of two ECW originals turned senior members of the flock. 
In 1998, Saturn broke free from Raven's domineering ways and sought to liberate the more docile flock members from Raven's spell. Months of battles came to a head at the 1998 Fall Brawl, where Saturn defeated Raven in a pretty great match where the flock would have to disband if Raven lost. It was Saturn's biggest singles win ever. Fast forward three years and both men were in different places in a crowded WWE. After a bump on the head, Saturn fell in love with a mop that he named Moppy. Raven, meanwhile, was little better than a tertiary member of the Alliance, palling around with Saturn's ex, Terry Runnels. The two crossed paths in a storyline where Raven fed Moppy to a wood chipper, so Saturn beat him in a throwaway match at Unforgiven. Not the most inspired angle, and with far less emotional stakes. Unless you have a mop fetish, in which case, my apologies. Number 5. Ric Flair vs Steve Austin It is almost criminal that the world never got a proper Austin vs Flair singles feud when both were established main eventers. Had Flair actually jumped to WWE in 1998 after falling out with Eric Bischoff, we may have gotten a Stone Cold Nature Boy world title feud, but alas. The best rivalry Austin and Flair had was a brief one in WCW in 1993, when Austin and Hollywood Blonde's partner Brian Pillman mocked Flair for being old, leading to an excellent tag team title match with Flair and Arn Anderson at Clash of the Champions. That small taste of Austin vs Flair was far better than their feud on Raw in 2002. Austin wasn't at his best as his Stone Cold character was more tame and cliched than revolutionary by this time. And speaking of cliched, Austin was given yet another authority figure to clash with as he started bullying an erstwhile accommodating Flair following a refereeing blunder at Backlash. Then Flair turned heel, then Flair stacked the deck against Austin, yada yada yada. Austin's walkout in June cut the rivalry short after one good TV match between the two, but let's face it, it wasn't either legendary figure's finest work. Number 4. Chris Jericho vs John Moxley Chris Jericho and the man once known as Dean Ambrose are among the more reliable performers in the business, especially when it comes to making something silly work. But that wasn't exactly the case in 2016, when petulant heel Jericho and detached oddball Ambrose feuded over the death of a houseplant, leading to a weapons-filled cage match that managed to take the edge off of some genuinely brutal moments. Jericho does comedy well, and Ambrose can do comedy well, but there's some bad comedy that they just can't exercise the demons out of. At the dawn of the 20s, Jericho was reigning as AEW's first world champion, and Ambrose was once more Moxley, the rebellious street fighter that backs down from no one. The two were set for a world title match at Revolution, and Jericho did all he could to derail his feisty challenger. This included offering him a spot in the inner circle and a car, then later trying to take Moxley's eye out with a spike. An eye patch wearing Moxley nearly blinded Jericho henchman Santana as payback and went on to defeat Jericho in a bloody battle to win the gold. I mean, that's way more fun than avenging a plant down in the midcard, eh? Number 3. Hulk Hogan vs Ric Flair For years, this was THE dream match in professional wrestling. Fans debated and magazines speculated what would happen if the WWF's Hulkster and WCW's Nature Boy were to cross paths inside the squared circle. In 1991, it looked like those questions would be answered when WCW's mismanagement sent Flair on the road to New York. And it didn't take long for the Fed to set up Hogan and Flair as rivals, begging the question of who was the real world champion. WrestleMania 8 seemed like the battleground for the historic showdown, but after a long house show run, WWE fans never got Hogan vs Flair proper. WCW, meanwhile, was quicker to deliver the dream match on the ideal medium. Flair returned to WCW in 1993, and Hogan signed amid much hoopla in 1994. Immediately, Hogan was programmed against a heel turn and Flair for the WCW world title and beat Nate for the belt at July's Bash at the Beach. WCW did strong business from that pay-per-view foray and was apt to run Hogan vs Flair off and on into 1999. Their WCW matches weren't always awe-inspiring, but WCW got more out of Hogan vs Flair than WWE did, which cannot be argued. 
Number two, Matt Hardy versus Jeff Hardy. There were three times that the not yet broken brethren were at odds in WWE. Briefly at the end of 2001 over petty matters, a random moment in 2002 that facilitated Matt's heel turn, and their 2009, yeah, I killed your dog and I tried to kill you as well, bit of nuttiness that was wiped away months later when the Hardys ended up on friendly terms once more, like, sorry about the attempted murder. Hey, we all make mistakes. Aside from a vastly underrated match at WrestleMania 25, Matt and Jeff never really did make magic against each other in WWE. In TNA, however, they made something that many folks consider magical, while leaving others with a bit of a migraine. Matt's inability to solve the Jeff puzzle in TNA in 2016 led him spiraling into unfathomable madness, which introduced the world to Broken Matt, an enigma like no other. Broken Matt and his cheerfully laid vocabulary challenged Brother Nero to a final deletion at the Hardy compound, which was as creative as it was absurd. And unlike their WWE matches, this got people talking, for better or for worse. The Hardys continued down this same preposterous path in TNA, and it jump-started their careers as a result. Number 1. The New World Order vs. The Company Maybe it's not exactly the same, since WWE and WCW are different promotions, but screw it, it's the same thing, same premise, and the audience had the same idea. In 1996, Scott Hall, Kevin Nash, Hulk Hogan, and others banded together as a malevolent, power-hungry faction that ran roughshod over WCW, scarfing up belts, TV time, and glory all the while. The opposition was the entire WCW roster, and several years of high-profile bouts were produced by this stable war. Not all of it was great, but the awesome parts are still fondly remembered today. In 2002, WWE brought back 40-something Halls, Nash and Hogan to comprise a reborn NWO, the story being that a spiteful McMahon was going to let them kill the Federation. Except none of the chaos or drama was there. The three aging heavyweights just tooled around and carried out occasional attacks, but nothing as tumultuous or landscape-changing as what they did one company earlier. And hey, within a month, Hogan turned babyface in conjunction with his legendary match against The Rock. Hall, Nash, and addition Sean Waltman, Big Show, Booker T, and Shawn Michaels never felt like a big deal, and after some DVD and t-shirt sales, the New York version of the NWO faded to black and white. In more than one sense, WCW did killing their own company better than WWE did. The Royal Rumble is arguably the greatest stipulation match in all of wrestling. It has something for everyone, intense in-ring action, big surprises, nail-biting drama, counting down from 10. It's a great big wrestling variety pack, and we are all here for it. The Rumble has also been a great vehicle for comedy. Often, when WWE try and be funny, it usually ends up with the same results as adding nitroglycerin into a birthday cake, but for some reason, this match seems to be the exception. Over its several decades of existence, the Rumble has provided fans with plenty of laugh-out-loud moments, sometimes intentionally, sometimes not. Looking at you, Vince, honorable mention. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 funniest Royal Rumble moments. Join us. Number 10, not fair to Flair. The 1992 Royal Rumble match is considered by many to be the best the format has ever seen, which is saying something considering it has Skinner in it. 30 men all fought not for the chance to main event WrestleMania, but to win the vacant WWE title. After Hulk Hogan threw a massive tantrum about being eliminated fairly, Ric Flair swooped in to win the match and the coveted Winged Eagle belt. The Nature Boy entered the match at number three, which caused all sorts of anxiety for his financial advisor, Bobby Heenan. The Brain was on commentary during this match and almost had a fit when his charge entered the fray so early. Heenan's this whole performance behind the announce desk here is legendary, as he perfectly portrays his fear of Flair losing whilst managing to keep in all of his classic one-liners. His highlights include bickering with Gorilla Monsoon, claiming he would low-blow his own grandmother to win the match, and finally calling Roddy Piper's outfit a kilt when he helps Flair, only to call it a skirt minutes later when Piper attacks him. A masterclass in heel commentary, there will never be another like the brain.
Number 9. Mil Mascaras Forgets the Rules The 1997 Rumble match included four entrants from Mexican promotion AAA, with whom WWE had a working partnership with at the time. They were Pieroff, Latin Lover, Cibernetico, and the legendary Mil Mascaras. The man in the silver mask dumped Pieroff out of the ring to score his second elimination of the match. Then, in a baffling turn of events, he scaled the ropes and leapt onto his fellow countrymen on the outside. Side. It's an impressive spot, until you remember that this is the Royal Rumble. This moment of madness, of course, meant that he had eliminated himself from the match for no good reason. He then tried to get back in the ring, only for the referees on the outside to tell him to piss off. Oh, so it's all right when Randy Savage does it, eh? This unbelievable gaffe is made even funnier by commentators Vince McMahon and Jim Ross trying and failing to cover it up. In actuality, the notoriously protective Mill made the decision himself because he felt being chucked out like everyone else would make him look like a loser. It's a shame that this is the only thing a lot of wrestling fans know about one of the greatest luchadors of all time. A shame, but still hilarious. Number 8. Excuse Me Vicky Guerrero is an incredibly polarizing figure. To some people, she was the ever-reliable heat magnet that helped steer Raw and SmackDown through some of its darkest days in the early 2010s. To others, she's a banshee on steroids with one of the worst voices in the history of the human race. Those people are marks. Anyway, that voice rang out around the Wells Fargo Center when Vicky entered the first ever Women's Royal Rumble match at number 16. Her shrill yells of excuse me pierced the eardrums of anyone within a five-mile radius as she stormed down to the ring. After deafening everyone, Vicky stopped to assess the situation she found herself in. That situation was not good. The four women in the ring all ganged up on wrestling's greatest cougar, chucking her out of the ring to the sheer delight of the crowd. Vicky's appearance in the Rumble was spot on. It was short, sweet, and conveyed everything that made her character so irritatingly great. For putting up with a lot of rubbish during her many years with WWE, it was nice to see Vicky get one last chance to make us all laugh. Number 7. Drew Carey the 2001 Royal Rumble is one of the few others that most often gets brought up alongside 92 as being one of the best ever. One of the more unique portions of the match involves comedian and actor Drew Carey. He entered the contest in the number 5 spot. Mr. McMahon had put Drew in the Rumble earlier that night as punishment for him flirting with Trish Stratus. If anyone's going to prey on a diva, it's Vince himself, damn it. Drew got in the ring right as Matt and Jeff Hardy took each other out of the Rumble. This left the star to bask in the limelight until Kane showed up. The big red machine stalked the outside of the ring like a shark circling a seal. Drew begged the referees for help and even tried to call the Hardy Boys back, but to no avail. Once Kane gets in the ring, Drew goes to shake his hand and even offers him some money. He escaped certain doom when Raven entered next, allowing our man to hop over the top rope and out of the match. Bad Bunny can keep his Canadian destroyers because this was Celebrity Wrestling Royal Rumble Bliss. Number 6. Bushwhacked the Bushwhackers have a Dave Meltzer five-star match in their repertoires. Kurt Angle does not. There is no God. The New Zealand duo, famous for head-licking and battering ramming, both made separate appearances in the 1991 Rumble match. Bushwhacker Butch lasted 10 minutes from the number 8 spot, whilst his partner in crime lasted far less time but achieved far more fame. Bushwhacker Luke cut his trademark march down to the ring. He then marched in between the ropes and and, guided by Earthquake, marched all the way across the ring and out the other side. To top it off, he even kept marching after his elimination. Luke lasted just four seconds in the match, but put each one to great use. He pulled this spot off to perfection, never once breaking character as he was unceremoniously dumped over the top rope and sent for an early shower. One of the earliest comedy spots in the Rumble, this moment shows that WWE were now willing to take more risks with the format and offer up a bit more diversity diversity across the hour-long matches. Number 5. Lawler Royally Fails Jerry Lawler has had two Rumble performances that could 
to qualify for this spot. In 1996, the King spent the majority of his 36 minutes in the Rumble hiding under the ring after being frightened by Jake Roberts' massive snake. No, that is not a euphemism. One year later, he would spend significantly less time in the match. Lawler was a surprise entrant from the commentary table, shocking his partner Vince McMahon as he put down his headset and joined the fray. He attempted to sneak up on Bret Hart, but the hitman clobbered Jerry with a punch and then hit him again to send him sailing backwards over the top rope. In all, Lawler spent just four seconds in the match, but my god were they great. Everything from his cocky swagger to his selling of the punches to the incredible whoa noise he makes whilst flying out of the ring is golden. The fact that he can't even remember he was in the match once he gets back on commentary is the icing on the cake. In the words of the man himself, you can't have a Royal Rumble without a king. Number 4. Gilbert's Time to Shine Impressions can make or break a wrestling career. Pretending to be The Miz gave Damian Sandow a new lease of life in WWE, but cosplaying as Randy Savage put the final nail in his coffin. One man for whom a good mimicking really paid off was Dwayne Gill, aka Gilberg. A parody of a top WCW star, you'll never guess which one, Gilberg was a hapless jobber who embarrassed himself every single time he set foot in the ring. The 1999 Royal Rumble match was no different. Gilbert entered at number 6, posing and gurning his way down to the ring. He then got inside, posed on the second rope, and was immediately tipped out of the ring by an exasperated looking Edge. The way Edge treated Gilbert with such utter disdain is beautiful. He put zero effort into eliminating him, but Dwayne still sold like he'd been shoved full force off the Empire State Building. Always willing to play the fool if the storyline called for it, Gilbert was an absolute trooper, and this might just be his greatest ever a moment. Who needs an undefeated streak? Number 3. The Hurricane Screws Up One of the best things to come out of the godforsaken invasion storyline was Shane Helms transforming into the Hurricane. A send-up of superheroes, the Hurricane wore his best Green Lantern threads, sported a rather dashing cape mask combo, and even had a special vehicle called the Hurricycle. He also kidnapped and brainwashed Molly Holly that one time, but we don't talk about that. The 2002 Royal Rumble featured a great moment where former two-man power trip members Stone Cold Steve Austin and Triple H came face to face for the first time in months. The two legends battered each other, both dropping to the mat after a double clothesline. Then came the next entrant, the caped crusader himself. Hurricane sized the two much larger men up and went for a chokeslam on both of them at the same time. With superb comic timing, Austin and Triple H looked at each other before promptly sending the superhero back to his lair. Not only did this moment perfectly snap the tension in the ring, but it also gave us a moment moment far superior to any MCU movie. Come at me, nerds. Number 2. Santino Wasn't Ready For 20 long years, the Warlord held the record for the shortest time spent in a single Royal Rumble match. His two-second stint in the 1989 match seemed unbeatable. Surely nobody could screw up as badly as this. Then along came Santino. At the 2009 event, Santino Morella drew number 28, which has yielded the joint highest number of winners of any spot in the match. Santino was not one of them. He barreled his way down to the ring and slid under the bottom rope, only for Kane to immediately clothesline him out, and I mean immediately. The Milan miracle lasted one single solitary second in the Rumble, breaking the Warlord's record and earning himself a place in the history books. His screams of I wasn't ready after the elimination just make this moment even better. A failure on this scale was perfect for the bumbling character of Santino, and he pulled off what was actually a very tricky spot without a hit. It's highly unlikely that anyone will ever break Santino's record, but there's no one we would rather see go down in Rumble history than our favourite fake Italian. With all due respect to Johnny Stamboli, of course. Number 1. Titus World Slide Whilst we would all love to forget the armpit stain that was the greatest Royal Rumble from 2018, this one moment will ensure that it lives on in our minds for eternity. The main event of the first ever major WWE show to take place in Saudi Arabia was was a 50-man rumble match for a disgusting-looking green belt. 
Entrant number 39, which feels like a really odd thing to say, was Titus O'Neil, and you all know what happened next. Unfortunately, he tripped on some air and went tumbling to the ground, landing perfectly under the ring with his legs sticking out like some sort of Looney Tunes cartoon. It was fantastic, pure slapstick at its finest, but with this moment comes a whole heap of conspiracy theories. Titus had done stuff like this before, most notably when he fell over nothing during a barrel carrying challenge on NXT, but this was different. The way he fell, the position he landed under the ring, the perfectness of the Titus world slide pun, it all just seemed too good to be true. Not everything's a work. I love you, Titus. Competing at WrestleMania is one thing, but to have your very first WWE match at the event, now that is special. It's also something that these 10 ragtag bunch have in common, as they all stepped into the ring on the main roster for the very first time at the show of shows. Did they all make an impact in these matches? Nah, not at all. Hell, half of them didn't even win, but they will always have these memories to go in their scrapbooks. And isn't that all wrestling's really about at the end of the day? No, it's about making money. Can't pay your mortgage with memories, can you? I'm Adam Pachisi from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 wrestlers who had their debut match at WrestleMania. Join us. Number 10, Lana. WrestleMania 32 is remembered for many things. The Rock squashing Eric Rowan in six seconds. The introduction of the new women's championship. The main event being one of the most boring wrestling matches of all time. With all that going on, it's incredibly easy to overlook the 10-woman tag team match that took place on the pre-show. Team Total Divas vs Team Blonde and Bad, yes, that's really what they were called, featured established names like Natalia, Brie Bella and Paige, as well as a woman who had only been previously seen as a manager. The ravishing Russian Lana was competing in a WWE ring for the first time ever as part of Team Blonde and Bad. I would tell you some of the stuff she did in between the ropes, but to be honest, she didn't really do that much. I can tell you that Lana and the rest of her team lost this match, which I'm sure everyone was devastated by. Number 9, Sunny. Sticking with managers now and a woman who used to be famous for being quote unquote the original diva. Now she's famous for, well, let's just say other things and move on quickly. Tammy Lynn Sitch, better known as Sunny, managed teams like the Godwins, the Legion of Doom, and the Body Donners during the 1990s. Despite being heavily featured on WWE programming at the time, she wouldn't participate in an actual match until 2009. 14 years after her first WWE appearance, Sunny took to the ring alongside 24 other women to vie for the crown of Miss WrestleMania. Well, 23 other women and one man in drag, but let's not get into that now, yeah? Despite having matches in Smoky Mountain Wrestling, ECW, and WCW, this is Sunny's only official bout for WWE. It's also her most recent match, as she hasn't returned to the ring since. And honestly, we don't blame her. If being in a match that acted as an afterthought to a Kid Rock concert was my only WWE wrestling experience, I'm not sure I would want to do it again either. Number 8. Logan Paul We didn't want to count celebrities on this list, because then we would just be talking about Lawrence Taylor, Floyd Mayweather, and Akabono for the entire thing, but none of those guys got signed to contracts, did they? YouTube sensation and all-round likeable guy, Logan Paul made his first WrestleMania appearance as part of the Kevin Owens vs Sami Zayn match at WrestleMania 37. One year later, Paul returned to the show of shows, only this time he was actually competing. Teaming up with The Miz and a very expensive Pokemon card, Paul put in one of, if not the greatest celebrity performances in the history of wrestling as he and the A-lister took down Dominic and Rey Mysterio. And since that day, the vlogger has gone from strength to strength inside the ring. His singles match with Miz at SummerSlam was exceptional, as was his world title match with Roman Reigns, and he had the spot of the night at the 2023 Royal Rumble when he and Ricochet attempted to fuse together mid-air. As much as you may hate to admit it, the kid's got something. Number 7. Omos Nigeria's tallest man and former giant ninja, Omos, actually made a bit of history when he made his in-ring debut at WrestleMania 37. Teaming up with his protective charge AJ Styles, Omos went to war with the New Day over the Raw Tag Team Championships. In a classic bit of big man booking, the Colossus obliterated Kofi and Xavier in easy fashion, dominating the multi-time champs and pinning Kingston with one foot. Kofi Mania sure feels like a long time ago, doesn't it? 
In capturing the titles alongside Styles, Omos became the first actual wrestler in history to make his debut at Mania and win a championship in the same match. Sorry, Nicholas, you don't count. Other people had done one or the other, but nobody had ever done both. Team for non Omos, which is absolutely what they should have been called, held the gold until SummerSlam when they lost it to RK Bro. Omos then had his first WrestleMania singles match with Bobby Lashley, suffering his first pinfall loss in the process. This guy really likes to do things for the first time at WrestleMania, doesn't he? Number 6. Fandango WrestleMania 29 was, in the grand scheme of things, largely forgettable. It does, however, hold a special place in the heart of the next two performers, both of whom took to the ring for the very first time at the event. Before he was a fashion cop, Fandango was an arrogant ballroom dancer who debuted for WWE in March of 2013. He kept pulling out of his first match because he thought that nobody was saying his name right. This went on for a few weeks until he ran into a certain Chris Jericho. Y2J made fun of Dango's name and attitude, which prompted the dancer to interfere in a number of his matches. This set the stage for a match between the two at the upcoming WrestleMania. In a moment that seems absolutely bonkers in hindsight, Fandango actually defeated Jericho in front of God and everyone. How did WWE capitalize on this momentum? Well, they booked Dango to lose his rematch with Jericho one month later, then he just sort of slowly but handsomely fell down the card and ended up getting released in 2021. To be honest, probably should have never beat Jericho in the first place. Number 5. Big E One match prior to Fandango vs Jericho was a battle for the WWE Tag Team Championships pitting Hell No against Dolph Ziggler and his personal muscle. This was Big E Langston, a former NXT champion who debuted alongside Ziggler and AJ Lee in December of 2012. After acting as the Money in the Bank holders heavy for several months, the time finally came for Mr. Langston to get between the ropes. In his main roster debut, Big E teamed up with Dolph in an attempt to wrest the tag straps away from Daniel Bryan and Kane. In spite of his best efforts, Dolph and E were unsuccessful after Bryan pinned Ziggler with a top rope headbutt. This was the start of a long and prosperous career on the main roster for our boy. He's since appeared at many more editions of Mania, most recently defending the Intercontinental Championship against Apollo Crews at number 37. Hopefully this isn't the last we'll see of the New Day member at the biggest show of the year. Get well soon, Biggie. We all miss you. Number 4. Sting Did you know that a quarter of all Sting's WWE matches took place at WrestleMania? That may have something to do with him only wrestling four matches in the company, but still... After decades of resisting their pull, the icon made his first WWE appearance at Survivor Series 2014. Coming to the aid of Dolph Ziggler, the WCW legend helped put the villainous authority out of action for about five weeks. All of this built to a huge nostalgia-fueled dream match, Sting vs Triple H at WrestleMania 31. In a highly entertaining contest, the Stinger and the game proved that they could both still go. They also invited some of their friends along, even if the NWO helping Sting out made absolutely no sense. You know who was their biggest adversary at one point, WWE? Unfortunately, terrible choice of winner and all, this would be as good as it would get for the face-painted vigilante. He would have two more matches on Raw and then get injured in his WWE title match with Seth Rollins. By WrestleMania 32, he was in the Hall of Fame and he never wrestled for anyone else ever again. I promise. Number 3. Baron Corbin This is the third time we've mentioned Mania 32 and so I must ask, is somebody pulling a rib on me? If I must talk about this infernal show, then I may as well talk about the fun but inconsequential Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal that took place toward the end of the night. 20 men all fought for the giant golden fezzik, including Shaquille O'Neal, Diamond Dallas Page, and Tatonka for some reason. Also in the pack was NXT's lone wolf, Baron Corbin, who was making his first main roster appearance on this night. After a gripping Final Four that also included Luminaries Bo Dallas and Darren Young, Corbin snuck up behind Kane and dumped the big man out of the ring to pick up a huge victory. And how did WWE follow this up? By having him lose to Dolph Ziggler at the next pay-per-view. As either Baron King or Happy, Mr. Corbin has had plenty more Mania highlights, including challenging for the Intercontinental Championship at 33, wrestling Drew McIntyre at 38, and retiring Kurt Angle at 35. Number 2. Ronda Rousey 
The Olympic gold medalist was having a much better time at the previous year's Mania when he teamed up with a debuting star to take on Triple H and Stephanie McMahon. That star was none other than UFC sensation Ronda Rousey, who, like Logan Paul, had made a non-wrestling WrestleMania appearance prior to her in-ring debut. Rousey had rocked up at the Royal Rumble, accompanied by the most dramatic point in human history, to set the stage for this mania encounter. Though reportedly WWE would have much rather her partner be The Rock, at least this was an excuse to give Angle his first WrestleMania match in 12 years. This mixed tag team match was just so much fun. The ultimate sports entertainment schmoz, everybody played their parts to perfection, and the crowd in New Orleans that night lapped every single bit of it up. In the end, Rousey almost tore Steph's arm off to get the win for her team in one of the most entertaining first matches in WWE history. One year later, and she was only bloody main eventing the whole pay-per-view. Good work and progress, Ronnie. Number 1. Bianca Belair Hold on there, I hear you cry. Bianca Belair made her main roster debut the night after WrestleMania 36. I hope someone gets fired for that blunder. Well, that's very much the story WWE would like you to believe. In reality, the future Raw and SmackDown Women's Champion actually appeared on the main roster two years earlier. As part of the WrestleMania 34 kickoff show, WWE put on the first ever WrestleMania Women's Battle Royal. It was initially called the Fabulous Moolah Memorial Battle Royal until everyone realized what a horrible person she was. Among the competitors in this match was a contingent of women from NXT. They were Kavita Devi, Tynara Conti, now Ty Mello in AEW, Dakota Kai, and the EST herself. Yes, Bianca Belair's main roster debut actually happened as part of a multi-woman over-the-top rope contest originally named after an alleged pimp. Talk about prestigious. From very humble beginnings, Belair rose up through the ranks to have two of the best Mania singles matches of recent years, her clash with Becky Lynch at 38 and her historic main event clash with Sasha Banks at 37. I'm sure Moolah is looking up and smiling. You know what they say, two's a crowd, but three's company. Actually, have I got that the wrong way around? Either way, some of the greatest wrestling matches of all time have had three participants. Whether they were fighting for championships, glory, or even the love of a good woman, these sets of triplets all proved that three is indeed the magic number. Before we start, we are not including tag team triple threats on this list. We are looking at three men or women duking it out. And before we start, a few honorable mentions. The Shield triple threat at 2016's Battleground, Daniel Bryan vs. Randy Orton vs. Batista in the main event of WrestleMania 30, and Edge vs. Daniel Bryan vs. Roman Reigns at WrestleMania 37. With that said, I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 greatest triple threats in WWE history. Join us! Number 10. John Cena vs. Triple H vs. Shawn Michaels at Survivor Series 2009 Survivor Series 2009 was actually home to two very good triple threat matches. They both pitted an existing tag team against a singles world champion. The first saw the members of Jericho battle The Undertaker for the World Heavyweight Championship, and the second pitted John Cena against D-Generation X. In the world title match, Chris Jericho and The Big Show attempted to work together to slay the dead man. Would the same thing happen in the second bout? Nah. As soon as the bell rang, DX fell apart when Shawn Michaels cracked Triple H on the jaw with a super kick. This is where that dumbfounded Cena meme face comes from, by the way. This led to a fascinating dynamic throughout the match, as Michaels and Trips were now on their own against the champion. It also meant that HBK and Triple H were allowed to fight each other, which was something fans hadn't seen in a while. Whilst this match did suffer a little bit from the old one guy gets taken out revolving door issue that WWE Triple Threats suffer from, the relationships between these three men made for a thrilling contest. Number 9. Asuka vs Becky Lynch vs Charlotte Flair at TLC 2018 For just the fourth time in WWE history, an all-female main event was booked for the final pay-per-view of 2018. SmackDown Women's Champion Becky Lynch and Charlotte Flair had been feuding since the summer, as the man was the one to dethrone the Queen for the blue belt. Adding Asuka into the mix for this title match really helped shake things up, as their singles feud was in danger of growing stale. Because this was December, WWE had no other choice but to book these women in a TLC match. Could have been avoided by, you know, not naming pay-per-views after match types, but there you go. Thankfully, the stipulation suited the match perfectly, as all three talented workers smacked the ever-loving 
stuffing stuffing out of each other. The trio were given over 21 minutes to play with and used every single one to tear the house down with epic spots and crazy bumps. The match ended when Ronda Rousey came down to take out Lynch and Flair, handing the title to Asuka and setting the stage for the WrestleMania 35 main event. That triple threat might have made it on here too were it not for the horribly botched finish. Number 8, Charlotte vs Becky Lynch vs Sasha Banks at WrestleMania 32 In terms of historical significance, this match might just be the most important one on this list. Charlotte, who had yet to gain her father's surname at this point, was the Divas Champion heading into WrestleMania 32. Thankfully, WWE realized that having their female competitors fight over a sparkly butterfly might be a little bit demeaning. Crazy, I know. They finally retired the pink menace and introduced a brand new women's championship for Charlotte, Becky Lynch, and Sasha Banks to compete for at Mania. Three of the four horsewomen gave this new title the epic first battle it deserved. They brought all of the skills and chemistry that had started the women's revolution down in NXT to give WWE main roster fans perhaps the greatest women's match of all time up to that point. In the end, Charlotte won the match to become the inaugural champion. However, the real winners here were the fans and women's wrestling as a whole, but really it was Charlotte. Number 7. The Rock vs The Undertaker vs Kurt Angle at Vengeance 2002 Not quite the Attitude Era, not quite so defined ruthless aggression, the first half of 2002 often gave us a wonderful mixture of stars competing against each other. That includes this match, featuring Big Evil Undertaker, the freshly bald Kurt Angle, and the the Scorpion King himself. The three legends gave us one of the best pay-per-view main events of the entire year. The Undertaker was heading into the match as undisputed champion, having won the belt off Hulk Hogan a couple of months prior. Clearly, he was really happy to be finally working with people who didn't qualify for a complimentary bus pass as he went all out in this match. All three of these guys brought something different to this party. Angle was the technical wizard, Rock the valiant showman, and Taker the bruising heavyweight. This clash of styles made for compelling viewing as these titans of the ring all presented a strong case for leaving with the gold and produced a wonderful sequence where they all tried each other's finishes on each other. In the end, it was the Dwayne that got the victory, pinning Angle with a rock bottom to become a then record setting seven time world champ. Number 6 Brock Lesnar vs. Kurt Angle vs. The Big Show at Vengeance 2003 the year 2003 was all about the rivalry between Brock Lesnar and Kurt Angle because it definitely wasn't about the Triple H Goldberg feud on Raw. A pair of super athletic, pain resistant freaks, Angle and Lesnar were a match made in terrifying, muscly heaven and they put on many memorable matches across the year. They were both involved in the main event of Vengeance 2003, although they weren't alone. Big Show, the man who had ended Lesnar's undefeated streak the year before, had also wormed his way into the mix, setting up a triple threat for Brock's belt. Though some fans thought he might drag the other men down, Show's inclusion was actually a great addition. He gave both men something to work around, meaning that they could modify spots from their previous match instead of just trotting them out again. They also made Show look like something of a monster, which he hadn't been effectively presented as in a good long while. In the end, Angle pinned the champion to pick up the belt, setting in motion yet more wonderful singles matches between the two. Number 5. The Rock vs. Versus Triple H versus Kurt Angle at SummerSlam 2000. The main event WWE title match at SummerSlam 2000 was all about three people Triple H, Kurt Angle, and Stephanie McMahon. Oh, yeah, and actual world champion The Rock, I suppose. This was the apex of one of the most soap opera storylines WWE has ever done the McMahon Helmsley Angle love triangle. As Kurt and Steph grew closer as just friends, the game grew increasingly more jealous. This all peaked when the goal medalist planted a smooch on the billion dollar princess on the smackdown before the big night. Bloody hell, it's like EastEnders, only somehow less violent? All this context made the SummerSlam triple threat more compelling than any technical masterpiece. It didn't even matter that Angle got his bell rung minutes into the match after a botched pedigree and had to take some time out backstage. In fact, if anything, it just made it more intriguing. Sports entertainment at its finest, this match would unfortunately turn out to be the high point of the story as Hunter soon pulled the plug on it backstage. 
Something about it not being believable that Steph would leave him a real man for that dorky Kurt. Sure thing, Drips. Keep telling yourself that. Number four, Seth Rollins versus The Miz versus Finn Balor at WrestleMania 34. In terms of WrestleMania openers, you could do much, much worse than this triple threat for the Intercontinental Championship from Mania 34. Looking at you, Tag Team 4-Way from Mania 13, The Miz had got himself in the crosshairs of both Seth Rollins and Finn Balor in the lead-up to the biggest show of the year. Both former NXT champions were gunning for his IC belt, which led to this three-way scuffle. And look, we all know that Miz isn't the greatest technician in the world and his standard moveset is about as exciting as watching a worm run the 200 meters, but when he's paired up with other more invigorating opponents, he is the perfect foil. Rollins and Balor handled all the thrilling moves, whilst Miz served as the cowardly heel who would use underhanded tactics to try to steal a win. This gave the match a really entertaining structure to work around, and all three participants worked with each other brilliantly. Seth got the win in what was one of the best matches on the entire Mania card. I mean, it was certainly better than that pitiful Brock Roman main event, and I tell them that to their faces too, and then run away really quickly. Number three, Brock Lesnar versus John Cena versus Seth Rollins at Royal Rumble 2015. Speaking of the Beast Incarnate, here he is again, this time defending his WWE Championship against two very different opponents at Royal Rumble 2015. Lesnar had been champion since SummerSlam, where he conducted an experiment on John Cena to see how many times a man could be dropped on his neck and still become a famous movie star. Cena had come close to regaining the title at Night of Champions when Seth Rollins attempted to cash in Money in the Bank and ruined everything. A few months later, this highly charged triple threat was made. The early stages of this match were based around just one thing, trying to kill Brock Lesnar. A sound strategy, I'm sure you'll agree. Cena and Rollins went hell for leather to keep Lesnar down, succeeding when the architect hit an elbow drop on him through the announce table. Q Rollins and Cena having some one-on-one time, which is never a bad thing, before Lesnar rose from the dead to pin Seth and retain. A match of two halves, as they say in football, each as gripping as each other. Is that what they say in football? Don't really watch it. Is Beckham still playing? Number two, Chris Benoit versus Triple H versus Shawn Michaels at WrestleMania 20. Daniel Bryan versus Randy Orton versus Batista. Roman Reigns versus Daniel Bryan versus Edge. The last five minutes of WrestleMania 31. These are all WrestleMania triple threat main events and they all absolutely ruled. However, the best of the bunch must be from the night where it all began again. Still have no idea what that tagline means, by the way. The big World Heavyweight Championship bout at WrestleMania 20 looked like it was going to be between champion Triple H and scorned former friend Shawn Michaels. That was until Chris Benoit won the Royal Rumble and inserted himself into the picture. The end result was a phenomenal triple threat match featuring two super workers and Triple H who was also there. I'm kidding, obviously, and to give the game his dues, he was the perfect fulcrum for the two mega athletes to pivot around. After nearly 25 minutes of intense action and about 10 pints of blood loss, the rabid Wolverine made Trips tap out to complete his underdog rise to the top. In fact, this match was so good that they ran it back again at Backlash the following month. Number one, Gunter versus Sheamus versus Drew McIntyre at WrestleMania 39 Night 2. In 2023, for just the second time in history, Dave Meltzer awarded a full five stars to a triple threat match. The first was AJ Styles versus Christopher Daniels versus Samoa Joe from TNA Unbreakable 2005, a masterclass of ring psychology, high flying, and storytelling. The second, well, that was just three meaty blokes smacking the pork out of each other. Okay, that's not fair. Gunter, Sheamus, and Drew McIntyre's Intercontinental Masterclass from WrestleMania 39 was way more than that. Not only did it have the story of the Irishman's long-running quest to beat Gunter and finally claim the IC title, but it also showcased his crumbling friendship with Drew. The Celtic Warrior's face when McIntyre broke up a pinfall, denying him his ambition of becoming Intercontinental Champion is the stuff dreams are made of. Chuck in some top quality spots and some very, very sore chests, and you have got yourself a recipe for one of the best WrestleMania matches of all time. Hey, it's certainly the best Mania triple threat that I can think of. Sorry, Kane versus Big Show versus Raven from Mania X7. Just wasn't your time. You can keep your football goals or your touchdowns or your take that sing alongs because none of them compare to the ear splitting noise of a live wrestling pop. 
Except maybe when Gary Barlow takes his shirt off. Whoa! That moment when something exciting or unexpected happens and the thousands of people in attendance all cheer at once, that is what wrestling is all about. And when it comes to big moments that got even bigger reactions, there is nowhere better than World Wrestling Entertainment. WWE has consistently provided fans with awe-inspiring moments to lose their minds to. Big returns, big debuts, big title wins, you name it, WWE has done it, with those who witnessed these moments responding in deafening fashion. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 biggest pops in WWE history. Join us. Number 10. Bulldog's Big Win When it comes to monster pops, it helps to have a monster-sized crowd. Enter the 80-plus thousand people at Wembley Stadium for SummerSlam 1992. These British fans have gone down in history as one of the biggest and best crowds in the history of wrestling. Their crowning moment came at the climax of the show, when hometown hero Davey Boy Smith won the Intercontinental Championship. Before you say anything, we know that Davey wasn't from London, but WWE don't care, so why should we? This is the company that tried to convince us that Drew McIntyre was Welsh for a minute there. The British Bulldog squared off against brother-in-law Brett in the main event with the IC title on the line. After Hart had to walk Davey through every single spot, apparently he'd spent most of the weeks leading up to the event being naughty with Jim Neidhart, Bulldog reversed a sunset flip and pinned the champion to a huge ovation from the partisan audience. The elation felt by the crowd is infectious, and the pop is still as joyous to hear now as it was over 30 years ago. Now that is a high that I can get behind. Number 9. Raw is Jericho The Monday Night Wars were a hell of a time to be a wrestling fan. With WWE and WCW desperate to outdraw the other, every single episode of Raw and Nitro was a must-see, just in case somebody from one company turned up in the other. The biggest defection from Atlanta to Stamford took place on the 9th of August 1999. After weeks of mysterious messages counting down to the supposed new millennium, the clocks finally ran out mid way through a promo by The Rock. An unfamiliar theme and video started playing until the Titantron displayed a single word. Jericho. Out walked Y2J, the talented WCW star who had been kept firmly in the midcard due to backstage politics. Despite being held back, he was still extremely popular, and the fans raised the roof when he walked out. Not only did the Ayatollah of Rock and Roller get weeks of build-up to his arrival, but he was seemingly already being positioned as a major player in WWE, and the fans reacted to this positively. Jericho has had more shock returns and debuts than he's had catchphrases at this point, but you never forget your first. Number 8. John Cena and Edge at the Royal Rumble Choosing just one Royal Rumble return for this list was damn near impossible. In fact, it was impossible, so we've chosen two instead. Rumours that retired Hall of Famer Edge was making his return at the 2020 Royal Rumble proved to be true when the opening sting of You Think You Know Me echoed around Minute Maid Park. Edge was back after nine years out with injury, and he looked better than ever. The crowd's huge pop when he entered through a cloud of smoke was proof that his presence on WWE TV had been sorely missed. As for John Cena, he hadn't been gone nearly as long as his old rival, but his comeback in 2008 was still pretty damn impressive. In a match against Mr. Kennedy, Kennedy on Raw, Cena tore his pectoral muscle and was sidelined for several months. Several turned into just a few pretty quickly because John Cena is not human. He came back way ahead of schedule as the 30th man in the Rumble, eventually eliminating Triple H to win the whole thing. It's one of the biggest cheers Cena has ever gotten, which is surprising because everyone hated him at the time. Number 7. The Beast Returns Brock Lesnar's first exit from WWE in 2004 was a complete mess. Tired of life on the road, fans were aware that Brock was quitting ahead of his match with Goldberg at WrestleMania 20. Since Goldberg was leaving too, the crowd absolutely dumped on both of them, turning it into one of the most awkward encounters in the show's history. Lesnar tried and failed to start a career in professional football. He was much more successful in the UFC though, but McMahon money is a powerful force and he made his triumphant comeback to WWE the night after WrestleMania 28. 
Considering how he left the promotion, you'd expect fans to have booed Lesnar back to the octagon. But instead, they came unglued as the meatiest man in all of combat sports strode out onto the stage to stare John Cena square in the eye. Not only was Brock back, but he had inserted himself right at the top of the card against the company's biggest star. This only made the crowd scream even louder. Now, all he had to do was win his first match back against Cena at Extreme Rules, and then... Wait, what? He lost. You're joking. Number 6. The Guest Host Is... Ahead of WrestleMania 27, everyone was trying to guess who the advertised guest host of the show would be. Ryan Seacrest? Bob Barker? Justin Bieber? The list of suspects was long, but nobody saw the real answer coming. Not even the millions and millions of his fans. When the time came for the reveal, the lights dropped around the arena. Then the immortal words, IF YOU SMELL, cut through the darkness like a knife. The Rock was back. Back. Dwayne Johnson made his first live Raw appearance in seven years to an atomic reaction from those in attendance. The movie star slowly made his way out of the curtain, drinking in the huge volume of noise being made solely for him. The Rock's return was a huge shot in the arm for WWE and created a much-needed buzz around the upcoming WrestleMania. And this wasn't just a one-time deal either, as the Brahma Bull would compete in a number of matches after this comeback and even won the WWE Championship in 2013. Actually, let's not bring that up. CM Punk will find out we're talking about it and come for us. Regardless of what happened after, this return was, in a word, electrifying. Number 5. The Hardy Boys Are Back when the New Day announced that a fourth duo was entering the Raw Tag Team Championship ladder match at WrestleMania 33, many people expected the team to reveal themselves as the added participants, which would have been fine if not predictable. But then, the Hardys' music hit. Matt and Jeff made their way down to the ring as the Orlando crowd lost their minds. Not only had this legendary team not been seen in WWE for over eight years, they had just come off the back of exceptional runs in TNA and Ring of Honor. Plus, these guys had just had a ladder match with the Young Bucks just 24 hours earlier. What the hell were they doing here? Broken Matt Hardy had injected new life into the older sibling, paving the way for Jeff to become Brother Nero and all the brilliant wackiness that followed. Their return at Mania appealed to everyone, old fans who remembered them from the Attitude Era and new ones who knew them from their broken days. Combine this with an audience of 75,000 odd people and that is a recipe for a WONDERFUL reaction. Number 4. Time to play the game Depending on how you look at it, Triple H tearing his quads in 2001 was either a terrible thing or maybe a stroke of luck. Trips missed out on seven months of his career and the injury interrupted his run as a top heel alongside Stone Cold Steve Austin. But on the other hand, this took him out of the entirety of the invasion angle so he didn't have to get involved in any of that rubbish. After healing up and probably waiting an extra bit to make sure the invasion was done, Triple H made his long-awaited return in January of 2002. The response to the game's comeback was as ludicrous as his giant denim jacket. Fans went berserk the moment they heard that iconic motorhead opening chord and almost did permanent damage to Madison Square Garden by blowing its roof clean off. He might have been a dastardly heel when he left, but this reaction to his return confirmed that the game was now a full-on good guy. Did this work in the long run? Not really, because it led to that terrible feud with Jericho and Stephanie, but at least we got that moment out of it. Number 3. Punk in Chicago Phil Brooks might not be everyone's cup of tea, and I don't think he's on the Elite's Christmas card list anymore, but even his staunchest critic wouldn't deny the power of this night. CM Punk got everyone's attention with his industry-rattling pipe bomb promo on Raw, where he verbally ran down everyone from John Cena to John Laurinaitis to Vince McMahon himself. This came while he was building to a WWE Championship match with Big Match John, set to go down at Money in the Bank. Hang on, that show's in Chicago, and CM Punk's from Chicago. What are the chances? When Punk arrived in Chicago, he was treated like a god. To this crowd, Punk represented anti-establishment. He represented change. He represented hope that the stale, sterilized, Cena-led era of WWE was heading for the bin. These people didn't just want him to win, they needed it. 
To be honest, this entire match could be an entrant on this list, as the crowd were deafening throughout, but few things will ever top his entrance that night. There's a good reason AEW booked his return for the same city. Number 2. Austin's Backlash After the disappointing end of WrestleMania 2000, fans were hoping to see The Rock finally unseat Triple H as WWE Champion one month later at Backlash. The champ had the backing of the McMahons, and everything was set up to ensure that the Great One failed. However, Rocky had an ace up his sleeve, a beer-drinking, bald-headed ace. Just when it looked like the match was over, the glass shattered, and so did the sound barrier. Stone Cold Steve Austin, chair in hand, made his way down to the ring to help his former rival take out Triple H and his goons. Austin was still recovering from major neck surgery and hadn't been on TV regularly for about five months. Fans were ecstatic to see him back, especially when he helped the Brahma Bull beat the Cerebral Assassin for the gold. From the moment Austin's music hits to the end of the rock celebrations, the fans do not let up for a single second. This is the sort of crowd reaction that made the Attitude Era so much fun to watch, and something that many say is sorely missing from wrestling today. Number 1. Mankind Wins the Big One The first episode of Raw in 1999 was headlined by The Rock vs. Mankind for the WWE Championship. Mick Foley was out to achieve his dream of becoming world champion and to avenge his betrayal at the hands of the corporation at Survivor Series. With D-Generation X at ringside to combat the evil faction, Rock and Mankind got into a huge brawl that soon saw everyone on the outside fighting as well, except for Kane who just sort of stood there for some reason. Whilst all this chaos was happening, the glass shattered and Stone Cold joined the melee. The audience were already at fever pitch before Austin's arrival, but his presence turned things up to 11. He then somehow turned things up even higher when he planted the rock with a chair shot and allowed Mankind to make the cover and win the title. The culmination of a great match, an exciting interference, and a beloved wrestler finally winning the big one created the perfect conditions for the perfect crowd reaction. A title change can be a great way to supercharge a wrestling promotion and generate all sorts of new interest in a product. Equally, they can happen by total accident. <laughs> AJ Styles and Kevin Owens. <laughs> NXT has had plenty of memorable belt swaps over the years. Some set up huge angles for way in the future, while some were just really fun to watch at the time. Either is valid, and both are worth celebrating. Let's do that. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cult Wrestling, and these are the 10 best NXT title changes ever. Join us! Number 10. Ricochet defeats Adam Cole for the NXT North American Championship The NXT North American Championship got off to a great start as its inaugural holder was decided in a bona fide five-star classic. Go on, Dave. The insane six-man ladder match from TakeOver New Orleans ended with Adam Cole raising the beautiful belt above his head. Unfortunately, you can't really win a championship from nobody, so we decided not to count this moment. Instead, let's fast forward to when Cole lost the belt at TakeOver Brooklyn 4. Taking on the leader of the Undisputed Era was another participant in the initial ladder match, the man that gravity forgot, Ricochet. Yeah, I know that was Pac's nickname in WWE, but the sentiment still applies, right? To the surprise of absolutely nobody, Cole and Ricochet put on a spectacular match. Highlights included Rick taking out Cole with a Hurricane Runner off the apron to the outside and getting hit in midair with a perfectly time superkick off a springboard moonsault. How they even managed that I will never know. One 6.30 cents on later and Ricochet had ended Cole's reign to pick up his first title in NXT after one hell of a battle. Nice work, Trevor. Number 9. The Undisputed Era defeats Mustache Mountain for the NXT Tag Team Championships It was incredibly tempting to put the reverse of this result on this list when Mustache Mountain beat the Undisputed Era to win their only set of NXT tag team titles. That match took place on the second night of the 2018 United Kingdom Championship Tournament, which was good because it happened in front of a British crowd, but bad because comparatively few people actually saw it. For that reason, we have to give this spot to the night the dastardly heels snatched the belts back from the plucky Brits. Two days later in reality, although much later in kayfabe, Kyle O'Reilly and Bobby Fish got their rematch against Tyler Bate and Trent Seven. Though these two teams 
Cage could put on an all-out physical performance, this match was all about storytelling and psychology. The era isolated Seven throughout the match, identifying him as a weak link. Bate found this very distressing as Seven wasn't just his partner, but his mentor as well. Finally, the younger man could take no more and threw in the towel to save his older friend, handing the titles back to the baddies. No, you're crying. Number 8. Keith Lee beats Adam Cole for the NXT Championship The pandemic was a pretty awful time to be a wrestling fan. In fact, scratch that, it was an awful time full stop, obviously. However, one of the bright spots in this utterly dismal period of humanity was watching one very handsome man beat another very handsome man for a very handsome belt. Keith Lee had been North American champion since defeating Roderick Strong for the gold in January 2020. Come summertime, Adam Cole was desperate to get that belt back into the undisputed era and so laid out a challenge for the big man. A match was made for the second night of the Great American Bash. Cole versus Lee, title for title, both men's lives on the line. Sorry, got a bit carried away there. The two future AEW co-workers put on a great showing before Lee planted Cole with a big bang catastrophe to become the first man to hold both belts at the same time. Limitless Lee had spent so long in NXT not doing that much, despite having all the potential in the world. Now, here he was, a double champion having just ended the longest world title reign in the brand's history. Again, you're crying. Number 7. Kevin Owens defeats Sami Zayn for the NXT Championship Though they're the best of friends these days, depending on if they've fallen out or not before this video gets released, Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens have a checkered past, and that is putting it lightly. Even if you discount all the stuff they did to each other in Ring of Honor and beyond, the Owens-Zayn rivalry has gone to some pretty extreme places over the years. The first time these two faced each other in a match in WWE was at 2015's NXT TakeOver Rival. Owens had previously ruined Sami's night by attacking his so-called friend an hour or so after making his debut. Now the two would square off for Zayn's NXT title. The match was booked to perfection, showcasing Owens as a brutish monster who would go to any length to get what he wanted. In the end, Owens just wouldn't stop powerbombing Zayn to the point where the referee awarded him the match and the title via stoppage. This was a risky move as stoppage finishes don't always go over well, but it fit the characters perfectly. Owens the Destroyer and Zayn the man who never gave up. Lovely stuff. Number 6. American Alpha defeat The Revival for the NXT Tag Team Championships The men currently known as FTR were a large part of why NXT was famed for its tag team wrestling during its glory days. We will get to their most famous rivalry in a bit, but let's remember this forgotten gem from TakeOver Dallas back in the far-flung year of 2016. God, I'm old. Scott Dawson and Dash Wilder, as they were called at the time, were set to defend their tag team titles in the night opener. Their opponents, the odd couple duo of ultra-serious Jason Jordan and goofy McGooferson Chad Gable. The pair known as American Alpha had come together the previous year and had gotten very popular amongst the NXT faithful. This led to a tag title match that was, to put it pretty bluntly, absolutely class. After overcoming Dash and Dawson's cheating ways, American Alpha pinned Dawson to end the Revival's reign and begin their own time on top. This victory meant so much to everybody involved, making it one of the most uplifting moments in NXT history. I mean, just ask Jason Jordan, who couldn't help but burst into tears upon winning. Wow, somebody really was crying. Thought that was just a running gag. Number 5. Tommaso Ciampa defeats Alistair Black for the NXT Championship Once upon a time, Tommaso Ciampa was in genuine danger of being attacked if he ever left his own house. The Blackheart earned his nickname through his feud with Johnny Gargano, which began with the shocking breakup of DIY at TakeOver Chicago. Fans thought the rivalry was over and done with at TakeOver over New Orleans when Gargano beat his nemesis in a match to earn his NXT job back. Little did we know, things were just getting started. On that same show, Alistair Black beat Andrade Cien Almas to win the NXT Championship. This was a great moment, but nothing compared to how his reign would end. On the July 18th, 2018 episode of NXT, Champa faced off against Black for the top prize. Thanks to an inadvertent assist from Gargano himself, Champa was able to 
to win the match and become acquainted with Goldie for the very first time. The new champ was public enemy number one back in those days, so putting the belt on him in such a devious manner was a stroke of genius. Number four, Rhea Ripley defeats Shayna Baszler for the NXT Women's Championship. Asuka may have had the longest single NXT Women's Championship reign, but the woman who has held the belt for longer than anyone else in total is Shayna Baszler. Across her two stints as champ, Baszler has held the gold for a combined 549 days. Her second reign was ginormous at 416 days. That was until she ran into Mami. Rhea Ripley returned to NXT as a babyface in the summer of 2019 and pursued the Queen of Spades until the end of the year. The turning point came at War Games, where Ripley's team beat Baszler's despite a significant numbers disadvantage. Curse you, Dakota Kai. On the December 18th episode of NXT, Ripley got her women's championship shot. In the bout's closing moment, she was able to hit the title holder with an avalanche riptide to score the one, two, three. Getting a big win over a long reigning champion transformed Ripley into a megastar. The entire locker room emptying out to celebrate with her should confirm that theory to you. In fact, this episode was the only one where NXT beat Dynamite in the key 18 to 49 demographic. Which is good, I think. Probably means something to someone somewhere. Number three, Sami Zayn defeats Adrian Neville for the NXT Championship. It's fair to say that without Sami Zayn and his rise to the top, NXT perhaps wouldn't have caught on fire in the way that it did. Zayn played the tenacious but flawed hero superbly, always coming up short in big matches despite his natural skill. In order to secure a one-on-one -on -one match for the belt at TakeOver R Evolution, he needed to make a dangerous waiver. The challenger put his NXT career on the line, saying that if he didn't win the gold, then he would pack his bags and go. Adrian Neville, a pre-bastard pack, agreed and the fight was on. This drama only added to what was a damn fine wrestling match. Neither man was a slouch, far from it, and they put the crowd through their paces in this fast-paced encounter. Finally, after a halluva kick to the Geordie's Dome, Zayn got the job done and was crowned the new NXT champion. All his hard work had finally paid off, and those who had followed Zayn up to this point had all of their faith rewarded. And then that horrible Kevin Owens showed up and ruined everything. Stop. Stop! He's already dead! Number 2. DIY defeat The Revival for the NXT Tag Team Championships Sure, watching Jason Jordan cry in Texas was nice, but come on, you were all waiting for this one. The team of Tommaso Ciampa and Johnny Gargano had a huge opportunity at TakeOver Brooklyn 2. They were taking on The Revival for the Tag Team Gold. Unfortunately, though, the bad guys won the match when Gargano submitted to a leg lock. Bloody hell, Johnny, this is why you're gonna get turned on next year. As we all know by now, though, the story in WWE is never over, and Gargano and Ciampa got one more chance at TakeOver Toronto in a two out of three falls match. These lot could have wrestled blindfolded with their legs tied together and still turned out at least a four-star match. They just clicked with one another so well, and this match in Canada was their magnum opus. After the match went to one fall apiece, DIY got their opponents in simultaneous submissions as the Revival clung to each other in an attempt not to tap. They could not hold on, though, as the bad guys gave in to give the heroes their biggest win to date. Nicely done, boys. Number one, Bailey defeats Sasha Banks for the NXT Women's Championship. The first TakeOver Brooklyn event from 2015 was what really took NXT to the next level. It was their first major show to accompany a WWE Big Four pay-per-view, their first major show to take place outside of Full Sail University, and bloody Jushin Thunder Liger was there. Like as a wrestler, he had a match. He wasn't just in the stalls. The whole show was great, top to bottom, but the pinnacle of the evening was the NXT women's title match between champion Sasha Banks and challenger Bayley. Both performers were in their prime positions. Sasha was an arrogant heel, whilst Bayley was the most wholesomely cherished wrestler since the death of Kayfabe. They were both part of the four horsewomen that had revolutionized women's wrestling in WWE, and in New York City, they would kick 
kick things up a notch. The pair left it all in the ring, putting on easily the best women's match in WWE history up to that point. The cherry on top was Bailey's victory as the crowd exploded with affection towards the hugger. For so many different reasons, both in storyline and in the real world, this was a truly special result. And yes, I am crying. Wrestling is as much about showmanship and spectacle as it is about simulated combat. And the first opportunity for theatrics presents itself before the bell has sounded when our lycra-clad warriors make their entrances. A lot of entrances are, in their own way, somewhat OTT, but the following are extravagant even within the flexible parameters of sports entertainment. Whether dangerous, elaborate, politically controversial, or unintentionally hilarious, they prove there really are no limits when it comes to creativity or stupidity in this wonderful and wacky world. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 most outrageous pro wrestling entrances. Join us! Number 10. Big Josh at Super Brawl There is a long and illustrious history of using bears in professional wrestling. Sorry, actually, let me rephrase that. I mean, there is a long and stupid history of using bears in professional wrestling. Not illustrious. While the practice of wrestlers actually wrestling bears, which was a big attraction in promotions such as Stu Hart's Stampede, was pretty much gone by the early 90s, WCW, in their infinite wisdom, decided to bring two of the large and very unpredictable animals into the mix for an unconventional entrance. Accompanying fun-loving lumberjack Big Josh for his bout with Black Bart at Super Brawl 1, the bears were muzzled and closely tailed by their handler, but them just being in an arena full of people, not to mention loud loud music and pyrotechnics was just asking for trouble. Oh, and they also urinated all the way down the ramp. Fantastic. The brainchild of Dusty Rhodes, who wanted to do something unique to get his buddy over, it was obviously impractical, and they only ever did it the one time. Incredibly, this wasn't even the weirdest entrance at Super Brawl 1, but more on that, well, why not right now? Number 9. Oz at Super Brawl 1 Early 90s WCW was, as we have just established, full of dumb ideas. Up there with the absolutely most inane was the character of Oz, inspired, if you could call it that, by the great and powerful wizard who I think actually lived in Oz, wasn't called Oz. You see, the rights to the movie version of The Wizard of Oz were owned by WCW parent company Turner Broadcasting, presenting a glorious opportunity for a bit of cross-promotional corporate synergy. Did you fools learn nothing from the Robocop debacle? The unlucky Kevin Nash, who was probably looking back longingly at his days as Master Blaster Steel, was chosen to portray the silver-haired Oz, making his grand debut in the guise at the first Super Brawl. Accompanied by the Grand Wizard, aka Kevin Sullivan in a dodgy mask and wig, Oz came out of a castle and garbled something that seemed to scare away Dorothy the Tin Man, the Cowardly Lion, and the Scarecrow as two weak sparklers, some green lighting, and a puff of smoke heralded his arrival. Honestly, the presentation would probably get a bad review from your local newspaper if it took place in a primary school play. Number 8. Brock Lesnar at SummerSlam 2022 WWE superstars have driven a wide variety of vehicles to the ring in the past. We've had motorcycles, low riders, lawn mowers, golf carts, limousines, and Zambonis take wrestlers from the locker room to ringside. But only one man has gotten behind the wheel of a goddamn tractor. Brock Lesnar grew up on a dairy farm in Webster, South Dakota, so he is no stranger to operating heavy machinery. Hell, even now as a world-famous and exceptionally wealthy multi-sport athlete, the Beast Incarnate owns and operates his own farm in Saskatchewan, so he clearly can't get planting and harvesting out of his system. Cowboy Brock drove his big red tractor to the ring for his last man standing showdown with undisputed WWE Universal Champion Roman Reigns at SummerSlam 2022. Not only did he manage to navigate the narrow winding entranceway with precision, but he used the tractor during the course of the match, first leaping off it to get a jump start on his opponent, then using the front loader to drop the tribal chief into the ring before finally attempting to flip the ring over. Seems like a real good way to lose your license if you ask me. 
Number seven, The Great Mooter at Hustle Aid 2007. Look, I am not going to sit here and claim to be an expert on the Japanese wrestling promotion Hustle. The only thing I can tell you, based on my limited knowledge and understanding, is that it was absolutely mental. Take their 2007 Hustle Aid show, for example, which featured a tag team called the Super Flying Vampires, the infamous Razor Ramon Hardgay, and a saucy lady called Ying Ling the Erotic Terrorist. Sounds like my honeymoon, way! <laughs> Yingling teamed up with Tajiri to take on a bloke called RG, which stands for Real Gay, and don't expect me to explain the backstory here, and the Great Muta, who was being held captive in a lamp. If there's one thing I love about Japanese professional wrestling, it's how they treat it more like a sport, you know? Anyway, Muta wouldn't be bottled up for too long, as RG threw the lamp into a hole in the entranceway, setting off much smoke and green lighting. When it settled back down, Keiji Muto's alter ego stood there, primed and ready for battle. An absolutely ridiculous and ridiculously good entrance from one of the strangest companies that ever existed. Number 6, Rick and Charlotte Flair at the Great American Bash 1985 and 86 and WrestleMania 35. It is fair to say that the professional wrestling entrance has evolved significantly since the mid-1980s, when the best you could ask for was a pulsating guitar riff and enough flashbulbs to blind an owl. Long before the special entrance became a regular occurrence, NWA World's Heavyweight Champion Ric Flair styled and profiled his way to the ring at the 1985 and 86 Great American Bashes. Prior to his title defense against Nikita Koloff and Ricky Morton at the American Legion Memorial Stadium in Charlotte, North Carolina, the Nature Boy boarded a helicopter and asked the pilot to take him to the ring. In fairness, it was a pretty short trip from his house. Also, isn't it nice to say Ric Flair and helicopter without getting dark side of the ring flashbacks. Anyway, it was a spectacular entrance that totally fit his character and was certainly novel for the time. By the time Rick's daughter Charlotte was due to make history as one third of the first all-female main event in WrestleMania history, it had been a while since a wrestler had taken a helicopter ride to a stadium. It wasn't actually her idea to recreate it, and she only found out about it days beforehand, but it was a fitting tribute to her father and suitably grandiose for the grandest stage of them all. Number 5. Triple H and Stephanie McMahon at WrestleMania 33 When it comes to outrageous entrances at the Showcase of the Immortals, Triple H is pretty damn hard to beat, and you can make your own joke about the game being hard to beat there. Hunter has made a habit of coming out for his matches in offbeat ways, from his barbarian-style entrance at Mania 22 to his King of Kings emergence at Mania 30. And that's not to mention his Terminator and Mad Max cosplay efforts either. The most outrageous of the bunch, however, is the entrance he and wife Stephanie made for his grudge match with Seth Rollins at 33. Trailing a police escort, the corporate power couple came out riding a frankly ludicrous motorcycle decked out in leather and giving faces that seemed to say, in all seriousness, yes, we are a couple of biker badasses and you better watch out, bucko. Honestly, the whole charade was like a married pair's midlife crisis come to life. I know wrestling is all about suspending disbelief and all that, but the way they played it all straight and without a hint of irony was just a little too much for me. Number 4. Scott Steiner on Nitro While early 90s WCW was full of naff ideas, the company in 2000 was full of positively unsafe ones. For example, letting Scott Steiner, himself acting like a bit of a wild animal at the time, make his entrance for the October 23rd episode of Nitro with an actual tiger. And as Tony Schiavone mentioned on commentary, the big cat really didn't want to be there. Which was good news, since it was accompanied by a sole handler and a rather flimsy looking leash. No safety concerns there then. So why did Big Popper Pump randomly come to the ring with a tiger that one time with no explanation? Besides it being, you know, really cool and stuff. According to the man himself, the feline and his trainer once visited a WCW house show and Steiner became besotted with the animal. He asked WCW management if he could do the entrance and since everyone backstage was genuinely terrified of him, they didn't say no. Steiner later revealed that a zebra print wearing Rey Mysterio almost became the tiger's dinner when he crouched down to the animal's eye level, freaking out its handler. I'd like to see him 619 his way out of that situation. Number 3. Cody Rhodes at Double or Nothing 2019 
At Double or Nothing 2019, Cody Rhodes and his brother Dustin stole AEW's first ever pay-per-view with a blood-soaked instant classic. It was vindication for the Rhodes brothers, having had a WrestleMania dream match snatched away from them four years earlier after, as Stardust and Goldust, they had had a stinker at Fastlane. Maybe, just maybe, some of that lingering resentment crept into the American Nightmare's grand entrance here. In an obvious shot at WWE exec Triple H, Cody took a sledgehammer to a throne styled after the ones the Cerebral Assassin had previously used. Rhodes later explained that the idea literally came to him in a dream and wasn't just a shot at Hunter, but also a signal that he, as a then AEW EVP, was focused on being a wrestler first and foremost. Sure it was, mate. Symbolism, yeah? Anyway, Cody's big display raised quite a few eyebrows and seemed to signal the start of a rivalry between the two promotions. Good thing Triple H doesn't hold grudges and wouldn't, say, book Cody to choke in his big WrestleMania world title main event years later. Number 2. The Undertaker at Survivor Series 2005 There aren't many wrestlers in history who have ever had a flair for the theatrical quite like The Undertaker. The undead zombie biker guy, go figure, right? The man has rode to the ring on chariots, been accompanied by torch-bearing druids, has glided from the ceiling like a bat, along with various other ways of getting from A to B besides, you know, just walking very slowly. The best and most outrageous of the bunch, however, was the entrance he made for his surprise return at the end of the 2005 Survivor Series. The Phenom was brought out in a casket, which was promptly struck by lightning, setting it on fire before an angry taker punched his way out of it en route to beating up the entire SmackDown roster. He'd been trapped in a casket, which was then set on fire by Randy Orton and his father Cowboy Bob at the previous month's No Mercy pay-per-view, so he had every right to be a bit miffed. Anyway, this was a great cliffhanger to end a pay-per-view on and the sort of balmy special effects show that WWE's production people excel at. Number 1. Antonio Inoki at Fight for Japan 2011 I don't think I'm far off when I say that the late great Antonio Inoki had a few, um, let's say out there ideas in his time. Fighting Muhammad Ali, promoting shows in North Korea, negotiating for hostages with a rag, buying one of Fidel Castro's islands after he became convinced there was buried treasure there. I could go on and on to be honest, but one of the weirdest moments in the Chinsters on-camera career came at the Dream Slash IGF Fight for Japan show on New Year's Eve 2011. Following a worked bout between Josh Barnett and Hideki Suzuki, Anoki was carried from the entrance ramp to the ring on a cross. Hmm, sort of reminds me of something, but I can't quite put my finger on what. He was let down, entered the ring, and used a bucket of paint to draw a symbol while simultaneously cutting a promo before being interrupted by Tiger Jeet and Tiger Ali Singh, who proceeded to smack him with a kendo stick, only to then stop the beating, apologize, raise Anoki's hand, and give him a kendo stick before leaving the ring. Alrighty then. Now that I think of it, you know what this whole episode reminds me of? Might need to take some paracetamol and have a good lie down. Everybody makes mistakes. It's how you react to and learn from those mistakes that is important. World Wrestling Entertainment have made plenty of mistakes during their balmy existence. Some small, some big, some that should have put them out of business. To their credit, WWE have learned from some of these mistakes and avoided repeating history. Some, but not all, and whether it's bad creative decisions or boneheaded business moves, WWE replicated a few glaring missteps with often disastrous repercussions. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 times WWE didn't learn from their mistakes. Join us. Number 10. Burying WCW Stars You might have heard about WWE winning the Monday Night War with WCW as the mum and pop McMahon family-driven underdog crushed the evil corporation bankrolled by that dastardly billionaire Ted Turner. Even though they officially won the war when they bought WCW in March of 2001, which really had been over for some time by that point, WWE evidently felt the need to hammer home their superiority by burying the talent they acquired in its wake. 
The WCW portion of the alliance was routinely trounced during the ill-fated invasion storyline, but WWE really dropped the ball when it came to some of WCW's biggest stars. Diamond Dallas Page was reduced to a joke almost immediately after getting obliterated by The Undertaker and his then-wife Sarah, while Scott Steiner, Booker T and Goldberg all had issues when they were programmed opposite the all-conquering Triple H. That is four former World Heavyweight Champions who had their momentum halted and stock reduced simply because they made their names elsewhere and WWE had a stiffy for the boss's son-in-law. The most egregious of all, however, was the treatment of Sting, an industry icon who finally signed with WWE 20 years into his career just to lose both of his high-profile pay-per-view matches. Number 9. Recreating the Owen Hart Piledriver if a WWE star suffers a serious, potentially life-threatening injury during a match, common sense would suggest that the move, spot, or stunt that caused it would be shelved post-haste. Especially if that injury happened to, you know, the biggest star in the business. When Owen Hart accidentally dropped Steve Austin on his head with a sit-out tombstone pile driver at SummerSlam 1997, that really should have been the end for that variation of the move. Incredibly though, the Rocket not only performed the move again, but did so for an angle that played off the Texas Rattlesnake's brush with paralysis. The brainchild of a man with the brain of a child, Vince Russo, Owen delivered the move to Dan Seven on the September 28, 1998 episode of Raw, sending the beast out of the arena on a backboard. Though the injury was kayfabe in nature, in reality, Hart had legitimately dropped Seven on his noggin, causing a jolt of electricity to shoot through the UFC fighter's body. Seven was rightfully furious with his opponent, but this dangerous idea should have never been greenlit in the first place. Number 8. Body Shaming the Divas Professional wrestling is, in large part, a cosmetic business, and no company is more concerned with the appearance of their superstars than WWE. Historically, male performers are supposed to look like Greek gods, while their female counterparts are expected to resemble supermodels. There are exceptions, of course, but if you're on the main roster and you're not perceived to be in tip-top shape, well, you can expect to be on the receiving end of some good old-fashioned public humiliation. Never was this more unsavory than when the company decided to fat shame Mickey James via Lay Cool during the Piggy James storyline. By the way, that's fat shamed in inverted commas because the former women's champion was in phenomenal shape by any sane person's standards. WWE apparently disagreed though, and so they poked fun at Mickey's physique in a way that left everyone involved, as well as the fans, feeling very uncomfortable. So, if it didn't work the first time, why not try again? Poor Caitlyn became the object of AJ Lee's ridicule in 2013 and was mocked for being too big in a lamentable storyline that only proved WWE had some serious growing up to do. And that was something that was proved once again during the Alexa Bliss Nia Jax storyline in 2018. Number 7. The XFL Vince McMahon's decision to launch a professional football league in the early 2000s was, shall we say, a gamble. The genetic jackhammer decided to roll the dice on the costly endeavor, despite the fact that his WWE business was booming, and when it comes to business endeavors outside of WWE, the McMahon Midas touch was practically non-existent. WBF, we hardly knew ye. Rule changes, substandard quality of play, and a sports entertainment presentation were all derided by critics, but people did tune in to watch the XFL. For the first week, anyway. After the initial ratings euphoria, reality set in and the numbers plummeted so hard that XFL partner NBC was forced to bail out after a single season, with both the network and Titan Sports Inc. losing $35 million apiece before they decided to cut their losses and shut the league down. Undeterred by such a metaphorical public spanking, Vince revived the XFL in 2020. Reviews were somewhat kinder for this iteration, but the ratings took a similar nosedive after the first week, and hastened by the shutdown caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, the XFL was forced to file for bankruptcy just two months after its relaunch. Best of luck, Dwayne! Number 6. Nostalgia Title Reigns Living in the past, there's no future in it. 
While there is definitely a time and a place and a market for nostalgia in WWE, the company can be accused of not knowing when enough was enough on several occasions. The odd cameo or short comeback from a star of yesteryear can work brilliantly, but when they start hogging the limelight and winning titles at the expense of current stars and up-and-comers, well, then we have a problem. WWE's reliance on older part-timers has been well documented, and while you can see some reasoning or logic behind giving them a title run, that doesn't necessarily mean it's always or ever a good idea. Hulk Hogan's 2002 return started it all, as the strength of the Hulkster's crowd reactions convinced WWE to book him to beat Triple H for the undisputed title just a month after the game's WrestleMania 18 triumph. Since then, we've seen Ric Flair and Roddy Piper bag the world tag straps, a non-bumping Bret Hart win the US title, and most infamously of all, Goldberg unseat the Fiend for the Universal title. Big stars won and all, yes, but their latter-day title runs were harmful in some way, shape, or form. Number 5. Rehiring the Ultimate Warrior Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Fool me three times, well, shame on us all, because what the hell are we doing here? Seriously, three times fooled? Come on now. The relationship between Vince McMahon and Jim Helwig, aka The Ultimate Warrior, was at best strained and at worst utterly tempestuous. The face-painted musclehead was a big star for WWE in 1991, no doubt, and he felt like he should have been compensated more, among other things, for his efforts, which led to the threat of a SummerSlam no-show followed by a suspension slash quitting. Warrior returned after months in exile, only for the comeback to end when he fell afoul of the company's stringent new drug test policy. Their relationship was put on ice for the best part of four years before desperate times called for desperate measures and Vince and Jim resurrected their business relationship. This latest attempt to work together ended in acrimony after just a few months when Warrior began no-showing, kicking off years of bad blood that resulted in lawsuits, mudslinging, and straight-up character assassination. Number 4. Trying to get Linda McMahon elected twice Linda McMahon eventually got a spot in government thanks to the McMahon family's close ties with then-President Donald Trump, but when Linda tried to get elected on her own merit and dime, things didn't quite go according to plan. Looking for a seat in the United States Senate, Linda left her WWE responsibilities in 2009 in order to run as a Republican candidate for the state of Connecticut. Self-funding her own campaign, Linda supposedly alienated voters, particularly female ones, and though she promised to be a job creator, her association with the tawdry sports entertainment franchise she helped create was a stick to beat her with. I mean, it's hard to explain the whole Trish Stratus barks like a dog angle when all you want to do is discuss policy, isn't it? Linda ultimately lost to her Democratic adversary by 11% after spending a truckload of cash, but like Vince with the XFL years beforehand, she wasn't going to let torching tens of millions of dollars put her off. So she ran again in 2012, a second attempt that also ended in defeat. The total cost of both campaigns was close to 100 million, much of which came from her personal bank account. Number 3. Picking the wrong WrestleMania main event If there is one match per year that WWE needs to get absolutely spot on, it is the main event of WrestleMania. For a long time, the headliner at the Showcase of the Immortals was typically a WWE title match featuring the winner of the Royal Rumble. This tradition has, on occasion, been a detriment though. For example, 2002's WrestleMania 18, when The Rock and Hulk Hogan electrified the Toronto Skydome crowd so much that their circuits blew up and they were practically zombified for Triple H and Chris Jericho's show closer. The Cerebral Assassin was stung again seven years later, when his and Randy Orton's WWE title grudge match played out before near silence after Shawn Michaels and The Undertaker had produced one of the most incredible displays in WWE history while completely stealing the show. And then there have been all the times WWE booked a match to close the show of shows when there was a far superior alternative available. I mean, who wants Hogan vs. Sid when there could have been Hogan vs. Flair? Or Yokozuna vs. Hart when Hart vs. Savage was possible? Or John Cena vs. The Miz when literally anything else would have sufficed instead? Number 2. A Pair of Royal Fumbles 
After the main event of WrestleMania, the second biggest match WWE has to get right is arguably the Royal Rumble. A lot of thought goes into the annual 30-person over-the-top rope spectacular, from the order of entry to the order of elimination to who eliminates who and so on and so forth. In the end, the most important thing is picking an appropriate winner, a task WWE can be accused of mucking up from time to time. Like when they completely bolster up in back-to-back -back years with two of the worst received rumbles of all time. Fans desperately wanted emerging cult hero Daniel Bryan to not only enter the 2014 Rumble, but win it and book his place in the Mania main event. WWE, on the other hand, preferred the returning Dave Batista. When Bryan not only didn't win, but didn't even enter the match, fans completely turned on it, turning it into a fiasco. A year later, WWE thought they were covering their bases by having D. Bry exit the match early, but the Philadelphia crowd vehemently rejected the company's decision to have Roman Reigns win the match instead. Having learned nothing from the year before, WWE's tone-deaf handling of the 2015 Rumble was so bad that even The Rock got booed. Number 1. Steroid Controversies as we discussed earlier, WWE is an appearance-obsessed company in a cosmetic industry. And with cosmetic industries, be they sports or entertainment, comes invariably cosmetic enhancements. The use of performance-enhancing drugs is a touchy subject and one that WWE goes to great plans to avoid, until they are left with no choice but to face the music. Like in the early to mid-90s, when the company was embroiled in a scandal related to Dr. George Zahorian, a ringside physician for WWE events in Pennsylvania for supplying wrestlers with the muscle-building drugs. Vince McMahon was indicted, went to trial, and was ultimately acquitted, but the reputational damage was done thanks to those testifying and those blatantly fibbing on the Arsenio Hall show, brother! WWE had implemented drug testing, but then stopped it, until the untimely passing of Eddie Guerrero in 2005 forced them to create the wellness policy. Some physiques got softer and leaner, yes, but the flaws of the wellness policy came to light when numerous WWE performers past and present were implicated in another scandal in the wake of the Benoit tragedy. Having seemingly learned little from their first steroid-related controversy, WWE and its stars immediately went on the defensive and produced used nothing but spin, deflection, and outright lies while praying the whole thing would blow over. One of the original Big Four pay-per-views, WWE SummerSlam has managed to retain its aura as a night of importance 35 years since it made its bow. Host to some of the biggest matches and moments of the year, there have nonetheless been plenty of missed opportunities for the biggest party of the summer when matches that were supposed to happen, for whatever reason, didn't end up transpiring. From championship bouts and celebrity cameos to blood feud settlers and more, I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling. And these are 10 cancelled WWE SummerSlam matches. Join us. Number 10, Big Show vs. The Undertaker in 2000. At SummerSlam 1999, Big Show and The Undertaker teamed up to take on Kane and X-Pac for the WWE Tag Team titles. The so-called Unholy Alliance wouldn't get to reign as champs for very long, though, as the dead man's injury woes meant that he would soon be on the sidelines for an extended period. When he returned as the American Badass, it seemed as though the world's largest athlete hadn't gotten over the disappointment and turned heel on his former partner. All signs pointed towards the two squaring off at SummerSlam, but show was written off WWE television when Taker threw him off the stage and threw a table on the August 7th, 2000 episode of Raw. The Phenom quickly pivoted to a program with kayfabe brother Kane, while the big nasty bastard was actually sent to developmental league Ohio Valley Wrestling to lose weight and improve his conditioning. WWE officials had actually been upset with the Giants' attitude for a while, and a string of subpar performances had convinced them to not only can his lucrative pay-per-view match with Taker, but send him all the way down to OVW too. Number 9. Mr. Perfect vs. Brutus Beefcake in 1990 At SummerSlam 1988, Brutus Beefcake was supposed to challenge the Honky Tonk Man for the Intercontinental title. However, outlaw Ron Bass and those darn spurs of his meant that the barber would have to miss his championship bout, allowing the Ultimate Warrior to literally sprint in as his replacement back the gold and end Honky's legendarily long reign. 
two years later, it was not a kayfabe injury, but a very real one that took brother Brutai off the SummerSlam card. Once again, Beefcake was set to challenge for the IC belt, but a devastating jet ski accident rearranged his face and cost him another pay-per-view payday. Not only that, but Hogan's best mate would be on the shelf for the best part of three years recovering, with doctors questioning whether he would ever step foot in the ring again. As was the case two years prior, Beefcake's removal opened up a spot for a jacked-up, suntanned hero in tassels, with Kerry the Texas Tornado Von Erich filling in and leaving the Philadelphia Spectrum with a shiny new toy. Number 8. Seth Rollins vs Matt Riddle in 2022 One of the most personal rivalries of recent memory has been the one between Seth freaking Rollins and Matt, can we call him Matt Riddle, Riddle. After weeks of insults and vicious attacks, a match between the two was made for SummerSlam. Then, just days before the premium live events, WWE announced that the match was being postponed. According to the company, Riddle had suffered a stinger during an attack by the Monday Night Messiah on the go-home episode of Raw. However, this was not a real injury, but rather a kayfabe reason for the match being scrapped. In reality, the new regime had to put the Mysterios on the bill because Ray had a lucrative endorsement deal with a beer company and WWE needed to honor it. Since they weren't in a title match and there was no celebrity involvement, Rollins and Riddle were the ones whose match was sacrificed to keep the running time reasonable. Seth admitted afterwards that he was annoyed at not being able to give the fans something that was advertised and had been built up so well and felt as a performer like the cancellation was a slap in the face. Number 7. Batista vs Muhammad Hassan in 2005 The short but spectacular WWE career of Muhammad Hassan was unlike any other. Plucked from OVW and given a controversial heat-seeking gimmick, Mark Capani got to work with some of the biggest stars in the industry within his first six months on WWE TV. Chris Jericho, Shawn Michaels, Steve Austin, Hulk Hogan, John Cena, the Undertaker, Hassan interacted with them all as it was obvious WWE had big plans for the character. Very big plans as it turns out because WWE were actually thinking about going all the way and having him beat Batista for the World Heavyweight title at SummerSlam 2005 in America's capital and the animal's home city of Washington DC no less. Unfortunately for Kapani, SmackDown Network UPN demanded the Hassan character's removal following the notorious angle which aired on the July 7th episode of the show. Bombarded with complaints due to the terroristic overtones of the segment, which was regrettably kept in despite the London bombings happening earlier that day, UPN decided they didn't want Hassan on their show and the character was almost literally killed off a couple of weeks later at the Great American Bash. Number 6. Umaga vs Jackass in in 2007. Remember that time Umaga destroyed Jackass stars Chris Pontius and Steve-O on an episode of Raw? You know, when he legitimately kicked Steve-O's head in after the daredevil had the temerity to laugh off the first attack? Well, that nearly led to a full-on Umaga vs Jackass match almost an entire year later. The idea was for the Samoan Bulldozer to take on Steve-O, Pontius, Wee Man, Johnny Knoxville and the boys in some sort of wild gimmick match at SummerSlam 2007. Pushed strongly by Jackass fan Shane McMahon, not only was the match given the green light, but posters and TV commercials hyping it were released. And then the whole thing fell apart. Some reports suggested that Knoxville got cold feet in the wake of the Benoit family tragedy since he had Hollywood aspirations and Vince McMahon's brand of sports entertainment was being put under the microscope for all the wrong reasons. Knoxville himself claimed that WWE and the Jackass side simply got their wires crossed when it came to scheduling and expected commitment. Whatever the issue, the match got taken off the drawing board and we would have to wait another 15 years to see Jackass and WWE in the ring together proper. It was so, so worth that wait. Number 5. The Wyatt Family vs John Cena, Big Show and Justin Bieber in 2014 Yep, you heard me right. Celebrity involvement in WWE 
is common, especially at major events, as the company liked to use people from the wider sports and entertainment worlds to generate mainstream publicity. And back in 2014, they didn't come much bigger than tween idol Justin Bieber. Plans were apparently in place for Bieber to tag with Big Show and John Cena to take on the Wyatt family at that year's SummerSlam. It was actually Show who made the connection with Bieber's agent Scooter Braun, and the pop star was supposedly eager to do it if WWE promoted his album and, you know, paid him a very healthy fee indeed. According to Show, WWE gave Scooter the runaround when it came to the financials and he pulled out of negotiations. Some within the company evidently didn't see what benefit the Bieber Association would give WWE, despite the fact that, you know, he had about a billion young and impressionable fans throwing money at anything he did. In the end, Bray wrestled Chris Jericho, Cena headlined against Brock Lesnar, and Big Show didn't even make the cut. Can you believe it? Number 4. Tito Santana vs. Rick Martel in 1990 In the summer of 1987, beloved babyfaces Tito Santana and Rick Martel joined together to create Strike Force. Successful pretty much from the off, they unseated the Hart Foundation to win the tag team titles just a couple of months into their tenure as a team. They lost them at WrestleMania 4 and a year later would disband when Martel abandoned his partner at Mania 5. They would feud for the next year, but never had a significant blow-off until it was booked for SummerSlam 1990. Right up until the weekend of the show, a match between the two was advertised as happening. However, the model had sustained an injury in June and wouldn't be fighting fit until October. The Warlord ended up being drafted in as an opponent for Santana and beat El Matador in what was pretty much much just an extended squash. To provide a kayfabe explanation for Martel's absence, WWE claimed the French-Canadian was attending a fashion show in Paris on the night instead. Commendable commitment to the character there, you gotta admit. Number 3. Alexa Bliss vs Bayley in 2017 Bayley well and truly had the number of Raw Women's Champion Alexa Bliss in the run-up to SummerSlam 2017, beating her in various tag matches as well as a non-title singles outing. Sasha Banks, meanwhile, felt like she was owed a rematch after Bliss had beaten her via countout at Great Balls of Fire. One half of the four horsewomen subsequently clashed in a number one contenders match, with the hugger besting the boss to officially become number one contender for SummerSlam. Sadly, Bailey suffered a separated shoulder whilst wrestling Nia Jax of all people and was forced to relinquish her number one contender's spot. It was a bitter blow for the babyface, but it would be to the benefit of Banks, who won a triple threat match and then knocked off Nia to become the new number one contender. Not only that, but Sasha went on to unseat Alexa at the biggest party of the summer, kicking off her fourth reign with the strap. She actually only held it for eight days before dropping it back to Bliss, and it's interesting to speculate if the creative plans for Bailey would have been the same had she made it to the Barclays Center in Brooklyn. Number 2. Bianca Belair vs Sasha Banks in 2021 Four years later, the roles were reversed for Banks, who was set to clash with SmackDown Women's Champion Bianca Belair at SummerSlam 2021. The boss had succumbed to the EST of WWE in a classic at WrestleMania 37, and despite showing the possibility of a union between the two of them, had turned on Bianca before challenging her to a rematch. However, right before Banks was due to make her entrance on the night, it was announced that she was not cleared to compete as scheduled. Any fans peeved about false advertising were even more miffed when Carmella was announced as her replacement, but then Becky Lynch returned after more than a year away, attacked Carmella, and took the match and the title for herself. It was a lot to take in, and once the dust had settled, people began questioning what the deal with Sasha was. According to reports, WWE had known for eight days that she wouldn't be wrestling in Nevada, but decided to keep things hush-hush. Banks herself, who returned to Extreme Rules the following month, has been coy about the real reason why, and it remains something of a mystery to this very day. Number 1. Shawn Michaels vs Mr McMahon in 2002 SummerSlam 2002 was the scene of one of the most spectacular comebacks in WWE history as Shawn Michaels returned from an over four-year exile after undergoing what was thought to be career-ending back surgery. Tearing the house down with former DX buddy Triple H in an unsanctioned match, the Heartbreak Kid showed the world that he was still able to perform at the highest level and on the biggest stages. Michaels himself had some doubts heading into the pay-per-view and had originally pitched to wrestle a much different opponent. 
The showstopper initially wanted to wrestle Mr. McMahon in a street fight, feeling fans wouldn't be expecting a five-star match out of him in those circumstances. Per the proposed storyline, Michaels would be out for revenge against McMahon for running him into the ground during his prime and being the person ultimately responsible for his physical state. The chairman was on board too, realizing it would be a major attraction and likely draw significant interest. But during a conversation with his future son-in-law, McMahon concluded that the game would be a better opponent for HBK as he was a true ring general and could help disguise Sean's weaknesses. Luckily for all involved, there weren't any. A change of scenery can do a professional wrestler the world of good, reinvigorating them and perhaps even taking their career to previously unseen heights. The key word there being can, because some wrestlers sign for a different promotion, hoping for the best, only for things to turn out very differently to how they probably imagined they would. Others might bite their tongue and take it on the chin, but not these lots. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 wrestlers who regret going to other promotions. Join us. Number 10. Booker T Burned out and worn down after years on the road working the relentless full-time WWE schedule, Booker T left the company in September of 2007. He, like many former WWE stars with name value, quickly found himself in TNA, emerging as the surprise partner of Sting at the Genesis pay-per-view that November. Attracted to the far lighter schedule and really believing that he could make a difference to the product, it took the former five-time WCW champion all of about two two weeks to decide, sod it, I'll just take this as a paid vacation instead. Booker almost immediately began phoning it in while accepting a salary, freely admitting that he was doing things just to entertain himself as he believed that his power to really influence things on screen was practically non-existent due to circumstances outside of his control. In later years, Booker would say that he was ashamed of himself for doing some of the things he did while plying his trade in the impact zone. He may not have regretted exiting WWE, but his TNA experience experience was a massive disappointment to him personally and resulted in him losing his passion for the business he had once loved so much. Number 9. Ted DiBiase the Monday Night Wars were a great time to be a professional wrestler as WWE, WCW and even ECW were chomping at the bit to sign top tier talent, especially if it meant taking someone away from the competition. And that's why Eric Bischoff reached out to Ted DiBiase, who had retired from in-ring competition a few years prior to act as the financial backer and mouthpiece of the New World Order. According to The Million Dollar Man, his role was quickly diminished as the NWO got hotter, with Bischoff himself slipping into his place. Ted was frustrated with essentially being reduced to a bloke who carries around other people's belts and made his feelings known to Eazy e He also wasn't best pleased with the generally chaotic backstage scene in WCW at the time. Once his no-cut contract expired, Ted left WCW and made no secret of how frustrating he found his three-year tenure in the Turner-owned organization. Adding to his sense of regret was the fact that he had sent Vince McMahon a letter informing him of his departure rather than speak with him face to face. Number 8. Gail Kim It's fair to say that Gail Kim wasn't used exceptionally well during her first WWE run. Outside of her winning the women's title in her Raw debut, you would struggle to think of anything else the talented but underutilized Kim did prior to her November 2004 release. Resurfacing in TNA, Kim set about showing the world exactly what she was capable of, in particular during her exceptional series of matches with Awesome Kong. Perhaps realizing they had made a mistake the first time, WWE came calling again and Gail re-signed with the company in late 2008. So did WWE write the wrongs from Kim's first run and let her show the world just how bloody good she was? No, no they did not. The former Knockouts champion was involved a little more and lasted a little longer, yes, but her second stretch was exceptionally frustrating, so much so that Kim once voluntarily eliminated herself from a battle royal. Gail hasn't been shy in telling the world just how unhappy she was with her treatment and how glad she was to leave and return to TNA. Number 7. The Honky Tonk Man After leaving WWE in 1991, the Honky Tonk Man wrestled on the independent scene for a few years until some old friends got his foot in the door at WCW. Hulk Hogan and Jimmy Hart vouched for the then longest reigning intercontinental champion ever, with Eric Bischoff reluctantly signing him to a deal. When the Honky Tonk Man showed up in WCW, Bischoff was quick to tell him that he wasn't a fan and that the only reason he brought him in was to shut Jimmy Hart up. 
Ouch. The Elvis wannabe did pretty much nothing during his four months in WCW outside of a brief feud with Johnny B. Bad over the TV title. He was asked to put the champ over, something that didn't sit too well with the Honky Tonk Man, who promptly told Eric Bischoff that he wouldn't do any clean jobs on television. Duly informed that if that was the case, he could leave right then and there, Wayne Farris took his boss up on the offer and Shake rattled and rolled out of the building. Already unhappy with his nightly pay and not being offered a proper contract, Honky told Bischoff that he couldn't hold Vince McMahon's jockstrap as he walked out the door and back to the indies. Number 6. Eric Bischoff When Eric Bischoff left WWE in 2005, save for a surprise appearance or two here and there, most fans assumed that he was done in professional wrestling. There was really nothing more for him to accomplish, and besides, he had outside interests and business to occupy his time. But when Hulk Hogan went to TNA to save the company by leading the charge against Vince McMahon, that's heavy sarcasm there by the way, he wanted someone he trusted by his side. And so Bischoff was roped back in, even though he didn't like the TNA product and wasn't particularly interested in working in sports entertainment anymore either. But like a good and handsomely paid soldier, Eric did what he had to do and worked both as an on-screen character as well as a creative force behind the scenes. Reflecting on his time in Dixieland, Bischoff has called the decision to go there as very regrettable and admits that he wishes he had never done it. The only silver lining was getting his son Garrett a job and being afforded the opportunity to share on-camera moments with him, something that he will always cherish. Number 5. William Regal Now, before we start, I should mention that William Regal himself has not expressly come out and said that he regretted his short stint in All Elite Wrestling. Wrestling. On the contrary, Regal on Twitter thanked Tony Khan and the crew and said he had a lovely time working with so many talented wrestlers and nice people. According to EC3, however, when the 2008 WWE King of the Ring went to AEW in March of 2022, he immediately regretted his decision due to an apparent maturity issue within management. Take it with a pinch of protein shake, maybe, but Regal did manage to negotiate an early out from his AEW contract less than a year after making his debut as an on-screen character in order to return to WWE. It's also emerged long after the fact that the battling Brit may have had a locker room run-in with the ever-controversial CM Punk, something which can't have made him feel too comfortable backstage. Regal himself has said that his previous health issues played a part in his decision to request his release as he realized that all he had left was time. I guess he just didn't want to spend his time there then. Number 4. Shane Douglas Shane Douglas had been Shane Douglas across runs in WCW, WWE, WCW again, and then ECW from 1988 until he went back to WWE in 1995. With occupational gimmicks all the rage at the time, Shane was rechristened Dean Douglas and given the character of an evil college dean. His school teacher past coming back to haunt him, Douglas knew that the gimmick was a no-hoper, but that was the least of his worries during what turned out to be a hugely disappointing six-month stay. The franchise has made public a litany of complaints about how he was treated in interviews since, noting that the pay wasn't nearly as good as he initially hoped it would be, how the members of the clique supposedly tried to sabotage him in the ring and backstage, and how Vince McMahon allegedly tried to force him to work through a serious back injury. Douglas enjoyed being around the non-click members of the locker room, such as Bret Hart, Dustin Rhodes and Kurt Hennig, but that's about where the positivity about his second WWE run ends. Luckily for him, he was able to rebuild his career and reputation by going back to ECW. Number 3. Jake Roberts According to Jake Roberts, his decision to leave WWE after putting The Undertaker over at WrestleMania 8 was because Vince McMahon had reneged on a promise to give him the booking job that previously belonged to Pat Patterson, who disappeared for a while following the Ring Boy scandal. Roberts had managed to strike himself a lucrative deal with rival WCW before taking his snake and going home, which he could officially Sign once his 90-day non-compete expired. Unfortunately for Jake, WCW axed Kip Frey and installed Bill Watts as his EVP successor on day 87. The cowboy, who had been brought in to cut costs, subsequently tore up Jake's contract and offered him a much lower amount, knowing full well that Roberts couldn't go back to WWE anytime soon. Outside of losing to Sting in a rotten coal miner's glove match at Halloween Havoc 1992, Jake didn't do much of note during 
during his few months in WCW. Robert soon checked himself into rehab, was fired by Watts, and then later successfully sued WCW for the money he was owed. A small victory from an otherwise lamentable episode. Number 2. Ric Flair Ric Flair was given one of the best send-offs in the history of wrestling when he fell to Shawn Michaels in an emotionally charged encounter at WrestleMania 24 before being honoured by the entire WWE roster on Raw the next night. It was an in-ring goodbye befitting one of the genuine greats, and the hope was that the Nature Boy would honour his commitment. Sadly, Slick Rick found his way to TNA in early 2010, a consequence of needing money to maintain his fast-living lifestyle and, you know, pay back the mountain of cash he owed various creditors too. All told, Flair wrestled a dozen matches within a little over a year for TNA and, well, they weren't pretty. The dirtiest player in the game knew it too and called ever signing for TNA the biggest regret in his career. And that's Ric Flair we're talking about here. He's had more than a couple of regrets. He enjoyed the camaraderie of the roster and the relatively easy money, but acknowledged it as a stain on his legacy and still feels bad for cheapening his WWE swan song with the Heartbreak Kid. Number 1. Bret Hart In Bret Hart, WCW were getting arguably the hottest and most sympathetic wrestler in the business after the Hitman had been notoriously screwed out of losing the world title at the 1997 Survivor Series. Inexplicably, they fumbled the ball right out of the gate, and Bret's WCW career got off to a stuttering start never to fully recover. Honestly, they had one of the best wrestlers in the world, a man who had been disgracefully booted out of the other promotion, handed to them on a silver platter, and they dropped the friggin' thing almost instantly. Not only was it a creatively dissatisfying two years for the excellence of execution, but his younger brother Owen tragically passed away while working for WWE, and Brett's own career essentially came to an end seven months later when Goldberg kicked him in the head at Starcade 99. Brett has been more than open, not just in deriding Eric Bischoff and WCW's ability to produce compelling television, but also in his regret at ever leaving WWE in the first place, with the knowledge of what was to come after. They say wrestling rings are made to be broken. Well, they don't, that's rules, but those spandex-clad beef boys still occasionally find a way to break the very thing they're supposed to be wrestling in regardless. From simple rope snaps and buckled boards to full-on destruction, we've seen the ring get taken apart in the course of action in various companies throughout the years. Most of the time, it's intentional. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 times wrestlers destroyed the ring. Join us! Number 10. The Giant on Thunder While the Big Show had a penchant for wrecking WWE rings, which we will delve into soon enough, don't worry, his destructive ways actually began when he was performing as the Giant in WCW. On the January 22nd, 1998 episode of Thunder, the Giant was wrestling Scott Hall in the show's main event when the bad guy's running buddy Kevin Nash ran in and caused the bout to end via DQ. Due to a storyline stipulation that prevented the Giant from laying a hand on Big sexy, he took out his frustrations in the most mature way possible, by tearing down the ring with Hall still inside of it. Using his mammoth frame to upend the ring posts, the giant had Hall doing his best sell job, causing him to comically stagger around the dilapidated ring before falling down. In all honesty, it wasn't nearly as cool as it sounds, but it was an interesting way to end the show if nothing else, and it suitably put over Paul White's impressive size. It also gave the ring crew a head start, and I'm nothing if not a man who respects those unsung heroes. Number 9. Big Show and Brock Lesnar on SmackDown As I just mentioned, the Giant took his ring-breaking ways with him to WWE. And it didn't take him long to start busting boards, as the 500-pounder chokeslammed The Undertaker right through the canvas on the June 7th, 1999 episode of Raw, less than four months after his WWE debut. Perhaps the most famous ring-breaking incident in Big Show's career came four years later, when he met Brock Lesnar in the main event of the June 12, 2003 edition of SmackDown. Entering uncharted territory, Show began climbing to the top rope when he was cut off by the next big thing and hit with a gargantuan superplex. Not just breathtaking in and of itself, the ring collapse aftermath was perfectly done by WWE's props department and it remains one of the most surprising and thrilling climaxes to an episode of TV in the company's history. In fact, it was so good that WWE repeated the trick with Show several times 
times. Mark Henry brought him down to earth in their world heavyweight title match at Vengeance 2011, with John Cena and Alberto Del Rio having to work their match in the wreckage. Braun Strowman also got in on the act on the April 17th, 2017 edition of Raw. Number 8. JBL at No Way Out 2005 One of the hallmarks of JBL's unlikely and long WWE title reign was the loudmouth Texan consistently managing to find new ways of just about weathering the storm and somehow leaving with the belt around his waist. SmackDown general manager Teddy Long tried to combat this by booking Bradshaw against the Big Show, there's that guy again, in a barbed wire cage match at No Way Out 2005. There was nowhere to run for the champ, as the top of the steel structure was covered in the spiky stuff, leaving him at the mercy of the world's largest athlete. But if there's a will, then there's a way, and the way JBL was going to escape this time was through the ring. In an ingenious finish, Sho gave him a top rope choke slam, the force of the bump causing the former acolyte to make a hole in the ring. Assuming that his opponent was fully incapacitated, Sho sauntered out of the cage door, only to then discover that JBL had used the hole to escape from under the ring itself, meaning that he had technically escaped and got to ringside first. A cool spot, yes, but also the perfect way for an opportunistic champion to eke out a win. Number 7. Cactus Jack at No Way Out 2000 Five years before JBL and Big Show were headlining No Way Out in a steel structure, Triple H and Cactus Jack were doing the same. Inside Hell in a Cell, the game of Mick Foley's epic rivalry came to a stunning conclusion with Hunter's time on the line against Foley's career. Another five-star bloodbath in their incredible series, the two men beat each other to a pulp, utilizing the cell as well as a host of nasty weapons. Inevitably, they ended up fighting on top of the damn thing, instantly bringing to mind Foley's iconic cell match with The Undertaker from almost two years prior. Mrs. Foley's baby boy didn't get launched off the side of the structure this time, but he did go through it once again. Actually, he did take a bump off the side through the announce table, because of course he bloody did. Countering a pile driver attempt with a back body drop, Triple H sent the hardcore legend hurtling through a panel and down to the ring, which cratered around him. It was a spectacular bump, and thankfully for Foley, a lot safer than the brutal chokeslam he received at the 1998 King of the Ring. Number 6. Bam Bam Bigelow and Taz at Living Dangerously 1998 WWE may have perfected the ring-breaking stunt in matches, but they initially nicked it from, where else, ECW. Yes, the stunt was another of the many things Vince McMahon's promotion borrowed from the Paul Heyman-led outfit during the 90s. At ECW's Living Dangerously 1998 pay-per-view, Taz defended his world television title against Bam Bam Bigelow. Most of the fighting between the human suplex machine and the beast from the east took place in the crowd as they brawled around the arena. When they were given the signal, however, they returned to the ring for the grand ending. With a Taz mission locked in, Bigelow threw his body weight backwards, sending both men through the ring. Living dangerously indeed. Bam Bam was genuinely worried that Taz would hurt himself on the spot, so before the show they measured the proper distance needed to ensure nobody would be injured and put a small piece of white tape on the top rope to mark it. It went off exactly as planned and both men were thrilled with the outcome. Honestly, only in wrestling could somebody be thrilled at being thrown into a hole and having a 400 pound man land immediately on top of them. Number 5. Yokozuna at SummerSlam 1996 WWE's narrative would tell you that the second he cut his Austin 316 promo following his triumph in the 1996 King of the Ring, Stone Cold's meteoric rise to the top began in earnest. In reality though, Steve Austin had to bide his time a while longer. For example, he wasn't even booked on the main SummerSlam card two months later, having to settle for a pre show free-for-all bouts with Yokozuna instead. The Samoan super heavyweight was tipping the scales north of 600 pounds at this point, so it's no surprise that the match was not a long one. Though it only clocked in at 1 minute and 52 seconds, at least the finish was a memorable sight. As he attempted to hit his finisher, Yoko's bulk caused the top turnbuckle to come loose, sending him crashing down to the mat and handing Austin the victory. WWE attempted to do something similar during Roman Reigns' undisputed WWE WWE Universal title defense against Finn Balor at Extreme Rules 2022, but the only thing it succeeded in was making the demon look like a bit of a muppet.
it. Number 4. The Undertaker and Edge at SummerSlam 2008 After feuding for the best part of a year and having wrestled in a WrestleMania main event as well as a TLC match, the bitter feud between Edge and The Undertaker really needed to end in a way befitting its epic nature. A Hell in a Cell headliner at SummerSlam certainly did the trick, as the Deadman and the Rated R Superstar were given plenty of plunder to play with. The absence of blood, a consequence of the company's recent change to a PG rating, was a shame, but nobody was talking about the lack of claret when the pay-per-view was over. After putting his foe away with a tombstone, Taker wanted to make sure that Edge would never breathe again, let alone wrestle. Taking him for a trip up the ladder, the dead man sent him through a gimmicked part of the ring with a mighty choke slam. Then, just to make sure he was really dead, Taker had flames shoot out of the hole that Edge's body had just created. You know, at his command, because he's a magic biker zombie, you see. Number 3. The Nexus on Raw when the collective members of the Nexus were sent to the ring for their debut following the John Cena vs CM Punk main events on the June 7th, 2010 episode of Raw, they were only given two instructions by Vince McMahon. Number one, don't punch any member of the audience, which, I mean, yeah. And number two, don't touch the cameras, because they're HD, they're worth about 100 grand, and frankly, pal, they are more important to WWE than the eight of you put together. Besides that, the so-called band of rookies were given carte blonde to wreak as much havoc as they wanted. Well, as long as they didn't break untold rule number three. Don't choke out a ring announcer with his own tie. As well as laying waste to everyone within their vicinity, the Nexus also did some damage to the ring, dislodging the middle rope and pulling up the ring canvas and a portion of the ring padding. They also chucked about a bunch of stuff at ringside and generally made quite a mess. How do you expect to make any friends in the locker room making a scene like that, lads? Honestly. Number two, Cheeks in TNA. There was a lot riding on the debut show for NWA TNA. Their inaugural effort in their weekly pay-per-view format basically had to be a home run if the concept had any chance of succeeding. So, naturally, the ring got knackered before the show went live on air. That's right, in the very first match in a TNA ring, the thing went ahead and broke. The reason for this is the lamentable Cheeks, who was a 450-pound Rikishi ripoff who got winded walking down to the ring, who managed to do something to make it go all dodgy, whether it was hitting the ropes or turnbuckles with his sizable frame, I'm not entirely sure. It's actually pretty impressive in its own way, since he and his opponent Frank Parker were only out there for little over a minute. The ring breaking caused a bit of a scramble backstage, with segments rearranged in order to give Ron and Don Harris enough time to fix the issue. They managed to just about get it done in time. Even more amazingly, TNA actually aired the disastrous dark match on their second weekly pay-per-view. It was, mercifully, the simultaneous pay-per-view debut and retirement of Cheeks. Number one. Brock Lesnar at SummerSlam 2022 Brock Lesnar has long been a law unto himself, his combination of freakish strength and ultra-intimidating aura essentially giving him free reign to do what he wants when he wants to do it. So if the Beast Incarnate decides that he's going to drive a tractor to ringside and then use it in his match, who are you to tell him otherwise? An actual rancher who grew up working on a dairy farm, Lesnar knows his way around agricultural equipment and looked plenty comfortable driving that big red thing down to ringside for his SummerSlam 2022 show down with undisputed WWE Universal Champion Roman Reigns. Not only did Brock start the match off by jumping off the tractor onto the Tribal Chief, but he later used its front loader to hoist up and drop down Roman before capping it off with his pièce de résistance, lifting the ring up with Reigns still in it. According to reports, Lesnar actually pulled this feat off without any prior rehearsal. Because of course he did. He's Brock Lesnar. Using a tractor to pick up a wrestling ring is just another day at the office for that big, sweaty, scary, prairie boy. Ah, the wrestling championship belt. A symbol of excellence, an ode to the grand traditions of the industry's past, one of the most important parts of this great thing that we all love. Okay, let's be honest, they're mostly a way for companies to sell expensive replicas. The reason why sweaty weirdos like you love to spend obscene amounts of money on fake belts is because some of them are absolutely gorgeous. But of the many, many different title belts that have existed throughout history, which are so stunning that they would put WCW Steve Austin to shame. Before we start, we realize that this is going to be an incredibly controversial list, as it's so ruddy bloody subjective.
positive, so a few honorable mentions first. The NXT North American title, the WWF Attitude Era title, the IWGP Intercontinental Championship title from 2012 to 2021, the Ring of Honor World Tag Team titles, the OGTNA World title, the NWA World's Heavyweight title, the 90s WWF Tag Team titles, and the Lucha Underground Gift of the Gods Championship, because bloody look at it! On with the list. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 greatest wrestling belt designs. Join us. Number 10, the NXT Men's and Women's Championship from 2017 to 2022. The original version of the Men's NXT Championship was a nice idea in principle. The letters of the brand were perfect for the design of a belt, with the large golden X serving as the title's main plate. But is it just me or did it always look a bit dirty? Like it could have permanently used a spot of polish? Am I going mad? As for the original women's title, it was fine, but just a bit unimposing. Like it was really, really really small and still had tints of pink on it, which just allowed for comparisons to the god-awful Divas Championship. I still have nightmares about that oversized Claire's accessories purchase. Then came 2017's NXT TakeOver Orlando, where everything changed. As unveiled by champions Bobby Roode and Asuka, the new designs of the Men's and Women's Championships were much better. They were more compact and contained, the X of NXT now housed within a traditional front plate. Put simply, they just looked a bit classier, but perhaps that's because they weren't covered in dirt anymore. Seriously, am I the only one who noticed that? Please, somebody else tell me they saw it. Number 9, the MLW World Tag Team Championships from 2018 to present. Being the dirty wrestling hipsters that we are, we wanted to include at least one less prominent promotion in their championship in this list. I know, aren't we nice? As a result, feast your eyes upon these buttes from Major League Wrestling. MLW was first founded in 2002 by ex-WWE writer Court Bauer. However, the company would fold after just two years, leaving its wrestlers, storylines, and championships up in the air. After a long hiatus, the company made its grand return in 2017. The following year, it reintroduced its tag team titles after the Lucha Bros won a triple threat ladder match to become the new champs. The titles would go on to be held by the Hart Foundation, the Von Erichs, and some other teams that weren't reboots from the 80s. Big and bold, with an ornate wreath design running around the outside, the centerpiece is the huge silver globe that sits directly in the middle. With the striking MLW logo slap bang in the center, these belts are grand and dynamic, which is impressive for a title with such a relatively short lineage. Number 8, the Ring of Honor World Championship from 2012 to 2017. The current version of the Ring of Honor World Championship is loosely based on the very first design of the belt with a few new bells and whistles. This is a shame because that design definitely isn't the best ROH has had. I guess it just looks a bit outdated, like a relic from a bygone era. It's squashed, the lettering is ugly and overbearing, and it just doesn't feel like the top prize of a company as big as ROH. Then came the second and third versions, which were somehow even worse. Version 2 looks like it was made for about $5, and version 3 looks like it shrunk in the wall. Then, thankfully, came design number four. First appearing in 2012, this iteration of the gold finally felt good enough to carry the history of the championship. For starters, it was actually gold-colored, rather than the bafflingly silver-colored plate that it would eventually be replaced with. Gold is better than silver, guys. Everyone knows that. Yes, the ROH logo in the middle is a little squeezed, but there's just something appealing about this design. It is beautiful, it is regal, and most importantly, it's not any of the others. Number 7, the NWA World Television Championship from 2019 to present. If you were to travel back in time to the moment just before the Big Bang, you would find vast swathes of emptiness and the original NWA booking committee discussing whether or not George Hackenschmidt should go over in Missouri. The point I'm trying to make is that the National Wrestling Alliance is old as balls. When Billy Corgan reshuffled the NWA, he brought back their World Television Championship. Unfortunately, because a certain tyrant in Connecticut owned the older versions of the belt, this new one would have to start its history all over again. Influenced by the old Georgia and Mid-Atlantic models of the title, the new belt captured all the honor and weight of its predecessors while somehow feeling unique. It just felt timeless, an homage to 
the past, and it looked even better once it was around the waist of inaugural champion Ricky Starks. Although, to be honest, that man could walk out wearing a telephone cord and it would still look prestigious. Number 6. The NXT United Kingdom Championship At the tail end of 2016, WWE announced out of nowhere that they would be hosting a tournament to crown their first ever United Kingdom champion. 16 of Britain's finest grapplers would compete over two nights to become the first holder of the new belt. And what a belt it was! It's amazing just how much people love this design, considering all WWE did was pop out the center part of their existing WWE Championship and put the UK coat of arms in the middle instead. Old people will remember that this design used to be on the back of pound coins here in the UK. Do they still use it on the new ones? It's been a while since I had any money. Anyway, just look how nice this design is. Look at that crown! Look at the lion! Look at that horse! Fun fact, in the actual coat of arms is a unicorn. Why did you deny us a unicorn championship, WWE? Come on, New Day, help us out. Mythical creature or not, this is absolutely stunning and showed just how much time and effort WWE had put into the creation of the title. If only they'd shown that much care with the actual UK division, eh? Number 5. The WWE Intercontinental Championship from 1986 to 1998 the Intercontinental title belt design has changed considerably over the years, from that ramshackle thing Pat Patterson won in that totally real tournament that definitely happened in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, to the black and gold beauty that Gunter currently carries around. There are many iterations in between, but the best is what is often referred to as the classic Intercontinental Championship belt. You know, the one that was held by a litany of Hall of Famers, Randy Savage, Ricky Steamboat, Ultimate Warrior, Rick Rude, Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels and more still, back when the IC strap was very much the secondary title and considered a stepping stone to the main prize. It's nothing too terribly flashy, but it looks like a proper piece of kit, primarily gold with a globe in the center and augmented by stars, with side plates depicting a little bit of grappling and showcasing the WWE logo. It's been backed by leathers of various colors, including black, white, gold for gold dust, and whatever shade Warrior wanted to match his tassels that week. It is called the classic design for a reason, with WWE agreeing and resurrecting it for a time in the 2010s. Number 4. The AEW World Championship Remember when British comedian Jack Whitehall was in AEW? He introduced Bret Hart for the championship unveiling segment at the original Double or Nothing. Why was he there? Anyway, mysterious posh boys to one side, the championship that the hitman did eventually introduce was an absolute treat for the eyes. First of all, this thing is chunky, thick with all the C's. The plates absolutely pop off the strap, sticking out so far you could take an eye out if you got too close. When Jericho used to hit people with it when he was champion, it sounded like he just struck someone with a spade. Despite its considerable heft, it somehow manages to be sleek and elegant at the same time. The elongated center portion doesn't distract like many other similar designs, instead giving the belt a unique look while embodying so many classic belts of the past. The care and respect that went into creating this title showed just how committed AEW was to excellence so early on in its existence. It's just a bit of a shame that Brett held it up to the wrong camera when he first showed it off. Nothing a few more months in developmental wouldn't fix, eh? Number 3. The Winged Eagle Since it was first won by Buddy Rogers, the WWE Championship has been through many different names and title designs. You are probably going to be nostalgic for whichever version was around when you were growing up. Unless it was that weird, horrible green thing that the Iron Sheik had. Nobody misses that. But objectively, I think we can all agree that the best version of the title is the iconic winged eagle design that was in use from 1988 to 1998. First introduced by Hulk Hogan, this beautiful design is everything a world title should be. And by that, we mean it's really shiny. Look how shiny it is. If you want more than just one word, shiny, on why this belt is so good, then let's Let's talk about its most famous feature. The soaring golden eagle in the center is magnificent, from the way it straddles the globe on its back to the way its wings burst out of the top of the design. This mighty bird embodies everything that a wrestling champion should be, larger than life, a little bit arrogant, but absolutely resplendent. Number 2. The IWGP Heavyweight Title from 2008 to 2021 A golden title for one of New Japan's true golden 
Eras, the design of the IWGP heavyweight title between 2008 and 2021 was fitting for a company that seemingly went from strength to strength and did everything to maintain the integrity of its top prize. Unveiled at a press conference and handed to then-champion Shinsuke Nakamura during a pre-match ceremony, this fourth design of a title first introduced in 1987 was said to begin a new history in New Japan by the company's president. Secured on black leather, the predominantly gold and silver design had some lovely detailing, but one of the most striking features of the belt was contained within the side plates. On them were small nameplates featuring the names of every previous champion, so the current title holder was literally reminded of the important history of one of the most prestigious wrestling titles in the world. Speaking of, our dear planet also features prominently in the design, lorded over by New Japan's iconic lion logo. Why the promotion scrapped this gleaming waistband in favor of what looks a bit like a posh divas title when it was unified with the IWGP Intercontinental title and became the IWGP World Heavyweight title in 2021, I will never know. Number one, Big Gold. First designed by Charles Crumrine in 1985, the fabled Big Gold belt is a living, breathing part of professional wrestling's very soul. Originally awarded to NWA World's champion Ric Flair, the Big Gold belt has represented over half a dozen different titles over the years, including the WCW Championship, WWE's World Heavyweight Championship, and is of course the inspiration for the new version of WWE's World Heavyweight title too. There is a reason why this large shiny dinner plate kept getting brought back from the grave. Seriously, this thing is just glory personified. The size of it, the slick gold coloring, the intricate little flourishes on the main plate, the fact that it had a name bar when most other wrestling titles at the time didn't. The belt was a tribute to excess, the all-encompassing thrill of being the very best wrestler in the entire world. There is a reason it's so synonymous with Ric Flair, as the two shared the same philosophy of more is more. The big gold set the standard for all future world championship designs, and even though it hasn't been used by a promotion since 2014, it still looms large in the memory of anyone lucky enough to catch a glimpse of it. NXT is supposed to be WWE's developmental system, helping to grow the next generation of talent. The reason I say supposed like that is because more often than not, wrestlers who are big stars down in Florida often get shafted when moved up to the main roster. Sebo Dallas, The Ascension, Keith Lee, and so on. Sometimes, though, a wrestler actually does better on Raw or SmackDown than they ever did down in the black and gold. I know, what a concept. So, who are these lucky guys and gals? Well, I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 WWE wrestlers who are more successful on the main roster than in NXT. Join us. Number 10, Carmella. Starting out as a valet is a tried and tested method of getting your foot in the door of a wrestling company. On one side, you have Lita, who began her WWE career as ringside company for SA Rios and later the Hardy Boys. On the other, you have Reginald. Yeah, less said there the better. Towards the Lita side of things is where you will find Carmella, who debuted as the hairdresser turned helper for Enzo Amore and Big Cass. Her NXT highlights included being part of her team's feud with Blake and Murphy for the tag titles and wrestling Bayley for the Women's Championship. She was called up to SmackDown in 2016 and quickly became one of the brand's most popular female stars. She would go on to win the first ever Women's Money in the Bank match the following year, cashing in on Charlotte the year after. Though she didn't do badly for herself down in Florida, Mella definitely gained a higher profile and won more championship gold after she graduated to the main roster. That said, down in NXT, she never had to wear a gaudy face mask, dance with our truth or have to look at James Ellsworth, so maybe we're wrong on this one. Number 9. Rusev Before he was Miro in AEW or just Rusev in WWE, the Bulgarian brute was Alexander Rusev in the land of black and gold. Debuting for the brand in 2013, the Eastern European powerhouse went on to have one of the weirdest NXT careers of all time. His original manager was Sylvester Lafour, remember him, and he was once in a tag team with Scott Dawson, aka FTR's Dax Harwood, called the Fighting Legionnaires. I don't know what that means. Things picked up for Rusev when he took 
took on real-life partner Lana as his manager. In 2014, he appeared in the Royal Rumble match before being called up full-time in April. He would continue to periodically appear down in NXT, having his last match for them in July. On the main roster, Rusev would lose his first name, but gain two US title runs, a popular slogan, and the love and affection of almost every wrestling fan around the world. Number 8. Elias the modern-day Elias did a reverse Rusev when he got called up, dropping his surname instead. As the drifter Elias Samson, the guitar-wielding nomad would cut vaguely mysterious promos and beat undercard performers like Bull Dempsey and Jesse Sorensen. His winning ways would end after he started facing more established talent like Johnny Gargano and Shinsuke Nakamura before he was booted from the brand in a Loser Leaves NXT match against Cassius Ono in 2017. Despite not being dynamite or anything in the ring, Elias has been given some pretty decent pushes since joining the main roster. He's appeared on several pay-per-views, challenged for championships, and who could forget when he and Kevin Owens got assaulted by booze that one time in Seattle. He may not have won any titles since his call-up, but Elias has certainly been featured far more prominently on Raw and SmackDown than he ever was in NXT. Number 7. Xavier Woods Xavier Woods actually had a pretty damn successful career in TNA before he joined WWE's developmental system in 2010. After a few years in Florida Championship Wrestling, Woods debuted for the newly rebranded NXT in late 2012. He had actually had a handful of non-televised matches beforehand, the first of which was against none other than Big E Langston. Neat. Woods' final NXT match for a long time was in June 2013. Just a few months later, he was on the main roster as the tag team partner for R-Truth. And you all know what happened next. Woods toiled for a bit, got together with Big E and Kofi Kingston, formed the New Day, learned to play the trombone, and became one third of one of the most celebrated and decorated stables in the history of WWE. In the decades since his call-up, Woods has become a vital part of the WWE landscape. Though he didn't really have much time to achieve anything in NXT, nobody was expecting the nerdy college kid to go quite as far as he did. Number 6. Solo Sokoa a very recent call-up at the time of recording, Solo Sokoa shocked the world when he saved Roman Reigns' world title reign at Clash at the Castle. Since rescuing his cousin from Drew McIntyre that night in Wales, Sokoa has been a valued member of the bloodline and has enjoyed a quasi-main event status as a result. He very rarely loses on the main roster and has had multiple great matches both on his own and alongside his brothers, the Usos. You got any more kids, Rikishi? The ones we've seen so far have been great. Solo signed his WWE contract in August 2021 and made his NXT debut at that year's Halloween Havoc. He was originally a good guy, which seems bonkers now, and had his first major feud with Boa that culminated in a Falls Count Anywhere match in January 2022. He certainly wasn't bad at NXT by any means, but making your main roster debut as part of a pay-per-view main event and then joining one of the most dominant factions of the last decade? You can't really argue with that, can you? Number 5. Bray Wyatt Bray Wyatt was actually on the WWE main roster before he was ever in NXT. Husky Harris? The Nexus? Yeah, you remember. After getting repackaged as a swamp-dwelling cult leader with a penchant for straw hats, Wyatt turned up in NXT in July 2012. He got injured shortly thereafter, but this didn't stop him from appearing on TV alongside his new followers Luke Harper and Eric Rowan. As a trio, the Wyatt family got called up to the main roster in the run-up to SummerSlam 2013. What followed has been a proper roller coaster for Bray as he's flip-flopped between fan favorite and Scourge ever since. People loved him as WWE champion champion, but they hated his matches with Randy Orton. People loved him as The Fiend, but they hated him with Uncle Howdy. Honestly, you lot can be so fickle. In spite of these inconsistencies, Wyatt has achieved far more on the main roster than he did down in the black and gold. He's a multi-time world champion, he's main evented countless big shows, and created some of the most memorable segments in recent years. By the way, memorable doesn't always mean good, but it is something. Number 4. Alexa Bliss 
Much like Carmella, Alexa Bliss also rose to prominence down in NXT as the manager of a tag team. Alongside Wesley Blake and Buddy Murphy, Bliss gained notoriety as a devious heel who was willing to do anything it took to make sure her boys won the day. She actually had been a wrestler prior to this, but her character was a glitter fairy, so let's just move on. After Blake and Murphy went their separate ways, Bliss started performing on her own in the women's division. She challenged Bayley once for the NXT women's title and was then called up to the main roster in the 2016 draft. The goddess hasn't looked back since that day, going on an absolute tear. She became the first person to win both the Raw and SmackDown Women's Championships, has been a tag team champion three times, won Money in the Bank, and once had black goo run down her face at WrestleMania. So very illustrious. Bliss turned into a bona fide superstar after leaving NXT, which is absolutely insane when you consider that her finisher used to be called the Sparkle Splash. Number 3. Bianca Belair from an afterthought debut following WrestleMania 36 to winning the Royal Rumble to closing out night one of Mania 37, Belair's journey to the top of WWE's women's division has been hard fought and an utter joy to watch. Not only is she a former WrestleMania main eventer, but she's also a two-time women's champion with her Raw women's title reign lasting over a year. She is not only one of the biggest female stars in the company, but she's also one of their biggest stars full stop. Also, she's married to Montez Ford. What a hunk. Belair came to many people's attention as part of the 2017 May Young Classic and then went on a strong undefeated run down in NXT. This came to an end when she failed to beat Shayna Baszler for the Women's Championship at TakeOver Phoenix. She would stick around in the title picture until departing the brand in 2020, so she didn't have a bad run by any stretch. However, when you consider just how big a star she has become on the main roster, you have to give that part of her career some major props. Number 2. Baron Corbin Ah, the tale of Baron Corbin, a story of triumph, misery, and waistcoats. As the Lone Wolf, he was one of the standout stars of NXT from 2014 to 2016, a time many consider the promotion's golden era. He rubbed elbows with some big names, Rhino, Samoa Joe, Sami Zayn, and Austin Aries, to name but a few. His main roster debut took place at WrestleMania 32, where he won the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal. In his first night out of developmental, he had already won more trophies than he ever did in NXT. Over the next few years, Corbin rose from mid-card heel to Money in the Bank winner to actual main eventer. Were the fans happy with this trajectory? Absolutely not, but it happened. He would eventually be given the rub of retiring Kurt Bloody Angle at WrestleMania. Oh god, please don't make me think about that match again. Inconsistent matches to one side, Corbin has been part of so many major storylines and moments on the main roster that we had to include him in the festivities here. Now please put down your pitchforks and flaming torches. Number 1. Becky Lynch Arguably the most important thing NXT ever did was give women's wrestling in WWE the proper platform it was in desperate need of. At the forefront of that movement were the fabled four horsewomen, Charlotte Flair, Sasha Banks, Bayley and Becky Lynch. In NXT, three of those four women won the promotion's top prize, and two of them headlined a takeover. Unfortunately, Becky Lynch fits into neither of those categories. For the longest time, Lynch was seen by many as the forgotten horsewoman, the one that everybody liked but nobody truly loved. However, that all changed one special night in 2018. After ditching her go-getting attitude and becoming the man, Lynch has completely turned a corner. Her explosion in popularity helped helped pave the way for her, Charlotte Flair and Ronda Rousey to main event WrestleMania 35 and she's been considered a top name ever since. Lynch had her moments in NXT, challenging for the women's title on a few occasions and all that, but nobody could have predicted what was to come for that red-headed steampunk. Through grit, determination and radiant likability, Becky Lynch went from undesirable to ungoddamn deniable. Oh wait, that's somebody else's phrase. You get the idea though, Becky Lynch rules. Wrestling is a dangerous game and we've seen our fair share of performers go down with injury due to mishaps in the ring. However, just because a wrestler steps outside of the squared circle, that doesn't mean they're safe. These 10 grapplers all managed to hurt themselves away from the world of steel chairs and flaming tables. Some of these accidents were actually quite serious and we will treat them appropriately. Others, well, they're really funny. Good thing I don't believe in karma. 
I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 wrestlers who injured themselves outside the ring. Join us. Number 10. Cody Rhodes – Lifting Weights at Hell in a Cell 2022, Cody Rhodes and Seth Rollins had the first Dave Meltzer-rated five-star match on WWE's main roster for 11 years. This monster rating was partially due to the excellent in-ring chemistry of the pair, but it was mainly down to Cody wrestling the match with a bruise on his chest the size of bloody Texas. Rhodes had torn his pectoral muscle completely off the bone in the build-up to the show. The fact that it was a complete tear actually turned out to be the best thing for him, as the injury physically couldn't have been any worse by wrestling a full-length match. Such a gnarly injury was the result of something every wrestler does just about every day – weight training. The American Nightmare was in the gym ahead of his match with Rollins when he first hurt his muscle. He made things worse by trying to work through the pain, which is what led to his arm looking like an apple that somebody had just dropped down some stairs. This injury goes to show just how intense the training regime for a professional wrestler can be. It also shows that Cody Rhodes is a complete and utter lunatic. Number 9. Ember Moon Chasing the 24-7 Title the 24-7 Championship wasn't worth bending down to pick up off the floor, let alone getting injured over. Sadly, this is exactly what happened to current Ring of Honor star Athena, known in WWE as Ember Moon. Moon had a pretty decent run in WWE, picking up the NXT Women's and Women's Tag Team Championships in her time with the Black and Gold. However, a career low point had to be when she hurt her ankle whilst running around after this olive green monstrosity. Whilst participating in a 24-7 segment on the September 24, 2019 edition of SmackDown, Moon says she felt a pop in her ankle as she was running after R-Truth and Carmella backstage. And that's got to be about the only pop the 24-7 title ever got, eh? <laughs> thank you, thank you. I'm here all week. Moon initially brushed it off, but then later discovered that she had torn her Achilles tendon. This injury kept her off TV for quite some time. In fact, she wouldn't return to the ring for over a year. Rot in hell, 24-7 title. Number 8. Goldberg working on a farm we could have put Big Bill Berg on this list for several different reasons. There was that time in WCW that he punched through the window of a limousine, slicing an artery in his arm and causing massive amounts of blood loss. He knocked himself silly on an episode of Raw by headbutting a door prior to an in-ring promo segment, a tradition that he has since retired. However, we thought we would go with this recent incident in which Goldberg took on his fiercest rival to date, a tractor. Whilst working on his Texas farm, the former world champion managed to bash his head against the vehicle he was driving and cut himself open hard way. There's no need to blade when you're fighting agricultural machinery. Goldberg, who was 56 years old at the time, posted pictures to social media of the massive gash that he had received as a result of his fight with the digger. The cut appeared to be on the top of his head, which just makes me think he tried to spear the tractor before getting out for the jackhammer. Number 7. Samoa Joe Filming a Commercial Despite looking like he could be shot with a cannon and walk it off, Samoa Joe's main roster WWE was blighted by persistent injuries. He suffered two in quick succession in 2017 and 2018, which kept him off TV for a combined total of six months. He also spent time on the commentary desk while recovering from the ouchies, which led to that all-time great image of him in a poncho at WrestleMania 37. That injury was caused by a strange set of circumstances, which took place whilst Joe was filming an advert for WWE. Joe took a table bump as part of the commercial and ended up bashing his head in the process. This came just two months out from WrestleMania 36, meaning that Joe would have to miss the show. Although if you're going to miss a WrestleMania, that was definitely the right one. Considering how many violent scenarios the Samoan submission machine has been in during his lengthy in-ring career, it's strange to think that he could do so much damage to himself in a controlled studio environment. I mean, this is the guy who did a drop kick down some concrete stairs for crying out loud. Number 6. Lisa Filming a TV Show Sometimes stunts on films and TV shows go wrong and people get hurt. Wrestlers are of course no exception to this. 
Just ask Kevin Nash about the time he got legit stabbed whilst filming The Punisher. Perhaps the most severe injury a grappler has ever sustained on set was when Hall of Fame Alita was working on sci-fi action show Dark Angel in 2002. The Team Extreme member had landed herself a guest role on the season 2 episode Freak Show. In a freak accident, no pun intended, she ended up breaking her neck. Whilst rehearsing a scene where she would hit someone with a Hurricane Rana, the stunt double Lita was working with dropped the superstar right on her head, which caused her to crack three vertebrae. The stunt woman had assured the flame-haired daredevil that she could control her weight, but that turned out to not be the case. The injury led to an 18-month hiatus from wrestling, although she would still appear on TV as a commentator for Heat during this time. Number 5. Shawn Michaels Attacked by Marines we should warn you now that this is a story about Shawn Michaels from the mid-1990s, so some of the details might be as exaggerated as Shawn's selling. As far as most people are aware, what happened was that HBK took a trip out to a bar one night in Syracuse, New York. Whilst he was enjoying himself, presumably playing pool and sharing a pork scratching or two with the locals, he ended up antagonizing a soldier. After supposedly hitting on the serviceman's girlfriend one too many times, he and Michaels got into a fist fight. According to some sources, the soldier and perhaps 5 or 50 of his marine mates slammed a car door into Sean's head. That said, the other witnesses were an intoxicated British bulldog and X-Pack, so take that with a kilo of salt. The injury kept Michaels off the upcoming In Your House show and forced him to relinquish the Intercontinental title. The great irony of this is that the attack led to increased sympathy from the fans, which facilitated a Michaels face turn when he came back. Only the showstopper could try it on with another man's girlfriend and end up coming out the other side as a good guy. Number 4. Justin Gabriel – Base Jumping When he was in WWE as part of the Nexus or on his own, Justin Gabriel was always known as a high flyer. This is also the case in the real world, and it almost cost the South African his life on multiple occasions. Gabriel, who now wrestles under the name PJ Black, is a genuine thrill seeker. This is reflected in his nickname The Dare Wolf, which is either a great pun or one of the worst of all time, not quite sure. One of his passions is base jumping, which basically basically means jumping off of very high things and then opening a parachute at the last minute to avoid turning into a human pancake. What could possibly go wrong? After suffering two broken ankles during an accident in 2016, Gabriel returned to the sport for some reason and damn near killed himself. While sleeping off a building, the performer turned the wrong way and crashed into the structure. He managed to flip himself back around, breaking his ankle a second time in the process, and then also ripped off one of his fingers on a satellite dish. Maybe just stick to the 450 splashes from now on? Number 3. Magnum TA in a car crash One of the great what-ifs of 80s wrestling pertains to a man with one of the greatest moustaches the sport has ever known. Magnum TA was a fast-rising star in the NWA, captivating audiences as a blue-eyed babyface. He famously went to war with Tully Blanchard in a bloody I Quit match at the third ever Starcade and was being primed for a run with the world title. Then, disaster struck. Whilst driving his car in the rain, Magnum crashed into a telephone pole not far from his home. The crash shattered several bones in the star's neck and very nearly killed him. It also ended his wrestling career. Magnum TA was only 27 years old when he was forced to retire, which is far too young. There is seriously a strong chance that he might be considered one of the best of all time today if his career had been allowed to fully play out. As it is, we simply salute a legendary mullet and moustache combination and rewatch him threatening to remove Tully's eye with a piece of table on repeat. Number 2. Brutus Beefcake – A Parasailing Accident the barber, brother Brutai, Hulk Hogan's special man friend, call him what you will, Brutus Beefcake has had one hell of a career. His time in the squared circle, however, almost came to an end back in 1990 thanks to this very serious injury. Beaver was parasailing, which is the thing where you get dragged around behind a boat whilst you're wearing a parachute. While helping his friend prepare for his go, the driver of the boat set off too early and sent the other person's knees crashing into Brutus's face. He lost his nasal cavity, his jaw, and needed assistance when breathing. It took intensive facial reconstructive surgery to repair the damage, which left the star's career in severe jeopardy. However, despite having his entire face destroyed, Beefcake was back in a WWE ring just under two years later. 
It is a minor miracle that Ed Leslie was able to do anything again after this accident, let alone wrestle on and off for the next two decades. I mean, just imagine all the incredible Zodiac, Booty Man, and Disciple matches we would have missed out on if he had had to hang them up. Don't bear thinking about. Number one, Randy Orton taking the bins out. Household chores might be annoying, but surely they're not dangerous, right? Well, they are if you're a certain apex predator. WrestleMania 32 was cursed in terms of stars sustaining injuries. Every single champion from the previous year's event went down hurt. Seth Rollins, John Cena, Daniel Bryan, Tyson Kidd, Cesaro, Nikki Bella, all of them were on the shelf. Randy Orton was another name missing from the lineup. Whilst Rollins had done his knee in wrestling and Bryan's accumulated injuries had caught up with him, the Viper's reason for not being there was much less exciting. Reportedly, Orton hurt his shoulder whilst taking the rubbish to the bins at his home in October 2015. I mean, what was he throwing away? A grand piano? This bizarre boo-boo took Orton out of his feud with the Wyatt family and kept him off our screens until the next summer when he came back just in time to get his head caved in by Brock Lesnar Lesnar's mighty elbows. He might have survived Cactus Jack in a hardcore brawl, The Undertaker in a casket match, and everything The Fiend threw at him, but the great Randy Orton was no match for the almighty garbage can. The history of a certain wrestling show can be intertwined with the momentous championship changes that took place there. Money in the Bank is remembered for CM Punk beating John Cena in 2011, there are countless amazing WrestleMania belt swaps, and of course there was the brand-defining reign that began at Stomping Grounds 2019. You know the one, the really famous one. The one between that guy and that other guy. SummerSlam has also hosted its fair share of famous champion crowning moments, and we are here to lay out 10 of the very best. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are Ricochet beat Samoa Joe for the US belt. That was the one I was trying to think of earlier. Got there in the end. Anyway, here are the 10 best title changes in SummerSlam history. Join us. Number 10. The Ultimate Warrior defeats the Honky Tonk Man for the Intercontinental Championship. At the very first SummerSlam back in 1988, the Honky Tonk Man was supposed to defend his Intercontinental title against Brutus the Barber Beefcake. The Beaster, however, was put out of commission thanks to Ron Bass and those dastardly spurs of his. Thinking he was in the clear, Honky and his manager Jimmy Hart appeared at the pay-per-view to gloat and offer up a challenge for the belt. The Elvis impersonator's cockiness would prove to be his downfall, however, as the Ultimate Warrior came rushing down to the ring to accept the challenge. Just 31 seconds later, Warrior defeated the champion with a flurry of offense to win the belt and end Mr. Tonk Man's record-setting reign. It may not have been an epic or anything, but this short and sweet match gave SummerSlam its very first legendary moment. It also gave Howard Finkel a whopper of a headache when Warrior accidentally knocked him off the apron. Poor Fink. Number 9. Virgil defeats Ted DiBiase for the Million Dollar Championship the manager slash bodyguard turning on their evil boss trope is one of the most tried and tested in all of pro wrestling. Batista turning on Triple H, Wardlow turning on MJF, Damian Mizdow turning on The Miz. You might think I included that last one as a joke, but I am deadly serious. In WWE's Golden Age, the best example of this formula was when long-suffering manservant Virgil finally had enough of Ted DiBiase. After years of doing the rich man's dirty work, Virgil stood up to the Million Dollar Man at the 1991 Royal Rumble. After failing to wrest the Million Dollar Championship from his former employer at WrestleMania, Virg defeated Ted at SummerSlam to pick up the gaudy but beautiful looking belt. Watching Virgil finally get his revenge on the man who had made his life a living hell for so long was beautifully cathartic. And hey, by becoming champion, Virgil joined a legacy that would one day include LA Knight and Stone Cold Steve Austin. And that's the only time you will hear those three names in the same sentence ever. Number 8. The Usos defeat The New Day for the SmackDown Tag Team Championships the SummerSlam 2017 main card featured Shinsuke Nakamura losing to Jinder Mahal, Randy Orton beating Rusev in 10 seconds, and a match between Big Show and Big Cass featuring Enzo Amore in his underpants. And you're telling me there was no room for two of the best tag teams on the planet? Pull the other one. 
In spite of their place on the pre-show, the New Day and the Usos decided to wrestle like they were in the main event of WrestleMania. 2017 was a fantastic year for both of these teams, and this match was a highlight of their excellent rivalry. They put it all on the line to entertain the fans dumb enough to get into the arena early, eventually concluding nearly 20 minutes of action with a win for the Samoan Twins. New Day may have lost the SmackDown Tag Team Championships, but they and their opponents had just gained a whole new level of respect from wrestling fans across the world. Hey, finally a reason to watch the pre-show again! even if no other pre-show match in history would ever live up to this one. Number 7. Bret Hart defeats The Undertaker for the WWE Championship Did the Attitude Era begin with the Austin 316 promo? How about when the Scratch logo was introduced, or Vince McMahon running down Bret Hart following Survivor Series 97? Or maybe when Shawn Michaels came out on Raw that one time with a load of socks stuffed down his pants? All good answers, but you could also argue that it got underway at SummerSlam 1997. The main event of this show was The Undertaker defending his world title against Bret the Hitman Hart. Also involved was special guest referee Shawn Michaels, who thankfully hadn't stuffed his shorts on this occasion that we know of. Instead, HBK accidentally smacked Taker with a chair to hand the match and the title to Hart. This came at the end of a brilliant contest in which both legendary grapplers pulled out all the stops. The errant chair shot led to a brief Michaels-Taker feud, which culminated with the first ever Hell in a Cell match at Bad Blood. It also started the Hart title reign that would be ended by HBK at Survivor Series, aka that thing in Montreal that we are all sick of hearing about. Not only was the SummerSlam title change well worked, but it was pretty damn important too. Number 6. Brock Lesnar defeats John Cena for the WWE Championship Some people watch wrestling for the intricate in-ring displays achieved by two top performers working in sync to tell stories through pure physicality. Others, well, they just like to watch big dudes clobber the stuffing out of other big dudes. If you fall into the latter of those categories, then do I have the match for you! There was some uncertainty over whether or not WWE would put their top title on Brock Lesnar at SummerSlam 2014. On one hand, he was a special attraction who had ended The Undertaker's WrestleMania streak earlier that year. On the other hand, he was a part-timer who wouldn't be around every week to show off the belt. That said, at the end of this match, there was no uncertainty at all. Lesnar demolished Cena, absolutely battering him from pillar to post. This was the most in peril fans had ever seen Cena, as the once mighty champion failed to hit any sort of meaningful offense on his opponents. This title change not only ushered in a new era, but it was also thoroughly entertaining for anyone who had cursed Johnny Boy's name over the past decade. And trust me, that was a lot of people. Number 5. Daniel Bryan defeats John Cena for the WWE Championship One year before John Cena lost his world title to Lesnar, he lost another top prize to a very different kind of athlete. Daniel Bryan had slowly been getting over with the mainstream crowd since his debut in 2010. Thanks to his great work as part of Team Hell No, the American Dragon was handpicked by Big Match John to face him for the WWE title at the biggest party of the summer. D. Bry's incredible in-ring skill meant that he and Cena were able to have one of the best pure wrestling matches the show had ever seen. Not only did Bryan win the match and the title, but he did so clean as a sheet thanks to his debuting running knee finisher. This was Bryan's coming out party as a main eventer, proof that he could hang with the big boys and still look like a million bucks. Fans just couldn't wait to see what this lengthy title reign would look like. Oh my god, here comes Randy Orton and he's just cashed in. Never mind. Still, at least this eventually led to Brian's win at WrestleMania 30, which was the plan the whole time, wasn't it, guys? Number 4. Triple H defeats The Rock for the Intercontinental Championship While Stone Cold Steve Austin may be the obvious answer to who The Rock's greatest career rival was, you could also make the case for a certain cerebral assassin. I mean, he definitely would, that's for sure. Triple H and the Brahma Bull spent most of 2000 trading the world title back and forth and had clashed a few times prior to the turn of the millennium. Arguably, their most famous lower card clash took place at SummerSlam 1998, a match with Rocky's Intercontinental Championship suspended above the ring. Dwayne and Hunter's chemistry together was off the charts, as shown in this fantastic display of in-ring narrative building. 
For over 25 minutes, the two men fought with and without the assistance of the hardware, getting help from their various stablemates along the way. In the end, a shot to the Great Ones Great Ones from China gave the game enough of a window to reach the top of the ladder and claim the workhorse belt for the second time. The action was great, the story was great, we got to see a future Hollywood megastar get smacked in the balls. What is not to love about this excellent ladder match? Number 3. CM Punk Defeats Jeff Hardy for the World Heavyweight Championship Let's stick with ladders for now as we talk about another match that served as the blow-off to a stunning feud. After CM Punk cashed in Money in the Bank on Jeff Hardy at Extreme Rules, the two heavily tattooed rivals faced each other pretty much non-stop until SummerSlam came around. Hardy, who had recaptured the belt since then, wanted to put Punk away once and for all in a match that he was a specialist in, TLC. Actually, come to think of it, has Jeff Hardy actually ever won a TLC match? Edge and Christian won the first couple, and I don't think the charismatic enigma ever got his hand raised at any of the other ones. Oh no, Jeff, what have you done? True to form, Hardy didn't win this match either, but he sure did put on one hell of an entertaining show. These two men hit each other with everything that wasn't fastened down and a few things that were. The most famous spot in this match, of course, is the one where Jeff jumped down from what was essentially the upper stratosphere to hit Punk with one of the wildest swanton bombs of all time. And that, dear viewers, is saying something. Number 2. Brock Lesnar Defeats The Rock for the WWE Championship SummerSlam 2002 is widely considered to be the best iteration of the Big Four staple. With matches like Kurt Angle vs Rey Mysterio, Edge vs Eddie Guerrero, and the in-ring comeback of Shawn Michaels taking on Triple H, it's kinda hard to argue against that. Another tick in this show's plus column is its main event, a torch-passing present-meets-future match for the WWE title. The Rock was the title holder going into the show and was defending against that year's King of the Ring, Brock Lesnar. As you can imagine, the pair of studs put on a great show. Rock used all of his Academy Award-winning acting skills to put over how powerful Lesnar was while still having plenty of veteran counters for the next big thing. After a wild brawl that saw Paul and get put through a table, Brock beat Rock to become the youngest WWE Champion of all time. Unfortunately, he would fail to capitalize on this monumental win and eventually fade into obscurity. Wait a second, no, the opposite. He did the opposite of that. Number 1. The British Bulldog Defeats Bret Hart for the Intercontinental Championship Hey, it comes up all the time in lists about SummerSlam, but only because it's that damn good. SummerSlam 1992, Wembley Stadium in London, England. After realizing that us limeys like wrestling too, WWE held their second biggest show of the year on British shores and gave the country a main event for the ages. In one corner was Intercontinental Champion Bret Hart, one of the finest grapplers to ever grace the earth. In the other was hometown hero the British Bulldog, who was actually born about 200 miles up the road, but who's counting? These brothers-in-law put on one of the greatest in-ring wrestling displays in the history of the company to that point. Hart very much carried his, um, haggard foe to what was easily his greatest match ever until Davy Boy sat on an attempted sunset flip to pin the hitman and capture the gold. Hey, very rarely in wrestling does everything come together perfectly, but this was one of those times. The right wrestlers in the right setting in the right spot on the card, SummerSlam 1992 will always be remembered as the night Davy brought it home for old blighty. God save our gracious bulldog. Wrestling and romance. Now, there's a volatile combination if I ever saw one. Liable to end in heartbreak or, you know, a powerbomb or something, on-screen wrestling romances rarely, if ever, turn out happily ever after. WWE are the worst offenders when it comes to this, of course, but some kayfabe couples don't even get the chance to see their union crumble so spectacularly. Whether they were scrapped after a first kiss or were simply only talked about in creative meetings, these would-be relationships had ice cold water poured on them before they could get lukewarm, never mind red hot. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 cancelled WWE romances. Join us! Number 10 Trinity and Orlando Jordan 
After signing with WWE in early 2006, stuntwoman extraordinaire and former TNA star Trinity was almost thrown right into a fire with a proposed controversial storyline involving Orlando Jordan. The former United States champion was somewhat directionless at this time, having split from JBL, but this new pitch promised to get people talking about him once again, if nothing else. It was said that Trinity would be brought to television as OJ's girlfriend, though there would be a twist. Playing off Jordan's well-known personal proclivities, he would also have a boyfriend at the same time, creating WWE's first bisexual love triangle. It was unknown just who the other male in this equation would be, but things never really got past the planning stages. It was reported in the Wrestling Observer that the boyfriend would be somebody flamboyant and over the top, which is sort of par for the course for the era, sadly. Later reports suggested that Orlando's real-life friend and travelling partner could have filled the role. In any event, the angle was dropped, as was Jordan not long after, while Trinity briefly appeared for the rebooted ECW brand before also being released. Number 9. Nia Jax and Enzo Amore Enzo Amore liked to brag about being a certified G and a bona fide stud, but we sort of had to take his word for it, since it wasn't like he was regularly shown macking on chicks or anything. Well, he might not have done much of any full-on macking, but there were signs that Enzo could get himself a lady friend toward the end of 2017, when the Cruiserweight Champion and Nia Jax started flirting back and forth in backstage segments. According to Amore, their relationship was supposed to continue to blossom, with the realest guy in the room using the irresistible force to help him win matches while he won her heart. It would then transpire that he was simply using Nia, who, lest we forget, is not like most girls, while cheating on her with her best friend, Alexa Bliss. Regrettably, Enzo was fired in murky circumstances while the storyline was starting to take shape, though it likely would have played out as he described when you consider that Nia and Bliss ended up feuding anyway, leading into WrestleMania. As it is, we can only imagine all the humping that Enzo and Naya might have done. Go on, imagine it. You're welcome. Number 8. AJ Lee and Dean Ambrose Primo, Hornswoggle, John Cena, CM Punk, Kane, Dolph Ziggler, Daniel Bryan, former Divas champion AJ Lee managed to lock lips with quite a few of her male colleagues during her relatively short but certainly eventful main roster run. One romance that never made it in front of cameras was AJ's mooted dalliance with Dean Ambrose. According to Lee, this would have happened after her disastrous wedding to Dee Bry at Raw 1000. The original payoff would have seen the bearded wonder commit his ex fiance to a mental institution. While locked up, she would find and fall in love with the lunatic fringe. They would then both show up as a new, unhinged couple, with AJ being even crazier than before. This never got off the ground because AJ herself vehemently objected to it and its portrayal of mental illness. As someone who suffers from bipolar disorder, she could not in good conscience participate in something that would essentially ridicule her condition. Lee would be left off television for a time while writers came up with something for her that was, you know, not totally offensive, while Ambrose had to wait a little longer for his call. Up. It was worth the wait. Number 7. Caitlin and Cody Rhodes Some of the best fiction is inspired by truth. So, when Caitlyn tweeted about her fondness for moustaches, WWE writer Kevin X sensed an opportunity to pen a storyline based around that fact. And who better for the chick buster to cozy up to than Cody Rhodes, who at the time was sporting some damn fine lip hair. According to X, the romance would cause dissension between Cody and his tag partner Damian Sandow before, in a twist, Caitlyn would turn on the dashing one and side with the intellectual saviour of the masses. Because big beards are more powerful than thin moustaches and all that. Another way it could have went would have been for Sandow to get his own gal, leading to a series of mixed tags. At the end of the day, the Caitlyn and Cody romance was nixed by Vince McMahon, who didn't understand why the grandson of a plumber would bother with someone like Caitlyn while the likes of the Bellas were knocking about. Egg tried to explain to his boss that Caitlyn was, you know, very attractive, but his efforts fell on deaf ears. Cody and Caitlyn did share a few segments, but nothing ultimately came of it. Number 6. Ryan Shamrock and Ken Shamrock Ah, oh, two people with the same unique surname finding love. Isn't that nice and unexpected and oh god, they're brother and sister, aren't they? <coughs> 
It was the Attitude Era, you see, so nothing was off limits. Not even inter-family relations. Well, or so WWE thought, because the world's most dangerous man was certainly not on board with this sort of thing, even if it was for the purposes of so-called entertainment. Ken was steadfastly against any storyline that would imply that he was intimate with his kayfabe younger sister, because he had very real children to think about and didn't want them to have to answer any uncomfortable questions on the playground. Incidentally, the UFC star has cited being pitched this particular storyline as one of the reasons he decided to leave the company later in the year. Meanwhile, Alicia Webb, who played Ryan, was more than likely just happy to be along for the ride, since her WWE tenure was initially planned as a one-shot deal. In a tasty little bit of irony, Shamrock and Webb actually dated for a while IRL. Number 5. Katie Lee and Paul Burchill Oh, two people with the same unique surname finding love, and they're both British too. Isn't that nice and unexpected? And oh god, they're brother and sister again, aren't they? <coughs> Almost a decade after the Shamrock affair was shot down and a couple of years removed from Vince McMahon playfully suggesting that his son Shane could be revealed as the father of his daughter Stephanie's firstborn child, it was time to go down this dark and disturbing road once more. After stalling as a British bruiser and then as a Jack Sparrow cosplay artist, Paul Burchill attempted to get his career back on track with the help of his younger sister, Katie Lee. When they were first introduced as a duo on Raw, Paul and Katie made reference to how much they liked to, um, make each other happy, with the Ripper vowing to ensure that whatever Katie wants, Katie gets, while she fondled his abs. Vomit, meat mouth. Fortunately, this angle was dropped after just a couple of weeks, and they went to being strictly siblings after. You know, people tend to complain about WWE going PG in 2008, but if nothing else... Number 4. Sable and The Undertaker as if it wasn't painfully obvious from watching WWE's Attitude Era product at the time, lead writer Vince Russo was absolutely besotted with Sable. He's admitted as much in the years since, noting that he was always trying to figure out ways to get her involved in storylines. One of his grand ideas in 1997 was to have her leave Mark Merrow and shack up with The Undertaker. It was felt at the time that the dead man's character could perhaps use some freshening up, with suggestions that his persona become more pronounced announcedly evil moving forward. With his gothic bride by his side, the two would, in theory, lord over WWE as the promotion's demonic power couple. Would, except Mark Calloway's real-life wife Sarah wasn't thrilled with the prospect of her hubby rubbing shoulders and god knows what else on camera with a sultry sex pot like Rena Mero. You know, I feel like there's an easy solution here. Like, why didn't the phenom just, say, get his wife's name tattooed on his throat? That way, he would never forget get who was waiting for him at home, and he could always get it painfully lasered off in the unlikely event of divorce. Number 3. Crystal Marshall and Edge That Edge gets about, doesn't he? Lita, Vicky Guerrero, Beth Phoenix, lock up your daughters everyone, the rated R superstar is on the prowl. All three of those couplings had good things going for them and were memorable in their own way, but one member of the SmackDown roster in 2007 evidently didn't see the fuss about being paired with the ultimate opportunist. Crystal Marshall was penciled in for a run by the side of Edge, but turned it down because she wasn't comfortable with the more sexual side of things. The Canadian Lothario was a tonsil hockey veteran by this point. Part of this was because she was in a relationship with Bobby Lashley, who was a member of the Raw roster, though injured at the time. Aghast that Crystal would veto the idea of being the new leader and feeling that she was being ungrateful by saying no to a golden opportunity, WWE opted to cut her entirely. Edge instead began his nefarious relationship with Vicky and never looked back, unless it was to check out some other woman he wanted to do the no pants dance with. Number 2. Angelina Love and Matt Hardy Angelina Love went on to have a very successful career elsewhere, particularly as a member of the Beautiful People in TNA, but her sports entertainment dream almost ended when she was released from her WWE developmental contract in May of 2007. Prior to that, her best chance of a promotion to the main roster appeared to be as Matt Hardy's on-screen girlfriend. Love, who was then known as Angel Williams, was due to portray a planted fan in the audience who would get noticed by North Carolina's finest, with all due respect to Zach Gallagher, 
Galifianakis before eventually becoming the Elder Hardy's main squeeze. Angelina was raring to go when her segment was cut right as she was on her way to take her seat. Love was later told that Vince McMahon had hastily rewritten the whole show before the taping and that her big moment was one of the things that didn't make the grade. John Laurinaitis subsequently assured Love that her segment would be on next week's show, but, well, a promise from Johnny Ace is about as useful as chopsticks for soup, so, well, you know how that goes. Number 1. Trish Stratus and The Rock the top male star in WWE and the top female star in WWE swapping spit on screen would be big news at any time, but during the Attitude Era when those two stars were the Rock and Trish Stratus, good lord. The two were brought together by their mutual desire to take down the tyrannical Mr. McMahon and shared a backstage smooch before teaming up to take on the genetic jackhammer and Kurt Angle on the December 3rd, 2001 episode of Raw. Trish wanted to thank Rock for saving her from joining McMahon's special club on the previous episode of SmackDown and gave him a peck on the cheek. The Great One told her she was welcome by giving her a big taste of the most electrifying mouth in sports entertainment. Their alliance would continue on the next episode of SmackDown when they conspired along with Jim Ross and Rikishi to humiliate their boss and put a temporary end to his special club. They had one more awkward interaction at Vengeance days later where Big Dwayne insinuated that he would lay something down on Trisha's candy ass later that night before the whole thing was just forgotten about. According to Bruce Pritchard, Vince was wary of putting his top babyface in a romance angle out of fear that the fans would turn on him. Fans turning on The Rock? That'd never happen. Fighting for a championship in WWE is a great honor. Fighting at WrestleMania is a great honor. Combine the two and you get something so honorable it would make a Knight of the Crusade weep with happiness. Not everything is about the shiny belts though, as the show of shows has given us some great matches with nothing on the line except pride. Okay, so that's not strictly speaking true. Some of these matches did have stakes involved, but they weren't championships, so get off our backs and enjoy the countdown, alright? I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 greatest non-title matches in WrestleMania history. Join us! Number 10. Bray Wyatt vs John Cena at WrestleMania 36 Night 2 We might be getting off to a controversial start with this one, as some would say that the Firefly Funhouse match wasn't actually a match at all. But hey, if WWE can count it, then so can we. Also, it was absolutely spectacular. Six years after John Cena halted Bray Wyatt's momentum by beating him at WrestleMania 30, the two men squared off again in front of… well, nobody. This was, of course, right at the start of the pandemic, aka the really bad times. WWE made the best out of this crappy situation by giving Bray the creative keys to this match. He was able to construct a trippy, psychedelic tour through Cena's past, which included highlighting some of the more questionable things the character had ever done. He took shots at Cena's perceived crushing of up-and-coming talent, his backstage privilege, and his supposed part in driving away so many people from wrestling. This was WWE's equivalent of an art house film, a complex character study on one of the most controversial figures in the company's history. Was it a wrestling match in the traditional sense? Not at all. Was it a divisive stroke of genius? I think so. Number 9. Shane McMahon vs Vince McMahon at WrestleMania X7 Stick with me here, we will get to some proper matches with proper wrestlers in them soon, I promise. Despite not being actual wrestlers, and despite Vince being in his mid-50s at the time, this father-son clash from WrestleMania X7 is an all-time classic. Mr McMahon was making his family's life a living hell in 2001. He had drugged his wife, taken on Trish Stratus as his mistress, and put his poor daughter Stephanie through several lifetimes of abuse in the space of a few months. Stepping up to take his dad to task and put his tyranny to an end was new WCW owner Shane McMahon, who challenged his father to a street fight at WrestleMania. With more smoke and mirrors than a glass factory on fire, the McMahon boys put on a soap opera spectacle for the ages. Interference, betrayals, trash cans, this match had it all. In the end, Shane got revenge for his family by beating his old man to a thunderous ovation. This match is the absolute pin of the sports entertainment philosophy, and everybody loved it. Don't believe me? Just listen to that road warrior pop when Linda gets out of her chair. Number 8. The Money in the Bank Ladder Match at WrestleMania 21 Alright, you can all come out now, we've got some actual wrestling for you. Killjoys. For five years, the Money in the Bank Ladder Match had its home at WrestleMania. From 
2005 to 2010, anywhere between 6 and 10 wrestlers battled it out to retrieve a briefcase that would guarantee them a world championship match at any point within a year. Whilst all these matches are special in their own way, we had to give this spot on the list to the one that started it all. Chris Jericho, Chris Benoit, Christian, Kane, Edge and Shelton Benjamin were the guinea pigs for this experiment, and they all played their parts to a T. The match more than lived up to its hype, delivering on all of its potential for action and drama. Suplexes off ladders, choke slams off ladders, Shelton Benjamin breaking physics to run up a ladder and clothesline Jericho. These are just some of the memorable spots that made this human car wreck so much fun to witness. Edge would be the first man to grab the famous briefcase, but all six of the competitors made history on this night. A tremendous start for what is now one of WWE's signature matches. Number 7, The Ultimate Warrior vs Randy Savage at WrestleMania 7. At WrestleMania 3, Randy Savage and Ricky Steamboat put on one of the greatest WrestleMania matches of all time for the Intercontinental title. At WrestleMania 6, The Ultimate Warrior's battle with Hulk Hogan became one of the most iconic main events in the show's history. Put these two together and what do you get? Well, lots of performance enhancing drugs and crazed shouting, but also another match for the ages. This all started when the Macho King cost Warrior his WWE title at the Royal Rumble. The two megastars would face off at Mania 7 with each man's career on the line. After a dramatic back and forth that included Warrior kicking out of five consecutive flying elbows, the ultimate one put Macho down and forced him to retire. The drama only ramped up when Queen Sherry attacked her former charge, only for Miss Elizabeth to rush to the ring and save her estranged husband from a kicking. In that moment, we we were all that one fan wearing the hat and glasses. You know the one. A great mix of in-ring performance and storyline emotion, this match is so good that it doesn't even matter that Savage's retirement only lasted a couple of months. Number 6, Shawn Michaels vs Ric Flair at WrestleMania 24. Speaking of not staying retired, in late 2007, Vince McMahon announced that the next singles match Ric Flair lost would be his last. The Nature Boy rode his luck all the way to WrestleMania 24, where he shared the ring with Shawn Michaels. HBK and Slick Rick put on a masterclass in audience manipulation. Everyone knew that this would be Flair's swan song as there was no way he could conceivably beat Michaels. But in the magical way that only wrestling can provide, these two made you believe. Every near fall was a heart stopper, every comeback a bolt of electricity, and that iconic shot of Michaels mouthing, I'm sorry, I love you, before putting Flair away is enough to send shivers down your spine. Despite Despite being nearly 60, Flair put in an all-time great performance in this match. He even hit something off the top rope for goodness sake, he never did that. Sure there are better worked bouts out there, but in terms of a special feeling surrounding a match, there aren't many that can touch this one. And you know what, if we forgave Savage for breaking his retirement, I suppose we have to forgive Rick too. Number 5, The Rock vs Hulk Hogan at WrestleMania 18. Neither The Rock nor Hulk Hogan were ever regarded as the best technical wrestler wrestlers on the planet, but what they were great at was holding a crowd in the palm of their hand. And on this night in Toronto, that is exactly what they did. After the Hulkster made his triumphant WWE return as part of the NWO, fans were chomping at the bit to see a dream match between him and Stone Cold Steve Austin. That never happened, but this was as good, if not a little better. Despite being a dastardly heel, the fans refused to boo the returning Hogan. They booed the Rock instead. The Rock, that's like booing a very charismatic puppy. This unique dynamic led to some of the most insane crowd noises in wrestling history. Everything these two men did garnered a seismic reaction from the fans as the Mania 18 crowd ramped up towards fever pitch. This match was so bloody good that Hogan was forced to turn babyface on the spot, fighting off Hall and Nash to stand tall with The Rock. Of course, this did inadvertently lead to him winning the WWE Championship a month later, but we weren't to know that at the time. Number 4, Owen Hart vs Bret Hart at WrestleMania 10. After two matches that were all about emotion, let's get stuck into some good old fashioned wrestling, shall we? The 10th edition of the Showcase of the Immortals featured two scheduled WWE Championship matches. Yokozuna retained over Lex Luger before falling to Bret Hart in the main event to crown the Hitman champion once again. However, it's not like Hart was going into this match fresh as he had opened the show in an absolute 
absolute barn burner against his younger brother, Owen. After coming to blows at Survivor Series, the two siblings looked to be on the same page until Owen did the unthinkable and kicked Brett's leg out of his leg at the Royal Rumble. At Mania, these two masters of their craft put on a technical showcase like no other. To just list all the spots would do this match a serious disservice, but just look at the people involved. Let's just say it wasn't all tests of strength and back rakes. The younger heart actually pinned his more accomplished brother to not only score an upset victory, but also to set up a scintillating stare down at the end of the night as Brett celebrated with the gold. Actually, maybe there was some emotion here after all. Number three, Kurt Angle versus Shawn Michaels at WrestleMania 21. When it comes to the perfect mixture of in-ring ability, promo skills, and physical storytelling, there aren't many wrestlers that can match up to Kurt Angle and Shawn Michaels. One was a traditional grappler with Olympic experience, whilst the other was a flashy showman who some thought favored style over substance. All this helped make their clash at WrestleMania 21 one of the most intriguing and greatest Mania matches of all time. Angle kept trying to beat Michaels with his technical mastery, but Sean did what he did best and frustrated him. He kept finding new ways to get out of Angle's moves, throwing in his own amateur wrestling to annoy the Olympic gold medalist even more. Word of advice, Sean, don't piss off a man who could snap your foot clean off if he wanted to. The wrestling machine finally put the showstopper down with a vicious ankle lock after almost half an hour of wrestling heaven. These two men could pull magic out of thin air, so it's no surprise that they excelled when put together. Also, this feud gave us Sexy Kurt, which is enough to get it on this list on its own. Number two, Bret Hart versus Stone Cold Steve Austin at WrestleMania 13. The build-up to WrestleMania 13 was all over the place. First, Shawn Michaels was champion, then Bret Hart, then Sid. Austin won the Royal Rumble, but because he cheated, The Undertaker took his place in the main event. Thankfully, out of all this carnage came the grudge match to end all grudge matches. Hart went into this match as the embodiment of the company's past, clean cut, respectful, and humble. As for Austin, he was the total antithesis of those things and a sign of things to come in wrestling's future. To settle their differences, these two titans met in an I Quit match officiated by Ken Shamrock and his tiny little shorts. After some of the most intense fighting WWE fans had ever seen, the match ended with one of the all-time great closing spots. A bloodied Austin was locked deep into Bret's sharpshooter as the Canadian demanded that the Texan give up. Defiant as always, Austin chose to pass out from the pain, cementing himself as a megastar in the process. A great wrestling match is one thing, but one that changes the entire course of the industry? That is something special. Number 1. The Undertaker vs Shawn Michaels at WrestleMania 25 and 26 Alright, we couldn't pick between the two, but you know what? We shouldn't have to. When The Undertaker and Shawn Michaels met at WrestleMania 25, they put on what many still consider to be the single greatest match in the show's history, non-title or otherwise. Even after half an hour of breathtaking spots and masterful storytelling, the tale was not over though. One year later, after months of obsessively trying to get Taker to agree to a rematch, HBK battled and lost to the dead man, ending his career in the process. These matches are like takeaway pizza and shoddy garlic dip. You cannot have one without the other. There's so much context that you need to have seen both in order to fully understand them. In actual fact, there's about a dozen other matches and moments that you need to see to get the full story. Classic moments, a legendary storyline, and an intangible feeling of greatness sitting across them. There was just no separating the two Taker Michaels Mania matches, so they're both our number one. When a championship is won in a sport or an award is given in some avenue of entertainment, you usually expect the result to stick. In the sports entertainment world of WWE, however, a title change is never a sure thing since whether it be to advance storylines, test a reaction, or just to get people talking, WWE can always find a way to reverse, cancel, or otherwise ignore them. So pause those celebrations, bring up the instant replay, and get out the big book of dusty finishes because my name is Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling and these are 10 reversed WWE title changes. Join us. Number 10, Daniel Bryan and the WWE World Heavyweight Title. 
We all remember Daniel Bryan's meteoric rise to his WWE title triumph in the main event of WrestleMania 30 in 2014. The Yes Movement had made D. Bry the most popular performer in the company in the run-up to his big win at the Showcase of the Immortals, with fans passionately spurring on the seemingly overlooked star. What tends to be forgotten about is the American Dragon's previous World Heavyweight title run, which began in late 2011. Bryan was a reigning Money in the Bank contract holder, having won SmackDown's version of the eponymous ladder match. He attempted to cash in during his feud with Mark Henry, though the first couple of attempts proved fruitless. The world's strongest man attacked the bearded wonder before the match could even start the first time, while the second time it seemed as though Bryan had done it after Big Show had knocked Henry out for him on the November 25th episode of SmackDown. But hold on a minute, player, because here comes SmackDown general manager Teddy Long to let us all know that Henry wasn't medically cleared to compete and voided the switch. Brian would only manage to pull it off almost a month later at TLC. Number 9. William Regal and Eugene and the WWE World Tag Team Titles William Regal's 2004 homecoming was set up perfectly, with the battling Brit and his friend Eugene challenging World Tag Team Champions La Resistance on the October 11th episode of Raw, which emanated from Manchester, England. Regal was on the comeback trail following more than a year off, during which he almost died due to health complications caused by a heart parasite he had contracted during a WWE tour of India. He and his odd couple partner were firm favourites, and the crowd went absolutely bonkers when Regal pinned Sylvain Grenier for the feel-good win. Feel good, do you? Well, wouldn't it be a shame if Raw General Manager Eric Bischoff came out and ruined that feeling, eh? That's right, amid a sea of celebrations, that son of a bish came out and restarted the match because Sir William had used the power of the punch to secure the three counts. The champs then went on to retain in predictable fashion. Considering Regal and Eugene would randomly win the titles about a month later, there's really no reason they couldn't have just sped up the process here. Especially considering WWE had already pulled a similar trick earlier in the year when Bischoff's understudy Johnny Nitro pulled the rug out from Chris Benoit and Shawn Michaels after HBK pinned the illegal man. Number 8. Chris Benoit and the WWE Title Speaking of Benoit, he was thrust into a pay-per-view headline feud with WWE Champion The Rock not too long after he and the rest of the Radicals jumped from the sinking ship that was WCW. The Crippler was presented as a threat heading into their showdown at Fully Loaded 2000, but few felt that he would upset the Great One and bag the belt, even though he was being helped in his pursuit by temporary manager Shane McMahon. Incredibly, it appeared that the Rabbit Wolverine had won the title on the night, thanks to a tech technicality. It initially looked as though referee Earl Hebner awoke from one of his many naps and called for the bell, with everyone assuming that Benoit had submitted to his very own crossface. However, the official shockingly awarded the bout to the challenger because he believed that the rock had attacked him from behind with a chair earlier, when really it was Shane. As the Brahma Bull could lose the title via disqualification due to the pre-match stipulations, this made the Canadian the new champ. For about 90 seconds, that is, until Commissioner Foley sauntered out, reversed the decision, and restarted the match. WWE booked a similar scenario for Benoit in the main event of Unforgiven two months later. Number 7. The Fabulous Rougeos and the WWE Tag Team Titles before pay-per-view buy rates and television rights fees became the biggest economic drivers of WWE's business, the big money was made at house shows. Why else do you think WWE stars in the 80s worked 400 days a year, working three times a day, and were sometimes on the road for months at a time without a single day off? In all seriousness, the non-televised events were incredibly important, and WWE treated them as such, occasionally running major angles and even booking title changes to take place on them. Like at the Montreal Forum on August 10th, 1987, when the fabulous Rougeos took on WWE Tag Team Champions, the Hart Foundation. Foundation manager Jimmy Hart attempted to interfere on their behalf at the end, only to be disposed of his megaphone, which was then used on Brett for the ostensible title change. The Rougeos were announced as the new champions and celebrated appropriately, but the decision was hastily reversed and the match switch is not recognized by WWE. 
The pink and black attack went back to defending the straps the very next night, while Brett vowed to never be screwed out of a title in Montreal again. Number 6. Owen Hart and the WWE Title when you look at the best wrestlers to have never won the WWE title, it is fair to say that Owen Hart would be at the top of most fans' lists. I mean, I would personally have to put him just below Mojo Rawley on mine, but he's certainly up there. The Rocket was only ever in serious contention for the title when feuding with Big Brother Brett in 1994, though he was unable to unseat the Hitman during their high-profile series. He came close on one occasion, however, when he beat Brett in a lumberjack match during a a mammoth superstars TV taping. Taking place weeks before their classic cage match at SummerSlam, the younger Hart pinned his older sibling following interference from Jim Neidhart. The referee called for the bell and the heel contingent came to the ring and raised Owen on their shoulders, mimicking the Hitman's own title-winning celebration from WrestleMania 10. However, once a second referee pointed out the interference, complete with a replay on the video wall, the match was restarted and the excellence of execution returned. Retained. If you want to check it out, the match was later released on the Wham Bam Body Slam VHS. Number 5. Rob Van Dam and the WWE Undisputed Title for a minute there, it seemed like Rob Van Dam would become a bona fide member of the WWE Main Eventers Club. The whole flipping show came to WWE in 2001 as part of the Invasion Angle and was one of the very few success stories from that muddled mess. He locked horns with major players like The Rock, Steve Austin and Kurt Angle and challenged for the WWE title toward the tail end of the year as his popularity skyrocketed. WWE refrained from pulling the trigger and called off on RVD's push in early 2002, though he remained a fan favourite and got a crack at The Undertaker's undisputed title in the main event of the May 20th episode of Raw. Big Evil had only had the title for 24 hours after defeating Hulk Hogan with the worst chokeslam ever at Judgment Day the night before. Van Damme was a tad sprightlier than Terrible Terry and really took it to the champ with his signature offence. And that included a Rolling Thunder, which won the match? Wait, what? Obviously not, because as anyone could see, Taker got his foot on the ropes on the count of two. Ric Flair then restarted the match, and the dead man retained with a last ride to restore the natural order of things. Number 4. Dean Ambrose and the WWE Title it was heartening to see the new blood in the WWE main event of Elimination Chamber 2015 as former Shield teammates Seth Rollins and Dean Ambrose clashed over the Architects WWE title. Rollins was in the process of establishing himself as the main man after cashing in his Money in the Bank contract during the epic climax of WrestleMania 31 while the lunatic fringe was striking a chord in his quest to simultaneously bag the gold and make life miserable for the authority. Their match was chugging along nicely and it looked like it could go either way as they traded big moves for 20 entertaining minutes. After neutralizing Kane and J&J &J security at ringside, Dean attempted to hit Seth with his top rope standing elbow drop only for the champ to pull the referee in harm's way. The official was clattered, but Ambrose avoided a phoenix splash and nailed dirty deeds with a second referee coming in and counting the three to a huge ovation. The euphoria was short-lived mind as the original referee called for a DQ win instead. An indignant Ambrose then stole the title belt, to which you simply have to say, fair play. Number 3. Greg Valentine and the WWE Title was there any WWE star surlier than Greg Valentine? Short and stocky with a face cut from granite, the hammer is, quite frankly, the sort of bloke who's not afraid to eat a packet of crisps while having a poo. In his day, Valentine was typically in the championship mix and held both the WWE tag team and intercontinental titles. He never held the WWE title, but in a fleeting moment of confusion, it appeared that he had done it in one of the strangest ways possible. Valentine was throwing down with then-champion Bob Backlund on the October 19th, 1981 Madison Square Garden house show when he took Backlund for a ride with the airplane spin. Bob's legs hit the official, knocking him down, before Backlund then fell on top of Valentine with the groggy ref counting the pin. The hammer then jumped up and began celebrating as if he had made the cover and the ref, still shaking those cobwebs loose, went along with it and awarded him the title. It was promptly taken away from him after a post-match inquisition and a rematch match was booked for WWE's next visit to the world's most famous arena, which Backland won. 
Number two, Chris Jericho and the WWE title. Chris Jericho had a bit of trouble during his first year in WWE, starting with the bizarre co-intercontinental champion storyline with China. Y2J and the ninth wonder of the world consecutively held and defended the title after one of their IC title matches ended in a double pin, though WWE themselves consider the title vacant for the period between that and Jericho winning it outright at the 2000 Royal Rumble. Four months later, Jericho's habit of mocking Stephanie McMahon saw him thrust into a WWE title title match with Triple H on the April 17th edition of Raw. Jericho had coaxed the game into putting the title up for grabs and enlisted the APA to stand ringside and watch and prevent any chicanery. He almost got an almighty assist from referee Earl Hebner, who delivered a blatant fast count following a lion's salt in retaliation for being pushed to the ground by Hunter. The pop for the Ayatollah of Rock and Roller's triumph was huge, but Jericho was forced to return the belt after the cerebral assassin threatened Hebner into reversing his decision. Number 1. John Cena and the WWE Title it's hard to feel too bad for John Cena having a world title win reversed, isn't it? I mean, the man's had, what is it, like 16 of them at this point? Let someone else have a go, big selfish John. CM Punk was certainly having a go of it in 2012. The Straight Edge Superstar was in the midst of the longest WWE title reign of the modern era when he put the strap on the line against his perennial rival at Night of Champions. It's John Cena and CM Punk in a pay-per-view main event, so you knew that the quality of the action was going to be of the highest standard. Like most of their meetings, there was also a genuine sense that either man could win, something heightened by Cena's money in the bank cash-in failure, the fact that Punk had held the title for so long, and the show was taking place in Boston Mass, baby! After umpteen kickouts and close calls, it came down to Cena delivering a rare top-rope German suplex for the apparent win. Not so fast, Jorts boy, because your big beefy shoulders were also down and the referee rendered the match a draw. It wasn't much of an ending, but it was an ending, and sometimes that's enough. There are many reasons why a pro wrestling dream match won't end up happening. Disagreements over money, wrestlers never working in the same place at the same time, bookers not considering Mojo Rawley a dream opponent, etc. Often though, it simply boils down to the egos of the participants. It could be an old grudge standing in the way of doing business, one part Party refusing to lose to the other, or something else entirely, but there have been some mouth-watering clashes right there for the making before politics came into play. I'm Adam Pachisi from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 wrestling dream matches that didn't happen due to ego. Join us! Number 10, Shawn Michaels vs. Hulk Hogan Part 2 Alright, so Shawn Michaels vs. Hulk Hogan did happen at SummerSlam 2005 in a match that is infamous for the Heartbreak Kid's outlandish overselling. The reason why Michaels was flipping and flopping for all of the Hulkster's offense, however, is because he was miffed that Terrible Terry had nixed a planned rematch where Shawn would go over at the following month's Unforgiven. There would then supposedly be a decider, with Hulk coming out on top to win the series 2-1. The mooted sequel was scheduled to take place inside a steel cage, but Hogan pulled the classic that doesn't work for me brother card and ensured that his dalliance with the showstopper was a one and done deal. The red and yellow monster likely wasn't too thrilled with the idea of doing the favours for Michaels, even if he would ultimately get another win back himself, but his opinion of his opponent degenerated during their feud as Michaels continually mocked Hogan on TV. The tipping point came on Raw the night after SummerSlam, when HBK cut a sarcastic promo touting Hogan's agility and in-ring prowess, convincing Hulk that their feud was well and truly over. Number 9. Sting vs. The Undertaker It would have been great in 1995. Hell, it still would have been pretty damn good in 2005. And in 2015, well, it would have been quite the spectacle now, wouldn't it? When Sting, the last holdout from WCW, finally made his WWE debut at Survivor Series 2014, many fans instantly began booking the icon against the dead man. It was the natural match to make for a variety of reasons, 
happens, but it never ended up happening. Instead, Sting faced off against Triple H at WrestleMania 31, while Taker returned from Lesnar-induced hibernation and further derailed Bray Wyatt's momentum. By the time WrestleMania 32 came around a year later, Steve Borden was retired and being inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame, and the Phenom was scrapping with Shane McMahon inside Hell in a Cell. The window had passed, but why wasn't the bout booked a year prior, especially when Sting was so keen for it? Well, according to some cryptic comments made by Mark Calloway, the backstage belief was that the match looked better on paper, with Sting adding that Vince wanted one last WCW vs WWE themed bout, hence him inexplicably doing the job to the cerebral assassin. Number 8. Steve Austin vs Brock Lesnar By the time the June 10th, 2002 episode of Raw rolled around, Steve Austin was physically and mentally burned out. His body was breaking down and he was creatively disillusioned, not only with the direction of his own character, but the company in general. Being asked to put over newcomer Brock Lesnar in a random King of the Ring qualifying match without any build whatsoever was the last straw. Stone Cold famously took his ball and went home, scuppering a tasty clash between him and the next big thing in the process. Thing is, the Texas Rattlesnake really had every right to veto the match and the result, considering his status compared to Lesnar's at the time. Austin did say he would be happy to do business with Brock down the line, if it was built up properly and, you know, happened on a major pay-per-view and not some random episode of Raw. Injuries prevented that from ever happening, but Austin was reportedly offered a match with the Beast Incarnate at WrestleMania 39, turning it down after he and WWE failed to come to terms on a suitable agreement. Number 7. Chris Jericho vs Goldberg They got there in the end, but for a long time it felt like Chris Jericho and Goldberg would never have a match with one another. Not through any lack of effort on Jericho's part, of course, because he was bound and determined to get Big Bill in the ring when the two worked for WCW in 1990. The Canadian mocked and taunted Demand for weeks, making fun of his persona and entrance. He even beat a fake Goldberg at the Fall Brawl pay-per-view, seemingly sowing the seeds for a scrap with the real deal further down the line. Nope. According to Jericho, Goldberg had zero desire to work with him in any form or fashion, believing that comedy storylines were beneath him and that he should really only have been working with main event level talent. Jericho, for his part, didn't want to have a competitive match with the World Heavyweight Champion and was happy just to be squashed, so long as it went down on pay-per-view. In the end, Goldberg agreed to spear Y2J in the entranceway, thus ending their feud. It was this display of egotism that convinced Jericho to see out his WCW contract and try his luck in WWE. Number 6. Antonio Inoki vs Akira Maeda The bad boy of 1980s Japanese wrestling, Akira Maeda was no stranger to controversy. Whether it was that bizarre match with a drunk Andre the Giant where neither man had an interest in cooperating, or the time he broke Ricky Choshu's face with a shoot kick, Maeda had a reputation for doing his own thing. And that extended to working, or rather not wanting to work with, New Japan pro wrestling founder, booker and top star Antonio Inoki. The two men met many times in tag bouts, but only in one singles match in 1983, which Inoki won. Despite there being big money to be made with a full-on program between the two, it didn't come to pass due to Maeda's unwillingness to work with the chin star. Akira and Inoki had some major heat backstage, and Maeda used his clout as a top star to pass on a series of matches. The big sticking point was, predictably, Inoki's refusal to put over his understudy. This wound Maeda up to no end, leading to the unprofessional behavior that caused him to leave New Japan and start a rival promotion. Number 5. The Elite vs CM Punk Look, we should have all known when CM Punk decided to return to wrestling for AEW that it would all end in biting, shoot chair shots, suspensions and firings, right? The Straight Edge superstars backstage beefs with the likes of Hangman Page, The Young Bucks and Kenny Omega have regrettably cost us what would have been some seriously good pro wrestling matches. Regardless of who was right or wrong, and let's be honest, 
as the whole saga feels like one big subjective grey area, it is a shame that these so-called professionals can't find a way to move past it for the sake of business. Because Punk vs Omega, or Punk and a Partner vs The Young Bucks, or Punk and FTR vs The Elite would surely lead to an uptick in AEW interest resulting in higher ratings, bigger live gates, and more pay-per-view buys. However, at the time of recording at least, all evidence indicates that if CM Punk does return to the company, then he is unlikely to face the Elite and may even be on an entirely separate brand. Number 4. The Rock vs Shawn Michaels Back in the day, Shawn Michaels was a real piece of work. As arrogant and hard to manage as he was talented, Michaels made many enemies in the first half of his career. And that included a young Dwayne Johnson, who, rumour has it, has harboured a grudge against the Heartbreak Kid ever since he witnessed Michaels being disrespectful to his grandmother when Michaels wrestled for his family's promotion way back when. Relations didn't improve when Shawn was top dog in WWE in the mid to late 90s and Rocky Maivia was a young blue chipper looking to find a foothold. Michaels, along with close friend and confidant Triple H, were, shall we say, less than welcoming to the third generation star? Many years later, when the boy toy had returned from his four-year injury layoff and The Rock was the most electrifying man in all of entertainment, DJ put the kibosh on a match with HBK. WWE would have liked to have booked it, but the people's champion wasn't about to do business with somebody he really didn't like on a personal level. The two eventually mended fences and Michaels now helps train Johnson's daughter in NXT. Number 3. Bret Hart vs Hulk Hogan The ending of WrestleMania 9 was famously one of the most infuriating ever, particularly for Bret Hart. The hitman dropped the WWE title to Yokozuna, who then immediately lost it to Hulk Hogan in an impromptu farce of a match. Bret was relatively okay with it at the time, since he had been promised that the Hulkster would pass the torch to him properly at SummerSlam. Oh Bret, poor sweet naive handsome Bret. Months before their proposed match, Hogan had one of his customary changes of heart, no pun intended, and decided that he would rather drop the title back to Yokozuna at King of the Ring, thanks to an exploding camera, rather than lose clean to the excellence of execution. Hart was, naturally, a bit irked about having his main event WWE title torch passing moment taken away from him and has used the situation to routinely knock Hulk over the years. The only time they did meet in a televised one-on-one -on -one match was over five years later on a random episode of Nitro, with Brett winning by DQ and no follow-up, because WCW. Number 2. Brock Lesnar vs Kevin Owens Deep down, he may be a simple country farm boy from Webster, South Dakota, but Brock Lesnar is no fool when it comes to the pro wrestling business. The Beast has negotiated some of the most lucrative contracts in history, while essentially being able to pick and choose when he wants to work. He can also, apparently, choose who he wants to work with. And according to Scuttlebutt, aka Road Dog, on that podcast of his, Kevin Owens is is not one of those people. It wasn't specified exactly when Lesnar rejected the chance to work with the prize fighter, but it was likely during KO's run as Universal Champ. Brock and Kevin did have one non-televised outing at a Madison Square Garden house show on March 12, 2017, which took place between Owens dropping the Universal title and Lesnar challenging Goldberg for it at WrestleMania 33. You will be surprised to hear that Brock ate him up within two minutes and pinned him following an F5. If Lesnar was motivated and these two were given a decent chunk of time, the results could be spectacular. Come on, Brock. Number 1. Steve Austin vs Hulk Hogan WWE really only had one shot to book the dream match to end all dream matches at WrestleMania 19, and they blew it. Not really, of course, because trying to get Steve Austin and Hulk Hogan to square off in a singles match was a political minefield that nobody knew how to successfully navigate. Pretty much all of the resistance came from the bionic redneck, as Austin didn't feel as though their styles would mesh well in the ring. Hulk was older and way less mobile than he had been in years prior, while Austin's injuries were beginning to catch up with him, leading Stone Cold to predict the match would be awkward and disappointing to fans. 
Also, you know, there was that little detail about who would lay down for the other one. It's very unlikely that Austin would have wanted to do a job for Hogan, and likely vice versa, although this has never been outright proven. Bottom line is, Austin was pitched the match on several occasions and stomped a mud hole in the idea every time. Seeing how Hogan ended up completely stealing his Mania Dream match with The Rock, he's probably glad that he did. Is there ever a good time to get injured? Well, maybe if you're just about to visit your hated in-laws and you slip over on the way to the car, breaking your butt bone and rendering yourself unable to travel. But other than that, boo-boos are something that you generally want to avoid. This goes double for professional wrestlers. Getting hurt means taking time off, which means making less money, getting less exposure, and running the risk of picking up some ring rust. Also, if you're a champion, it means you may have to give up your shiny belt. Plenty of promising championships reigns have been derailed due to title holders getting banged up. These 10 title holders all got hurt at the worst possible time, denying them and their fans what could have been a career-defining run. I'm Adam Pachisi from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 worst timed injuries to wrestling champions. Join us! Number 10. Dolph Ziggler as World Heavyweight Champion Before WWE flushed most of its potential down the toilet, Money in the Bank used to be one of the highlights of the year. Few men have made good on their time with the briefcase quite like Dolph Ziggler, who cashed it in in spectacular fashion on the Raw after WrestleMania 29. Fans were eager to see what the show-off could do now that he was on top. As it turns out, what he could do was get a whopper of a concussion and lose the championship in his first defense. Ziggler was supposed to defend the title in a three-way ladder match at Extreme Rules, but got hurt at a SmackDown taping and was pulled from the bout. Then he defended the championship against Alberto Del Rio at Payback, playing up to his real-life injury in the match. The concussion meant that Dolph was off TV for most of his 67 days with the belt, which severely dampened what could have been an excellent reign. So much much for here to show the world. Number 9. Rob Van Dam as ECW TV Champion This may come as a surprise to some, considering how strongly he's associated with the promotion, but Rob Van Dam never won the original ECW World Championship. His most famous championship venture in the land of the extreme was with their television title, which he held for 700 days between 1998 and 2000. Whilst his reign with the gold was epic, the way he lost it was not. RVD was getting prepped for a huge champion versus champion match in early 2000. He was due to face off against world champion Mike Awesome on a show that would hopefully draw the money and interest that the company so desperately needed. Sadly though, fate intervened and Van Damme broke his ankle defending the belt against Rhino. The title was vacated and the whole flipping show's mammoth reign went out with a whimper. Would ECW still be around today if the Awesome vs RVD match had gone ahead? Probably not, considering how the former stabbed the company in the back and joined WCW. Still, if it hadn't been for Rob's ankle, we would know for sure. It's the only time in his life he's ever been let down by a joint. Number 8. John Cena as WWE Champion Fans had already begun to sour on the Doctor of Thugonomics during his third WWE Championship reign. He was gradually losing more and more of what made him so cool in the first place, morphing into a bland template that WWE could project their corporate dreams onto. Still, nobody wanted his longest ever stint with the title to end in such a sad way. Actually, some people probably did. Wrestling fans were brutal in the mid-2000s. During a relatively routine match, against Mr. Kennedy, Kennedy on Raw, John Cena tore his pectoral muscle after executing a simple hip toss. Considering that Cena only did about seven different moves at this point, you would have think he would have known how to do them all safely. The injury took place six days away from No Mercy, where he was scheduled to face Randy Orton. As a result, Orton was simply gifted the championship at the beginning of the show. And then he lost it to Triple H in an impromptu match, who then defended it against Umaga in another impromptu match, who then lost it back to Wharton in the night's main event? All this madness because one man's boob unexpectedly exploded. Number 7. Batista as World Heavyweight Champion In terms of first world title wins, Batista couldn't have asked for much better. A clean win over Triple H in the main event of WrestleMania 21 off the back of a molten hot evolution breakup storyline. That is a dream come true. However, the way he lost the belt was a total nightmare. The animal held on to the title for a record set 
getting 282 days before he tore his triceps in a match against Mark Henry in early 2006. The top champion was down. No biggie. It's not like the biggest show of 2006 was just a few months away. Oh dear. Original plans for Batista to face Royal Rumble winner Randy Orton at Mania 22 were scrapped and Kurt Angle was quickly shunted across to SmackDown to carry the big gold belt in Dave's absence. Angle wasn't the only beneficiary from this injury as it opened the door for Rey Mysterio to win the Rumble instead and capture the gold at Mania in honor of Eddie Guerrero. So everything worked out okay in the end. Well, except for Batista who was out of action for six months. Number six, Shawn Michaels as WWE Champion. This one, is a little tricky. The official reason given for Shawn Michaels vacating the WWE Championship in February of 1997 is a knee injury. However, it has long been speculated that it was actually HBK's pride that was damaged. Michaels won his first world title at WrestleMania 12 after besting Bret Hart in an Iron Man match. The plan was for Shawn and Bret to do a rematch one year later, this time with the showstopper putting over the Hitman. Unfortunately, working with Shawn Michaels in the mid-90s was like trying to teach a crocodile to dance the can-can. Unwise, volatile, and ultimately pointless. Rumor has it that Michaels vacated the championship to avoid dropping it to Hart, whom he despised in real life. This threw plans for the upcoming WrestleMania 13 into complete disarray. The world title flopped around from person to person, eventually ending up on The Undertaker when all was said and done. As for Hart, he would only go on to have one of the greatest wrestling matches of all time against Stone Cold Steve Austin, as the injured HBK looked on from the sidelines. Number 5. Tommaso Ciampa as NXT Champion Debuting as happy-go-lucky tag team DIY, Johnny Gargano and Tommaso Ciampa won over the hearts of the NXT faithful with their incredible matches against American Alpha and The Revival. They then split up in heartbreaking fashion when Ciampa turned on Gargano at TakeOver Chicago. Ciampa's injury during their match with the Authors of Pain put their feud on ice for a couple of months, but that only helped stretch out the tension. His injury in 20 2019, however, was not so serendipitous. Now NXT champion, Ciampa was scheduled to face off against Gargano for the title at TakeOver New York. This would be the fiery culmination of their epic rivalry and would surely see Johnny Wrestling crowned the top guy in NXT. And then Ciampa decided to go and hurt his neck. Well, I'm sure he didn't decide to do it, but it happened, sadly. Requiring surgery, the psycho killer relinquished his precious Goldie just two weeks out from the anticipated TakeOver show. Showdown. Yes, the replacement match between Gargano and Adam Cole was spectacular, but imagine how much better the embrace between Johnny and Tommaso would have been had it come at the end of a hard-fought match between the two of them. Number 4. CM Punk as AEW World Champion Are we even allowed to mention this wrestler and this company within the same breath anymore? Promise we're not going to get sued or, you know, bitten. Okay, if you're sure. CM Punk rounded off an amazing comeback to the ring by beating Adam Hangman Page for the AEW World Championship at Double or Nothing 2022. Nine months after his first appearance on Rampage, and to many, Punk was the king of the wrestling world once again, and nothing could go wrong, as long as he didn't put a foot wrong. Unfortunately, Punk broke his foot, either during the Double or Nothing main event or the six-man tag match he took part in on Dynamite a few days later. He probably shouldn't have had that match, but he wasn't going to miss out on teaming with FTR now, was he? They're his best mates! Punk didn't vacate the belt, with AEW instead choosing to crown an interim champion. However, the Aoi did throw off all sorts of plans the company had, including having Punk face Hiroshi Tanahashi at Forbidden Door. Then came the title unification with Moxley, then All Out, then the backstage fight, and you know the rest. And it can basically all be traced back to the moment the Straight Edge Superstar got crocked. Number 3. Seth Rollins as WWE World Heavyweight Champion Dolph Ziggler's cash-in was great, but this one was on a whole nother level. During the main event of WrestleMania 31 between between Brock Lesnar and Roman Reigns, Seth Rollins sprinted down to the ring like bloody Roadrunner with a blonde streak. He inserted himself into the match, hit a curb stomp on Reigns, and pinned him to leave the Showcase of the Immortals with his first WWE Championship. He held the gold for 221 days, propping up the company as its top heel. Then came that fateful visit to Ireland. 
Whilst wrestling Kane at a Dublin house show, Rollins blew out his knee, executing a sunset flip powerbomb. This put him on the shelf and ended his title reign before you could say, Pint of Guinness, my good man. Seriously though, this was devastating. Rollins had worked incredibly hard as champion and had done an amazing job of it. Now he was out of the picture, just as the road to WrestleMania was beginning to be paved. The subsequent scenario involving Reigns and Triple H was hardly an adequate substitute for what the architect would have done had he been healthy. Number 2. Finn Balor as Universal Champion Some of the entries on this list have been unfortunate because the champion was in the middle of a real long reign when they happened. This time, it was the complete opposite. Following the second brand split in 2016, WWE introduced a second world championship to serve Raw. This was the Universal Championship, a belt so ugly that it almost ruined an entire SummerSlam match. I blame the fans. Yeah, you. The match in question was Finn Balor vs Seth Rollins to crown the inaugural champion. Balor was victorious, pinning Rollins and holding the belt up high. Wait a second, he can't physically hold the belt up. An errant powerbomb to the barricade sent the Demon King's shoulder into a different dimension. Balor appeared the next night on Raw, arm in a sling, to vacate the championship just 24 hours after he had won it. WWE had strapped the rocket to the recently called up Irishman and fans were thrilled, but his time with the gold was cruelly cut short through no fault of his own and he hasn't often gotten near the top prize since. Number 1. Daniel Bryan as WWE World Heavyweight Champion Wrestlemania WrestleMania 30, the night Daniel Bryan proved everyone wrong and beat both Randy Orton and Batista to capture the WWE World Heavyweight Championship in a pulsating main event. He had been through a hell of an ordeal to get there, but the American Dragon had finally scored the big one and was finally ready to lead the company as the biggest star in wrestling. And then his neck collapsed. Bryan managed just a single pay-per-view title defense against Kane before things started to go downhill. He endured a litany of neck and nerve issues before finally letting the WWE title go in June of 2014, ending what was supposed to be his glorious reign at just 64 days. It was utterly devastating to watch Bryan give up the thing that he had worked so hard for. We had all gotten so invested in him that it felt like a personal tragedy to watch him walk away, doubly so when the exact same thing happened the following year with the IC Championship. Thankfully, Brian Danielson seems to have overcome his injuries and is enjoying a fruitful wrestling career once again, but there was a time where that was far from guaranteed. WWE stars, it could be said, are a mixture of athlete, actor, and stuntman. And while every move and bump can be considered a stunt in its own unique way, WWE stars are on occasion tasked with performing the sort of actual stunts that would make the cast of Jackass proud. These don't always go according to plan, however, leading to some very close near misses, some very genuine injuries, and on rare occasions, the person performing the stunt coming within a hair of tragedy. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 most dangerous WWE stunts. Join us! Number 10. Playing with Fire WWE stars thrive off heat, but something tells me the vast majority of them wouldn't relish being in matches and segments that involve actual fire. It was Kane who made Flames a regular presence on WWE television, the big red machine being involved in many situations over the course of his career where he could have very easily been burned. In a controlled studio setting, like the interview where he set fire to Jim Ross, that risk is obviously minimized. But live and in an arena, things get a bit trickier and altogether less predictable, even when the proper precautions are taken. Kane could have become engulfed at the 1998 Royal Rumble, for example, when he doused a casket in gasoline and set it on fire in the arena entranceway. He was legitimately set ablaze a couple of times in different Inferno matches, then did the same to MVP, something achieved thanks to specially padded ring attire. Of course, these all pale in comparison to Edge spearing Mick Foley through a flaming table at WrestleMania 22, a stunt that went miraculously well considering the risk factor. Number 9. A Wheelie Bad Landing 
Poor Zack Ryder was put through the ringer in early 2012. After daring to get over on his own, WWE seemingly punished Long Island Icy by having his character endure humiliation after humiliation. Like having John Cena steal away Eve, who then turned on Ryder at WrestleMania by kicking him square in the broskies. That said, the creative pain was nothing compared to the very real pain Zack could have suffered when Kane, him again, sent him sailing off the side of the Raw stage. Ryder was sat in a wheelchair following a previous drubbing at the hands of the devil's favourite demon and was easy pickings. The whole thing probably seemed safe enough when they were talking through it earlier in the day, but in execution it was very sketchy indeed. Being pushed at high speed off the low stage, the internet champion barely had enough time to position himself so that he didn't pulverise his knees and or ankles. Ryder later revealed that the fall jacked his back up, but it could have been far worse. Number 8. Dumped off the stage Zack Ryder wasn't the first person to be thrown off a WWE stage, of course, and I would bet all of my stock in social media company Tout that he will not be the last. Ryder's fall was brutal, no doubt, but at least he could see where he was going and was able to protect himself as best he could. Terry Funk and Mick Foley didn't quite have the same luxury when they took a tumble on the February 2nd, 1998 episode of Raw. The hardcore legends were locked into a dumpster by the New Age Outlaws, who teased pushing them harmlessly down on the ramp before deciding on total destruction instead. Road Dog has subsequently assured fans that precautions were taken and that Vince McMahon himself went for an initial ride just to make sure that nobody would get hurt. But still, it could have gone quickly awry when the red light was on. The endless replays, JR's tremendous sell job on commentary, the locker room emptying to check on their co-workers, and the outlaws explaining themselves to a miffed Vince only added to the general aura of unease afterwards. Number 7. Fangin, Bangin and Hangin The Ministry of Darkness, what are they like, eh? Abductions, torture, attempted human sacrifices, nothing was out of bounds for The Undertaker and his gang of evil followers. Cheeky little scamps. Put next to some of their more outlandish antics, the Ministry's hanging of Gangrel on the February 1st, 1999 episode of Raw didn't seem particularly OTT or anything. But despite it looking simple enough to pull off, it came close to being catastrophic. The Ministry men were told by WWE's prop ace Richie Posner earlier in the day that the rope they had picked out for the angle wasn't suitable, as it was brand new and would almost certainly cinch up in the moment. Regrettably, they didn't heed his advice because when they flung the vampire over the top rope with the noose around his neck and pulled back, the rope did just what Posner guessed it would. Gasping for air and rightfully panicking as his life flashed before his eyes, Gangrel managed to give Midian the Iggy that he was in trouble, with Dennis Knight able to relay the message to the Acolytes who let go just in time. Number 6. An Instant Classic as with fire, WWE have occasionally used the unpredictable element of glass in angles and matches. We all remember Marty Jannetty going through the barbershop window, the coward, and Shawn Michaels getting a delayed dose of karma when he was introduced to the Geratron 5000 many years later. Unlike fire, glass is much easier to gimmick and stunts involving it can be done a lot more safely. Unfortunately for Kurt Angle and Shane McMahon at the 2001 King of the Ring pay-per-view, the WWE props team neglected to get the more forgiving kind of glass for the show's set because they were afraid it would shatter due to the nearby pyrotechnics. The Olympic hero and the boss's son weren't to know as Kurt prepared to suplex Shane through the panes towards the end of their chaotic street fight grudge match. McMahon famously bounced off on the first couple of attempts, the back of his head hitting the concrete floor with a sickening thud. Determined to make sure shards were sent flying, Angle ended up simply flinging him face first instead, resulting in both men needing stitches. Number 5. Big Show Breaks the Ring one of the most spectacular stunts WWE can wheel out is when part of the ring breaks. It always gets a reaction because WWE do it pretty sparingly and there's rarely an indication that it's going to happen. That said, Big Show climbing to the top rope might have been a bit of a giveaway since he was involved in three full-on ring breaks. The first time was when the world's largest athletes battled Brock Lesnar for the WWE title on the June 12, 2003 episode of SmackDown. Show was going for a super 
chokeslam when the next big thing countered into a superplex, resulting in ropes snapping, boards bending, and the match being declared a no contest. It was done perfectly, thanks to the ring being raised slightly and airbags placed underneath it, but any number of things could have gone wrong and led to a bad injury. WWE repeated the spot on two further occasions when Show collided with Mark Henry and Braun Strowman. Visually stunning, a good old fashioned ring break requires planning and precision, and a couple of big beefy boys to make it realistic. Number 4 Rey Mysterio's Backlash Whiplash Alright, so we've established that Big Show is really, really big. Big enough to break the ring on three separate occasions even. You know who's not so big? Andrew Hodkinson and Rey Mysterio, WWE's so-called biggest little man who found himself booked against the 500 pounder in a giant mismatch at Backlash 2003. It went about as well as expected for Mysterio, with Little Ray succumbing to a choke slam and then being placed on a backboard in preparation for being stretched out. In a shocking scene, Sho came back, grabbed the prone Mysterio, and swung him like a baseball bat into the ring post. Ray hit hard and dropped to the floor, breaking his fall with his face. The post-match angle was done to write the cruise away off television for a few weeks, but almost ended up putting him on the shelf for far longer. Though he wasn't seriously injured, he did reportedly have a big bump on his forehead as well as a sprained thumb and wrist. He was also, quite understandably, badly shaken up after and vowed to never again be strapped to a stretcher and swung like a baseball bat into a ring post. Smart. Number 3. Shane Falls Off The Titantron Multiple Times no member of the McMahon family had to do the crazy things they did on television. They didn't have to get beaten up or embarrassed, but they did it anyway because they are entertainers at heart. Shane McMahon certainly didn't have to put his life on the line over and over again by either falling or jumping from great heights. Shano's first breathtaking fall came at SummerSlam 2000, when he scaled the side of the set while being pursued by Steve Blackman and took a backwards plunge from about 30 feet up. Yes, the landing was cushioned, duh, but that's still a hell of a distance and Shane had to to make sure that he controlled his body and landed perfectly, which he did. And hell, if it worked so well the first time, why not do it two more times? Shane dropped a huge elbow on Big Show at Backlash 2001 and then attempted the same on Kane at Unforgiven 2003, which missed. Undeterred by advancing age or the long layoff since his last match, Shane flung himself off the side of the cell in his WrestleMania 32 comeback match with The Undertaker. And that, as well as a legitimate tournament victory, is why he's considered the best wrestler in the world. Number 2. The Grandest Spear of Them All the Hardys, Dudleys, and Edge and Christian continually raise the bar in their table, ladder, and TLC matches to the point that a 50-footer wouldn't have come close to reaching it. The bar, that is. They must have been feeling the pressure to top their own lofty efforts when WWE booked the sequel to TLC at the historic WrestleMania X7, yet with their combined willpower were able to somehow inch that bar just a little bit higher. In a match filled with spectacular bumps and stunts, the trio of tag teams reserved the biggest and best of the bunch for close to the end. Edge and Jeff Hardy had done a spot where Edge speared Jeff off a ladder, usually by jumping from the top rope a couple of times before, but they decided to take things to another level at Mania. With the charismatic Enigma hanging from the hook that held the titles in place, the Rated R Superstar jumped off the top of a massive ladder and sent him a long way down to the mat below. The timing had to be absolutely spot on to make sure that both the giver and and receiver didn't end up getting poleaxed on the grandest stage. Number 1. Broken in Half Perhaps no WWE star in history has suffered for their art more than Mick Foley. Mrs. Foley's baby boy routinely took all manner of heavy duty bumps, any one of which could have ended his career and probably would have ended the careers of anyone else bonkers enough to try them. For all the unbelievable spills that Saint Mick took before and during his WWE career, one, well actually two, live longest in the memory. 
Realising that his King of the Ring 1998 Hell in a Cell showdown with The Undertaker, who was going into the match with an injured ankle, didn't have the strongest build, and that the first Cell match between the Dead Man and Shawn Michaels had set the bar extremely high, Foley took things into his own hands to make sure it lived up to expectations. And then some. First, he seemingly floated off the top and threw the announce table at ringside. Then he climbed back up and was chokeslammed through the top of the cage, a steel chair falling with Foley and cracking him square in the face, in some sort of sadistic cosmic joke. Still one of the damnedest things in wrestling history. To become a tag team champion in WWE is recognition that the tandem you belong to is the very best in the ring. Or that you sell the most merch. Either way, today we are looking at teams that have only had one reign with any set of tag team titles across their WWE careers. For example, if a team had one reign with the World Tag Team Championships, but also had a different reign with the WWE Tag Team Championships, they would be disqualified. Sorry, Kane and Big Show, but rules are rules. I'm Adam Pachisi from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 best one-time WWE Tag Team Champions. Join us. Number 10, Stone Cold Steve Austin and Dude Love. You would be hard-pressed to find two more opposing characters than 1997 Steve Austin and Mick Foley's hippie alter ego, Dude Love. One was a tough-as-nails redneck who took no nonsense and dished out all kinds of whoop-ass. The other was a fun-loving throwback with the knobbliest knees this side of a Butlin's Holiday Park. However, if you know anything about wrestling, then you will know that odd couples often make fantastic tag teams. Austin had been tag champs with Shawn Michaels before HBK got himself suspended. Owen Hart and the British Bulldog won a tournament to face Austin and his new partner who was nobody. Ever the loner, Austin decided to go it alone. However, during the match, he got some unexpected help from the man in tie-dye. Dude Love ran down to save the Texas Rattlesnake from his enemies. One stunner later and Austin and Love were the new tag champs. These two misfits were fantastically entertaining together, even if their reign was cut short by Stone Cold's injury at SummerSlam. Just imagine how much more fun this pairing could have had had fate not intervened just a few months into their tandem. Number 9. Tyson Kidd and Cesaro A tag team is a great way for an underrated singles wrestler to get some attention. Just ask Cesaro. Our man Claudio has enjoyed success alongside Shinsuke Nakamura and as part of the bar with Sheamus, but it is all too brief run with Tyson Kidd that we are interested in here. The Swiss Superman and Natalia's husband started teaming in late 2014, picking up steam thanks to their incredible in-ring chemistry. It didn't take them too long to become champions as they beat the Usos for the belts at Fastlane 2015. At WrestleMania 31, Kid and Cesaro defended their championships in a four-way match against the former champs, The New Day, and Los Matadores that definitely deserved more than its pre-show placement. New Day would then end their reign at just 63 days, but this super athletic team accomplished a very lot in that short space of time. It felt like they breathed new life into the tag scene, bringing a serious focus to the division that hadn't been seen in a while. It's a serious shame that Kid's forced retirement later that year would bring an end to such a promising partnership. Number 8. Rated RKO You know the name incredibly well, but did you know that Rated RKO's original run only lasted 7 months? In 2006, Edge and Randy Orton were a natural combination. Both were despicable heels, both hated DX, and both were very good at making funny faces when setting up for their finishers. They beat the somewhat random team of Ric Flair and Roddy Piper to win the tag straps in November. They would then feud with Triple H and Shawn Michaels for the next several months, including losing to their team in a clean sweep at Survivor Series. Let's not dwell on that for too long, it was a bad time for all involved. Especially you, Mike Knox. Rated RKO would play a huge part in the build for WrestleMania 23 as they entered the crosshairs of Michaels and his opponent for that show, WWE Champion John Cena. 
It was this duo that unseated Edge and Orton as champions in the run-up to Mania, ending their reign at 77 days. They may not have reigned for very long, but this team was super popular as champions and had a far-reaching effect on the wider WWE ecosystem. There is a reason that everyone still remembers them. Number 7. Soul Patrol WWE loves to trot out groundbreaking milestones to the point where we're all pretty bloody sick of them. One moment that is worth retreading, though, is the time that Tony Atlas and Rocky Just Wait Until You See My Son Johnson defeated the Wild Samoans in 1983. Atlas and Johnson overcame interference from Captain Lou Albano to beat Afra and Seeker and make history in the process. This victory not only made them the first African-American team to become World Tag Team Champions, but it also made them the first black men to hold any sort of gold in the Federation. If that wasn't enough, Soul Patrol reigned with the belts for a respectable 154 days before dropping them to Adrian Adonis and Dick Murdoch. This team became champions because they were insanely popular wrestlers with great looks and tons of charisma, and they set a great example for aspiring black wrestlers worldwide. Number 6. Kane and Rob Van Dam As far as unlikely duos go, they don't get much more unlikely than Rob Van Dam and Kane. One was a pyromaniac hell-bent on inflicting pain and suffering, while the only thing the other one was likely to light up was a big fat doobie. Forming in early 2003, RVD and the Big Red Machine attempted to bag the belts on multiple occasions, including on the WrestleMania 19 pre-show, until they finally won them on the March 31st edition of Monday Night Raw. Their two styles contrasted well, and they had solid defenses against teams like the Dudley Boys, Lance Storm and Chief Morley, Chris Jericho and Christian, and La Resistance. It was against the French Canadians that their 76-day run with the gold came to an end due to a spot of miscommunication. That made 19-year-old Rene Dupree the youngest champion in WWE history until, you know, they gave the title to an actual child. Unsuccessful in their rematch, Kane and Van Damme split up when Kane was unmasked and turned into well, even more of a psycho. Number 5. Roman Reigns and Seth Rollins These days, Roman is considered pretty much the ultimate singles wrestler in WWE, having been champion for, where are we now, 5,487 days or something? That said, he had to share his first taste of WWE gold. Back when he was in The Shield, Reigns and his brother in black Seth Rollins won the WWE Tag Team Championships at Extreme Rules 2013. Dean Ambrose had picked up the US title earlier in the night, meaning that the faction were nicely decorated indeed. For the next 148 days, Reigns and Rollins defended the belts against the likes of Daniel Bryan and Randy Orton, The Usos, and the Primetime Players. The Shield lost their tag straps in dramatic fashion when they were beaten by Cody Rhodes and Goldust as part of an emotional storyline with the Rhodes brothers' jobs on the line. Unfortunately, this was only like the fifth televised time that they had actually defended the belts. And that was a common theme with The Shield during this time. Still, the visual of the group with all the belts and that Rhodes match more than makes up for the lack of TV time. Number 4. The Valiant Brothers History buffs out there will be wondering which combination of the Valiant Brothers we are talking about here. To that I say, have you thought about going outside recently? You look like you could use some sun. Just kidding, the combination of the Valiants we are on about here is Jimmy and Johnny, who reigned as World Tag Team Champions between 1974 and 1975. Sorry Jerry, you just didn't make the cut. Though they weren't actually related, Jimmy and Johnny had great chemistry together as dominant heels. They got signed in 1974 by Vince McMahon Sr. and won the company's tag belt shortly thereafter. Their reign lasted for 370 days before they were eventually dethroned by Dominic DiNucci and Victor Rivera. This made them the Fed's first team to be champs for over a year, a record that would stand for 14 years until demolition came along. Those pesky face-painted freaks. Even though they're not household names today, the Valiants were crucial to the success of tag team wrestling in the company's earlier days. They set records and established trends before many of the most popular tag team wrestlers of all time were even born, and we think that deserves a mention. Number 3. The British Bulldogs Remember WrestleMania 2? If you said yes to that question, then I'm so sorry. There'll be a link to a support group in the comments. 
One of the few high points of that generally maligned show was the main event match of the Rosemont Horizon portion of the event. The Dream Team, that's Greg Valentine and Brutus Beefcake by the way, were defending their World Tag Team Championships against an extremely popular tandem. And we're not just saying that because they're from the same country as us. Davy Boy Smith and Dynamite Kid, better known as the British Bulldogs, were one of the most over babyface teams in the company at the time. Not only were they given the closing match at a portion of WrestleMania, but they were accompanied to the ring by none other than Ozzy Osbourne. Let's just be glad Matilda was a dog and not a bat, eh? The Bulldogs beat the Dream Team to begin a 294-day run with the belts. They propped the tag division up with great matches before finally dropping the titles to fellow Stampede Wrestling alumni, the Hart Foundation. Perhaps they would have been champions again had Dynamite's injuries and backstage issues not led to his WWE exit. Number 2. Owen Hart and the British Bulldog It's a Bulldog double whammy! We are not biased, we promise, and the fact I'm wearing Union Jack underpants is a complete coincidence. After serving together as members of Camp Cornet, brothers-in-law Owen Hart and the British Bulldog set their sights on the World Tag Team Championships at In Your House 10. The pair were successful in unseating the smoking guns and would then reign for a whopping 246 days with the titles. They did have a few dud defenses in their time, their bout against Fake Razor and Fake Diesel from In Your House 12 comes to mind, but on the whole, these two talented workers were usually able to deliver between the ropes. What makes this reign so memorable are the times that the pair were at odds with each other. Bulldog defeated Owen to become the first ever European champion whilst they were still tag champs, leading to the Rockets' legendary line of, you may have two titles, but I have two slammies. Their reign also coincided with the reformation of the Hart Foundation in 1997. I think that was a pretty big year for them, can't really remember. Number 1. Team Hell No the enemies becoming friends trope in wrestling is one that, when done right, can be excellent. In recent years, there has been no better example of this storyline than when Daniel Bryan shacked up with Kane to form Team Hell No. Bryan and Kane were at each other's throats throughout 2012 until some anger management classes, led by the hero that is Dr. Shelby, come on, helped smooth things out. Okay, well, not really, they still hated each other, but they were just a team now. Despite bickering like a pair of old biddies, Team Hell No won the WWE Tag Team titles from R-Truth and Kofi Kingston at Night of Champions. After initially resenting being forced to reign together, over time the pair gained each other's trust and started to work together as a solid unit. This led to matches against Team Road Scholars, 3MB, and a WrestleMania title defense against Dolph Ziggler and Big E Langston. Their reign came to an end as part of their lengthy feud with The Shield, ending D. Bry and the Big Red Machine's time with the belts at 245 days. For their comedic brilliance, excellent matches, and their engaging relationship progression, Team Hell No gets a giant yes from us. As one of WWE's original Big Four pay-per-views, Survivor Series has played host to many a memorable match and moment. Considering there have been 35 of the bastards, it's not too shocking that some of these might have faded from the collective memory of wrestling fans just a little bit. So with the 2023 edition right around the corner, we thought we would shine a light on some Survivor Series moments that may have been underrated, overlooked, or otherwise significant, but that are, for whatever reason, rarely brought up. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 forgotten WWE Survivor Series moments. Join us! Number 10. Kofi Survives Before Randy Orton branded him as stupid, stupid for bungling a match finish on Raw, Kofi Kingston's late 2009 push was going just swimmingly. In the run-up to that year's Survivor Series, Kingston got the better of the Legend Killer on several occasions, memorably destroying his custom NASCAR car and hitting him with an almighty boom drop through a table in Madison Square Garden. Captaining his team of Christian, Mark Henry, MVP and R-Truth against Randy's squad of CM Punk, Cody Rhodes, Ted DiBiase Jr. and William Regal, Kofi Star continued to shine. The match eventually came down to Kingston against Punk and Orton, the odds not looking good for the Ghana-born High Flyer. Out 
outnumbered and outmatched, Kofi had to dig deep against the Viper and Straight Edge Superstar. Scrapping to stay in the fight, Kingston managed to counter his old tag partner's roll-up into one of his own, eliminating him. Mere seconds later, Orton attempted to intervene, only to be met with a trouble in paradise which he sold expertly, and he too was eliminated. Just like that, Kofi had defeated two ex-world champions in one night. It was a breathless, perfectly timed and executed finish that did much to raise Kingston's stock. Number 9. The Shawn Michaels Show Shawn Michaels may be considered Mr. WrestleMania for his vaunted exploits at the Showcase of the Immortals, but he has quite the record when it comes to Survivor Series too. Montreal Screwjob aside, the Heartbreak Kid has a rather glowing Survivor Series resume, boasting epic world title wins, standout moments, and plenty of first-class performances. His finest hour at this particular pay-per-view event may have come in 2003, when he led the charge for Steve Austin's team against Eric Bischoff's mob. The co-general man managers had been at odds, and the stipulations dictated that Stone Cold would have to step down as co-GM if his team lost, whereas if his team won, he would be allowed to batter people indiscriminately. Seems fair? Anyway, the match was a corker that built and built the drama thanks mainly to the efforts of Michaels. With Rob Van Dam, Booker T and the Dudley Boys heading for the showers, Sean was left to fend for himself against Chris Jericho, Christian and Randy Orton. The subsequent incredibly gutsy showing had the crowd losing their minds before the heartbreak of Batista costing a bloody HBK the miracle comeback. Number 8. The Perfect Replacement one of the big attractions at Survivor Series 1992 was to see Randy Savage and the Ultimate Warrior team up to take on Ric Flair and Razor Ramon. Regrettably, the Macho Man lost his Mega Maniac's partner when Warrior Jim got flagged for using human growth hormone and was either fired or quit or both in the run-up to the pay-per-view. Stepping up as his replacement was Kurt Hennig, aka Mr. Perfect. Hennig had been on the shelf since the prior year's SummerSlam, where he notably dropped the Intercontinental title to Bret Hart in a bona fide classic despite suffering from a potentially career-ending back injury. There were question marks over his condition going into Survivor Series, but Hennig answered the skeptics by entering a fine performance that was especially impressive considering his long layoff. It's a shame the match ended in an admittedly lame disqualification, but take nothing away from Hennig's appearance. He had a really short time to get himself ready and stepped up admirably. It wasn't flawless, but it did give Hennig the confidence to come back full time just a month or so later. Number 7. Jeff Hardy's MSG Callback Survivor Series 2002 was not overall a banner night for Jeff Hardy. Competing in the six-man table elimination match opener, the charismatic Enigma looked every bit of performer who was rapidly losing his passion for the business. He famously missed his cue and took an age to prevent Rico from hitting a move, leading to the self-professed stylist's audible cries of "Damn it, Jeff!" and messed up his own rail runner spot by slipping and taking a nasty header into a table. There were a couple of bright spots, however, where it looked like the Jeff Hardy of old out there, with one stunt in particular harkening back to his not too distant glory days. Almost three years after tearing the house down in a tag team table match with the Dudleys, Hardy replicated a famous spot for the Madison Square Garden crowd. This time assisted by Bubba Ray, Jeff climbed up to a raised balcony section of the arena and, with a shrug of the shoulders, hit three-minute warnings Rosie with a graceful swanton bomb through the wood. Beautiful violence. Hey, while we're at it, the reunion of Bubba and Devon months after they were split in the first WWE draft was another somewhat forgotten but lovely moment. Number 6. Kong is awesome. No, we are not talking about the artist formerly known as Karma, who unfortunately never really got the chance to show the WWE Universe what she was all about. We are actually talking about Aja Kong, the incredible force who made her name running roughshod over the All Japan women's promotion during the 80s and 90s. Kong was brought in to be built up as a challenger for then women's champion Alundra Blaze, and the two would be on opposite teams at the 1995 Survivor Series. Not that Kong needed the help mind, as she managed to convincingly eliminate all three of of her All Japan Women contemporaries and then blazed to complete a mighty impressive single-handed clean sweep and emerge as the match's sole survivor. It was not only a very promising showing for Kong, but the match itself was chock full of action and told a great story, as Alundra herself eliminated the three other members of Kong's team before succumbing to a spinning back fist. There wasn't any follow-up due to Blaze defecting to WCW and chucking her title belt in the trash, but hey, at least the thought was there. 
Number 5. The Debut of Jazz the 2001 Survivor Series marked the end of the road for the invasion angle. Mishandled from the start, what could have been the most incredible money-drawing storyline in wrestling history limped to a weak finish after just a few disappointing months. One of the bright spots of the pay-per-view was WWE's decision to resurrect the Women's Championship, which hadn't been seen since then-champion China left the company earlier in the year. Lita, Trish Stratus, Mighty Molly, Jacqueline and Ivory were joined in the six-pack for the vacant strap by former ECW star Jazz, making her WWE debut. Jazz didn't manage to win the title in her first match, that honour went to the constantly improving Stratus, but her arrival did make a statement and signalled that WWE were going to take their women's division a lot more seriously going forward. It's not like she had to wait too long anyway, she managed to defeat Trish for the title on the February 4th 2002 edition of Monday Night Raw. Jazz was a great addition to WWE's roster and has long been underrated by many and her Survivor Series bow was a genuine pleasant surprise. Number 4. Lying, Cheating and Stealing the Show the 2002 Survivor Series was the site of a couple of historic title changes, with Big Show becoming the first man to pin Brock Lesnar on screen to bag the Undisputed Championship, and Shawn Michaels winning the first ever Elimination Chamber match to take the World Heavyweight Championship away from Triple H. What shouldn't get forgotten about is the fact that three other titles also changed hands on the night. Billy Kidman reclaimed the Cruiserweight title, while Victoria scored her first Women's Championship. Also walking away from MSG with gold were the uncle and nephew combination of Eddie and Chavo Guerrero, who outlasted the teams of Chris Benoit and Kurt Angle and Rey Mysterio and Edge to become the third ever SmackDown Tag Team Champs. Not only was an unheralded gem of a match, but it was also a great moment for Los Guerreros, who were more like brothers growing up and used to wrestle each other when they were kids during intermission on shows promoted by Eddie's father Gory. This was just reward for the familial duo, who had been showing their worth every week on the Blue Brand for months. Number 3. Hart vs Michaels if I say Hart vs. Michaels at Survivor Series, your mind will more than likely flash to the infamous ending of the 1997 event, where Michaels conspired with Vince McMahon and others to screw Brett out of his world title on his last night with the company, in Canada too, no less. Or the hipsters among you might flash to 1992, where the hitman defended his WWE title against the showstopper in a wonderful headliner that felt like a preview of the new generation era that was to come soon after. I'm not talking about either of those here, but rather Brett's father Stu taxing the jaw of the boy toy in 1993. Hart was teaming with brothers Owen, Keith, and of course Bruce against Michaels and his band of nondescript knights. The match itself was poor and lasted a ridiculous 30 minutes, but it was worth sitting through to see the Hart family patriarch crack Sean with a stiff one. A lot of people have played the I'll get my dad on you card before, but if any of the Hart boys said it, you knew you were in for a proper hiding. Number 2. The Miz and Mizdow win gold. Well, bronze. While fans may bemoan the way the union between the Miz and Damian Mizdow ended without the two getting a proper payoff for the angle, you would be remiss to not reflect on the good when it comes to what was one of the hottest acts in WWE at the time. It was never really supposed to be that way, with Damian Sandow simply trying to make something out of very little and getting the act over in the process. Fans really started to respond to not just his hilarious mimicry, but the interplay between him and the A-lister. They were hot heading into a four-way WWE Tag Team title match at the 2014 Survivor Series, though there was no guarantee WWE would pull the trigger. If anything, it was actually somewhat unlikely given how often they had fumbled the bag when it came to hot acts in the recent past. How refreshing it was to see them book the movie star and his supposed stunt double to go over on the Usos, Los Matadores, and Goldust and Stardust, giving the St. Louis crowd and everyone watching at home a thoroughly satisfying payoff. Number 1. DX Gets Punked the 2006 Survivor Series bore witness to one of the mightiest babyface crews ever assembled as DX's Triple H and Shawn Michaels teamed with the Hardys and CM Punk. Rated RKO, Gregory Helms, Johnny Nitro and Mike Knox didn't stand a chance, did they? Wait, who? 
At the time, the Straight Edge Superstar was very much at the bottom of the pecking order of that fivesome, though you wouldn't know it by the reaction he received from the Philadelphia faithful that night. In his first WWE pay-per-view appearance, Punk's name was chanted loudly by the almost 16,000 strong crowd as DX went to do their usual pre-match promo routine. You could almost see Triple H plotting his future revenge in real time as the game had to hand the microphone over to the ECW up-and-comer for the big question. Amusingly, WWE tried to credit the Second City Savior's popularity to internet fans. I mean, it was 2006. You would hope people in Philly at least had dial-up by then, right? Anyway, everyone was a winner in the end as the good guy scored an impressive clean sweep and, as an added bonus, killed whatever dreams Mike Knox may have had as they did it. Thanks for coming, Mike! In the words of Vin Diesel in Fast and Furious, nothing is more important than family. Much like the family in that series, these 10 wrestling clans are all completely fictitious. Whilst wrestling has its fair share of famous, genuine families, the Steiners, the Flairs, the Rhodes, etc., it's also a form of entertainment built on lies. So naturally, there have been more than a few fabricated lineages over the years. We've ranked the following made-up relatives based on how well they work together, but also how influential each member was on their own. Just call me Sister Sledge because today we are family! I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling and these are the 10 best kayfabe families in wrestling. Join us! Number 10, The Guns. Before you run riot in the comments, we know that Billy Gunn is the biological father of Austin and Colton, as much as he would like us to believe that he actually sired Anthony Bowens and Max Caster. We are not talking about the Gun Club or the acclaimed. Instead, we are talking about the popular 90s tag team, the Smoking Guns. Billy, whose real name is the frankly ludicrous Monty Sop, joined with wrestler Brett Colt to form a team called the Long Riders. When the Riders arrived in WWE in 1993, Sop changed his name to Billy Gunn and Colt became his kayfabe brother, Bart. Under a cowboy gimmick, the guns were a fixture of the WWE tag team scene throughout the mid-90s. They won the World Tag Team Championships three times and even got to defend them at WrestleMania 11. The pair split up in 1996 and had a brief feud that was halted by a neck injury to Billy. After recovering, he would join up with Road Dog to form the New Age Outlaws, become a part of D-Generation X, and the rest is history. As for Bart, well, he won the Brawl for All and got rewarded by having his head knocked into orbit by Butterbean. Number 9, Edge and Christian. The man currently known as Christian Cage made his WWE debut in 1998, antagonizing Edge from the crowd during a match with Owen Hart. It was revealed that Christian was Edge's brother, and the pair eventually joined forces under Gangrel as part of the brood. When they split from the vampire, E and C would go on a tremendous tag team run. They won the tag strap seven times, took part in the first two TLC matches, and were voted the Wrestling Observer News Letters Tag Team of the Year in 2000. Their singles runs also reeked of awesomeness, with both men becoming multiple-time world champions across various different promotions. If WWE hadn't retconned that these two were related when Christian returned to the company in 2009, then this combo would actually be much higher up on the list. So whilst they're just childhood friends these days, they were brothers during their most successful period. Wait a second, if they aren't actually related, then who is Grandma Edna? Just who was Edge on the phone to at SummerSlam 2001? The plot thickens. Number 8, The Hollies. The Holly Dynasty was first established in WWE with the arrival of Bob Holly to the company in January of 1994. Let's just gloss over the fact that he was a NASCAR driver named Thurman Sparky Plug, shall we? After becoming Bob and then later Hardcore Holly, he was joined by his kayfabe cousin Crash in 1999. The pair feuded on and off over who was tougher, but actually did team up to beat the Rock and Sock connection for the tag team titles. I repeat, the Hollies have a win over the Rock and Nick Foley. The Attitude Era was mental. The third piece of the puzzle arrived in the form of Molly Holly in 2000. Yet another cousin, Molly was brought in to neutralize Trish Stratus during her male relative's feud with Test and Albert. They too would eventually fall out over Molly's relationship with a member of another family on this list. Spoilers! This even led to Molly pinning Crash in an intergender match on Raw in 2001. Again, wild times, people. All three Hollies won multiple championships throughout their WWE careers and were very entertaining, either on their own or in any combination. 
Number seven, the Fargos. If you say Fargo to anyone these days, they will probably think of the Coen Brothers film or the TV series it inspired. Or perhaps the programming language Fargo, but that's only if they're big, dirty nerds. And we do not deal with nerds here. We are a professional wrestling channel, damn it. Anyway, fans of grappling from the late 1950s will think of the fabulous Fargo brothers when that particular name is uttered. Jackie and Don Fargo were a huge attraction for Vince McMahon Sr. in in the early days of wrestling's return to Madison Square Garden, helping draw record audiences in bouts against the likes of Antonino Rocca and Miguel Perez. In reality, Jackie was a North Carolina native, whilst Don was born in Germany. Jackie's real name wasn't even Jackie, it was Henry. When will the lies end? The truth didn't matter much back in those days as kayfabe was still alive and well. What mattered was entertainment and the Fargos sure provided that. The team were ahead of their time and set the mold for many great tag teams and singles wrestlers that followed them. They might be pretty much forgotten about these days, but wrestling fans have a lot to thank the Fargos for. Number 6. The Koloffs Ivan Koloff and his nephew Nikita wrestled as the Russian team in the NWA throughout the 1980s. This despite the fact that Nikita was from Minnesota and Ivan was from Montreal. But hey, what would pro wrestling be without a bit of the Red Scare? Wrestling bookers weren't about to pass up on the opportunity to exploit Cold War fears for some cold hard cash, so the Russians were often the enemy in promotions up and down America. Ivan had been playing a Muscovite long before this though, most famously in WWE. He was the man who brought an end to Bruno Sammartino's record-setting world championship reign at MSG, becoming just the third man in history to hold the gold. Alongside Nikita, Ivan held the NWA World Tag Team Championships and Six-Man Championships. The pair would defend the tag belts in one of the main events of Starcade 1985, showing just how hot their act was at the time. Despite being as Russian as a bald eagle, the Koloffs went to extreme lengths to keep kayfabe. Nikita even took the commendable step of learning the language and even legally changed his name in 1988. Hell of a commitment, comrade. Number 5. The Grahams Superstar Billy Graham might mostly get in the news these days for saying stupid things online, but there was a time when he was one of the biggest wrestling stars in the world. The man who ended Bruno Sammartino's second reign as WWE Champion, Graham's intense promo delivery and handlebar moustache inspired many a wrestler to follow in his footsteps. We won't name names, but let's just say a certain brother owes a lot of his success to the superstar. Although his ring name was meant as a tribute to the famous famous evangelist Billy Graham, it also allowed him to slot right into the famous Graham family that was a part of championship wrestling from Florida. The Graham clan consisted of fictitious brothers Dr. Jerry Graham, a WWE Hall of Famer, Eddie Graham, a future NWA president, and Crazy Luke Graham, one half of the first ever WWE Tag Team Champs. There were a bunch of other Grahams as well, but those are the ones with Wikipedia pages, and that's the real quiz. So what was Billy's real name before he changed it? Eldridge. Eldridge Coleman. You can sort of see why he went with Graham instead. Number four, the Valiants. Handsome Johnny, Luscious Jimmy, and Gentleman Jerry. No, not the nicknames I have for my meat and two veg, but rather the names of the three Valiant brothers. Jimmy and Johnny first teamed together in 1974 and would go on to become the longest reigning WWE Tag Team Champions for 14 years until Demolition came along and smashed that record. Ha <laughs> ha, smash. Do you get it? Do ya? When the Valiant brothers returned to WWE in 1978, Jimmy wasn't around. He had retired by this point, leading Johnny to invent a new brother called Jerry. He had a naming formula and he stuck with it. Good for him. Whilst Jerry and Johnny did win the tag belts again, they weren't nearly as successful as the previous version of the Valiant brothers. Now, we're not saying that's Jerry's fault, but... Okay, we don't really know what the reason could have been. It was probably Jerry's fault. Bloody Jerry. Still, the Valiants remain one of the most fondly remembered tag teams of the 1970s, and they all got inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame in 1996. Wait a second. Only Jimmy and Johnny did. They left Jerry out. Number three, the Andersons. In terms of sheer size, the kayfabe Anderson family has every other clan on this list beat and then some. The genesis of the family can be traced back to Gene Anderson, a wrestler who debuted in 1958 and was the only member of the group actually called Anderson. In 1965, Anderson roped in wrestler Larry Hainemy to be his brother Lars. The two formed the Minnesota Wrecking Crew, still regarded as 
is one of the best tag teams ever. Then came Rock Rogowski, who changed his name to Ole Anderson. Martin Lund soon followed as Arn Anderson, who you might remember as that crazy old bloke who went on a rant about Glocks and AEW. The Anderson family influenced every corner of the wrestling world. In the ring, Arn and Ole formed the first iteration of the Four Horsemen. Behind the scenes, Ole served as head booker for WCW. Over the years, more real and fake Andersons joined the fold. There's Arn's legit son, Brock, but also there's current WWE star, Carl Anderson. I mean, hell, according to Kayfabe, Ric Flair is part of the family as Arn's cousin. And don't even get me started on CW Anderson. Number two, the Dudleys. Well, here we go. Whilst you may only know Bubba Ray, Devon, and maybe Spike, the Dudley clan is much larger and stranger than you could ever imagine. The family's backstory is that Big Daddy Dudley used to travel around Dudleyville, impregnating many different women as he went. As a result, his sons were all born to different mothers and ended up all different shapes, sizes, and appearances. In ECW, the original three members of the Dudley clan were Dudley Dudley, Big Dick Dudley and Snot Dudley. They were followed by Dances with Dudley, Chubby Dudley and Sign Guy Dudley. Bubba Ray didn't actually turn up until late 1995 and Devon until 1996. Even if the family just consisted of Bubba, Devon and Spike, they would still go down as one of the all-time great made-up families. The Dudley's exploits as a tag team are legendary and each man has done enough on his own to certify themselves as legends. Still, for ECW's commitment to the bit and for the sheer size and ludicrous nature of the wider brood, the entire Dudley family has earned its spot this high up the list. Number one, the Brothers of Destruction. Few wrestlers inspired by other wrestlers have been quite as successful as Kane. The Big Red Machine first turned up in WWE in 1997 to interfere in the first ever Hell in a Cell match. He was there to attack his brother, The Undertaker, who had left him scarred and disfigured after setting fire to his parents' funeral home. Or so we thought, we weren't to know at the time. Over the years, the Hellish Brothers have fought many battles as friends and foes. They faced each other twice at WrestleMania, won numerous tag team championships, buried each other alive, set each other on fire, and Kane even once played with Taker's Hot Wheels without telling him. Well, I'm telling Dad, and speaking of Dad, we have to mention Paul Bearer. As Kane's kayfabe father, the Keeper of the Urn also gets a spot on this list. His time as a manager to both men was essential to their respective successes, and he deserves just as much praise as the actual wrestlers for his contributions to this whole saga. For their successes together, on their own, and for giving us the greatest satanic soap opera in all of entertainment, the brother Brothers of Destruction and Paul Bearer are easily the greatest kayfabe family in all of wrestling. One of the keys to a successful career in professional wrestling might be longevity, but some wrestlers have managed to have quite the remarkable runs that only lasted a few years. Indeed, there is nothing to say that you can't win titles, perform on pay-per-views, make history, and make money in a limited window of time. These lot proved it, even if in many cases their runs were ended due to factors outside of their control or in tragic circumstances. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 short but spectacular pro wrestling careers. Join us! Number 10, Blitzkrieg. I'm not one to believe in time travel, unless it's a bank holiday weekend and I happen to be watching the Back to the Future trilogy, but former WCW star Blitzkrieg has me thinking it might be possible. The high-flying masked man showed up as if from nowhere in early 1999, dazzled everyone with his revolutionary offense, and then disappeared less than a year after making his TV debut. In that short time, Blitzkrieg, who had been wrestling on the indie since 1994, got to work with some true legends, including Rey Mysterio and Eddie Guerrero, and positively stole the show in a barn burner with Juventud Guerrero at Spring Stampede. The man under the hood, Jay Ross, seemingly grew tired of the bumps and bruises and grind of the road, and after reportedly suffering a nasty concussion, decided to quit the business. The 1999 Wrestling Observer Rookie of the Year never wrestled again, choosing instead to become a computer technician before changing careers and becoming a registered nurse. He made one post-retirement wrestling-related appearance to publicly pass his gimmick to Jack Evans, a man he had inspired to become a wrestler. 
Number 9. Droz Darren Drozdov was a promising American football player whose skill on the gridiron saw him make it all the way to the NFL. His football career was ended due to injury, but the former nose tackle for the Denver Broncos attracted interest from the world of sports entertainment due in part to his athletic ability and in part due to his ability to regurgitate on cue. The man first known as Puke and then simply Droz had a brief spell in ECW before debuting on WWE television. Droz was lucky in that he showed up right as WWE were at their hottest. He got to participate in the infamous Brawl for All tournament, team up with the Legion of Doom, and then form a promising duo with Prince Albert. Of course, Droz was unlucky in that his career was cut short and his life changed forever when he suffered a severe neck injury at the October 5th, 1999 SmackDown and Heat tapings. Paralyzed upon impact, the 30-year-old has had to use a wheelchair ever since. Considering he was only around for really 18 or so months, Droz managed to pack a lot into such a short amount of time. Number 8. Tom McGee Few wrestlers have been so intrinsically linked to one match as Tom McGee. The former powerlifter and bodybuilder and runner-up in the 1982 World's Strongest Man competition will forever be tied to the mythical October 7th, 1986 non-televised dark match he had with Bret Hart, which remained unseen for decades until it was dug up and broadcast, complete with accompanying documentary, on the WWE Network in 2019. The story goes that the Hitman did such a good job of making the massively muscular and surprisingly agile McGee look better than he really was that Vince McMahon was convinced that he had just unearthed the next Hulk Hogan-like megastar. The illusion unfortunately fell apart when Mega Man was in the ring with other opponents, however, and his career never really took off. But McGee, for all his technical faults, did have a five-year career in the business that, aside from the Bret Hart match, yielded a few highlights. He worked for trainer Stu Hart's Stampede Wrestling promotion as well as overseas for All Japan before quitting the business in 1990. Number 7. Sean O'Hare Size, strength, frightening agility, and a million-dollar look. Of all the graduates from the WCW Power Plant training facility, Sean O'Hare had the most upside. Debuting on television in the summer of 2000, O'Hare, along with tag partner Mark Jindrak, was one of the few bright spots in the dying days of the company. The natural-born thrillers won the WCW tag team titles, and O'Hare in particular looked like a future main eventer. He would have to wait for his opportunity after WCW was bought by WWE, but in early 2003, he re-emerged with a new and intriguing Devil's Advocate gimmick. Paired with Roddy Piper, O'Hare got a decent push initially, which included a rare victory over Mr. America, who I think was Hulk Hogan under a mask? Regrettably, things went a bit wobbly after that due to backstage issues, a motorcycle accident, and other outside-the-ring incidents, and O'Hare was released in early 2004. Subsequently turning his attention to MMA, the Year 2000 Wrestling Observer Rookie of the Year did manage to squeeze in a couple more post-WWE matches, including a Tokyo Dome showdown with Hiroshi Tanahashi. Number 6. Monty Brown Monty Brown was a feared American football player who turned out for the Buffalo Bills at the Super Bowl before an ankle injury forced him to change vocations. With his size, look, and charisma, professional wrestling was a natural fit for him, and he made his debut in 2001. An obvious prospect, he was still undeniably a little rough around the edges and only wrestled a handful of matches in those early years. The Alpha Male's big break came in 2004 when he returned to TNA and got over in a major way, sending him rapidly up the card. Unfortunately, he was unable to unseat NWA champion Jeff Jarrett, but Brown was always in the mix and got to work with some top stars in major programs. After his TNA deal expired, he was picked up by WWE and placed on ECW. He may have been one of the faces of that brand had he not suddenly had to leave the company and retire from wrestling in order to look after a family member. Really only on the wrestling world's radar for a few years, Monty is one of the industry's great what-ifs. That said, his accomplishments and impact, pardon the pun, should not be overlooked. Number 5. Sable WWE went to great lengths to bag Mark Merrow, signing him to a then-rare guaranteed contract due to Vince McMahon believing that the former Johnny B. Bad could be a headliner. However, it was Mark's wife, Rena, who accompanied him to his WWE job interview and was duly signed after she had wiped Vince's saliva off her, that became the bigger superstar. 
Debuting initially as the valet of Hunter Hearst Helmsley, it didn't take long for the blonde beauty to capture the hearts and, um, minds of the Attitude Faithful. Sable was a sex pot pinup, the likes of which WWE had never really seen before, and the company exploited it for all it was worth for a couple of years. And the ratings spoke for themselves. They said that male 18 to 34 demographic really likes Sable. The former women's champion then shockingly left the company in the spring of 1999 and sued them for, amongst other things, sexual harassment. That didn't totally burn Sable's bridge, however, and after four years of trying to forge an acting career and flirting with other wrestling endeavors, she was brought in for another run before leaving again to start a Viking family with new boo Brock Lesnar. Number 4. Magnum TA if you were to create the perfect babyface for the 1980s, particularly one focused on the southern market, you would end up creating Magnum TA by default. With his Tom Selleck moustache, jacked physique and badass demeanor, he was the sort of guy women in the audience fawned over and guys in the audience wanted to have a beer with, and vice versa in some cases too, I'm sure. Having caught fire while working for Jim Crockett Promotions thanks to booking that protected his relative inexperience, a tag team with the ever-popular Dusty Rhodes, and a gripping blood feud with the despised Tully Blanchard, Magnum was well on his way to the NWA heavyweight title. In fact, with the American Dream booking the territory and Magnum being a proven draw, he likely would have captured it in either late 1986 or early 87. However, fate intervened, and just a few weeks out from Starcade 86, Terry Allen crashed his car in an accident that almost cost him his life. It didn't, thankfully, but it did end a career that was only going to get better and better. Number 3. Nick Mondo The name Sick Nick Mondo might not be familiar to many, but to fans of ultra-violent deathmatch wrestling in the early 2000s, he was a true superstar. Mondo debuted for Upstart Combat Zone Wrestling in 2000 and quickly made a name for himself thanks to the extreme punishment he was willing to endure for his art. Tables, ladders, chairs, glass, barbed wire, we Whackers, nothing was off limits in a sick Nick Mondo match, and he became a cult hero in the Philadelphia based promotion, winning the CZW Iron Man title, tag team titles, and the second ever Tournament of Death. Even those that didn't necessarily watch CZW knew of Mondo due to the gory photos of him that would be published in the wrestling magazines. Of course, pro wrestling ain't ballet, and deathmatch wrestling is more like bullfighting, only the bull is covered in spikes and you're tied to a pole wearing a bright red suit. Naturally, Mondo accrued several major injuries during his fleeting career, which forced him to hang up his light tubes just four years into it at the age of 23. He's maintained a slight connection to the business as a filmmaker and was the man behind John Moxley's post-WWE vignettes and hype videos. Number 2. Hana Kimura the daughter of professional wrestler and mixed martial artist Kyoko Kimura, Hana Kimura decided to follow in her mother's footsteps and started training with Japan's Wrestle 1 promotion in the mid 2010s. It wasn't long before her services were in demand in her homeland, where she split her time between Wrestle 1, Sendai Girls, and Stardom, as well as overseas for Ring of Honor, Pro Wrestling Eve, and in Mexico. It was for Stardom, however, where Hana really excelled and became a true star, capturing the organization's Artist of Stardom and Goddess of Stardom Championships, as well as winning 2019's five-star Grand Prix Tournament. Clearly a name on the rise and possessing boundless energy, enthusiasm, and charisma, Hana Kimura looked destined to become one of the biggest female stars in the business. That was obvious when she was chosen to represent stardom and help kick off New Japan's Wrestle Kingdom event in front of a packed Tokyo Dome on January 4th, 2020. Tragically, Hannah would take her own life less than six months after, being the recipient of online bullying and harassment due to her involvement in a reality TV show. She was only 22. Number 1. Mohamed Hassan Young Italian-American Mark Capani got his big break after a couple of years performing in WWE's developmental system, OVW. He wasn't being called up as the newest member of the FBI, however. On the contrary, the 24-year-old was brought to Raw as disgruntled Arab-American Mohamed Hassan. It was, from the off, a controversial, button-pushing character that generated intense heat and ensured that Hassan was always involved in a major storyline. 
I mean, in just eight months, he got to work with Hulk Hogan, Shawn Michaels, Chris Jericho, Steve Austin, The Undertaker, John Cena, Batista, and more. Rumor has it that WWE may have gone all the way with the lightning rod and made him world heavyweight champion had the UPN network not demanded his removal from SmackDown following a regrettable terroristic angle that aired on July 7th, 2005, the same day as the London bombings. Released just a couple of months later and quickly announcing his retirement thereafter, Capani has since enjoyed a second career as a junior high school principal, only coming back for three independent show matches in 2018. His WWE run remains one of the most curious in pro wrestling history. The dangers in wrestling are inherent, and any number of injuries can happen at any time, from broken bones and torn tendons to concussions and beyond. And while the blade has been used to create the illusion that a move, strike, or weapon shot has busted a WWE star open, there have also been many other times where that effect has been achieved for real, aka the hard way. Normally accidental, performers have sometimes done this on purpose to enhance a storyline, match, or angle. Those absolute mad bastards. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 WWE stars who got busted open hard way. Join us. Number 10, Kurt Angle. It didn't take Kurt Angle too long to wave goodbye to his pure amateur ideals and embrace the down and dirty ethos of WWE's brand of sports entertainment. That extended to getting color, which the Olympic gold medalist was happy to do when the occasion called for it. Like, for example, during his epic WWE title match with Stone Cold Steve Austin at SummerSlam 2001. There was no need for him to bleed during or after his mid-card match with Mark Henry on the August 15th, 2002 episode of SmackDown, the new kid on the block Rey Mysterio and his tricky knee braces saw to it that Angle shed some claret. Following his victory over the world's strongest man, Angle was attacked by the masked man and sent to the outside with a top rope Hurricane Rana, a spot which incidentally needed to be filmed three times as they kept bungling it up. The third time wasn't the charm for old Kurtz, whose head came into contact with Rey's brace, breaking the skin. 14 stitches were required to close the wound. Rumor has it that Angle also needed an extra pint of milk to numb the pain. Number 9. Finn Balor Hell in a Cell is perhaps WWE's most feared stipulation match. In these more sanitized times, however, the cage may have gotten bigger and turned red for a bit for some reason, but the threat of danger has noticeably decreased. Thankfully, we got a decent amount of gore for Edge and Finn Balor's cell encounter at WrestleMania 39. I say we're thankful for the unintentional bloodshed giving the cell itself an element of danger that it had been missing for a while, but we are obviously not glad that the Judgment Day leader got his head caved in with a steel ladder. It was hard to properly see the outcome since the match official momentarily halted proceedings and Balor was in full demon mode makeup, but the evidence was on the canvas for all to see as the match chugged along. Just the 14 staples for Finn and his demonic laceration afterwards. Number 8. Lita It is exceptionally rare to see WWE's female performers get busted open, but it does happen every now and again. We've seen plenty of black eyes and bloody lips over the years, especially in more recent times as the performance level and physicality of the women's division has increased dramatically, but very seldom does the red stuff flow freely. I suppose if there was a time you would want it to happen, a championship match on a major pay-per-view would be the place. Future WWE Hall of Famers Ivory and Lita were duking it out for the right to censor members' women's title when a live round caught the Team Extreme's plucky daredevil. The potato shot opened Lita up and added some decent drama to what had been, in truth, a rather scrappy contest to that point. It started out as a trickle, but before long, the left side of Lita's face was the same color as her hair, with the plasma staining Ivory's white shirt, too. Somewhat surprisingly, considering the amount of blood that spouted from it, only a couple of stitches were required to close the cut. Number 7. Randy Orton In a post-PG world, the practice of blading, intentionally cutting yourself with a razor blade to induce blood flow, was strictly outlawed by WWE. Dave Batista found out the hard way when he was fined a hundred grand for gigging during a cage match main event with Chris Jericho on an episode of Raw in 2008. Turns out Vince McMahon wasn't keen on his wrestlers mutilating themselves on his flagship show, but his stance was different when it came to drawing blood with Brock Lesnar's elbows eight years later. At SummerSlam,
SummerSlam 2016, Lesnar battered the skull of the legend killer to win the match via technical knockout. Not only did the very real blows from the former UFC heavyweight champion give Orton a concussion, go figure, it also caused a pool of blood to form next to him on the canvas. All in all, it took 10 staples to put Randy together again. It was a powerful visual and had some fans questioning whether Lesnar had gone into business for himself, fueled by Shane McMahon marching out and an uninformed Jericho throwing a tizzy about the situation backstage. It was all part of a perplexing plan to, I suppose, make Brock look like a monster because he really needs the help, doesn't he? Number six, Roman Reigns. Back with the Beast Incarnate now and another incident where his pointy appendage did some damage during a major main event. A lot can be said about Brock's WrestleMania 34 headliner with Roman Reigns, that it was slow, boring, repetitive, lacked heat, wasn't what people wanted to see, didn't click, turned into a complete disaster. Well, you get the picture, but they at least strived for epic out there. As the match descended into train wreck territory, Lesnar mounted Reigns and cut him open with a series of hard elbow strikes. I mean, he really opened him up because the big dog sprung a gusher out there. It spurred on his futile comeback before falling to an F5, but the visual of a bloody Roman sporting the proverbial crimson mask, his eyes bulging out of his head, was one of the bout's only highlights. After the show, rumors ran rampant that the juice was of the artificial variety and that the tribal chief had, shock horror, used blood capsules to get the desired effect. This was dispelled when Reigns came out on Raw the next night with his forehead seriously swollen up and WWE confirming that 12 sutras and 10 staples were needed to plug the cut up. Number 5. Brock Lesnar and we are back with more Brock Lesnar, though this time he's on the receiving end. Hey, nobody ever said he couldn't dish it out and take it. Since his WWE return in 2012, Lesnar has made a habit of getting split open either intentionally or otherwise. One of the gnarliest instances of Brock getting bloody came on the February 25th, 2013 episode of Raw when he engaged in a vicious brawl with a returning Triple H. Lesnar went head first into the ring post, turning himself into a human hot dog with extra ketchup due to a cut that required 18 staples to close. He got cut in the WrestleMania 31 main event as well as during a Madison Square Garden house show outing with Austin Theory on the road to WrestleMania 38. Those were all apparently accidental, but there have been some intentional instances too, such as his 2015 Hell in a Cell war with The Undertaker and his grudge match with Cody Rhodes at Backlash 2023 where he collided with the exposed turnbuckle. People sometimes question Brock's love for the business, but not many in recent memory have so willingly risked their lovely pink skin for it. Number 4. Bobby Lashley when the new World Heavyweight title was ushered in via a thrown-together tournament, it felt like any real sense of proper stakes or high drama was sorely lacking. Big Bad Bobby Lashley inadvertently turned his two tournament matches into more of a spectacle when he got cut open on the May 12th, 2023 edition of SmackDown. On his way to a triple threat triumph over Austin Theory and Sheamus, the Almighty was launched into the steel stairs by Theory, causing the gash. He may have been opened up and dripping fluid out of his head, but Lashley rallied and won the match. Later in the freaking night, he met AJ Styles for the chance to freaking square off with Seth freaking Rollins in the freaking final. During the match with the phenomenal one, Bobby's cut was opened once again. Styles, ever the wrestling strategist, targeted it by repeatedly smacking him in the noggin. A great strategy, you have to admit, and one that paid off as AJ booked his place in the final while Lashley looked like a warrior in defeat. Number 3. CM Punk. The main event all-star Money in the Bank ladder match from the 2013 pay-per-view of the same name was a rough night at the office for several of the combatants. Christian suffered a chipped tooth, while both CM Punk and the returning Rob Van Dam ended up leaving Philadelphia with a little more metal in their heads. RVD got 14 staples for a gash in his forehead, which, while no doubt painful, did not result in that much blood lost. Punk, on the other hand, had it running in his 
his eyes after Paul Heyman turned on him by braining him with a ladder. Talk about adding injury to insult, eh? The Straight Edge Superstar got 13 staples for the pleasure. It wasn't the first time Friendly Phil had been busted open hard way during a PG era pay-per-view as his match with Rey Mysterio at Over the Limit 2010 had to be momentarily stopped just minutes in, much to the annoyance of Punk, who waved off any mid-match attempts to clean him off. Interestingly, Punk was the architect of one of WWE's most obvious blade jobs ever during a cage match with Jerry Lawler, but the then WWE champion wasn't fined or suspended for it. Number 2. Beth Phoenix Back to the fairer sex now, and I suppose the Royal Rumble match increases the likelihood of an in-ring accident happening? With 30 females entering the bout and so much going on, it's hardly surprising that there could be some timing issues, miscommunications, or other mistakes that could result in accidental injuries. Entering the 2020 Women's Rumble with just five days' notice, Beth Phoenix was booked to last almost half an hour before being eliminated. Shortly after getting in the ring, however, the Glamazon cracked the back of her head off the ring post while grappling with Bianca Belair on the turnbuckles. As the match wore on, Beth's hair began to change colour, to the point that Edge must have been sat backstage wondering when his blonde wife decided to become a redhead. Credit to Phoenix for sticking to her task and continuing to wrestle as her mane became matted with blood. Edge would reveal afterwards that the cut required six staples to shut and praised his missus for her toughness. Number 1. Paul London The Cruiserweight title match between Paul London and Billy Kidman from the April 7th, 2005 episode of SmackDown should have been a routine bit of business. You know, the two go out there, put on an entertaining contest for the five or six minutes they were allotted before getting the hell out of Dodge. While the former tag team championship partners had engaged in a personal feud in the past, it had really been put to bed many months ago. On this night, however, things took a turn for the dramatic when Kidman went to scoop his opponent out of the ring. On his way between the bottom and middle rope, London hit his head on an exposed steel bolt, busting him wide open. This forced something of a script change, with referee Charles Robinson intervening in an attempt to stop the match. Despite leaking plasma, London did what any good babyface champion would do and fought through the pain to eke out a victory via a roll-up. London later called the unplanned blood a gift from the wrestling gods and the following week cut a fiery promo while wearing a bandage, but WWE neglected to fully capitalize on it and all London had to show for his efforts was a nice scar. Whether it's a revise, a retcon, or a full-on rewrite, World Wrestling Entertainment have not been shy about meddling with their own history. There are various reasons for this, from saving face and avoiding legal issues to exaggerating accomplishments and progressing storylines, but it can be pretty maddening for longtime fans who witness something happen one way just for it to be retold through WWE's own filter. When looking for the WWE history book, perhaps you should check the fiction section first. I'm Adam Pachisi from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 times WWE rewrote their own history. Join us. Number 10. Getting the F Out On May 6, 2002, WWE officially changed its name from the World Wrestling Federation to World Wrestling Entertainment. Fans were well prepped for the switch of initials thanks to an effectively amusing ad campaign about the company getting the F out. Now, Vince McMahon would have you believe that the decision to switch from WWF to WWE was about emphasizing the entertainment aspect of his brand of sports entertainment while moving further away from that disgusting pro wrestling nonsense. In truth, WWE fought the change necessitated after WWE breached an agreement with UK-based conservation group the World Wildlife Fund every single step of the way. The Panda people laid the smackdown on Vince's legal team in court, resulting in WWE being unable to use the Scratch logo that debuted in 1998, as well as the WWF letters in specified circumstances. WWE attempted to spin the ruling in their favor with a frankly laughable press release, but anyone who had actually followed the saga knew that WWE was simply in the wrong and paid for their mistakes. Number 9. Kane's Burns from the get-go, it was stressed by WWE that Kane wore a mask to hide the burns he sustained to his face in a fire that The Undertaker had set in an attempt to burn down the family funeral home and murder his younger sibling. <laughs> Brothers, eh? 
This really added to the big red machine's aura and also made fans want to see just how disfigured the ugly freak was under the hood. We got the occasional inconclusive glimpse before Kane lost a World Heavyweight title versus mask match against Triple H on the June 23rd, 2003 episode of Raw. And then we got a load of smudged mascara and a skullet. So what happened here then? Well, it's entirely possible that WWE didn't think ahead, shocking I know, and plan for the possibility of Kane taking his mask off when they penned his elaborate backstory. Scrambling for an explanation of the absence of scarred flesh, it was instead claimed that the burns the devil's favourite demon had suffered were merely psychological. So, was it also all in DX's head when they were visibly repulsed after unmasking him backstage in 2000? Boy, I really hope somebody got fired for that blunder. Number 8. Hogan Slamming Andre in the main event of WrestleMania 3, the irresistible force met the immovable object when Hulk Hogan defended his WWE title against Andre the Giant. The Hulkster won the match, becoming the first person in history to both slam and pin the seven-footer. Well, at least that's how WWE tells it. The Hulkster himself will tell it that he slammed Andre as a shoot, brother, tearing every muscle in his back in the process, but that's another lie for another time. In reality, Andre had been slammed multiple times by many different people. Harley Race, Kamala, Stan Hansen, and even Hogan himself, among others, had slammed him in the past. And you know what? Hogan previously did it on a major WWE show, no less. Now, Andre taking a slam wasn't exactly a regular occurrence, and most of these happened in other territories or overseas in Japan, but they did happen. Same goes for the big man losing, even if he did have a healthy win percentage. Hog's feat at Mania 3 is impressive enough in itself, yet WWE feel the need to inflate it along with the show's highly disputed attendance figure. Number 7. Who's your pappy? Rey Mysterio and Eddie Guerrero's feud took a personal turn in the summer of 2005 when Latino Heat revealed his big secret and confessed that he was the biological father of Rey's son Dominic. As the story went, Guerrero sired a child while he and wife Vicky were on the outs. After Eddie proved unwilling to raise the boy himself, Mysterio and his wife Angie adopted him. The soap opera twist led to a ladder match for the custody of Dominic at SummerSlam 2005, oh wrestling, which was won by Ray. He may have won custody, but according to the storyline, Dominic was Eddie's biological child. Fast forward 15 years, Dom decides to get into the business himself and is paired with his actual biological father. WWE dropped the pretense that Dominic was a Guerrero by blood while playfully referencing and poking fun at his previous kayfabe lineage. WWE obviously couldn't perpetuate the falsehood following Eddie's passing and weren't going to meddle with a proper father-son team when Dominic stepped into the ring, but it's funny how such a major plot point has been disregarded. Number 6. Goldberg's Run-In Speaking of Eddie, how about that time he beats Brock Lesnar in the main event of No Way Out 2004 to win the WWE title? What a moment it was when Latino Heat countered the F5 with a DDT onto the title belt and hit the frog splash for a feel-good three count. All that after battling the beast for 30 minutes with no help whatsoever. Well, that is apart from the timely assist provided by Goldberg after the referee was bumped, but let's not bring that little wrinkle up, shall we? Yes, even though WWE sneakily omit that part when celebrating Guerrero's title triumph, it did happen. The man had shown up earlier in the night and attacked the next big thing prior to being removed from the arena by security. He must have managed to break free and sneak back in because he came back later to spear Lesnar while Brian Hebner was taking a nap. To be fair, it was only a false finish and didn't lead directly to the finish itself, but it's pretty amusing how WWE scrubs it from the match's recap. Number 5. The Monday Night War I mean, where do we even start with this one? They say history is written by the victors, and you don't have to convince me twice after seeing how WWE likes to tell the tale of the Monday Night War. If you listen to WWE's version of their mid to late 90s feud with WCW, you will hear of how Ted Turner bought all of the McMahon made stars due to his limitless checkbook, how WCW played dirty by doing heinous things like revealing the results of WWE's pre taped shows live on air, and how D Generation X turned the tide by invading WCW with a tank. 
Honestly, the picture WWE paints is so distorted and one-sided, it is beyond ridiculous. It wouldn't be so bad, but their version of the so-called war is considered legit by many fans who only really know of it because of WWE-produced media. To them, the valiant mum and pop promotion managed to overcome the evil corporation due to their creativity, determination, superior storytelling, and homegrown stars. The reality is, of course, far, far different. Number 4. Jamaican Me Crazy when Kofi Kingston burst onto the scene in 2008, much was made of his Jamaican heritage. Pre-debut vignettes showed him on the beaches of his homeland, he had reggae-inflected entrance music, wore Jamaican flag colours on his gear, and, oh yeah, he was called Kofi Kingston and spoke with a heavy Jamaican accent. At some point, shortly before Bragging Rights 2009, Kofi simply dropped the accent and started being billed from his real home country of Ghana, West Africa. Naturally, that cheeky DX chappy Triple H couldn't just let it slide and called Kingston out about his disappearing accent during a promo. And that was that, to be honest. No explanation or reasoning for the change, just a wink and a nod and a friendly crotch chop and time to move on. And that was for the best, really, since the New Day member only did the Jamaican thing on the indies because Prince Nana was doing a Ghanaian Prince gimmick in Ring of Honor and he didn't want to be accused of trying to copy him. I mean, the accent may be gone, but I wish those bumberclarts would bring back that banging SOS theme. Number 3. Benoit Right, so we go from something relatively light and playful to this. Look, you cannot talk about WWE history without talking about Chris Benoit. The Rabid Wolverine was a major part of it between 2000 and 2007, though WWE have went to great lengths to erase him from their history ever since the Benoit family tragedy. Faced with an unprecedented situation, the company decided to refrain from mentioning Benoit's name going forward. His name still appears in the history books, but Chris Benoit isn't searchable on the network and his name and likeness doesn't appear on WWE programming wherever possible. So, when the Radicals jumping from WCW to WWE gets brought up, it's Eddie Guerrero, Dean Malenko and Perry Saturn who are shown. When WrestleMania 20 is discussed, the big matches were Eddie's WWE title victory over Kurt Angle and The Undertaker's return against Kane, and not the Canadian Crippler's World Heavyweight title win in the main event. Some may argue that Benoit's career shouldn't be overlooked, but given the circumstances, WWE really had no choice but to take the position they have in distancing themselves from him. Number 2. Reeking of Dishonesty and now back to levity with the curious case of Edge and Christian. Were they supposed to be best friends? Were they supposed to be brothers? Do you even think you know them? Something certainly reeks here and it ain't of awesomeness. From Christian's WWE debut, it was said that he and his fellow Brood member were legit siblings, something that was continually parroted over the course of the next many years. There were even some humorous skits where Captain Charisma was ghosted by their grandma Edna, which was one of the reasons Christian ended up turning on the Rated R Superstar in 2001. Fast forward to the 2010 draft and Christian is giving an emotional speech, talking about how close the two were and how he remembers their first meeting in 6th grade and HOLD THE FORT! Just like that, Edge and Christian were no longer battling brothers, but best buds. And that's the actual truth of the matter, of course, as Jay Rezo and Adam Copeland are not related by blood, but bonded by friendship and spandex and baby oil and all that good stuff. Number 1. Revising the Warrior In 2005, WWE released a hatchet job DVD called The Self-Destruction of the Ultimate Warrior. In it, the former WWE Champion was roundly criticised and mocked by his former colleagues, then-current stars, and even Vince McMahon himself. Jim Helwig was on the outs with the company at the time and wasn't exactly making any friends with his outrageous hate-filled actions and statements like cheering on Bobby Heenan's cancer diagnosis. Warrior would continue to be at odds with WWE until fences were finally mended in 2014. When Helwig died just days after being inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame, the company quickly went to work in lionizing the face-painted superstar, including greenlighting a new, much more flattering documentary and establishing the Warrior Award in his honor. In this new documentary, released just nine days after his passing, the Ultimate Warrior was portrayed as being a transcendent icon of the industry who had been perhaps misunderstood by his peers. 
The self-destruction DVD, as well as the resultant litigation, was briefly covered in the piece, but WWE swiftly buried the animosity and returned to a more positive tone. I mean, I'm all for letting bygones be bygones, but the total 180 performed here was as jarring as an Ultimate Warrior promo. What would the biggest party of the summer be without a good old-fashioned title change to celebrate? As one of the original Big Four, we've seen plenty of major ones take place at SummerSlams over the past 35 years. But whether major or minor, a title change doesn't necessarily lead to a great title reign. These bad lads, however, had us drinking out of coconuts, doing cannonballs into the pool, and obnoxiously playing loud music in public places in celebration. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 best title reigns that began at SummerSlam. Join us. Number 10, RK Bro and the Raw Tag Team Championships in 2021. SummerSlam 2021 was a momentous occasion as the event became stadium-sized once again, which was certainly refreshing after it took place in the Thunderdome a year before. How did WWE open this marquee event? By having a snake and a hippie battle a soccer mum and his giant friend for a pair of red pennies. Because how else? RK Bro, the team of Randy Orton and Matt Riddle, had been steadily building popularity since WrestleMania 37. In SummerSlam 2021's first match, they defeated the team of AJ Styles and Omos to win the Raw Tag Team titles for the very first time. Over the next 142 days, the duo defended their belts against the Street Profits, the Dirty Dogs, and even handed the Usos a rare loss at Survivor Series. Their time as champions came to an end when Alpha Academy beat them in January 2022 only for the Viper and his bro to win them back two months later. Why didn't WWE just book them to have one long uninterrupted reign, you ask? Look, this was when Vince was still fully in charge. Nothing really made any sense. Number 9. Seth Rollins and the Intercontinental Championship in 2018 in another SummerSlam opener three years earlier, Seth Rollins defeated Dolph Ziggler to win his second Intercontinental title. The match was noteworthy for two reasons. One was that a recently returned Dean Ambrose was in Seth's corner, and the other was that there wasn't a giant countdown timer on the screen to distract the fans. Whilst Rollins' reign lasted a healthy 119 days, hardly any of that time was spent as a solo act. The very next night on Raw, Roman Reigns lit up the shield signal and reformed his old group to take on his nemesis, Braun Strowman. This led to a three-on-three -three feud between the boys in vests and Strowman, Ziggler, and Drew McIntyre. They were called the Dogs of War, remember that? Whilst he had to share the spotlight, this run for Rollins still produced some excellent matches, and he even became a double champion when he and Ambrose won the tag belts. Had the lunatic fringes heel turn in the wake of Roman's leukemia diagnosis gone smoother, this could have been an even better reign. Sadly, Dean just beat Seth for the belt in a pretty boring match at TLC, then went around getting injections in his bum. Number 8. Bret Hart and the Intercontinental Championship in 1991 the match made in heaven advertised for SummerSlam 1991 wasn't actually a wrestling match at all. Instead, it was Randy Savage marrying Miss Elizabeth. Personally, I'd have liked to see Macho versus Liz, but whatever. An actual match that was truly divine was Bret Hart defeating Mr. Perfect in a flawless technical bout to win his first ever WWE singles gold. Because Raw wasn't a thing yet and WWE only did four big shows a year, it's a little bit more tricky to track Hart's progress as Intercontinental Champ. Still, he defended the belt regularly on house shows and made some major televised appearances too. He had a regular series of matches against Ted DiBiase including a time limit draw in Madison Square Garden. He also retained the gold against none other than Ric Flair on a couple of occasions, a whole 13 years before the Nature Boy would finally win the IC belt for himself. After 144 days of action, a case of kayfabe flu, the deadliest of all, meant that Hart lost the belt to the Mountie at a 1992 house show. Losing to a bloke in fancy dress isn't great, but at least this opened the door for Roddy Piper to win the title a few days later, so we move on. Number 7. Damian Priest in the United States Championship in 2021 
back to 2021 and another title change that happened on the night. No, we're not talking about Becky Lynch beating Bianca Belair because it'll just make everybody really angry all over again. Much like RK Bro, Damian Priest had also been getting more and more over during the pandemic era. Except instead of a stoner, Priest's partner was an international music sensation named Bad Bunny. After managing to shake off the stink of that god-awful zombie match, Blur, Priest worked his way up to challenging Sheamus for the United States title at the biggest party of the summer. In an excellent match, the Archer of Infamy won the gold and set off on a reign that would last a whopping 191 days. Priest would continue his feud with the Irishman before going on to defend the belt against the likes of AJ Styles, Jeff Hardy, Sami Zayn, and Dolph Ziggler. He was booked to look nice and strong during this reign, and more importantly, Importantly, no undead creatures showed up. After dropping the belt to Finn Balor, Priest went to his weird Jekyll and Hyde phase that we would all like to forget about. But don't worry, he would join the Judgment Day shortly after. Number 6. Antonio Cesaro in the United States Championship in 2012 What's this? A title change that happened on the pre-show? And it was actually good? There must be some sort of mistake. Live on YouTube, of all places, horrible sight, wouldn't catch me using it, a pre-name change Antonio Cesaro defeated Santino Morella to capture his first and only United States title. The Swiss Superman was booked to look super tough against the bumbling Italian, steamrolling him in several rematches over the next few weeks. Then he would go on an impressive run of pay-per-view appearances defending the red, white, and blue belt. Sure, none of them had that much storyline behind them, but this was a mid-card WWE title in the early 2010s. Expectations were a lot lower. Cesaro would also travel down to the newly revamped NXT a few times, defending his belt against Tyson Kidd and Adrian Neville. This was a precursor to his own incredible rundown in developmental, where his feud with Sami Zayn would light the brand on fire. After 239 days, Cesaro dropped the title to Kofi Kingston. Number 5. Bret Hart and the WWE Championship in 1997 at just 98 days long, Bret Hart's fifth and final WWE Championship reign is the shortest one on this list. So, why is it here? Hart secured the title after special guest referee Shawn Michaels accidentally bonked champion The Undertaker on the head with a steel chair. This would spin off into their feud, which would lead to the first ever Hell in a Cell match and the debut of That's Gotta Be, That'S Gotta Be Kane! As for the Hitman, he would ramp up on his whole anti-American gimmick by going after the most patriotic wrestler in the world, The Patriot. Clues in the name, innit? After defending against Del Wilkes and then against The Undertaker, Hart rocked up for his final world title defense at Survivor Series 1997 against Shawn Michaels in Montreal. Do we really need to say anything else? Put simply, had Hart not won the title at SummerSlam, so many of the most pivotal moments in WWE history might not have ever happened. Number 4. Brock Lesnar and the WWE Championship in 2014 over a full decade after he last won the big shiny toy, Brock Lesnar recaptured the WWE Championship from John Cena in a brutal decimation of the face that ran the place. The Beast Incarnate demolished Cena, pummeling him with German suplexes until the champion must have thought he actually was in Germany. After winning the gold, Lesnar would make very infrequent appearances with it, but that just made any time he did show up feel even more special. He had an absolute barn burner of a triple threat match at the 2015 Royal Rumble before going on to defend his title in the main event of WrestleMania 31 against Roman Reigns. A match that could have ruined the night instead cemented it in history, all thanks to Seth Rollins and the best money in the bank cash in of all time. Had Lesnar defended the title more than three times during this reign, yes, that is the actual number, then maybe it would have been a little higher on this list. Still, what we got was pretty damn great, and Brock doesn't leave his dear stand for less than half a million dollars, so we should be grateful, really. Number 3. Ronda Rousey and the Raw Women's Championship in 2018 before she became the grumpiest woman to ever live, Ronda Rousey was treated as a huge deal by both WWE management and fans. After making her in-ring debut at WrestleMania 34, it was clear that the former UFC fighter was going to go on to great things. She had her first ever Raw Women's Championship match at Money in the Bank against Nia Jax, which was interrupted by Alexa Bliss cashing in her briefcase. So close. 
Never fear, just two months later at SummerSlam 2018, Rousey defeated Bliss in just four minutes to capture the gold. Her rowdiness held the title for 232 days and had quite the string of matches as champ. She made 13 televised defenses of the belt, including the main event of WWE's first ever all-female pay-per-view, Evolution. Oh, and there was also the small matter of her being one of the first three women to close out a WrestleMania, which is how her reign ended at the hands of Becky Lynch. From start to finish, Rousey's time as Raw Women's Champion was totally blockbuster, and we're unlikely to see anything like it from her again, at least not without her moaning about it every step of the way. Number 2. The Ultimate Warrior and the Intercontinental Championship in 1989 at the very first SummerSlam in 1988, the Ultimate Warrior beats the Honky Tonk Man to become Intercontinental Champion and held the belt until WrestleMania. At the second ever SummerSlam in 1989, the Ultimate Warrior beats Rick Rude to become Intercontinental Champion and held the belt until WrestleMania. Hmm, decisions, decisions. As good as Warrior beating Honky in 30 seconds was, his second IC title reign led to one of the greatest main events in Mania history. After besting the Ravishing One, Warrior held onto his gold against several legends, including in a series of matches with Andre the Giant. After crossing paths with WWE Champion Hulk Hogan in the Royal Rumble, the stage was set for a mammoth match. Hogan vs. Warrior, title for title, moustache vs. tassels. As you should all know, Warrior defeated Hogan to leave Mania 6 with both belts. The start of this reign may not have been as memorable as the first one, but the ending was so much better. Number 1. The New Day and the WWE Tag Team Championships in 2015 at SummerSlam 2015, in the second match on the card, the New Day of Big E and Kofi Kingston won a fatal four-way match to become WWE Tag Team Champions for the second time. Little did we know at the time that we were witnessing the beginning of a historical reign. By the time the group lost the belts at Roadblock end of the line, they had been champion for 483 days. That was, at the time, the longest ever continuous tag team title reign in the history of the company. Over the course of their lengthy run, New Day had memorable rivalries with the Usos, the Lucha Dragons, Gallows and Anderson, and the Dudley Boys. They introduced approximately a billion different catchphrases, props, and gimmicks to runaway success, winning over crowds every everywhere despite them supposedly being heels for a bit. This was the reign that turned the faction from despised faux gospel group into one of the most beloved factions in the history of WWE. It made E, Kingston and Woods into one of the most overacts in the business and gave the tag division a well-needed dose of positivity. SummerSlam 2015 was a new day, all right? Oh yes, it was. You've heard the expression, you've got to be in it to win it, right? Well, if you said that to any of these wrestlers, they would probably slap you right in your stupid little face. That's because these men and women have all participated in several Money in the Bank ladder matches without ever capturing the coveted briefcase. Will they ever get their turn? Who knows, but let's hope they don't end up losing any more matches. Their poor hearts and egos might not be able to bear it. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 WWE stars who have appeared in the most Money in the Bank matches without winning. Join us. Number 10, Charlotte Flair and others with three. Okay, we are getting this list off with an admittedly weird start because 10 different men and women have entered three Money in the Bank ladder matches without walking away with the briefcase. On the men's side, you've got Kevin Owens, Sami Zayn, John Morrison, Evan Bourne, MVP, Finley, and Shinsuke Nakamura. For the women, there is Naomi, Tamina, and the queen of WWE, Charlotte Flair. The reason we're putting the spotlight on Charlotte is because out of all the names we just mentioned, it's the biggest shock that she hasn't got a Money in the Bank win to her name. WWE have given her just about every conceivable accolade possible since she arrived in the company in 2013. Despite all of that though, Flair has never gotten her hands on this particular prize. Charlotte has certainly been involved in the Money in the Bank scene though, as she's been cashed in on by three separate winners. The first was Carmella in 2018. 18, and then Bailey in 2019, and finally Nikki A.S.H. in 2021. 
And you'll never guess what. All three of those women dropped the belt back to Charlotte once their reign was over. Surprise, surprise. Number nine, Becky Lynch with four. Like her fellow horsewoman, Becky Lynch failed in two separate Money in the Bank matches within the space of nine days. The 2017 edition of Money in the Bank played host to the first ever all-female ladder match. Lynch was one of the participants vying to win this historic bout, but that honor eventually went to oh, James Ellsworth. The chinless wonder, of course, technically won the match for Carmella, but SmackDown GM Daniel Bryan was having none of it. He ordered that a second ladder match containing the original participants be held on SmackDown, which was won by Carmella, again. Without the help of Ellsworth this time, fortunately. Anyway, Lynch was now a two-time loser and followed this up by coming up short in the 2018 and 2022 installments of the contest. The man is another star who has won everything there is to win, so don't be surprised if she does eventually get the briefcase at some point in her career. Chances are she'll cash in on Charlotte only to lose the title right back to her. History is not on Big Time Bex's side. Number 8, Cody Rhodes with 4. Adrenaline in my soul. Ladder matches don't suit Cody Rhodes. The American Nightmare has had several of his own nightmares when competing for the chance to cash in. Rhodes was part of the first ever ladder match to take place on the standalone Money in the Bank pay-per-view as he was in the mix for the SmackDown prize back in 2010. In a crowded eight-man affair, Cody didn't have much chance to stand out and was almost immediately forgotten about as soon as Kane won the whole thing. He came much closer the following year when he once again opened the show for the blue brand. This time he was thwarted by Daniel Bryan, who choked him at the top of a ladder to take him out of the running. Yeah, Sounds like something Brian would do. He finished up his four-year run of back-to-back -back Money in the Bank matches by failing to overcome Dolph Ziggler in 2012 and then Damian Sandow in 2013. That last one was particularly interesting as Rhodes and Sandow had been tag team partners going into the event and would feud with each other after it. Number seven, Matt Hardy with four. Our final performer with a quadruplet of shortcomings in Money in the Bank is the tornado slapper himself, Matt Hardy. The Elder Hardy Boy made his first appearance in the match in the days when it used to be a WrestleMania thing. He was part of the second ever class of Money in the Bank as six men battled out at Mania 22, one of whom was a 57-year-old Ric Flair who Hardy superplexed off a damn ladder. Matt was there the next year at Mania 23 where his main contribution was instructing his brother Jeff to destroy both Edge and himself by jumping off a jumbo ladder. Hardy made a run in at Mania 23 24 to stop MVP from winning before competing in his final two Money in the Bank matches at Mania 26 and at the first standalone pay-per-view later that year. Obviously, Matt was no stranger to ladder matches, so it makes sense that he was in so bloody many of these things. However, WWE obviously never saw him as the same level of star as they did his brother, so it also makes sense they never won one. Number six, Drew McIntyre with five. Considering that his entire gimmick was the chosen one. It's shocking that Drew McIntyre never got chosen to win the Money in the Bank briefcase during his first WWE run. The story going into WrestleMania 26 was that McIntyre couldn't actually qualify for the ladder match on his own. Instead, he needed Vince McMahon to put pressure on Teddy Long to overturn his losses. In the end, none of this actually mattered as our man Drew failed to unhook the briefcase on the day. That said, Jack Swagger failed to unhook that briefcase case too, and he still won the match. McIntyre failed at the first Money in the Bank pay-per-view later that year, which would be his final appearance in the match type prior to his 2014 release. He's actually appeared in more Money in the Bank matches since coming back to WWE, turning up in the 2019, 2021, and 2022 editions. Did his time on the indies give him the skills he needed to finally win? Absolutely not. He's on this list. He lost those three matches to Brock Lesnar, Big E, and Austin Theory respectively. And that last one really had to sting as Theory was essentially doing a retread of the Chosen One gimmick at the time. Brutal. Number five, Shelton Benjamin with five. For the first time on this list, we are talking about someone who was in the very first Money in the Bank ladder match. Shelton Benjamin was a perfect fit for this environment. He was young, athletic, and could do things that would make a veteran physicist question everything they knew about the universe. For example, 
Riddle when he ran up a ladder to deliver a clothesline to Chris Jericho, arguably Money in the Bank's first great spot. Benjamin performed so well in this first match that he was asked to come back for the following year's showcase. He was also present at WrestleMania's 24, 25, and 26, making him the only person on this list to have never competed in a ladder match at the dedicated Money in the Bank pay-per-view. Unfortunately, Shelton's dazzling ability might actually be the reason he's so high up this list. He was always available to put in a good performance, but the company were never going to pull the trigger on a world title push. And that would explain why he was in so many of these matches without ever winning one. Serves you right for being so damn talented, Mr. Gold Standard. Number four, Chris Jericho with five. Y2J might have won that first ladder match at WrestleMania 21 had Shelton Benjamin not defied logic to deliver that clothesline. Chris Jericho wouldn't return to Money in the Bank for three years when he rocked up at Mania 24. He then disappeared for another two years before taking part in the Raw match on the first standalone show. Jericho's final two Money in the Bank appearances were at the 2012 show, where Big Show cost him on that occasion, and in 2016, where he lost to then-rival Dean Ambrose. Losing a match five different times is already pretty embarrassing, but it gets worse when you remember that Jericho was the one who pitched the Money in the Bank concept in the first place. Both in storyline and in real life, Jericho is the creator of this stipulation, and yet he has never won one. The most opportune moments for him to win the briefcase would have either been back at the very first match or in 2012 so that he could have continued his feud with WWE Champion CM Punk. Alas, these moments never happened, and it's now very unlikely that he will ever win the match he had a big hand in creating. Number three, Natalia with five. When it comes to setting records that don't involve winning anything, you can always count on Natalia. The third generation superstar is the female competitor with the most money in the bank appearances without a win, clocking up five different matches without so much as a sniff of the briefcase. Like Charlotte and Becky, Natty was in the cluster known as the first two women's money in the bank matches. Because she didn't have an Ellsworth by her side, she didn't win either of them. Fast forward a year and Natalia was unable to stop Alexa Bliss from winning the contract, and then in 2019, she lost out to Bailey, followed by another unsuccessful try in 2021. Natty is another performer caught between a rock and a hard place when it comes to money in the bank. She's just too reliable a worker to be left out of the matches, but she was never going to be given the honor of actually winning. However, her participation in the 2017 match did give us that bit on Total Divas where Jim Neidhart tries to teach his daughter how to climb a ladder. We can at least be grateful for that, eh? Number two, Christian with six. Another ladder match expert, another member of the original money in the bank lineup, another match without a single Money in the Bank win to his name. Christian had to watch on as his former partner Edge scooped up the inaugural briefcase back in 2005. He was clearly devastated by this as it took him another four years to give it another go. Captain Charisma then competed in the match twice in one year, falling short at WrestleMania 26 and again at Money in the Bank 2010 a few months later. 2012 wasn't Christian's year either, and nor was 2013, and this would turn out to be the star's final final Money in the Bank appearance as he would be forced to temporarily retire from wrestling the following year. Whilst WWE were chomping at the bit to strap the rocket to Edge, that wasn't the case with his former vampiric brother. For the most part, Christian was seen as mid-card at best in WWE. With so much experience on the steel rungs, WWE were happy to give him a spot in the Money in the Bank match, but there was never a time it felt as though he had a real chance at winning it. Number one, Kofi Kingston with seven. Kofi Kingston is tied with Kane for the most Money in the Bank appearances ever. However, as the Big Red Machine won the briefcase back in 2010, the sole dishonor of being top of our countdown goes to one-third of the New Day. From WrestleMania 25 in 2009 to the 2011 Money in the Bank pay-per-view, Kofi Kingston competed in four back-to-back -back ladder matches to no avail. Sure, he got over massively with some very impressive spots, but none of this mattered when he he left the arena empty-handed. Kingston returned to the fold for the 2014 and 2015 matches, but was once again passed over in favor of Seth Rollins and then Sheamus. To date, his final Money in the Bank appearance was in 2018, when Braun Strowman devoured everyone to claim the case for himself. What makes this all worse is that Kingston was apparently meant to 
win the WrestleMania 26 match before Randy Orton blew up at him on Raw with his famous cry of STUPID! STUPID! Imagine how the world would look today if this had never happened. Okay, it probably wouldn't have changed that much, but it's nice to think of things sometimes, isn't it? With WWE television typically running the gamut in terms of the quality of the content it presents, a WWE star is never going to like absolutely everything they're asked to do on screen. This includes storylines, the real heart and soul of sports entertainment and something that, given the time invested, performers want to be nothing less than top tier. That's not only not always the case, but sometimes a star will be so displeased with their scripted saga that they'll then let the world know just how much of a bad time they had doing it. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling and these are 10 storylines WWE stars hated doing. Join us! Number 10. Stone Cold and the Bad Guy as one of the top stars the industry has ever seen, Steve Austin had the power to say no to things he didn't want to do. At the peak of his powers, Stone Cold refused programs or matches with the likes of Jeff Jarrett, Billy Gunn, and Mark Merrow, but he bit the bullet and engaged in a storyline with Scott Hall and Kevin Nash in early 2002. Rather than a dream match with Hulk Hogan, the Texas Rattlesnake was booked opposite Hall at WrestleMania 18, and the creative direction of their feud in the build-up to the showcase of the Immortals did not meet Austin's standards. The bad guy himself later claimed that Austin was annoyed because he felt that he should have been in a main event against the Hulkster and had to settle for what he got instead. To make matters worse, both Austin and Hall were going through personal issues at the time and their in-ring work suffered as a result. The bionic redneck was so disgruntled with how the feud in the match with Hall had gone that he skipped the WrestleMania after party and flew home rather than go to Raw the next night. Night. Number 9. A Rough Start for the Diamonds Diamond Dallas Page's introduction to WWE as part of the invasion was mishandled from the get-go. Rather than portray a character similar to the one that had worked so well in WCW, WWE instead had him turn into a creepy stalker who was targeting The Undertaker's then-wife, Sarah Calloway. Page gave up his guaranteed contract with WCW parent company Time Warner in order to have his WWE run and admitted that, in hindsight, he should have said thanks but no thanks when the creative direction of his feud with the dead man was presented to him. DDP pointed out how he didn't feel like him trying to seduce another man's wife made sense given that he was married to ex-Nitro girl Kimberly at the time, but he wanted to be a team player and stick things out to see where they were leading. They were leading to Dallas getting routinely pummeled by Taker and Kane and eventually pinned by Sarah on an episode of Raw, completing one of the most obvious on-screen burials in WWE history. And let me tell you, Yoga Dad, that's not a good thing. Number 8. Unfit for the King Jake Roberts was involved in some heavy-duty storylines in his day, often with a personal slant to them, but the 1996 storyline he had with Jerry Lawler revolving around his history of alcoholism is one that he wishes he had never done. The Snake had returned to the company as a supposedly changed character, renouncing his villainous hedonistic past and pushing the good word of his lord and saviour. His issues with substance abuse became the butt of the King's jokes on commentary and led to a scene where Lawler poured actual whiskey over the recovering addict, with Roberts claiming that the real stuff, rather than say iced tea, was used at the behest of Vince McMahon. Jake has long since expressed his displeasure with how the storyline went down and claims that if he could go back in time, he would say no to the idea. Say what you will about the WWE Hall of Famer and his various highs and lows over the years, but exploiting a genuine disease should not have been on the table. Honestly, some things you just don't do. I mean, how would Jerry Lawler like it if I talked about the time he number seven pretty mean storylines the Attitude Era was a golden age for regrettable storylines, as the ratings-chasing shock TV tone of the product dictated that pretty much everything was fair game as long as it could grab the audience's ever-decreasing attention span. One of the most controversial angles of the day was one that its focal point positively begged the writers not to go through with. On the January 4th, 1999 episode of Raw, an ostensibly pregnant Terry Runnels went to interfere in D'Lo Brown's match with Edge, slipped off the ring's 
steps to the floor and miscarried. It was, of course, a ruse all along, and Terry had faked it just to manipulate Brown to do her bidding until the farce was exposed. Runnels not only thought it was distasteful to use something tragic that people actually experience as fodder for a wrestling storyline, but was also worried about what the other kids in elementary school might say to her daughter Dakota. Terry had pleaded with Vince Russo not to write the storyline into the show, but Vinny Roo went ahead and did it anyway, bro. I mean, how else would the horny teenagers tuning in know that women are inherently sneaky and evil? Number six, The Edge, Hardy, and Lita Love Triangle. When Matt Hardy publicly revealed that his girlfriend Lita had been having an affair with his good friend Edge behind his back while he was at home recovering from knee surgery, then he believed it was part of some elaborate way to work fans as the beginning of some sort of reality-based storyline. It became clear that wasn't the case when Matt was subsequently fired for exposing the affair, though Edge and Lita were duly paired up on screen. Fans pretty much demanded Hardy's return, however, and WWE opted to bring him back specifically for a storyline based on the love triangle. It was awkward, it was intense, and according to everyone involved, it wasn't enjoyable to be a part of. All three parties are on record as saying they felt uncomfortable going through with it due to the strong feelings involved, but felt as though they had made their bed and now had to lie in it. Not literally, of course, and certainly not with all three of them in there. Imagine how weird that would be. Though given how the rated R superstar celebrated winning his first world title, perhaps it wasn't totally out of the question? Number 5. The Lunatic Winch there wasn't one specific thing that led to Dean Ambrose's decision to leave WWE in 2019, but his rotten late 2018 feud with Seth Rollins more than convinced him he was making the right decision to walk away. The Lunatic Fringe's persona had been getting progressively wackier over time and hit a peak or a nadir during the rivalry with his fellow former Hound of Justice. Ambrose would later describe during an episode of Talk is Jericho how he would feel physically unwell when it came time to go to Raw as he was so worried about what his creative task for the evening would be. Whether it was getting multiple inoculations to protect himself from the WWE Universe or uttering a scripted shot at the leukemia-stricken Roman Reigns, Dean would constantly have to fight against what the creative team were wanting him to do. He tried his best to make the material work, but much of it was irredeemable and turned what should have been a straightforward money-drawing program into a disappointing mess. Hey, if nothing else, at least the man looked moment Terribly cool in that fur lined leather jacket. Number four, Piggy James. Being bullied is never fun. At least I assume it's never fun. Can't say I've ever been a victim myself, though I suppose I'm lucky in that I'm really, really cool and there's nothing that people can really make fun of me for. Right, guys? Right? Anyway, yeah, being bullied is never fun, but being bullied while you're at work and having that bullying aired live to millions of people is much, much worse. And that was the fate of Mickey James in late 2009, when WWE scripted Michelle McCool and Layla to make fun of Piggy for being overweight. James believed WWE were ribbing on the square and trying to simultaneously get heat for Lay Cool while sending her a message about her physique. Which, if you look at any picture of the former women's champion from that era was hardly an issue, was it? Mickey hated it and confessed in later interviews that the others involved in the storyline weren't exactly thrilled about doing it either. James eventually triumphed over her tormentors and got her revenge, but it felt like too little too late after suffering weeks and weeks of cruel ridicule. Number 3. Kurt Angle's Charmel Obsession WWE delighted in making Kurt Angle the butt of the joke. And to be fair, the Olympic gold medalist himself also enjoyed having a laugh at his own expense, whether it was by wearing a miniature cowboy hat, doing some Shawn Michaels cosplay karaoke, or failing to read the back of Edge's 8x10 pictures. Kurt was less fond of being portrayed as a sadistic sexual deviant hell-bent on having his way with another man's wife. <laughs> Prude. The seriously bizarre storyline that saw Angle pursue Charmel was chock full of uncomfortable moments that took the direction of Kurt's character in a whole new and utterly strange direction. According to Angle, the storyline was the idea of Vince McMahon, who came up with it after hearing that the former WWE champion had dated some African American women in the past. The Hall of Famer would later say how it was the one storyline he totally regretted doing, and even though he enjoyed wrestling Booker T, would have gladly given that opportunity up if it meant not having to do what he did with Charmel. Number 2. Slick Rick and the Sassy Southern Belle 
With Ric Flair's days in the ring well and truly over, please God let them be well and truly over, his value to WWE now is pretty much associating with his daughter Charlotte. Not that the Queen needs the rub anymore, of course, but it's a natural and easy fit whenever the company wants to get Slick Rick involved. One of the Nature Boy's most recent and most lamentable contributions was his intergenerational on-screen relationship with Lacey Evans. As well as grossing out WWE fans, the storyline also made the two-time WWE Hall of Famer very uncomfortable, not least when it was implied that Flair was the father of Lacey's baby. When interviewed after the fact, the dirtiest player in the game admitted that he didn't enjoy doing the storyline and was actually a little mad about having to go through with it, but felt as though Vince McMahon wasn't about to have his creative vision questioned and so bit the bullet. Charlotte also wasn't keen on the whole affair and it was mercifully dropped so that Evans could go on maternity leave. I do still hate children but fair play to this one for saving the day. Number 1. The Big Dog Food Roman Reigns had to suffer through more than his fair share of rotten creative as a struggling babyface before he helped take control of his destiny by turning heel and becoming the tribal chief. For Reigns, the tipping point was his interminable feud with Baron Corbin. I mean, that whole story was just a total dog's dinner, wasn't it? I mean, it literally was, because at one point they were fighting because they had covered each other in dog food. While Roman himself hasn't directly commented on his frustrations with the storyline, his wise man Paul Heyman and did reveal that the feud with Corbin was the point where the head of the table said enough. Obviously, getting handcuffed to the ring post and covered in pedigree chum is embarrassing in and of itself, but the bigger issue for Reigns was how far his character had fallen and how his babyface act just wasn't working. His feud with Corbin was the drizzling you know what yes, but if it planted the seed for Roman's heel turn later in the year, then at least it wasn't completely useless. If there's two things I know plenty about, it is length and stamina. And look, that one time wasn't my fault, all right? I'd had a long day. Sharing my enthusiasm for a marathon sesh are these following wrestlers who competed in some of the girthiest matches in WrestleMania history. Did all of these matches live up to their size? Absolutely not. However, they are all special in one way or another, and some rank amongst the greatest bouts the granddaddy of them all has ever seen. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 longest WrestleMania matches ever. Join us. Number 10. Stone Cold Steve Austin vs. The Rock at WrestleMania X7, 28 minutes and 8 seconds. Talk about kicking things off in style, eh? We've only got one of the biggest WrestleMania matches of all time to start with. WrestleMania X7 is rightfully considered to be the greatest iteration in the show of show's grand legacy, thanks in no small part to its blockbuster main event. WWE Champion The Rock, Royal Rumble winner Stone Cold Steve Austin, Limp Bizkit's My Way, Deborah, I guess? The pieces were all in place for a battle for the ages, and these two gladiators did not disappoint. For the better part of half an hour, Rock and Austin battered each other in this no-holds-barred classic. With the crowd at fever pitch, the two men looked to be locked in a stalemate until Satan himself, Vince McMahon, helped the Texas Rattlesnake defeat the Brahma Bull in controversial fashion. Combine this with their other two matches at Mania's 15 and 19, and the Rattlesnake and the Great One have spent well over an hour together locked in combat on the biggest stage. Number 9. The Undertaker vs. Triple H at WrestleMania 27, 29 minutes and 23 seconds. To call WrestleMania 27 a disappointment would be unfair. You would actually have to have your hopes up in the first place to be disappointed. Can you really tell me that anyone was actually excited for John Cena vs. The Miz, or Jerry Lawler vs. Michael Cole, or Snooki? One thing that was hyped up was The Undertaker battling Triple H in a no holds barred match, and this stipulation more than met expectations. The game had made his big comeback from injury to challenge the dead man in an attempt to avenge H. HBK's career-ending loss from the year before. What followed was a brutal affair between two legends that was the best thing on the show by far. Although that's damning with faint praise if I ever heard it. Whether they knew they would have to save the card or they just wanted to get the best out of each other, Taker and Trips left it all in the ring on this night for just shy of 30 minutes. Thankfully, this list isn't ranked on how long these matches felt, otherwise this show's main event would be top with a score of about four days. 
Number 8, The Undertaker vs Shane McMahon at WrestleMania 32, 30 minutes and 5 seconds. Whilst most of the matches on this list earned their lengthy runtime, our first foray over half an hour most certainly did not. The night after Fastlane 2016, Shane McMahon made his return to WWE after eight years away. He immediately went after his father, promising to reveal an embarrassing secret about Vince if he wasn't given the chance to run Raw. In hindsight, we should probably be searching for that lockbox. Might be useful as evidence in a trial sometime soon. The Elder McMahon made a match for WrestleMania. Shane McMahon vs. The Undertaker inside Hell in a Cell with control of the red brand on the line. There was something about Undertaker's WrestleMania career as well, but nobody really cared about that. When the bell finally rang, it became painfully apparent that neither man was in their prime anymore. These two middle-aged men stumbled about the ring for over 30 minutes, somehow only managing to fit about five minutes worth of moves into that time. Sure, Shane's big jump was spectacular, but a match this lengthy needed more than one memorable spot to make it worthwhile. For the love of mankind, indeed. Number 7. John Cena vs Shawn Michaels at WrestleMania 23, 30 minutes and 5 seconds We know this spot should technically be a tie between this match here and the previous one, but there was no way we could bring ourselves to put a bout of this quality on the same level as the Snorefest from 2016. Rumor has it that Triple H was supposed to be John Cena's WrestleMania 23 opponent until Hunter's Quadricep got other ideas. Luckily for WWE, they had Shawn Michaels standing behind some glasses with the words, Break in Case of Emergency, written on it. HBK was parachuted into the main event to face Cena instead, and he was more than up to the task. I mean, of course he was. He was Sean Bloody Michaels. HBK drew out Cena's best match to date, walking the relatively inexperienced WWE Champion through over half an hour of excitement and intrigue. After coming close on several occasions, the showstopper eventually succumbed to Cena's STFU submission to give the champ one hell of a vindicating victory. Even after all these years, this might still be Big Match John's best ever Mania appearance. And it would have been his longest too, were it not for a certain electrifying man five years later. Number 6. The Rock vs John Cena at WrestleMania 28, 30 minutes and 35 seconds The night after WrestleMania 27, aka the worst hangover in wrestling history, a monumental announcement was made on Raw. John Cena and The Rock stood across from each other in the ring after the great one cost Cena his WWE Championship match against The Miz. This led to both stars agreeing to a match one year down the line, Cena vs Rock at WrestleMania 28. Once in a lifetime- <laughs> Okay, sorry, I can't get through that tagline without laughing. It was never gonna be once in a lifetime, was it? They had the rematch planned from the start. After 12 months of anticipation and CM Punk accidentally getting super over, whoops, the two future Fast and Furious alumni finally met in the main event. For 30 minutes and 35 seconds, these two attempted to put on an epic. And whilst the match was definitely really, really good, we're not quite sure it lived up to all of the 1,835 seconds that it was afforded. In the end, Rock pinned a cocky Cena to win the match. And then when it came to the rematch at WrestleMania 29, the company had learned their lesson and sliced about six minutes from the runtime. Number 5. The Undertaker vs Shawn Michaels at WrestleMania 25, 30 minutes and 44 seconds there is a reason why both Shawn Michaels and The Undertaker's names have come up multiple times on this list already and will come up a few more times before we reach the end. In the entire history of WWE, few men have been as reliable big match performers as The Phenom or The Heartbreak Kid. Even fewer are more closely tied to the event of WrestleMania. Undertaker had the streak and Shawn's nickname was literally Mr. WrestleMania. All of this would explain why, when the two stars first met at the the showcase of the Immortals, they were given such a huge chunk of time to play with. At the time, this was both the longest non-title and longest non-main event match in the show's history, and both men more than delivered on those responsibilities. I mean, what do you want us to say that hasn't already been said? This was a masterclass in storytelling, match pacing, audience manipulation, and how to make yourself three inches shorter by jumping directly into the ground. It is an all-time great, and there is a reason why it's still talked about so much. Number 4. The Undertaker vs Triple H at 
WrestleMania 28, 30 minutes and 50 seconds. Not wanting to be upstaged by his best mate, Triple H got a whole four extra seconds out of Taker for their third encounter at WrestleMania. Yes, I said third. I remember WrestleMania X7, even if WWE don't. There was a crash pad and everything. After narrowly avoiding defeat at Hunter's hands the previous year, Taker was determined to prove his dominance over the game inside Hell in a Cell. For almost 31 minutes, these two went to war with the then-retired Shawn Michaels serving as special guest ref, and there is no denying that it was packed to the gills with drama. I mean, that super kick into the pedigree kickout is one of the greatest near falls of all time. Both in kayfabe and in the minds of the fans, this was the closest the streak had come to ending up to this point. This threat elevated the drama to near Shakespearean levels and helped make this the greatest cell match in Mania history. Although, as we saw earlier, it wasn't up against particularly stiff competition. And don't even get us started on Taker vs. Boss Man. Number 3. Triple H vs. The Rock vs. Mick Foley vs. Big Show at WrestleMania 2000, 36 minutes and 24 seconds. Taking a huge leap in match times, we find ourselves at one that was overstuffed in every sense of the word. All common sense pointed to The Rock being the sole challenger for Triple H's WWE Championship at WrestleMania 2000. Rocky had just won the Royal Rumble, sort of, and was the most popular babyface in the company. Opposite him was a dastardly heel with a storied history against the proprietor of the SmackDown Hotel. These two were the tomato and cheese on the margarita pizza, until WWE decided to complicate things by shoving a load of mushrooms, peppers, capers, and pineapple on top. The one-on-one -on -one match soon became a four-way, also involving Mick Foley, The Big Show, and a McMahon in every corner. Because this was an elimination match, the whole thing dragged on for way longer than it needed to. After nearly 36 and a half minutes, Triple H pinned The Rock and nothing was gained. Thanks guys, guess I'll just sit here and think about some of the other stuff I could have done with almost 40 minutes. Number 2. Edge vs Randy Orton at WrestleMania 36 Night 2, 36 minutes and 55 seconds. Officially the longest non-title, non-main event match in WrestleMania history, this bout pitted old rivals Edge and Randy Orton against one another in a last man standing match on the second night of WrestleMania 36. After Edge's sensational return at the 2020 Royal Rumble, the Viper immediately spoiled the party by viciously assaulting his former former partner's neck the next night on Raw. After weeks of Randy becoming more and more unhinged, the two eventually faced off at the weird pandemic mania in a match that was, um, well it was really bloody long. Almost 37 minutes, as I say, a very long time, and these two did not fill that space especially effectively. Most of the match was just them plodding about backstage, occasionally stopping to fight in a gym or on the top of a truck. The stipulation certainly didn't help, as there were long pauses in the match whilst the referee counted to 10. Overall, many were left with the belief that a simple no-holds-barred match would have been far better suited to this blood feud. Number 1. Shawn Michaels vs Bret Hart at WrestleMania 12, 1 hour, 1 minute and 56 seconds. The winner by a considerable margin is, of course, the first ever televised WWE Iron Man match from WrestleMania 12. 12. After Shawn Michaels won his second Royal Rumble, he was put on a collision course with the man who would become his greatest rival. Both on screen and behind the curtain, that is. Bret Hart was the WWE Champion and had a reputation as the best pure wrestler in the world. Michaels wanted to challenge this and so it was agreed that the two super studs would face off in a one hour Iron Man match to test their endurance. Whoever scored the most pins in 60 minutes would be the champion and what was the score after the time ran out? Nothing. It was a tie at zero each. Can't quite work out if that means both men were on rare form and couldn't be pinned or had an off day and couldn't pin their opponent. The draw forced the match into overtime, which lasted a little under two minutes before Sean kicked Brett's head off to finally achieve the boyhood dream. Whether you love this match or wish it never happened, there is no denying the historical significance of the WrestleMania 12 main event. We highly doubt anything will come close to challenging spot at the top of this list anytime soon. At least we hope not, because life is simply too short, unlike WrestleMania.
Is there anything more exciting in wrestling than when the lights go out? Well, except for if you were at that TNA show where the fire alarms went off. That looked genuinely frightening. Total darkness is usually a sign that something big is about to happen. A debut, a return, a surprise attack, basically anything involving The Undertaker. The lights out spot is a classic for a reason. The Big Dub has been responsible for some of the greatest examples of this trick in wrestling history. So today we are shining a light on the times WWE did the exact opposite. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 best lights out moments in WWE history. Join us. Number 10. Alistair Black is Alistair Back Tommy End, Alistair Black, Malachi Black, Mr. Zelina Vega, whatever name he has gone by, the sinister man from Amsterdam has always had a flair for the mysterious. After he lost his NXT championship to the dastardly Tommaso Ciampa, Black was scheduled to compete for the title in a triple threat also involving Johnny Gargano. Then, right before NXT TakeOver Brooklyn 4, the former champion was found laid out in the parking lot at the hands of an anonymous assailant. Whilst Black was away, Nikki Cross was running around saying that she knew who did it. This led to an amazing interruption during a match between Cross and Bianca Belair on the October 17th, 2018 episode of NXT. Midway through the bout, the lights cut out. Somebody then put 50p in the performance center meter, only to find a returning Alistair Black sitting cross-legged in the middle of the ring. He then confronted Cross about who his attacker was as the match just sort of fizzled out. Oh well. Dramatic, surprising, and a key point in an intriguing story, NXT didn't do lights out moments often, but when they did, they were great. Number 9. Wyatt opens the door Whilst most lights out moments are surprises, sometimes a predictable one can still be effective. A recent example of this went down at Extreme Rules 2022, aka the extended pre-show for Bray Wyatt's WWE comeback. The Eater of Worlds had been one of the highest profile pandemic-era budget cuts. Now, with Triple H captaining the ship in a series of cryptic clues scattered across WWE programming, fans were hoping this would be the night he returned. After Matt Riddle beat Seth Rollins in the Fight Pit main event, the lights around the arena shut off. The audience exploded with excitement as they knew exactly what was coming. A clip of Bray singing He's Got the Whole World in His Hands started playing as we were treated to images of Firefly Funhouse iconography. Then, out of the glowing door that had appeared on the stage, out stepped Wyatt for all the world to see. This was a phenomenally theatrical return that really got people excited to see what Bray would do next. It's just a bit of a shame that what he did next was have a rubbish match sponsored by a soft drink. Number 8. Sting Saves Orton After an age of being the last big holdout from WCW not to wrestle for WWE, Sting made an incredible debut for the company at Survivor Series 2014. Then he lost a Triple H at WrestleMania, then his first match on Raw ended in DQ. He did win a tag team match, but was injured in a match with Seth Rollins shortly thereafter, and unfortunately had to temporarily retire. Cue the Hall of Fame music. The Stinger did get a couple of decent moments in a WWE ring though, like the time he played Knight in Shining Armor for Randy Orton on an episode of Raw. The Viper was surrounded on all sides by the Authority, who looked like they were about to do him in. All of a sudden, a crow flew into the arena, squawked, and then crashed into a trans Transformer, cutting all power to the building. In reality, this of course sounded the arrival of Sting, who popped up out of the darkness to assist Orton in kicking some bad guy butts. For a man who's made many surprise appearances over the years, this was one of the best. Number 7. A Big Red Comeback The February 7th, 2000 edition of Raw was home to one of the best main events in the show's history. After initially standing up to the McMahon-Helmsley regime, Chris Benoit, Eddie Guerrero, Perry Saturn and Dean Malenko joined forces with the baddies to add even more power to their ranks. This led to the Radicals teaming with Triple H to face The Rock, Cactus Jack, Rikishi and Too Cool in a massive 10-man tag. After some of the loudest crowd reactions in WWE history, the evil fivesome put away the assorted babyfaces to seemingly end the night on a sour note. That was until it all went dark. Out from the shadows came Paul Bearer and, by his side, a returning cat. 
Lane. The demon had been missing from TV for some time after being betrayed by his former best friend, X-Pac. Now, he was out for revenge and nobody was going to stop him. Kane went full beast mode here, dropping every heel in the ring with clinical precision. It's an absolutely classic Attitude Era ending to Raw and one of the best cases of WWE booking a disheartening finish only to send the crowd home happy. Number 6. Sabu Saves the Day Of all the wrestlers who utilize the lights out tactic, poor old Sabu often gets overlooked. Though his best teleportation took place in ECW, the homicidal etc etc maniac did manage to pull off one great magic act in a WWE ring. Well, sort of a WWE ring. At ECW One Night Stand 2005, Rob Van Dam gave an impassioned speech to the hardcore faithful. Despite being one of the biggest stars of the original company and one of the main campaigners for the nostalgia show, RVD was injured and thus unable to compete. This didn't stop him from taking a bump though, because of course it didn't, as he was interrupted by the man-beast Rhino. After delivering a gore to the injured extremist, Rhino looked set to finish him off when everything went black. When the lights came back up, Van Damme's bitter rival turned friend Sabu was standing right there. An ECW tribute night just wouldn't have been the same without a spot like this, so thank the barbed wire gods that they managed to fit one in. Number 5. That's not Jeff Hardy? CM Punk and Jeff Hardy had what was easily one of the best rivalries of 2009. With plenty of real-life differences between the two to draw from, WWE presented a deeply personal feud that culminated in dramatic fashion at SummerSlam. In a brutal TLC match for the World Heavyweight Championship, Punk knocked Hardy off the top of a giant ladder and then plucked the big gold belt from its hook to become the new champ. He ended the night by standing over the prone body of his opponent, sneering like the smug git he was. And then he got hit in the face by a giant dong. The Undertaker's signature bell sound hit and the lights went down. The audience cheered, but when the light returned to the arena, nothing had changed. Or had it? Unbeknownst to Punk, the dead man had replaced Hardy on the mat beneath him. Then came the big sit-up, a thunderous choke slam, and the new champ had his first contender. Had the show ended with just Punk winning, that would have been enough, but the extra surprise of a returning taker was the ghoulish cherry on the top of this incredibly violent cake. Number 4. Low Watt Bulbs The Watt chant that was inspired by Stone Cold Steve Austin is a bit like the TV show The Big Bang Theory. Some might have found it funny to start with, but the more it's gone on, the more annoying it's become. Come at me, comment section. On the January 3rd, 2002 edition of SmackDown, Vince McMahon was attempting to talk to the Washington DC crowd, but they just would not stop watting him. Then McMahon remembered he was the one in charge. To get the crowd to shut up, he ordered that all the lights in the arena be cut out. The chairman was feeling pretty bloody pleased with himself. That was until Stone Cold's music started to play. The boss ordered the lights to be turned back on, but it was too late. When they came back, Austin was in the ring behind him, and <laughs> guess what he did next? Did he A, give him a nice cake to eat, B, get down on one knee and propose, or C, give him the Stone Cold Stunner? Well, actually, you're all wrong, because the answer was D, get beaten up by Booker T and Big Boss Man. But at least the lights out part went well. Number three, oh yeah. Remember when The Undertaker went through his rebellious teenager phase and started riding motorcycles and listening to rock music? It was either the best or worst part of his career, depending on how high your tolerance for Limp Bizkit is. American Badass Taker first appeared at Judgment Day 2000 and was killed off at Survivor Series 2003. Literally killed off, Kane dumped about two tons of dirt on top of him. That is one dead bike right there. This led to a storyline where Kane was haunted by the spirit of his sibling. Although he was adamant that Taker was dead, Kane couldn't shake the spectres of his past and was forced to challenge his brother to a match at WrestleMania 20. As Kane stood in the ring waiting for his opponent, the arena predictably fell dark. What wasn't predictable though was the familiar cry of, oh yes, that pierced the air of Madison Square Garden. Paul Bearer returned to the screen for the first time in four years. His arrival heralded that of Dead Man Undertaker, who promptly defeated Kane in a short but sweet match. Number two, that's gotta be Kane. About seven years before Mania 20, Bearer took part in another great lights out moment that was practically the inverse of what I just described. In the first ever Hell in a Cell match at Bad Blood 1997, Undertaker was fighting his fierce 
rival, Shawn Michaels. Just when it looked like the Phenom had the victory in sight, suddenly nobody had anything in their sights anymore. Chilling organ music started to play, and then, bathed in a spooky red hue, Bearer strode down to the ring behind a giant man in a bodysuit and mask. In the weeks leading up to Bad Blood, Bearer had been teasing the arrival of Taker's deepest, darkest secret, his brother, Kane, who was left tortured and scarred after a fire at their parents' funeral home. And now, just as our old pal Percy Pringle had predicted, Kane was on the scene. The behemoth made his presence known immediately by ripping off the door to the cell and laying out his brother with a tombstone. This allowed HBK to win the match, but all anyone was actually interested in was WWE's newest monster, an all-time great debut. Number one, an electrifying return. WWE sparked some serious interest in WrestleMania 27 by announcing that a celebrity would be acting as the event's guest host. Who could it be? Bob Barker? Justin Bieber? Barney the Dinosaur? Okay, one of those was never a rumor. I mean, there's just no way Bob Barker was gonna do WrestleMania. This question was put to bed in style on the February 14th, 2011 edition of Raw. After Justin Roberts announced that the mystery host was set to be revealed, all the lights slowly began to shut down. First the house lights, then the WrestleMania sign, and eventually the Titantron before the entire arena was bathed in darkness. And then, if you smell what the rock is, so I'm getting carried away. For the first time in seven long years, the rock walked out in front of a WWE crowd and the reaction was otherworldly. People went bonkers for Big Dwayne's big return and the fact that he was going to be at WrestleMania made this moment even more special. In fact, the only thing that would have made it cooler was if the great one had come out with a massive flamethrower and set his own name alight. A man can dream. If WWE fans can help make a moment, match, or even an entire show, well, they can certainly break them too. While WWE would be nothing without its fans, and I don't think anybody is in any rush to return to the Thunderdome now, are they? It is true that the so-called WWE universe, or at least certain members of it, can at times be a curse rather than a blessing. From derogatory chants to ill-advised run-ins, I'm Adam Pacitti, and these are 10 WWE moments ruined by fans. Fans, join us. Number 10, Bizarro World. The big story coming out of SummerSlam 2004 was supposed to be Randy Orton becoming the youngest world champion in WWE history. In the end, though, the main story of the show was the reactions and actions of the Toronto crowd. Heavily booing supposed favorites, including hometown boy Edge and wildly cheering villains like Triple H, the fans flipped the script on WWE and threw some wrestlers off their game. Special scorn was reserved for the WWE title match between JBL and The Undertaker, which was long and, shall we say, deliberately paced? The fans amused themselves through it by doing a big Mexican wave and trying out new chants like this match sucks and end this match. One fan almost ruined the post-match angle when he hopped the barricade and jumped onto Bradshaw's limo, which had been gimmicked to collapse when the dead man chokeslammed him onto it. This all took place before fans hijacking shows became a lot more commonplace, and the unease was clearly communicated via the announcers, who have a direct line to management backstage, as they kept referring to Toronto as Bizarro World. Number 9. A Latino Beating over two years before SummerSlam 2004, WWE had other issues in the Great White North, this time in Alberta as opposed to Ontario. The May 27th, 2002 edition of Monday Night Raw was a big one for Rob Van Dam and Eddie Guerrero, who were headlining the show in a ladder match for Eddie's Intercontinental title. An exhilarating contest full of high-risk moves and stunts, arguably the most dangerous moment of the match, came courtesy of an idiot fan who decided to run into the ring and tried to push Guerrero off the ladder while he was climbing up it. Luckily for Latino Heat, he saw the lunatic out of the corner of his eye and was able to jump off it at the last second. Originally believing that the fan was Crash Holly due to the way he was dressed, Eddie became enraged when he realized it was some silly punter and gave him a swift parting shot to the face as security dragged him away. Thankfully, this unscheduled run-in didn't ruin the match, even if it did momentarily take the spotlight away from two world-class performers who were in the middle of producing something very special. Number 8. No Sympathy for the Dead Man 
One of the most shocking moments in the history of wrestling occurred at WrestleMania 30 when Brock Lesnar defeated The Undertaker to end the streak. Immediately after the referee had counted to three, there was a multitude of visceral reactions from the fans inside the Superdome. Shock, disbelief, anger, this. As the dust settled and the crowd began to realize that no, this wasn't a mistake or some sick joke on WWE's part, The Undertaker began to gather himself. Having been concussed early in the bout, Mark Calloway was a little out of sorts and probably finding it quite hard to properly digest the magnitude of what had just happened. Luckily for him, one fan was there to help him out with a kind shout of, YOU SUCK! Yes, after getting mauled by Brock Lesnar and surrendering his perfect WrestleMania record, one fan felt the best medicine for Taker was a bit of salt in the wound. It probably didn't bother him too much, to be honest, since he didn't know if he was in New Orleans or New York and immediately collapsed backstage, but it kinda killed the mood for the viewer at home. Number 7. The Death of a Babyface when the affair between Edge and Lita became public knowledge in early 2005, a small pocket of WWE fans started to express their displeasure at the couple for the infidelity, while simultaneously showing support for Lita's jilted ex-boyfriend, Matt Hardy. Matt being unceremoniously dumped by his employer only added fuel to the fire, and things came to a head when Madison Square Garden hosted the April 18th, 2005 episode of Raw. With a higher contingent of in-the-know fans in attendance, Lita was like a lamb to the slaughter when she was sent out for a segment with Trish Stratus. Though she was supposed to be the sympathetic babyface on crutches and all, the world's most famous arena treated her with nothing but disdain, showering her with loud chants of you screwed Matt and other things that would probably get us kicked off of YouTube. Trish was clearly flustered by the response and couldn't hold the segment together, resulting in it going completely off the rails. It was the hostile reaction to Lisa here that ultimately convinced WWE to turn her heel and partner her up with Edge just a few weeks later. Turned out alright in the end though, didn't it? Number 6. The Grandest Stage for a Fall The first time meeting between Brock Lesnar and Bill Goldberg was a dream match for fans who enjoy watching big, beastly men kicking lumps out of each other. Which I need to remind you, should be all of us. Booked for the 20th WrestleMania, the next big thing versus Deman was a marquee attraction for such a historic show. And it would have likely gotten the desired reactions, had it not come to light in the days leading up to the big night that Goldberg wouldn't be extending his one-year contract with WWE, and Brock had handed in his notice so that he could chase a dream of playing in the NFL. With no reason to cheer for either man, the MSG faithful decided to turn on them both and have a little fun during the collective swan song. Song. Reportedly encouraged by Shane McMahon himself, the fans gave Lesnar and Bill hell out there and they didn't have a hope of doing anything worthwhile in the circumstances. So they didn't bother. You could patently read the annoyance on both of their faces while special referee Steve Austin looked bemused by the situation. Number 5. The Rubber Chicken Run-In a great many fans were upset at WWE's decision to have Cody Rhodes lose to Roman Reigns in the main event of WrestleMania 39. A substantial portion of those trekking to California's SoFi Stadium did so with the express intention of seeing the American Nightmare finish the story and defeat the Tribal Chief to become undisputed WWE Universal Champion. A Samoan spike from Solo Sokoa put paid to that, breaking the hearts of thousands in attendance. Now, as sad as you are, you can cannot, under any circumstances, throw a rubber chicken into the ring. Yes, one cheeky scamp thought the best way to underline the pathos of Cody's bitter loss was to chuck a dog toy onto the mat next to him. Naturally, the image went viral and took some of the shine off what had been a great match and a significant moment. A couple of weeks after the fact, Rhodes mentioned the rubber chicken in a promo, essentially making it canon. Fingers crossed when Cody finally, hopefully, gets his big win over Roman at WrestleMania 40 that fans refrain from doing anything so regrettable. Bastards. Number 4. The Hit Job on the Hitman there are few living wrestlers as revered as Bret Hart. The best there is, best there was, and best there ever will be is routinely cited by many of today's crop as a direct inspiration and hero, and there aren't many accolades even in retirement that he hasn't had bestowed upon him. In 2019, Bret became a two-time WWE Hall of Famer when he, alongside the late Jim the Anvil Neidhart, were inducted as the Hart Foundation. 
A special night was soiled by one complete and utter, shall we say, twat who decided to make it all about himself. The deluded Zachary Madsen rushed the stage and tackled the hitman as he and Jim Neidhart's daughter Natalia were giving their acceptance speeches. There was panic and confusion as Hart hit the floor, with security and wrestlers in attendance immediately hitting the ring to remove him. On top of facing criminal charges, Madsen also had to bear the brunt of a few well-placed digs from the likes of Brett's nephew Harry Smith and the revival's Dash Wilder, who almost took his stupid little head off with an uppercut. Mercifully, Hart was relatively unharmed and able to finish his speech. Number 3. Universally Panned SummerSlam 2016 should have been an incredible evening for Finn Balor and Seth Rollins. Here they were at one of the biggest shows of the year, competing to become the first ever WWE Universal Champion. How far they both come, etc, etc. Well, fate had other ideas, as though the match itself was perfectly decent, things outside of their control made it one that they would likely not want to revisit anytime soon. Not only was Balor injured on a powerbomb to the ringside barricade, early on, but the fans in the Barclays Center were more concerned with voicing their displeasure at the title belt's design than following the action. They booed the reveal, they booed JoJo announcing the thing, they booed every time the camera cut to it. Basically, the WWE Universal title belt became the biggest heel in the business for about 20 minutes. And it's a shame, because the match was basically never really given a chance, even though the New York crowd seemingly liked both participants. Now yes, we can all agree that garish red thing with the giant WWE logo was perhaps not the most aesthetically pleasing prize, but there was no need to take it out on the performers risking their necks. Number 2. Bash at the Beach Ball if Seth Rollins and Finn Balor thought their SummerSlam fan woes were all over, well, all they had to do was wait another year, because at the 2017 iteration of the pay-per-view, those inside the Barclays Center got up to their old tricks once again. Actually, to be fair, this was a new trick, although an irritating one for the wrestlers nonetheless. Rollins was teaming with Dean Ambrose to take on Raw Tag Team Champions Sheamus and Cesaro, aka The Bar, when a rogue beach ball became the focus of fan attention. The the ball had been introduced during the previous match between Balor and Bray Wyatt. With each serve and volley, the Swiss Superman got more and more irate, to the point that he decided to take matters into his own hands by running into the crowd, grabbing the inflatable nuisance and ripping it in half. His actions drew a mixture of cheers and boos, but Cesaro likely didn't care since, you know, he had a match to wrestle and all that. He later revealed that WWE staff thanked him for doing it when he got backstage, and the company quickly banned beach balls from live events. Number 1. Disrespecting the Divas the post-WrestleMania Raw crowds were good fun in the beginning, weren't they? They were loud, they were interactive, and they were pretty much harmless, so long as they were popping for debuts or fandangoing long into the night. At one point, the crowds took a turn, and the show became much more about them than any of the, you know, actual stars of the show. And no point was that clearer than during a six-woman tag match the night after WrestleMania 31. As Paige, Naomi, and AJ Lee in her last WWE outing took on Natalya, and the Bella Twins, fans popped themselves by chanting YOU SUCK, followed by the name of the significant other of someone in the match. Tyson Kidd, John Cena, CM Punk, they all got a name check, and frankly, it was insulting at best and completely unacceptable at worst. The women shrugged it off and got on with the task at hand, but it was still an unwanted, not to mention disrespectful distraction, and a shame for Lee, who hasn't wrestled since and had to sign off her in-ring career listening to people childish reminding her who her husband was. Being strong is pretty much a prerequisite if you want to be a WWE star, and the average member of the WWE locker room isn't going to have any issues when it comes to bench pressing, deadlifting, and all that other stuff the sweaty grapplers do to prepare themselves for matches. But why talk about the average bozos when we can look at some proper anomalies? WWE rings have been the scenes of some absolutely outrageous examples of unbridled strength courtesy of our favourite muscle monsters. And before we begin, just to note that this countdown will look at the things that actually happened in the ring and not stuff that happened in backstage segments and therefore could easily just be gimmicked, such as the tipping over of vehicles and whatnot. I'm all for that sort of thing, but there shall be no trickery here. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 insane, real WWE feats of strength. Join us.
Number 10, all aboard the Lex Express. WWE didn't do things half-cocked when it came to pushing Lex Luger as their new red, white, and blue savior in the summer of 93. Having previously portrayed a narcissistic heel, the total package emerged as the all-American hero on July 4th when he stormed the USS Intrepid via helicopter and attempted to do what others, including some of his fellow WWE stars, had failed to do and slam the mighty Yokozuna. The then WWE Champion was tipping the scales north of 500 pounds at the time and rarely left his feet. Embodying the spirit of the entire United States on its Independence Day, Luger sent the sumo into the turnbuckles, hit him with that metal forearm and hoisted him up before dropping him with a mighty slam. Rock, flag and eagle, baby! Now, obviously, Lex knew his way around the weight room and had the muscles to show for it, but credit must go to Yoko for getting up for him in the first place. The super heavyweight was shockingly agile when he needed to be, though Luger still had to hold him and ensure a safe landing while also ensuring his own knees didn't explode like a goddamn fireworks parade. Number 9. Cesaro Swings Carly Speaking of exploding knees, let's talk about the great Carly. The world's least limber giant was not one to get off ground level if it could be helped, with only a select few such as John Cena, Batista and Kane getting the privilege of giving him a proper bump. The ultra-strong Cesaro is another man who has been able to show off his power on the Punjabi playboy, but not by hitting him with a mere slam or spinebuster. The Swiss Superman is genuinely one of the strongest men to have ever performed in a WWE ring, and he got to fully demonstrate that when he gave the great Carly a giant swing. Emphasis on giant. Cesaro took the seven-footer for a spin at Battleground 2013, managing to swing him around for multiple rotations with apparent ease. Not only does it take serious arm and upper body strength to get him up in the first place, but the leg and core strength required to maintain balance and control as he went around and around is seriously impressive. He had previously finished Carly off with an epic neutralizer during a match on main event, so this was a natural progression in his quest to show off. Number 8. The Strong EST Of course, ridiculous feats of strength are not just the territory of WWE's menfolk. The company's history is littered with members of the so-called fairer sex who could give their male counterparts a run for their money in the weight room, with the likes of China, Beth Phoenix and Rhea Ripley standing out as those who have matched their beauty with brawn. But perhaps the strong EST of them all is Bianca Belair. She shows it when she press slams her opponents, she shows it when she squats over and runs with him on her shoulders, and she certainly showed it on the December 20th, 2021 edition of Raw when she squared off with Dewdrop. Picking up her larger foe in the familiar torture rack position, Bianca carried the former and future Piper Niven from the corner to the center of the ring where she hit a truly spectacular KOD for the win. Not only did Belair show how strong she was to get her Scottish colleague up in the first place, but she showed remarkable control by then carrying her and planting her safely on her stomach. Number 7. Hogan Slams Andre Now, we all know that WWE's oft-pushed myth that Andre the Giant had never been slammed or beaten prior to his WWE Championship showdown with Hulk Hogan at WrestleMania 3 are complete and utter bollocks. Andre had been slammed multiple times before, including by Hogan and on WWE shows too, no less. But those were several years, many pounds, and much more mobility before. Because on that day in the Pontiac Silverdome, the big man was far heavier and much less likely to assist the Hulkster in the incredible feat due to the ravages of various injuries, with his back in particularly excruciating pain. And if we're to believe Terrible Terry's own account, the giant weighed somewhere between 500 pounds and 3 tons, give or take a kilo or two. The whole match built to the iconic slam, with Hogan trying and failing to get it done earlier on. Powered by prayers, vitamins, and goodness knows what else, maybe some early R&D Ico Pro, Hulk managed to pick up the immovable object, hold him for a second, and then drop him down to the canvas below. Number 6. The World's Largest F5 Brock Lesnar. Now there's a scary thought, eh? The next big thing is an absolute freak of nature, possessing the size, speed, strength, and just about everything else to make him the perfect sports entertainment specimen. 
And Lesnar is not shy about demonstrating his athletic prowess in the squared circle, especially when it comes to chucking around some of his fellow beef boys. For example, The Big Show, aka the world's beefiest beef boy, or world's largest athlete, I forget. Brock has hit his enormous rival with just about every move in his arsenal, from German and belly-to-belly -belly suplexes to an almighty ring-exploding superplex. And he's also done him in with his finisher, the F5. Right, so Lesnar has managed to pull this off on multiple occasions with seeming ease, but that doesn't make it any less impressive. I mean, the guy is picking up 500 pounds, holding it on his shoulders, squatting it, and then throwing and spinning it through the air in one hernia-inducing motion. I struggled carrying the big shot from Tesco the other day. Makes you think, makes you cry. Number 5. The World's Strongest Tombstone The Undertaker was many things. Spooky, scary, intimidating, threatening, frightening, daunting, and so on. But one aspect of his game that doesn't get its just due is just how bloody strong he was. Almost supernaturally strong, you might say. Not me, mind. That would be absurd. Anyway, standing close to seven feet tall and hovering around the 300 pound mark, the dead man had no issues getting people up for the choke slam, the last ride, or indeed the tombstone pile driver. Not even those who outweighed him by about 100 pounds, like Mark Henry. After teaming with Kurt Angle to take on Henry and Eminem on the February 17th, 2006 episode of SmackDown, the Phenom unleashed what he himself has since called his most memorable tombstone ever. Taker was clearly in excellent shape at the time, but Henry was very big too. Picking him up and lifting him upside down was one thing, but then holding him and making sure that an inherently dangerous move was performed safely and that he protected his opponent was another altogether. He pulled it off in style, however, and then repeated it for poops and giggles six weeks later on the grandest stage. Number four, Mark Henry breaks the chain. Speaking of Mark Henry, they call him the world's strongest man for a reason. It's because he's, um, the strongest man in the world. And if you don't believe me, him, or WWE, then I suggest you keep those opinions to yourself or else quickly run a mile before Henry grabs you, picks you up, presses you for 55 reps, and launches you into the sun. The Hall of Pain inductor has done countless impressive things in and out of WWE rings over the years, but perhaps the most extraordinary was when he tried to get from the outside of it to the inside. Storming out at the end of Eminem's tag team title cage match defense against Rey Mysterio and Batista on the January 6, 2006 episode of SmackDown, the former powerlifter attempted to bust his way through the steel structure. However, either the props department or the ring crew or some group of idiots messed up somewhere because the supposedly gimmicked chain didn't break away as intended. Because it was a real steel chain. No problem for Henry, of course, who duly snapped it like a breadstick before doing the same to the animal. Number 3. Strong as the Bull Every good stable really needs someone to act as the muscle, and WWE's iteration of the full-blooded Italians was no different. Which is where Johnny the Bull Stamboli came in. And yes, Chuck Palumbo wasn't exactly soft and Nunzio was shredded, but the point is Stamboli was the man for heavy lifting. Literally. With a nickname like The Bull, you expect him to be strong, but the move he pulled off on Samoan super heavyweight Rikishi on the February 20th, 2003 episode of SmackDown really does need to be seen to be believed. Out of nowhere, Johnny picked up the 400 pounder, pressed him over his head and slammed him down. Mamma mia! Rikishi was deceptively agile for his size and knew how to move about the ring at pace, but this was basically just raw strength from the FBI member who had previously press slammed Rikishi's brother Eddie Fatu, aka Jamal, on an episode of Heat. Rikishi, unable to match such power, vowed revenge by rubbing his backside on Stamboli's face. I think I'd rather take the press slam, to be honest. Number two, super strong, super Cena. John Cena's strong. John Cena's strong. He picks them up, then puts them down. Rise above hate. Lift heavy weights. John Cena's strong. John Cena's strong. <clears throat> he is, though, isn't he? 
The Doctor of Thugonomics most often illustrates the scope of his burliness with his finishing move, the FU, or the AA, or the glorified fireman's carry drop, or whatever you want to call it. He's nailed some true behemoths with it in the past, but his most impressive one wasn't even one at all, but a noble attempt. While competing for Edge's WWE title in a triple threat match with The Big Show at WrestleMania 25, Big Match John tried to create an unforgettable, memorable moment when he hoisted up both of his opponents for the FU to end all FUs. By my calculation, that is somewhere in the region of £700 he's supporting there, even if it only was for a split second. Cena went on to win the match too, though he pulled every tendon in his body and the lasting damage forces him to waddle around like a duck when the cameras are switched off, apparently. Number 1. Farm Boy Strength And so we cap things off with another freakish display of freakish strength by that big beautiful freak Brock Lesnar. The Beast Incarnate has been laughing in the face of nature for going on a quarter of a century now, but he really was something else when he was a mere rookie in the midst of a record-setting run for someone so young and new to the business. We've already established that one of his favourite hobbies was introducing the Big Show to the forces of gravity. And while the suplexes and F5s were all mightily exciting, Lesnar took things to another level while defending his WWE title against Show and Kurt Angle in the main event of Vengeance 2003. Joining an exclusive club of people who have powerbombed the world's largest athlete, or at least tried to, the next big thing not only hit the move beautifully, but added his own twist. Rather than just dumping Show's 500 pound frame out of the corner, Brock ran halfway across the ring and absolutely blasted him down. I mean, good lord, what's he gonna do next? F5 a shark? WWE has come up with some incredible match stipulations over the years. The Royal Rumble, the Elimination Chamber, Money in the Bank, and who could forget the thrill ride that was the Punjabi Prison? Legendary one and all. Sometimes the company borrows ideas from other places, as we've seen recently with the introduction of war games on the main roster. However, the following steps may have proven popular in other promotions, but have yet to make an appearance for the big dub. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic wrestling and these are 10 famous match stipulations never used in WWE. Join us! Number 10. The Triple Cage Match Anyone who has seen the WCW tie-in movie Ready to Rumble will know that a triple-decker steel cage is used during the final act. Well, that's if anyone has ever made it to the end of that film, that is. Whilst Jimmy King may not be a real wrestler, the triple cage match is most certainly a real stipulation. At 1988's Great American Bash, two teams of five wrestlers were put into a Tower of Doom, a match that could only be won by climbing down through all three cages to the floor. At Uncensored 1996, Hulk Hogan and Randy Savage defeated eight heels in the so-called Doomsday Cage, which was so bad I wish the world really had ended. Then there was the main event of Slambury 2000, a triple threat triple cage match between Jeff Jarrett, Diamond Dallas Page and reigning world champion David Arquette. WWE have never attempted to use three cages at once, presumably because they saw those last two WCW matches and were a bit scared off. The closest they ever got was when they surrounded a regular cage with the Hell in a Cell at Unforgiven 1999 for the infamous Kennel from Hell. Barking mad. Number 9. Bunkhouse Stampede Though the first televised Royal Rumble match didn't happen until 1988, similar formats were already in use by other companies. Between 1985 and 88, the NWA ran an annual mega match called the Bunkhouse Stampede. This was about as southern wrestling as you could possibly get as the competitors were allowed, nay, encouraged to wear cowboy boots, hats, and as much denim as they could physically handle. The idea was to invoke images of a brawl breaking out on a ranch, with all the various cowboys getting involved in any way they could. This gave rise to perhaps the Stampede's most infamous quality, its heavy use of weapons. Wrestlers could bring their own signature tools to the ring and use them to wreak as much havoc as possible. We're talking straps, spikes, cowbells, chains, you name it, someone was gonna get hit by one. As a result, bunkhouse Stampedes were usually incredibly bloody and violent affairs, which might be why WWE have never done one. Also, this match represents the pinnacle of what Vince McMahon was trying to erase from wrestling in the 1980s, so he's probably just very happy to let it gather dust. Number 8. The Flaming Tables Match 
Whilst we've seen plenty of tables matches in WWE, we have never witnessed one where the hardware simply had to be on fire before a wrestler got put through it. This mad match type found a home in, where else, ECW during the peak of that promotion's powers. Only one such match found its way onto pay-per-view when Balls Mahoney and Chili Willy took on De Baldi's at November to Remember 2000. Mahoney and Chili won, by the way, and no, I'm not saying their other names, it's just juvenile. Willy Balls. Though it's never been the specific objective of a match to use one, flaming tables have not been totally absent from WWE. The most famous example has to be during Edge and Mick Foley's match at WrestleMania 22, where the rated R superstar speared the hardcore legend through one off the ring apron. And you know what? Because such a spectacle is so rare in WWE, the iconic quality of the Edge Foley moment was preserved. Considering that the company has been PG for quite a while now, do not expect burning wood to return anytime soon. Number 7. The Scaffold Match In theory, there's nothing wrong with a scaffold match. Two wrestlers or teams of wrestlers fight it out on top of a large wobbly structure, with the winner being the first one to throw their opponent or opponents off the top. It's dangerous, but it's visually interesting. What more could you possibly want? Well, I guess to actually see the wrestlers for a start. The scaffold match has long been criticised for making it very hard for crowds both at home and in person to witness the action as it unfolds. They also severely limit how much work participants can do, the bulk of the offence in them being punches and kicks, as well as being needlessly risky for very little reward. During a match at the NWA's Starcade 1986 between the Road Warriors and the Midnight Express, Jim Cornette fell from the scaffolding and managed to tear all the ligaments in one of his knees. No wonder he's so grumpy all the time. And hey, let's not even bring up the death-defying escapades of New Jack and Vic Grimes. It really is no wonder WWE have never touched this one. Number 6. King of the Mountain slash Reverse Battle Royal We are lumping these two together because A, they're both TNA slash Impact Wrestling specialities, and B, they both involve taking a regular match construct and flip reversing it. A reverse battle royal is quite simple. Wrestlers start outside the ring and attempt to get back into it, before then attempting to throw the opponents that made it back straight out again. It made its debut on an episode of Impact in 2006, and was then awarded Worst Match of the Year by the Wrestling Observer, to give you an idea of how well it went. As for the King of the Mountain, it's a essentially a reverse ladder match where you have to hang something up instead of pulling it down, but there are also a bunch of other rules that make my head hurt just thinking about them. Something about a penalty box? I don't know, you'd have to ask Jeff Jarrett, slap nut. Whilst you have to admire their creativity, both of these steps have a whiff of if it ain't broke don't fix it about them. Both are clunky at best and downright messy at worst and aren't even used that often by the promotion that created them. Number 5. Monsters Ball Another impact speciality now, and one that belongs to a certain monstrous performer. Abyss worked for TNA for 17 years, winning multiple titles including the NWA World's Heavyweight Championship. Serving as a kind of amalgamation of The Undertaker, Kane and Mankind, Abyss's character was one of an unhinged psychopath who was willing to endure unbearable suffering to get his hands on his opponents. This tied in perfectly with his signature hardcore match type, where the competitors were kept in a darkened room with no food or water for 24 hours beforehand. That's all kayfabe, by the way. Or perhaps TNA actually couldn't afford the catering bill and this was a clever cover. Anyway, Abyss appeared in 49 Monsters Ball matches, more than four times more than anybody else. Even after he left the company, they've still used the stipulation on multiple occasions. Chris Park, the man behind the Abyss gimmick, has actually worked for WWE as a producer since 2019, so it is entirely possible that a variation of Monsters Ball could turn up in the promotion one day. I mean, if Rey Mysterio can have his eye removed in a match, then the whole suspension of disbelief argument is kind of over, you know? Number 4. The Ultimate X Match our TNA trilogy concludes with perhaps the promotion's most famous and celebrated creation. Apart from aces and eights, obviously. Those guys are ruled. A major selling point during the early days of TNA was its X Division, which was designed to fill the gap left by ECW and WCW's cruiserweights. This division was all about high-flying, high-impact moves and was initially populated by the likes of Loki, Jerry Lynn, and AJ Styles. The Ultimate X Match is considered the crowning achievement of of the X Division concept. Two cables are suspended 15 feet in the air so they form the shape of an X. Oh, I get it now. An object, sometimes a title.
little belt, sometimes a big red cross is hung in the middle of the X, and it's up to the participants to retrieve it without using a ladder. American Gladiators eat your bloody heart out. There have been 49 different Ultimate X matches since its 2003 debut, with some being Grace and others being that one where the X kept falling down. There are plenty of WWE stars who could work wonders in this sort of environment, but it's unlikely that the company would ever ape something so synonymous with its former competitor. Number 3. The Exploding Barbed Wire Deathmatch there have been plenty of variations of the Make the Ring Explode match attempted over the years, including something called the Anus Explosion Deathmatch from Frontier Martial Arts Wrestling. The objective there was to stick a firework up your opponent's bum and then set it off. Should have just called it a normal Friday night match. Am I right, lads? Lads? An exploding barbed wire deathmatch is where the ring ropes have been covered by or replaced with the spiky stuff and also set to explode every time someone touches them. Mick Foley and Terry Funk had a version of this match in 1995 that has gone down in hardcore wrestling history. The version from AEW Revolution 2021? Sure, but for a different reason. The first mainstream exploding barbed wire deathmatch in a long time went from historical to hysterical when the planned explosion at the end failed to go off, leaving everyone looking a bit confused and incredibly silly. This error means that the stipulation now has a bit of a black mark against its name, which is just another reason why we'll probably never see one happen in a WWE ring. Also, something tells me that sponsors wouldn't be thrilled at the idea of kids watching their favourite superstars get blown up either. Number 2. The Coal Miner's Glove Match For the uninformed, a coal miner's glove is a leather welding glove with a steel bar across the knuckles. One day, a wrestler saw one and went, that would look great dangling from a giant pole. Thus, the Coal Miner's Glove Match was born, and it would go on to be one of the most feared match types in the territory days of wrestling. The glove was so powerful that one punch was enough to knock somebody out, which is why the only way to get hold of one was to shimmy up a huge strut. WCW ran one of these matches as the main event of Halloween Havoc 1992, pitting Sting against Jake the Snake Roberts. When the Stinger hit Roberts with the glove, it forced him to shove a snake into his own face, which is how he lost the match. And some people still thought wrestling was real back then. WWE have never put on a coal miner's glove match, although they did give the world the coal miner's nightstick match between the big boss man and Test on a 1999 episode of Raw. Don't get your hopes up, it was just a nightstick on a pole match. Number 1. World War 3 WWE has borrowed a lot of things from WCW over the years. War Games, The Great American Bash, nonsensical storylines with no payoff, but one thing they've never taken from them is the concept of World War 3. From 1995 to 1998, WCW held an enormous three-ring 60-man battle royal at a November pay-per-view named after this insane match type. Though the first one was for the WCW World Heavyweight Championship, later incarnations rewarded its winner with a title shot at Starcade. Sort of sounds like WCW were the ones doing the stealing here. Even in their wildest Saudi Arabian dreams, WWE have never done an over-the-top rope match with this many people. They've also never done a match type with three rings, despite owning the rights to World War 3 since 2001. So why is this? Perhaps it's because WWE are happy to stick to the Royal Rumble concept. Or perhaps it's because a match with 60 people in it at the same time is an unwatchable mess. Who's to say? But whatever the reason, we may never see World War 3 again. In wrestling, I mean. In terms of actual World Wars, I say we're about 50-50 right now. If there is one thing sports fans love, it is fantasizing about the best athletes of this era taking on the superstars of the past. In football, fans dream about Messi taking on Pele. In basketball, mouths water at the prospect of Michael Jordan versus Ennis Cantor. And in chess, what could be more exciting than thinking about the titanic clash between Ruben Fine and Andre Esepenko? What, no chess fans out there? Philistines. The thing about WWE is that these intergenerational matches aren't just possible, they happen on the regular. It is woven into the fabric of the business that an older veteran puts over a younger performer on their way, which has led to plenty of amazing spectacles over the years. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 biggest generation versus generation matches in WWE history. Join us.
Number 10. Vince McMahon vs. Shane McMahon in terms of intergenerational matches, this one fits the bill quite literally, as it involves a father beating the ever-loving snot out of his own son. The street fight between Vince McMahon and his son Shane from WrestleMania X7 is now the stuff of wrestling legend. After tormenting his family by drugging his wife Linda and taking on Trish Stratus as a mistress, Vinnie Mac finally got his comeuppance during this absolutely wild fight. There were chair shots, elbow drops, slaps, Mick Foley, and perhaps Perhaps the greatest WrestleMania moment of all time, Linda McMahon slowly rising from her chair to kick her no good husband square in the nuts. You think I'm kidding? I'm not. The charisma void that is Linda McMahon got a goddamn road warrior pop here. In the end, Shane got the win over his old man and put his fiendish plot to rest. I mean, yeah, Vince might have ended up standing tall at the end of the night with the new WWE champion Stone Cold Steve Austin, but there was a good hour or so where we thought he had finally hit rock bottom. No pun intended. The McMahon family soap opera might be responsible for some of the worst content in all of WWE, but when done right, it delivered absolute gold. Number 9. Kevin Owens vs Stone Cold Steve Austin When rumors began to circulate at the beginning of 2022 that Stone Cold Steve Austin might be in a match at the upcoming WrestleMania 38, many fans quickly dismissed them. Austin hadn't had a match in nearly 20 years, he was getting on in years, and had a famously knackered, well, everything. Surely a comeback was off the cards. Well, if 2022 proved one thing, it's that anything can happen in the world of pro wrestling. It was announced that Stone Cold would be a guest on a WrestleMania edition of the KO Show, hosted by Kevin Owens. However, Owens revealed that this was all a ruse to lure Austin to the ring, and the match was on. Against all the odds, a 57-year-old Austin put on a stonker of a performance, hanging with one of the best wrestlers of the current crop. He ended up beating Owens with, well, what else, a Stone Cold Stunner. Owens has drawn many comparisons to the Texas Rattlesnake over his career. Both are brawlers with a ferocious attitude and a sharp tongue, with Owens even adopting the Stunner as a finisher in recent years. Seeing the two square off was a dream come true for many, and a perfect return for one of the all-time greats. Number 8. Jimmy Snooker vs The Undertaker at WrestleMania 7 With the power of hindsight, the most important match on the card for WrestleMania 7 was a 4 minutes and 20 second long undercard encounter. Jimmy Superfly Snooker's prime years for WWE were in the early to mid 1980s, where he famously jumped off a steel cage onto Don Morocco at Madison Square Garden. He's also famous for some other stuff, but we're not going to get into that right now because it'll drag down the tone of the entire video. By the time Mania 7 rolled around, Snooker was 47 years old, the wrestling equivalent of 101 at the time. Meanwhile, his opponent The Undertaker turned 26 on the day of the show itself. His birthday present was a victory over Snooker that kickstarted one of the most important parts of his wrestling legacy. Undertaker would go unbeaten at WrestleMania for the next 23 years, with the streak becoming a reason to buy the show of shows all by itself. Having the young Taker go over a legend like Snooker in his very first WrestleMania match helped set him up for big things in the company that year. However, few could have predicted just how monumental this match would seem in the decades that followed. Number 7. Shawn Michaels vs Hulk Hogan Hulk Hogan was the guy in WWE for almost the entire 1980s and the early part of the 1990s. That mantle would eventually find its way to Shawn Michaels, who led the company as one of its biggest stars for a few years in the mid to late 90s. So when it was announced that these two legends would meet in the main event of SummerSlam 2005, fans from across the ages were delighted. Oh, how little they knew. This match is famous, or should that be infamous, for Shawn's ludicrous overselling of Hogan's offense. The Heartbreak Kid flopped around for the Hulkster like he was a puppet on a string, making the bout unintentionally hilarious as a result. The reason for this ridiculous unprofessionalism was that Hogan had apparently reneged on his promise to give HBK his win back in a mooted rematch. When he realized that this match was a one-time deal and that he was doing the J-O-B, Michaels decided to make Hogan's life a 
living hell while they shared the squared circle. In all fairness, how good would a match between these two have actually been in 2005? The showstopper's hissy fit actually made the match so much more entertaining and ensured that it lives on in the minds of wrestling fans to this very day. Number 6. Trish Stratus vs Charlotte Flair there aren't many bigger names in the world of women's wrestling than Trish Stratus, which is ironic because she's only 5'5". Five five. Initially used as nothing more than a bit of eye candy, Trish evolved in front of us to become one of the most competent performers of the Attitude Era. For context, being a good wrestler and a woman in this period was about as useful to your career as being a master of origami. WWE took any chance they could get to promote how great Stratus was and made her the poster girl for their women's division as as well as the standard for future performers to strive for. Well, that was until a shiny new toy arrived in the company. Charlotte Flair has been held on a similarly high pedestal since she made her main roster debut in 2015. Being the daughter of Ric Flair certainly didn't hurt, but Charlotte has defined her own legacy with a slew of excellent matches. Promos, not so much, but matches for sure. The two met in the ring at SummerSlam 2019, with the younger generation going over. It was a more than stratifying match that served as a reminder of just how far women's wrestling had come since Trish's heyday. Number 5. Randy Orton vs Cactus Jack as well as being one of the biggest draws of the Attitude Era, Mick Foley also made a star out of Triple H at the Royal Rumble in 2000 and helped solidify Edge as a main event player with their battle at WrestleMania 22. In between those two matches, he helped a young Apex Predator find his feet and RKO whatever ceiling was hovering above his head. 23-year-old Randy Orton made it his personal mission to torment poor Mick in late 2003 slash early 2004. He kicked Foley down some stairs, which led to Mick taking Randy out of the Royal Rumble, which led to the Rock and Sock connection reforming to take on Evolution at WrestleMania 20. After all that, the feud was basically put to bed at Backlash 2004. Except that bed was full of barbed wire and thumbtacks. A semi-retired Foley performing as Cactus Jack challenged Orton for the Intercontinental Championship in a hardcore match. This was Cactus Jack's speciality match, but the Legend Killer was able to overcome the legend, how apt, and emerge on the other side of this brutal encounter a made man. Number 4. Triple H vs Batista Sticking with Evolution members now, as two former components of the Great Stable found themselves face to face in the main event of WrestleMania. After a fantastically executed slow burn face turn, Batista finally turned on Triple H and Ric Flair by giving his old pals the thumbs down on an episode of Raw. Batista had just won the Royal Rumble and shockingly cashed in his shot for Tripper's World Heavyweight Championship at the biggest event of the year. And WrestleMania 21 was the night of young emerging talent. Randy Orton put on a great performance against The Undertaker, John Cena beats JBL to become WWE Champion, and The Animal closed out the night by taking down the Cerebral Assassin to become World Champion for the very first time. It's a bit of a shame that the match itself left a lot to be desired, but let's not dwell on that right now. While Cena beating JBL might have had larger ramifications for wrestling going forward, the story between Hunter and Dave's match is what puts it on this list. Evolution was the past, present, and future all coming together. And now, the future was the present, which is pretty damn poetic if you ask me. Number 3. Brock Lesnar vs The Rock Get ready to hear the words The Rock over and over again as he crops up in every entry from now until the end of the list. SummerSlam 2002 is considered by many to be the greatest incarnation of the show. Kurt Angle defeated Rey Mysterio in a blistering opener, Shawn Michaels made his in-ring return, and who could forget the all-time classic that was Spike Dudley vs Steven Richards on the pre-show? I certainly won't, and you can't make me. The show ended with The Rock defending his undisputed WWE Championship against the next big thing, Brock Lesnar. The Beast had debuted for the company just five months earlier and was already facing one of its biggest stars for the top prize. After a great back and forth encounter, Brock pinned Rock with an F5 to become the youngest world champion in WWE history at the time. This match made perfect sense. Rock was stepping away from wrestling full time to take on Tinseltown, while Brock was the next big thing. Number 2. The Rock vs John Cena 
After conquering the world of Hollywood, Rocky made his live return to Monday Night Raw for the first time in over seven years in February of 2011. This was seemingly to set him up as the guest host for WrestleMania 27, but in reality, it was actually sowing the seeds for the following year's event. Following the all-time great closer between The Miz and John Cena, that was sarcasm by the way, Rock got into it with Cena on Raw. The Great One had basically cost Cena the WWE Championship in the battle, and now Big Match John wanted revenge. This set up the next year's WrestleMania main event, The Rock vs. John Cena, The Attitude Era vs. The PG Era, Loud and Rowdy vs. Squeaky Clean, Black Adam vs. Ferdinand the Bull. This was absolutely huge. After 12 months of build that was actually 3 months of build spread out over a year, the two icons came face to face. In the end, the past killed the present when Rock beat Cena with a rock bottom, giving fans a scene that truly lived up to the tagline, once in a lifetime. Again, that was sarcasm. Number 1. The Rock vs Hulk Hogan he put over the future, tangled with the biggest star of the modern age, and now the time has come to talk about Rock vs. the ghost of wrestling past. After nine years trying to become a movie star and getting good use out of Ted Turner's checkbook, Hulk Hogan made his return to the company he helped build when he came back to WWE at No Way Out 2002. Almost immediately, he was inserted into a feud with one of his successors, as Hogan vs. The Rock was booked for the upcoming WrestleMania 18. While some fans wanted Hogan to take on Steve Austin at the event, it could be argued that Rock was actually a better pick. Rock was perhaps more of a showman than Austin, maybe better able to match Hogan's ability to control a crowd. And the decision paid off with one of the greatest wrestling spectacles of all time. Although he was the heel, the Toronto crowd overwhelmingly cheered the Hulkster. This completely flipped the match's dynamic on its head as the fans ravenously ate up everything Hogan Hogan did. A match made solely on star power, Rock vs Hogan at WrestleMania remains one of the best viewing experiences a wrestling fan can get, this side of Spike Dudley vs Steven Richards. Turning a wrestler from good to bad or vice versa is a great way to change up their character and add a new wrinkle to the on-screen product. And what better place to express a new attitude than on the grandest stage of them all? Clues kind of in the name. Plenty of performers have swapped allegiances at the showcase of the Immortals over the years. So let's get straight into five times baddies went good and five times heroes turned to the dark side. I'm Adam Pacisi from Cultaholic Wrestling and these are the 10 biggest WrestleMania heel and face turns. Join us. Number 10, Kurt Angle at WrestleMania 19. We are starting off with a subtle one here because WWE don't do subtlety very often and it's important that we cherish it when they do. WrestleMania 19 is considered by many to be the best mania ever that didn't take place in 2001. To cap off a night of excellent action, fans were treated to a first time dream match as Brock Lesnar squared off against Kurt Angle for the Olympians WWE title. This fantastic match was sadly overshadowed by the Beast nearly doing himself in by botching a shooting star press, which might be why a lot of people missed what happened after the bell rang. The heelish angle actually embraced the new champion, giving him a big hug and raising his arm up for the crowd to see. Unfortunately, WWE's cameras didn't really capture this moment, probably because everybody was still in shock at how Lesnar was still breathing. This moment of sportsmanship hinted at Angle's return from surgery later that year. When these two had their rematch at SummerSlam, Angle was the good guy and Brock the evil heel. Not a spectacle of a face turn, but an effective one nonetheless. Number 9, Shinsuke Nakamura at WrestleMania 34. At New Japan Pro Wrestling's Wrestle Kingdom 10 event, AJ Styles and Shinsuke Nakamura had one of the matches of the year over the IWGP Intercontinental title. So, when WWE decided to run this program back at WrestleMania 34 over the WWE title, fans got very excited. In hindsight, though, they needn't have really bothered. Whether it was oddly paced, overhyped, or just not up to their usual standards, 
Woods, Nakamura vs. Styles 2 just wasn't very interesting. It ended with Styles countering a Kinshasa to hit the Styles Clash for the win as the crowd went mild. At least things picked up a bit though when Nakas smashed AJ in the Nakas a few minutes later. After appearing to show his opponent respect, the King of Strong Style hit the phenomenal one with a low blow before cementing his turn to the dark side with another vicious knee strike. It was a really well executed moment. Unfortunately though, it led to absolutely nout. Styles and Nakamura feuded for another couple of months and almost all of their matches ended in disappointment. After this seriously underwhelming rivalry, Nakamura wouldn't get a sniff of the world title ever again. But hey, at least the turn was good, I guess. Number 8. Mike Tyson at WrestleMania 14 We're getting this one out of the way early because, well, Mike Tyson isn't really a wrestler. He's a boxer and a pigeon breeder too, but now we're getting off topic. However, there is no denying just how important his presence was in the build-up to WrestleMania 14. The baddest man on the planet had aligned himself with D-Generation X ahead of leader HBK's WWE title defense against Stone Cold Steve Austin. However, after Cold Stone won the match and the title, Michaels got all up in Tyson's face. Not a smart move, Sean. Not a smart move. In response, Iron Mike laid the former champion out, rejecting DX and turning good in the process. He then posed with Austin to close out the show on an iconic image. The boxing legend's involvement in Mania 14 brought tons of new eyes to the product, with some claiming that its success was mostly down to him. Regardless of whether that's true or not, there is no denying that Tyson added yet another layer of greatness to this event and that him knocking out Michaels is a moment for the ages. Thank God he didn't bite his ear off. Number 7. Rick Martel at WrestleMania 5 The team of Strike Force were one of the more popular babyface tandems during the golden era of WWE. Rick Martel and Tito Santana first teamed together in 1987 and would go on to capture the World Tag Team Championships from the Hart Foundation later that year. After a brief hiatus, the duo reunited at the 1989 Royal Rumble and were booked to face the Brain Busters at WrestleMania 5. Little did anyone know that this would be where the team would implode once and for all. During the contest, Santana accidentally hit his own partner with a flying forearm. Later, when Santana was reaching for the tag, Martel turned his back on the future El Matador, leaving him high and dry for Arn and Tully to pick the bones. Not only did this moment signal the breakup of a very popular act, but it also ushered in a new era for Martel as a single star. As the model, he would strut around like he owned the place and blind his opponents with his own trademark fragrance. The model was a fantastic character, and it could trace its beginnings back to this night in Trump Plaza. Number 6. Randy Savage at WrestleMania 7 Prior to WrestleMania 5, Randy Savage turned heel to set up the blockbuster main event of him versus Hulk Hogan for the WWE Championship. After two years as a baddie, accompanied by the brilliantly unhinged Sensational Sherry, Savage went back to the light in another iconic moment. WrestleMania 7 was largely a bit crap, but one of the few highlights was the exceptional career versus career match between Savage and the Ultimate Warrior, in which the Macho King was defeated. And then, when he was at his lowest, Queen Sherry turned on Savage, viciously attacking him after the bell. And that made Miss Elizabeth furious. Upon witnessing this from her seat in the crowd, Elizabeth rushed the ring to rescue her former man from the evil queen's attack. After saving the day, Liz reunited with Savage for the first time in over two years as the arena flooded with tears. In terms of soap opera high emotion, there haven't been many WWE moments more perfect than this. Getting Liz and Randy back together was a great way to take the edge off his tragic retirement and let fans cheer Savage again after a while of him being an absolute Rotter. Number 5. Triple H at WrestleMania 15 WrestleMania 15 took fans of the D-Generation X stable on an emotional roller coaster. In the night's eighth bout, Triple H was battling the corporation's Kane in a heated grudge match. Just when it looked like the monster had the day one, China came out to turn on the baddies and rejoin DX. Well, at least that's what she wanted us to think. Two matches later and Shane McMahon was defending his European Championship against X-Pac. The challenger was facing overwhelming odds as Test of the Mean Street Posse kept interfering. But what's that on the horizon? It's Triple H and China riding in to save their friend. But wait, what are you doing, Triple H? Triple H! 
In the swerviest swerve that ever swerved, bro, the game turned his back on X-Pac and DX to help Shane retain and side with the corporation. Not only was this shocking in the moment, but it also paved the way for Hunter's rise to the main events that took place later that year. This was clearly a night four turns as Big Show made his first of 67 face turns earlier in the show. Number four, Andre the Giant at WrestleMania 6. Much like Savage would do for WrestleMania 5, Andre the Giant went bad to give Hulk Hulk Hogan someone to fight at WrestleMania 3. In their iconic battle, Andre came up short against the Hulkster but stayed as a villain for the next three years. At WrestleMania 6, Andre and Haku were defending their tag team championships as the Colossal Connection. Their opponents were Demolition, who were looking to win the tag team titles for the third WrestleMania in a row. This was more of a handicap match than a tag as Andre spent most of the time on the outside of the ring. This allowed Axe and Smash to pick up the win and end the heels reign with the gold. Heenan, who was the Connection's manager, was not happy with how his humongous French client had performed. He chastised Andre after the bell, even going so far as to slap the giant. That was a bad idea. Andre snapped and laid into Heenan and his partner as the crowd went bonkers. He then rode off into the sunset in the same way he came into WWE, as a beloved hero. Number 3. Bret Hart at WrestleMania 13 Everybody talks about the double turn from WrestleMania 13 when Bret Hart and Steve Austin left their match with the exact opposite alignments to what they had going in. But really, was Austin actually a heel before this match? Yeah, he was a loudmouthed, braggadocious a-hole, but fans still cheered him. And he was basically doing all the same stuff he would carry on doing as a babyface. What actually changed? Anyway, one thing we can say for sure is that Bret Hart was most definitely not a heel before this legendary no DQ submission match. He was the clean-cut poster boy of the WWE who was getting severely riled up that the fans were choosing the Texas Rattlesnake over him. All of this was the perfect fuel for Bret to go bad. After Austin refused to tap out in a career-defining moment, Hart went ballistic, laying into his wounded opponent with reckless abandon. Calm down, Bret. We know he looks like Goldberg, but it's not actually him. Number 2. Hulk Hogan at WrestleMania 18 Arguably the greatest face turn in the history of WrestleMania happened by complete accident. The Rock vs. Hollywood Hulk Hogan from WrestleMania 18 is notable because the fans completely hijacked it. Despite Hogan being an out-and-out bad guy, he hit the Rock's ambulance with a truck for crying out loud. The fans in Toronto cheered him like he was a returning hero. And that's because he was. This was his first Mania match in almost a decade. After The Rock beat the Hulkster and the NWO came down to assault their former leader, plans were changed on the fly. Rock returned to the ring to save his opponent, who he helped fight off Hall and Nash. This solidified Hogan's new position as a babyface, something that the crowd were more than happy to endorse. More than in any other form of entertainment, live or otherwise, the crowd is a huge part of pro wrestling. This moment proves that, as the trajectory of one wrestler's career was altered forever because of the reaction of one particular audience. That also means that when we complain about Hogan's subsequent WWE title reign, we've only got ourselves and Canada to blame. Number 1. Stone Cold Steve Austin at WrestleMania X7 To some, his face turn at 13 might have been a bit dubious, but there is no denying that Austin definitely turned heel at WrestleMania X7. He was facing The Rock for the WWE Championship and just couldn't put his opponent away. Desperate to win back his favorite shiny eagle, Austin did the unthinkable and sided with Satan himself. He accepted help from Vince McMahon, who had made his way down to ringside during the match. With a McMahon endorsed steel chair, Austin pummeled the people's snot out of The Rock and captured the title with Vincent K at his side. There is no denying that Austin turning heel was a huge moment and a big surprise, but was this the right time to do it? When The Rock was on his way to Hollywood and there was no credible babyface challenges for Stone Cold to face? Some go as far as to blame this turn for the decline in wrestling's popularity that followed over the next few years. That may be a bit simplistic, but this will certainly go down as one of the most important wrestling moments of all time, for better or for worse.
What would a WWE live event be without a large crowd? Well, just ask anyone who was at these shows as they were all attended by fewer than six and a half thousand people. By the way, don't expect to see any NXT shows or other network specials on this list. We are only counting proper main roster WWE pay-per-views. Oh, and also we're not counting the two Beware of Dog shows because those were affected by a power outage and we felt like it was unfair to include them. Also, there were two different shows and it got too convoluted, so we chickened out. And we're obviously not including anything from the pandemic. Don't be a smart ass. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 worst attended WWE pay-per-views of all time. Join us. Number 10, In Your House 2, The Lumberjacks, 6,482. As you will find out throughout this list, the In Your House series weren't always the best when it came to drawing crowds. Initially designed as cut price stopgaps between the big four slash five shows, the first In Your House premiered on May 14th, 1995, with just 7,000 people in attendance. By the time the second show came around in July, about 500 of those people are gone. Nah, can't be asked. In Your House 2, retroactively titled The Lumberjacks, drew just 6,482 people to Nashville, Tennessee's Municipal Auditorium. In comparison, WCW held Starcade there later that same year in front of 8,200 fans. It's not like WWE were offering a Starcade level experience with their show, to be fair. Bam Bam Bigelow versus Henry Godwin. The 123 Kid versus The Roadie. Razor Ramon and Savio Vega versus Men on a Mission. I mean, yeah, you can see why they struggled. 1995 is known as a very bad year for WWE in terms of business, and this show can act as a microcosm of that larger issue. Fans just weren't that interested in what the company had to offer, so they kept their hands firmly in their pockets. Number 9, Taboo Tuesday 2005, 6000. The concept of Taboo Tuesday was an interesting one. Fans had the power to vote on the outcomes of certain decisions, such as which wrestlers would be in a match, what stipulations they would fight under, and what titles would be on the line. Unfortunately, considering you needed a small nuclear power station to even run the internet in 2005, the idea was perhaps a little too advanced for the time. This edition of the show was broadcast from San Diego, California's iPay One Center, known today as the Pachanga Arena. This was the arena that saw the unification of the WWF and WCW Championships at Vengeance Day 2001, only that show drew a much more significant crowd. Only 6,000 souls turned up to Taboo Tuesday, roughly half of the figure for Vengeance just four years earlier. Instead of a title unification tournament, these fans got to see Mankind take on Carlito, Eugene team up with Jimmy Snooker, and Batista fight Jonathan Coachman in a street fight. Who needs history being made when you got all that? To be fair, Mankind vs. Carlito was pretty alright. Perhaps due to the low ticket sales, Taboo Tuesday was replaced with Cyber Sunday the following year. That sold better, presumably because it was on a day of the week people were actually free. Number 8, Stomping Grounds 2019, 6000. The most recent show on this list by quite some margin is the first and thus far only show to bear the Stomping Grounds name. Look at its logo, it's a little shoe. How clever. Replacing Backlash in the calendar, Stomping Grounds just sort of came out of nowhere. It had no stipulation attached to it, no real reason to be named what it was named, it was just kind of there. Weird. Fans who showed up to the Tacoma Dome in Washington got to see Ricochet beat Samoa Joe for the US title, Kofi Kingston defend his WWE Championship against Dolph Ziggler, and Seth Rollins fight in a no-holds-barred war with Baron Corbin. <laughs> Only 6,000 folks showed up to see their favorite superstars kick ass and take names. Their last US pay-per-view, Money in the Bank, had drawn over 15,000 fans. Probably because Corbin wasn't in the world title match, to be fair. The only other show that came close to this figure in 2019 was Clash of Champions, with everything else doing 10k fans or more. Rest in peace, stomping grounds. You were too beautiful for this world. Number 7, In Your House 12, It's Time, 5,708. Despite the fact that it bore his catchphrase in the title, In Your House 12, It's Time, did not feature Vader at all as he was dealing with an injury. 
Shame they'd already printed out all the programs. WWE had to work around the big man's absence for their final major show of 1996, instead offering fans a main event of Bret Hart challenging for the WWE Championship against Sid. You might not think that sounds especially epic, and you would be right, but things get worse for this show when you look elsewhere on the card. It was opened by Flash Funk vs. Leaf Cassidy. Remember him? He was Al Snow before he went a bit crazy and became a bit interesting. Owen Hart and the British Bulldog defended their tag straps against fake Diesel and fake Razor Ramon, blur, and The Undertaker fought the Executioner, i.e. Terry Gordy in a mask, in one of the worst pay-per-view bouts of the year. It's hardly surprising that a show this disappointing only drew 5,708 people to the West Palm Beach Auditorium. They probably all hated it, but at least there was less traffic than usual to beat on the way home, eh? Number 6. In Your House 6, Rage in a Cage, 5,500 Another poorly attended In Your House show, another Bret Hart match in the main event. Are we sure this guy is really the best there is, was and ever will be? This time, Hart was the defending champion, putting his belt on the line against Diesel just a handful of weeks before his epic Iron Man match at WrestleMania 12. It was also a cage match if you hadn't already figured that out. Hart won because there was no way Kevin Nash was going an hour, setting up his WrestleMania bout with Shawn Michaels. HBK had won the right to face Brett earlier in the night by beating the hitman's brother, Owen. As for the other matches, well, Razor Ramon beat the 1-2-3 kid in the opening crybaby match. That is a match where the loser has to wear a diaper because there is no humor quite like a five-year-old's humor. Hunter Hearst Helmsley took on Duke the Dumpster Drosy in a battle of class and sophistication over literal garbage. And Yokozuna beat the British Bulldog by DQ. Only five and a half thousand people were subjected to this total fart of a pay-per-view, and we are so, so sorry for all of them. Number 5. In Your House 3 Triple Header 5146 Our triple header of In Your House shows ends with In Your House Triple Header. It's almost like we planned it this way. We didn't, honest. Back to 1995 and to the third outing for this brave new format. A format that was getting consistently worse results with every new attempt. September's In Your House 3 boasted a pretty spectacular main event in an attempt to turn the sinking ship around. Diesel, the WWE Champion, and Shawn Michaels, the Intercontinental Champion, teamed up to take on tag team champions Yokozuna and Owen Hart. Except the British Bulldog filled in for Hart, even though Hart still got involved in the finish of the match. Match. Um, it's hard to explain. Just watch the show, or better yet, don't. Sadly, this meant that the rest of the card was severely lacking in star power. When Whale on Mercy is your choice to open a show, then you need to take a long, hard look at yourself. Just 5,146 people forked out to come and watch this show, which is probably 5,146 people too many. Number 4. Armageddon 2004 – 5,000 Jesus could have fed the audience at Armageddon 2004 with five loaves and two fish. Armageddon closed out WWE's pay-per-view year from Duluth, Georgia. WWE, if you want people to come to your shows, then please start holding them in places people have actually heard of. No offense, Duluthians. Anyway, Duluth was treated to a whopper of a main event as JBL defended the WWE Championship against Eddie Guerrero, Booker T, and The Undertaker in a fatal four-way. Unfortunately, this was the only real highlight on a show that also featured tough enough finalists Daniel Puder and Mike the Miz Mizanin in a Dixie dogfight and Kurt Angle winning a match over Santa Claus. Yep, Santa Claus. Even the prospect of seeing old Saint Nick didn't draw people to this show, which only packed in 5,000 fans. WWE wouldn't return to the venue for a big show until 2019, when they put on Starcade. Remember when WWE took one of the most cherished names in WCW history and ran it as a dinky little house show? Duluth is cursed, I swear. Number 3. Ground Zero in your house, 4,963 for our final trip to In Your Houseland, we take you back to the year 1997, when business was significantly better than it was two years ago. 
Ground Zero in your house, which was the 17th incarnation, in case anybody cares, was home to a bumper main event that pitted two megastars against one another for the very first time. Shawn Michaels had been in The Undertaker's crosshairs ever since he had cost the dead man the WWE title at SummerSlam. Now the two would finally tangle in the ring, kicking off one of the greatest in-ring rivalries of all time with a no contest. The match ended with a no contest. Good stuff. Bret Hart was once again WWE Champion, seriously, maybe he's the cursed one, and was defending against none other than Del Wilkes, aka the Patriots. This was Patriots first and only pay-per-view title match, and Hart beat him with the sharpshooter after 20 minutes. Not even the power of Murica could attract more than 4,963 people from the good city of Louisville, Kentucky. Number 2, December to December 2006, 4,800. I know we said right at the start that we were only counting WWE pay-per-views, but did you really think I was going to miss out on slagging off this steaming pile of bull piss? Also, WWE's version of ECW was essentially just SmackDown Lite, so you can forgive me on the technicalities. After it relaunched in 2006, the resurrected EC dub was given its first pay-per-view later in the year. And how did it go? Well, they never ran another major show again. You tell me how it went. December to Dismember was a disaster and is rightly remembered as one of the worst wrestling shows of all time. Balls Mahoney took on Matt Stryker. Mike Knox and Kelly Kelly teamed up to take on the stinking vampires. Davari beats Tommy Dreamer. ECW died a death all over again on this night in front of 4,800 witnesses in Augusta, Georgia's James Brown Arena. Honestly, it's amazing that the crowd was even that big as there was absolutely zero reason for anybody to have wanted to see this show. The only thing that kept it off the top spot was a real oddity of a show from two years earlier. Number 1. Taboo Tuesday 2004 – 3500 that's right, both of the Taboo Tuesdays rank among the worst-selling WWE pay-per-views of all time. The first one had the same premise as the second. The audience would be able to interact with the show and cast their votes to shape what they saw. There was a vote to determine who would face Chris Jericho for the Intercontinental Championship in which Jonathan Coachman legitimately came third. There was one to choose what weapon would be legal in a match between Kane and Snitsky. Steel Chain was the winner, so naturally Snitsky one by crushing Kane's throat with a steel chair. And then there was Eugene versus Eric Bischoff, a match where the loser's fate would be decided by the audience. In a cruel twist of fate, the horrible, horrible fans voted to have Bischoff's silky silver locks shaved off. You monsters. The novelty of this event simply wasn't enough to draw numbers as a pitiful 3,500 people showed up to watch it all unfold. To this day, it is the worst attended proper a WWE pay-per-view of all time. Maybe that's because, I don't know, people are busy on Tuesday nights? Just a thought. They say history is written by the victors. They, whoever they are, may also now say history is rewritten by those who own their own network. That's because WWE are able and sometimes forced to edit past problematic content from not only their own shows, but also from the various other promotion libraries that they own. So even if you think you're getting the full shebang for your $9.99 a month, that is not always strictly the case, and some major matters matches and moments from wrestling history are now only available via other means. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling and these are 10 moments edited off the WWE Network. Join us. Number 10. Roddy Piper vs Bad News Brown from WrestleMania 6 much of the content edited off the WWE Network is of the racially insensitive variety, and it doesn't get much more misguided than Roddy Piper's bizarre stunt from WrestleMania 6. In a bid to demonstrate to his opponent, Bad News Brown, that their dispute had nothing to do with skin colour, the Rowdy Scott painted half of his body black. Not only did WWE scrub the entire match from the show in 2021, but they got rid of Piper's controversial pre-match promo too. I mean, it wouldn't make much sense to have a pre-match promo without the actual match, I guess, would it? 
So if you load up the network and put on WrestleMania 6, you go straight from Brutus Beefcake giving the genius a mid-ring haircut to Steve Allen practicing the Russian national anthem with the Bolsheviks. Haha, <laughs> the good old days. The move to excise the entire Piper Bad News bout took some fans by surprise since this was a case of going back and removing not just a moment, but a significant chunk out of a past iteration of WWE's signature event. Number 9. Vince McMahon Survivor Series N-Bomb There haven't been many WWE characters as provocative as the boss himself. Well, the old boss anyway. Boy, does that sound weird. There were few lengths Mr. McMahon wouldn't go to in order to shock, entertain, or generate heat, whether he was demanding one of his employees bark like a dog in the middle of the ring or trying to choke the life out of his very own daughter. In a backstage segment at the 2005 Survivor Series, the genetic jackhammer crossed a line when he dropped an N-bomb while talking to WWE champion John Cena, prompting incredulous observer Booker T to audibly question if he really heard what he had just witnessed. Not only is Mr. McMahon's slur edited off the WWE Network, but the entire segment leading up to it has also been cut. Even though WWE intended the bit to be humorous rather than hateful, having the ex-chairman of a billion-dollar enterprise uttering that word was deemed unsuitable and it was scrubbed as the WWE Network prepared to transition to Peacock in America. America. Watch the show now and it uneasily transitions directly from the United States title opener to the women's championship bout. Number 8. Mickey's WrestleMania Moment Speaking of women's championship bouts, and speaking of uneasy transitions, eh, Trish Stratus is at the center of another major moment cut from the WWE Network. Mickey James and Trish Stratus's feud was one of the most provocative WWE storylines of the day, a take on the film's single white female, which saw Mickey portray an obsessed superfan who wanted to be more than just friends with her idol. There was tremendous heat going into their title clash at WrestleMania 22, with a feverish Chicago crowd chomping at the bit to see James become the new champ. The match itself was decent, but things got a little ropey towards the end, necessitating some major edits on the WWE Network. As Trish was getting set to deliver some stratisfaction, Mickey grabbed her crotch, forcing her to put the brakes on the move. Now, the crotch grab itself is intact on the network, but WWE cut to a crowd shot during the moment Mickey James licked her fingers. WWE also opted to remove the two making a dog's dinner out of Mickey's own stratisfaction attempt, using more cutaways to clean up the match's conclusion. Number 7. The Rock Concert Volume 1 Squeaky clean uber celebrity Dwayne Johnson, or as his friends like myself call him, The Rock, has one of the most micromanaged images in Hollywood, nary putting a foot wrong when it comes to comments that he makes in public. In the wild and woolly Attitude Era, on the other hand, the most electrifying man in sports entertainment frequently levied loaded insults at his foes and seemed to approach pushing the envelope with glee. While some of his content from the era has perhaps not aged so well, it nevertheless remains intact on the network. His 2003 rock concert, however, does not. The Great One was on fantastic form, singing songs making fun of Sacramento fans and WrestleMania opponent Steve Austin, but on the network, the musical portion is missing, and the segment quickly cuts to Stone Cold's inevitable interruption. So why did WWE choose to meddle with one of the most iconic Raw segments of all time? Well, nobody is really 100% sure, though speculation is that because The Rock is parodying the song Kansas City by Wilbur Harrison, it may just be a simple copyright issue. Number 6. Chris Benoit's Eerie Promo the use of Chris Benoit on the WWE Network has been a contentious issue since before the network was even a thing, for obvious reasons. Though almost all of the rabid Wolverine's matches and moments remain, WWE will never upload things like his Hard Knocks documentary profile from 2004, for example, and his matches never feature his actual name in the description, WWE opting instead to list his opponent or opponents competing in some variety of match type. And while it's more than fair to say that promos and interviews were never Benoit's strongest suit, one of his efforts has been omitted from the network. 
Prior to the Crippler's WWE title bout with Kurt Angle in the main event of the February 6th, 2003 episode of SmackDown, Benoit did a sit-down interview talking about their classic encounter from the Royal Rumble a couple of weeks beforehand. The reason WWE have scrapped it is likely because he expressly mentions his wife and children during it before he's interrupted by the Olympic hero. WWE have always had to be careful with how they navigate the Benoit issue, so deleting something likely to trigger memories of that horrible tragedy was a call they had to make. Number 5. Jerry Springer's Too Hot for TV Episode 1 you remember Jerry Springer's Too Hot for TV, don't you? Of course you do! Why wouldn't you? Appointment television, if ever there was. WWE drafted in the famous chat show host to present a bit of original network content that explored moments from throughout WWE history that were deemed too hot for TV. Except, you know, not really, since the vast majority of what they showed had been broadcast on television. Perhaps they can rename it Too Hot for the WWE Network, since one of the ten episodes produced has since vanished. It's actually the show's first episode, subtitled Love Hurts, that's no longer available to view. As you may have guessed by its title, the episode looked at some notorious WWE romance storylines such as Billy and Chuck's commitment ceremony and Dawn Marie shagging Al Wilson into a premature grave. Was there any one thing that caused WWE to snuff this particular episode off the network? It's hard to say, and it's probably a case of WWE reconsidering some things in light of our more politically correct times since a lot of the content from the episode is intact elsewhere. Number 4. Bret Hart in Stampede Wrestling There is no shortage of Bret Hart to savour on the WWE Network, with the bulk of his WWE and WCW careers documented on the streaming service. One era of the Hitman you won't be able to enjoy, however, is Bret's pre-WWE days in his father Stu Hart's Stampede Wrestling territory. WWE quietly removed several documentaries featuring footage of the excellence of execution in Stampede during the summer of 2020, having previously deleted whole episodes of Stampede Wrestling from the network archives. The titles kiboshed were The Best There Is, The Best There Was and The Best There Ever Will Be, Heart and Soul, The Heart Family Anthology, Bret Hart, The Dungeon Collection, Greatest Rivalries, Bret Hart vs. Shawn Michaels, WWE's Top 50 Superstars and The Most Powerful Families in wrestling. While the reasons for the cuts weren't made public, a little sleuthing made it obvious that Hart's Stampede footage was the issue. While WWE owns the Stampede Wrestling Library, Bret himself actually owns his own matches from that era since he bought the rights to them from his parents before they passed away. Evidently, the Hall of Famer and WWE were unable to come to an agreement on use of the footage. Number 3. JBL's Judgment Day Promo Bradshaw's transition from beer-drinking, barroom-brawling tag team specialist to Wall Street-working xenophobic main event star was, to say the least, a little jarring. Many fans did not accept it right away, which may have played into WWE's decision to ramp up the hateful rhetoric while resorting to shock tactics like the angle where Eddie Guerrero's mother suffered a heart attack because of the tall Texan at an El Paso house show. Heading into his WWE title outing opposite Latino at Judgment Day 2004, JBL had heat all right, but he dared to pour fuel onto the fire with his pre-match promo. Prior to Guerrero's entrance, JBL got on the mic and cut a two-minute long speech ragging on Hispanic people, the show was taking place in Los Angeles, which has a large Hispanic population, before claiming that he fired his Mexican housekeeper for stealing from him and offering to hire Mama Guerrero to be his new maid once she had fully recovered from her recent ordeal. It was a tip Typically strong delivery and garnered the desired response, but you can certainly see why WWE took it off the network. Number 2 DX's Nation of Domination Parody is there any period of WWE history as overly lionized as the Attitude Era? Yes, everyone was super over and it was exciting and the ratings were through the roof and all that good stuff, but so much of that era's content has aged about as well as that yogurt you opened three weeks ago, put back in the fridge and forgot about. And some of the worst offenders were D-Generation X. Look, I can just about tolerate WWE blabbing on about how the green and black group invaded WCW with a tank and definitely didn't just drive close to an arena in a jeep, but some of their antics were unforgivable. 
Looking at it through a modern lens, WWE appear to agree, at least when it comes to DX's parody of the Nation of Domination from the July 6th, 1998 episode of Raw, as it's no longer available on the network. Aside from sidekick Jason Sensation's always fantastic send-up of Owen Hart, the entire thing is an unmitigated disaster, with Triple H, Road Dog, Billy Gunn, and X-Pac donning blackface and doing deeply insulting impressions of their contemporaries. And like that old moldy yogurt, WWE felt the need to finally throw it out. Number 1. Buff Blackface if you think WWE were the only ones to utilize blackface for their primetime television show, and I haven't even mentioned the artist formerly known as Goldust vs. Flash Funk, then you would be wrong. Because anything WWE can do, WCW can do an even worse version of. I mean, they'd had plenty of practice. And who is the most insufferable person available on the WCW roster to do something immediately regrettable? Why, that would be Buff Bagwell, of course. Bagwell was certainly buff, and he did have the stuff, though the stuff on the July 19th, 1999 episode of Nitro was something to make his skin darker so that he could parody Ernest the Cat Miller. Oh, and he's also accompanied by somebody portraying Miller's manager, Sonny Ono, in what looks like a $2 Halloween mask. Great. If that didn't capture your attention, then the preceding racist promo surely would. Honestly, the whole thing is lamentable, and it's no wonder it's been cleansed from the network. It's also no wonder that Sonny Ono was one of the people who spearheaded a racial discrimination lawsuit against WCW, or that Miller ended up decking Bagwell for real before their big blow-off match at the Road Wild pay-per-view. The first time a WWE star appears on television is, or at least should be, a big deal. Not only is it in many instances the fulfillment of a lifelong dream, it can also be the beginning of a legendary career, a bookmark to look back on as a seminal moment in a performer's history. Sometimes a superstar's first on-camera WWE appearance takes place years before they're a superstar at all. From sprightly superfans to relatives roped into the action, I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 wrestlers who appeared on WWE TV way before they were stars. Join us! Number 10, AJ Lee. AJ Lee would go on to become one of the most popular female stars of her era, due in large part to the fact that she was just so different from her contemporaries. It's hardly a major surprise, considering how much she clearly idolized WWE Hall of Fame Alita whilst growing up. And there's video evidence to back that up, with WWE uploading footage of a then 14-year-old April Mendez meeting the former women's champion at a signing of Lita's It Just Feels Right VHS on July 18th, 2001. Overcome with emotion, Lee, clad in Lita t-shirt, has to fight back the tears while telling her hero how much she means to her. It's very cute, and AJ would reflect years later that she's thankful Lita was so sweet to her and didn't make her feel stupid for fangirling out. The footage aired on WWE television not long after, but the clip would take on a slightly different meaning over a decade later when Lee began dating and ultimately wound up marrying Lita's ex-boyfriend, CM Punk. Number 9. Tyson Kidd and Natalya In Your House Canadian Stampede was a homecoming for the Hart family, with Brett and Owen performing in the show's main event alongside extended family members Jim Neidhart and Davey Boy Smith. The Hart Foundation prevailed in the show Closer, with the finish incorporating Brett and Owen's father Stu and their older brothers. After picking up the victory, the Hearts invited the crew who were seated in the first rows of the Calgary Saddle Dome to come into the ring for a big celebration. Local legend Stu was naturally the centre of attention, but the moment offered a cameo to some younger members of the Hart House who would go on to have distinguished WWE careers themselves. The Anvil's daughter Natalia Neidhart can be spotted in the ring next to a young TJ Wilson, aka Tyson Kidd, a friend of the family who essentially became an adopted member of the Hart clan. Fast forward a little over a decade and Natalia and Kidd would make WWE debuts proper. Even sweeter, the two little Matt Rats would end up marrying each other in 2013 after being together for 12 years. Aww. 
Number 8. Dominic Mysterio The detestable Dominic Mysterio is one of WWE's hottest heat magnets these days. It wasn't always that way, of course, with Dom introduced to the WWE universe as a cherub-cheeked little tyke who was the center of an infamous storyline in 2005. While many fans recall him being involved as Rey Mysterio and Eddie Guerrero literally fought for his custody, the Judgment Day members' on-screen bow predates even that. Dom had been in the audience to watch some of his father's key matches, and by father we mean Rey for anyone who wants to get cute about it. This included when the Masked Man challenged for Matt Hardy's Cruiserweight title on the June 5th, 2003 episode of SmackDown, a rare occasion where the Cruiserweights got to headline on WWE TV. Since the show was being taped in Ray's hometown of San Diego, California, a fairy tale ending was the thing to do and Mysterio managed to bag the gold before bringing his son into the ring to share the moment with him. And just look at how the ungrateful little bastard repaid his old man. Number 7. Charlotte Flair Though Ric Flair's sons David and Reed keenly followed their father into the wrestling business, the Nature Boy's daughter Charlotte was more likely to become a professional volleyball player than a bone bender. Not that she hadn't been exposed to the industry from an early age, because Charlotte showed up in WCW in both 1993 in a vignette with her dad at that year's Starcade and in 2000, where she got physically involved with Vince Russo. Poor woman. The first time the second generation star graced WWE screens was in 2004 when she attended the December 6th edition of Monday Night Raw. Taking place in her hometown of Charlotte, North Carolina, Flair was on hand to witness history being made as that particular episode was headlined by Lisa winning the Women's Championship from Trish Stratus. Almost 12 years later, on October 3rd, 2016, Charlotte would herself compete in just the third ever Women's Championship main event on Raw, dropping the title to Sasha Banks. Number 6. Johnny Gargano Tommaso Ciampa's first WWE appearance of note was certainly a memorable one. Acting as the attorney for the controversial Muhammad Hassan, the Blackheart with slicked back hair and glasses read out a statement on behalf of his client addressing the shocking angle from a week earlier, which had gotten the Hassan character kicked off of WWE television. Thomas Whitney Esquire was then destroyed by The Undertaker, because of course. In a neat piece of symmetry, Champa's DIY partner Johnny Gargano's first televised WWE appearance involved the dead man's kayfabe brother Kane. Johnny Wrestling wasn't doing extra duty on WWE TV, but rather watching on in horror from the crowd as the Big Red Machine attacked a planted fan on the March 2nd, 1998 episode of Raw. Gargano, who would have been nine at the time, later explained that he was so terrified because he thought that Kane would come for him next. Number 5. The Usos It feels like we've watched Jimmy and Jey Uso grow up on WWE television, given that they've been a focal part of the promotion for coming up 15 years now. Their evolution during that time has been startling, as the Usos have blossomed from young men with bags of potential to two veterans who are among the very best the business has to offer. They may have made their WWE TV debuts proper by attacking the Hart Dynasty in 2010, but the twin tag team had at least one televised appearance under their belt. It was long rumored that either Jay or Jimmy was the kid interacting with Santa and Stone Cold Steve Austin during a segment on the December 22nd, 1997 episode of Raw, but that was, in fact, their non-wrestling younger brother, Jeremiah. The multi-time tag champions, on the other hand, first showed their faces on an episode of Confidential in 2002 during a profile of their father, Rikishi. Then 16, Jimmy and Jay joined in as their daddy performed a traditional Samoan dance, which is nice and all, but if they're not wearing yellow shades and busting a move to turn it up, can't say I'm too interested. Number 4. Edge A lifelong member of the so-called WWE universe, Adam Copeland's sports entertainment fandom was no stranger to those who knew him. He was voted most likely to become WWE champion in his high school yearbook and began training for a career in tights at the earliest available opportunity. A long time before he established himself as a WWE superstar in his own right, a 17-year-old Edge was in the crowd at WrestleMania 6, cheering on Hulk Hogan as his hero defended the world title against the Ultimate Warrior. 
It was a bad result for the teenage Hulkamaniac, but a much better one for himself nine years later when he himself wrestled in the Toronto Sky Dome and beat Jeff Jarrett to win the Intercontinental title, the first gold of an illustrious Hall of Fame career. Perhaps the most sentimental of his championship triumphs was when he got to team with his childhood idol and capture the tag straps in 2002. That's the power of prayers and vitamins right there, guys. Well, and being six foot five and shredded with a great head of hair and Hollywood white teeth, but mostly the prayers and vitamins. Number three, Velveteen Dream. One route that prospective stars used to be able to take to WWE was via Tough Enough. The reality show has produced several stars, including those that didn't actually win the competition but ended up getting signed anyway, like The Miz. Patrick Clark, aka The Velveteen Dream, was one of those who made it to WWE, well, NXT anyway, thanks to Tough Enough. Clark entered the 2015 version of the show and was a favourite to win, though he was somewhat shockingly eliminated at the midway point because of perceived cockiness. Patrick didn't seem quite so sure of himself when he attended a WWE signing in his hometown of Washington DC in 2011. 16 or 17 years old at the time, he was interviewed by the camera crew after standing in line to get his WrestleMania 27 DVD signed by Tough Enough Season 3 co-winner John Morrison. Clark complimented Jomo for how interactive he was with fans while praising the former Intercontinental Champion for being a down-to-earth and really cool guy. Note to future Velveteen Dream, sometimes it's okay to meet fans at signings and not inappropriately message them on social media platforms. Number 2. The Rock Dwayne Johnson would one day become the most electrifying man in all of entertainment, conquering the professional wrestling world on his way to becoming the biggest movie star on the planet, but in 1984 he was just an awkward kid with an afro watching his famous father do his job. A young rock can be seen sitting front row on the March 17th, 1984 episode of Championship Wrestling as Rocky Johnson and Tony Atlas successfully defend their tag titles against Charlie Fulton and Pete Doherty. No, not that one. The camera pans to 11-year-old Dwayne as Rocky is introduced, with commentator Vince McMahon failing to acknowledge the family connection. This is likely because baby faces in those days were supposed to appear um, available and rarely acknowledged having a wife or kids. The great one, self-admittedly a bit of a tearaway in those days, would sometimes accompany his dad on the road. Dwayne would later tell of how he was confused for a girl back then due to his soft features. He remedied that in later life by becoming so large and muscular that in all seriousness, I'm a bit worried about him. He's up on the Ico Pro, mate. You're in your 50s. Number one, Rob Van Dam. These days, if a kid wants to make a fast buck, they will, I don't know, invest in crypto or become an online influencer or develop a million dollar app or something. Kids these days, eh? God, I hate them. It was a trifle trickier back in 1987 when a 16-year-old Rob Van Dam got his first wrestling paycheck. Not by actually wrestling, mind, but by answering Ted DiBiase's challenge to kiss his million-dollar foot. RVD was still a few years away from making his own professional wrestling debut when he and some buddies attended a WWE house show in his hometown of Battle Creek, Michigan. The whole flipping show was paid $100 to pucker up and plant one on Ted's toes after DiBiase's victory over Dusty Wolf. The footage then aired on the August 9th, 1987 episode of Wrestling Challenge. Van Dam recalled years later how he could have negotiated a fee as high as $500 since the point of the skit was that everybody has their price and could only say no so many times before they inevitably caved to the cash. Rob accepted the first offer and got his face on television as well as a cool hundred bucks which it says here he spent on herbs. Oh, didn't know he liked cooking. WWE and WCW had a lot in common and frequently borrowed from each other. That extended to on-screen rivalries, whether that was the case while both promotions were in existence or long after WWE had won the so-called war. Vince McMahon may have outlasted his closest competition, but his presentations of certain feuds didn't always eclipse the way they were done by the Turner-backed organization. Sometimes, however, they very much did. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 rivalries done in both WWE and WCW. Join us! Number 10, Bret Hart vs. Kurt Hennig 
One of Bret Hart's all-time favorite opponents was Kurt Hennig, aka Mr. Perfect. The two were incapable of having a bad match together and routinely tore the house down with their watertight exhibitions of technical wrestling excellence. Hennig was also involved in some of the Hitman's most iconic WWE moments, dropping the Intercontinental title to Bret at SummerSlam 1991 and doing the honors once again as the excellence of execution advanced to the finals of the 1993 King of the Ring tournament. It was only natural that two wrestlers with such well-documented chemistry would want to lock up again when the chance presented itself almost five years later. With both men now getting their paychecks signed by Turner and not McMahon, they tried to recapture the magic at WCW Uncensored 1998. With Hart looking to defend the honor of WCW against the villainous New World Order, the two had a match that was just fine. Far from perfect, no pun intended, with neither man quite in their athletic primes, it was still an enjoyable wrestling match from two very good professional wrestlers, with Hart winning cleanly to end the dispute. Number 9. Rey Mysterio vs Eddie Guerrero Two of the shining stars of WCW's cruiserweight division, Rey Mysterio and Eddie Guerrero habitually stole the show whenever they were booked to wrestle each other. Clashing over the Cruiserweight title in late 1997, Eddie and Ray had one of the best matches, well, ever at that year's Halloween Havoc. The Luchadors continued to variously team and feud with each other until Guerrero left WCW for WWE in January of 2000. They picked up where they left off when the Masked Man joined him a couple of years later and ended up capturing the WWE Tag Team titles at No Way Out 2005. Latino Heat's inability to beat his partner in supposedly friendly competition forced him to snap, however, leading to a heel turn and a summer series with the master of the 619. Their matches at Judgment Day, The Great American Bash, and on SmackDown were all top tier, but fans mostly remember the storyline for the custody of Dominic element and resultant ladder match at SummerSlam 2005. Getting to see two such incredibly talented performers scrap so regularly was a true treat, and the program while different to their WCW one, was a more than worthy sequel. Number 8. Hulk Hogan and Roddy Piper not too long after Hulk Hogan's arrival in WCW, it became evident that the Hulkster was going to get his mates gigs and look to work with people who he had a track record with. That included potential opponents, and who better than his old adversary, Rowdy Roddy Piper. Hogan and Roddy had engaged in a fierce feud during WWE's rock and wrestling boom in the mid-1980s, with Piper proving to be the perfect villainous foil to the heroic Hulk. The two men who were on opposite sides of the ring for the very first WrestleMania main event rekindled their rivalry over a decade later in WCW. This time, however, the roles would be reversed. Hogan was now the treacherous leader of the New World Order, and the Rowdy Scott was the beloved veteran showing up to help WCW and take down his nemesis. Two months after emerging at the climax of Halloween Havoc 1996, Piper challenged Hogan in the main event of Starcade. And you know what? Hot Rod got the win, making the Hulkster pass out to his sleeper hole to win the WCW World Heavyweight. Wait a second, the title wasn't on the line. What a load of old belayer sh- Number 7, Goldberg vs Chris Jericho To call Goldberg and Chris Jericho's 1998 WCW feud one-sided would be an understatement. Hell, it barely even counts as a feud at all, since one person, Jericho, was doing just about all the legwork, while the other person, Goldberg, felt the entire thing was beneath him and had to be convinced to do as much as even hit his antagonizer with a spear. Big Bill's refusal to work a proper feud and match, even if it was a quick squash with him, was one of the key factors in Jericho's decision not to renew his WCW contract and sign with WWE instead. When Big Bill joined him there almost four years later, his second feud was with the one-time cruiserweight he felt wasn't on his main event level beforehand. Tensions boiled over before the two even began feuding on screen when they got into a backstage scrap at a raw taping. That fight was, according to various reports, won by Jericho, but the former Atlanta Falcon would prevail in their eventual one-on-one -on -one in ring meeting at Bad Blood 2003. The WWE feud was fine for what it was, even if it could have used 100% more Ralphus. Number 6. Raven vs Perry Saturn after departing the drug ship, sorry, I mean good ship, ECW in 1997, Perry Saturn and Raven would find success in the mid-card of WCW. Perry 
Harry soon became a member of Raven's flock, though Saturn was never really fully under the spell of the former ECW champion and soon drifted away to make a name for himself. Eventually, Saturn made it his mission to break up the flock, leading to a Raven's Rules match between the pair at Fall Brawl 1998. Saturn won, freeing the flock members from the clutches of their bullying tormentor. Three years later, Saturn and Raven would feud over something very different. A mop, to be precise. They feuded over a mop. A goddamn mop. Why did this happen? Well, that grungy prick fed Perry's one true love into a wood chipper at the behest of Saturn's scorned ex, Terry Runnels. Upset your man left you for a mop, are you, Terry? Get over it. We've all been there, sister. Anyway, things came to a head at Unforgiven 2001, with Saturn once again emerging victorious. A victory, maybe, but it wouldn't bring back that hot piece of wood. Number 5. Kevin Nash vs. Sid Tall, muscular men with solid heads of hair trying to powerbomb each other. What's not to love there? Well, a lot actually, because both the WWE and WCW versions of Kevin Nash and Sid feuds were... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Oh yeah, crap. First facing off in the bad old days of 1995, WWE Champion Diesel and the master and ruler of the world's dispute led to Big Daddy Cool defending his title against his fellow giant in the main event of the first ever In Your House pay-per-view. Their headline effort was, oh, what's the word I'm looking for again? Oh yeah, crap. Just as their lumberjack match at the second In Your House was, though at least that had a conclusive ending. Conclusive endings weren't on the menu when Nash and Sid squared off in a master of the powerbomb match at Starcade 1999. With the rules stating that the match would end when one man hit his signature move on the other, it naturally ended with no power bombs being performed and Nash just lying to the referee that he had done it. Hey, at least it ended their feud. Number 4. Randy Savage vs Ric Flair if there was one way to get under Randy Savage's skin, it was to make a pass at his wife, the lovely Miss Elizabeth. If you wanted to make the macho man an enemy for life, you could do what Ric Flair did and claim that Liz was mine before she was yours. Rick and Randy famously feuded after the nature boy doctored up some pictures of him and Savage's missus getting cozy, with Match responding by taking Flair's WWE title at WrestleMania 8. Slick Rick would eventually regain the title from Randy many months later, drawing a line under their beef. Well, for a couple of years anyway, because one of Savage's first orders of business when he joined WCW in 1994 was going after the dirtiest player in the game. In 1995 alone, the two wrestled on three separate pay-per-views. Flair beat Savage at the Great American Bash, with Randy gaining revenge in a lifeguard match at Bash at the Beach. Rick would dethrone Randy to capture the WCW World title at Starcade, leading to more matches on television and a cage match at Super Brawl 1996. WCW relied on the combination often, yes, but if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Ooh yeah, dig it! Number 3. Rey Mysterio vs Chris Jericho Chris Jericho really came into his own during his feud with Rey Mysterio in early 1998 WCW. The arrogant heel defeated the masked man to capture the Cruiserweight title at the sold-out pay-per-view in January, with Jericho taking credit for giving Mysterio a knee injury that would keep the former champ out until the summer. Rey returned at Bash at the Beach and regained his title by beating Jericho in a no-DQ match. Entertaining as their WCW work together was, it wasn't a patch on their later meetings in WWE. Having one of the best feuds of 2009, Mysterio and Jericho clashed on three separate pay-per-views and various times on television in a scintillating series over the IC title. Every match just seemed to get better and better, peaking at the bash when Rey beat Jericho in an exceptional mask versus title thriller. But it wasn't just the matches that made this feud stand apart, it was the character work and angles too that really put it over the edge. Watching it all unfold was enough to make a man shout, Booyaka, Booyaka! Not me, though. I'm better than that. Number 2. Booker T vs Chris Benoit There aren't many combinations of wrestlers who could successfully pull off a best of seven series of matches, let alone twice. That they were able to do so in WCW in 1998 and then again in WWE in 2005 speaks to the in-ring artistry of Booker T and Chris Benoit. Their first series began on the May 25th, 1998 episode of Nitro. Looking to become number one contender for the WCW television 
television title. The two traded the advantage across episodes of Nitro, Thunder, and Saturday Night, heading into the Great American Bash Decider, tied at three apiece, where the Harlem Heat Man just about edged it. In late 2005, the five-time WCW World Champion and the Rabid Wolverine attempted to replicate their previous feat, this time with the WWE United States Championship up for grabs. While enjoying a 3-1 to one lead over Benoit, Booker went down with a groin injury and was replaced by Randy Orton, who ultimately managed to win the series 4-3. When Booker was healthy again, he dropped the US title to Benoit in a final match at No Way Out 2006. Number 1. Hulk Hogan vs. The Ultimate Warrior For the main event of WrestleMania 6, WWE took the novel approach of booking two babyface superheroes against one another in a champion vs. champion showdown. WWE Champion Hulk Hogan met Intercontinental Champion The Ultimate Warrior following a friendly rivalry built on competition and a desire to be the best. Outside of a brief interaction in the 1990 Royal Rumble match, the two didn't touch until they were in front of around 68,000 people inside the Toronto Sky Dome. Ostensibly passing the torch to his successor, Hogan put Warrior over clean in the middle. Hey, did you really think that the Hulkster wasn't going to get his win back eventually, brother? Over eight years later and still seemingly haunted by the loss, Hogan was instrumental in bringing Warrior to WCW for a redux that gave fans serious reflux. Because it made us vomit all over ourselves, you see? While WWE's version of the feud was an artistic and commercial triumph, Warrior Hogan Part 2 was a total disaster, from their hokey segments and rambling promos to the eventual blow-off at Halloween Havoc 1998, where Hogan offered the perfect visual metaphor for the whole farce when he accidentally set his own face on fire. Thanks for watching. Getting romantically involved with a co-worker always poses a risk. While it might be all sunshine and lollipops at one moment, if things start to go south and a split happens, it can cause a whole host of problems. Something that these lovesick sports entertainers know all about. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 worst breakups in WWE history. Join us! Number 10. CM Punk and Beth Phoenix The CM in CM Punk could well have stood for Chick Magna at times, given the amount of fighting females he's gone steady with during his career. In WWE alone, he was romantically linked with Maria Kanellis, Kelly Kelly, Beth Phoenix, Lita, and AJ Lee, who he is currently married to. Does that boy just love kissing girls or what? Obviously, there have been some breakups along the way, and they haven't always been amicable. This included his purportedly year-long relationship with the Glamazon, which the second season City Saint broke off before cryptically saying on a radio show that it irked him to see people become complete douchebags and that his ex didn't care who her boyfriend was as long as someone was her boyfriend. Meow. There had supposedly been issues with their relationship due to Punk hanging around with Lita, who he used to date and would date again after breaking up with Phoenix. Beth, meanwhile, would find solace in the arms of Edge, who used to date Lita, who dated Punk. We got I love Square here, folks, and it's a beautiful, goddamn sexy thing to witness. Number 9. The British Bulldog and Diana Hart Smith Davy Boy Smith's wife Diana Hart wasn't a character on WWE television for long, but her short time involved with storylines sure was memorable. Having previously either accompanied her husband to ringside or been spotted cheering him on in the front row, Diana jumped right into the thick of it during the British Bulldog's 1996 rivalry with Shawn Michaels. Accusing the heartbreak kid of um, being inappropriate with her backstage, Diana also slapped Michaels during an episode of Raw. Diana and Davey had married in 1984, but ended up getting divorced in 2000. In her widely discredited 2001 autobiography Under the Mat, Diana detailed her husband's outrageous lifestyle, alleging that he was not only addicted to a whole host of substances, including cocaine, steroids, and painkillers, but that he had also been physically abusive towards her during their 16-year union. The book was recalled after Owen Hart's widow Martha threatened a lawsuit, and Diana herself has disowned it, claiming that the stories were massively embellished by the ghostwriter, but the damage to Davy Boy's reputation was done. 
Regardless of just how true or false the book's accusations are, there is no doubting that Diana and Davy Boy's relationship was of the toxic variety. Number 8. Kenny Dykstra and Mickey James In the mid-2000s, Mickey James and Kenny Dykstra were dating for a while and ended up getting engaged to one another. The former Spirit Squad member assumed Mickey would soon be his wife until he caught her googling Mickey James and John Cena dating. Weird, he must have thought to himself. John Cena isn't dating Mickey James. I am dating Mickey James. What the hell is going on here then? Well, turns out both were true because as James confessed, in dramatic fashion, she and the C-Nation leader had been having a months-long affair on the road. The engagement was called off and Kenny was transferred from Raw, where Mickey and Cena worked, to SmackDown. Things got even more complicated later on, however, when Big Shagger John informed James that he was planning on marrying his high school sweetheart and called time on their fling. She apparently took the breakup bad and was also moved from Raw to SmackDown, though Dykstra had long since been released by that point. I mean, can you blame her for taking it bad though? Cena literally told her she couldn't see him. Number 7. Randy Savage and Miss Elizabeth The tumultuous on-screen relationship between Randy Savage and Miss Elizabeth was mirrored by a wildlife off-screen, or vice versa. The macho man was notoriously protective of his wife, whom he had married in 1984, and kept her on a tight leash backstage. Not literally, of course. He would just lock her in closets and forbid her from fraternizing with the rest of the locker room. That's all. Perfectly normal behavior. Savage's controlling ways took their toll on his spouse, who, according According to just about every account, was a saint who put up with way more than most would have. Eventually, she had enough and headed down to Miami to hang out with Hulk Hogan's then wife Linda while Randy was on the road wrestling. One thing led to another, and Liz ended up asking for a divorce amid rumors that she was fooling around in the Sunshine State. Savage immediately blamed the Hulkster and Linda for putting ideas in his wife's head, leading to a fractious working relationship for the better part of the next decade and a heated rivalry rivalry for years afterwards. Number 6. Goldust and Terry Runnels After meeting while working together in WCW, Dustin Runnels married Terry Boatwright in 1993. Terry followed Dustin to WWE in 1995, managing his androgynous alter ego Goldust as the cigar-smoking Marlena. They were a dynamite act on screen, but things soon fell apart behind the scenes. At some point in the late 90s, their relationship became uns salvageable, leading to a bitter separation and ultimately a divorce in 1999. Things then got personal, with Terry accusing Dustin's father Dusty Rhodes of stirring the pot by calling her a gold digger and saying that she had cheated on his son. Dustin himself once outright accused his wife of sleeping with Jake the Snake Roberts, although that was quickly dispelled. Terry, for her part, grew tired of Dustin's substance abuse problems and resented being caught in the middle of his strained relationship with the American Dream. They managed to put their animosity to one side for the benefit of their daughter Dakota and have been on better terms in recent years. Even if the bizarre one did drunkenly serenade his mortified ex over the PA system on the infamous plane ride from hell. Number 5. Jerry Lawler and the Cat Jerry Lawler brought his real-life wife into the fold in 1999, with Stacey Carter joining the company as Deborah's on-screen assistant. Over the course of the next year and a half, she morphed from Miss Kitty into the cat. Now, that is character development, and had memorable spells managing China, feuding with Terry Runnels, flashing her itty bitty kitty you know what, and going to war alongside her husband with right to censor. It was right in the middle of her dispute with the RTC that WWE abruptly fired Carter because of attitude issues, with Jerry quitting the company in protest. It was a noble thing for the king to do, but it soon came around to bite him in his royal backside when it was revealed that Stacy was having a brazenly open affair with a WWE developmental talent. When the king's away, the cat will play. Carter soon asked Lawler for a divorce, leaving Jerry jobless and despondent as he was completely smitten with his much younger wife. With the papers being drawn up, Lawler found his way back to WWE, but it took him a long time to get over the divorce as he wrote in excruciatingly painful detail in his absolutely mental autobiography. Number 4. Big Cass and Carmella 
After meeting and falling in love during their time in NXT, Big Cass and Carmella ended up on the main roster, allowing their relationship to continue to bloom. By all accounts, they were happy and even bought a house together, but things began to unravel just as it seemed they were going better than ever. The Queen of Staten Island ended up calling things off in late 2017, citing the seven-footer's negative attitude, which was partly due to him being out with a knee injury, and the belief that he never intended to marry her. Fair enough, you might think, but Cass didn't take the breakup very well. According to reports, he attempted to reconcile with Carmella backstage at the June 19th, 2018 SmackDown taping. When she tried to walk away, he reportedly attempted to prevent her from doing so by grabbing her arm, causing Eric Rowan and the Usos to step in and defuse the situation. When Vince McMahon heard about what had happened, he let Big Cass go, despite him being involved with storylines at the time and coming just two days after his pay-per-view singles match with Daniel Bryan. Number 3. Steve Austin and Debra Steve Austin famously took his ball and went home in the summer of 2002 when being asked to put over Brock Lesnar on a random episode of Raw brought his creative frustrations to the boil. Stone Cold would also note that he was physically breaking down and had grown burned out from life on the road. Another facet to Austin's exit was the deterioration of his marriage to wife Debra. Just five Five days after walking out on the company, Deborah called the police to their San Antonio home and claimed that her husband had hit her before fleeing the residence. Deborah alleged that it was the third such incident of its kind, adding that she believed it was brought on by substance abuse. Austin ended up pleading no contest to the charges and was slapped with a fine, anger management classes, community service, and a year's probation. It was also the end of his two-year marriage to the former Mrs. McMichael. The Texas Rattlesnake would show remorse for his actions in later interviews and inevitably return to WWE. For Deborah, however, that was pretty much the end of her involvement in the sports entertainment business. Number 2. Matt Hardy and Lita Knowing he would be on the shelf for a while following reconstructive knee surgery, Matt Hardy asked his good friend Edge to keep an eye on his girlfriend Lita while they travelled together on the road. Well, the Rated R superstar did more than keep his eye on her. His hands, lips, and goodness knows what else, were all over the red-headed daredevil as Matt soon discovered to his horror. The sensei of Mattitude subsequently exposed this via his website, causing a bunch of issues for the three involved as well as WWE itself. Upset with how he handled the situation, the company released Hardy. Trying to make the best of an unfortunate situation, they then paired Lita and Edge up as an on-screen item. WWE eventually caved to fan pressure and hired Matt back, specifically to work a program with Edge and Lisa. Outside of the ring, Edge's second marriage to a woman named Lisa quickly disintegrated, with the scorned spouse throwing around plenty of accusations of her own. Uncomfortable for all involved, the love triangle storyline nonetheless played out without any major hiccups and everyone eventually moved on with their lives. Number 1. Triple H and China Power couples do not get much more powerful than Triple H and China. I mean, just look at them. See those muscles? How could they not be powerful? Bet they did chin-ups for breakfast. Of course, the power I'm referring to was both literal and figurative, with the game firmly in the main eventers club and China standing tall as the biggest female star in the company come the turn of the millennium. It was around this time, however, that Hunter would be paired up with Stephanie McMahon. Life ended up imitating art, and the fictional romance became real, as the ninth wonder of the world found out when she stumbled across love letters the billion dollar princess had written to her man. Though they lived together and were at one point engaged to be married, the affair compounded other issues such as whether or not they wanted to have children and the couple split up. Not only that, but the perceived belief that a devastated China would be unable to maintain professionalism while working in the same environment as the McMahon-Helmsley faction was a contributing factor to WWE's decision not to renew her contract. In theory, to put on a wrestling show, all you really need is a wrestling ring for your spandex-clad warriors to do battle in. Whilst most wrestling shows take place in halls and arenas of various size and stature, companies have in the past flexed their creative muscle and put on events in some weird and wonderful places. These exotic locales have at times been visually stunning, logistically frustrating, and on some occasions, downright dangerous. I'm Adam Pacisi from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 strange places pro wrestling shows took place. Join us.
Number 10, The Beach. The first ever WCW Bash at the Beach pay-per-views, initially called Beach Blast, took place in your typical boring old arenas. In 1995, Eric Bischoff seized the opportunity to have the event take place on actual sand and book the show to emanate from Huntington Beach, California. A loaded card saw Sting defend his United States title against Meng, Randy Savage topple Ric Flair in a lifeguard, essentially a lumberjack match, and Hulk Hogan retain the WCW World Heavyweight title by beating Vader in a steel cage match. WCW hilariously claimed numbers between 50 and 100,000 for attendance, but in actuality, it was closer to about 10,000. And that's nothing to sniff at, of course, but everyone got in there for free because, you know, it took place on an actual public beach. There were organizational issues on the day, according to Dave Meltzer, who attended the show. First off, there were no bleachers, making it hard for people to see much of the action if they were too far back, while the intense July sun was energy sapping and resulted, ironically, in a lack of crowd heat, not helped by the fact many people there weren't actual wrestling fans. Still, it did look pretty on TV and the Hulkster no doubt got a massive payday for headlining, which is all that really matters, brother. Number 9. A Cruise Ship if a beach holiday doesn't tickle your fancy, how about a cruise? After all, these days you're just as likely to see a pro wrestling show on a ship as you are the sand. I mean, especially if the cruise you sign up for is called Chris Jericho's Rock and Wrestling Rager at Sea. Bit of a giveaway, that. Le Champion came up with the concept in 2018, allowing fans to climb aboard with some of their sports entertainment and musical heroes to experience meet and greets, stand-up comedy, gigs, and grappling. For the first iteration of The Rager in 2018, Jericho partnered with Ring of Honor to produce four shows across as many nights, featuring the prestigious <coughs> Sea of Honor tournament. Going one further during the second wave in early 2020, the Demo God joined forces with his new employer, All Elite Wrestling, to tape an episode of Dynamite, reviving the Bash at the Beach name in the process. Naturally, MJF got thrown into a pool. Jericho's third cruise once again featured four days worth of wrestling courtesy of the AEW crew. Number 8. Penn Station WWE's Shotgun Saturday Night program was, at least initially, the company's attempt at delivering an edgier product. Something like their response to ECW, only, you know, with wrestling nuns and Sonny having relations with a giant Tickle Me Elmo. If nothing else, at least the show really did look and feel different from regular WWE programming, helped in large part by the list of eclectic venues they booked for tapings. New York night spots like Manhattan's Mirage Club and the All-Star Cafe in Times Square were certainly neat, but paled in comparison to Penn Station, location of the final proper episode of Shotgun before it became a routine Raw pre-tape. Though it wasn't the main event, the big attraction on the show was Triple H defending his Intercontinental title against The Undertaker. The Dead Man's entrance certainly took on a new dimension as he had to take an escalator to the ring, which incidentally was smaller than the normal WWE ring due to the cramped conditions. Taker took Hunter back to the top of the escalator after the match, delivering a tombstone pile driver on it and sending the game off looking like he was eight pints deep after his work's Christmas party. Number 7. The Mall of America the debut episode of WCW Nitro took place on the grandest stage of them all. No, wait, sorry. I mean, the grandest stage of the mall. While running a wrestling show from an actual mall may seem a little minor league when stacked up alongside a major arena or stadium, Bloomington, Minnesota's Mall of America certainly made a strong first impression to those tuning into TNT on September 4th, 1995. According to WCW Senior Vice President Eric Bischoff, the brains behind Nitro, the decision to run the show from the Mall of America was one born out of necessity as much as anything else. The company weren't exactly setting arena box offices on fire at the time, typically taping their televised product from Disney's MGM Studios in Florida. Describing the mall crowd as a little bit of smoke and mirrors to get a sizable audience in without having to worry about selling out a 10,000-seater, Easy e also recognized that the mall setting would provide a unique aesthetic. As a bonus for the hungrier fan, Hulk Hogan's Pasta Mania eatery was just a short walk away. Number 6. Wall Street WWE had previously run a short outdoor show in the heart of New York City when they invaded Times Square for the WrestleMania 11 public workout in 1995. 
Vince and Co. popped across the Hudson River five and a half years later to put on a more ambitious show on Wall Street. The company was celebrating their shares being traded on the New York Stock Exchange and put on a spectacle during lunch hour on October 25th, 2000. The street was packed to see the event, though live reports suggested the suits weren't that bothered about the in-ring stuff and were way more into the personalities, promos and confrontations. The only real attempt at an actual match was the Hardys versus Lowdown in a tag team title bout, though nobody did too much since it was only meant to be exhibition stuff and it lasted barely five minutes. Steve Austin was on hand to give Taz a stunner following the human suplex machine's victory over Al Snow, while Triple H ran in on Chris Benoit's encounter with Kane. Originally, Vince McMahon wanted The Rock to wrestle a bear on the show, according to Bruce Pritchard, in some heavy-handed visual metaphor about bull versus bear markets. Because, you know, The Rock was nicknamed the Brahma Bull for those who don't understand true creative insanity. Number five, an active war zone. During the Attitude Era, WWE Raw was often said to have come from the war zone, but in 2003, that statement was genuinely the case when the company presented SmackDown from Camp Victory in Baghdad, Iraq. The brainchild of John Bradshaw Layfield, who had gone on several USO-sponsored tours of military bases, the Christmas in Iraq show came together quickly and with several caveats attached to it. WWE were only allowed to take a crew of 34, bringing over 19 technicians and 15 talents handpicked by Vince McMahon, who also took the trip. There were legitimate security and safety concerns, and everyone involved was briefed about the potential issues, but thankfully it all went off without a hitch. WWE dropped storylines for the show, which took place in front of about 5,000 troops in a makeshift arena they had helped set up. Some of the wrestlers were apprehensive about the event, and it was said to have been an exhausting endeavor due to the nature of the travel schedule, but WWE ended up turning it into an annual tradition. Number 4. Ganrajima Island the country of Japan has specialized in wacky and wonderful locations for wrestling events, with promotions from FMW to DDT promoting matches in everywhere from campsites and trains to electrified swimming pools. Long before any of those, the country's leading outfit, New Japan Pro Wrestling, hosted matches on the deserted island of Ganrajima, which had been the site of a legendary samurai battle in the 1600s. The first Ganrajima deathmatch took place in 1987 between New Japan's main man and Antonio Inoki and Masa Saito. Lasting a grueling two hours and change, it was far from a technical triumph and feels about five times longer than it actually is. The spiritual sequel between Hiroshi Hase and Tiger Jeet Singh four years later, on the other hand, lasts a comparatively breezy 70 or so minutes, edited down on New Japan World, and is far more compelling. I mean, it's still not something you need to go out of your way to watch or anything, but it is a gory and inventive brawl nonetheless. As for why New Japan felt the need to go to an uninhabited island twice for these kooky clashes? Well, curious viewer, like nicking a Freddo bar when the shopkeeper isn't looking, I guess sometimes it's fun to do things just because you have the opportunity to do them. Number 3. Sturgis Motorcycle Rally more mid-90s madness from WCW now as their pursuit to put on wrestling shows in the balmiest places possible took them to Sturgis, South Dakota for the annual Sturgis Motorcycle Rally, where they presented Hog Wild. Like Bash at the Beach the year before, everyone got in for free, and what's more, at future shows rebranded Road Wild, they brought their big fat hogs with them. Since they were giving up the live gate, WCW had to take Nitro from Disney MGM Studios for a month beforehand as a cost-cutting measure, as well as strike sponsorship deals with companies who poured money into the rally itself. As a show, it really did look different from just about everything else, though the chopper-mad audience could be indifferent if not downright hostile towards things that they didn't appreciate. Logistically, the venue choice posed problems, particularly when it came to travel and accommodation for the wrestlers and crew, though many of the bone benders, including motorbike enthusiast Bischoff himself, rode themselves there. The inaugural Sturgis show was a good effort, all things considered, but later editions weren't up to par, if Leno what I mean. Number 2. The Roof of WWE HQ 
In the mid-90s, WWE attempted an ambitious production when they filmed a new opening credit sequence for Raw on top of WWE's headquarters, aka Titan Towers. It necessitated a giant crane to move ring equipment up there and a helicopter was enlisted to capture aerial footage. It was a visually stunning bit of business and a novel way of using company premises. 25 years later, WWE upped the ante, though not because they wanted to. The COVID-19 pandemic had thrown everything into flux, but the WWE show went on, whether they had to film in a sanitized performance center in Orlando or an empty office building in Stamford. For the two Money in the Bank ladder matches at the namesake premium live event, the rules were altered so that participants would have to fight their way from the ground floor of Titan Towers to the roof, where a ring was set up with the briefcases suspended above it. It was absolutely bonkers, featuring a food fight, oddball cameos, and King Corbin been chucking Rey Mysterio to his, at the time, presumed demise. Number 1. Pyongyang, North Korea we have seen a lot of previously uncharted territory on our countdown so far, but WCW and New Japan's decision to run two shows in Pyongyang, North Korea in 1995 takes some topping as far as strangeness goes. The idea of Japanese professional wrestling legend and then politician Antonio Inoki collision in Korea was supposed to improve diplomatic relations between Nippon and the so-called Democratic People's Republic of Korea. He was one of the few people who could gain true access to to the insular country and took advantage of New Japan's working relationship with WCW to put on two star-studded cards as part of the officially titled Pyongyang International Sports and Combat Culture Festival for Peace. Taking place inside the mammoth May Day Stadium, both days drew over 150,000 people, though official attendances are disputed, and really it's a moot point since people had to be there. Most watching live had never seen professional wrestling before and didn't quite know what to make of the spectacle, while the American contingent of wrestlers experienced a serious culture shock of their own as they had their passports immediately confiscated on arrival and were forced to participate in some good old-fashioned propaganda if they wanted them back. As the old saying goes, patience is a ver. Ugh, stuff it, I can't be bothered to read the rest of that sentence. And that's why I would be a terrible money in the bank holder, as that gimmick is all about biding your time and waiting for the best moment to use it. Hey, just ask any of these lots who all waited for well over a hundred days before making good on their briefcase win. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 Money in the Bank holders who waited the longest to cash in. Join us. Number 10, The Miz, 119 Days. We will get to Otis's time with the Money in the Bank a bit later on, but without spoiling too much, it was disastrous. He might have gotten super over off the back of his storyline with Mandy Rose, but he definitely wasn't at the stage where he should have been a world champion. WWE realized this eventually and tried to come up with a clever way of getting the briefcase off him. They then gave up on those ideas and just gave it to The Miz instead. Say la vie. Miz challenged the contract holder at Hell in a Cell 2020, aiming to use his partner John Morrison to his advantage. In a shocking turn of events, it would actually be Otis's second that won in the match as Tucker turned on his buddy to cost him the bout. Tucker, of course, would go on to do nothing of note before getting released the following year. Great work, guys. Miz held his new toy for 119 days before successfully cashing in on Drew McIntyre at Elimination Chamber 2021. However, as part of a deal struck with the Hurt Business, Miz then lost the title in a match against Bobby Lashley just eight days later. Number 9. The Miz, 127 Days well, would you look at that? A decade before he beat Otis to hold the briefcase for a second time, Miz won his first Money in the Bank contract in the traditional manner. He won the first ever Raw exclusive ladder match at the 2010 pay-per-view, whilst also holding the United States Championship at the same time. Miz lost that belt at Night of Champions in September, but would move on to much bigger things just two months after that. On the November 22nd, 2010 episode of Raw, the A-lister took advantage of Randy 
Randy Orton, having just defended the WWE title against Wade Barrett to cash in on the Viper. He blocked an RKO and delivered a thunderous skull-crushing finale to capture the title to the anger of little girls everywhere. Well, that particularly angry little girl anyway. The new champion had held this briefcase for 127 days, eight days longer than he would hold it in 10 years' time. His subsequent title reign lasted much longer than his one in 2012, as he ruled over Raw for 160 days. He even got to headline WrestleMania. Not sure if you knew that about The Miz. He never mentions it. Number 8. Austin Theory, 129 Days when Austin Theory won the 2022 Men's Money in the Bank match, it sparked frenzied debate over what WWE were going to do next, since both the titles were being held by the juggernaut that is Roman Reigns. Were they going to have Theory cash in and fail? Lose the briefcase to someone else? Let it expire? Notice how I didn't say have him beat Roman Reigns, because everyone knew that that was never going to happen. Fans would have to wait 129 days for their answer, as that's how long it took Mr. A-Town down to pull the trigger. He tried multiple times to cash in ahead of time, most memorably at Clash at the Castle, where WWE flew him all the way out to Wales just to get clobbered by Tyson Fury. In the end, Fury made the baffling decision to try and cash in on Seth Rollins, who was the United States champion. To paraphrase Bart Simpson, I don't think any of us expected him to do that. This was the first time a non-world title had been the target of the contract holder, and guess what? Austin lost. <laughs> you love it. Number 7. Daniel Bryan, 154 Days You could argue that Daniel Bryan in 2011 was the perfect example of a Mr. Money in the Bank. He was young and talented, but WWE were probably never going to naturally push him to the top of the card. Money in the Bank gave him a great way to win his first world title in a manner befitting how the company saw him. Small. They saw him as small. Brian won the SmackDown briefcase at the 2011 pay-per-view and would hold on to it for 154 days. He would have still been at number 7 on this list had his first cash-in on SmackDown gone as planned. D. Bry thought he had successfully taken in the World Heavyweight Championship from Mark Henry after 132 days with the case, but this was overturned as Henry wasn't medically cleared to compete. Not to worry, as the American Dragon would then successfully cash in on Big Show just a month or so later at the TLC pay-per-view. He would hold the big gold belt until WrestleMania 28, where he lost it in... Oh dear, it's this match, isn't it? Better not talk about it for too long. Let's just move on to the person who beat him. Number 6, Sheamus 161 Days Four years after taking on Bryan in the match that shall not be named, Sheamus was once again in the world title picture. This was during his mohawk phase that we all go through in our late 30s, am I right lads? He was also a heel, having returned from injury the night after WrestleMania 31 to blast Dolph Ziggler square in the mush. This led to their kiss me ass match at Extreme Rules. Remember that? Rubbish, wasn't it? Sheamus would pick up the Money in the Bank briefcase later that year, becoming only the second man in history to win that match as well as the Royal Rumble and King of the Ring. 161 days went by, mostly without incident. He attempted to cash in on Seth Rollins at Night of Champions, but was halted by Kane. And then came Survivor Series and the finals of a tournament to crown a new WWE Champion. After a hard-fought match against Dean Ambrose, Roman Reigns finally reached the mountaintop to win the very first World Championship of his WWE career, only for Sheamus to catch Cash in about five minutes later. Ha <laughs> ha you love it. Number 5, Otis 193 Days. See, told you we'd get here. The 2020 edition of Money in the Bank was very unusual, as 2020 was the year somebody opened the gates of hell, Pandora's box, and my underwear drawer all at once. The traditional ladder match was replaced by a cinematic encounter located within WWE's corporate headquarters. It was fun for the most part, if you take out that bit where Dana Brooke grabbed the wrong briefcase and looked like a total dingus. The women's match was won by Asuka, who actually won the Raw Women's Championship from a pregnant Becky Lynch. As for the men's, that 
that was won by our boy from Heavy Machinery. As we've already discussed, Otis winning money in the bank was a pretty odd choice. There was no way he was going to be beating either Drew McIntyre or Roman Reigns, and it quickly became apparent that the prop was now a bit of dead weight for the lad. The big man's 193 days with the case made him the person who held money in the bank for the longest time without ever cashing it in. Poor Otis, he just wanted to do the worm. Number 4. Dolph Ziggler 267 Days Taking a massive leap now, the next four contract holders all waited for well over 200 days to cash in. Dolph Ziggler won the World Heavyweight Championship briefcase in 2012 and held his prize for the remainder of the calendar year. In that time, he put it on the line not once, but twice. He beat Chris Jericho one night after SummerSlam in a match where, if Y2J lost, he would be terminated from WWE. Then at TLC, Ziggler main evented the show in a ladder match for the contract against John. John Cena. Ziggles defeated Big Match John to keep his grubby little mitts on the case. All of this built to the night after WrestleMania 29 and one of the loudest pops of the modern era. When Ziggler's music hit whilst Alberto Del Rio was lying injured in the ring, the crowd simply lost their minds. The show off had gotten pretty damn over during his run as Mr. Money in the Bank and all that hard work was about to pay off. The cash in was successful and the show off ended the night as the new World Heavyweight Champion. Number 3. Seth Rollins 273 Days after splitting up the shield in chair-swinging fashion, Seth Rollins fell right into the pocket of the authority. With a little, or a lot, of their help, he was able to snatch money in the bank in 2014 and begin one epic run with the briefcase. Going into WrestleMania 31, WWE had booked themselves into a hell of a corner. WWE Champion Brock Lesnar was set to face off against Roman Reigns in the main event. Lesnar had been a part-time champ since winning the belt at SummerSlam and fans were sick of him only turning up once every few months. That said, they were sick of Roman even more. Just when it looked like all was lost, WWE implemented one of their greatest ever booking decisions and had Rollins cash in during the Mania main event. This was the first time this had ever happened, as well as the first cash in to go down at the show of shows. After 273 days, days of hanging on to the case, Rollins successfully pinned Reigns to pull off the heist of the century. Seriously, props, and thank god they didn't take the contract off him sooner. Number 2. Edge 280 Days the first man to win Money in the Bank was also the one who held on to it for the longest. At WrestleMania 21, Edge walked out of the inaugural ladder match with his hands clasped firmly around the briefcase. Little did we know that we would be seeing him with his new accessory for the next nine and a bit months. For the next 280 days, the Rated R superstar quietly watched and waited for the perfect chance to strike. He was forced to defend his briefcase against Matt Hardy in October of 2005 before eventually choosing his moment at New Year's Revolution 2006. After an explanation by Mr. McMahon, because frankly nobody knew how this thing worked yet, Edge took on a bloodied and beaten John Cena, fresh off defending his title inside Elimination Chamber in the first ever cash-in match. Edge eventually put Cena down for the count, earning him his first of 11 world championships across a glittering WWE career. This cash-in was pivotal to Edge's ascension to the main event and to the development of his ultimate opportunist character. Number 1. Carmella 287 Days Edge might be the first male performer to have held onto the briefcase for the longest, but when it comes to the ladies, the answer is F-A-B-U-L. Uh, is it, is it another L or? Fabulous. She's fabulous. What I'm trying to say is that in 2017, Carmella became the first woman to win money in the bank. She was also the first woman to have the briefcase taken off her because somebody thought it'd be a good idea for James Ellsworth to get involved. Because WWE loves nothing more than to waste our time, they had Carmella win the briefcase back about a week later on SmackDown. And thus began the longest ever gap between a briefcase win and a cash-in. After a few failed attempts to bring home the SmackDown, 
SmackDown Women's Championship, the Princess of Staten Island finally scored big when Charlotte Flair was left laying by the Iconics. Thanks to Billy Kay and Peyton Royce, Carmella cashed in to win her first and thus far only Women's Championship in WWE. And to think, her time with the briefcase would have been even longer if a certain man with two hands hadn't gotten involved. Why must you ruin everything, you chinless knobend? Nobody did bad graps quite like World Championship Wrestling. Obviously, it gave us a lot of good stuff too, but when it came to really messing the bed when the lights were on bright, WCW routinely proved that no matter how much money it had at its disposal or how vast and talented its roster was, bell to bell, things could easily fall apart at the drop of a leg, brother! Amazingly, much of the absolute worst that WCW had to offer took place for major titles and in pay-per-view main events. After you take in a few of these horror shows, it becomes increasingly clear why the promotion isn't around anymore today. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 worst WCW matches ever. Join us. Number 10, Scott Steiner vs. Jeff Jarrett vs. Sid vs. Road Warrior Animal at Sin Forever known as the match where Sid suffered his horrendous and, for all intents and purposes, career-ending leg injury, it's worth remembering that this Four Corners World Heavyweight title scrap was resembling an omelette made with a chainsaw before the Millennium Man's sickening snap. Steiner was defending in a match that started as a triple threat between him, Sid, and Jarrett, with the promise of the mystery man being revealed later on. The action was poor, psychology all over the place, and the mystery reveal ruined because Sid was lying in the ring with his leg hanging on by a thread after attempting a second rope big boot. After that, everyone involved was just killing precious pay-per-view time and hoping to get through the bloody thing. As far as surprises go, Road Warrior Animal was un unfortunately, a bit of a lame one. I mean, especially when WCW were bigging it up as being on the level of Steve Austin or The Rock. Animal could also do nothing but deliver one hit to Sid, who clearly needed some medical attention by this point, allowing the genetic freak to retain. For a major show main event, this was almost inexcusable. Yes, the injury mucked things up, but it wasn't exactly going great guns before that, and it's quite impressive just how much nonsense they managed to pack into such a short period of time. Number 9, Steve McMichael vs. Brian Adams at Road Wild 1998 WCW's forays into Sturgis, South Dakota for their motorcycle-themed Road Wild events were neither commercial nor artistic triumphs. I'm sure it was all good fun for Eric Bischoff and his fellow hog enthusiasts on the WCW roster who basically saw it as a summer vacation on Turner's dime, but the shows themselves were genuinely pretty poor. One of the worst was 1998's iteration, which featured a comically bad match between Steve Mongo McMichael and Brian Adams. Look, I get that Mongo was a great guy that everybody loved, and Summer of 69 is a genuine banger, but this was simply no good. Adams should have stuck to rock and roll, because he was way out of his depth here, getting exposed like the complete amateur he was. The Horseman member wasn't the man to carry him either, as he had his own obvious limitations and needed to be in there with somebody who could keep him on track. The botched match featured one of the worst referee bumps ever before it was finally put out of its misery with a Mongo tombstone pile driver. Hold on a second, that was Crush. Please forgive me, I know not what I do. Number 8, Randy Savage vs Hulk Hogan at Uncensored 1998 Notorious frenemies Randy Savage and Hulk Hogan continued their Mega Powers tag team in WCW before inevitably they began feuding. And the magic of, say, the WrestleMania 5 main event seemed a long way off when the Hulkster and the Macho Man locked horns in WCW. Headlining 1998's Uncensored in a cage match, Savage and Hogan looked like the knackered, aging men that they were, lazily shuffling about at half speed before resorting to desperate measures in a last grasp attempt to generate interest. Both men ended up bleeding buckets, a rare sight in the PG-rated WCW, but nobody cared. The referee even let them out of the cage door in order to brawl at ringside, but 
fans remained disinterested, and who could blame them? Credit to Savage for delivering an axe handle from the top of the cage given the state of his famously knackered knees at the time, but that was a lone bright spot in a turgid so-called contest. Oh, and it ended in a no contest too, because screw you paying customer and screw anyone who thinks a pay-per-view main event cage match could have a decisive finish. Number 7. Rick Rude vs Masahiro Chono at Halloween Havoc 1992 You know, somebody should have sensed something was wrong when Rick Rude showed up without facial hair. The clean-shaven, ravishing one took on New Japan star Masahiro Chono for the NWA heavyweight title at Halloween Havoc 92 in a match where both competitors were allowed to choose a referee. Chono picked his countryman, Kensuke Sasaki, while Rude opted for Harley Race. Ollie Anderson flipped a coin prior to the match to determine which ref would be in the ring and which would be outside. Oh, sounds like we could be in for some excitement here, right? Wrong. Very wrong. This match is the antithesis of excitement. Filing tax returns is more exciting than sitting through this rest hold filled abomination. Seriously, by the 10th chin lock, you will be crying out for some wet paint so that you can watch it dry. The fans in Philadelphia evidently chose to make their own entertainment during this slog as a fight broke out in the audience. And I guarantee that that fight contained way more action than this match, which was not only boring, but lasted a ridiculous 22 minutes and 23 seconds and ended with a dusty finish when the champ was disqualified for throwing the challenger over the top rope. Number 6. Sid Vicious vs Eligante at Super Brawl 1991 While you would probably expect a match between two superior workers like Rick Rude and Masahiro Chono to be at the very least good, nobody is going into a bout between Sid Vicious and Eligante expecting a 5 star classic. The first Super Brawl pay-per-view had been a roasting hot dud by the time these two freaks of nature waddled out for their stretcher match. And while it only lasts a brisk 2 minutes 13 seconds, it somehow feels 10 times longer. They wisely tried to keep things simple, but simple was evidently a step too far for the enormous Eligante, whose attempts at selling made the star of your local panto look like Marlon Brando. Not only was the action positively rotten, but WCW didn't even adhere to the pre-match stipulation. After losing to the dreaded claw, the one move the future giant Gonzalez couldn't possibly mess up, Sid didn't go out on a stretcher, presumably because he didn't fancy looking that vulnerable on his way to WWE. The pitiful post-match angle with Kevin Sullivan and One Man Gang attacking Eligante only heaped on more embarrassment to this whole ill-judged presentation. Number 5. Steve Austin and Terry Taylor vs PN News and Bobby Eaton at Great American Bash 1991 The 1991 Great American Bash was one of the worst pay-per-views in WCW history, the legendarily bad show coming as the company was in turmoil following the shock departure of NWA World's Heavyweight Champion Ric Flair. With serious bad vibes hanging over it, the event got off to the worst possible start with an infamously awful tag team scaffold match. Ignoring how random the combination of teams is, let's just hop right in and dissect the match's crippling logistical flaw. Whatever genius made the scaffold for the match made it way too narrow. So not only could they not do any actual wrestling on the rickety death trap, but they could barely walk along the platform without fear of falling 15 feet to the ring below. And so nothing happened for 8 agonizing minutes besides stalling, punching, stalling, more punching, stalling, climbing down, and a little more stalling until the match just sort of ended for no adequately explained reason. They tried to make up for it with a bit of post-match wrestling inside the actual ring, but they were essentially trying to put out a raging house fire with a water pistol at that point. Number 4. War Games at Fall Brawl 1998 The War Games concept was tried and tested, but despite being seemingly easy to execute, WCW felt the need to tinker with a winning formula at Fall Brawl 98. The match was now three teams instead of two, and could end by pinfall at any time. Also, the winner would get a shot at World Heavyweight Champion Goldberg at the next pay-per-view, so it pretty much became every man for himself. As far as star power is concerned, the match certainly wasn't lacking in that department, with Hulk Hogan, Bret Hart, Roddy Piper, Lex Luger, Sting, Kevin Nash, DDP, and, um, Stevie Ray throwing down in the two cages. The Ultimate Warrior was also in the match, though he only turned up for the brain cell destroying finale and to meekly brawl to the back with Hulk Hogan and his perennial coattail rider Ed Leslie. Honestly, you would think with so many heavy hitters and a gimmick to work with and all the rest of it,
it that this match would be compelling in some way, but it just wasn't. Nobody cared, not the wrestlers involved, the fans watching, or the poor announcers who spent much of the match's runtime trying to make sense of the nonsensical. Number 3. Vampiro vs Sting at Great American Bash 2000 WCW was circling the drain by the summer of 2000, with head writer Vince Russo evidently making it his life's mission to speed up the company's demise by presenting a show without a single redeemable quality. The vast, vast majority of 2000's Great American Bash was bad, awful, terrible, horrendous, or otherwise appalling. But the Human Torch match between Vampiro and Sting was beyond insulting. To win the match, one man had to take another by the entrance stage and light them on fire with a torch. Sting started the match by changing the rules, because why not make things even stupider, bro? By hoisting the torch to the top of the entrance set and telling Vampiro he would have to go up there if he wanted to make him extra crispy. The actual match portion, such as it was, could best be described as meandering before they scaled the set, with Sting taking a bump onto some cardboard on the way up in preparation for the big flaming finish. With the lights flickering and spooky music playing over the PA system, Vampiro set fire to what was obviously a stuntman in Sting paint before the poor bloke did his best Jeff Hardy impression and WCW crew members tried desperately to disguise his identity. Number 2. Hulk Hogan and Randy Savage versus The Alliance to End Hulkamania at Uncensored 1996 Before Hogan became cool, debatable, by turning heel and forming the New World Order, he was responsible for some of the absolute worst stuff that WCW ever put out there. I mean, he was still responsible for that when he traded in the red and yellow for the black and white, but Hollywood Hogan was good value for a minute or two at least. Hogan's popularity as the all-conquering babyface hero was seriously starting to wane when the Doomsday Cage match main event from Uncensored 96 just about put an end to Hulkamania. Well, for the time being at least, it would take something like a leaked audio tape to finish the job, I reckon. Not that the Noble Alliance to end Hulkamania, that's Ric Flair, Arn Anderson, Meng the Barbarian, Kevin Sullivan, Lex Luger, Z Gangster, and The Ultimate Solution actually won this 8 on 2 handicap shambles. Oh no no no, I mean how could they beat the Mega Powers, especially when they were being aided by the Booty Man and his deadly frying pans. I would try to adequately explain the rules or the storyline or anything that could help this spandex-clad fever dream make sense, but I would just be wasting my time. Just like I wasted 25 soul-crushing minutes watching this total and utter farce in the first place. Number 1. The Warrior vs Hulk Hogan at Halloween Havoc 1998 WCW squandered tens of millions of dollars on various nonsense over the years, but one of the worst investments they ever made was signing the Don't Call Him Ultimate Unless You Want to Be Sued Warrior to a short-term seven-figure deal in 1998. The bloom was well and truly off the rose as far as Jim Helwig's cartoonish creation was concerned at that point, but WCW sensed the Monday Night War tide was seriously turning and brought him in for a boost. Not only were his promos and segments leading up to his huge grudge match with Hulk Hogan a total and utter disaster, but the bout itself was the worst in WCW history. Rumor has it that Terrible Terry convinced Eric Bischoff to use Ted Turner's checkbook and bring Warrior in so that he could get his win back after putting the face-painted muscle head over in the main event of WrestleMania 6 a full eight and a half years earlier. That match was a classic of its genre, a true clash of the titans that worked beautifully despite both men's physical limitations. To call this match a car crash, however, would be an insult to car crashes. It perfectly summed itself up when Hogan tried to use a fireball only for it to malfunction and end up burning his own fingers instead. I think the cosmic universe is trying to tell you something there, brother. Now, I don't know about you, but I sure feel old and knackered these days. Yes, the constant grind of being a YouTube funny man might have caught up with me, even if you probably didn't notice since I've managed to keep the standard of the knob jokes pretty damn high. High and stiff, like a knob. How long-time WWE stars who are in the 40-plus club manage to get out of bed in the morning, let alone keep up with performers almost half their age, is beyond me. But these lads and lasses are super-kicking father time in the face. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 wrestling legends who are getting better with age. Join us.
Number 10, Bobby Lashley. When Bobby Lashley made his on-screen WWE debut in the fall of 2005, it was readily apparent that he had heaps of potential. WWE had big plans for him too, but an ECW title reign and a high-profile match at WrestleMania 23 were about as good as it got before he exited the company in early 2008, the potential largely unfulfilled. Truth is, Lashley had the athletic ability and look to be a major star, but he he lacked a certain charisma to truly connect on a higher level. When the Almighty returned to the company in 2018, he did so as a much more well-rounded performer, the years of working for TNA and fighting in MMA having smoothed out a few of the rough edges that were there during his first WWE run. Bobby has proven what a top-level talent he is during this second stint, not only showing a marked improvement in his in-ring work, but also a new level of confidence on the mic and with his character work. Now creeping towards his late 40s, Lashley is one of WWE's most dependable main event acts. He also somehow looks even more rich than he did in his mid-20s, which shouldn't be possible and certainly isn't fair. Number 9. Dustin Rhodes They call him the natural. Natural as can be. Yeah, they call him the natural. It just comes naturally. So went the opening lines to Dustin Rhodes' absolute banger of a WCW theme song. It was an accurate assessment of Dustin, who took to the business like a duck takes to wrestling, or whatever that saying is. Now in his mid-50s and openly talking about his impending retirement, the 35-year-old veteran will be a serious miss on the AEW roster when he puts away the face paint for good. Dustin has gotten himself in tremendous shape over the last few years and, free of the personal demons that at times threaten to overshadow his on-screen work, is laser-focused on going out in style. His instant classic with Brother Cody at the 2019 Double or Nothing event kicked off this late-stage purple patch which has seen him have belters with the likes of Brian Danielson, CM Punk, Sammy Guevara and others. A surefire future Hall of Famer, enjoy Dustin Rhodes doing what he does best while you're still can. Number 8. Rey Mysterio Look, there has never been a moment in time that Rey Mysterio was anything less than really, really good, but the man himself has admitted that constant injuries slowed him down and made him perform below his usual lofty standards towards the end of his first WWE run. Between leaving and coming back in 2018, Mysterio wrestled part-time on the indies and internationally. He also, crucially, discovered the magic of stem cell therapy, making frequent trips to Colombia to get the injections that have not only prolonged his career by several years, but healed him to the point that he's been able to ditch the knee braces and turn back the hands of time by moving around the ring with a speed and grace that belies his 48 years of age. Seriously, if the masked man just showed up today out of nowhere, having never wrestled on TV before, you would peg his age at half of what it actually is. The WWE Hall of Famer hasn't lost a step and looks as good as he ever has. It's hard to believe that he was contemplating retirement not too long ago. Number 7. Edge If Edge's WWE career had ended with his doctor-imposed 2011 retirement, it still would have been one of the most illustrious in WWE history. But the Hall of Famer didn't want the ride to end on somebody else's terms and made the most improbable comeback starting with his spectacular surprise return at the 2020 Royal Rumble. The rated R superstar's promo style might not be for everyone, but when it comes to the work in the ring, you cannot argue with the results. Go on, try and argue with me. See how shouted at and blocked that gets ya. His matches with Seth Rollins, Roman Reigns, AJ Styles, Finn Balor and others have all been top class and thanks to his seasonal schedule, Edge has been able to properly rest and keep his body in prime shape. The ultimate opportunist turns 50 in October, by which point he might well have bowed out, having heavily hinted that he's close to calling time on this last chapter. Hopefully there's still time to bring Gangrel back into the fold before then. Number 6. Trish Stratus Trish Stratus retired from full-time in-ring competition at Unforgiven 2006, enjoying a storybook career ending as she beat her best friend slash greatest rival Lita to win the women's championship in her hometown of Toronto. Inevitably, Trish came back, including for the odd match in 2008, 2009 and 2011, before largely disappearing from our screens. The WWE Hall of Famer returned once more as a surprise entrant in the first ever women's 
Royal Rumble in 2018, which led to more tag matches and finally a big intergenerational showdown with Charlotte Flair at SummerSlam 2019. Showing no signs of ring rust as she rocked the house in her loss to the Queen, Trish decided that she wanted one more bite of the cherry this year, only this time as a heel. Turning to the dark side, Stratus has reminded everyone just what an effective bad girl she can be in her feud with Becky Lynch. At 47, the former seven-time women's champion looks better than ever, and I mean that both literally because, and I say this completely respectfully, holy smoke show, as well as she does in the ring. Clearly her years of practicing yoga and adhering to a healthy lifestyle have kept her in top shape because the Trish from 2023 is even leaner and meaner than the Trish from 2003. Number 5. Jeff Jarrett At this stage in the game, Jeff Jarrett has just about seen and done it all when it comes to the pro wrestling business. Having debuted all the way back in 1986, the third generation star has demonstrated an unparalleled knack for surviving and thriving in an often cutthroat business. There have been some high highs and low lows along the way, but Double J consistently manages to land on his feet and prosper even after going through some real rough patches in recent recent times. These days, The Chosen One is of course All Elite, working not only as the company's director of business development, but as a featured on-screen talent too. You could hear the sound of a thousand moaning tweets when Jarrett cropped up on Dynamite and cracked Darby Allen with his trademark guitar, but you would be a bald-faced lying bastard if you didn't admit that he's been great value since. The former WCW World Heavyweight Champion looks like he's having the time of his life out there, drawing some real genuine heat while working with the new generation of stars. Credit must go to Jarrett for getting in phenomenal shape and using his veteran experience to help get others over. Ain't he great? Number 4. Mickey James Mickey James made her pro wrestling debut all the way back in 1999, two days before she turned 20. And Mickey has been going strong ever since, working her way from the Indies to WWE before an impressive run in TNA slash Impact paved the way for a second WWE run. After she was released and famously had her belongings sent to her in a bin bag, Mickey may have wondered what, two decades into her career, was next. Her reemergence in Impact has been a triumph, in particular her inspired last rodeo series, which saw James test herself against Impact's best en route to a fifth knockouts title. With the stipulation that the next time she lost she would have to retire, Mickey wrestled every match as if it were her last. There was a genuine sadness to the thought that the veteran might actually call it a day. The last rodeo and her recent work in Impact in general has solidified Mickey's status as a legend and exhibited how much of a well-rounded total package she really is. A true credit to the industry, let's hope there are many more rodeos in her future. Number 3. Seamus Seamus has never been shy about smashing other people in the face, but these days he seems to relish hitting them extra hard. And you know what? It is absolutely class. The Celtic Warrior has been around WWE for an age, having made his on-screen debut back in 2009. There have been plenty of ups and downs along the way, but Sheamus has only gotten better and better and better and better over time, to the point that he's now delivering banger after banger after banger after banger after banger. After banger. The fella has always been a hard-nosed workhorse, but it's fair to say that his efforts perhaps went underappreciated by some in the past. Having found sadistic soulmates in fellow bruisers like Drew McIntyre and Gunther, Sheamus has been having the matches of his life of late, leaving it all in the ring every time he steps through the curtain. You wonder how much time he has left given his age and history of injuries, but the Irishman shows no signs of slowing down, and as long as there's a chin to be kicked or a chest to be clubbed, he will be on hand to dish it out. Number 2. Randy Orton A naturally gifted third generation athlete, it was obvious from the very get go that young Randy Orton was going to be something special. Watching footage of him in WWE developmental territory OVW in the early 2000s, you can see very clearly that the future legend killer is as smooth as silk and has the physical abilities to be a star. That promise was fulfilled very early as Randy, while being groomed by Evolution teammates Triple H and Ric Flair, became a headliner and won his first world title at the tender age of 24. 
Since then, Orton has won everything there is to win in WWE and has amassed an enviable body of work across the two decades he's been on the main roster. Considered the gold standard by many industry veterans, the Viper may no longer be the face of the company, but he is in many ways a much better and more versatile sports entertainer than ever. His timing, facial expressions, psychology, and way of dictating the pace of a match, segment, or storyline make him an invaluable asset at a time when available performers with so much main stage experience are few and far between. Number 1. Brock Lesnar You know, for somebody who supposedly doesn't care about the professional wrestling business, Brock Lesnar doesn't half put a shift in on the rare occasions he actually has to put a shift in, that is. It didn't take long for the next big thing to establish himself as, well, the next big thing after making his main roster debut in the spring of 2002. That was over two decades ago, and while Lesnar's WWE career has been inconsistent on occasion, these days he looks like he's got it all figured out and stands as a class apart from his peers. After an eon standing behind Paul Heyman and playing the mean-mugging menace with the short back and sides, the Beast Incarnate transformed himself into Cowboy Brock, a man who did his own talking, wore his own clothes, and drove his own tractor by God. A tremendous and much-needed way to freshen up an act that had gotten stale, Cowboy Brock was perhaps the ultimate version of Brock Lesnar. I mean, it was certainly the most fun and did nothing to diminish Brock's aura as a terrifying monster of a man who will suplex you out of your skin if you dare look at him sideways. His matches with the likes of Lashley, Reigns, and McIntyre serve as proof that he is worth every zero on those big, fat paychecks of his. Royal Rumble, WrestleMania, SummerSlam, Survivor Series. These are the traditional big four of WWE's pay-per-view schedule, the company's oldest shows and the ones that are typically treated with the most respect and prestige. I mean, if you discount all the times Vince McMahon tried to cancel Survivor Series, but I digress. These events have given us some of the greatest wrestling cards of all time, but they would be nothing without the smaller pay-per-views leading up to and after them. These are sometimes called B-shows, and today we are showing them some love. But before we begin, we have decided not to count Money in the Bank or King of the Ring in this list, as they are sometimes clumped into a big five. Which is bollocks, but there you go. Shout out to the 2011 and 1998 iterations of those shows, respectively. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 best B-show pay-per-views in WWE history. Join us. Number 10, Extreme Rules 2012. The night after WrestleMania 28, Brock Lesnar made his return to WWE for the first time in eight years. The former UFC heavyweight champion strode out on stage, popped that one guy in a camo t-shirt really hard, and then laid out John Cena with a fluorescent green F5. This was all to set up Brock's first match back, an Extreme Rules match at, well, Extreme Rules, clues in the name. In the show's main events, the Beast and Big Match John knocked seven bells out of one another in one of the most brutal matches the company had seen in quite a long time. Elsewhere saw two excellent World Championship matches, Sheamus vs Daniel Bryan in a 2 out of 3 falls match, and CM Punk defending against Chris Jericho in a Chicago street fight. It also had Brodus Clay vs Dolph Ziggler, but hey, nothing's perfect. A great undercard capped off with a brutal main event, you almost overlook the utter stupidity in having Brock do the job. Almost. Number 9. Evolution in 2018, WWE put on its first two major shows in Saudi Arabia. Owing to the culture of the nation, female performers were not allowed on these shows at the time. On the 28th of October, just five days before the Crown Jewel show was set to take place in Saudi, WWE put on their first ever all-female pay-per-view event, Evolution. I'm sure these two things are in no way linked. A showcase of the best female talent the company had to offer, Evolution was a stacked card with a triple header of matches for the NXT, SmackDown, and Raw women's titles. Charlotte Flair and Becky Lynch stole the show with their insane last woman standing match, but applause must also go to Shayna Baszler and Kyrie Sane, Nikki Bella and Ronda Rousey, and Mae Young Classic finalists Tony Storm and Io Shirai. Not only were the matches great, but this was also a celebration of the program women's wrestling had made in the company. It was genuinely heartwarming to see WWE treat its female workers this way after years of animosity towards them. 
Still waiting on that second one, though. Number 8. No Mercy 2002 About a decade before he battered Cena at Extreme Rules, Lesnar was battering The Undertaker at No Mercy 2002. The future Street Breaker and Streak Breaky met inside Hell in a Cell for Brock's WWE Championship. It was a match so brutal that even Paul Heyman ended up getting color somehow as Brock put the dead man away to solidify his position as the next big thing. This show is also home to what many consider to be the greatest WWE tag team match of all time. In it, Chris Benoit and Kurt Angle teamed up to face Edge and Rey Mysterio to determine the initial holders of the WWE Tag Team Championships. These four had insane chemistry together and the fantastic storyline of Angle and Benoit as a dysfunctional team underpinned this technical classic to perfection. Jamie Noble defeated Tajiri in a fun cruiserweight title match and Triple H unified the World Heavyweight and Intercontinental Championships against Kane in a match that was more historic than, you know, good. But in terms of memorable moments, few B-shows come close to matching this one. I mean, who could forget Dawn Marie versus Tori Wilson as part of that storyline where Dawn was bonking Tori's dad? Classic stuff, that. Number 7. Fully Loaded 2000 The year 2000 is considered by many to be WWE's best ever in terms of creative output and mainstream success. Almost every pay-per-view the company put out that year was a smash, with one of their best offerings coming in the form of Fully Loaded in July. The theme of this show was the established main event crew tangling with the new crop of would-be headliners. This was illustrated in the show's three major matches, The Undertaker vs. Kurt Angle, Triple H vs. Chris Jericho, and The Rock vs. Chris Benoit. Granted, none of the newer guys actually won any of their matches, but hey, it's the thought that counts, and two of the three matches were exquisite. The show opened with a thrilling mixed-gender tag, pitting the Hardy Boys and Lita against TNA and Trish Stratus. Not only was the action good, but this was also one of the earliest moments in the epic rivalry between Trish and Lita. Throw in Perry Saturn versus Eddie Guerrero and Rikishi doing an insane dive off the top of a cage onto Val Venus, and you've got yourself a recipe for one hell of a good time. I mean, unless you're Rikishi's knees or Val's everything. Number 6. Vengeance 2005 A wrestling card with only five matches on it? Sign me the hell up. This quintuplet from the 2005 Vengeance show all stand out in one way or another. Shelton Benjamin vs. Carlito for the Intercontinental Championship was technically sound. Victoria vs. Christy Hemi was entertaining by the standards of the time. Edge taking on Kane was another step in the rated R superstars are sent to the main event. And then there were the two rematches from WrestleMania 21. The first was Shawn Michaels taking on Kurt Angle. The two legends had put on what was arguably the best Mania match of all time up to that point and did not disappoint when it came to the sequel. And then came the main event, a Hell in a Cell match pitting World Heavyweight Champion Batista against his former boss and grumpiest man alive, Triple H. The animal and the game went to war inside the cell, putting on a near half-hour-long match that never let up. Big Dave pinned Big Papa H with a Batista bomb to solidify himself as the champion and end Hunter's time in the main event scene. Who are we kidding? He never left the main event scene. Number 5. Unforgiven 2006 When it comes to discussing John Cena's greatest career rivals, the conversation inevitably turns to Randy Orton, The Rock, and his own hairline. However, those of us who really know our FUs from our AAs say Edge. The two stars feuded on and off across 2006 after the Canadian cashed in his Money in the Bank briefcase on Cena at New Year's Revolution. The huge blow-off to their rivalry came at Unforgiven when Edge put the WWE title on the line in a TLC match. In one of John's best matches up to that point, he went toe-to-toe -to -toe with one of the innovators of TLC and won it in spectacular fashion by giving the FU to Edge off a ladder through a stack of tables. But it wasn't just these two who tore it up in Toronto that night. Trish Stratus wrestled and went over in her last match as a full-timer against longtime frenemy Lita. Johnny Nitro and Jeff Hardy got 17 goddamn minutes to play with, and DX took on Vince McMahon, Shane McMahon, and The Big Show in a Hell in a Cell match that was ironically entertaining and genuinely violent. Number 4. Backlash 2001 WrestleMania X7 is widely regarded as the greatest show WWE have ever done, so the one that came immediately after it had some big shoes to fill. 
Thankfully, though, the feet on Backlash 01 were enormous. The show was opened by the greatest faction of all time, X-Factor, defeating the Dudley Boys in a decent six-man tag. Then Rhino took on Raven in a hardcore match so good that TNA would run it in the main event of their Unbreakable pay-per-view four years later. William Regal beat Chris Jericho in the highly entertaining Duchess of Queensbury rules match. Kurt Angle and Chris Benoit pushed the boundaries with an exceptional 30-minute ultimate submission match. Shane McMahon jumped on the big show in one of his career-defining leaps. And then came the big one, Matt Hardy, Christian and Eddie Guerrero in a triple threat match for the European title. Oh, and then the two-man power trip versus Brothers of Destruction with all the belts on the line. This mammoth main event closed out a stacked show by having Triple H and Stone Cold Steve Austin beat Taker and Kane to hold all the gold at the end of the night. Do not sleep on this show, it's awesome. Number 3 ECW One Night Stand 2005 While some may prefer the 2006 iteration, which saw Rob Van Dam defeat John Cena to become WWE Champion, in our opinion, you just can't beat the original. Prompted by the success of the Rise and Fall of ECW DVD set, WWE decided to raise the extreme promotion from the dead for a night of ultra-violent nostalgia. The show presented a melting pot of matches featuring currently employed talent, former ECW talent, and a whole host of free agents. Lance Storm took on Chris Jericho as the Thrill Seekers imploded. Super Crazy, Tajiri, and Little Guido had another of their famous three-way dances, not triple threats, thank you very much. Rey Mysterio took on Psychosis and a throwback to their early days in America. And the main event was the Dudley Boys in full tie-dye glory taking on Tommy Dreamer and the Sandman who got his full Metallica entrance and everything. Throw in Chris Benoit scrapping with Eddie Guerrero and Mike Awesome and Masata Tanaka ripping each other to pieces. Bloody hell, it was good. And One Night Stand is the perfect homage to the little Philadelphia-based company that could. Number 2. In Your House Canadian Stampede Often cited as one of the most complete WWE cards ever, the 16th In Your House event was subtitled Canadian Stampede due to the close proximity to the Calgary Stampede event in Canada. It was also an homage to the Hart family, who got their start in wrestling through Father Stew's Stampede territory. The extended Hart clan, plus Brian Pillman, who tagged along for the ride, were facing the team of the Road Warriors, Gold Dust, Ken Shamrock, and Stone Cold Steve Austin in the main event. This was slap bang in the middle of the Hart Foundation's Heel in America facing Canada run, so the place went absolutely ballistic when the Hitman and company came to the ring. The noise only increased when the hometown heroes beat those dastardly Yanks to send the crowd home happy. And the other three matches on this show, yes, there were only three other matches, were also terrific. Hunter Hearst Helmsley and Mankind continued their rivalry, The Undertaker battled Vader, and a Japanese talent exchange saw Takamishi Noku take on the great Sasuke. Short, sweet, and straight to the point, there is a reason this show ranks so highly amongst many people's greatest WWE shows of all time. Number 1. Backlash 2000 Edge and Christian vs DX, Dean Malenko vs Scotty Too Hossie, Chris Jericho vs Chris Benoit, The Big Show parodying Hulk Hogan, Bubba Dudley putting Trish Stratus through a table. These are all good matches and great moments, don't get me wrong, but come on, you're all here for the main events. Mega Heel WWE Champion Triple H was putting his belt on the line against The Rock in a match that really should have main evented WrestleMania a month earlier. In one of the greatest examples of why wrestling was popular in the Attitude Era, this match is overflowing with drama. Rock is constantly fighting from underneath to overcome the game's various henchmen, including crooked referee Shane McMahon. And then, just as it looked like all was lost, the glass shattered. Stone Cold was supposed to be in The Rock's corner, but had failed to show up for the match. However, just when his old rival needed him the most, the Texas Rattlesnake showed up with a chair in his hand, laying out fools left, right, and center, allowing the Great One to reclaim the gold. Sometimes a good main event is enough to secure a show's place in history. Backlash didn't have a good main event. It had one of the all-time greatest. When he got his giant muscular hands on the keys to WWE, Triple H made a 
bit of a habit of bringing back some of his old favorites that were let go under the McMahon regime. While returns like Dakota Kai and Bronson Reed make a lot of sense, some have perhaps seemed a little strange. Even mega popular names like Bray Wyatt haven't had the smoothest ride so far, at least at the time of recording. Don't worry though, because we've got some really <laughs> weird ones for you from years gone by. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 seriously random WWE re-signings. Join us. Number 10, Chris Masters in 2009. The masterpiece Chris Masters was given a fairly decent shake of the stick during his first stint with WWE. Debuting in February 2005, Masters got over with his impressive physique, arrogant mannerisms, and seemingly unbreakable master lock finisher. He teamed with Carlito to form my favorite tag team, the Masters of Cool, had the opening match at WrestleMania 22, and challenged for the WWE title on a number of occasions. However, via Violations of WWE's wellness policy meant that Masters was let go in November 2007. After floating around on the indies, the chiseled superstar returned to McMahonland in July of 2009 and did, well, not a lot really. He had a very brief feud with MVP, got into a relationship with Eve Torres, and that was about it. He was then released again in 2011, so what was all that for really? What makes this rehire so random is that WWE clearly saw something in Masters during his first run. So why didn't they try and recapture that magic the second time around instead of making him a glorified jobber? That said, the peck dancing thing, really cool. Number 9, Gail Kim in 2008. Whilst working for TNA between 2005 and 2008, Gail Kim helped revolutionize the way women's wrestling was seen in North America. Her feud with Awesome Kong over the Knockouts Championship is nothing short of legendary and helped put the entire company on the map. However, when Kim's contract expired in 2008, she chose to go back to WWE. Kim's first go around in the company started off very strong as she won the women's championship in her very first match. She lasted a little over a year before being abruptly cut as management informed her that they wanted to take the women's division in a new direction. That direction clearly involved a lot more bikinis. So we're not really sure what Kim was expecting when she went back to WWE. The company still didn't really care about its female performers, so they weren't going to give her anywhere near the same treatment she'd received over in Nashville. Kim realized this herself on the August 1st, 2011 episode of Raw, where she was so fed up that she eliminated herself from a battle royal. She left the company later that year, and honestly, it's hard to argue with her decision. Seriously wasted potential on WWE. WWE's part. Number 8. The British Bulldog in 1999 During the 80s and early 90s, the British Bulldog was a fantastic mid-card and tag team act who truly embodied the cartoony spirit of the World Wrestling Federation. Sadly, that spirit had become a lot more dark and grimy by the time Bulldog returned to the company in 1999. After leaving in protest over the Montreal screw job, Bret Hart was his brother-in-law after all, Davy Boy spent a couple of years working for WCW. Sadly, the the only notable thing he achieved there was a serious back injury when he landed hard on a trap door. He went back up north in September 1999 and just a few weeks later was headlining the Unforgiven pay-per-view in a WWE title six-pack challenge. The other participants were Triple H, Big Show, Mankind, Kane and The Rock. No offense to the lad, but at this point in his career, Bulldog stuck out like a very British sore thumb. And that was basically the story of his entire return run. Bulldog just felt like he didn't belong, like he was a hangover from another era. Exacerbated by his injuries, it was clear that Davy Boy was just not made for the Attitude Era, no matter how much denim he wore. Still, worked for Triple H, didn't it? Number 7. Sable in 2003 In her prime, Sable was one of the most popular performers in the entire industry. Not for her wrestling, but hey, the Attitude Era. Whether it was feuding against her jealous husband Mark Mero, competing for the revived women's championship, or turning Jerry Lawler into a puddle of drool, Sable was a star, and then, in 1999, she was out the door. Mrs. Brock Lesnar first left WWE under pretty dire circumstances. In fact, on her way out, she filed a $10 million lawsuit against the company, citing allegations of harassment and unsafe working conditions. This made it all the more confusing when, in 2000, 
2003, she returned to the very same company she had taken legal action against. In a very icky turn of events, Sable was rehired to play the on-screen mistress of Vince McMahon. As well as making out with the chairman, Sable feuded with the likes of his daughter Stephanie and Tori Wilson. She wrestled her final match in June 2004 and left the company once and for all in August. Number 6. Test in 2006 did you know that Test first debuted in WWE as a bodyguard for the band Motley Crue? Did you want to know that? Well, tough. The big Canadian first worked for WWE between 1998 and 2004 and got involved in some pretty hefty storylines. This was the guy who was at one point scheduled to be the on-screen husband of Stephanie McMahon. That darn Triple H in his wacky schemes, what's he like, eh? Tess then teamed with Albert, played turncoat during the invasion, and won a bunch of different championships before his time in the promotion came to an end. Two years later, though, and the big guy was back on the ECW brand. He challenged Bobby Lashley for the ECW title at the 2007 Royal Rumble, was part of that god-awful Extreme Elimination Chamber match at December to Dismember, and got suspended for a wellness policy violation before leaving once again. Okay, so he was in the alliance, which technically had ECW in it, but what else did this very WWE man have to do with the land of the extreme? Number 5. Eva Marie in 2021 when Eva Marie first signed for WWE back in 2013, the landscape was very different. We were still in the divas era of women's wrestling, where management seemed to care more about how a female wrestler looked than how she performed. Naturally, the striking redhead former model fit right in. To put it politely, Eva Marie was not a natural. And if you think that's not very polite, you should have seen the first draft of this script. After stinking up the main roster and NXT until 2017, she and the company finally parted ways. Phew, glad that's over. There's no way she's getting rehired now that we have all of these really talented stars in the women's division, right? Wait a minute. Yes, Eva was back, re-signing with the company in late 2020. During this run, she cut a few promos, changed Piper Niven's name to Dewdrop, and wrestled a bad match with Alexa Bliss at SummerSlam. Her comeback lasted about a year, which was about a year too long. Nothing against the woman personally, obviously, but she was just too big of a reminder of a time in wrestling many fans would like to forget. There were fragments of an idea in terms of Eva's booking, but it soon became clear that WWE just did not have a long-term plan in mind. Number 4. Haku in 2001 The 2001 Royal Rumble match featured plenty of surprises. The Honky Tonk Man made a fun cameo, Big Show returned, and who could forget when WWE Hall of Famer Drew Carey won the whole thing with a double Canadian destroyer to Stone Cold Steve Austin. Also, Haku was there. Wait, what? The scariest man to ever live made his first WWE appearance in nine years when he came out at number 29. For the better part of the last decade, he had been wrestling in WCW as Meng. In fact, he was there just one week earlier. At the Sin pay-per-view, the company's third last ever, Meng wrestled Crowbar and Terry Funk in a WCW hardcore title match. And guess what? He only went and bloody won it. That's right, when Haku appeared in the Royal Rumble, he was technically still the WCW hardcore hardcore champion. However, it looked like WWE may have only rehired him to stick it to their rivals down south as Haku was gone again just over a year later. To be fair, there's also the possibility that he could have just told WCW management he was leaving with the belt and everybody was too afraid to stop him. Can't blame him. Number 3. Eric Bischoff in 2019 Vince McMahon has had plenty of legendary foes over the years. Stone Cold Steve Austin, Hulk Hogan, the American legal system, but few have posed quite the same threat as Eric Bischoff. As executive producer during WCW's golden years, Bischoff came within inches of taking down the sports entertainment patriarch for good. Bischoff's WWE debut came as a shock to everyone as he was announced the new general manager of Raw in 2000. 2002. He's appeared numerous times for the promotion since then, but his strangest comeback was one that fans barely got to see at all. In June 2019, it was announced that Raw and SmackDown were getting some new executive directors. Heading up the red brand was Paul Heyman, which made sense as he already worked for WWE at the time. But on the blue side was a returning Eric Bischoff. Bischoff being brought back to a position of power was something nobody saw coming. The whole move 
turned out to be a disaster as Bischoff was sacked in October, but for one brief moment, the former heads of WCW and ECW were both helping Vince McMahon run the company. Wrestling's so weird. Number 2. Tatonka in 2005 Remember when Tatonka randomly turned up in the 2016 Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal? No announcement, no entrance music, no nothing. He was just there. Well, it turns out that the Native American superstar had prior when it came to showing up on WWE programming for no reason. In August 2005, Tatonka answered the Eugene Open Challenge to compete against Nick Dinsmore for Kurt Angle's stolen gold medal. That is a crazy sentence. What was meant to be a one-off turned into a full-on return, and the former War Eagle was back, baby. He was in the 2006 Royal Rumble for 15 minutes. He was The Miz's first ever opponent. He teamed with Matt Hardy to take on Eminem for the tag team titles on pay-per-view. All this from a guy who debuted back in 1992. In terms of weird returns, they do not come much weirder than this. Not only was Tatonka back, but he was involved. He was getting better storylines than performers 10 years younger than him, and sadly, we have absolutely no idea why. Number 1. D'Lo Brown in 2008 D'Lo Brown is surely one of the most underrated wrestlers WWE has ever had on their books. Cool, charismatic, and with a moveset that wouldn't look out of place today, D'Lo was a captivating presence whenever he was on screen. A staple of the Attitude Era undercard, Brown hung about until 2003. He then wrestled for the newly formed TNA, spent a lot of time in Japan, and even fought for the Ring of Honor world title at one point. But hang on, he also came back to WWE in 2008? Pulling my leg, aren't you? No leg pulling here, Brown really did re-sign for WWE in June 2008. In his redo with the company, D'Lo wrestled a whopping five televised matches, and almost all of them were against Santino Morella. Bit of trivia, he also wrestled Dolph Ziggler under his Nick Nemeth ring name, in case you were curious. D'Lo actually beat Santino in an IC title bout, but it was by disqualification. Should have just given him the belt, come on. D'Lo was dropped in 2009 due to cost-cutting measures, which begs the question, why did they even rehire him in the first place? Still, for my money, the greatest European champion of the world. Big up D'Lo Brown. WWE is the be-all and end-all when it comes to professional wrestling. Well, that's what the company would like you to think anyway. As anyone not drinking the Kool-Aid will know, there is a world of grappling away from the big dub. When wrestlers move from WWE to the land outside, it can be a good excuse for them to completely alter their image. Be it physically or a total gimmick overhaul, these performers all underwent massive changes after departing the biggest sports entertainment company in the world. I'm Adam Pachiti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 biggest transformations wrestlers made after leaving WWE. Join us! Number 10. John Moxley in May 2019, All Elite Wrestling burst onto the wrestling scene with its first official pay-per-view, Double or Nothing. All the big stars were there, Kenny Omega, The Young Bucks, Glacier! However, the talk of the town after the event was the man who strolled in through the crowd following the show's main event. Just a month earlier, former WWE Champion Dean Ambrose's contract with the company expired. He chose not to renew his deal, paving the way for the shock AEW debut of John Moxley. In the years since Mox's arrival, we have seen a very different side to the former Shield member. In WWE, he was often on the sillier side of things, spraying his opponents with condiments and green gunge and the like. In AEW, the only thing anyone has been getting sprayed with is Moxley's own blood. Drawing inspiration from his days in CZW, Mox reinvented himself as a deathmatch specialist, a man who could seemingly feel no pain and had a worrying attraction to all things barbed wire. From a forgotten hound of justice to AEW world champion, John Moxley is an inspiration to us all. Well, unless you have haemophilia. Number 9. Luke Gallows if you are old and sad like me, then you will remember late 2000s WWE tag team Jesse and Festus. Jesse was the talkative one in this pair of hillbillies, whilst Festus was mostly silent. We would find out later this was because he drank too much and was in a permanent alcohol-induced state of mental paralysis. Thanks, CM Punk. Festus became Luke Gallows under the Straight Edge Superstar's control before getting released in 2010. 
As it turns out, this would be one of the best things that ever happened to him. After a stint in TNA with the Aces and Apes group, don't ask, Gallows eventually found his way to Japan and formed a very fruitful partnership with Carl Anderson. He transformed into a heavy-hitting bruiser and helped guide his team to three IWGP tag team titles. Oh, and he also joined something called the Bullet Club, whatever that is. By the time Gallows rejoined WWE in 2016, he was pretty much unrecognizable from the man who had been in the Straight Edge Society six years earlier. He was also totally, totally different from Festus, but you didn't need us to tell you that. Number 8. Juice Robinson When you think of NXT, you think of the developmental system that gave us so many of WWE's current roster. Not everyone in NXT went on to the main roster though, and some people became stars outside of the WWE system. CJ Parker had been part of WWE's old farm system, Florida Championship Wrestling, until NXT came about. He had done quite well in FCW, winning their tag titles on two occasions. Would this success carry over to his new home? Well, Parker was essentially used as a jobber to the stars, serving as Kevin Owens' debut opponent to take over our evolution. He would depart the company in 2015, and like Gallows, he too headed to the Far East. Just three years after being cut from NXT, Parker, who was now going by the name Juice Robinson, was the IWGP United States Champion after winning the belt from Jay White. He had gone from a smelly-looking hippie type to a legitimately loved babyface who was mixing up with a very best that the world had to offer. He also wasn't named after a Baywatch character anymore, which probably helped. Number 7. EC3 Alright, I'm going to give you all 5 seconds to get all the control your narrative jokes out of your system. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Finished? Good. Prior to his second disappointing run in WWE, EC3 had an even more disappointing run in WWE under the name Derek Bateman. Straight away, there's your problem. Who on earth's gonna get behind a wrestler called Derek Bateman? Sounds like a used car salesman, and a bad one at that. To the surprise of no one, DB got over like a lead balloon and was released from his WWE contract in 2013. Then he suddenly remembered that he was related to Dixie Carter and went to TNA. As Ethan Carter III, or EC3, because who has time to say all of that, the former Mr. Bateman became a huge star in his new home. Not only did he become a two-time world champion, but he also stopped looking like the geeky best friend in a high school comedy. EC3 actually got so good that WWE were practically forced to rehire him in 2018. Number 6. Sammy Callahan. Despite the fact that they've run several different hacker gimmicks over the years, it's clear as crystal that WWE has absolutely no idea what a hacker actually is. Case in point, Solomon Crow. Debuting for NXT in 2013, Crow was the brand's resident computer whiz, using his trusty tablet computer to seize control of the arena's lights and dim them slightly. Too edgy for you. Crow was kept off WWE TV for over a year, presumably because they realized his character was utter balls. He finally turned up in front of the camera in 2014, did nothing of note, and then got cut the following year. As soon as he was gone from the big dub, his hacker persona fell by the wayside in favor of a much darker, more violent side of himself. Sammy Callahan quickly gained a reputation for being one of the most brutal performers in North American wrestling. Don't believe us? Just ask Eddie Edwards. The story of Solomon Crow is just a footnote in the career of a bona fide indie legend. Good thing he did ditch the tablet, actually. Most of those small venues probably don't even have Wi-Fi. Number 5. Tangaloa Tangaloa, son of the world's scariest man Haku, doesn't get a lot of recognition when you consider all the things that he's done in his career. He's a seven-time IWGP heavyweight tag team champion alongside Tama Tonga, he's a three-time never openweight six-man tag team champion, and he won TNA's Gut Check competition in 2015. Anyone remember Gut Check? Anyone? Nope. You'll also probably struggle to remember Loa's days in WWE, mainly because he went under a different name, a different gimmick, and an image completely different to how he looks now. Despite his very strong Pacific Island heritage, WWE thought it would be a good idea to package Loa as a Latino and call him Camacho. Hey, at least that's better than the first name they gave him, Donnie Marlowe. <laughs> Camacho was the running buddy of Hunico, aka the fake scene Cara. They would occasionally come down to the ring riding a bike, but that's about the only thing worth mentioning from their WWE run. After 
After getting his WWE pink slip in 2014, Camacho wound up in New Japan, formed a tag team with his brother, changed his name, and has never looked back. Number 4. Drew McIntyre you can say a lot of things about Vince McMahon, a lot of things, but you cannot deny that he was spot on when he called Drew McIntyre a future world champion back in 2009. The young Scotsman received a considerable push, scooping up the Intercontinental and Tag Team Championships during his initial run. Progress then stalled and McIntyre found himself in Heath Slater's fake rock band, 3MB. Unfortunately for their millions of fans the world over, 3MB's setlist was cut short when Drew was released in 2014. It looked like the dream was over, but in fact, it was just beginning. McIntyre worked his backside off over the next few years, honing his craft in various independent promotions as well as Impact until he became one of the biggest names on the circuit. Oh, and he also got jacked? Like, seriously jacked? It looked like he'd eaten the old Drew McIntyre. In 2017, McIntyre made his grand return to WWE in the front row of NXT TakeOver Orlando. Three years later, he would pin Brock Lesnar in the main event of WrestleMania to become WWE Champion and fulfill his destiny. Just a shame no one was around to see it. Number 3. Zack Ryder Woo, woo, would you believe it? That goofy guy with the stupid hair in WWE went on to become a legitimate badass hardcore wrestler and one of the most in-demand performers on the indie scene. Zack Ryder was always the almost man in WWE. He almost broke out after getting himself over online in 2011 before the company ruthlessly cut his legs out from under him. He almost had a nice moment at WrestleMania 32 before his interview Intercontinental Championship reign was ended the very next night by The Miz. He almost made those half trunk, half pants things work. No, he didn't. Anyway, Ryder just never quite made it to that next level, and when his release came in 2020, some fans saw it as the end of 15 years of wasted potential and missed opportunities. And then, Zack went mental. Under his real name of Matt Cardona, the former broski completely overhauled his persona. Playing off the fact that people would see him as an ex-WWE guy, Cardona got under the skin of indie marks around the country when he targeted guys like John Moxley and Nick Gage. Now, Cardona is considered to be the king of the indies, often putting on violent bloody affairs for promotions like GCW. Things didn't turn out too bad for the Long Island IC, who also realized my dream by marrying a WWE diva. Number 2. Cody Rhodes when the phrase betting on yourself comes up in wrestling, it's hard to think of anyone except the son of a son of a plumber. Cody Rhodes was essentially fresh out of the womb when he debuted for WWE and fans assumed he would be with the company for life. He became tag team and intercontinental champion a handful of times, but it was clear that there was a glass ceiling above Cody that he just wasn't going to break. Certainly not while he was dressed as Stardust anyway. Rhodes asked for and was granted his release in 2016, and then set about drawing up the blueprint for how ex-WWE stars can succeed on the indies. He travelled everywhere, winning titles and putting on great matches in promotions around the globe. He joined the Bullet Club, put on All In, and helped usher in a little-known promotion called All Elite Wrestling. By the time Cody returned to WWE in 2022, he was a different man. He had an undeniable star power to him, the aura of someone who had pushed himself to the very limits and come out on top, giant neck tattoo and all. Number 1. Raven Remember the tag team The Quebecers from the early 90s? Remember their posh, snooty manager with a polo mallet? That is Raven. Johnny Polo served as the French Canadian's manager for about a year, guiding them to three tag team championship reigns. Hey, speaking of the Quebecers, how about that PCO transformation, eh? Sorry, anyway, he also served as an associate producer and presenter for Radio WWF before departing the company in late 1994. By early 1995, Polo was no more, and the iconic character of Raven had taken his place. Scott Levy, the man behind the gimmick, underwent an insane transformation to get into character. He bulked up significantly and abandoned his preppy dress sense for a grungier, more modern look. Raven was instantly over thanks to that look, a subtly terrifying promo style, and a legendary rivalry with Tommy Dreamer in ECW. To go from an annoying rich kid manager to a dark, demented, hardcore wrestler in just a few months shows how creative our man Scott was. 
Johnny Polo and Raven are completely unrecognizable from each other, with one going down as one of the best gimmicks of all time, and the other being thought about nevermore. Caw, caw. Whilst praise in WWE often goes to the performers and bookers, and quite rightly so, let's take a moment to thank the humble, sometimes forgotten, production crew. Great camera work, pyro, lighting, and so on are key components to the show and are invaluable tools when it comes to presenting a wrestler as a superstar. On the flip side, though, bad production can completely ruin some of WWE's best moments. Just imagine how good these ones could have been had some Someone in the production truck not completely fudged it. Bad special effects, dodgy filming, cringy scripting, it's all here, folks, and it's about to make you very sad. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 times bad production ruined great WWE moments. Join us. Number 10. Rooftop Crash Pads When discussing unique shows in wrestling history, you simply must include Money in the Bank 2020. Taking place during the pandemic, the show's titular contest saw its participants scaling WWE headquarters instead of a traditional ladder. The concept wasn't executed perfectly and had one too many doink in a dress shirt cameos for my liking, but it was a pretty neat idea on the whole. During the closing stages of the match, which took place on the roof of the building, two of the male participants supposedly fell to their deaths. Well, they were actually pushed, but that sounded far too incriminating. Baron Corbin lobbed both Rey Mysterio and Aleister Black off the building to the ground below. Except we know that he didn't, because aerial shots of the roof from earlier in the night showed a nice comfy crash pad just underneath where the two men would be flung. It's not something you would necessarily notice if you weren't looking for it, but for eagle-eyed viewers, this dramatic moment was a little bit spoiled. I mean, at least we now know how the giant survived when Hulk Hogan pushed him off the roof of Kobo Hall. Number 9. Drew's Sing-Along Held in Cardiff, Wales, 2022's Clash at the Castle was propped up by two big matches involving hometown stars. You had Sheamus vs. Gunter and Drew McIntyre vs. Roman Reigns. Okay, so neither Drew nor Sheamus are from Wales, and Sheamus isn't even from the United Kingdom, but the point is they tried, and that's all we ask for these days. After McIntyre failed to defeat Reigns for the undisputed Universal Championship, he was joined in the ring by boxer Tyson Fury. Fury. McIntyre and Fury had been building a feud for months using social media, so perhaps this would be the moment where WWE kickstarted the rivalry on TV. Well, nope, they did a bit of karaoke instead. Fury serenaded the crowd with Don McLean's American Pie before Drew finished the night off with a spectacular version of the Oasis classic, Don't Look Back in Anger. The whole spectacle was utterly bizarre, especially coming off the back of such an emotionally exhausting match. McIntyre himself confirmed that not all of the singing was supposed to have aired on the network. Whilst even a tiny bit of crooning would have been enough to bewilder fans watching at home, the the fact that we got several minutes of it really diminished the show's ending. Number 8. The Undertaker's Lightning In one of the strangest scheduling decisions they've ever made, WWE decided to put on Rey Mysterio winning the 2006 Royal Rumble before Kurt Angle defended the World Heavyweight Championship against Mark Henry. Thankfully, they weren't mad enough to actually give Henry the belt at this point as Angle beat him in under 10 minutes. And then came the moment that everyone remembers about this match, the return of The Undertaker. The dead man, who hadn't been seen in over a whole month, rode into the arena on a frickin' horse-drawn chariot. That's so cool. He then shot fake lightning out of his hands and collapsed the ring. That's not so cool. Honestly, the CGI bolts look cheesy as anything. Whilst The Undertaker has used spooky superpowers before, and to great effect, this tipped over into the realm of silly. Also, surely the fans in the arena couldn't actually see the lightning, so what the hell did they think was going on? I mean, unless Mark Calloway really can shoot electricity from his fingers. If that's the case, I take back everything bad I've ever said about him. Great job in that Goldberg match, Mr. Calloway. Please don't electrocute me. Number 7. The Rock's Promo Notes 
few things are quite as captivating in wrestling as when Dwayne The Rock Johnson gets his teeth stuck into a promo. The Rock is the master of the microphone, one of, if not the best talkers the business has ever known. His monologues are as iconic and entertaining as any of his matches, elevating and ruining careers in equal measure. Yeah, we're talking about you, Billy Gunn. How disappointing, then, to find out Rocky sometimes writes notes on his wrist to help him along. I'm holding back the tears here. WWE cameras most notably caught a glimpse of DJ's cues during his feud with John Cena in the run-up to WrestleMania 28. This even led to Cena calling out the Great One for said infraction on the February 27th, 2012 edition of Monday Night Raw. He's still an absolute demon on the mic, but knowing that Rock's quick-witted tirades are plotted out in advance did ruin the magic for some fans. Yes, the Brahma Bull could have done more to cover up his bullet points or memorized his notes instead, but but maybe WWE should have realized that they were there and, I don't know, not filmed them? If you smell what the... What's the line again? Number 6. Triple H's Mania Entrance Whether it's a gold throne, an army of faceless minions, or a giant tricycle, Triple H sure knows how to put together a memorable WrestleMania entrance, albeit sometimes for all the wrong reasons. Case in point, his walkout to face Brock Lesnar at WrestleMania 29. The King of Kings' big entrance that year involved him strutting out of a huge skull-shaped archway through a cloud of smoke. The smoke effect was created using dry ice some of which accidentally got fired directly onto Hunter's tummy. On the surface, this ruins the cool entrance because it looked like Triple H had been playing in the snow before making his way to the ring. However, upon closer reading, this malfunction had far more serious ramifications. The dry ice actually gave the cerebral assassin second-degree burns on his torso, which is not something that sounds particularly fun. I mean, especially considering that he went on to wrestle Brock goddamn Lesnar for nearly 25 minutes. Watching the moment back knowing this makes for quite the uncomfortable viewing experience. I know I probably shouldn't complain about feeling uncomfortable when a man had his skin frozen off, but you get the picture. Should have got Undertaker's Pyro Man to warm him up again. Number 5. For the Love of Mankind The Undertaker and Shane McMahon's WrestleMania 32 match is largely bad. An old man and a middle-aged man stomp about inside a big metal box for about half an hour. I mean, it certainly doesn't sound great on paper, does it? The match is mostly remembered for the utterly insane bump Shane O'Mac took off the top of the cell, trying and failing failing to hit the dead man with his trademark elbow drop. Well, actually, that's not what most fans remember. Michael Cole's cringe-inducing line immediately afterwards is what fans remember. Almost as soon as young Simba hit the floor with the force of a neutron bomb, Cole yells out, FOR THE LOVE OF MANKIND, with all the sincerity of a used car salesman. An obvious nod to Mick Foley's similarly spectacular fall, the line was so blatantly manufactured that it took everyone watching out of the moment. To make matters worse, the camera clearly caught Cole reading the line off a clipboard as he was saying it. The irony of the whole situation is that Cole's reference to Foley only served to remind viewers of JR's legendary call at King of the Ring 98. A much better moment, honestly, and no clipboard required. Number 4. Sin Cara's Trampoline One of the few things the original Sin Cara ever had going for him was his first entrance. The Mexican star, formerly known as Mystico, would run down to the ring and appear to leap several feet into the air before flipping over the top rope in one fluid motion. Well, except for all the times he clipped his feet on the rope and landed with all the grace of a one-legged turkey, that is. But even this eventually fizzled out for the luchador as WWE cameras accidentally pulled back the curtain on this amazing stunt. During his early entrances, a trampoline was clearly visible right where Sin Cara would take flight. To all the younger fans watching, this completely killed the myth that he was some incredibly gifted high flyer and made him look more like a budget circus performer. WWE knew the jig was up and quickly changed the Faceless One's routine. The trampoline was removed and Sin Cara would just slide under the bottom rope instead before doing a much less impressive role off the middle rope. What a letdown. It's like your mum promising you chicken dippers for tea and then swapping them out for Brussels sprouts at the last minute. I'll never forgive you, Linda. Number 3. Edge's Rumble Return During the 2020 Men's Royal Rumble match, the unmistakable sound of Alter Bridge's Metalingus filled Houston's Minute Maid Park as the rated R superstar Edge made his long-awaited return. The Hall of Famer had been on the shelf since a 2011 neck injury forced him to retire, and now he 
was back and he was ready to kick some bums. At least we think that's what he wanted. We didn't actually see it. As soon as Edge got into the ring, he hit a spear on Dolph Ziggler, right as Kevin Dunn decided that it would be a great idea to cut away to the crowd. Edge's first spear in a match in almost a decade and he missed it. Come on, Kevin, mate. How long you been doing this now? WWE have shamelessly tried to cover this botch up. In a clip posted to YouTube, the footage skips ahead, implying that Edge's first spear back was to Carl Anderson instead of the show-off. And then, when they uploaded the rumble in full to YouTube, they used an alternate angle and pasted the commentary of the Anderson spear over the Dolph one. Nice try, WWE, but we remember. We will always remember what you did on this day. Number two, AJ's rumble debut. AJ Styles was easily one of the biggest names in wrestling never to work for WWE. And before you say anything, those matches on Jacked and Metal don't count. Shut up. That all changed when Styles appeared at number Number three in the 2016 Royal Rumble match to a huge ovation. It would have been nice to see said ovation or to see AJ actually walk out on stage or at the very least his Titan Tron, but instead all fans got to see was Roman Reigns pulling his best whoa face. Once the buzzer sounded and this strange new music started to play, the camera hung on the big dog's big dog face for about 10 seconds before cutting back to Styles already halfway out onto the stage. This was AJ's big moments, his arrival in WWE after so many years of fans hoping and dreaming that he would show up. And WWE decided that the focus should probably be on Roman Reigns. Typical. What's even more annoying is that they released an alternative cut on the debut, which is way better. You actually see the Titan Tron flash up the word phenomenal right before the crowd goes wild. I mean, it just makes so much more sense than what we actually got. Again, typical. Number one, Jag Thinned. In one of the best feel-good moments in wrestling history, Daniel Bryan overcame all three members of Evolution in one night to become WWE Champion and secure his place at the top of the sports entertainment mountain. It was a moment for the ages and one that will forever be associated with the words... Uh, jag thinned. Hang on a second. As Bryan got down on his knees to throw the belts up in the air with his trademark yes taunt, someone in the crowd held up a sign with jag thinned written on it it completely obscuring what would have been a perfect shot. As it turns out, the sign could be spotted at several other WWE events before this one, but this is where it gained infamy. Whilst the fault for this hilarious moment mostly lies with whoever held up the sign, the WWE camera crew shouldn't have been in a position to be blocked by a lone placard. As it turns out, none of this really mattered as wrestling fans continue to celebrate both the title win and the ridiculous sign in equal measure. Still, bloody funny stuff. A jag thin to all and to all a good night. In the grand scheme of things, Extreme Championship Wrestling burned very brightly for a relatively short period of time. In that time, however, the promotion managed to make many memorable moments that have stood the test of time, thanks in large part to the aura of the stars it helped create. The Sabus, Rob Van Dams, Ravens, Tazes, and the like were bona fide stars in ECW and beyond, but there were plenty of wrestlers who bled and sweat in that sweat box of an arena in Philadelphia that didn't quite leave the same legacy and may have been lost to time despite their best efforts. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling and these are 10 ECW stars you don't remember. Join us. Number 10, Uganda. A spin-off of Kamala, what gave it away, Uganda was brought into ECW for 21 matches during the second half of 1999. A mainstay of All Japan Wrestling, where he wrestled as giant Kamala with an eye, Uganda hadn't had a great deal of exposure to the US audience outside of the occasional match here or there, including a loss to Eric Watts on an episode of WCW Worldwide in 1992. ECW fans were first introduced to Uganda on the August 20th, 21st, 1999 edition of Hardcore TV, which opened with highlights of him beating Spanish Angel and Kid Cash in separate matches. A week later, he was seen squashing Tom Marquez. Evidently being pushed as a monster heel, Uganda was built up so that he could be knocked down by two of ECW's top stars. First, he unsuccessfully challenged Rob Van Dam for the world TV title in a competitive match. Then, the barefoot brawler did a 23-second job for giant killer Spike Dudley. 
Dudley, which was his cue to return to the land of the rising sun. Real name Ben Peacock, he would continue to wrestle in Japan before retiring from the business in 2005. Number 9. Ikuto Hidaka ECW always seemed to have close ties with Japanese organizations and were able to bring in stars like Atsushi Onita, Masato Tanaka, Hayabusa, The Great Sasuke, and others at their peak. In the winter of 1999, the small battle arts promotion sent a promising rookie on a learning excursion to the land of the extreme, presumably in the hope it would give him the sort of seasoning and exposure it had provided fellow Japanese export Yoshihiro Tajiri. Ikuto Hidaka wrestled 11 matches in total between November 26th and December 18th, three of which were televised. Two of those were against the dependable Super Crazy, a complimentary opponent for the high-flying Hidaka. Bursting onto the scene and dropping jaws like Rey Mysterio Jr. had four years earlier, the ECW fans immediately embraced him. It was hard not to marvel at the speed and crispness of Hidaka, who was just a couple of years into his professional career at that point. He only got a few opportunities to show the American audience what what he was all about, but he made the most of it and left the Philadelphia faithful wanting more. Number 8. Ulf Herman Ah, Ulf Herman. How difficult it is to say your name and not immediately follow it up with the German. Herman worked in his home country and around Europe during the 90s, gaining experience in different territories and even earning a WWE tryout match as Herman the German, naturally, in 1992. WWE passed on him, but Ulf made his way to ECW in 1998 and aligned himself with Lance Wright and his short-lived The Wright Connection stable of unofficial WWE stars like Too Cold Scorpio and, um, Bracus. On television, Herman was primarily used to put over other bigger stars, such as Sabu, and he did a couple of very quick jobs to Spike Dudley, which was basically a rite of passage for anyone over 6 foot 4 and 250 pounds who found themselves in ECW at that time. Herman's one other highlight was a short TV title match loss to Rob Van Dam on an episode of Hardcore TV. All told, the one-time member of the full-blooded Italians wrestled 31 ECW matches, only a few of which were televised, before his jaunt to the USA ended and he returned to the Europe scene. Number 7. Prodigy and the Prodigy well, if you don't remember Prodigy, the odds of you remembering Prodigy are pretty slim, aren't they? Right, so Prodigy was a repackaged Tom Marquez, and you don't know who Tom Marquez is, do you? Tom Marquez was an indie guy from Puerto Rico who worked a handful of matches for ECW over the course of a few years before securing a regular gig in 1999. He was essentially a solid hand used to put others over before being given a bit more to do as a member of the stable The Sideshow Freaks. That group was managed by the Prodigette, aka Angel Orsini, a female performer who had been active on the worldwide indie scene. The Prodigette only worked a handful of matches, including a victory over Jazz and a mixed tag loss to Simon Diamond and Johnny Swinger, but stuck around until the bitter end. Unfortunately, she missed the very, very last ECW house show after being injured in a car accident. Post-ECW, Orsini, using her real name, had a decent career on the indies, while Marquez worked here and there before sacking her off in 2005. Number 6. Antifaz Del Norte Though former WCW Vice President Eric Bischoff will no doubt happily tell you that he introduced Lucha Libre to the American mainstream, it was actually Paul Heyman who gave the likes of Rey Mysterio, Juventud Guerrera, Psychosis and Conan their first real shot in the US. ECW would continue to draft in the occasional masked Mexican talent afterwards, though that was easier said than done with WCW and WWE having first dibs on the best ones. One high flyer who got a look in was Antifaz del Norte, aka the Mask of the North. Of note, he had televised matches against Tajiri and a debuting Super Crazy, as well as a couple of outings against Little Guido, one of which took place at the 1999 Guilty as Charged pay-per-view. Most of the matches he had were decent enough and he clearly had talent, but perhaps there wasn't enough to distinguish him, even if he was more than happy to throw caution to the wind with some truly reckless dives. Curiously, his his ECW swan song was a non-televised ECW world title match loss to Taz, following which he went back to working south of the border. Number 5. Tommy Cairo Because ECW became so popular as the ultra-violent anti-establishment cult promotion of the mid to late 90s, people tend to forget its pre-extreme life as the NWA affiliate Eastern Championship Wrestling. Eastern Championship Wrestling had a whole other roster and a bunch of stars that fans of the table-breaking revamp 
may not have heard of. For example, Tommy Cairo, a former professional bodybuilder who became one of only two men along with Tony Stetson to hold the ECW Pennsylvania Championship during its fleeting five-month lifespan in 1993. The most memorable thing Cairo did during his ECW tenure was feud with the Sandman. Their personal rivalry saw them start as partners before drawing in woman and Sandman's wife, Lori, aka Peaches, and leading to various matches revolving around the so-called Singapore Canes. Iron Man Tommy Cairo wasn't a dynamic promo and didn't really do anything flashy in the ring, but his contributions to the early days of ECW should not be overlooked, and he was one of the hottest wrestlers in the Northeast independent scene of the day. Number 4. Skull Von Crush Skull Von Crush. Seriously, why didn't he just name himself I'm a Scary Tough Guy? Grrr. The owner of this menacing moniker was none other than a pre-dress wearing Vito. A student of Johnny Rods, Vito had wrestled in Memphis, Puerto Rico, Japan, and done some jobs for WWE before getting his shot in ECW toward the tail end of 98. Used primarily on live events, Skull Von Crush had a couple of decent matches with world television champion Rob Van Dam on Hardcore TV, but he failed to really stand out from the rest of the pack. He was a solid enough hand and worked hard, but didn't have much of a character, which is presumably why the ECW Brain Trust decided to let him go by his real name and added him to the Baldy stable. The Italian-American slaphead certainly fit the part, you know? After feuding with New Jack, Vito left ECW for WCW after taking the pin in a Loser Leaves ECW tag team match. All in all, he was in the land of extreme for about a year. Forget about it! I already did, mate. Number 3. Sal Bolomo Another cult favorite from the pre-extreme days of Eastern Championship Wrestling, Wildman Sal Bolomo was a longtime journeyman grappler who was probably best known for being a technically sound WWE jobber during the mid-80s. When he rocked up in ECW in the early 90s, he was considerably heavier and sported a massive beard. He also wore new gear that made him look like a homeless Roman centurion and completely changed up his wrestling style, swapping headlocks and hip tosses for frenzied brawling. Before New Jack Balls Mahoney and the like made it their calling card years later, Belomo was the first ECW star to truly take the action into the audience and use everything in his vicinity that wasn't nailed down. He never won a championship in ECW, but he did receive a few cracks at them, including in a tournament final for the vacant ECW heavyweight title, which was won by Jimmy Snooker. Sal wrestled for ECW between 1992 and 1994, left, and then came back for a couple of matches as a member of the FBI in 96. What he lacked in finesse, he made up for by being entertaining and unpredictable. Number 2. Rod Price The Price is Right, more like The Price is Rod, am I right? Rod Price, that is. Alright, so we may be stretching the definition of the term star here a little bit, but Texas mainstay Rugged Rod Price did wrestle over 50 matches for ECW in 1998 and 1999. Price was mainly used as an enhancement talent to put other bigger stars over and only appeared a few times on TV. Like many a follically challenged member of the hardcore crew, Price was, inevitably, made a member of the Baldies. Not for long, mind, because a month after his last tag match with PN News, Rod Price said goodbye to Extreme Championship Wrestling. We probably didn't get to see the best of Rod Price in ECW, as injuries, in particular a serious one to his neck, had taken their toll and would soon take him out of the ring for good. In his prime, he was actually pretty damn good, and a lot of people say that he could have been a bigger deal with better timing and the push. Unfortunately, when it came time to round out his career in Paul Heyman's promotion, he was more or less filling up a place on the card. Number 1. Mac Daddy Kane No, this isn't an alter ego of Glenn Jacobs where he became a pimp, although that is definitely something I would have watched and I'm now sad never happened. No, no, no. Mac Daddy Kane was another WWE star who briefly cut his teeth in Paul Heyman's promotion. A solid six years before showing up on Raw as three-minute warning member Rosie, Matthew Anawa he was working in the small halls of the northeastern United States alongside his uncle Samu, aka Sammy Silk. Together, they were the Samoan Gangster Party, arriving in ECW in the summer of 1996 to challenge for the ECW World Tag Team titles. Sammy was clearly the captain of the ship, having already been in the business for 14 years working for major organizations like WWE, WCW, and New Japan, while Mac Daddy Kane, also known as Big Matty Smalls, was looking to make a name for himself. 
herself. It didn't quite happen in ECW, as the duo stay lasted just four months and ten matches, though one of them against the non-Samoan gangsters at Heatwave gained a measure of infamy after the Island Boys were bludgeoned with weapons in a brutally one-sided short squash match that ended via referee's decision. A great WWE feud should, in theory, culminate with a major blow-off match. Ideally, said match will take place on a pay-per-view, or premium live event if you prefer. You know, in the interest of making money and memories and all that good stuff. That is usually how things go, but there have been some instances where a red-hot feud, or feud that had the potential to be red-hot, was either ended on regular television or, in a few cases, never even made it that far, despite deserving a bigger stage. I'm Adam Pachisi from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 great WWE feuds that never had a pay-per-view blow-off. Join us! Number 10. Booker T vs. Steve Austin Booker T made an immediate impact in his WWE debut. The former WCW heavyweight champion interfered in the main event of the 2001 King of the Ring pay-per-view, blasting WWE champion Steve Austin through the announce table. You would reckon that the notoriously tetchy Stone Cold would want revenge after such a sneak attack, but Austin had unfortunately gotten injured on the bump and would be out of action for the best part of a month. His return came in a tag match on SmackDown, with Booker on the opposite side of the ring. Austin managed to hit a stunner on his nemesis before abandoning the bout in order to save his wife Deborah from being abducted by that rapscallion Diamond Dallas Page. Days later, the two Texans fought in the 10-man tag at Invasion, with Austin shockingly betraying Team WWE and joining the Alliance in its conclusion. His feud with Booker was then put on ice until the Invasion angle had run its course, after which they had several matches on television, as well as the fantastic brawl in a supermarket. Never did make it to pay-per-view, though, because bottom line, Vince McMahon evidently didn't see it as marketable enough. Sucker! Number 9. Bray Wyatt vs. Brock Lesnar Bray Wyatt and his lovely family targeted Brock Lesnar in early 2016, using their numerical advantage to get the better of the beast on multiple occasions. This included in the Royal Rumble, where a four-on-one attack led to Brock's elimination. Lesnar didn't immediately go after their collective heads, however, as he was too concerned with trying to get a WWE title opportunity at WrestleMania by beating Roman Reigns and Dean Ambrose at Fastlane. When that didn't quite work out, WWE went back to the Wyatt well and booked Brock against Bray for the Roadblock WWE Network Special. However, the Eater of Worlds suffered a back injury in the run-up to the event. Rather than take him out of the equation entirely, WWE rejigged it so Wyatt teamed with Luke Harper in a two-on-one handicap match. Lesnar promptly ate Harper up in about four minutes, with Bray refraining from getting physically involved. So, would the match finally happen when he was suitably recovered? Nope. WWE opted to quietly squash the beef and move both men onto different things, which is a shame because a pay-per-view match between them had real potential. Number 8. Rey Mysterio vs. Andrade it didn't quite work out for Andrade in WWE, but for a while there, it really felt as though the company had their next big Hispanic superstar on their hands. And never more so than when he was in the ring with fellow luchador Rey Mysterio. Against the legendary masked man, El Idolo was able to routinely demonstrate the full range of his abilities. And I do mean routinely, because he and Rey had plenty of opportunities to showcase their chemistry on TV. Between the summer of 2018 and spring of 2020, the two had eight televised singles matches, not to mention plenty of other tag and multi-man matches, including bouts with two out of three falls and ladder stipulations. Often contested with the United States title on the line, the matches always impressed. But despite being a highlight of SmackDown and then Raw, WWE never let them loose on pay-per-view. The only time they clashed on what is now referred to as a premium live event was at Fastlane 2019 in a four-way also featuring Samoa Joe and R-Truth. Even then, they only got on the main show after initially being booked in a singles match on the pre-show. Number 7. The Undertaker vs. The Ultimate Warrior 
Two of the most over-the-top and recognizable characters of their era, The Undertaker and The Ultimate Warrior, were a tremendous contrast to one another. One was a face-painted, neon-soaked, 100 miles per hour jacked-up babyface, while the other was a jet-black heel who moved at a zombie's pace. It was a great attraction on paper, and WWE booked it countlessly throughout the spring and summer of 1991 while the two were at odds on television. This included many body bag and a few casket matches on the road. Sounds like the sort of novel thing that folks would pay to see, but almost all of the Undertaker vs Ultimate Warrior matchups took place on house shows, with a couple of them filmed for broadcast on the MSG network or as Coliseum home video exclusives. WWE only ran five pay-per-views in 1991, and the only one WWE could have realistically booked the match for was SummerSlam. Warrior infamously held up Vince McMahon for cash at the show and was immediately suspended following his performance in Madison and Square Garden that night. When he returned the following year, the dead man was a babyface and they actually teamed up a handful of times rather than square off against one another. Number 6. Jerry Lawler vs King Booker Booker T's King Booker phase was a riot as the hard grafting veteran turned the silliness up to 11 and became the top dog on SmackDown, reigning for six months as the Blue Brand's World Heavyweight Champion. Drafted to Raw in the summer of 2007, King Booker quickly found a natural adversary in the form of Jerry Lawler. Declaring that Lawler could no longer refer to himself as a king, Booker targeted the announcer and sometimes wrestler, leading to a couple of matches between the two. Their bout on the July 30th episode episode of Raw ended with a disqualification victory for Jerry when Booker went ham on him in the corner, resulting in a rematch the following week with the added stipulation that the loser had to crown the winner the week after. Booker won that one thanks to an assist from Queen Charmel, but Lawler refused to crown him when the time came. Not because he wanted to string the program out until SummerSlam and blow it off properly, but because this feud was just a time killer until the King of Kings Triple H returned at the pay-per-view and pedigreed Booker T all the way to TNA. Number 5. Eric Bischoff vs Vince McMahon if one match pretty much sold itself based on real-life history, it was a showdown between Eric Bischoff and Vince McMahon. Bischoff has spent years fighting WWE and trying to put McMahon out of business and even challenged him to a real fight on pay-per-view, only to ultimately fail in his endeavor. So why wouldn't the former SVP of WCW want to go after the genetic jackhammer when he came to WWE in 2002? And vice versa for that matter. Well, WWE threw the easy money straight into the fire by quashing the real-life rivalry on Easy es first night in as a talent when he was introduced by Vince as the Raw general manager with a big old bear hug. The two would nonetheless butt heads during Bischoff's three and a half year stay and did end up on opposite sides of the ring in the main event of the February 23rd, 2004 episode of Raw. The action was rotten, as expected, and the brief match was basically little more than an excuse to have Brock Lesnar interact with special guest referee Steve Austin. Had WWE built it up effectively and added some wacky stipulations, you would think that people would have paid for the privilege. Number 4. The Legion of Doom vs Demolition Ooh, what a crushing missed opportunity this was. Demolition were, in many respects, WWE's answer to the hugely popular Road Warriors, with Axe and Smash sharing many characteristics with Hawk and Animal, and ruling the WWE tag division in a dominant style akin to the way the Warriors had in the NWA. So, when the rechristened Legion of Doom joined WWE in 1990, fans eagerly anticipated a matchup between the two units. And it looked like things would go that way, too, when LOD cost Demolition the tag titles at SummerSlam. But the payoff never really came, at least not on television or pay-per-view. WWE booked the straight tag match on various house shows, but televised meetings usually added Crush and WWE Champion The Ultimate Warrior, turning them into six-mans. Demolition and the Legion of Doom did have the opportunity to throw down on pay-per-view when they were booked on opposite teams at Survivor Series, but they barely interacted before they were all eliminated early on. Had the feud happened a year or two earlier, prior to Axe's health issues, it might have had more intensity and led to a big money match on an order-only event. Number 3. Damien Sandow vs The Miz a happy accident in many ways, the partnership between The Miz and Damian Sandow, aka Mizdow, was a great example of the talent taking something and running with it until it got over big. 
The Miz's stunt double was a riot as he mimicked the supposed A-lister's movements, took bumps from imaginary adversaries, and generally elevated the whole copycat routine to another level. The pair even became tag team champions, but lost them as hints of dissension began to creep in. It was inevitable that The Miz would get fed up with his avatar, especially as Sandow's popularity grew. And so it came to be when he demoted him from stunt double to personal assistant. The big split was brewing and came, fittingly, on the grandest stage of them all. Well, the grandest pre-show of them all, as Miz Dow finally turned on Miz in the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal at WrestleMania 31. The reaction Sandow received from the tens of thousands in attendance really should have convinced WWE that they had a hot match on their hands. Regrettably, Miz and Sandow simply traded lukewarm victories on Raw, with Miz winning the feud for good and relegating the intellectual savior of the masses to the bottom of the card. Number two, Ric Flair versus Hulk Hogan. When Ric Flair jumped from WCW to WWE, carrying the NWA heavyweight title belt with him and proclaiming himself to be the real world's champion, a pay-per-view match with WWE champion Hulk Hogan seemed all but guaranteed. The Nature Boy and the Hulkster began feuding on television and looked set to collide at WrestleMania 8. Like, seriously, they announced the match for Flair's newly won WWE title and everything. But what are you going to do, brother, when the house shows don't draw particularly well and the matches themselves fall flat on you. Yes, whether it was the apparent tepid live reactions or the subpar box office that Hogan and Flair drew on the road, WWE were convinced to change things up at the Showcase of the Immortals. And so Rick defended against Randy Savage while Hulk threw down with Sid Justice. WWE neglected to book the Flair Hogan match on pay-per-view, though WCW did it many times in later years. Vince McMahon had a second opportunity to put it on pay-per-view in 2002, but booked the match as a Raw main event instead. It would have only been a decade too late, to be fair. Number 1. John Cena vs Christian after years of threatening to break out of the mid-card pack, 2005 looked like the year Christian would finally join the main eventers club. His route to that club seemed to be a feud with the ascendant John Cena. It was teased with a confrontation at that year's Royal Rumble, and Captain Charisma continued to taunt the Doctor of Thugonomics in promos ahead of Cena being drafted to Raw in the summer. They had another face-to-face -face as soon as Big Match John made the switch, and all evidence indicated that a WWE title showdown would go down at vengeance. It did, but Christian would have to share the spotlight with Chris Jericho, who was inserted into the mix, making it a triple threat. After eating the pin in the match, Christian was duly shifted over to SmackDown, where he promptly slid down the card. The mishandling of the Cena feud and lack of proper match between the two must have been a factor in his decision to leave WWE and join TNA just months later. A great professional wrestling stable doesn't always need time to establish itself as great, but the benefit of many months, if not years together, certainly doesn't hurt. We've seen many a stable that, while they may have made an impact by bagging gold, creating memorable moments, or having awesome matches, ultimately didn't scratch the surface of what they could have done if allowed to flourish unburdened. Sometimes it was their own undoing, while other times outside forces were very much at play. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 short-lived wrestling stables that could have been much bigger. Join us! Number 10, The Un-Americans. A trio of Canadians rallying against all things USA, the so-called Un-Americans of Lance Storm, Christian, and Test moved from SmackDown to Raw and soon added yank-hating Brit William Regal to their ranks. The quartet pushed the buttons of patriotic fans and wrestlers, not least of which the American badass himself, generating a ton of heat in the process. Regrettably, some of the members' refusal to comply with management's wishes curtailed their advancement. Test and Christian balked at suggestions they get their hair cut in the style of Storm and Regal, even though they both ended up chopping their locks off within a few months anyway. While there have been claims that the group, besides Regal, weren't terribly comfortable with the amount of hate they were on the receipt end of. The upshot was the group was canned after just a few months, with Regal and Storm remaining as a tag team, Christian forming a partnership with Chris Jericho, and Test, well, he became a walking punchline. It's a shame they weren't around for longer, really, because there was some serious talent in the group. 
Number 9. The League of Nations Another supergroup of foreign menaces, the League of Nations was certainly not lacking when it came to in-ring pedigree. Ireland Sheamus, the UK's Wade Barrett, Bulgaria's Rusev, and Mexico's Alberto Del Rio joined forces on November 30th, 2015. It is a damning indictment of WWE creative that they were done as a unit a mere six months later. On paper, the League of Nations looked like a group that could rule the main event roost. And while they did initially hold the US and world titles, it became evident early on what their real purpose was. Get Roman Reigns over. WWE desperately needed the big dog to be firing as the all-conquering babyface in the run-up to WrestleMania 32, so the gang of expats were fed to him. Regrettably, it didn't work as fans still rejected Roman's push. Even more regrettably, every member of the League of Nations was less over than they were before it formed when it was mercifully put out of its misery in April 2016. Sheamus, Rusev, Barrett, and Del Rio have all been outspoken in their disappointment and frustration with how how badly the group was mishandled. Number 8. Team Angle While recovering from injuries towards the very end of 2002, WWE Champion Kurt Angle introduced two hot young prospects who could do his wrestling for him. Charlie Haas and Shelton Benjamin, in a spot originally earmarked for Charlie's brother Russ, who sadly passed away a year prior, joined up with the Olympic gold medalist to form Team Angle. Managed by Paul Heyman, the three amateur standouts sadly only got to wrestle a trio of matches as a threesome. That is, of course, because Kurt got crocked in Team Angle's handicap match loss to Brock Lesnar and Chris Benoit at No Way Out 2003. After Angle dropped the title to the next big thing at WrestleMania 19, Haas and Benjamin continued to do their convalescing leader proud as they defended their tag titles with a portrait of Angle looking on from ringside. When Kurt returned, he did so as a babyface and promptly fired them from his team for going on a losing streak. The WWE Hall of Famer has since bemoaned the stable's hasty breakup, believing that they could have had a run that lasted years rather than months. I'm inclined to agree with him, because if I don't, I'm afraid he'll chin me. Number 7. The Hart Foundation There have been various iterations and takes on the Hart Foundation tag team and stable, but the 1997 version takes some beating. Fondly remembered as one of the greatest stables in wrestling history, people perhaps tend to forget that they could have been that much greater had the five members been together longer than just a few short months. Heels in America and baby faces everywhere else, Bret Hart, Owen Hart, Jim Neidhart, the British Bulldog, and Brian Pillman talk the talk and walk the walk during one of the most intriguing WWE storylines ever. Their time as a troupe peaked at Canadian Stampede, where in front of a feverish crowd in Calgary, the Hart Foundation got the better of Steve Austin's squad in a blistering main event. It was, regrettably, the only time the five men teamed on TV. Pillman would tragically pass away just a few months later before the events of the Montreal Screwjob finished the hit job on the Hitman's clan and sent everyone but Owen out the door. It was a dishonorable ending for such an excellent ensemble. Still, we will always have Canadian Stampede. Number 6. The Latino World Order Tired of being disrespected by WCW management, primarily Eric Bischoff, Eddie Guerrero began to band the rest of the hard-working yet underappreciated luchadors together to rail against the system starting in October of 1998. Eddie dubbed his group the Latino World Order. He soon had the support of just about all the Mexican mob, apart from Rey Mysterio, who refused to don the LWO's colors. Guerrero and the rest of the LWO soon set about doing all they could to get Mysterio to join, and the masked man was eventually forced to get in line after losing a match to Eddie. The storyline didn't get a chance to play out, though, as on New Year's Day 1999, Eddie was involved in a serious car accident that threatened to not only end his career, but his life. Without him around to guide them, the Latino World Order really didn't have a chance and voluntarily agreed to disband and join the rest of WCW in fighting the NWO, ending their union after just four months. WWE have of course since revived the LWO with Mysterio as its leader. Number 5. King Booker's Court 
After an age of contemplating in-ring retirement, Booker T finally received the push his talent deserved when, in the summer of 2006, he defeated Rey Mysterio to win the World Heavyweight title. Ruling over SmackDown as champ, King Booker, who had won the King of the Ring tournament the month prior, was flanked by Queen Charmel. The pair were brilliant at hamming it up and really got the gimmick over, but the former five-time WCW champion needed some outside help to maintain his dominance in the face of threats like Batista, John Cena and Bobby Lashley. Enter William Regal and Finlay, dubbed Sir Regal and Sir Finlay, during a ludicrous knighting ceremony which doubled as the official formation of King Booker's court on the August 25th, 2006 edition of SmackDown. As well as doing some of Booker's dirty work, Regal also added to the act with his incessant cries of All Hail King Booker as the champ made his entrance. Despite their obvious chemistry, King Booker's court would only last until the no Mercy pay-per-view in October, where Finley was one of the challengers for Booker's title and a fed-up Regal punched out the master of the spinner Rooney backstage. Number 4. Cosmic Wasteland As they hopelessly floundered in mid-card purgatory, Stardust and the Ascension came together in a bid to reverse their fortunes in the fall of 2015. Visually striking, if nothing else, the group known as Cosmic Wasteland had the potential to be so much more than fodder if given the chance. Connor and Victor had once been a force to be reckoned with in NXT and served as imposing backup for Cody Rhodes' alter ego. Cody, for his part, was never fully comfortable behind the face paint, but you wouldn't know it by watching the way he threw himself into angles, promos and matches as the psychotic supervillain, silly as they often were. Aside from standing around in dingy smoke filled rooms and scouting people from ringside, what Cosmic Wasteland did more than anything else was lose matches as they were clearly just there to put others over. The idea of the faction was barely developed and neither the fans nor the performers had any reason to care. It was a true disservice to the three of them. Cosmic Wasteland predictably fizzled out and Rhodes, correctly sensing there were more opportunities for him outside WWE, asked for and received his release. Number 3. The Magnificent Seven Look at this for a lineup. Ric Flair, the Steiner Brothers, Lex Luger, Road Warrior Animal, Jeff Jarrett, and Buff Bagwell. More of a sensational six plus Buff Bagwell, maybe, the Magnificent Seven were formed and led by on screen WCW CEO Flair at the company's Sin pay per view in January of 2001. I'm sure you history buffs out there will note the date and immediately understand just why this one wasn't around long term. With their main focus being keeping the WCW title around the shredded waist of Big Popper Pump, the Magnificent Seven was really the company's last big idea before inevitably kicking the bucket. In the weeks leading up to WCW being bought by Vince McMahon, one of their major angles saw the members of the Magnificent Seven being attacked one by one by a mystery assailant. Fans never got the payoff as the storyline was abandoned when the sale went through. Though if I had to guess who the attacker was, I would bet the farm on that sneaky Sean Stasiak. WCW was a hot mess in those final months, but the Magnificent Seven at least brought some intrigue and star power to a rapidly diminishing product. Number 2. Team Lesnar if you look on page 57 of the Big Book of Large Men, and if anyone out there has my copy, please be so kind as to return it, you will find a picture of Brock Lesnar, Big Show, Nathan Jones, Matt Morgan, and A-Train. This five-strong crew of absolute monsters was put together by SmackDown general manager Paul Heyman in the fall of 2003, essentially to help protect the interest of the next big thing who was reigning as world champion at the time. On sheer mass alone, the group, which I will informally name Mr. Heyman's Fabulous Beef Boys were one of the most impressive in wrestling history. Gorgeous muscle monsters, one and all. In the ring, however, they had a couple of glaring weaknesses. Their names were Jones and Morgan. Whereas Lesnar, Show, and A-Train could pull their considerable weight, Morgan and Jones didn't quite cut the mustard. The Colossus of Boggo Road also couldn't hack the demanding WWE schedule and quit the company during a tour stop in his native Australia. Morgan, on the other hand, was given a couple more months to prove his worth before being being shipped back to OVW for further training. Number 1. The Radicals When Eddie Guerrero, Dean Malenko, Chris Benoit and Perry Saturn collectively decided to jump ship in January of 2001, WCW's loss was very much WWE's gain. 
The Radicals instantly made an impact upon their arrival, but truth be told, their run as a group failed to live up to initial expectations. The injury Eddie suffered during his very first WWE match didn't help things, obviously, but it really didn't take WWE too long to splinter them off anyway. Come around May, the rabid Wolverine was establishing himself as a solo star, Guerrero had discovered his Latino heat and had a good thing going with his Mamacita, while Pez and Dean were more often than not teaming together. The Radicals reformed towards the end of the year but really didn't accomplish too much and were pretty much mired in the mid-card before splitting up and fighting amongst themselves once again. Fans will rightly praise the talents of the individuals and how incredible the surprise debut was as a moment. However, as a stable, the Radicals were capable of doing much, much more. WWE botches can be, and often are, very funny indeed. I mean, a grown man sprinting full pelt down a ridiculously long ramp only to trip over a mat and slide under the ring, his body disappearing and only his legs barely sticking out from underneath it. I'm sorry, but all the creative greats in Hollywood couldn't script something as side-splittingly hilarious as that unplanned moment of genius. On occasion, however, the flubs and spills do not result in laughs, but very genuine concern for the performers who were on the receiving end. WWE stars put their well-being on the line every time they step into the ring, a fact that is hammered home when things go badly wrong between the ropes. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 scariest WWE botches ever. Don't try this at home. Number 10. Turning the tables on Spike Dudley Little Spike Dudley was certainly no stranger to taking extreme punishments, having put himself through the ringer during his ECW days. Looking to make a name for himself in Paul Heyman's promotion, Spike took all manner of abuse, whether it was being put through flaming tables or getting launched into the crowd in the hope that the fans would catch him. This penchant for pain followed him to WWE, where he continued to get murked on a regular basis. And that's all well and good when it's someone experienced doing the murking, but the run of the Dudley Litter ran into some issues when he was in the green hands of La Resistance. The villainous Frenchmen were entrusted with giving Spike a flapjack over the top rope, sending him backwards through a ringside table. Unfortunately, the wood was out of position, and René Dupree and Sylvain Grognier didn't get him up high enough, with Spike falling short of the intended target and cracking the back of his head and neck on the edge of the table. Thankfully, he wasn't injured, but this could have been very bad indeed, and it's a minor miracle he didn't walk away with at least a concussion. Number 9. The Pedigree from Hell The Pedigree is one of the most vicious looking finishers in the game, no pun intended, especially when Triple H neglects to release his opponent's hands as he drops to his knees. It's usually safe as houses despite looking like a killer, but it has gone tits up on a number of occasions. For example, in the main event of SummerSlam 2000, when he went to nail it on Kurt Angle through the announce table, only for the desk to crumble under their weight, the landing giving the gold medalist a serious concussion. Poor Marty Garner would have been chuffed with a concussion after he nearly got decapitated with the move at a WWE Superstars taping in May of 1996. The pedigree was not yet fully established, and Garner, who wrestled with the Hardy Boys on the indies as Champagne, assumed that he was either going for a double underhook suplex or powerbomb. The upshot was he jumped high and attempted to flip over, taking a header into the canvas. Mercifully, he wasn't seriously hurt and even returned for more WWE job duty later in the year. Number 8. Here Comes the Pain Hardcore Bob Holly was unafraid to dish out some stiff shots, especially to the rookies, but to be fair to the surly curmudgeon, he also expected it back and endured more injuries than most. Like the time Kurt Angle snapped his arm with an errant moonsault, or the time that Holly's back got sliced up something fierce after he and Rob Van Dam took a tumble through a table. The undoubted worst injury of Bob Corr's career, however, was the broken neck that he suffered at the meaty hands of a young Brock Lesnar. The two were wrestling a singles match on the September 12, 2002 episode of SmackDown when something went awry. While attempting a powerbomb, the freakishly strong next big thing seemed to struggle to hold the Alabama Slammer up and opted to dump him on his head and neck. The good news was that Holly could actually walk afterwards and incredibly even finish the match. The bad news was that his neck was broken, necessitating surgery and a year-long layoff. 
While some people speculated that Brock did the deed on purpose, it was obviously a mistake brought about by Lesnar feeling sick that day and thus more tired and less freakishly strong than usual. Number 7. Candice's KO Candice Michelle deserves a whole lot of credit for working hard to improve her skills as an in-ring performer. The GoDaddy girl had been little more than eye candy before knuckling down and learning how to actually wrestle, which resulted in her becoming women's champion and holding her own in matches with accomplished opponents like Melina, Nikki James, and Beth Phoenix. It was while wrestling Beth in a 2 out of 3 falls women's title match on the October 22, 2007 episode of Raw that Candice's career nearly abruptly ended. While propped up on the top rope, Michelle's balance was disrupted when Beth ran into the ropes. Falling in an uncontrolled manner, Candice's face and head collided with the mat with a sickening thud. It was obvious right away that something was wrong and Phoenix pinned her quickly, with the referee audibly instructing the challenger not to kick out, to win the match 2-0 and retain her title. Post-match, Candice was looked over by WWE's medical staff and taken out on a stretcher. The injury ended up being a broken clavicle and kept her on the shelf for several months. Number 6. Big E's Big Break I love Big E. I love his cheeky little smile, I love his hypnotic gyrating dance moves, and I love his big, shiny, glorious muscles. I'd just like to cuddle up to the bloke and sink my head in those snuggly pecs as he whispers in my ear about the power of positivity while I blissfully fall asleep. Yeah, that's what I'd like. That'd be just fine. Um, anyway, what's not fine is the broken neck Big E suffered while taking an outside the ring belly to belly suplex from Ridge Holland on the March 11th, 2022 episode of SmackDown. Men with that much mass are simply not supposed to land that way, and everyone watching feared the worst as soon as he made contact with the floor. Turns out the former WWE champion was very lucky indeed, because doctors told him after the fact that the fall could have resulted in a stroke, paralysis, or even death. He's still on the mend, but is expected to make a full recovery and harbours no ill will towards Holland. Even after going through what he went through, that lovable chunk of man meat wouldn't dare be sour. Number 5. Almost Killing the Dead Man When WWE announced that The Undertaker vs Goldberg would take place at Super Showdown 2019, the initial feeling was that it would either be a smoke and mirrors filled epic or a disaster of untold proportions. The very early stages of the Attitude Era Dream match were encouraging, but then the man went and clocked that big bald head of his against the ring post, not helped in any way by a subsequent tombstone that planted him right on top of that big bald head of his in an ugly way. With Goldberg concussed, the bout then completely fell apart, leading to one of the scariest moments of the dead man's career when an attempted jackhammer went pear-shaped and turned into a brain buster. Taker had been no stranger to near misses, famously nearly halving himself when Sim Snooker, posing as a cameraman, failed to catch his big dive at WrestleMania 25, and then getting set on fire while making his entrance at the Elimination Chamber pay-per-view almost a year later, but this was different and altogether a lot scarier. Notorious for gutting through the pain, even Mark Calloway had to admit how banged up he was after the botch, which was centimetres away from being catastrophic. Number 4. Madcap Mishap Back to Saudi Arabia again for another neck-snapping botch that almost ended the promising young career of Madcap Moss. The man in the suspenders was facing off with Drew McIntyre in his biggest singles match to date, a false count anywhere no DQ affair that was going swimmingly before Moss decided to take a simple enough move in a strange way. Drew hoisted him over for a sort of reverse Alabama slam with the intention of dropping Moss flat on his face and stomach. However, Moss, in McIntyre's own words, zigged when he should have zagged and over-rotated, landing right on the top of his head. There was an instant panic from Happy Corbin at ringside, who believed that his fellow superstar must have surely sustained a broken neck or, best case scenario, a bad concussion. Corbin was making contingency plans to somehow get the match ended, but amazingly, Madcap Moss, or should we call him Mad Bastard Moss after this, was fine if not a little shaken up. Nothing broken, no concussion. Scientists need to figure out what this man's neck is made of 
of so that we can make battering rams and stuff out of it in the future. Number three, Joey Mercury's Armageddon. Any professional wrestling match presents an inherent element of danger and risk, but the levels are turned up considerably when things veer into gimmick territory. The ladder match, ubiquitous as it has now become, is still one of the most dangerous of the lot. Performing moves from and onto the steel rungs requires great skill, timing, and good fortune to come out of the other side unscathed. Unpredictable and hard to control, many WWE stars have taken nasty unplanned spills and come close to serious injury in ladder matches, though the majority of the time they don't require a trip to hospital, sorry, local medical facility afterwards. Joey Mercury was not so fortunate at Armageddon 2006, when Jeff Hardy's seesaw spot exploded in his face. The Eminem member failed to get his hands up in time, and the very sharp corner of the ladder caught him flush and at high speed. Leaking blood, Mercury left the match and went backstage, where he was promptly whisked away in an ambulance for treatment. Mercury had broken his nose and orbital bone and required more than 30 stitches to close the wounds. He was lucky he didn't lose an eye. Number 2. Brock Lesnar's Shooting Star Mess Kurt Angle went into his WWE title defense against Brock Lesnar in the main event of WrestleMania 19 with a broken freaking neck, knowing that one wrong bump could make it the last match of his career. The concern around the Olympic hero's brittle bones was well founded, but somebody should have been thinking a little more about the next big thing too. Asked to break out the shooting star press, a move that he had performed many times while stationed in OVW in order to create a WrestleMania moment, Lesnar was hesitant to do it, but ultimately agreed. He may have done it while honing his craft in developmental, but there was a costly miscue on the grandest stage of them all. Tired and sweaty and slightly unsure of himself, Lesnar came up short on the attempt, landing on his face and neck just a couple of inches shy of his opponent. By seemingly divine intervention, Brock hadn't broken his neck, but he was out on his feet due to the massive concussion he did suffer and didn't know whether he was in Seattle's Safeco Field or on a dairy farm in Webster, South Dakota when the match was over. Number 1. The Bionic Redneck Things were going brilliantly for Steve Austin in the summer of 1997, as he looked well on his way to becoming the biggest star in the business thanks to his hell-raising, blue-collar rebel character. And then, in the blink of an eye, Stone Cold's world and head came crashing down between the thighs of Owen Hart. The two were well into their grudge match at SummerSlam, with the stipulation that if Austin lost, he would have to kiss the backside of the rocket when Owen hit a sit-out tombstone pile driver that left his opponent with a momentary loss of feeling in his lower extremities. The Texas Rattlesnake's head was a good few inches too low when Owen dropped to his backside and he was spiked with no way to protect himself. Fearing that he had been paralyzed upon impact, the feeling gradually came back and Austin managed to crawl over and win the match as scheduled with the weakest looking roll-up in wrestling history. How he was able to do it is beyond me, since his neck was all kinds of messed up, leading to major fusion surgery a couple of years later and hastening the end of his in-ring career just a couple of years after that. Eric Bischoff famously claimed that controversy creates cash. Named his book it and everything. Well, Eric, it can also create lists, especially when his former company, World Championship Wrestling, is concerned. WCW has been gone for over two decades now, rest in peace. So you can be forgiven for forgetting, or perhaps not even knowing about, some of the company's more scandalous incidents. Whether taking place on screen or off, these episodes shocked fans, sullied reputations, and occasionally resulted in the SmackDown being laid down inside a courtroom. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 biggest WCW controversies. Join us. Oh, and by the way, we've left the finger poke of doom off this list. You've heard about it enough times. Number 10. WWE's Flair for the Gold Presented with the opportunity to sign your main competitor's world champion, nine times out of ten, you are going to do it. If that world champion happens to be Ric Flair in his prime, that nine times becomes a solid ten. Slick Rick left WCW in acrimony in the summer of 1991 after frequently clashing with the company's then-president, Jim Hurd. Soon after, Flair began appearing on WWE television with the big gold belt proclaiming himself to be the real world's champion. An embarrassed WCW sued him to get the title belt back, but Flair refused because he had put down a $25,000 deposit when he first became champion, which had not been paid 
paid back to him when he was fired by Heard. Flair thus believed that the title belt was his own personal property and could do what he wanted with it. Meanwhile, WCW vacated the title and created a new one, which was won by Lex Luger. The saga came to an end just a few months later when Flair agreed to send the belt back to WCW in exchange for about $40,000, the original deposit plus interest, or roughly the cost of a Ric Flair bar tab. Number 9. Missy Hyatt sues WCW Believing she had been unfairly fired by WCW in February of 1994, Missy Hyatt duly filed a lawsuit against the company, Turner Broadcasting Systems, WCW EVP Bob Dew, and Eric Bischoff. The Georgia Equal Employment Opportunity Commission gave Missy the go-ahead to sue after investigating her claims, which included sexual harassment, sexual discrimination, and retaliation. This ranged from unwanted advances and constantly being asked on dates to groping and intimidating intimidation, according to Hyatt, as well as a blown-up picture of her accidentally exposing her chest from Starcade 1993 being hung up in WCW's photo studio. Missy also claimed that she had been underpaid relative to other announcers and that WCW breached her contract by not paying her royalties for merchandise or for her work on the company's very lucrative hotline. Bischoff, for his part, claims he fired Hyatt for unprofessional behavior, particularly related to her apparent jealousy of new signing Sherry Martell, while Missy contends it's because she went over his head to then-superior Bob Dew about her various issues. As was Turner policy at the time, they ultimately settled with Missy out of court in late 1995. Number 8. Bischoff Sues Flair Eric Bischoff, WCW's maverick senior vice president, was a polarizing figure at the best of times. He helped take the company to unprecedented heights, yes, but he was also abrasive and could be accused of not showing his talent, including legendary stars, the respect they were due. Least of all, Ric Flair, a man who may have been tremendously popular and considered one of the very best professional wrestlers of all time, but who Easy e felt was past his sell-by date in the late 90s. Things got so fractious between the two that Bischoff sued the Nature Boy for $2 million. Bischoff claimed that Rick had breached his contract when he failed to show up for the April 9th, 1998 Thunder taping, though Flair contended he told management ahead of time that he would be missing in order to attend his son Reed's amateur wrestling tournament. The dirtiest player in the game countersued and disappeared from TV for five months, while Bischoff continued to run him down in promos and to the wrestling media. Inevitably, Flair returned and Bischoff used the real-life animosity to build a match between the two at Starcade, which the 16-time world champion lost, naturally, because WCW just couldn't help themselves. Number 7. WWE Sues WCW Oh, it's all getting a bit litigious in here now, isn't it? It is hardly surprising that the intense promotional war between WWE and WCW would spill over from the small screen to the courtroom. The two sides were unafraid to play dirty and both did things that could have landed them in front of a judge, but it was WWE who filed papers first due to the portrayal of a pair of its invading former stars. WWE filed a copyright infringement suit against WCW in 1996 because they claimed the Turner-owned organization implied too strongly that Scott Hall and Kevin Nash, whose names weren't mentioned on television during the first few weeks of the angle, were actually their WWE characters Razor Ramon and Diesel invading on behalf of WWE. Vince McMahon's favored legal eagle, Jerry McDevitt, was adamant that WCW were confusing the marketplace, in particular because Hall's WCW look and mannerisms was so close to the bad guys. The lawsuit dragged on for years before being settled in August of 2000. One of the terms of the settlement was that WWE had the right to bid on WCW's assets if the company was liquidated, which is why they were able to snap it up for such a relatively small fee just months later. Number 6. Sid Scissors Arn Anderson you talk about scissoring in professional wrestling these days, and people will harp on about AEW and start calling you daddy ass. But the real ones know that when it comes to scissoring in wrestling, Sid Vicious and Arn Anderson are the true OGs. Remember that thing I said earlier about professional wrestlers getting even more wrestlery when they go on international tours? Well, on the first night of a European excursion in October of 1993, the enforcer and master and ruler of the world got into a heated argument that escalated to bloody violence. 
It all started when Psycho Sid made a derogatory comment about Arn's friend Ric Flair, resulting in threats and beers flying across the bar. Things had seemingly cooled down when everyone went back to their rooms, but Vicious, alleging that Anderson had threatened him with a broken beer bottle in the hotel hallway, went to straighten things out with a chair leg. A chair leg wasn't used in the end, but a pair of scissors were, with the two getting into a gory brawl that left the Blackburn establishment looking like something out of the shine. No police charges were filed, but both men were deported from the tour. Arn was suspended upon his return to the States, while Sid was fired. Number 5. The Benoit Sullivan Affair WCW's series of bookers made untold number of blunderous mistakes over the years, many of which directly contributed to torpedoing fan interest. Only one man, however, penned a storyline that led to his own divorce. Evidently learning little from the whole Brian Pillman loose cannon work shoot scenario from not long before, Kevin Sullivan devised a plot that would see his real-life wife Nancy Woman Sullivan have an affair with Chris Benoit. As part of the work, Sullivan encouraged the pair to keep up appearances in public by travelling together and acting like a real couple on the road. Wouldn't you know it, fiction became fact and Nancy ended up leaving Kevin for Chris. Once the affair became common knowledge, it created a tense working environment, both backstage and in the ring, where Benoit and Sullivan frequently butted heads in ultra-intense grudge matches. They remained professional and no liberties were taken between the ropes, but the affair contributed to Benoit's decision to depart for WWE along with the rest of the Radicals in early 2000 when the Taskmaster was promoted to head booker. Number 4. The Starcade 1997 Finish The storyline between Hulk Hogan and Sting was pitched perfectly heading into Starcade 1997. WCW's biggest show of the year was headlined by the leader of the New World Order defending his heavyweight title against the vigilante who had watched on from the rafters as the NWO ran rampant before finally taking action and vowing to dethrone the Hulkster. WCW fans were firmly behind the face-painted icon, heading into a bout which really could only conceivably have one finish, Sting pinning Hogan to bag the gold. Sting did prevail on the big night, but the manner of his victory was far from straightforward and remains controversial to this very day. Crooked referee Nick Patrick was supposed to deliver a fast count for Hogan, prompting new signing Bret Hart to storm out and right the wrong since he knew all about being screwed, if we haven't mentioned it before. Turns out Steve Borden got screwed for real because Hogan made it so that Patrick delivered a standard count, making it look like his initial win was legitimate. Really, what are you going to do when Terry Belea's backstage politicking runs wild on you? Number 3. Hogan Sues WCW Quickly back to the red and yellow menace now as we ponder the immortal question of what happens when someone isn't a Hulkamaniac but rather a jabroni mark without a life that don't know it's a work when you work a work and work yourself into a shoot. Marks. All right then, so let's look at Bash at the Beach 2000 and the last time we will look at a controversial finish to a Hulk Hogan world title match, I promise. So basically, Hogan agreed to pin Jeff Jarrett to win the title after the Chosen One simply laid down in the middle of the ring rather than wrestle. This was all part of a Vince Russo masterpiece that would have led to Hogan returning down the line to win the title proper. But then Russo flipped the script and cut a scathing promo on Hogan as Hulk was flying back home. Terrible Terry then launched a lawsuit against WCW citing defamation of character as well as denying him the right to his contractually mandated creative control. If you think the whole thing is utterly ridiculous, well, you're not alone, because a court agreed and threw the suit out while the breach of contract countersuits between Hogan and WCW were settled confidentially. Number 2. The Gold Club Technically, this scandal didn't come out until after WCW had bitten the dust, but Eric Bischoff's association with the Atlanta Georgia Gentleman's Establishment, The Gold Club, was very much during his tenure as the company's SVP. The Gold Club was a notorious celebrity night spot where you could receive um, special favours from the exotic dancers who worked there. When the club and its owner Steve Kaplan went on trial charged with prostitution, credit card fraud, racketeering, money laundering, police corruption and 
being accused of having ties to the notorious Gambino crime family, the Bish was called in to testify. And so it came out that on one night, Eric and his wife Lori had gone back to their hotel room with a dancer named Jaina Pelnis, who used the stage name Frederic, where the ladies had some adult fun as a plastered Bischoff watched and possibly joined in. He can't remember. Eric testified that he paid Frederic between $75 and $100 for drinks and dances he and his wife had received in a private room at the club, while Laurie allegedly slipped her $200 on the way to the hotel, but that what happened between the two women was completely consensual. Several unnamed WCW wrestlers were said to have frequented the Gold Club as well, but no charges against them were ever filed. Number 1. The Racial Discrimination Lawsuit while World Championship Wrestling can be credited for giving some ethnic minority performers opportunities, the promotion has on occasion been accused of being a good old boy network that held those same minorities back and favoured predominantly white wrestlers as well as backstage workers and office staff. A group of 10 people who had performed for WCW, including Sonny Ono, Hardbody Harris and hard work Bobby Walker, agreed with this assessment and feeling as though they had been discriminated against because of their race, decided to to sue WCW parent company AOL Time Warner in 2000. Sullivan, Bischoff, Russo, JJ Dillon, Terry Taylor, and power plant trainer Jody Hamilton, along with others, were all outlined in the suit as supposedly having used racially insensitive language, while WCW on the whole was accused of purposely holding back African American, Asian, and Mexican talents and being institutionally racist. Those from minorities that were put on television were instructed to play up to stereotypes, it was claimed, while their pay and benefits were much less than white performers received. The saga dragged on in the court system until years after WCW was sold to WWE. In 2003, it was settled out of court, with the main principals reportedly receiving huge settlements. The word corpsing has nothing to do with The Undertaker or Casey Vick, thank God. Instead, it is a term most commonly used in acting, referring to when an actor breaks character, usually by laughing at something happening on stage. Wrestling is just one big theatre production with steel chairs instead of pantomime horses, and as a result, some of our favourite grapplers have also been caught off guard when the cameras are rolling. Get ready to see some of the scariest people on earth chuckle their bloody hearts out. The first one honourable mention, just because I love it so much, The Undertaker here during a promo with Triple H and HP. BK, look at him. Just look at him. I'm Adam Pachisi from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 times WWE wrestlers corpsed on TV. Join us. Number 10. Some Oosie Comments Forget the excellent matches or the emotional high points, the word Oosie is the single greatest thing to come from the Sami Zayn bloodline story. The honorary Oosie, well, scratch that, the former honorary Oosie, is a very funny guy, as his heel run with Kevin Owens in 2017 and 2018 more than demonstrated. But his greatest comedic moments in WWE have come during segments with, and at the expense of, Roman Reigns and his stable of cousins. The most the most famous example of this has to be from the October 28th, 2022 edition of SmackDown. After Jey Uso accidentally insults the tribal chief, Zayn steps in to try to smooth things over. He apologizes for Jey's behavior, saying that his insubordination is down to him not feeling very oozy. And that is when it all falls apart. Reigns, who was deadly serious just moments ago, breaks out laughing for the world to see. Jey does a slightly better job of holding in the giggles until Roman then says the word. Normally, wrestlers breaking character during a deadly serious segment would be seen as a bad thing. However, since this is one with Zayn we're talking about, it was class. Number 9. Orton Sings the Blues Ah, the Sing Brothers. Remember them? The Bollywood boys from the Cruiserweight Classic were quickly repackaged as Jinder Mahal's smartly dressed henchmen when Vince McMahon forced us all to live through the fever dream that was his WWE title reign. The Sings, Sunil and Samir, had three jobs while working for Jinder. Help him win his matches, call the great Carly for his interference spot at Battleground, and get beaten to a pulp by Randy Orton. Randy was Jinder's 
first feud as champion after the modern day Maharaja beat the Viper for the title at Backlash. During that match, the Sings ran interference on their boss's behalf, causing Orton to go all snaky snaky on them. After dumping Sunil over one announce table, Orton then went to do the same to his brother. However, he forgot that Samir Singh was the same size as his shoe and chucked him in the air so high that he came crashing down on the side of the table. Normally, this wouldn't be funny, of course, but Randy's face when walking away from the incident as if to say, ruh I done effed up, is absolute comedy gold. Thankfully, Samir was fine. Number 8. Janetti Hits the Bottom Before he became the most unhinged wrestler on the internet, and that takes some doing, let me tell you, Marty Janetti was part of a very successful tag team called The Rockers. Wonder what ever happened to that other guy? You might not know or remember that Janetti actually made a comeback to WWE in 2005, sticking around until 2009, give or take a firing, or five. In February of 2006, the former Intercontinental Champion was making his case to be signed to a full-time contract. Mr. McMahon agreed but only on the condition that Janetti join the Kiss My Ass Club. If you're unaware of what this is and want me to explain it to you, then too bad. I refuse, all right? When Vince dropped his trousers to reveal his billionaire buttocks, Janetti totally lost it. You can see him turning away from the camera to hide his laughter at the sight of a very rich man's bare backside staring him directly in the face. We would like to say that this is the weirdest thing that's ever happened to Marty Janetti, but his internet history would tend to disagree with that. Number seven. You're making me laugh. When Kofi Kingston defeated Daniel Bryan at WrestleMania 35, he became the first African born individual to win the prestigious WWE title. Which is why it makes perfect sense that when he debuted in WWE, he was billed as being from Jamaica in the Caribbean, which is not in Africa. To be fair to WWE, Kofi himself was using the Jamaican gimmick on the indies before signing with the company. He ran with the character, accent and all, for almost two years before dropping dropping any connection to the island nation. But Triple H remembers. Triple H always remembers. In a segment building up to Bragging Rights 2009, Kingston got on the mic to try to pull together his disorganized team. He finished his pep talk with, any questions? Which was a bad idea as the game then asked him, Aren't you supposed to be Jamaican? Kofi sells this like he's just had his biggest secret revealed on live TV, but this may or may not be some stellar acting. However, check out little Cody Rhodes in the background, chuckling away like there's no tomorrow. Next thing you know, we'll find out that he's not actually the American nightmare. Number six, heckle, loyalty, and respect. At SummerSlam 2013, Daniel Bryan defeated John Cena to become WWE champion for the first time. Moments later, Randy Orton would cash in money in the bank, ending Brian's fairy tale and setting in motion the chain of events that would lead us to WrestleMania 30. In the build-up to this match, Brian and Cena had a promo segment on Raw. Brian runs the champion down, telling him he's become a parody of a professional wrestler. It is a killer line, but someone in the audience that night was about to go one better. In response, Cena lists off the name of some of the greats he's beaten over the years. Brian cuts in, pointing out how Cena is talking about those people like they're better than him. Quick as a flash, someone in the crowd shouts out, they are! Stick a fork in him, folks. He's done. This unbelievable heckle momentarily makes Cena corpse. You can see and hear him smile and laugh as he turns his head away before snapping back into promo mode shortly thereafter. He might be a cyborg in a neon t-shirt, but even Super Cena is vulnerable to some comedy kryptonite every now and then. Number five, the worst stunner of all time. Before WrestleMania 38, the last time Steve Austin and Vince McMahon wrestled on the same show was WrestleMania 19 way back in 2003. However, since since 2022 was a year written by an out-of-control AI machine, the two Attitude Era staples both had matches over Mania weekend. The Rattlesnake ended up getting involved in McMahon's business after the 76-year-old tycoon defeated Pat McAfee in a match that was good. After celebrating with one Austin, Austin Theory that is, McMahon's good times were spoiled by another. After stunning the young star, Stone Cold offered his old boss a beer. The pensioner tentatively accepted before getting kicked in the gut, and then, and then, it was like a piece of performance art, something from the annals of the Renaissance. McMahon fell into the ropes, almost went totally over on the ground, got pulled up by Austin, and then collapsed in a heap in a manner no way resembling a Stone Cold stunner. It was 
hilarious, and Austin clearly thought so too. He can be seen cackling away like nobody's watching after getting up from the move, clearly having the absolute time of his life. You know what, Steve? Good on ya. Number four, Jake the Break Roberts. For those of you who know the story of Jake Roberts, you will know that it had many sad parts. Years of substance abuse left the legendary wrestler on the brink of death until his life was turned around, thanks in no small part to the efforts of DDP. On the January 6th, 2014 old school edition of Raw, Jake's incredible theme music played over the loudspeakers and the snake stepped out in front of a WWE audience for the first time in almost nine years. Everyone was thrilled to see him, including Dean Ambrose, who was standing in the ring. Roberts was actually one of his heroes growing up, and now here he was face to face with him. After a GTS from CM Punk, Ambrose was out cold. This allowed Roberts to pull his trademark trick of laying a live snake across the body of his fallen foe. The Shield member was supposed to be unconscious, but you can clearly see a smile creep across his face as he lives out a childhood dream. And that is really cute from the man who likes to get impaled with barbed wire for a living. Number three, a taste of the people's medicine. It was a rare sight to see The Rock speechless across his WWE career. The Great One is one of the best speakers in wrestling history, a skill that he's parlayed into the world of acting with bank-busting results. However, he is not invincible on the mic. On the March 7th, 2000 edition of Raw, Commissioner Foley welcomed his old enemy turned friend down to the ring. He congratulated the Brahma Bull on his five reigns with the WWE title, saying that it put him amongst the elite of the wrestling world. He asked The Rock how that felt, and without a second thought, Dwayne walked right into Mick's trap. After raising his microphone to his lips and attempting to speak, Rocky was ambushed by Foley, who yelled out, It doesn't matter how you feel, in true rock style. The crowd went ballistic, chanting and cheering Foley on as he ran around the ring in celebration. The Rock had nothing to say to this. Instead, he just stood in the ring, giggling at being outplayed at his own game by one of his best mates. And this is why wrestling is the best. Number two, R-Truth breaks the beast. R-Truth is not everyone's cup of tea. In fact, to some, he's a cup of battery acid and that cup is on fire. Not me though, bloody love him. Anyway, he has had some great moments over the years, including this gem from the build to the 2020 Royal Rumble. After cutting an impassioned promo about how his client, Brock Lesnar, was going to win the men's match, Paul Heyman was cut off by the 24-7 champ. As soon as Truth starts talking, you can see Lesnar start to go. Once Truth mentions his childhood hero, John Cena, a smile creeps across his face. Then, when Truth says he's going to eliminate Paul Heyman from the Rumble instead of Lesnar, the Beast completely caves in. Lesnar laughs his entire ass off after this line, even when Heyman tries to get the segment back on track. According to the man himself, Truth was dared to try and break the former UFC champion, and that is exactly what he did. Massive props to the guy for attempting to raise a titter from the world's angriest mountain. I mean, imagine if Lesnar hadn't liked the joke. We could be talking about this moment in a very different light. Number one, a real man's prank. As any good wrestling fan knows, William Regal and Brian Danielson are very close. The Blackpool native helped to train the former Daniel Bryan, and the two have remained good friends ever since. Such good friends, in fact, that one can prank the other during a TV taping and get away with it. The two men were set to wrestle each other in Liverpool, England on an episode of Superstars. After the home country lad received a suitably loud pop, Regal walked down the ramp looking ready for a fight. And then a whistle blew. This signaled the start of Real Man's Man, Regal so bad it's good theme music from his hard hat wearing lumberjack days. Brian planned the audio cue as a joke and it absolutely cracked Regal up. What starts as a smirk blossoms into a full blown grin as the American dragon absolutely beams in the ring. Honestly, it's one of the best things to ever happen on an episode of Superstars, which to be fair isn't saying much. It's just a really sweet moment between two old friends who then proceeded to batter the living hell out of each other for our entertainment. Ah. Here's something you might not have known before now. Wrestling is pretty dangerous. It turns out that a form of entertainment that involves dropping people on their heads, hitting them with chairs, and chucking them off the top of ladders actually takes a great deal of skill to pull off. That means whoever's doing said wrestles must be of sound body and mind, otherwise they pose a real danger to themselves and others. This is why the following 10 wrestlers should have never been allowed to carry on or even start a certain wrestling match. 
Whether they got injured during the bout, before it, or were just in no fit state to be doing anything, these grapplers should have been whisked away to a hospital, sorry, I mean local medical facility, before they even set their eyes on a squared circle. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 times a wrestler shouldn't have been allowed to perform. Join us. Number 10, Eddie Guerrero. Eddie Guerrero and JBL knew that they were up against it in their WWE title headliner at Judgment Day 2004. Bradshaw's transformation from beer drinking babyface tag team specialist to J.R. Ewing esque supervillain was sudden, and it's fair to say that not everybody bought him as a credible challenger. The two men certainly attempted to turn up the heat prior to their big showdown with some controversial promos and angles, but the real test would be in front of a sold out Staples Center and pay-per-view audience. The match was chugging along fine on the night and was decent, if not unexceptional, until JBL blasted Latino Heat with a vicious chair shot to the head and Eddie sprung a gusher. Accidentally cutting an artery while performing the blade job, Guerrero quickly redefined the term crimson mask. The sheer amount of plasma shed, and there were puddles of it, clearly caused concern for Eddie's welfare among those in attendance, and it's frankly astonishing that he continued to wrestle for so long as blood poured out of the wound. Weakened by the blood loss, the champ collapsed in the ring and had to be helped backstage where he promptly went into shock. Rushed off in an ambulance, Eddie was pumped full of fluids and stitched up before being given the week off to recover. I'll say. Number 9. Bret Hart As he will tell anybody within 20 feet of him at any given time, Bret Hart's in-ring career was ended by a botched thrust kick courtesy of Goldberg in the main event of WCW's Starcade 99 pay-per-view. It's estimated that Hart suffered up to three more concussions during the course of the match, which ended in a screwy finish because... WCW. The hitman should have taken time off to recover after this slew of head injuries, but he's on this list, so you can guess where this story is going. It's going straight into the ring the very next night. Yes, less than 24 hours later, the excellence of execution was main eventing Nitro against none other than Bill Goldberg. The two were battling for the WCW title, which had been declared vacant earlier in the night because of the aforementioned screwy finish. Considering Brett was probably still seeing spots and feeling woozy, it is unforgivable that he was wrestling again against Goldberg of all people, and the match no doubt caused more damage and contributed in some way to his career-ending post-concussion issues. Hart wrestled a further eight matches, including a hardcore bout with Terry Funk, before finally saying that enough was enough. Number 8. Mr. Perfect Alongside Bret Hart, Mr. Perfect Kurt Hennig was one of the very best in-ring workers the WWE had in the early 1990s. The two put on an absolute clinic at the 1991 SummerSlam, with Hart overcoming the perfect one to secure his first ever IC title. Whilst you wouldn't have been able to tell based on the exceptional quality, Hennig was suffering from severe back pain throughout the contest, which had begun in the weeks leading up to it. His injury was so bad that he couldn't even hit his signature perfect plex, though he did save one of those for Brett to kick out of at the pay-per-view. After passing on the title to the Hitman, Perfect took some time off to recover, and by took some time off we mean that he actually temporarily retired. But because retirements in wrestling last as long as Ric Flair marriages, or Ric Flair retirements for that matter, Hennig did eventually return to the ring. However, it is scary to think that a match as excellent as Perfect vs Hearts could have been a key reason why one of the all-time greats had to step away from the ring. Number 7. The Undertaker Mark Calloway was subjected to all sorts of physical torture across his three decades playing The Undertaker, including more unprotected chair shots to the head than you could shake a concussion lawsuit at. Perhaps the strangest injury Taker ever suffered was at the 2010 Elimination Chamber pay-per-view. Whilst making his entrance ahead of the World Heavyweight Championship Chamber match, the dead man got badly burnt by his own entrance pyro. Undertaker abandoned his usual slow walk to the ring and rushed inside the chamber, where he quickly doused himself with water. The fire had given him first and second degree burns to his neck and chest. He was only saved from further damage thanks to his thick black coat. Told you a goth phase would be useful, Mum. Taker was cleared by a ringside doctor, but he then had to stand inside the pod for over half an hour where he could literally smell his own cooking flesh. They had to have him in there to set up his match with Shawn Michaels at 
WrestleMania 26. Yes, but surely there had to be a better way than this. Number 6. Kurt Angle Despite being an excellent match, the main event of WrestleMania 19 was definitely cursed. This is the infamous Brock Lesnar shooting star press match, where the next big thing damn near killed himself trying to rotate his huge carcass through the air to end the match. However, before the bell had even rung, the other participant in this WWE Championship contest was also seriously banged up. Angle re-injured his famous broken freaking neck in the build-up to his match with Lesnar at No Way Out, with things being bad to the point that he was almost taken off the show and replaced with Chris Benoit. Lesnar and Angle even had a match on a pre-mania SmackDown for the title, just in case WWE wanted to pull the old switcheroo. However, being the absolute madman he is, Angle fought through the injury and put Lesnar over at the show of shows. He then took three months off to have experimental surgery to fix the lit of issues with his neck. Angle vs Lesnar was a worthy WrestleMania main event, but it actually ended up endangering both men's lives, and surely no wrestling match is worth that. Number 5. Kurt Angle It's a Kurt Angle double whammy, and whammy is the operative word in this entry. Kurt Angle and Triple H were fighting over the affections of Stephanie McMahon in the build-up to SummerSlam 2000, one of the best soap opera storylines WWE has ever done. In the opening melee, the game got Angle up on the announce table for a pedigree. Regrettably, the table broke prematurely, sending the Olympian crashing face first into the floor and giving him a gold medal worthy concussion. Angle was rushed to the back but re emerged for the match's conclusion. He was visibly out of it upon his return, clearly still suffering the effects of the table spot. Considering the match ended with The Rock pinning Triple H, they could have really just kept Kurt out of the remainder of it. Yes, his inclusion was maybe needed to further the Love Triangle storyline, but they could have done something on Raw, and anyway, that got dropped not long after because Triple H got jealous. Number 4. Big Van Vader The late great Big Van Vader's incredible combination of size, power, and agility made him one of the most unique performers to ever grace a wrestling ring. He was like a slasher movie monster, completely relentless in his pursuits. Also, much like Jason Voorhees or Michael Myers, he could brush off wounds that would have left any normal man dead. During a match in Japan in 1990, Vader suffered an errant thumb to the eye from his opponent Stan Hansen with stomach-churning results. His left eye popped completely out of its socket, leaving the Mastodon looking like he was wearing a pair of comedy glasses. Not faced by having his entire eye come out of his head, the big man casually popped it back in and held it in place with his eyelid to finish the match. That, dear viewers, is utterly mental, and there is no way that Vader should have been allowed to continue. Continue. I mean, do I really need to explain how bad it was that his eye wasn't where it was supposed to be? I'm no doctor, but that sounds like something that needs immediate medical attention. Number 3. Mankind When it comes to the Mount Rushmore of wrestling bumps, Mick Foley probably has two or three heads all to himself. And he would also probably jump off said mountain through a flaming table if you let him. His most iconic stunt is, of course, his terrifying fall from the top of Hell in a Cell during his King of the Ring 1998 match with The Undertaker. Mick Foley was sent hurtling off the side of the structure over 20 feet to the ground below. He disintegrated the announce table when he made contact with it, lying in a crumpled heap as millions of fans around the world wondered if he'd even survived the fall. We all know what happened next. Mankind somehow carries on the match, takes yet another terrifying bump through the cell, and wrestles a full-on match, including thumbtack spots with Taker, before eating a pin. It is iconic one of the most important wrestling matches of all time, but the toll it took on poor Foley's body is evident to this very day. Number 2. Matt Hardy Early into their Broken Rules match at AEW's All Out 2020 pay-per-view, Sammy Guevara tackled Matt Hardy off the top of a scissor lift, sending both men crashing through a table. A super dangerous spot, Matt ended up smacking his head on the concrete floor, knocking him totally loopy. I mean, firstly, why wasn't the floor padded? Secondly, 
why aren't there more tables to break the fall? And thirdly, who actually thought this was a good idea? What followed was not a pretty sight. Hardy stayed down for an uncomfortably long time before Guevara dragged him to his feet to avoid a 10 count. Then Matt stumbled around, clearly not with it, desperately attempting to finish the match. The bell then rang and the fight was called off. Except it wasn't, as Matt was somehow cleared to finish the match, which ended with a stupidly reckless spot where he and Sammy scaled some scaffolding. Hardy should have been kept far away from this match once he suffered his injury, as he was nowhere near fit enough to compete. The fact that AEW's doctors let him carry on remains one of the biggest black marks against the company to this very day. Number 1. Jeff Hardy TNA Victory Road 2011 was supposed to end with a dream match between heavyweight champion Sting and challenger Jeff Hardy, but that's not how it went down. Instead, Hardy came out to the ring looking like he was on another planet. Planet. He hadn't been seen for much of the day leading up to the show, the assumption being that he was off indulging his vices. When the time came to start the match, Eric Bischoff called an audible and had Sting forcibly pin Hardy after just 88 seconds of action, most of which was just Jeff taunting the crowd. The TNA fans chanted that the spectacle was a lot of rubbish, although they did use much spicier language, and Sting replied with, I agree, which was a damning indictment of what had just happened. This was a sad sight to see, Hardy at his lowest, the absolute worst of his personal issues. That said, the issue should have been dealt with backstage. He definitely should not have gone out in front of a crowd looking and acting the way he did. This was a dark day for Jeff Hardy, a dark day for TNA, and a dark day for pro wrestling as a whole. For every WWE NXT star that makes a name for themselves, either in the so-called developmental system or later on as a member of WWE's main roster, there are about 10 candidates who won't make it past a certain level if they even get on TV in the first place. With so much talent coming through the doors of the WWE Performance Center, it is inevitable that some of them aren't going to break through and have the impactful NXT career that they, as well as those behind the scenes, hoped for. A lot of stars have passed through Full Sail and the PC in the past decade, but you may struggle to recall the following. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 forgotten WWE NXT stars. Join us. Number 10, Jake Carter. Wrestlers following in the footsteps of a famous family member must feel a real burden to not just continue the family legacy, but ensure that they don't tarnish it. Jesse White, aka NXT's Jake Carter, had especially big shoes to fill because he was the son of WWE Hall of Famer and one of the best big men the business has ever seen, Vader. I mean, seriously, look at the size of him. He must have worn about a size 16, I'm guessing. Talk about big shoes to fill. A college football standout, Jesse's gridiron dreams were unfortunately quashed by injuries, but he decided to give pro wrestling a try, doing some indies and then working in Japan, often teaming with his father, before WWE came calling and signed him to a developmental deal. Jay Carter's time in Florida Championship Wrestling was fruitful as he bagged tag gold with fellow prospect Corey Graves. But things went awry when FCW rebranded to NXT as Carter went solo as your girlfriend's favorite. He was winless on the brand and would ultimately get released after failing to catch on and allegedly irking the writers with unwanted storyline pitches. Number 9. Kaylee Turner Another NXT hopeful itching for the same success as a family member was Christina Crawford, aka Kaylee Turner, the younger sister of Victoria Alicia Fox Crawford. Signing with the company in the summer of 2011, Christina was then released from her contract so that she could participate in the rebooted Tough Enough. When she didn't win the reality show, WWE re-signed her and she ended up winning the FCW Divas title. Kaylee Turner wrestled a solitary televised NXT match, teaming with Caitlyn to lose to Paige and Tamina Snooker on the August 8, 2012 episode of the show after a couple of weeks of appearing in non-wrestling roles. Three days later, WWE released Crawford while she was still recognized as FCW Divas Champion. Three days after that, WWE retired the FCW Divas title as they were preparing to fully rebrand everything to NXT, making Turner the final champion. The rap on Crawford was that after a couple of years in training, she wasn't picking things up quickly enough and that her body wasn't responding well to the wear and tear that comes with bumping, but she's evidently been very successful in her post-wrestling life. Number 8. Briley Pierce 
And we are immediately back yet again with another sibling pursuing sports entertainment superstardom via WWE's developmental system. To be fair to Ryan Nemeth, younger brother of Nick Nemeth, aka Dolph Ziggler, he had watched his older bro go from a caddy to a male cheerleader to a bloke who introduces himself to people before getting beaten up to finally achieving a nice level of success as a dependable workhorse. So if Nick can do it, why can't Ryan? The one-time FCW Tag Team Champion debuted in NXT as an interviewer before making three televised in-ring appearances, all of them recorded at the same May 2nd, 2013 TV taping. They were a no contest with Sakamoto when the Ascension's Connor O'Brien ran in and murked them both, then a handicap match lost to O'Brien while teaming with Sakamoto, and then a fleeting battle royal appearance that aired after he was released. His release was a surprise to many as it was noted that he was popular and worked hard, but WWE were about to move everybody into their new performance center and wanted to bring in some fresh faces. Oh, and apparently a member of senior management disliked him for no good reason. That'll do it. Number 7. Memo Montenegro Alright, so it's been a few seconds since we've talked about an aspiring wrestler getting into the family business in the hopes of matching the accomplishments of their kin. NXT's Memo Montenegro wasn't just a member of any wrestling family either. As the son of Dos Caras, nephew of Mil Mascaras, and brother of Alberto Del Rio, he was essentially Lucha Libre royalty before he'd even put on a mask. New to the business and not exactly doing anything to stand out, the unmasked Montenegro wrestled eight NXT matches in total, including two on television. Vision. Those two matches were quick losses to Big E and then Xavier Woods. After what were essentially a pair of squash matches, Memo wrestled a handful of non-televised house show bouts, coming out on the winning side just once in a six-man opener. Dropping off the radar and not being seen in an NXT ring for months, it was no major surprise when he received his release in July of 2013. What was a surprise was that he was let go while his brother was reigning as World Heavyweight Champion. Though since the same thing happened to old Briley Pierce when his big brother held the same title, perhaps we really shouldn't be so shocked. Number 6. El Local Though primarily known for his talents as a ring announcer, Ricardo Rodriguez actually knew a thing or two about wrestling as well. Well, maybe he knew a thing, I'm not sure about two. Prior to being signed by WWE, Rodriguez worked on the indie scene as Chimera and wrestled a couple of matches under the name and gimmick when assigned to FCW in 2010. Then he got a recurring role as Alberto Del Rio's personal ring announcer and sacked off his previous gimmick, though he continued to wrestle in the minor leagues under his new alias. Once the association with Del Rio ended and that jarring partnership with Rob Van Dam ran its course, Rodriguez returned to NXT as the jobberific El Local which is Spanish for the local, for those of you having a tough time translating. Mostly used as a jobber, El Local did enjoy some degree of relevancy while teaming with Kalisto, who clearly had far more upside against the Ascension, which included an NXT tag team title match at the very first takeover. But that first takeover was the end of the line for Local slash Rodriguez, who was released just a couple of months later. Number five, Mickey Keegan. Mickey Keegan. Mickey Keegan. I'm sorry, but with a name like that, you've got more chance of being a journeyman English professional footballer with spells at MK Dons and Macclesfield than a WWE star. Max Pelham had been doing the indie thing for about seven years, including forming a tag team with Tommaso Ciampa when he signed his developmental deal in August of 2012. He debuted as Axel Keegan and suffered televised losses to Bo Dallas, Big E, and The Shield before resurfacing with a new first name. Would Mickey Keegan light the world on fire in a way that Axel Keegan had not? Further rapid losses to Dallas, the Ascension, and the Wyatt family would say no, he would not. Regrettably, creative indifference would be the least of Pelham's worries, as tests show that his health was rapidly deteriorating, with worsening spinal stenosis forcing him to step away from the ring. He stuck around NXT for a few more months as a creative assistant before leaving in January of 2014 and joining Crew Alexander on loan for the rest of the season. Number 4. Sakamoto Kazuma Sakamoto ventured overseas in the summer of 2011 for a customary learning excursion away from his Japanese homeland. Having worked for Taka Mishinoku's K-Dojo promotion for the best part of a decade, Kazuma sought new experiences and challenges and wound up getting signed to a WWE developmental deal. His FCW stay was characterized by doing jobs for just about everyone before he was called up to the main roster as manager-cum-whipping-boy of Lord Tensai. When the Tensai character failed to get over to the 
desired level, Sakamoto was sent back to Florida, resurfacing as the opponent for a debuting Adrian Neville in January 2013. It was clear just what Sakamoto's spot on the third brand would be, and his subsequent losses to Mason Ryan and Connor O'Brien, alongside the aforementioned Briley Pierce, were par for the course. When he and Pierce were the first two men to be quickly eliminated by Mason Ryan in a battle royal, they must have seen the writing on the wall. Thankfully, since his release, Sakamoto has been able to show a lot more of what he's genuinely capable of while wrestling in his native Japan. Number 3. Troy McLean. Hi, I'm Troy McLean. You may remember me from such matches as tagging with Travis Tyler vs The Ascension and singles bout with Baron Corbin. Or you know, you probably don't and sorry for the bad American accent. Trained by Rikishi and Gangrel at their Florida-based Knox Pro Wrestling Academy, Alexander Jones was offered a WWE developmental deal very early into his sports entertainment journey after John Cena spied him while visiting the school and helped open the door by setting up a tryout. A talented three-sport athlete who had been specifically recruited by his Attitude Era coaches, Jones readily admitted that he didn't grow up a fan of the business but endeavoured to give it a shot anyway. Laboured with a slightly naff motivational speaker gimmick, Troy McLean only made a couple of televised appearances for NXT, but reportedly received good marks from those who tracked his progress at live events, including Hall of Famer and eagle-eyed scout Jerry Briscoe, who felt that Jones had all the tools required to be a major player in the future. That unfortunately didn't happen, as McLean was surprisingly released from his contract and, after a short spell on the indies, left the industry altogether. Number 2. Garrett Dillon Listen, if my dad was legendary country music singer and actor Chris Christopherson, and trust me, sometimes I wish he was, I would do everything possible to pursue a career as a whiskey-drinking, girl-chasing, honk-tonking outlaw. The Highwayman's son Jody, on the other hand, opted for a career in bone-bending and grafted in the small halls before getting a shot in WWE's developmental system. At one point, Jody took off for a while to deal with a personal matter, with Triple H bringing him back after it had all been sorted out. Chris and Garrett Dillon, he looked and wrestled like a solid throwback and gave the impression that he could grow into a hell of a hand in time. In NXT, he formed teams with both Jake Carter and Scott Dawson, the latter of which started to gain a little bit of traction before Garrett was released the first time around. When he came back, he wasn't really given many opportunities and was only used to put others over, including Camacho and my man Bojo Rawley, before being given the boot for good. Post NXT, he continued working the indies and developed a new character called Warpig. Number 1. Audrey Marie Unlike many who pursue the WWE dream, Ashley Miller was neither an aspiring wrestler nor had any real athletic background to speak of. Miller was, crucially, a fan of it growing up, however. Ashley was working as an accountant when she entered and won a modelling contest, subsequently turning down several other modelling gigs in order to try out with WWE. She was signed to a deal, given the moniker of Audrey Marie, and despite her lack of experience, worked hard and impressed those in charge. So much so that she beat Oxana to win the FCW Divas title, which she held for 105 days. Audrey probably thought that she was getting called up to the main roster when she was included in vignettes filmed hyping up the Wyatt family's debut, Sister Abigail anyone, but she remained in the newly revamped NXT instead. She initially scored a couple of decent wins on NXT TV against against the likes of Sasha Banks and Paige, but was quickly phased out in favour of Banks, Paige and the rest of the insurgent crop of promising young women. Miller was released in May of 2013 and wrestled just one more match on the indies before calling it a day. Patience may be a virtue, but nobody has ever accused Vince McMahon and the rest of the WWE Creative Brain Trust of being especially virtuous now, have they? WWE stars come and WWE stars go, but it's no lie to say that some go sooner than others, and many times long before they've ever really been given a proper shot to succeed. Whether it was a blink and you'll miss it run or a main event dalliance, the lack of faith often leaves fans with the lingering question of what if? I'm Adam Pachisi from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 wrestlers WWE gave up on too quickly. Join us. Number 10. Mordecai After a couple of years in WWE's developmental system, Kevin Furtick, who had portrayed a character called Seven during his stint in OVW, was called up to the SmackDown roster in the spring of 2004. Vignettes hyped the impending debut of Mordecai, a religious zealot type hell-bent on ridding the world of sin for weeks. 
decked out in all white everything, the Pale Rider was supposedly going to be built up for an eventual feud with The Undertaker. WWE appeared to be doing the slow burn thing with Mordecai, giving him victories over the likes of Scotty Too Hottie and Hardcore Holly at back-to-back -back pay per views. But just days after knocking off old Sparky Plug, Mordecai was beaten by Rey Mysterio on SmackDown and sent back to OVW. Amazingly, there had been suggestions that Mordecai could challenge Eddie Guerrero for the WWE title at SummerSlam prior to JBL taking the belt off Latino Heat and Mordecai getting axed. Fertig himself has said that his involvement in a bar fight contributed to his downfall, but WWE quickly called on Mordecai anyway and certainly didn't have big plans for Kevin Thorne on ECW a couple of years later either. Number 9. Caval Loki grafted tirelessly for years in promotions like Ring of Honor, TNA, and overseas in Japan to earn a reputation as one of the most talented pro wrestlers of his generation. So it's quite funny that when WWE got their hands on him, they paired him up with Lay Cool and had him play second fiddle to the co-holders of the women's title. Despite being routinely mocked for his stoic demeanor, the renamed Caval ended up winning season two of NXT when it was a glorified game show and was shifted over to the SmackDown brand, where he lost, and lost, and lost again. But then he earned a place on the blue brand's bragging rights team, wahey! And he lost that too. Still, at least he had a guaranteed title shot to fall back on from his NXT victory, eh? Which he used to take on Intercontinental Champion Dolph Ziggler at the 2010 Survivor Series. He lost that one too, naturally, then lost some more matches before he got tired of losing and realizing that WWE had no significant ideas for him besides losing a lot, he asked for and received his release. Number 8. Ultimo Dragon Years after it was feared a botched elbow operation had ended his career, WCW favorite Ultimo Dragon signed with WWE. The company built up his impending debut with vignettes and introduced the inventor of the acai moonsault in grand style by having his first televised WWE match take place on an episode of SmackDown taped from Madison Square Garden. The masked man looked sharp putting Shannon Moore away, while Rey Mysterio talked him up on commentary and Billy Kidman watched on from the crowd, flanked by models and wearing sunglasses for some reason. That was about as good as it got for Dragon, whose next televised outing was a quick loss to Eddie Guerrero. After that, Ultimo could usually be found plying his trade on low-priority weekend show Velocity. No real shock that he decided to leave WWE after less than a year. The man himself would later say that WWE perhaps felt like he was too similar to Mysterio, while also revealing that they wanted him to unmask, a request that helped speed up his premature exit. Number 7. Shad Gass Spart. If you had to bet money on one of the members of Crime Time getting pushed strongly and succeeding in singles once they broke up, you would have put it on Shad Gaspard. No offense to JTG or anything, but Shad had the height and the muscularity that WWE typically coveted, as well as a presence and charisma and all that other good stuff. Shad clearly believed in himself too, which is why he pitched the team breaking up so that he could have a solo run to WWE Creative in early 2010. He got his wish, but not the results he desired, as he was hastily beaten in his and JTG's rush strap match Extreme Rules, essentially blowing off their feud mere weeks after his big heel turn. He did get a win over his former partner on Superstars a short time later, but after one more squash match win, WWE decided Gaspard was missing something and sent him to Florida Championship Wrestling, where he spun his wheels for a few months before being released. Shad had all the tools to do more and go further on his own, but WWE evidently didn't see it. Number 6. Damian Sandow there is a belief among a certain segment of WWE fans that a talent is only allowed to get over if the company actively wants them to. You may cry conspiracy at that notion, but may I present to you Exhibit A. Fired after a forgettable 2006 run on SmackDown, Aaron Stevens toiled on the indies, won back the attention of his former employer, and reported once again to the developmental system. While there, he crafted the Damien Sandow persona, which was his ticket back to the main roster. The intellectual savior of the masses was something very different and struck a chord with the WWE universe. 
Working his way up the card, Sandow formed a winning team with Cody Rhodes, which led to an inevitable split when he betrayed his partner in order to secure the Money in the Bank briefcase. It was a prop that could have propelled Sandow to the very top tier, but WWE instead booked Sandow to be the first person to fail to cash it in as he senselessly lost to John Cena on Raw. The brass ring only grew further and further out of reach as Damien plummeted to the bottom of the bill. Number 5. Maven The winner of the first ever season of Tough Enough, Maven Huffman enjoyed early success in WWE. He famously eliminated The Undertaker from the 2002 Royal Rumble and snagged a WrestleMania hardcore title match against Goldust before an ill-timed injury derailed his momentum. It took Maven a while to regain it, though things looked to be going in the right direction for the a still inexperienced star in late 2004. Rumming shoulders with Randy Orton and Chris's Jericho and Benoit, Maven feuded with the remaining members of Evolution heading into that year's Survivor Series. As a member of the winning team, even if he didn't do that much in the match besides running and potato Gene Snitsky, his character was given the chance to act as general manager of Raw for a week. Typically, he booked himself in a World Heavyweight title match against Triple H. Typically, he lost. He soon turned heel, but the push didn't take, and he was presented as a joke in his feud and matches with Intercontinental Champion Shelton Benjamin. Maven landed in a spot teaming with fellow mid-card comedy heel Simon Dean, but tagging with the fitness freak wasn't enough to save him from being future endeavoured. Number 4. Tensai to be fair to WWE, they tried time and time again to make Matt Bloom a credible singles threat. In the early 2000s, he was given a not insubstantial push on SmackDown as A-Train, but failed to get over to the desired level and after an injury and switch to Raw, he was let go. Reinventing himself as a monster heel in the Far East, he changed his name to Giant Bernard and enjoyed much success as one of the top foreigners in New Japan. WWE's talent relations chief, John Laurinaitis, was watching and engineered Bloom's return after an almost eight-year absence. Coming back with a gimmick inspired by his time in the Land of the Rising Sun, Bloom was now known as Lord Tensai, though he soon dropped the Lord part and was being built up as a villainous challenger for John Cena. After a couple of squashes to establish him as a threat, Tensai actually beat John Cena in an Extreme Rules match on Raw. This didn't lead to anything substantial, however, as WWE suddenly got bored of the big man, fed him to Cena, and proceeded to job him out to high heaven. Things turned out all right in the end, mind. Number 3. Eric Escobar Eric Perez spent four years stationed in WWE developmental territories Deep South and then Florida Championship Wrestling before finally receiving his call-up. The Puerto Rican was signed by WWE in the hope that he could be their next Spanish-speaking star, given that he was tall and had a good look. Debuting on SmackDown in September of 2009, Eric Escobar was introduced as the storyline boyfriend of Vicky Guerrero. He beat Matt Hardy in his first match to earn a place on the Blue Brand's team at Bragging Rights, though he was quickly removed from it along with Crime Time, Drew McIntyre, and Dolph Ziggler. Being replaced in the interbrand bout should have been the first sign that WWE weren't exactly going to follow through with Escobar's early push. Losing an Intercontinental title match to John Morrison and then getting dumped by Vicky was signs two and three. After being punished by the general manager for a few weeks, Escobar was given his marching orders by WWE just a few months after what had been such a promising start. Number 2. Kizani Sin Bodhi, a longtime friend of Edge and Christian who had wrestled regularly for TNA as a member of the New Church stable, had been on WWE's radar for a while doing dark matches and such before finally inking a developmental deal in July of 2007. After a year of busting his butt in the sticky Florida heat, Bodhi was pitched an idea for him to do on the main roster. Kizani! It's Carney for Carney, get it? Well, Bodie got it and hated it, but not one to turn down a chance at superstardom, grabbed it with both hands. Kazani vignettes began playing in October of 2008, showing the character at a carnival and speaking in Carney, of course. It may have been a rather lame inside joke, but the fact that Vince McMahon himself pitched the idea and WWE invested the time and effort in promoting the character did bode well. As did a debut victory over the luckless MVP on the first SmackDown of 2009. Sadly, that would be one of a grand total of two televised matches for Kizani, the other being the second man eliminated in a battle royal before he whiz as fizz -ired. 
Number 1. Ryback Breaking his ankle early into the Nexus invasion of WWE was quite possibly the best thing that could have happened to Ryan Reeves, as strange as that may sound. Away from television for the best part of two years, Skip Sheffield was allowed to become a distant memory. In his place came Ryback, a Goldbergian, cyborg-like smashing machine in striking airbrushed outfits. After a few months of squashing everything in his path, Ryback was one of the most overacts on the roster. So much so that he was chosen as an unlikely opponent for then WWE champion CM Punk. The undefeated Ryback was so hot at the time that some fans genuinely felt as though the right call would be for him to dethrone the straight edge superstar when they met inside Hell in a Cell, but that was not to be. After Ryback fell at the first hurdle, it felt as though WWE gave up on him as a proper main event level player. Sure, he won titles and was involved in memorable feuds after, but he was never seriously considered for the top prize again. And now, he never will be due to his official, legally binding retirement. The Humble House Show doesn't always get the love and appreciation it deserves. Also known as live events, these untelevised performances are a great chance to see your favourite wrestlers in their natural environment. With no TV cameras to play up to or storylines to worry about continuing, wrestlers are allowed to have a bit more fun, which can often have great results. Sometimes though, something massive will go down at one of these events, leaving the wrestling world wondering why such a momentous occurrence wasn't captured on film. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 most famous house shows in WWE history. Join us! Number 10. Rockers Collide In late 1991, that coward Marty Jannetty tried to escape his tag team partner Shawn Michaels by jumping out of a barbershop window. At least that's what my Uncle Bobby used to tell me. Seriously though, Michaels and Jannetty had been part of the Rockers, a very successful, very sexy tag team throughout the 80s and early 90s. Michaels turned heel on his friend, beginning a feud that was meant to culminate with the pair squaring off at WrestleMania 8. However, that plan was scrapped when Jannetty got arrested. Whoops. It wouldn't be until 1993 that the pair finally worked a proper program, with Marty actually beating Sean for the Intercontinental Championship on an episode of Raw. A couple of weeks later, at a random house show in Albany, New York, HBK and Party Marty faced off for the belt again. Michaels would regain the title with a little help from a debuting performer by the name of Diesel. Wonder what happened to him? This would be the final major match between the ex-rockers in their prime as Janetti would be gone from the company again in 1995. Oh Marty, what are you like? Number 9. The Iron Prequel The first ever Iron Man match in WWE history took place at WrestleMania 12 and was between Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart for the WWE Championship. Right? Wrong, as always. The actual first ever WWE Iron Man match took place almost seven years earlier than this, although it did feature one of the same participants. The Rockers teamed up to defeat the Fabulous Rougeos at a 1989 live event in Montreal. They would repeat the concept two days later before the format went dormant for another three and a half years. Bret Hart would wrestle in the first ever singles Iron Man match, but his dance partner was not the showstopper. At the January 9th, 1993 house show in Boston, Massachusetts, Bret Hart defended his WWE title in a 60-minute Iron Man match against the nature boy himself, Ric Flair. Hart had beaten Flair for the gold at another house show a few months earlier and was now putting it back on the line in what was known at the time as a marathon match. He was victorious by three falls to two, with those in Boston likely unaware that they had just witnessed history. Number 8. Where are all the wrestlers? Considering that they run approximately 8 billion live events a year, it is amazing that more doesn't go wrong when it comes to WWE's touring schedule. But when stuff does go wrong, it goes really wrong. Just two weeks out from WrestleMania 21, the SmackDown brand ran a house show in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, hometown of WWE legend Todd Grisham. Due to various travel issues, over two-thirds of the talent scheduled to appear on this night failed to show up. These included Rey Mysterio, a young Bob 
Bobby Lashley, and even Funaki. How will we cope with our SmackDown's number one announcer? In the end, a backup plan was hastily cobbled together. A special one-night tournament was devised featuring a majority of the wrestlers who had made it to the venue. John Cena would win it after defeating Booker T before coming up short in his promised WWE title match against JBL. It might not have been what was advertised, but at least those in attendance got to see several big names wrestle multiple matches in one night. Also, the previous day's house show featured Heidenreich vs. Charlie Haas. No disrespect to Charlie Haas, by the way, but maybe this was a blessing in disguise? Number 7. The Little Rock Riot Christmas can be a stressful time. There's presents to buy, decorations to put up, and you've also got to figure out how you explain Cousin Harry's new friend to your homophobic grandma. Maybe these holiday headaches contributed to this wild turn of events at a WWE house show in late December 1997. Fans in Little Rock, Arkansas that night had been expecting an episode of Monday Night Raw, so got very annoyed when they found out it was an insignificant house show instead. The rowdy audience got more and more agitated with what they perceived to be a lackluster card. In the end, the proposed main event of Triple H vs Ken Shamrock got cancelled after Shawn Michaels stormed out and legitimately told the fans they didn't deserve it. Fans rioted like they were back in the territory days as the 6,000 strong cohort fought security guards, each other, and various inanimate parts of the arena. One report even said a guy's shirt was set on fire, but there had been a lot of alcohol consumed on the night, so take that with a pinch of salt. Number 6. Rollins's Knee Gives Up Seth Rollins was heading into Survivor Series 2015 in great shape. He was WWE Champion, had been for most of the year, and was set to face off against Roman Reigns in that night's main event. Unfortunately for the architect, though, his ligaments had other ideas. On November on the 4th, 2015, Rollins was wrestling Kane at a live event in Dublin, Ireland. The luck of the Irish clearly didn't apply to the champ as he landed wrong on a sunset flip powerbomb and blew out several parts of his knee. Seth's ACL, MCL and meniscus were completely shot and the injury would keep him out of action for a presumed 6-9 to nine months. One thing that also went kaput was his WWE title reign as the belt was vacated shortly thereafter. Put simply, this threw everything into complete complete disarray, not just Survivor Series, but all the plans WWE had for the rest of the year and beyond. It was also an omen of things to come, as several other high-profile performers also went down with injuries in the lead-up to WrestleMania 32, which helped account for why that show was a steaming pile of dung. Number 5. Jericho vs Brazil When travelling to a country outside of your own, it's important to take into consideration the laws and customs of your destination. For example, you should know that when when entering the UK, not singing the national anthem while simultaneously making a pot of tea and reading a Paddington Bear book is punishable by death. Chris Jericho clearly didn't read up on the laws of Brazil when he travelled there for a WWE show in May of 2012. Y2J was facing off against CM Punk, who was wielding the Brazilian flag like a good little babyface. In order to get heat, Jericho snatched the flag, threw it on the ground, and stomped all over it. Not a bad tactic, eh? Except for the fact that desecrating the Brazilian flag is a big deal. Jericho was faced with arrest if he didn't apologise to the crowd right then and there. After the fact, WWE suspended him for performing the action without their consent. Considering that Y2J could have gone to jail for this, an earnest apology and a short suspension was probably the best outcome. Also, he was far from the first WWE wrestler to be insensitive in a foreign country. Number 4. JBL's Bad Decision JBL's bad decision could refer to a lot of things, including the time he accidentally tweeted a screenshot of himself searching for adult entertainment, but we are talking about one very specific incident here. An incident that went down during a June 5th, 2004 house show in Munich, Germany. JBL was the heel in this match, obviously, and so tried to draw some heat from the crowd. Nothing wrong with that, except when your idea of drawing heat is popping several Nazi salutes and goose-stepping around the ring. Needless to say, this drew a lot of negative reaction and not the kind JBL was after. All of this goes without mentioning the fact that Nazi iconography and actions are highly illegal in Germany, a country that has often struggled to reconcile with its past. In a shocking turn of events, WWE never actually punished JBL for this incident. In fact, they gave him the WWE Championship a few weeks later. Number 3. A New NXT Champion Title changes don't happen 
happen that often at house shows, because why would you waste a big moment like that on a non-televised crowd? Sometimes, though, WWE like to throw fans at live events a bone, including on this night in April 2016 in Lowell, Massachusetts. One of the matches that night was Finn Balor defending his NXT Championship against Samoa Joe. The two had been feuding for a few months now, and fans expected this to be just a throwaway match in keeping with their televised rivalry. Oh, how wrong they were! In a move nobody saw coming, Joe hit Balor with a muscle buster and pinned the Irishman to end his reign as King of NXT. And this wasn't just any old reign, this was the longest reign in the history of that belt up to that point. And they ended it at a house show. Unbelievable. In reality, this was actually a really smart move as it made the already radical developmental brand seem even more cutting edge. No doubt it also shifted a bunch more tickets to future NXT events as fans hoped they would see a repeat of what went down that night. Number 2. Diesel Crushes Backland Arguably the most famous and insane championship change in WWE house show history went down at Madison Square Garden in November 1994. Bob Backlund, at that time the living embodiment of middle-agedness, had just beaten Bret Hart for the WWE Championship in a major upset at Survivor Series. Backlund, whose last world title win had come in 1978, was surely too old to be the company's top champion for very long. And this statement was proven true as he dropped the belt just three days later. Not only was his reign short, but so was the match in which it ended. Backlund faced off against Diesel at this untelevised event and lost in a staggering 8 seconds to crown Big Daddy Cool as the new champ. This accomplished several things. Not only did it get the belt off Backlund and onto Diesel, but it also made Big Kev look like a total monster, demolishing a respected legend in less time than it takes to tie your shoelaces. It also signaled to WWE's spiritual home that anything Thing could still happen at the world's most famous arena. Number 1. The Curtain Call In April 1996, Kevin Nash and Scott Hall signed lucrative contracts with WCW. Not only were WWE losing two of their top stars, but this also broke up one of the most powerful backstage entities in wrestling history. The Click, which consisted primarily of Nash, Hall, Shawn Michaels, Shawn Waltman and Triple H, were all real-life chums who used their considerable influence to essentially run WWE for themselves. The group's final night together was the May 19th, 1996 house show at MSG, where Kevin, Scott, Sean and Tripps all celebrated in the ring together after the main events, even though they were all meant to be feuding with each other. This would have been just about fine had a fan not caught it all on camera. This shattering of kayfabe at a time where it was still enforced was a huge no-no. All four men involved would be severely punished, well, except except for Nash and Hall, who were leaving for WCW, and Shawn Michaels, who was WWE Champion. Damn, Hunter. Bad luck there. One of the great things about WWE's brand of sports entertainment is the sheer variety of wrestlers that are typically at their disposal. Having characters of all different shapes, sizes, and styles to pick from makes for some very intriguing matches. And it has also made for some mammoth mismatches. As one chinless wonder once put it, any man with two hands has a fighting chance. Well, that may be true to an extent, but the chance does decrease somewhat when you're put in the ring with somebody the size of a bloody cement truck. I'm Adam Pacisi from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 biggest mismatches in WWE history. Join us. Number 10, Nathan Jones vs. Shannon Moore. Nathan Jones wasn't in WWE for very long, but he sure made an impression in the brief time he was on the roster. It wasn't always a good one, but there we go. The Colossus of Boggo Road only wrestled a handful of televised matches, a couple of which were against far smaller opponents like Nunzio and Shannon Moore. Matched up against the high-flying cruiserweights, Jones was able to demonstrate his size and power by throwing them around at will, especially in his match with Moore. The little mf -er was more than happy to fling himself about for a bloke that was practically double his size, taking some gnarly bumps to the floor and a risky moonsault one with an Australian assist. Moore's match with Jones came during a storyline where SmackDown general manager Paul Heyman was trying to help him step out of the departing Matt Hardy's shadow and then rewarding him for his courage with more matches against his gruesome goon squad, pitting him against Matt Morgan, Jones, Big Show, A-Train and Brock Lesnar in consecutive weeks. So just keep that in mind next time you're mad at your boss. 
Number 9. Big Daddy V vs Colin Delaney Like Shannon Moore, poor pencil-thin Colin Delaney was put through the ringer on a weekly basis by being thrown to the wolves during his unlikely spell on ECW in 2008. What was supposed to be a one-shot deal turned into a recurring gag as Delaney got put in there with Mark Henry, Kane, The Great Carly, JBL, Big Show, Mike Knox, Vladimir Kozlov, and pretty much anyone else who could cause him some serious physical harm. Every one of those bouts was a giant mismatch, but Delaney's run of terror began with the biggest one of all. On the January 1st, 2008 episode of ECW on Sci-Fi, the luckless jobber squared off with the gargantuan Big Daddy V. Happy New Year, Colin! Outweighed by someone almost three times his size, there wasn't much Delaney could do except for survive as long as possible before being squashed or potentially swallowed whole like an anaconda's dinner. It went as expected, with the former King of the Ring winner manhandling his victim and putting him away within 90 seconds before swallowing him whole like a near 500 pound anaconda. Number 8. Big Show vs Rey Mysterio Fans of legendary luchador Rey Mysterio wondered how he would fare in the land of the giants when he joined WWE in the summer of 2002. Initially plugged into the cruiserweight division, it wasn't too long before the masked man began battling Vince McMahon's monsters. The sternest test for Mysterio in the earlier days of his WWE career was the Big Show. Ray had managed to just about avoid Show during their WCW days, but came up against him in a mismatch at Backlash 2003. The biggest little man against the world's largest athlete was certainly an attraction, but there was no doubt as to who the winner would be at the time, with Show crushing him in mere minutes. Adding insult to injury, Mysterio was then strapped to a stretcher and swung like a human baseball bat into the ring post. The two men would clash on numerous other occasions, with the 500-pounder usually coming out on top. Thankfully, the two were able to sort out their differences and form a tag team years later. In fact, they grew so close that sometimes Show would even let Ray sit on his knee and work the steering wheel while they drove to the next town. Number 7. Braun Strowman vs Kalisto the 2010s version of Big Show vs. Rey Mysterio was Braun Strowman against Kalisto. The 2010s were rubbish, weren't they? The monster among men and the man who was good at doing, um, good lucha things got into it in the spring of 2017. Strowman had previously eliminated Kalisto from the Royal Rumble, and a week after the masked man was drafted from SmackDown to Raw, Braun targeted him once more, shoving him in a dumpster like a big bad bully with poor social media instincts and setting up, what else, a dumpster match for the following week. After being battered about for most of the contest, Kalisto somehow managed to avoid being put in the bin and dropkicked the big man's knees, resulting in an improbable upset victory. Having watched the luchador convincingly get his masked backside handed to him and figuring anything other than a Strowman win was a fanciful, the crowd came unglued at the finish. Unfortunately for Kalisto, Braun didn't take losing the match very well, capping off a post-match beatdown by locking his opponent in the dumpster and pushing it off the side of the stage. Number 6. The Oddities vs Kyantai Having a numerical advantage should really make a mismatch in favour of that team, but that wasn't the case at SummerSlam 1998. Kai and Ty probably thought the odds had been evened up when they met the oddities in a 4-on-3 handicap match, but even with the extra man, it was clear that Takamishinoku, Funaki, Men's Teo and Dick Togo had their work cut out for them when coming up against Kurgan, Golga and Giant Silver. The high-flying Japanese quartet weren't lacking in skill, but were well outmatched when it came to size. Flanked by Luna Vachon and the Insane Clown Posse, the oddities had fun toying with their much smaller foes, including in four-on-one scenarios. To be fair, while the bulk of the contest was played for laughs, Kai and Tai did manage to look competitive in brief spells. The result was never in doubt, however, and a quadruple chokeslam followed by the biggest of splashes, well, Golga basically fell on top of them, confirmed the inevitable. This one easily gets in my top five favorite oddities matches of all time. Check it out! Number 5. Brock Lesnar vs Ricochet 
Brock Lesnar has to be the overwhelming favourite in any match he's booked in, whether it's against a super heavyweight, a reigning champion, or in something like the 30-man Royal Rumble. The Beast Incarnate's credentials speak for themselves, and Brock has conquered amateur wrestling, pro wrestling, and MMA, doing so as a massive, lightning-quick, absolutely terrifying physical specimen. Some of Lesnar's most compelling WWE matches have been against far smaller opponents, the likes of AJ Styles, Daniel Bryan, and Eddie Guerrero. A classic David vs. Goliath bout was what fans had hoped to get out of Ricochet's challenge of the WWE title at Super Showdown 2020, but the King of Flight was in way over his head and things ended up being about as one-sided as you can get. Brock made Ricochet pay for his part in helping Drew McIntyre eliminate him from the Rumble, ragdolling him around the ring with suplexes before finishing him with an F5 in 1 minute and 28 seconds. Well, he doesn't get paid by the hour, I guess. As for you, Ricochet, you tried your best, and you failed miserably. The lesson is, never try. Number 4. The Great Carly vs. Rey Mysterio Rey Mysterio may have been considered a cruiserweight for the first few years of his WWE career, but he was booked to win the World Heavyweight title at WrestleMania 22. It was a barrier-breaking moment, not just for Rey, but for others like him too. And as World Heavyweight Champion, the Master of the 619 would have to defend his title against some of the beefiest beef boys on the roster. Matches against JBL, Mark Henry, and Kane were taxing, but Mysterio's biggest hill to climb was with newcomer the Great Khali. One of the biggest men in WWE history, the Punjabi giant showed the world what he was all about when he dismantled The Undertaker and pinned the Phenom with one foot on his chest in his pay-per-view debut. Before tangling with the dead man, Khali had a non-title date with Ray Ray on an episode of SmackDown emanating from Mysterio's hometown of San Diego. Yeah, sure, invite his friends and family to witness the bloodbath, why not? And Bloodbath is what it would have turned into had Carly not decided to finish Mysterio off within a few painful minutes. He made up for this show of mercy later by trying to burst Ray's head open like a little grape. Number 3. Big Show vs Floyd Mayweather by definition, any celebrity or sports star crossing over to WWE is at a disadvantage. That's not to say they can't put in a good showing and even cause upsets in matches that sometimes struggle to maintain suspension of disbelief. It probably helps when you have legitimate combat sports experience or are, you know, widely regarded as one of the greatest boxers of all time. And the diminutive Floyd Mayweather would have been matched up pretty well, at least from a size perspective, with, say, someone like Chavo Guerrero. But Big Money Mayweather is Big Money Box Office, and Chavo Guerrero just doesn't really shift tickets. Sorry, Chavito. It made more monetary sense to present a freak show boxer versus wrestler bout with Floyd taking on Big Show in a no DQ match at WrestleMania 24. The undefeated lightweights brought his entire entourage to the showcase of the Immortals for his showdown with the world's largest athlete, but the former WWE champion took care of them all. Didn't sport the brass knuckles this time, though, did he? Number 2. Brock Lesnar vs Zach Gowan Have you heard the one about the one-legged man in an ass-kicking contest? Alright, good. Now let me tell you about the one-legged wrestler and his match with this absolute freak of nature. Around this time, the next big thing was starting to show people who the real Brock Lesnar was, and Vince McMahon booked him in a match with Zach Gowan on the August 21st, 2003 episode of SmackDown as a warm-up for SummerSlam opponent Kurt Angle, of course. Poor Zach was like a lamb to the slaughter in front of a hometown crowd, with his mother sitting at ringside as he clashed with the unhinged beast. Lesnar had shown the week before just how vicious he could be with someone a fraction of his size when he turned Brian Spann Anki Kendrick into a stain on the mat, but even that almighty beating paled in comparison to the job he did on Gowan. Brock left Zack in a bloodied and beaten pile on the floor, having destroyed him with power bombs, chair shots, and F5s into the ring post. Gowan technically won the match by disqualification, mind, so small mercies, eh? Number 1. The Great Carly vs. Hornswoggle 
fathers sometimes have to discipline their children. I don't have any kids of my own that I know of anyway, but it's a life lesson I have learned well during my lifetime of WWE fandom. Vince McMahon often took matters into his own hands in order to set Shane and Stephanie straight, and goodness me, wasn't that uncomfortable. But the genetic jackhammer gave the honors to the great Carl Lee, at least initially, when it came to humbling his illegitimate son, Hornswoggle. Upset that the little bastard turned out to be one of his own, McMahon booked the smallest performer in WWE against the biggest at Survivor Series 2007. Hornswoggle showed no fear as he squared up to the Punjabi giant's belly button before smartly retrieving a shillelagh from under the ring. Carly duly took the stick from him and twatted him over the head with that pavement slab he calls a right hand. Now, if you think there's something funny about a very large man smacking someone dressed like a leprechaun, you are are sadly mistaken. Because actually, there's something very funny about the visual, though the laughs came to an end when that spoil sport Finley ran in for the DQ. The main event of a WWE pay-per-view is usually the longest or one of the longest matches on the card. That is, of course, because these matches usually have the biggest stars in them as well as the most storyline heft, but sometimes the final match of the night is actually one of the shortest. For this list, we are counting a main event as the match that was scheduled to go on last at a pay-per-view, so no Money in the Bank cash-ins and no previously unannounced matches. Sorry Hulk Hogan and Yokozuna at WrestleMania 9, but, well, actually, I'm not sorry. Not sorry at all. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 shortest WWE pay-per-view main events ever. Join us. Number 10, The Undertaker vs. The Undertaker at SummerSlam 1994, 8 minutes and 57 seconds. In an alternative, some would say better, universe, the 1994 edition of SummerSlam was closed out by Bret Hart battling his brother Owen for the WWE title inside a steel cage. This was the culmination of the incredibly personal feud between the two siblings that had begun back at Survivor Series the previous year. After 32 minutes of intense Hence action inside the cage walls, Brett escaped the structure to win the match and keep his title reign intact. Unfortunately, we don't live in that universe. We live in a universe where this show was closed out by The Undertaker taking on a guy in Undertaker cosplay. As part of a storyline where Ted DiBiase had brought his own version of the dead man to WWE, the real Undertaker and the fake Undertaker, the Underfaker if you will, clashed in SummerSlam's final match. Well, I say clashed, what I mean is they slowed bumped into each other with all the grace and panache of two trees collapsing due to old age. Mercifully, this dull affair only lasted 8 minutes and 57 seconds before the real taker put the imposter away and this whole miserable angle was dropped. Number 9. Kurt Angle vs Stone Cold Steve Austin vs The Rock vs Rikishi at Rebellion 2000, 8 minutes and 50 seconds. To give you an idea of how little WWE cared about British audiences in 2000, the longest match on Rebellion, a UK exclusive pay-per-view, lasted just over 12 minutes. In fact, The Undertaker vs Chris Benoit was the only match on the show that went into double digits. Highlights from across the card included China teaming with Billy Gunn to take on Dean Malenko and Eddie Guerrero, Steve Blackman defending the hardcore title against Perry Saturn, and a sub-three-minute women's match pitting Ivory against Lita. What a time to be alive. The show's main event was a fatal four-way for the world title, which which on paper looked like an absolute banger. Defending champion Kurt Angle was putting his belt on the line against Stone Cold Steve Austin, The Rock and Rikishi in a match that could have been great had it been given longer than 8 minutes and 50 seconds to play with. Instead, Angle hit the Olympic Slam on Rikishi to win a short, underwhelming affair, proving once and for all that the big man was only there to take the pin. Number 8. John Cena vs The Great Carly at Judgment Day 2007, 8 minutes and 15 seconds. They might have been crazy enough to give him the World Heavyweight Championship in 2007, but even WWE had enough sense not to book the guy in any main events as champion. Carly 
Charlie's one and only show closer came at Judgment Day 2007, where he was the challenger to John Cena's WWE Championship. Not only was Carly to joy what a match is to a can of petrol, but the shine was also beginning to come off Cena as a main eventer. Once again though, WWE's very small amount of common sense prevailed, and the bout was booked to last no longer than 8 minutes and 15 seconds. It might have gone longer had Carly been facing somebody else, but Cena was still relatively new as a top talent and was far from the ring general needed to carry such a dead weight. In the end, the champ retained by forcing his gigantic opponent to submit for the first time ever. Oh, but what's this? His foot was under the rope? Oh no, don't tell me that means another world title match between these two. To be fair, their Fools Count Anywhere match at one night stand was actually pretty decent. Number 7. Stone Cold Steve Austin vs Mr McMahon at St Valentine's Day Massacre 1999, 7 minutes and 52 seconds. Anyone who's seen St Valentine's Day Massacre, a pay-per-view named after an actual massacre where 7 people died lest we forget, might remember the main event lasting a lot longer than 7 minutes and 52 seconds. That's because there was an ungodly amount of brouhaha before the match between Stone Cold Steve Austin and Vince McMahon officially got underway. In their first and only singles meeting on pay-per-view, McMahon was putting his Royal Rumble victory on the line against the Texas Rattlesnake in a cage match, meaning that if Stone Cold won, he would be facing The Rock at WrestleMania. Finney Mac refused to enter the cage, causing Austin to run out and batter his boss all over ringside. He could have actually won the bout by forfeit as he had sent Vince crashing off the side of the cage wall through the announce table in one of the maddest bumps in WWE history. I mean, the guy was 50 53 at the time. Once the match did officially get underway, it only lasted a shade under 8 minutes before McMahon's plan to use the debuting Paul White to his advantage backfired massively, handing Austin the win. Number 6. Brock Lesnar vs Drew McIntyre at WrestleMania 36 Night 2, 6 minutes and 55 seconds. Whilst Hulk Hogan's impromptu victory over Yokozuna at number 9 might officially be the shortest main event match in WrestleMania history, the briefest scheduled main event happened at the one mania we would all like to forget. WrestleMania 36 was the first WWE pay-per-view to be affected by the COVID pandemic, meaning that no fans were allowed in attendance for the showcase of the Immortals. In true showbiz fashion though, the show went ahead anyway over two nights, and the second chunk was closed out by Brock Lesnar defending the WWE Championship against Royal Rumble winner Drew McIntyre. In a moment over a decade in the making, McIntyre overcame the Beast's offense to strike him down with a claymore and capture his first WWE World Championship. Unfortunately, not only did his big moment take place in front of nobody, but it was all over and done with in 6 minutes and 55 seconds. Perhaps this match would have gone longer had Mania 36 gone ahead as originally planned, although this was a Brock Lesnar match, and as you're about to find out, Lesnar does not get paid by the hour. Number 5. Brock Lesnar vs Samoa Joe at Great Balls of Fire, 6 minutes and 25 seconds. Goodness gracious, it's that Raw exclusive pay-per-view from July 2017. What was it called again? Oh yeah, Shake, Rattle and Roll, that's the one. For this bizarrely named one-off event, WWE presented a tantalizing first time ever encounter between two of the most unique performers they had on their books. Samoa Joe had outlasted four other men at the previous month's Extreme Rules to book a date with Universal Champion Brock Lesnar at the Rock Around the Clock pay-per-view. The match had a killer build, with Joe made to look like a total monster by choking out Brock until he was redder than his own bloody title belt. So fans were expecting big things from this tasty big boy clash. Whilst the action was fast paced and thrilling, the match itself only lasted a measly 6 minutes and 25 seconds before Lesnar retained. I mean, length isn't everything, just ask your mum, but it would have been nice to see a little bit more from these two titans, you know? Ah well, at least this historic moment will make sure we always remember the name of the Johnny B. Good pay-per-view. That's right, isn't it? Number 4. Brock Lesnar vs Roman Reigns at SummerSlam 2018 
screen, 6 minutes, 10 seconds. That same Lesnar Universal title reign that included the Joe match came to an end over a year later when the Broctopus finally dropped the gold to the man he probably should have lost to at WrestleMania, Roman Reigns. Before these two could throw down at SummerSlam 2018, Mr. Money in the Bank Braun Strowman came down to ringside and made it clear that he was planning on cashing in on the winner. Lesnar showed Braun what he thought of that notion by absolutely murdering him and then throwing his briefcase so hard that it broke one of the LED screens. Strowman's presence eventually offered enough of a distraction for Reigns to take command of the match, crushing the champion's ribs with a spear to pin him and end his colossal 504-day reign. And they never wrestled again. Never ever again. This match was essentially the perfect storm for a short main event. It was a Brock Lesnar title defense, and it had the element of outside interference. It culminated in a match that lasted just 6 minutes and 10 seconds, the shortest scheduled SummerSlam main event in history. Number 3. The Fiend vs Goldberg at Super Showdown 2020, 3 minutes 8 seconds If there is one person who dislikes long main events more than Brock Lesnar, it is Bill Goldberg. Whilst the mayor of Suplex City can go long if he needs to, Goldberg was not built for matches lasting longer than 5 minutes, especially after his comeback in 2016. Case in point, this disastrous main event from the Saudi Arabia-hosted Super Showdown in 2020. Goldberg had been chosen as the challenger for the Fiend Bray Wyatt's Universal Championship, presumably as a stopgap ahead of WrestleMania 36, right? Oh, how wrong we were. In a stunning turn of events, the 53-year-old ex-WCW guy plowed through the undefeated Fiend in just 3 minutes and 8 seconds to snatch the title from his gloved hands, and also kill any sense of mystique the once promising character had left. Worst of all, this was all done to set up a match between Goldberg and Roman Reigns at WrestleMania, a match which never actually ended up happening due to the pandemic. The end result of this match was always going to upset people, but the fact that it happened in less time than it takes to make a cup of tea was the last straw. Number 2. Goldberg vs Brock Lesnar at Survivor Series 2016, 1 minute 26 seconds. 12 years after their classic match at WrestleMania 20, classics can be bad too, you know, Goldberg and Brock Lesnar were pitted against each other once again in the main event of Survivor Series 2016. Whilst Lesnar had returned to the company in 2012, this was the first time his opponent would compete in a WWE match since that fateful day in Madison Square Garden. The prevailing theory was that the two men would have a spirited big man clash, only for the Beast to vanquish his old enemy and continue his momentum as the company's resident destroyer. That theory turned out to be a whole heap of wrong. Lesnar rushed Goldberg into the corner, only for Big Billy to shove him down. A cocky Brock got back to his feet, then got speared out of his Jimmy John's branded shorts. Another spear and a jackhammer later, and that was that. Goldberg had just come out of retirement and essentially buried the man who broke the streak in 86 seconds. This was madness. This was unheard of. This was brilliant, to be honest, and one of the most genuinely shocking things WWE had done in years. Number 1. Kevin Owens vs Goldberg at Fastlane 2017 22 seconds About three months after he bulldozed his way through Brock Lesnar, Bill was back in the main event to challenge Universal Champion Kevin Owens for his big red strap. Both men were in the middle of separate feuds heading into WrestleMania 33. Goldberg had a rematch with Brock to worry about, whilst KO had just broken up with his best friend Chris Jericho in an all-time great Raw segment. So would any of this play into the action itself? I'm on the edge of my seat here. It was Owens whose past got the better of him as Y2J walked out just before the match to distract his former partner in crime. This gave Goldberg the upper hand and he wasted zero time in putting the champ away with his trademark combination. Bill Goldberg was the new Universal Champion and he'd done it in just 22 seconds. That makes the final match from Fastlane 2017 the shortest scheduled WWE pay-per-view main event of all time. Is that a record to be particularly proud of? Well, maybe if you're the guy who won the match. As for the loser, it's probably something he would like us all to forget ever happens. Spoiler, we never will. 
In wrestling, the phrase the Marty Jannetty of the team means one half of a duo who faded into obscurity whilst the other went on to great success. To be honest, that's probably the best thing that Marty's name can be associated with these days. Plenty of teams have had a Jannetty. Stevie Ray of Harlem Heat, Jim Neidhart of the Hart Foundation, Bart Gunn of the Smoking Guns. But there are exceptions to the rule. Prepare yourself, dear viewer, for a list entirely of Shawn Michaels's. Is, 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 is. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 tag team partners who both found greatness after the split. Join us! Number 10. DIY Following their appearance in the first Dusty Rhodes Tag Team Classic in 2015, Johnny Gargano and Tommaso Ciampa helped define the tag scene in NXT as the ultra-popular Hashtag DIY. Yeah, they had a hashtag in their name, it's cool, alright? Following an epic series of matches with the Revival that saw them win the NXT Tag Belts, the duo lost their prizes to the Authors of Pain and then came up short in a title rematch at TakeOver Chicago. Oh well, I'm sure they'll be able to talk it out and come to some so OH MY GOD, Tommaso! So what did you just do? The breakup of DIY led to both men becoming single superstars, both against each other and in separate feuds. Chamber would become a two-time NXT champion and one of the best heels in the brand's history, whilst Gargano would win the North American Championship three times and become NXT's first ever Triple Crown winner. It remains to be seen what success their reformed team will have on main, but I'm pretty optimistic. Number 9. The Steiner Brothers It's easy to look at one half of this sibling tag team and have a bit of a giggle, but you really shouldn't do that. Firstly, because he'll actually bite your head off, and secondly, because Rick Steiner achieved way more as a single star than you might remember. As well as being a former NWA slash WCW World Television Champion prior to teaming with his brother, the elder Steiner would win the title twice more after their famous split at Super Brawl in 1998. He would also capture the United States Champion championship in 2001, the penultimate person to hold that belt in WCW prior to the company being bought out. Whilst he was never a top tier star or a would be world champion, Rick did well for himself as a singles act. As for his younger, even more unhinged brother, well, we all know about him. Scott Steiner had the rocket strapped to him following his betrayal of Rick, joining the NWO, winning the United States Championship twice and holding the WCW world title right up until the final episode of Nitro. His grand run didn't carry over into his return to WWE as a solo star, but Freakzilla was the man in the dying days of Dub C Dub. Number 8. The Second City Saints before they fell out with each other, and before one of them fell out with 90% of people who have ever worked in wrestling, CM Punk and Colt Cabana were the best of friends. The two Chicago natives came up alongside one another and were put together in Ring of Honor during Punk's acclaimed feud with Raven. Alongside Kenny Omega's favorite person Ace Steel, and with appearances from the former Daphne and future Impact wrestler Tracy Brooks, the pair formed a group named the Second City Saints. Punk and Cabana wrestled the likes of Generation Next, the Rottweilers, and the Briscoe brothers who they beat for the ROH Tag Team Championships twice before the former went off to make his fortune in WWE. Since then, Cabana has become a celebrated figure on the independent scene as well as in AEW, winning multiple championships in many different promotions, including the prestigious NWA World's Heavyweight Championship twice. As for CM Punk, well, do you really need me to tell you what he's been up to in the time since? Number 7. Evil and Sonata over to New Japan now, and a group of lads who both became unlikely main eventers in the Land of the Rising Sun. In 2016, Sonata made his New Japan debut and immediately joined up with Tetsuya Naito and his LIJ stable. I could try and say the full name of that group, but we both know that wouldn't end well. As part of this new arrangement, Sonata was paired up with another young wrestler named Evil. This new duo won the World Tag League twice, the IWGP Tag Team Championships twice, and were three-time Never Open weight six man champs alongside Bushi. Everything was going swimmingly until evil went evil. It's always the ones you least suspect. The King of Darkness left LIJ to join Bullet Club, where he would become the faction's leader and scoop the IWGP Heavyweight Championship in a decision that everybody loved and nobody complained about. As for Sonata, he took a little longer to get to the mountaintop, but he eventually unseated Kazuchika Okada for the top prize in 2023, a title he still holds at time of recording. Considering that most people saw these two as purely tag team stars, they've not done too bad, have they? Number 6. Beer Money Inc. 
Beer. Money. No, not the only two things I have in my fridge at home, but the name of a very popular tag team from TNA's past. And for those asking why I keep my money in the fridge, it's safer in there because it's cold. Duh. After James Storm left America's Most Wanted, who might have qualified for this list had Chris Harris's WWE run not been a disaster, he joined up with a strapping young lad named Robert Roode. One of them liked to get drunk, the other liked to make cash. It was a match made in heaven. Seven. Over the next three years, Beer Money became multiple-time tag team champions and set the record for the longest single run with those belts in history. They got extremely over thanks to their individual charisma and in-ring synchronicity, but it wouldn't be until they split that both men would achieve their full potential. Both Storm and Rude would reign as TNA World Champion, becoming two of the most popular single stars in the company. In WWE, Rude has won several titles, while Storm, well, he made that appear in NXT that one time, didn't he? I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Storm has also done very well for himself outside of Impact. I mean, he didn't have his name changed to Braden Walker for a start. Number five, the Hardy Boys. Matt Hardy and his younger brother Jeff are easily the most popular wrestling tag team in history to share their name with a series of young adult detective novels. The pair officially signed with WWE in 1998, which was the beginning of a meteoric rise to stardom for both lads. Their daredevil antics and innovative ladder-based matches made them cornerstones of the Attitude Era, netting them approximately a billion tag team championships along the way. Over the years, the Carolina natives have reunited on many occasions, but have also found the time to have successful singles runs. Jeff is a three-time world champion in WWE and the same in TNA, with several intercontinental and US title runs to his name as well. Whilst Matt may not have been as consistently in the main event as his bro, he's still an ex-ECW and TNA world champ too. Plus, let's not forget his greatest contribution to wrestling as an art form, his boxing match with Evander Holyfield in 2007. Oh, and something about being broken? Number four, the Golden Lovers. When Kota Ibushi turned up in AEW at Blood and Guts 2023, people were very excited, and not just because they got to look at his handsome face again. He would be teaming up with Kenny Omega in the double caged match, making this a long overdue reunion for the Golden Lovers. Formed when both men met in 2009 whilst working for Japanese promotion DDT, the Golden Lovers quickly hopped across to New Japan, where they won the junior heavyweight tag team titles. They weren't to last though, as they stopped teaming regularly around 2014. Since then, both men have gone on to establish their legacies as two of the best grapplers of the modern era. Ibushi travelled all over the world before returning to New Japan in 2019 to become one of their top stars, winning their world title at Wrestle Kingdom 15. As for Omega, he only bloody went and helped found AEW, and that is just the tip of the iceberg. Now that the lovers are reunited, who knows what the next chapter will be? Hey, maybe they'll decide that this wrestling thing isn't for them, settle down in a nice car somewhere and sell homemade jams online. Could happen. Number three, the Blade Runners. In 1985, two rookie wrestlers broke away from a stable called Power Team USA to form their own group called the Freedom Fighters. When they joined the Universal Wrestling Federation a year later, they changed their name to the Blade Runners. These two wrestlers were Jim Helwig and Steve Borden, better known as the Ultimate Warrior and Sting. Blade Runner Sting and Blade Runner Rock, which was Warrior's name at the time, were initially managed by Dutch Mantel, who modern fans may remember as Zeb Coulter. They teamed together for less than a year before going their separate ways, but brother, you best believe the story didn't end there for those two. Obviously, both men separately went on to become megastars, but their careers did share some similarities. Both won their first world titles in 1990, both would headline their respective company's biggest shows, and both would have ill-advised rematches with Hulk Hogan. Though the Blade Runners were just a small part of their careers, it's still fascinating to think about the time these future legends spent on the same team. Number two, the Funk Brothers. Since its creation in the year 1948, only one pair of legitimate brothers have both held the NWA World Heavyweight Championship. We are talking about Dory Funk Jr. and his little brother Terry. Both broke into the business in the 1960s as part of their father, Dory Funk Sr.'s Western State Sports Promotion. Dory Jr. got started first, but would soon join forces with his sibling as they went about establishing themselves as one of the top teams 
in the territories. World title success came first to Dory, who beat Gene Kaniski for the gold in 1969. He would hold the belt for the next four years, the second longest single reign in its history. As for Terry, he would have to wait until 1975 to get his time in the sun. Outside of the NWA, Dory would go on to win championships all over the world for various legendary companies. As for Terry, well, he did just about everything there was to do in wrestling, including winning the ECW title at the age of 52. Middle-aged and crazy wasn't just a catchphrase, you know? There have been many great brother tag teams in this great sport of ours, but nobody did it quite like the Funks. Number 1. Edge and Christian from real-life best buds in Canada to fictional brothers in the brood to established legends in their own right, Edge and Christian have done exceedingly well for themselves in the world of wrestling. As a team in WWE, they were unstoppable, winning World Tag Team Gold on seven different occasions. In the early days of their breakup, they continued to succeed as Edge was pushed as a star of the future whilst Christian was a solid hand in the mid-card. Then came the World Championships. So many World Championships championships. Between their runs with the WWE title, the World Heavyweight title, the NWA title, and the Impact title, Edge and Christian have 16 top championships between them. That is an entire John Cena. And this is without mentioning all the great matches, promos, and moments these two have been involved in. If we went through all those, we'd be here until around 2056. In a business where so many tag team partners fall by the wayside, both of these icons have always found a way to keep themselves relevant, important, and most of all, entertaining. I cannot wait to see what these two do next. Stables, groups, factions, whatever you want to call them, in WWE they are supposed to be forces to be reckoned with. And WWE, to their credit, have been responsible for some of the best in the history of the business. When they get it right, they really get it right. But when they get it wrong, oh dearie me. Rather than careers being made and legacies forged, being involved in one of WWE's very bad stables can be the undoing of some performers or else linger as a metaphorical steel chair to beat them over the head with. Strength in numbers, my ass. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 worst WWE stables. Join us, or don't in these cases. Number 10, The League of Nations. On paper, a faction featuring Seamus, Rusev, Wade Barrett, and Alberto Del Rio isn't half bad. It's just a quarter bad, with Del Rio being that quarter. The League of Nations took four of WWE's dependable internationals and banded them together to spread anti-American sentiment, a simple concept I'm sure we can all get behind. So just what happens when an Englishman, an Irishman, a Bulgarian, and a Mexican walk into a wrestling ring together? A whole lot of nothing, sadly, as the League of Nations seem to exist for one primary reason, which was to assist in Operation Get Roman Reigns Over. Amazingly, grouping them together managed to collectively lower the value of everyone involved as the League of Nations had no clear purpose, no credibility, and the four men in the group were unhappy with their creative direction, or lack thereof. Seamus, Barrett, Rusev and Del Rio have all since been outspoken about their frustration and disappointment with their six-month alliance, and as far as their WWE runs are concerned anyway, only the Celtic Warrior ever truly recovered from it. Number 9. The Cabinet Saddled with the stigma of being a career mostly babyface mid-carder, JBL needed all the help he could get to establish himself as a top-line heel when he was thrust into the position in 2004. The shocking angles, heated promos, and feud and subsequent WWE title victory over Eddie Guerrero certainly helped legitimize him, and I'm sure WWE probably thought that making him the leader of his own stable would only enhance his reputation further. And so, President JBL assembled his cabinet, adding Chief of Staff Orlando Jordan, co-secretaries of defense the Basham brothers, and image consultant Amy Weber. The cabinet acted as warm bodies to be beaten up by the babyfaces trying to get their hands on the champ, but OJ, Doug, Danny, and Amy weren't exactly over with the audience and their matches and segments routinely fell really flat. They accomplished next to nothing before gradually disbanding with Amy quitting IRL after just a few months on the road and the Bashams kayfabe handing in their notice not too long after. 
By that point, JBL had lost the strap, and so it was basically just him and Orlando, with fixer Gillian Hall temporarily added to the mix before the whole thing was scrapped altogether. Number 8. The Mean Street Posse I will confess that the idea of a group of Shane McMahon's buddies from the mean streets of Greenwich, Connecticut wrestling in sweater vests and slacks was a funny one to start with anyway. Two-thirds of the so-called Mean Street Posse, Pete Gass and Rodney, were legitimate buddies with the boss's son, while the other member, Joey Abs, was a former enhancement talent and the only one with any actual in-ring experience. The Posse originally had a couple of other members, Willie Green and Billy P, before they were whittled down to a three. Mostly used in backstage segments or to run interference for Shane, the Posse wrestled the occasional mostly awful match, one of which against Stooges Patterson and Briscoe is inexplicably one of the most viewed matches in the history of Raw. The Posse's collective lack of training meant that their matches were mostly rotten and they didn't really have much reason for being once they split from McMahon, mostly being used as punching bags or hardcore title fodder. WWE evidently didn't see much of a future for them since they were shipped off to developmental league Memphis Championship Wrestling in late 2000, never to return. Number 7. The Mexicals In theory, an invading cruiserweight group consisting of Juventu Guerrera, Super Crazy and Psychosis should have been a surefire winner. After all, the three luchadors were all ultra-talented and their addition to the SmackDown roster in 2005 was a shot in the arm to a division that was thin on the ground and creatively neglected. However, WWE's decision to have the Mexicals ride to the ring on lawn mowers raised some eyebrows due to it being, you know, a massive racist stereotype and deeply offensive to a sizable portion of the show's audience. The Mexicals claimed that they were no longer going to do the manual labor that Hispanics were expected to do for gringos and began their WWE careers by interfering in matches by attacking other wrestlers. Their run got off to a pretty disastrous start when Hooventude smashed in Paul London's face with a botched 450 splash, leading to Vince McMahon outlawing the move and other high-risk maneuvers like the Shooting Star Press. Their matches were also unfortunately underwhelming, and though Guerrero bagged the Cruiserweight title, he alienated himself from the locker room with his characteristically annoying and erratic backstage behavior. Hoovy soon lost the title and was released just six months after the Mexicals' debut, after which Crazy and Psychosis became a more palatable tag team. Number 6. The Truth Commission if I was asked to create the perfect stable, it would almost definitely include Mantar, Bull Buchanan, any one member of the Oddities, and be managed by Don Callis. So why was the Truth Commission so resoundingly rubbish then? Starting life in the Memphis-based USWA territory, the Truth Commission was first managed by an actor Bret Hart had met in South Africa, though he was quickly replaced by the Jackal when the group of militias made its way to WWE TV. Part of 1997's Gang Wars storyline, their presence meant endless matches with the Nation of Domination, DOA, and Los Bariquas, but the Truth Commission didn't have a compelling mission statement, nor the wrestling skill to make up for poor creative. Tank left the stable early on, leaving the interrogator, recon, and sniper to do the heavy lifting. The focus was clearly on making Kurgan a monster heel, and the two were basically bump dummies in green t-shirts and red hats. The matches were boring, the storylines were practically non-existent, and nobody was upset or cared or even noticed when the Truth Commission went away. Number 5. The Social Outcasts Sometimes, stables are simply thrown together to give hard-working but directionless members of the roster something to do. On occasion, this can work out great and lead to career revivals. The Social Outcasts was not one of these occasions. On the first roar of 2016, Heath Slater introduced his newest stable since the dissolution of Three Man Band, revealing a coalition with Bo Dallas, Curtis Axel, and Adam Rose. Every member was a dependable lower mid-card guy that had experienced stop-and-start pushes and had come together to collectively reach for that elusive brass ring. Spoiler! They didn't reach it, but they did have t-shirts with their group name and a hashtag on it, so that's something. The social outcasts did much of nothing, starting as heels before turning babyface and gradually falling apart, starting with Rose's suspension and inevitable release. The group were never going to be world beaters, of course, but their seven-month existence yielded few highlights and failed to significantly elevate anyone involved. 
Just ask that tough enough, idiot. Actually, I take it back. At least we will always have their epic wrap off with Flow Rider. That shiznit was so fire, I was almost sizzic all over my dizzle. Number four, Pretty Mean Sisters. If you thought the MSP were bad, wait until we dive into PMS, another of WWE's stable misfires circa 99. PMS stood for Pretty Mean Sisters, a group of scorned women who targeted the roster's menfolk. Of course, it was all actually an allusion to premenstrual stress, because the man behind the concept, Vince Russo, is nothing if not a feminist. Made up of Terry Runnels, Jacqueline, and in time Ryan Shamrock, the sisters were involved in some of the worst storylines of the Attitude Era during their brief existence, including Terry's faked miscarriage. There would have been worse to come in the form of a Shamrock brother-sister romance had Ken not refused shortly before Ryan was released. By that point, PMS had added the hapless Sean Meat Stasiak as the group's love slave who, in the storyline, got pasted in his matches because he was so knackered after being forced to fulfill the needs of his horny masters. Eventually, Jacqueline got fed up with Terry um, wearing out and mistreating Meat, the tipping point arriving when Runnels forced Stasiak to kiss her foot following a loss to Edge on Sunday Night Heat, signalling the end of the group. A tale as old as time itself. Number 3. The Core The Nexus was a great idea that started well and led to some fantastic television, at least initially. Handled correctly, they could have become one of the greatest stables of all time, and their main members could have easily become main event level stars. Well, Nexus wasn't handled correctly and fizzled out after several months of irredeemable booking. CM Punk took over the reins of the Black and Yellow group, kicking out Barrett, Slater and Gabriel and forming the new Nexus, while the exiled members hooked up with former ECW champion Ezekiel Jackson to form the Core. That's spelled with two R's by the way, so you know they mean business. I can see the sense in trying to give the four of them something to do, but the whole concept of the core, if you can even call it a concept, felt like it was scribbled down on a fast food napkin and handed to Wade and the boys five minutes before their first promo together. Incredibly, the core managed to snatch the Intercontinental and Tag Team titles, but if you want to know how successful they really were, check out their 90 second loss at WrestleMania 27. Number 2. The Union the only union you're likely to ever see in a WWE locker room is the one that was made up of Mankind, Big Show, Ken Shamrock and Test in May of 1999. The union, or to give them their full title, the Union of People You Ought to Respect, Son, aka Up Yours, because it's Vince Russo's world we're living in and everything is a forced pun, were a short-lived offshoot of the corporation. The foursome abandoned the corporation after Shane McMahon wrangled power away from his father and began to treat certain members badly. The union was sort of aligned with other heavy hitters, including Mr. McMahon, Steve Austin, The Rock, and Commissioner Shawn Michaels, and battled the corporate ministry after The Undertaker's satanic outfit merged with Shane's crew. This all led to a union versus corporate ministry eight-man elimination tag match at the ill-fated Over the Edge, which was won by Mankind. Eight days later, Mrs. Foley's baby boy was written off TV in order to get knee surgery. One week after that, Vince McMahon was revealed as the higher power and, with their leader on the shelf and their enemy morphing into a confusing mess, the union turned in their 2 by 4s and went their separate ways. Number 1. Retribution the pandemic era was an unprecedented time for WWE, one of the very few sports or entertainment enterprises that kept running throughout. The lack of a live crowd and absence of key personnel led to some, shall we say, interesting creative choices. Interesting, unfortunately, is not something that the Retribution stable can be accused of being. Like the Nexus before them, Retribution were dismayed at the WWE system and wanted to take it down from within, causing property damage and attacking people at random like a bunch of masked asbos. None of it felt right from the off, with the stable's stupid outfits and slapdash names. Hold on, wasn't one of them called slapdash? No, sorry, slapjack, wasn't it? Yeah, much better. Anyway, as I was saying, their attire, monikers, motivations, it was all positively rotten. 
WWE and the members of Retribution, that's Ali, Mace, T-Bar, Reckoning, Retaliation, and our old pal Slapjack, thank you very much, ought to be thankful this sorry episode took place away from packed arenas, as I would have waged my entire Hasbro collection that it would have died a death in front of them. I mean, don't get me wrong, it still died a death, but at least it was only to the sound of Kevin Dunn's piped-in Thunderdome crowd noise. A wrestler leaving it to the very last moment to kick out of a big move sends electricity down your spine like nothing else, besides making love or so I'm told, and WWE have provided plenty of memorable examples of this over the years. The kick outs that is, not the love making. A lot goes into a good near fall, the move involved, the stakes of the match, the likelihood of it being the actual finish, and these 10 examples all nailed those traits to a T. I'm Adam Pacitti from Oh no, I've gone down! I'm not sure I'm going to be able to do the list! One, two, oh, he's back on his feet! Oh, that was close. But seriously now, I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 best near falls in WWE history. Join us! Number 10, Roman Gets Rumbled at Royal Rumble 2022. The most recent entry on this list occurred when two former brothers collided in the ring. Seth Rollins was taking on his former Shield BFF Roman Reigns for the Tribal Chiefs Universal Championship in the days before the championship had an official name that took about 15 minutes to spit out. Not only are these two men excellent workers, but Rollins had done a great job at getting inside the head of the head of the table. His mind games made him one of the most believable challenges to Reigns in months, which might be why this extraordinary kickout got such a great response. After countering a spear, Rollins then laid out his adversary with a buckle bomb that transitioned directly into a stomp. He then immediately made the cover, but the champion just about got his arm off the mat to prolong the contest. In that one moment, we were all that red-headed fan with the beard. A great moment from a great match. Let's choose to focus on this instead of that dumb DQ that came right at the end. We'll all be happier for it. Number 9, Beauty from the Beast at Survivor Series 2018. Brock Lesnar is one of the best kick-outers in all of wrestling. Okay, let me rephrase that, actually. Brock Lesnar is one of the best kick-outers in all of wrestling when he can be bothered. There, that's better. He was most definitely bothered against Daniel Bryan in their champion versus champion match at Survivor Series 2018. Bryan had just won the WWE title by hoofing AJ Styles in the plums, setting up a rather intriguing heel versus heel match for the event. Lesnar showed his dominance during the battle, except for one moment where it looked like WWE might just have chosen the upset. After the referee went down, Bryan went to the well once again and planted Lesnar right in his next big things, which he followed up with a running knee. But this wasn't enough to put Brock down, as the Beast kicked out at the last Last possible millisecond. D. Bry had the credibility to realistically beat Lesnar, especially if he had cheated to do so. Also, a big win over the Universal Champion would have been a great way to cement his recent heel turn. Better luck next time, Dragon. Number 8, Santino at Elimination Chamber 2012. Six or so years before he nearly floored the streak breaker, Daniel Bryan was almost beaten himself by a very unlikely candidate. As the final pay per view before wrestling, WrestleMania 28, Elimination Chamber offered one last chance for somebody to beat Bryan and carry the World Heavyweight title into the big event. The champ was defending against five other men inside the titular structure, where the match came down to himself and longtime comedy jobber Santino Morella. In a moment nobody saw coming, Santino pulled out his trusty Cobra and struck Bryan with it. Up to this point, nobody had ever kicked out of the Cobra. Surely, even even WWE weren't mad enough to have Santino go into WrestleMania as world champ. And they weren't. In the end, they didn't pull the trigger on Santino, but you would be lying if you said that you didn't buy into this finish, even if just for a split second. In an utterly baffling statistic, Bryan remains the only person in the history of WWE to be shown kicking out of Santino's finishing move. Number 7, HBK's gold medal kick out at WrestleMania 21. Honestly, we could have filled this list entirely with moments from the grandest stage of them all, but 
but that is a different list for a different day. So instead, we cherry-picked just a few of the greatest false finishes from across WrestleMania's illustrious history, starting with this gem from Mania 21. In one of the greatest Mania matches of all time, Shawn Michaels took on Kurt Angle in a battle of style versus substance. Sports entertainment versus pro wrestling, milk versus whatever the hell Shawn was putting into his body in the late 90s. Just one of the highlights of this epic encounter came when Michaels ascended to the top rope and quick as a flash, Angle jumped up behind him, caught HBK in an angle slam position and dropped the showstopper all the way to the mat below. This had to be the finish, right? Wrong, you bloody mark. At the last possible second, Michaels powered out of the super move, leaving everybody in a state of shock. Kicking out of a finisher is one thing, but a top rope finisher? Beautiful madness. Number six, Jack fights back at Royal Rumble 2000. During Triple H's early days as a main eventer, he could have hit a bloody T-Rex with a pedigree and it would have stayed down for a three count. The move was protected as all hell, despite the Ultimate Warrior's best efforts a few years earlier, which is why it was truly special to see Mick Foley overcome it at the 2000 Royal Rumble. As part of their legendary street fight, Foley as Cactus Jack was laid out with the game's finisher right after eating a back body drop onto some thumbtacks. Then, just as it looked like the end, Jack somehow denied trips the victory as the Madison Square Garden crowd went bonkers. He did then eat a pedigree face first into a bunch of tacks, so maybe he should have just stayed down. But still, not only did this make Foley look like a beast, but it also made Triple H even more of a heel for resorting to such fiendish tactics to put his opponents away. This was a fantastic moment that was beloved by everyone. Well, besides Mick's wife anyway. She probably wanted it to end as quickly as possible. Fair play. Number five, Cena finds his edge at New Year's Revolution 2006. Though it's part of the furniture nowadays, there was a time where people weren't so sure about this whole money in the bank thing and how it would work out. Thankfully though, the first cash-in was so good that everybody's fears just went away. John Cena successfully retained his WWE Championship in a bloody and brutal elimination chamber match at New Year's Revolution 2006. Unfortunately for Big Match John, the celebrations didn't last long, as who should come out but briefcase holder Edge. After Mr. McMahon explained what was going on like he was some sort of tutorial in a video game, Edge cashed in for the first time ever and we had ourselves a world title match. Cena was an exhausted mess who had just outlasted five other competitors in a brutal match. Surely he would fall to the very first spear Edge hit him with. Well, clearly you don't know your Cena. The champ somehow kicked out of the initial attack, adding a great layer of uncertainty to the moment. Had Edge just made a huge mistake? Should he have waited for another moment? Was he going to... Oh, wait, he's just hit another spear and won. Fantastic stuff. Number four, punked out at Money in the Bank 2011. Sticking with Johnny Boy for now, and that time an entire city was desperate to see him lose. Actually, that probably happened a lot of times through Cena's run, but we are talking about Chicago in this particular instance. The now iconic main event of Money in the Bank 2011 pitted WWE Champion John Cena against challenger and all-round naughty boy CM Punk. The Straight Edge Superstar's contract was up at midnight, meaning that if he won, he would be taking the WWE title with him. This was WWE's chance to do something genuinely interesting for the first time in a while, so naturally fans were nervous that Cena was just going to win and sweep the whole thing under the rug. So imagine how frightened everyone was then when the champ hoisted Punk up on his shoulders and hit a second AA. Thankfully, the wrestling gods were smiling down on us that day because the hometown hero managed to escape defeat right at the final moment. Not only is it a perfectly executed near fall, but the reaction from the nuclear crowd was loud enough to be heard from space. Number three, kicking out with Styles at SummerSlam 2016. The third installment in our accidental trilogy of John Cena moments took place at the 2016 edition of SummerSlam. Cena had been embroiled in a dream feud with AJ Styles, and the pair were tied up at one victory apiece. Now was the time to settle the score once and for all. Wow, that was dramatic. Should do movie trailers. Much like with Punk five years earlier, fans were desperate to see AJ win. A loss to Cena on such a huge stage had the potential to do much damage to the former TNA man and ruin what had been a pretty decent run in the promotion up to that 
that point. Knowing that they had the audience in the palm of their hands, WWE decided to muck around with our collective emotions by having Cena hit Styles with a top rope AA. Right, that's it. Match is over. Everybody burn your AJ Styles t-shirts and oh my god, he just kicked out! The incredible nature of this near fall, combined with Cena's prolonged reaction to it, transformed this entire match into an instant classic. Oh, and guess what? AJ actually won the whole thing. Clean too. Sometimes dreams do come true. Number two, that Undertaker face at WrestleMania 25. Like with Money in the Bank 2011, I really don't need to talk about Shawn Michaels versus The Undertaker from WrestleMania 25 any more than I already have. It is, of course, widely regarded as one of the best matches of all time, and yeah, it bloody well should be. There's only so many more times I can talk about Sim Snooker letting The Undertaker almost plant himself into the earth like a tree. But what I can talk about is one of the finest near falls in the history of our great sport. As HBK tried to skin the cat to get back in the ring, Taker took advantage and got him in position for a tombstone. He hit the move, crossed Sean's arms, but that still wasn't enough for a three. The setup to this moment, HBK's selling of it, and the overall quality of the match all helped make this moment special, but what really takes it over the edge is the classic face that Undertaker pulled right after it. His look of seriously, are you kidding me, exemplifies just how incredible this moment was and will live on in meme form for the rest of time. Number one, the streak lives at WrestleMania 28. The end of an era Hell in a Cell match between Triple H and The Undertaker at WrestleMania 28 was the culmination of a four year long story between the dead man and DX. Not only was this the sequel to Trips vs Taker from the year before, but it also tied up the Taker Michaels matches from the years before that as HBK was the special guest ref. I'm sure he'll remain perfectly impartial toward the man who cost him his career, eh? In a moment so obvious a fetus could have predicted it, Michaels sided with the game and tried to help him beat the phenom. Triple H countered a tombstone by pushing Taker right into the path of Sweet Chin Music. He then hit the pedigree to surely seal the deal and finally bring the mighty streak to an end. And then The Undertaker kicked out. Even with help from his best friend, even with two separate finishes, as Triple H couldn't put his nemesis away. For capturing so much emotion and history within the space of about 10 seconds, this has to be the best near fall in the history of WWE and maybe even wrestling as a whole. You've gotta be kidding me! So shouted the late great TNA color commentator Don West whenever something mental went down in the impact zone. He often had good cause to flex his vocal cords when it came to some of the outrageous spots TNA's stars would unleash. Whether it was in six sides or four sides, TNA's finest pushed the limits in an effort to get the wrestling world talking. So let's talk about them, shall we? I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 most insane spots in TNA history. Join us. Number 10, Mind the Gap. AJ Styles had a habit of stealing just about every match he was in, regardless of how many people were in it or what the stipulation was. So when it came to Lethal Lockdown, TNA's answer to war games, it didn't really matter that the phenomenal one was confined to a cage or that he would have to share the spotlight with seven of his co-workers. He had taken bumps off the side of the steel, had delivered a big splash off a support beam and threw a table on top of it, and most spectacularly of all, he had even jumped through the hole in the top of it. In 2009's iteration of the event, Styles literally ran and jumped through a gap not much bigger than himself to take out the trio of Kurt Angle, Booker T and Scott Steiner, kissing the edge of it on the way down. However, the main event Mafia men did such a piss poor job of breaking AJ's fall that he basically took the brunt of it whilst they clumsily fell over. Number 9, Dreamer's Nightmare When TNA got in on the act and ran their own ECW tribute show without actually calling it ECW or using the word extreme in any way, lest WWE's ace lawyer Jerry McDevitt send a small army of attorneys to Dixie Carter's house, there was every expectation that things would get a little nutty. 
Not every match at Hardcore Justice was a gore fest, but Eternal Enemies Tommy Dreamer and Raven were determined to bring a slice of blood-soaked Philadelphia violence to Orlando. With Mick Foley serving as special guest referee, Dreamer and Raven sought to emulate Foley's notorious 1999 Royal Rumble I Quit match with The Rock in the worst possible way. Handcuffing the innovator of violence's hands behind his back, Raven swung a chair at his rival's head. Thankfully, it was just the once and not the 1087 the Great One gave to Mrs. Foley's baby boy over a decade before, but this was ill-advised to say the least. With everything we had learned about the dangers of head trauma since the summer of 2007, you would think these veterans would know better than to tempt a concussion. Number 8. Angle's Lockdown Moonsault Kurt Angle has often said that though most fans will always remember him based on his WWE career, he actually had some of his greatest matches and moments while under TNA's employ. It's true, it's damn true, that the Olympic gold medalist gave his all for the promotion and never put in a performance that felt like he was phoning it in. Angle was all too happy to push the envelope inside and outside of the squared circle if it helped his matches too, and it wasn't an unfamiliar sight to see him perform diving flips off the stage and other high-risk stunts. One of his riskiest was actually a repeat of something he had tried in WWE nine years prior. At the culmination of his outstanding cage match with Ken Anderson at Lockdown 2010, Kurt laid his opponent out with a top rope German suplex before positioning him near the corner and beginning the big climb. Crossing his heart before using those mighty thighs to jump even higher in the air, the wrestling machine came crashing down with one of the damnedest moonsaults you're likely to see anywhere. The bean had well and truly kicked in. Number 7. A Phenomenal Cell Job The undisputed MVP of Golden Era TNA was AJ Styles. Present from the very first show, the inaugural X Division champion routinely put his physical well-being at stake in order to create memorable matches and moments. Some of the most memorable bouts from early TNA were of the inventive Ultimate X variety, with multiple stars aiming to retrieve the prize from the middle of the crisscrossed cables suspended above the ring. One of the very best of the bunch was the X Division title affair between Styles, Chris Sabin, and reigning champion Petey Williams at Final Resolution 2005. In a match full of breathtaking moves, spots, and sequences, one stood out above the rest. As the phenomenal one was shimmying his way across to grab the belt, Sabin surprised him with a springboard missile dropkick to the midsection. Now, there are numerous ways to sell such a move, landing on your back, landing on your front, landing on your feet, and buckling while holding your ouchy tummy, but AJ opted for the spectacular and turned himself inside out with an incredibly risky inward flip. A one-time deal that hasn't been replicated since, there was such a fine margin for error, but he pulled it off with styles. Number 6. Hardy's Monstrous Swanton If there is a platform, ledge, ladder, or well, anything within climbing distance, Jeff Hardy will find a way to do a swanton bomb off it. We saw him do it countless times in WWE, and he brought the act with him when he joined TNA. In 2005 alone, the charismatic Enigma performed the feat off the top of a cage through a table, off the impact set, and off some beams backstage, but he saved his best and most insane leap for TNA's biggest show of the year. Competing with Sabu, Abyss, and Rhino in a Monsters Ball match at Bound for Glory, Hardy pulled out all the stops in his bid to steal the show and ensure a lifetime of lower back pain. Placing Abyss on a table on the concrete floor of the Impact Zone, Jeff went to the very top of the set and flew a solid 15 or so feet, clearing the ramp and the Monsters manager, Father Mitchell, crashing with an almighty thud. Good night. Well, actually, not good night, because the poor bloke had to crawl his way to the ring for the finish, a comparatively harmless second rope pile driver from the Man Beast. Number 5. The Falling Angel And once again, we go to the potential death trap that is Ultimate X. When you think about what this match actually entails, climbing huge steel support columns to crisscrossing ropes that you'll then have to pull yourself across, inevitably either falling or more likely being knocked off them from a considerable height, it's a minor miracle that there haven't been more injuries associated with the gimmick. But that's not to say there haven't been some close calls. 
X Division mainstay Christopher Daniels came close to having his career ended when he and the lamentably named Suicide, portrayed here by Frankie Kazarian, took a terrifying plunge from the middle of the X at Bound for Glory 2009. According to Daniels, the idea was he would hit a flatliner while they were both up there, but his legs got tangled up and the two of them ended up hurling awkwardly towards the ring. The fallen angel came frighteningly close to spiking right on top of his head, something that would have no doubt put an end to his wrestling days, if not worse. When he got backstage, Daniels was confronted by an angry Samoa Joe, who warned him to never do anything like that again. I don't think he really needed the don't almost die advice, Joe, but it's nice of you to look out for your mace. Number 4. Abyss Plays With Fire Along with AJ Styles, another TNA mainstay who did everything he could to help the company was Abyss. The monster was more than willing to suffer for the cause and made his eagerness to take a pounding one of his calling cards. Whether it was tables, chairs, tacks, or barbed wire, the big man was in his comfort zone working with plunder. Fire, on the other hand, is a bit of a different beast altogether. Teaming with Matt Morgan to challenge beer money for the tag team titles in a monster's ball match, also featuring Team 3D and LAX at 2008's Bound for Glory, Abyss found out firsthand just how unpredictable fire could be when Brother Ray and Brother Devon gave him a choke slam off the stage through a flaming table. Now, the Dudleys, sorry, Team 3D, had done similar spots in the past, but this time the bump itself didn't quite extinguish the flames. On the contrary, Abyss's boiler suit was momentarily set ablaze and it took a couple of tries with a nearby extinguisher to finally put the flames out. Now that's what I call the wrong kind of heat. Number 3. Kaz's Ultimate Cutter Back to Ultimate X now, and if AJ's inward flip from earlier had a very fine margin of error, then the margins on this one were thinner than Brother Runt on a hunger strike. Kicking off 2007's Victory Road pay-per-view was an Ultimate X gauntlet match featuring Christopher Daniels, Homicide, Senshi, Jay Lethal, Frankie Kazarian, Petey Williams, Puma, Sonjay Dutt, Elix Skipper, and Shark Boy. The rules of the match saw wrestlers enter the fray at timed intervals, with eliminations occurring when someone was thrown over the top rope to the floor. The competitors left after the entire field had entered were then eligible to climb up for the Giant X. With a shot at the X Division title on the line, the 10 men reached deep into their bag of tricks, and the insanity peaked about five minutes from the finish with the sickest cutter you are likely ever going to see. Daniels was hanging upside down from the Trust when Kaz jumped forward off the top rope and caught the fallen angel perfectly with the move. So much could have gone wrong here, as Daniels and Kaz nearly found out two years later. Number 2. Samoa Joe's Flying Stairs Kick If Samoa Joe decided to never leave his feet, nobody would bat an eyelid. Joe could have been the type of wrestler who rarely gets knocked down, but the surprisingly agile super heavyweight was a big bumping big man and had no qualms about getting picked up and thrown around. He was also game for flying down a flight of stairs and landing on jagged concrete if it meant connecting with a kick. Defending his TNA world title against Sting in the main event of Bound for Glory 2008, the Samoan submission machine had to call an audible when the two were fighting in the crowd at the Sears Center in Illinois. What was supposed to be a relatively simple flying forearm was modified into this ludicrous two-footer because Sting had moved further down the stairs than he was supposed to be. I mean, I think my audible would have simply involved walking down the stairs, but I guess that's why he's Samoa Joe and I'm not. Anyway, the bump looked like like it could have been a career ender and rumors persisted for years that Joe was forced to modify his style after it, but he has since dispelled that as a mere myth. Nutter. Number 1. Elix Skipper's Cage Walk Rana Placed above the title matches and Macho Man Randy Savage's final match ever at Turning Point 2004 was the Six Sides of Steel grudge match between America's Most Wanted and Triple X. And with good reason, because not only was it a genuinely great match and a worthy sequel to one they had had on an Asylum-era weekly pay-per-view 18 months earlier, but it also featured one of the most astonishing spots in wrestling history. With Christopher Daniels holding Chris Harris in place, Elix Skipper stood on top of the perilously thin steel panel and proceeded to walk the length of it before hitting the Wildcat with a picture-perfect Hurricane Rana to the mat below. I mean, how? 
Just how? Prime Time had actually done his tightrope act on the actual ropes before, but never in these circumstances. He had actually wanted to try it in their previous cage match, but was put off due to the heat in the building causing extra perspiration and sensibly predicting that one errant slip could well be the end of him. On this night, however, it was perfect and will rightfully live on the highlight reel for eternity. As the old saying goes, home is where the heart is. Or in my case, home is where all the people who saw me wet myself in year seven are. Still can't show my face in the ride, weather spoons. Anyway, for most people, a homecoming is something to be celebrated, especially when you're a wrestler. Audiences love to cheer for their local heroes, even when they're not supposed to. See MJF and Long Island for reference. WWE may have gone through a weird phase of habitually booking people to lose in their hometowns, but that has hasn't stopped some of the greatest wrestlers of all time from getting monster ovations when returning to their roots. Before we start, one honorable mention here, and it's a big one. Bad Bunny at Backlash 2023. We wanted to focus on proper full-time wrestlers in this list, but given the reaction Mr. Bunny received in Puerto Rico, not to mention the performance he put on, it would be a travesty not to mention him. Mad props. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 biggest hometown pops in WWE history. Join us. Number 10, Daniel Bryan on Raw. In the build-up to the match that would unify the WWE and World Heavyweight Championships, WWE decided to host a segment featuring some of the men who have held these historic belts. Unfortunately, they decided to host the segment in Seattle, Washington, during the height of Daniel Bryan's popularity. Brian, who was from nearby Aberdeen, was one of the men in the ring while Triple H droned on about the importance of the upcoming match. Did the fans care? Did they balls? They just wanted to do the yes chant. Despite several attempts to shut the raucous audience down, including an ill-fated hand raise from Mark Henry, the Washington mob were not going to be stopped. They relentlessly cheered the underdog hero, bringing this entire segment to a standstill. It speaks to WWE's total ignorance of Brian's popularity at the time that they would put him out in front of his hometown fans and expect them to stay quiet. The best part of this whole thing is D. Bry's own reactions. The American Dragon clearly loved every single second of this, openly smiling and laughing every time the crowd got behind him. Number 9. Ric Flair on Raw At Survivor Series 2001, Team WWF defeated Team Alliance to win back control of the company and bring a close to one of the greatest storylines in the history of wrestling. Or at least it should have been one of the greatest storylines in the history of wrestling. Anyway, the next night on Raw, a victorious Vince McMahon was all set to strip Steve Austin of the world title and award it to Kurt Angle. Before this could pass, though, he was interrupted by the sound of a rather familiar piece of music. Had Kevin Dunn accidentally hit play on the 2001 A Space Odyssey soundtrack? No, no, no. This was Ric Flair making his first WWE appearance in over eight years in front of his hometown crowd of Charlotte, North Carolina. Though he wasn't actually born there, we all know that North Carolina has become somewhat of a second home for the nature boy. The state is regularly referred to as Flair Country, and Rick's daughter even took this city as her ring name when she joined the business. The fans went wild for their adopted son, welcoming him back to the Fed with open arms. As for Vince, well, let's just say he was less than thrilled. Number 8. John Cena at Survivor Series 2008 To call John Cena a divisive figure is like calling the sky blue, water wet, and his appearance in Fred the Movie a strange career choice. To young kids, he was a superhero with ungodly strength and determination. To anyone who no longer has their baby teeth, he was a despised corporate shill who was being pushed on them against their will. Years of let's go Cena, Cena sucks chants proved that there remained a split opinion on the man, but his return to the ring in Boston, Massachusetts at Survivor Series 2008 proved that he did still have fans out there. Big Match John grew up in West Newbury, 34 miles north of Boston. Clearly there was enough hometown love in the air that night as the very high-pitched crowd overwhelmingly cheered for Cena when he beat Y2J. Although, if you listen closely enough, you can hear the sounds of men in their 30s preparing what they were going to write online when they got home. Number 7. Edge at Unforgiven 2006 
Two years before his hometown crowd got behind him, John Cena was facing off against a man who was very much the local celebrity. Born in Orangeville, Ontario, Edge spent many of his younger years in the Toronto area of Canada. So when Unforgiven 2006 rolled into town and Edge was the WWE champion, you can imagine what sort of response he got. Even though he was the fiendish heel, Edge was still received like a hero upon his return to the Great White North. You can even hear the roar of the crowd over his incredibly loud entrance theme. Did WWE turn the theme music up or the crowd noise down? You decide. Sadly, this support did the rated R superstar no favors, as Cena beat him to win back his beloved spinner belt. In fact, not only did he beat him, but he gave him an AA off a ladder through a stack of tables. Hopefully Edge was still registered at the local hospital, or sorry, I mean local medical facility. Ah well, at least he got a good reception, eh, before he was flung about 10 feet to his demise. Nice. Number 6. Shawn Michaels at Royal Rumble 1997 Although he was billed from San Antonio, Texas, Shawn Michaels actually grew up in multiple different places. He was born in Arizona and even spent some time in the English town of Reading, which is a bit weird, isn't it? This was because his father was in the military, presumably taking down baddies with super kicks across the world. HBK did spend the majority of his youth in San Antonio, hence why it became his kayfabe home. This also meant meant that when he competed in the city at the 1997 Royal Rumble, the audience treated him like a god amongst men. Not only was Michaels the sole wrestler on the poster for this event, but his WWE Championship match with Psycho Sid actually main evented the show over the Rumble match itself. I'm sure Bret Hart was fine with that decision. In the end, this proved to be the right decision as the crowd went bonkers for the showstopper's big win. Now all that was left for him to do was have a rematch with the hitman at WrestleMania 13 and dropped the title back to him. Wait, what do you mean, lost his smile? What does that even mean? Number 5. Taz at Royal Rumble 2000 Royal Rumble 2000 wasn't just home to one of the best sets in pay-per-view history, but also featured a kick-ass debut from an ECW legend. Kurt Angle came out to issue an open challenge to anyone in the back. As the Madison Square Garden crowd watched on with bated breath, the sound of a heart monitor filled the air. Out came the recently signed Taz, former ECW champion, future commentary legend, and childhood resident of the Red Hook District of Brooklyn, New York. And before you New Yorkers come at us in the comments, we know that MSG is in a different borough. It's obviously in Staten Island. Everyone knows that. The human suplex machine emerged to a thunderous ovation from the crowd, despite the fact that everyone and their mother knew that he was going to be Angle's surprise opponent. The rabid fans kept the excitement level up for the whole match, which ended with Taz choking out the gold medalist to end his undefeated streak in emphatic fashion. And then Taz went on to have a great WWE in-ring career, winning multiple championships as Tazamania ran wild. At least, in my head he did. Number 4. Kurt Angle at Unforgiven 2001 The Olympic hero got his own dose of hometown glory when he challenged Stone Cold Steve Austin for the WWE Championship at Unforgiven 2001. We were deep into the Invasion storyline at this point, and Austin had been the top heel champion for the past 175 days. He might have reigned for even longer had a certain tragic world-changing event not taken place just two weeks earlier. The 9-11 terrorist attacks shocked the world and sent the USA into a state of uncertainty and fear. WWE wanted to create a feel-good moment to help the nation heal, and it just so happened that their up coming pay-per-view was being held in the birthplace of one of their most patriotic characters. Unforgiven was emanating from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, close to where Angle was born. In the night's final match, Angle tapped Austin out to win the belt to an enormous reaction from the city of brotherly love before celebrating with his assembled friends and family. A great homecoming for Angle and a brief bit of respite in one of the bleakest periods of America's recent history. Number 3. Sammy Zayn at Elimination Chamber 2023 WWE went through a weird phase in the 2010s of having stars lose big matches on home soil. It's almost as if the company was going against the idea of hometown support, which is baffling but not exactly out of character for Vince McMahon. Thankfully, WWE proved that they were still interested in pushing performers in front of their friends and neighbors as we saw at the 2023 Elimination Chamber event. This was the night that saw the culmination of months 
months of storyline between Roman Reigns and Sami Zayn. The scruffy-haired grappler had been taken on as an honorary member of the Bloodline, slowly winning over each individual member before eventually signing with Kevin Owens at the Royal Rumble. Zayn's involvement in this feud led to him getting massively over, and so when he was put in front of a crowd in Montreal, Quebec, Canada, the place went ballistic. The star was born in a suburb of Montreal, effectively making this a hometown crowd. They were at fever pitch throughout his world title match with Reigns, constantly on the edge over the thought that their boy could win the big one. He didn't, naturally, but sometimes it's the thought that counts. Number 2. The Hart Foundation at In Your House 16 Canadian Stampede Staying north of the border as we travel back to 1997 and one of the best top-to-bottom WWE cards in history. The main event of Canadian Stampede was a massive match, and not just because it had 10 people in it. On one side was Stone Cold Steve Austin, Gold Dust, Ken Shamrock, and the Legion of Doom. As for the other team, that was comprised of Bret Hart, Owen Hart, Jim Neidhart, the British Bulldog, and Brian Pillman, aka the Hart Foundation. The Hearts were essentially Canada personified at this point, despite being massive heels in the US. Take into consideration that this pay-per-view was coming from Calgary, Alberta, the hometown of Bret and Owen, and where their father Stu ran a successful wrestling promotion for many years, and the reaction was otherworldly. The crowd went nuclear when the foundation made its entrance and that energy didn't dissipate throughout the entire match. Seriously, there are points during this bout where the crowd are cheering so loudly you can see the cameras shaking. The Hearts really are the first family of Canadian wrestling, and you only need to watch this match if you want proof. Number 1. CM Punk at Money in the Bank 2011 CM Punk vs John Cena from Money in the Bank 2011 got 5 stars from Dave Meltzer, and to be honest, at least a star and a half of that is because of the crowd. Here is the story. Punk challenges Cena for the belt, but his contract expires on the night of the show. Punk presents himself as the perfect anti-corporate hero, challenging everything Cena and the WWE at large stand for. Also, Money in the Bank is taking place in Chicago. CM Punk's birthplace and a city where he is worshipped as a minor deity. All of this led to a monstrous ovation for the Straight Edge Superstar when he came out for his main event match. Not only would a win for Punk be a win for Chi Town, but it would also be a win for everyone who was sick to death of WWE's PG nonsense. Put simply, the atmosphere at Money in the Bank was incredible, with the fans leaning into everything the match threw at them. Sometimes, wrestling creates the perfect storm of time and place, and something magical happens as a result. And there was definitely some magic in the air on this night in the Windy City. Seth Rollins has gotten off to a pretty damn good start as WWE World Heavyweight Champion, though he will need to keep it going if he's going to want to find himself alongside this lot. These are the wrestling champions that took the ball and immediately started sprinting with it, giving their prized possession credibility from the get-go. That credibility didn't always last, sure, but the efforts of the following performers certainly can't be blamed for that. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 best inaugural champions in wrestling history. Join us! Number 10, Buddy Rogers, WWE Champion, then WWWF Champion. In 1963, after Vince McMahon Sr. and his business partner Toots Mon decided to leave the National Wrestling Alliance, they needed a new world champion. They settled on Buddy Rogers, who held the belt for just 36 days before dropping it to Bruno Sammartino. You might think that the wise choice would have been to have just put the belt straight on the Italian Stallion, but you would be wrong. Rogers was a megastar at the time, one of the first heels to incorporate flashy looks and an obnoxious personality into their character. He had recently held the NWA World's Heavyweight Championship and had drawn record-setting amounts of money for the company. McMahon and Mons wanted some of that sweet, sweet dough. Had it not been for a mild heart attack that cut his career short, Rogers may well have reigned for much longer. In the end, though, he proved to be just what the company needed, a respected veteran who added serious legitimacy to the new promotion and kept the seat warm for their homegrown talent to swoop in and carry the torch. I mixed a whole bunch of metaphors there, but you get the idea. Number 9. The British Bulldog WWF European Champion 
At SummerSlam 1992, the British Bulldog defeated his brother-in-law Bret Hart to win the Intercontinental Championship in front of a ravenous crowd of his fellow Brits. Five years later, Vince thought, I wonder if we'll get the same result if we apply that logic to the whole of Europe. The end result of this experiment was a tournament final match between Davy Boy and another of his brother-in-laws, Owen Hart, to crown the first ever European champion. Bulldog had beaten both Mankind and Vader to get to the final and overcame the Rockies in a great match to proudly represent the continent as its champion. He would hold the gold for 206 days, the longest single reign in the belt's entire history. This reign helped establish the title as part of WWE's furniture, helping it achieve the cult status it retains to this very day. He would eventually drop the title to Shawn Michaels, although the less said about that whole deal, the better. Let's just say that Shawn was a very naughty boy. Thanks to the Bulldog, the championship then went on to be held by several other famous European wrestlers, such as Eddie Guerrero and Triple H and D'Lo Brown. Right. Number 8. Seth Rollins, NXT Champion In 2012, WWE remembered that they weren't a game show company and rebranded the god-awful original version of NXT into the developmental brand that we know and love today. To crown the first ever NXT Champion, the Gold Rush Tournament was put together, featuring some of the best performers from the old farm system Florida Championship Wrestling. These included Drew McIntyre, Bo Dallas, Curtis Axel, and eventual winner Seth Rollins. Rollins defeated Jinder Mahal in the tournament final on the August 29th episode of NXT. He ruled the roost for 133 days, eventually dropping the belt to Big E. The new NXT sent out a strong mission statement by making Rollins their first champ. This was a brand where the top stars were technically sound wrestling machines with indie credentials, an ethos that has largely been present in the promotion ever since. Well, you know, except for the 2.0 years. Number 7. AJ Styles TNA X Division Champion When you think of the Impact or TNA X Division Championship, what do you picture? And please don't say that match where the Ultimate X kept falling down. The serious answer is a belt that promoted a more spectacular, high-risk, high-flying form of wrestling, one where technical ability and outrageous stunts were valued over sheer size and bulk. And what better wrestler to encapsulate all of that than the phenomenal one AJ Styles? On TNA's second ever weekly pay-per-view, yes, they used to run weekly pay-per-views, those mad lads, Styles defeated Jerry Lynn, Psychosis, and Loki to become the brand new X Division Champion. This was a double elimination match, and if anyone could explain to me how that works, then they will get a cookie. Styles would hold the belt for just 49 days before dropping it to Loki, but would win it a total of six times across his career. In his time with the company, the future WWE Champion was seen as one of the faces of the X Division, so it was only fitting that he be the first person to represent it as champion. Number 6. Tyler Bates, WWE UK Champion In January of 2017, WWE held a tournament to crown a new United Kingdom champion that was in no way influenced by the rise in popularity of British indie wrestling. I'm not bitter, you're bitter. The 16-man bracket played out over two nights and featured some of the best talent the UK scene had to offer. Trent Seven, Wolfgang, Joseph Connors, Mark Andrews, and a finger-snapping deviant named Pete Dunn, who I am straight up refusing to refer to as Butch here. Dunn made it all the way to the final, impressing with his deep skill set and menacing attitude. He would have won the whole bloody thing were it not for a plucky teenager from Dudley. 19-year-old Tyler Bate had also gotten madly over during the tournament, playing the earnest babyface role to perfection. A kayfabe-injured Bate managed to overcome Dunn in this hard-fought finale, winning the tournament and the title in the process. Bate's incredible performance in this tournament made him a star overnight and attracted plenty of attention to this burgeoning division. Also, this win made him the youngest singles champion in WWE history, meaning that he's achieved more in his short life than I ever will in mine. Ugh. Number 5. Chris Jericho, AEW World Champion When starting a new wrestling promotion, choosing who to have as top champion is one of the most important decisions a booker needs to make. AEW were faced with this problem ahead of their first all-out pay-per-view back in 2019. Their choices were the young upstart Hangman Adam Page or the 48-year-old ex-WWE guy Chris Jericho. Spoiler, the cowboy didn't win. 
Some people had major doubts over Jericho being the first AEW champion. Would putting the belt on him make the company seem like they were just trying to imitate their competition? Would Y2J's age work against him? Thankfully, the answer to both of those questions was no. Jericho was wonderful as title holder thanks to yet another career reinvention. As Le Champion, he walked the line perfectly between delusional comedy heel and genuine threat. He put on a great match with Cody Rhodes at full gear before handing over the belt to Jon Moxley at Revolution at the peak of the ex-Shield man's popularity. This inaugural reign was vital in establishing AEW as the new major force in pro wrestling, and we think that deserves a little bit of the bubbly. I'm never going to stop saying it. Number 4. Kurt Angle and Chris Benoit, WWE Tag Team Champions When the SmackDown writers put Heath Slater and Rhino together in 2016, chances are that they were at least partially inspired by this unlikely duo from 14 years earlier. During the original brand split, SmackDown was also left without a set of tag team titles. To counter the World Tag Team Championships on Raw, the Blue Show created a set of belts with a wonderfully original name, the WWE Tag Team Championships. Hey, does what it says on the tin. A tournament was held for these titles, culminating at No Mercy 2002. The two warring sides were made up of Edge and Rey Mysterio and the odd couple pairing of Chris Benoit and Kurt Angle, both of whom existed in a sort of weird tweener area at the time. The two had been put together for the purposes of this tournament, which led to weeks of hilarious segments where they tried and failed to get along. Despite their differences, the two were predictably dynamite in the ring together, as demonstrated in this awesome match. Angle and Benoit were victorious in what some people call the best WWE tag match ever. This nicely drew a line under their story and crowned a set of very talented tag team champions at the same time. Number 3. Antonio Inoki, IWGP Heavyweight Champion As well as having a chin that could break a diamond in half, Antonio Inoki was one of the most important and influential wrestlers of the last century. A legend in his native Japan, Inoki's lasting legacy is still felt today, as he was the man who founded New Japan Pro Wrestling in 1972. In 1987, when the company was looking to crown their first ever IWGP Heavyweight Champion, Inoki made the selfless decision decision to award the belt to himself. What a guy. To give him some credit, Inoki was easily the top star in the company. His victory over Masa Saito in a tournament final to win the belt was greeted with huge adulation, which helped sustain his run on top for the better part of a year. Inoki was finally unseated after 325 days and would never regain the title he helped to solidify. The belt would exist until 2021 when it was converted into the stupid looking IWGP World Heavyweight Championship. I cannot believe they got rid of this beautiful beautiful belt. So many great wrestlers held the IWGP Heavyweight Championship during its existence, and they all owe the late Mr. Inoki a very large debt for setting the tone. Number 2. Adam Cole, NXT North American Champion NXT TakeOver New Orleans in 2018 opened with one hell of a match. Six competitors fought in a hellacious ladder match for the right to call themselves the very first NXT North American Champion. To be fair, I would put myself through a table to get my hands on that gorgeous looking thing. So much better than the new IWGP Championship. I, all right, I'll stop going on about that now. The ladder match is still one of the best contests in the history of the brand, with far too many amazing spots to go over here. In the end, the winner of this absolute war was the leader of the Undisputed Era, Adam Cole, baby! Cole was easily one of the most popular performers in the whole company, even if he was a detestable heel. Fans were elated to see him win his first singles title in WWE, especially off the back of such an incredible match. For the next 133 days, Cole reigned with the beautiful strap before dropping it to Ricochet in another banger at TakeOver Brooklyn 4. A lengthy reign packed full of great matches with two excellent bouts to begin and end it. Can't argue with that, really. Go on, try. Number 1. Kenny Omega, IWGP United States Heavyweight Champion in 2017, New Japan Pro Wrestling was gaining serious momentum outside of its native land. Attempting to expand further into America, the company created the IWGP United States Heavyweight Championship and awarded it to Kenny Omega, who is from Canada. Whoops! 
In all seriousness, Omega and the rest of Bullet Club were a huge factor in New Japan's worldwide boost in popularity, so putting the title on him was an easy choice even if he did hail from a few hundred miles north of the belt's namesake nation. Omega defeated Tomohiro Ishii in Long Beach, California to win the title and would reign with the star-spangled belt buckle for the next 210 days. In that time, he would retain over the likes of Juice Robinson and Trent Beretta, as well as over Chris Jericho in their famous match from Wrestle Kingdom 12. For his excellent matches as champion and his role as foreign ambassador for New Japan, Kenny Omega deserves all the applause for his time as the first IWGP United States Heavyweight Champion. Also, why couldn't New Japan make the world title look as good as this? Okay, I really am done now. Thanks for watching. Whilst they're not usually as dramatic as heel turns, face turns are still an important part of wrestling's DNA. WWE's main roster has Batista chucking Triple H through a table, Hulk Hogan turning on the New World Order at WrestleMania 18, and Sami Zayn thwacking Roman Reigns in the back with a chair, as well as many other iconic babyface turns. But what about WWE's developmental system? What are some of their finest instances of bad guys gone good? Funny you should ask, I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 biggest face turns in NXT history. Join us! Number 10. Timothy Thatcher Despite sounding like the quaintest, most English man of all time, Timothy Thatcher is actually one of the scariest individuals you will ever come across. Also, he's from California. The master of the Thatcher's Thatch Can arrived in NXT as Matt Riddle's replacement partner during the pandemic. He quickly turned on the King of Bros, leading up to the first ever fight pit match in NXT history. I won't say in WWE history, because we all know that the fight pit is just a ripoff of the lion's den. Hashtag justice for Ken Shamrock. Thatcher eventually entered into a feud with Tommaso Ciampa, culminating in another trip to the pit on the January 20th, 2021 edition of NXT. As you can imagine, both men slapped each other so hard that it put some hairs on their chests. Well, even more hair. Both these guys were already quite furry. Thatcher walked away with the win, but gained some newfound respect for the Blackhearts. The duo agreed to team together in the upcoming Dusty Rhodes Tag Team Classic, turning Double T face in the process. Oh, isn't that cute? Well, maybe if you take away all the smacking these guys dished out to each other anyway. Number 9. Tony Dillinger If there's one thing that wrestling fans bloody love, it's shouting out numbers. Just ask anyone who's been to a Royal Rumble or those people who ruined that Iron Man match at Extreme Rules a few years ago. You guys are the worst, by the way. So when a wrestler came along with a gimmick that was all about yelling out the number 10, he was bound to get over. Ty Dillinger had been around at NXT for almost three years before he finally hit his stride as the perfect 10. Despite being presented as a heel against the likes of Apollo Crews and Andrade Cien Almas, fans couldn't help but chant along with Dillinger's signature counts. A face turn was inevitable. His time finally came when he partnered with Bobby Roode in the Dusty Rhodes Tag Team Classic, here making its second appearance in as many entries. Roode left his partner high and dry in their first match together, opening the door for Dillinger to call him out as a newly minted babyface. Not quite sure if the turn was a 10 out of 10, but I really like saying the word 10, which is why I put him at number 9. Number 8. Cameron Grimes There's a long-running tradition in professional wrestling of using rich characters as bad guys. I mean, it's hard to generate sympathy for somebody who has loads of money, and it's so much easier to portray them as greedy, arrogant, and devious. One notable exception to this rule is Cameron Grimes, who returned to NXT with a brand new gimmick in early 2021. He was now being presented as a multi-millionaire GameStop investor, making him the most up-to-date persona in the history of WWE. After a few months of fitting the typical rich guy mold, Grimes broke tradition when he started a feud with LA Knight. This storyline revolved around the ultimate wealthy dickhead in wrestling history, Ted DiBiase. Grimes and Ted met on NXT, but were soon interrupted by LA Knight. The future Max Dupree attacked Grimes, turning the investment guru babyface in the process. He solidified his turn three weeks later, when he saved the million dollar man from a Knight beatdown. Even though everything about his gimmick screamed heel, Grimes was ultimately too likeable to stay a bad guy for very long. 
Number 7. Bobby Fish The entire Undisputed Era slowly started a face turn during Adam Cole's 2020 rivalry with Pat McAfee. The gang of former Ring of Honor lads took on McAfee and his pals in a War Games match at the titular TakeOver, walking out of the double cage with the win. Unfortunately for Bobby Fish, he tore his triceps during the bout and was put on the shelf. Whilst Old Fishy was getting some rest, Cole had a bit of a temper tantrum and laid out his stablemates. This then led to Cole and O'Reilly's series of matches, all whilst Fish was sat at home working on his knitting. Finally, when he was healed, Fish returned to NXT to solidify himself as a babyface by rescuing his former Red Dragon partner from Pete Dunne and Oni Lorcan. This was the first time NXT fans had seen him in five months, and everyone was thrilled to see him back. Or that might have just been the Thunderdome. So, how did the rest of Fish's year go? Well, he lost to Dunn the next week and then did absolutely nothing of note before getting released in August. Sorry, Bobby, but where's the lie? Number 6. Dakota Kai When Dakota Kai attacked her partner Raquel Gonzalez because of her jealousy of the NXT Women's Champion, she somehow managed to turn heel whilst already being heel. Kai had made a bit of a habit of turning on partners ever since she took out Tegan Knox at War Games 2019. That was how Gonzalez was first introduced as Kai's second in her ensuing feud with Knox. The strongest back of all time got her revenge on the Kiwi star when she beats Kai at TakeOver 36. Then at Halloween Havoc, Kai returned under a mask to cost Gonzalez the belt against Mandy Rose. The two would be kept apart until the build-up to Stand and Deliver 2022. Kai had already been showing babyface tendencies when she attacked Toxic Attraction in the ring, which was unwise considering there were three of them and only one of her. If only a gigantic Hispanic woman was around to save her, eh? Gonzalez made the run-in and helped her former friend fight off Mandy Rose and Co. After nearly a year of animosity, Kai and Gonzalez hugged it out to transform the pink-haired performer back into a babyface. Good times all round. Number 5. Charlotte Before she became the most unlikable person in WWE history, Charlotte Flair was actually over as a babyface down in NXT. Without her father's first name, Charlotte debuted for the brand in summer of 2013 and quickly formed a tag team with Bayley. She established herself as a heel a few months later, joining the beautiful, fierce female group alongside Sasha Banks and Summer Rae. When was she a horsewoman? Charlotte would remain a baddie for the better part of a year. She became the NXT Women's Champion at the first ever TakeOver show in May 2014, before kicking Banks and Ray to the curb in the summer. Fast forward to TakeOver Fatal 4-Way, and Charlotte saved Bayley from a Banks attack. She confirmed her status as a babyface a few weeks later, embracing the hugger after their match on NXT. Ah. Charlotte's gradual return to the good side was a well-told story stretched out over almost an entire year. It might not have had the most spectacular conclusion, but sometimes subtlety is the way to go. Also, this was a damn sight better than any of her main roster face turns. Number 4. Sanity It's hard to pinpoint the exact moment that Eric Young's gang of balaclava enthusiasts turned babyface. Did Sanity go good when they beat the Authors of Pain at TakeOver Brooklyn 3? Did the turn happen when they were attacked by Kyle O'Reilly and Bobby Fish shortly thereafter? Did this faction even exist at all, or did we all just dream that they did? It could happen. For our money, the moment the turn was cemented was at the end of the September 20th, 2017 edition of NXT. The era had just beaten Mustache Mountain in the main event, only to be confronted by Drew McIntyre. The bad guys tried to peace out, only to be confronted by some very scary, very hairy men. Sanity jumped Cole, Fish and O'Reilly to come to the Scotsman's aid. This firmly established them as good guys, getting massive cheers from the crowd in the process. All of this built to the three-way war games match where Sanity took on the Undisputed Era and the makeshift team of the Authors of Pain and Roderick Strong. No offense, Roddy, but even with that vest on, no one is mistaking you for either ACAM or Razor. Number 3. Rhea Ripley Despite very clearly being from Australia, Rhea Ripley made her first regular WWE appearances as part of the NXT UK brand. Do you have any idea how different we Brits are from the Aussies? They can go out in the sun for longer than 10 minutes without getting burnt for a start. Anyway, Ripley was a wild success in Old Blighty, becoming the first ever NXT UK Women's Champion. She would later drop the belt to Tony Storm, another Australian. You know what, I give up at this point. 
Ripley had been presented as a heel for most of her time in the UK, so it was quite the surprise when she turned up on American soil as a badass babyface. She started off very strong, confronting NXT Women's Champion Shayna Baszler on the August 28, 2019 edition of the show. After snatching the microphone from her hand, she then said that Baszler had beaten everyone on the roster except her. And then she said a naughty word because she was cool. This was a fantastic introduction to Ripley for anyone who hadn't seen her before and a great way to start her run as a no-nonsense goodie. Number 2. Tommaso Ciampa For those of you who don't know the story of Ciampa and Johnny Gargano, first of all, where have you been? Second of all, basically, they used to be best friends until it turned out that Ciampa was the most evil man to have ever lived. After years of beating the hell out of each other, reuniting, then beating the hell out of each other some more, Gargano and Ciampa were set to face off for the NXT title in the Big Apple, and then Ciampa got hurt. The match was quickly shifted to Gargano versus Adam Cole for the vacant belt, which Gargano won after one hell of a match. At the end of the night, as he was celebrating, Ciampa snuck up behind Johnny and hugged him. No sneak attack, no vile act, a big old hug. A still injured Champa was so overwhelmed with joy for his former friend that the pair made up right there on the spot. This beautiful moment not only acknowledged how far Gargano had come, but also made it impossible for fans to boo Champa anymore. And with that, the most heated rivalry in NXT history was over. Until it wasn't. Stupid one final beat match. Number 1. Johnny Gargano Sticking with the gargano champa feud now, and the moment that should have been the setup to two men battling it out for the possession of Goldie. Gargano had actually turned heel in 2018, attacking Alistair Black in the build-up to Brooklyn 4. This helped establish the parking lot assault trend that NXT loves to overuse today. DIY then reunited as villains to enter the Dusty Rhodes Tag Team Classic. Thought we got rid of you? This new version of the group got through the first round of the tournament, but fell in the second when they came up against against Alistair Black and Ricochet. Ciampa then tried to turn on Gargano in exactly the same way that he had done at TakeOver Chicago almost two years earlier, but this time, Johnny was ready. The Rebel Heart countered Ciampa's attack and threw him into the LED board instead. After a few months in the wilderness, the old Johnny Wrestling was back and he was better than ever. Gargano was so popular in NXT that it would have been impossible to keep him heel for too long. Yeah, it helped freshen up his character, but his time on the dark side was only ever going to be temporary. There's a saying in life, nobody fights like family. Not only is this true of my family, I will never forget that time my grandma hit my uncle with a Canadian destroyer one Christmas, but it's also very true in wrestling. The sport of kings has seen many examples of relatives, blood or otherwise, going at it in the ring. For this list, we are looking at people who are genuinely related, rather than any kayfabe relationships. So no Billy versus Bart on this one. Sorry, guys. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 best family versus family matches in wrestling history. Join us! Number 10, Eddie Guerrero vs Chavo Guerrero on SmackDown At the 2004 Royal Rumble, the feud between Eddie Guerrero and his nephew Chavo came to a disappointing end. Though the action was customarily good, the two men were only allotted a paltry 8 minutes for their big blow-off, a consequence of the hour-long Rumble match and Triple H and Shawn Michaels needing extra time for their last man standing bout. Thankfully for Los Guerreros, they were able to run it back on SmackDown almost a month later. This time, Latino Latino Heat was defending his newly won WWE title, with Kurt Angle acting as special guest referee. Given twice the time on television than they were on pay-per-view, Eddie and Chavo, who had won the Cruiserweight title on the same night as his uncle's triumph, put on an engaging contest that demonstrated their chemistry as tag partners extended to being opponents. One mark against it is the lack of a decisive finish, as the Olympic hero turned on Eddie and attacked him, resulting in a no contest. Up until that point, however, the wrestling was as smooth as silk, even if there was a bit of an absence of drama regarding a potential title change. Number 9. Rey Mysterio vs Dominic Mysterio at WrestleMania 39 Though he's the kayfabe son of Eddie Guerrero, Dominic Mysterio is the real-life biological child of Rey Mysterio, allegedly. 
The two were inseparable during Dom's first couple of years in the promotion. At WrestleMania Backlash 2021, the Mysterios won the SmackDown Tag Team Championships, becoming the only father and son duo in WWE history to hold tag gold together. Well, that is until Shane McMahon inevitably wins the belts with one of his kids, obviously. Dirty Dom turned his back on his dear old dad when he decided that he'd much rather hang out with a sexy goth lady instead. And who can really blame him? Look at her. The younger Mysterio joined the Judgment Day and quickly became one of the most hated heels in professional wrestling, setting up a match with his pops at WrestleMania 39. Though many argued that Ray should have lost to his son, the action was still crisp, the emotions were still high, and Bad Bunny's running at the end was still a memorable moment. If only the whole thing hadn't been sponsored by a bloody cereal. Number 8. Ray Phoenix vs Pentagon Jr on AEW Dynamite The Lucha Brothers are possibly the third best sibling tag team in AEW right now, just behind the Young Bucks and the Gun Club. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Young Bucks aren't even that good. Ray Phoenix and Pentagon have been in All Elite Wrestling since day one. Their battles with the Young Bucks were a key part in the pre-Dynamite days of the promotion, and they've sporadically reappeared to wage war with their great rivals a few more times times over the years. On the October 21st, 2020 episode of Dynamite, Phoenix and Penta squared off against each other in the first round of the World Championship Eliminator Tournament. As you would expect from two of the most gifted luchadors on the planet, the action in this one was breathtaking. The two men worked seamlessly together, perhaps because they literally share the same DNA, and Phoenix scored an upset win over his more established brother to advance. Unfortunately, an injury took him out of the running, and so Penta advanced to the next round in his place. So did he win his match in honor of his brother? Nope, he lost. Loser. Number 7. The British Bulldog vs Owen Hart on Raw We've tried not to include the same families multiple times on this list, but it's kind of impossible to do that with the Hearts. I mean, there are hundreds of them. Trying to send out Christmas cards every year must be a nightmare. Our first visit to Stu and Helen's massive litter also features a man who married into the Canadian wrestling dynasty. Davy Boy Smith, aka the British Bulldog, tied the knot with Diana Hart in 1984. This move vastly increased the number of people he was related to, which included his new brother-in-law, Owen Hart. The two would find great success as a duo in the 90s, reigning as tag team champions for 246 days. During this time, they would also meet in the finals of a tournament to crown the first ever European champion. Held in Germany, this match was a technical masterpiece as the non-blood relatives put their considerable combined skill to the test. After one of the best matches in Raw history, Davy Boy pinned the rocket to win the inaugural belt for Queen and Country. Just thinking about it brings a tear to my little British eye. Number 6. Jeff Hardy vs Matt Hardy – The Final Deletion Matt Hardy and his baby brother Jeff had a few matches against each other in WWE, and unfortunately, more often than not, they were… well, they weren't that great. Their match at Vengeance 2001 underwhelmed, as did their Extreme Rules bout at WrestleMania 25. You know, the one that came about because Matt burnt Jeff's house down and killed his dog. In storyline, I hasten to add, please don't harass Matt on Twitter. The only really good WWE encounter between the two was an I Quit match at Backlash, but for their true magnum opus, we need to go to Impact. One day in 2016, Matt woke up and decided that he was actually the human vessel for an ancient spirit, as you do. This broken character went after Jeff, aka Brother Nero, leading to the legendary final deletion match on the July 5th episode of Impact. This was a cinematic match before cinematic matches were in vogue, as the Hardys shot each other with fireworks, jumped out of trees, and set each other on fire. It wasn't to everyone's taste, just ask Sam Driver, but those who liked it loved it, and it helped put both men's names back on the map. Number 5. Roman Reigns vs Jey Uso at Hell in a Cell 2020 Roman Reigns has faced off many times against his cousins the Usos, even before the bloodline was ever a thing. As a member of the Shield, Reigns battled Jimmy and Jay in various tag team matches, including for the championship belts at Money in the Bank 2013. Fast forward 10 years to the epic Civil War match at the same event, where Reigns got pinned for the first time in over three years. Take that, Baron Corbin. 
The match we are interested in happened right at the start of Reigns' run as Tribal Chief. After defeating him at Clash of Champions, the head of the table once again put his Universal Championship on the line against Jay in an I Quit Hell in a Cell match. After half an hour of physical and psychological warfare, the dastardly champion finally made his cousin give up by choking out Jimmy with a guillotine. This was a fantastic ending to a fantastic match, proving just how far Roman was willing to go to keep his mitts on the belt. Number 4. The British Bulldog vs Bret Hart at SummerSlam 1992 At SummerSlam 1992, the British Bulldog was put in a main event match for the Intercontinental Championship in front of a rabid UK crowd. To get through his high-pressure scenario, Davy Boy turned to another of his 48 brothers-in-law, reigning IC champion Bret the Hitman Hart. It's been said many, many times that this is one of the greatest matches in any number of different categories. Greatest Intercontinental Championship matches, greatest SummerSlam matches, greatest pay-per-view main events, greatest matches where one participant was recovering from a very, very heavy night out the night before. Despite his semi-inebriated state, the Bulldog reversed a sun set flip to pin Hart's shoulders down to the mat to score the 1, 2, 3. The fans in London erupted when their inverted commas hometown hero picked up the victory, ending this huge night on the highest of highs. Bret could famously have a great match with just about anybody, but the fact that he chose this night to deliver one of his best performances really shows just how powerful family can be. Number 3. Shane McMahon vs Vince McMahon at WrestleMania X7 Never mind all that lovey-dovey stuff I just said about family, let's talk about the time a son knocked seven bells of grapefruit juice out of his old man. 22 years before the Mysterios had their father versus son match, another famous wrestling family took turns duking it out. Vince McMahon had gone mad, well, even madder than usual, and was abusing his power even more egregiously than he typically did. He had placed his wife Linda into a medical coma, which allowed him to cavort freely with his new mistress, Trish Stratus. Understandably, this annoyed his son Shane, so the two decided to settle it in the ring, like all good families do. Was this a technical masterpiece? Absolutely not. Both men had the natural wrestling ability of two blind squirrels. But was this one of the most entertaining soap opera matches in WrestleMania history? You bet your sweet tushy it was. I won't run through the highlights here because that'll take all day, but I highly recommend you seek this one out if somehow you haven't already seen it. If only to see Linda McMahon get a bloody road warrior pop, if nothing else. Number 2. Cody vs Dustin Rhodes at Double or Nothing 2019 AEW's first pay-per-view, Double or Nothing, had something for everyone. The Casino Battle Royale was a bit of silly fun, the Young Bucks vs the Lucha Brothers was out and out carnage, and for those who liked their wrestling full of emotion, there was the Battle of the Rhodes Boys. When Dustin and Cody Rhodes were in WWE as Gold Dust and Stardust respectively, they tried to have a brother vs brother match at Fastlane 2015. Unfortunately, it went so badly that Cody left the company one year later. Okay, so that wasn't the exact reason, but the match still wasn't very good and apparently helped cancel a planned WrestleMania rematch. Four years on, they decided to have a do-over, and what a do-over it was. The Half Brothers put on one of the most intense story-driven matches of recent times. Cody playing the cocky youngster, whilst Dustin served as the wily veteran who refused to be put down. After over 20 minutes of bloody action, Cody finally pinned his brother as the MGM Grand rose to their feet in appreciation. And then came the famous moment where Cody asked Dustin to team with him because he didn't need a partner, but he did need a brother. Somebody get me a tissue. Number 1. Owen Hart vs Bret Hart at WrestleMania 10 Our third and final check-in on the Hart family is the only one to feature two of Stu and Helen's eight sons. The story of Owen vs Bret began with even more Hart kids as they teamed up with brothers Bruce and Keith at Survivor Series 1993. After Bret accidentally caused Owen to be the only one of his brothers eliminated, things started getting frosty. At Royal Rumble 1994, Owen kicked Bret's leg out of his 
his leg, and the match was made for WrestleMania 10, brother versus brother for the first time ever. Both men were famously sound in ring performers, and putting them together with a highly charged story behind them only galvanized them further. This opening contest is still regarded as one of the best Mania matches of all time, especially when you consider the shocking moment when Owen pinned his far more accomplished brother. This is a textbook example of a real-life relationship being used to further a scripted feud. The only way this could have been any better was if it led to a Hart Family 8-way somewhere down the line. What, you're telling me you didn't want to see Ross vs Wayne? Liars. Traditional thinking would suggest that WWE should save the biggest, most marketable matches they have for the rare occasions where fans actually have to hand over some of their hard-earned cash to watch the show. Though pay-per-view was once the lifeblood of the company, that hasn't stopped them from basically giving away dollar-drawing matches for free on television. Obviously, ratings and goodwill with the fans are important, but WWE clearly left some giant piles of money on the table when they opted to put Put these bouts on for now. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 insane matches WWE gave away on free TV. Join us. Number 10. Brock Lesnar vs Hulk Hogan Nostalgia Mania was running wild in 2002, brother, when Hulk Hogan returned to WWE after an almost decade-long absence. Though he came in as a hated heel and member of the New World Order, it wasn't long before Hogan's fawning fans had him back in the red and yellow, the strength of his reactions convincing Vince McMahon to make him the undisputed champion. After that experiment failed, WWE creative tried a different approach and decided to use the aging legend to help the up-and-coming crop of stars like Edge, Kurt Angle, and Brock Lesnar. The next big thing may have been new to the business, but WWE had the rocket strapped firmly to his massive back and nobody, not even Hulk Hogan, could stop him. WWE booked the two against one another in the main event of the August 8, 2002 episode of SmackDown, with Brock's undisputed title match at SummerSlam against The Rock at stake. Had the match been booked a couple of months down the road at, say, Survivor Series, as was the plan for a proposed rematch, it could have drawn a few bucks. As it was, though, WWE used Hogan to put the rookie over strong en route to his showdown with the Great One. Number 9. Bret Hart vs Psycho Sid All hell broke loose just days Days before WrestleMania 13, when Bret Hart challenged Psycho Sid for the WWE title inside a steel cage in the main event of Monday Night Raw. Obviously done in part to add intrigue ahead of the showcase of the Immortals and tease the fact that the Hitman submission match with Stone Cold Steve Austin could become a championship affair, this was one of the biggest, if not the biggest, Raw main events to that point. Having a WWE title match, let alone a stipulation match like this, on regular WWE television was still a rare occurrence, and its pay-per-view credentials were underscored by the fact that Bret and Sid had collided in a pay-per-view main event at In Your House It's Time just a few months earlier. As a match, it's nothing special, but it really set the table for Mania, and the involvement of Stone Cold and The Undertaker during and after the bout made for exciting scenes. Though the match itself was standard stuff, the post-match angle with the four-way brawl, along with the excellence of Execution's expletive-laden rant and confrontation with Vince McMahon, man was pure gold and helped make the WWE title seem like the most prestigious prize in wrestling. Number 8. John Cena vs Shawn Michaels John Cena and Shawn Michaels first squared off in singles action in the main event of the 2005 Halloween episode of Raw, the non-title affair going to a no contest when Kurt Angle ran in to build up to their triple threat match at Taboo Tuesday the next night. Michaels vs Cena didn't quite have the feel of a mouth-watering blockbuster pay-per-view headline then, but it certainly did when the two next clashed in another Raw main event 18 months later. A non-title rematch of their WrestleMania 23 WWE title main event, the Heartbreak Kid and Big Match John famously went a full hour in front of an enthusiastic crowd inside London's Earl's Court. Michaels went over on Cena after exhaustingly falling on top of him following Sweet Chin music, which begs the question, why didn't these two have one more singles pay-per-view match to settle things at Backlash rather than the multi-man match with added Edge and Orton. In any event, Michaels vs Cena only happened a handful of times, and it's curious that WWE had the majority of their offerings go down on free TV. 
Number seven, The Rock and Steve Austin versus The New World Order. Well, that is just a borderline hilarious amount of star power now, isn't it? When Hulk Hogan, Kevin Nash, and Scott Hall returned to WWE in February of 2002, fans began fantasy booking the matches they'd hoped to have seen during the Monday Night Wars or ill-fated invasion, in particular the Hulkster versus The Rock and Steve Austin in singles matches. Hogan and the People's Champion had their epic show-stealing encounter at WrestleMania 18, but Stone Stone Cold vetoed the idea of going one-on-one -on -one with the Immortal One. He would happily go up against Hulk in a handicap match on the WrestleMania 18 Go Home episode of Raw, however, teaming up with The Rock to take on the NWO in the show's main event. This would be the only time Hogan and Austin would trade blows, and it's frankly bizarre that WWE wouldn't ask fans to pay to see it. Amazingly, this was Hogan's first televised WWE match since King of the Ring 1993, too, and WWE WWE just threw it out there with pretty much no build in order to increase anticipation for a match that really had already sold itself. Number 6. Roman Reigns vs Rey Mysterio A Hell in a Cell match for the WWE Universal title on SmackDown, located entirely within the Thunderdome? You better believe WWE decided to treat fans to Roman Reigns defending against Rey Mysterio inside the steel structure without asking them to cough up a penny or subscribe to the network. The match had originally been scheduled to take place at the Hell in a Cell pay-per-view itself, but WWE made the decision to move it two days earlier instead. It was a surprising move, to say the least, and evidently it was one that was made for no good reason. Reports at the time suggested WWE just decided to move it to SmackDown because, I mean, screw it, why not? Mysterio's first ever Hell in a Cell match ended up being the first ever Cell match in SmackDown history, helping to boost the show's ratings. WWE then opted to give the sell stipulation to Bianca Belair and Bayley's SmackDown Women's title match at the pay-per-view. Truth be told, the pandemic era is a bit of a blur and those crowdless shows all tend to blend together, but Reigns vs Rey inside the cell was still a crazy match to have on regular TV. Number 5. TLC 3 and TLC 4 When a group of WWE stars are prepared to take their bodies to the limit in an untested gimmick match, it's only natural that the company would put that type of spectacle on on pay-per-view. There was a real curiosity when it came to the original TLC match between the Hardys, Dudleys and Edge and Christian at SummerSlam 2000, and there is no doubt that many fans coughed up to see what the sextet of daredevils would do with the assorted plunder at their disposal. The match was such a success that WWE booked the sequel for WrestleMania X7. Seven weeks later, the threequel with bonus Benoit and Jericho main evented the May 24, 2001 edition of SmackDown. Rather than take it easy on free TV, the eight competitors threw caution to the wind and put on a performance that would have fit right in at the granddaddy of them all. Seeking a ratings boost for the Raw brand 18 months later, WWE presented TLC4 as the main event of the first Raw Roulette-themed episode of the show. Both matches for free, yet you had to pay to see Kane attempting revenge for the whole Katie Vick debacle just a couple of weeks later. Number 4. Kurt Angle vs The Undertaker WWE booked Kurt Angle vs. The Undertaker in championship bouts on several occasions between 2000 and 2006. An intriguing clash of styles and characters, The Dead Man vs. The Olympic Hero was a natural matchup that seemed to only get better with age. In their initial meetings, there was a clear imbalance as Taker was the established, already legendary star, while Kurt was young in his career, if not already on his way to being a fully fledged headliner. Their best match against one another was most likely their World Heavy Heavyweight title main event from No Way Out 2006, a thrilling contest that really ought to have been on the WrestleMania card a month later. Because of its quote unquote controversial finish, WWE booked the rematch not for the grandest stage of them all, but for two weeks later on SmackDown. Once again, the two workhorses tore the house down and put on a WrestleMania caliber showing, strengthening calls for the trilogy to be capped off at Mania itself. Didn't happen, of course, though I bet people would have stumped up for it. Number 3. Jeff Hardy vs Shawn Michaels In his earlier WWE days, Jeff Hardy was often likened to Shawn Michaels. Both were young, naturally talented, took risks, and had that intangible it factor that made people gravitate towards them, so the comparison was an apt one. And Hardy, like Michaels, also burned out and had to leave WWE during what could and should have been some banner years. When the charismatic enigma returned, the showstopper was in his second spell 
spell with the company and, though he was a changed man, was every bit the superlative performer he had been in his pomp. The only time the two crossed paths was, somewhat randomly, in the main event of the February 11th, 2008 episode of Raw. Jeff's popularity was skyrocketing while Sean was in the autumn of his in-ring career and it made for a very interesting dynamic. Given 20 minutes to play with, the two had a barn burner that you'd have been more than happy to pay for. Not that I'm mad that we didn't have to, mind. The lack of a rematch, on the other hand, boils my blood to this very day. Number 2. John Cena vs Shinsuke Nakamura They called John Cena Big Match John for a reason. It's because JBL said it on commentary once and it stuck, even though it's a pretty lame nickname, all things considered. Regardless, Cena is one of WWE's biggest stars ever, and almost by default, any match he's in feels like a big deal. Especially when it's against another performer with a superstar aura and reputation, like the King of Strong Style himself, Shinsuke Nakamura. With a shot against WWE Champion Jinder Mahal at SummerSlam on the line, Cena and Shinsuke collided in the main event of the August 1st, 2017 episode of SmackDown. By rights, it probably should have been Nakamura vs Cena in a WWE title match at the biggest party of the summer, but the Mahal experiment was in full flow and so they went at it on the Blue Show instead. A much better match than Shinsuke's loss to Jinder, Nakamura vs Cena was a belting TV main event that came at just the right time, with Nakamura on the rise and Cena settling into his role as a beloved elder statesman who still dressed like a 12-year-old baby. Would have been well worth my $9.99 that month, and then some. Number 1. Brock Lesnar vs Kurt Angle WWE knew well in advance that they wanted Brock Lesnar vs Kurt Angle and they wanted it at WrestleMania. An amateur enthusiast's wet dream, the next big thing against the Olympic hero was a battle that didn't need a soap opera storyline or any other gimmicks or tomfoolery to make it special. WWE only booked three televised singles matches between Brock and Kurt, the first of which closed out WrestleMania 19 in style, the second of which was the highlight of SummerSlam 2003, and the third of which took up more than half of a SmackDown broadcast. With Angle and Lesnar tied one all when it came to their singles matches, WWE presented the one-hour Iron Man rubber match on free television. That is right, two of the very best wrestlers on the planet doing what they do best for an entire 60 minutes and all fans had to do was make sure to tune in at the right time. One of the biggest and best free TV matches in WWE history, it ended the Angle vs Lesnar rivalry on a high note, though you do wonder why it wasn't reserved for an order-only occasion. Nowadays you don't get Brock Lesnar to come to the arena for less than a small fortune, never mind wrestling for an hour on television. Okay, full transparency here. We had planned to release this video off the back of Cody Rhodes' big championship win at WrestleMania 39, but as you all know by now, that didn't happen. Whoops. Still, Rhea Ripley won the SmackDown Women's Championship and Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens are your new tag team champions, so maybe they will have a shot at joining this list someday. Although, with Vince McMahon back in charge, maybe not. For now though, let's look back at happier times. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling and these are the 10 best championship reigns that began at WrestleMania. Join us! Number 10. Randy Savage, the WWE Championship, won at WrestleMania 4 After the Million Dollar Man Ted DiBiase screwed Hulk Hogan out of the WWE Championship in 1988, a one-night tournament was held at WrestleMania 4 to crown a new top dog. The finals came down to Ted and Randy Savage, with the Macho Man overcoming the odds to win his first ever world title. Savage would reign with the gold for over a full year, main eventing SummerSlam and the next year's WrestleMania in the process. All of this is great stuff, so why isn't he higher up on this list? Well, one word, brother. Despite being the official main man for over 365 days, Savage constantly played second fiddle to the Hulkster during his time on top. Hogan was also there in the SummerSlam main event, he eliminated Savage from the 1989 Royal Rumble, and he was the one to dethrone him at WrestleMania 5. Still, you cannot deny the impressive length of Macho's title reign, nor the excellent Mega Powers Explode storyline that led to the WrestleMania 5 match. It would have been nice if he had had a little bit of room to breathe whilst champion, but that was never going to happen while Santa with muscles was hanging around. 
Number 9. Shawn Michaels WWE Championship won at WrestleMania 12 Shawn Michaels realized his boyhood dream in the main event of WrestleMania 12 when he beat Bret Hart in sudden death overtime following an exhausting one-hour Iron Man match. Seriously, I was knackered after watching that many headlock takeovers. The Heartbreak Kid would be forced to pull the wagon in the absence of the Hitman who went on a lengthy sabbatical after dropping the gold. If there's one person who could take the reins from someone as talented and consistent as Bret Hart, it is Shawn Michaels, and HBK had a commendable eight-month reign which saw him have tremendous pay-per-view matches with Diesel, British Bulldog, Vader, and Mankind, as well as gripping TV bouts with Steve Austin, Marty Jannetty, and Owen Hart. Even the match where he dropped the belt against Sid at Survivor Series was up there with the best matches the master and ruler of the world ever had. Competing with a red-hot WCW and hurting from a lack of star power, WWE weren't exactly firing on all cylinders at the time, and Sean has been criticized for a perceived lack of drawing ability. But Michaels was an artist, and he painted several masterpieces on the canvas of his choosing during his 231-day reign, which stands as the longest of his WWE career. Number 8. Bret Hart Intercontinental Championship won at WrestleMania 8 Despite being one of the most popular stars of his generation, Rowdy Roddy Piper only won one singles championship in WWE. That, of course, was the Intercontinental Championship, which he would eventually drop to Bret Hart at WrestleMania 8. Hart and Piper had an excellent match, one of the best in the title's history on the grandest stage. The excellence of execution rolled out of a sleeper hole to pin Hot Rod and then ended the match with a show of respect. It was beautiful stuff. Hart would reign for 146 days before dropping the title in yet another all-time classic match, the main event of SummerSlam 1992 against his brother-in-law, the British Bulldog. Hart and Bulldog put on another of the greatest IC title matches of all time in front of a rabid crowd of Davy Boy's fellow Brits. In fact, the match was so good that nobody could tell that Davy Boy wasn't in the best of ways for the entire thing. For the way this title reign began and ended, the Hitman more than deserves his place on this list. Number 7. The British Bulldogs World Tag Team Championships won at WrestleMania 2 A huge win in the main event of the Illinois portion of WrestleMania 2. You know, that famously good idea to have one show spread out over three different locations. Worked so well, that did. Along with partner Dynamite Kid, Davey was challenging for the World Tag Team Championships against the dream team of Brutus Beefcake and Greg Valentine. The dream team was their name, by the way, not an endorsement from me. They are far from my dream tag team, Mojo Rawley and Perry Saturn, thank you very much. Not only were the Bulldogs the babyface favorites going into the match, but they also had heavy metal legend Ozzy Osbourne in their corner. Although that did get awkward when he tried to bite Valentine's head off. The Bulldogs picked up the win and reigned for a whopping 294 days as champions. This is one of the longest title reigns in the history of the belts, and the duo were treated as megastars for the entire duration. Hey, I said it was one of the longest title reigns in the history of the World Tag Team Championships, because actually, there's a longer one. Number 6. Demolition The World Tag Team Championships won at WrestleMania 4 Two years after Davy Boy and Dynamite Kid won the titles, Axe and Smash of Demolition also captured the belts by beating Strike Force at WrestleMania 4. What followed was a championship reign of epic proportions as the Road Warrior knockoffs held onto their precious prizes for a frankly crackers 478 days. This is the longest reign in the history of those particular straps and would have been the longest tag title reign period were it not for those pesky New Day and Uso boys. Somewhere Axe and Smash are shaking their fists into the air. This gargantuan run would carry over to WrestleMania 5, where the pair were forced to defend the belts against the powers of pain and their former manager, Mr. Fuji. Demolition's record-setting reign would eventually come to an end in the summer of 1989 when the team lost a 2 out of 3 falls match to the Brain Busters. Demolition will always have a place in the history of tag team wrestling in WWE, even if those darned young'uns have now stolen their crown. Number 5. Becky Lynch, the Raw Women's Championship, won at WrestleMania 35. WrestleMania 35 saw history made when three women main evented the show for the first time ever. It's also entered the history books as the longest thing to ever happen ever. I'm pretty sure it's still going on somewhere. 
The groundbreaking triple threat ended with Becky Lynch overcoming Charlotte Flair and Ronda Rousey to win both the Raw and SmackDown Women's Championships. Let's just gloss over the fact that Rousey's shoulders were clearly off the mat when Becky pinned her. Lynch's reign with the blue belt would end after just 41 days when she lost it back to Charlotte at Money in the Bank. Her time with the red strap, however, was much longer as the last kicker would be Raw champion for almost 400 days. She would regularly defend the title against the likes of Lacey Evans, Natalia, Sasha Banks, and Asuka. And she would have been champion for much longer too had she not been forced to give up the belt after falling pregnant. Moral of the story, kids ruin everything. You could argue that she should have dropped the title to Shayna Baszler at WrestleMania 36, but this was still a big time reign from big time Bex. Number 4. Drew McIntyre, the WWE Championship, won at WrestleMania 36. After blasting Brock Lesnar in the face on his way to winning the 2020 Men's Royal Rumble, Drew McIntyre squared off against the Beast for the WWE Championship in the main event of WrestleMania 36's second night. In a short yet punchy affair, the Scotsman dethroned the Beast incarnate to win his first ever world title and finally fulfill Vince McMahon's prophecy of him being the Chosen One. Over the next 200 or so days, McIntyre firmly established himself as the main event talent that we all knew he could be. He put on great matches, carried himself like a star, and put together one of the best babyface title reigns of the modern era. There were a few issues, though. One is that WWE made the baffling decision to have McIntyre lose the belt to Randy Orton for less than a month in October, meaning that he could have had an even longer uninterrupted reign. Secondly, and this is no fault of Drew, but all of this good stuff took place with no crowd to see it as we were knee-deep into the pandemic at the time. Sorry, Drew, but you can't argue with germs. Trust me, I've tried. Number 3. Stone Cold Steve Austin, the WWE Championship, won at WrestleMania X7. This might be a controversial one, but hear us out. Stone Cold Steve Austin began three different world title reigns at WrestleMania. The first lasted 91 days before he dropped the belt to Kane for one night in 1998. The second lasted just 56 days before The Undertaker took it off him at Over the Edge. And then there is number three, aka the night Austin turned heel and possibly ended the ultra-lucrative Attitude Era as we knew it. After battering The Rock with that McMahon-endorsed steel chair, Austin reigned for 175 days as a psychotic, paranoid heel. This run encompassed his partnership with Triple H, his time in the Alliance, and would have likely been longer had WWE not given the belt to Kurt Angle as a feel-good moment after 9-11. The way in which he won the belt may have been dodgy, but Austin's 2001 World Championship reign might just be his best time on top. He had great matches, did some of his best ever character work, and spent more time with the belt than at any other point in his career. Search your feelings, you know it to be true. Number 2. Seth Rollins, the WWE Championship, won at WrestleMania 31. Seth Rollins pulled off one of the greatest Mania endings ever when he cashed in his Money in the Bank briefcase in the middle of the scheduled WWE title match between Roman Reigns and Brock Lesnar. In the heist of the century, honestly one of the best calls in Michael Cole's career right there, Rollins pinned Reigns to win his first ever World Championship, scurrying back up the ramp like a chipmunk with a dyed blonde streak. Over the next 221 days, Rollins turned from sniveling cowardly heel into one of the best big match performers the company had on their books. His matches with Cena, Dean Ambrose, Randy Orton, and more were all good fun as he slowly transformed into a main event player. Yes, the title reign did end on a downer when he blew out his knee, and yes, he did nearly kill Sting, but this was the Architect's coming out party as a top star, and that has to count for something. Number 1. John Cena, the United States Championship, won at WrestleMania 31. After failing to defeat Rusev the month before, Big Match John took on the Bulgarian Bruce in sun-drenched California at Mania 31. Even a wonky-looking springboard stunner couldn't stop him from beating that foreign menace and winning back the belt for old glory. 
Oh, say can you see? What followed was 147 days of some of the best work of Cena's career. Through his weekly open challenges, he shone a spotlight on some of the best young talent in the business and had great matches with the likes of Dean Ambrose, Neville, Bad News Barrett, and Cesaro. This was also the run that included his incredible feud with Kevin Owens, which honestly would be enough to get this reign on the list by itself. Even the way he lost the championship was awesome, and a winner-takes-all match also for the WWE Championship at SummerSlam. I mean, it was awesome if you ignore the part where comedian Jon Stewart cost Cena the title. Always a caveat, isn't there? As the old saying goes, what a difference a day makes. For example, when I was 12, I went to bed one night clean-shaven and with a high-pitched voice, and then when I woke up, I sounded like this and had a full beard. And I've been stuck like this ever since. Yeah, <laughs> you love it. These wrestlers know my pain all too well. Well, maybe not my exact pain, as they were all champions one day and then beltless just 24 hours later. I'm Adam Pachiti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 WWE title reigns that lasted for one day. Join us. Number 10, Charlotte Flair and the Raw Women's Championship. Charlotte Flair has been Raw Women's Champion six different times. She's also won the SmackDown Women's title, the NXT Women's title, the Women's Tag Team titles, and she's probably also been European Champion at some point as well. Despite her record number of reigns with the belt, Charlotte's average time with the gold is only around 50 days. This run from 2021 certainly doesn't help things. At Money in the Bank, Flair defeated Rhea Ripley to win the gold for the fifth time in her career. This was only the second pay-per-view to feature an audience since the start of the pandemic, so WWE presumably wanted to remind everybody that they should get used to being disappointed in person again. This disappointment wouldn't last long though, as the very next night on Raw, the newly minted Miss Money in the Bank Nikki A.S.H. cashed in on Charlotte to end her reign. Wow, I can't wait to see what Nikki does with the belt. Oh, she lost it back to Charlotte the next month at SummerSlam, and she hasn't had a whiff of the championship picture since then. Oh. Number 9. Finn Balor and the Universal Championship Wrestlers getting injured is a common cause of short title reigns. Perhaps the most heartbreaking example of this took place at SummerSlam 2016 and involved the match to crown the very first Universal Champion. It's also known as the one that you ruined by booing the belt, and I specifically mean you. On one side, you had Seth Rollins, the heel anointed one in management's pockets. And on the other side, there was Finn Balor, a recently called up former NXT champion with a great look, a killer moveset, and a delightful Irish twang. Balor beats Rollins to become the first ever holder of this brand new world championship. Sadly, he wouldn't be able to hold anything for a while as he injured his shoulder during the match. One night later on Raw, Balor appeared with his arm in a sling to relinquish the title he had just won. It was devastating for the former Bullet Club leader and all of the fans who were desperate to see him succeed. Balor would eventually return from injury, but he hasn't been taken seriously as a main eventer by WWE since. Number 8. Hervina and the Women's Championship Right, this one needs some explaining. On the January 31st, 2000 edition of Raw, a strange new challenger was named for the cat and her Women's Championship. Her name was Hervina, and she would be facing off against the champion in a Lumberjill Snow Bunny match. Honestly, don't even ask. Of course, Hervina was none other than longtime Federation manager Harvey Whippleman in a piss poor disguise. Whippleman actually beat the cat and became the first and only male competitor to win a women's championship in WWE. Thankfully, even the Fed weren't insane enough to keep the belt on Hervina for long, as Jacqueline won the title just one night later in a 60 second squash. And yes, technically that match was broadcast on the 3rd of February rather than the 1st, but we're working in real time here, not WWE's strange alternate dimension. So, why did Harvey Whippleman want to win the Women's Championship? Why didn't anyone recognize that this was clearly Harvey Whippleman in women's clothing? Only God and Vince McMahon know the answer to those questions. Number 7. Edge and Christian and the World Tag Team Championships 
Like Charlotte Flair, Edge and Christian's impressive number of tag team title reigns is bolstered by some very brief stints with the gold. These seven-time world tag team champions could only hold on to the belts for 91 days during their longest reign and were once champions for only a matter of minutes. That is not what we're here to discuss, though. The Canadians had recently lost a match, barring them from challenging for the titles for as long as the Hardy Boys held the gold. So they came up with a clever way around this, Golden Gimp Suits E and C disguise themselves as Los Conquistadors to get a title shot at No Mercy, which they won. The Canadians wouldn't be gloating for long though, as the Hardys then also dressed up as the Conquistadors and won the titles back one night later after taking Christian out ahead of the match. Not only does that mean that Los Conquistadors, a team that technically didn't even exist at that time, are two-time world tag team champions, but they also won the belts from themselves. I don't know, this was the Attitude Era, there was a lot of weird stuff stuff going on. Number 6. John Cena and David Otunga and the WWE Tag Team Championships Do not adjust your screens or book yourself in for a hearing test. You did just see and hear me say that John Cena was once a tag team champion with David Otunga. Remember him? Former Nexus member, ex-husband of Jennifer Hudson, and the guy who stank up the pre-show from time to time? All of John Cena's tag team title reigns have been weird. He's never won the belts with someone he wasn't feuding with, and this one came during that weird time that he was part of the Nexus but never actually did anything evil. Man, this storyline was a load of rubbish. Cena and Otunga hooked up, no, not like that, at bragging rights to beat the team of Cody Rhodes and Drew McIntyre. That means that there were three Royal Rumble winners in this match, and also David Otunga. On the following Raw, Nexus leader Wade Barrett ordered Cena and Otunga to lay down for fellow members Heath Slater and Justin Gabriel. When Big Match John refused, the group took him out, and Otunga followed orders to transfer the belts. Once again, this storyline was a load of rubbish. Number 5. Braun Strowman and Nicholas and the Raw Tag Team Championships In the lead-up to WrestleMania 34, Braun Strowman won a Tag Team Battle Royal by himself to earn a shot at the Raw Tag Titles. And who said WWE didn't care about its tag division? His opponents would be Sheamus and Cesaro, aka The Bar, but his partner was left a mystery until the show itself. Speculation ran wild over who the big man would pick. Would it be Elias, Samoa Joe, Rey Mysterio, a returning Gangrel, nobody? The real answer was something else entirely. After chucking their Mardi Gras float off the stage, the monster among men informed The Bar that his partner would be someone in the audience. And not just any someone. One, a 10 year old boy. Nicholas, the son of WWE referee John Cone, actually got tagged into the match without hitting any moves, obviously, before Strowman pinned Cesaro to win the belts for himself and his pint sized partner. Strowman and Nicholas vacated the belts a day later because the latter had to go back to school. That said, he did promise to return for them once he was old enough. Hey, if Dominic can do it. Number 4 Edge and the Intercontinental Championship. Not much usually happens at WWE house shows, except for maybe the odd drunken man yelling at wrestlers to subscribe to his YouTube channel. And I'd like to once again apologize for my behavior on that night. Sometimes though, something big will go down when the cameras aren't rolling to give the fans in attendance an extra special memory. And that is exactly what happened on July 24th, 1999 in Toronto, where fans got to see hometown boy Edge beat Jeff Jarrett for the Intercontinental title. Cue the Maple Leaf Confetti! This was the Young Star's first ever singles title reign, but the good times wouldn't last for the future Hall of Famer. The next night just so happened to be the date of the fully loaded pay-per-view, and that show opened with Edge defending his newly won strap against the man he took it from. Thanks to some interference from Gangrel, who totally should have returned at WrestleMania 34, Jarrett won the match and regained his beloved belt. It would take the Rated R Superstar another two years to win his second IC belt, and that reign would last last 35 times longer than his first one. That's still only 35 days, of course, but for a second there, you have to admit you were impressed. Number 3. The Miz and the Intercontinental Championship 
Chris Jericho may hold the record for the most intercontinental championship reigns at 9, but right behind him on 8 is a certain A-lister. The Miz also has the second longest total number of days as champion, which is surprising as he's had not one, but two 24-hour reigns with it. The first began at none other than WrestleMania 29. Well, technically it was on the pre-show of WrestleMania 29, but hey, that still counts, doesn't it? This was during that weird period where the man with the most punchable face in human history was a good guy. He beats Wade Barrett using the figure four leg lock to win the gold and then promptly dropped it back to him the next night on Raw. Nice one. Fast forward 18 months and Miz was facing Dolph Ziggler for the gold at Night of Champions, thankfully as a heel this time. He used his cheating ways to pin Ziggler for the belt and then promptly dropped it back to him the next night on Raw. Am I stuck in a time loop here? Is this Groundhog Day with the Miz instead of Bill Murray? Bloody hope not. Number 2. Mankind and the WWE Championship In the illustrious 60-plus year history of the WWE Championship, five different people have had a title reign end after just one day. We've decided to choose the two we found the most interesting, so apologies to Bret Hart, Daniel Bryan, and Hulk Hogan. Okay, maybe no apologies for that last one, brother! At SummerSlam 1999, everyone was surprised when Mick Foley defeated both Stone Cold Steve Austin and Triple H to win his third WWE title. Most people expected the game to walk away with the belt, with Mankind acting as a fall guy so Austin wouldn't have to be pinned. Rumor has it that Jesse Ventura, who was the special guest referee and serving governor of Minnesota at the time, didn't want to be seen raising the hand of the villainous Triple H. So Mankind was given the title instead, only to drop it to the King of Kings one night later on Raw. That means that Triple H, one of the greatest and most decorated world champions in the history of professional wrestling, won his first world championship on some random episode of Monday Night Raw. Hey, at least the belt wasn't literally just given to him that time. Number 1. Kane and the WWE Championship King of the Ring 1998 will forever be known as that time a zombie chucked a bloke in a Hannibal Lecter mask off the top of a giant metal box. But there was more to this night than just Mick Foley's tooth going up his own nose. In the show's main event, Steve Austin was wrestling Kane in a WWE Championship first blood match. If the Big Red Machine was unsuccessful, then he would set himself on fire. Sorry, that should be set himself on fire. Glenn Jacobs avoided self-immolation by winning the match and the title. Then, on the next episode of Raw, he dropped the belt back to Austin like nothing ever happened. Maybe this would have been okay if Kane had ever become WWE Champion again, but this was his one and only run with the company's biggest prize. Sure, he was World Heavyweight Champion and ECW Champion, but he would never get his gloved hands on the WWE Championship again. Well, at least he didn't have to set himself on fire, eh? Every cloud? Despite having multiple attempts on its life by Vince McMahon, tag team wrestling has, is, and hopefully always will be a core part of the sport. To celebrate that, we are looking at some of the best wrestlers to ever compete in the doubles division. Now, this is not a rundown of the best tag teams of all time. That is a whole different story and one that I'm pretty sure we've already done. Instead, it's one about the individual wrestlers who have won the most tag team titles, been part of several legendary teams, and done some of their best work while paired up with someone else. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 most successful tag team wrestlers ever. Join us. Number 10, Rey Mysterio. There are three things that Rey Mysterio loves most in life. Dressing up as superheroes, beating up his own son, and winning tag team gold. Rey won his first set of tag titles in his early 20s, whilst teaming up with his uncle, Rey Mysterio. Classic edition. When he wasn't dominating the cruiserweight title scene in WCW, he was winning three sets of tag belts. One with Conan, one with Juventud Guerrera, and one with Billy Kidman. Fun fact, he and Kidman were also the second ever WCW cruiserweight tag team champions. They were also the final ever WCW Cruiserweight Tag Team Champions because the belts got deactivated immediately afterwards. But hey, it all counts. In WWE, Mysterio found more tag team glory as a member of the vaunted SmackDown 6. He was on the losing side of the match to crown the first ever WWE Tag Team Champions at No Mercy 2002, but would go on to win those belts four times with four different partners. With so many different tag title runs across so many different companies with 
so many different partners, there can be no denying that Little Ray Ray has a knack for wrestling in duos. Number 9. Ricky Steamboat Though he may be best known for his all-time classics with Ric Flair over the NWA World's Heavyweight Championship or his WrestleMania 3 Intercontinental title masterpiece against Randy Savage, Ricky the Dragon Steamboat was also a dab hand when it came to tandem wrestling. In All Japan Pro Wrestling in the early 1980s, Steamboat was part of two memorable tag teams alongside Jay Youngblood and Dirty Dick Slater. Why you're laughing? What's so funny about Dirty Dick Slater? On American soil, the Dragon reigned as a tag team champion 13 times for the NWA slash WCW. He and Youngblood would wrest the NWA World Tag Team Championships off the original Briscoe Brothers at the very first Starcade event back in 1983. Though he was never a tag team champ in WWE, Steamboat's accomplishments in the division cannot be overlooked. He was a sensational wrestler who could easily adapt to any environment, which meant that he was just as capable of putting on a great match with a partner as he was on his own. Number 8. Kensuke Sasaki WCW fans might remember Kensuke Sasaki for his time as United States Champion in 1995. There was a whole thing where he didn't want to drop the belt outside of Japan, so the company had one man gang beat him in a dark match and then pretended like the whole thing never happened. It was, in a word, weird. Anyway, in his native land, Kensuke captured New Japan Pro Wrestling's IWGP Heavyweight Championship five times. He also won their tag straps seven times with five different partners, ranging from legendary singles star Riki Choshu to Road Warrior Hawk. Sasaki reigned with the IWGP Tag Team Championships for a total of 817 days, the sixth most out of anyone in history. In 1991, Sasaki and his partner Hiroshi Hase, who would go on to serve in the Japanese government after leaving wrestling, the more you know, competed against the Steiner brothers in a battle that won Match of the Year from the Wrestling Observer newsletter. Combine all that with a couple more reigns in All Japan and Pro Wrestling Noah, and you could make a case for Sasaki being the greatest tag performer in Japanese wrestling history. Just don't tell Tamatonga I said that. Number 7. Seth Rollins At Survivor Series 2012, Seth Rollins, Dean Ambrose and Roman Reigns burst through the crowd looking like they'd just been at a function where the dress code was smart casual. This was the debut of The Shield, a group that would lead Rollins to his first set of WWE Tag Team Championships when he and Reigns beat Team Hell No at Extreme Rules 2013. Rollins would also go on to win the Raw Tag Team Championships with Ambrose on two occasions. In total, Rollins has won the WWE slash Raw tag belts a record tying six times with five different partners by his side. Outside of the big dub, the Visionary was a tag champ in Ring of Honor and PWG alongside former WWE writer Jimmy Jacobs. They were called the Age of the Fall, which has got to be one of the coolest tag team names in wrestling history. Put simply, you could say that Rollins has quite the tag team pedigree because, you know, he uses the pedigree sometimes. Trust me, it works, guys. It works. Number 6. Edge If there's a notable achievement in WWE, there is a good chance that Edge's name will crop up alongside it. He won the World Heavyweight Championship more than anyone else, he was the first person to win Money in the Bank, he won the Royal Rumble, the King of the Ring, and he was voted Wrestling's Most Handsome Canadian in 1999. My condolences to Lance Storm. He is also a record-setting World Tag Team Champion, having held those belts on a staggering 12 different occasions. Seven of those reigns came with his brother slash not brother Christian, who was also a strong contender for this list. Elsewhere, the rated R superstar won gold with the likes of Randy Orton, Chris Jericho, and childhood hero, the human hot dog himself, Hulk Hogan. He only managed a measly two reigns with the WWE Tag Team Championships, but was involved in that epic No Mercy match with Rey Mysterio that we mentioned earlier. From revolutionizing WWE Tag Team Wrestling with the TLC matches to being part of the SmackDown 6 to his many other memorable units over the years, Edge's prowess as a tag team wrestler is something that we can all see clearly. Alright, I'll stop with the wordplay now. You people have no taste. Number 5. Arn Anderson If you look up the word manly in the dictionary, you will see a picture of a shirtless Arn Anderson grappling with an alligator while simultaneously building a shed. By the way, he's 12 years old in this picture. 
The Enforcer's menacing presence made him the perfect candidate for the role of Heavy in The Four Horsemen, as he and his various stablemates would do anything to keep the world title around Ric Flair's waist. In terms of straight-up duos, Anderson has had many accomplished partners over the years. As well as his kayfabe brother Oli, Arn won tag gold in the NWA with Paul Romer, Bobby Eaton, Larry Zabisco, and of course, Tully Blanchard. As the Brain Busters, Arn and Tully moved over to WWE and won their sole pair of tag belts by ending the record-setting reign of demolition in 1989. They would have almost certainly won more titles had Tully not been popped for some naughty powder later that same year. Though he never quite made it as a main event singles guy, Anderson could always be relied upon to work well as part of a larger group. Number 4. Billy Gunn Usually, a wrestler is lucky if they end up being part of one memorable tag team. As for Billy Gunn, well, he's been in three of them. Daddy Ass first debuted in WWE as one half of the Smoking Guns alongside his pretend brother Bart. The cowboy-themed double act were pretty successful in their time together, winning three sets of World Tag Team Championships before splitting up in 1996. Then came the team you probably best know Gun from, the New Age Outlaws. Alongside Road Dogg, the badass held tag gold five times during the Attitude Era, with the team being one of the most overacts on a ridiculously stacked roster. The Outlaws even came back to win a sixth set of belts in 2014, although maybe we shouldn't dwell on that bit of business for too long. And then, of course, there was Billy and Chuck, Gun's weird together but not really team with Chuck Palumbo that produced two tag title runs and more controversy than you could shake a vicar-shaped mask at. For reasons good and bad, Billy Gunn has always stood out as a tag team wrestler and has plenty of gold to prove it. Oh look, make that four. Number three, Mick Foley. Not only did Mrs. Foley's baby boy win tag team gold in WWE under three different personas, but he also won the tag straps of all three major wrestling companies during the Monday Night Wars. His one and only set of WCW tag team titles were won at Slamboree 1994, when he and Kevin Sullivan defeated the Nazis. Boys. In ECW, he won two sets of tag belts alongside everybody's favorite jobber, no not Jack, Mikey Whipwreck. Then came his time in the World Wrestling Federation, where Foley came down with a serious case of tag title fever. He won his first set of World Tag Team Championships under his dude love alter ego, alongside none other than Stone Cold Steve Austin. Then at WrestleMania 14, a reborn Cactus Jack teamed with Chainsaw Charlie, aka Terry Funk with some tights over his head, to defeat the New Age Outlaws in a championship dumpster match. That was the stipulation, by the way, not my review on the action. By the time all was said and done, Foley was an eight-time world tag champ. That brings his career total up to 11 different reigns with seven different partners. It should have been eight. Number two, Kane. On the July 13th, 1998 episode of Raw, the Big Red Machine began his tag team title reign when he and Mankind defeated the New Age Outlaws. They then lost the belts to Steve Austin and The Undertaker before winning them back to make a two-time champ in the space of about a month. Whilst Kane's reigns were never especially long, he sure did have a lot of them, 12 to be precise. These included his memorable run with X-Pac after those two became friends, three championship victories with his brother, The Undertaker, and who could forget his time in Team Hell No with Daniel Bryan. Easily my favourite hug-themed team of all time. In total, seven different men have been tag champs with Kane, which is the most of anyone in WWE history and a testament to the big man's versatility. He worked just as well in big monster teams like his one with the Big Show as he did in odd couples like his pairing with the Hurricane. Put simply, if you are a wrestler, big or small, and you're in need of a championship winning partner, then it's gotta be, it's gotta be Kane! Number one, Kofi Kingston. Kofi Kingston, of course, deserves to go down in history as a great tag wrestler for his work in the New Day alone. Alongside Big E and Xavier Woods, Kofi has been one of the most consistently popular tag acts for the last decade, scooping up belts like they were going out of style. With either Eeyore Woods as his partner, Kingston has won either the Raw or SmackDown tag belts ten times. This includes their second reign as a unit, which broke Demolition's record for longevity back in 2016. Oh yeah, and he and Woods also won the NXT Tag Team Championships in 2022, just because. However, 
However, this list is all about wrestlers who have been in multiple successful tag teams, and luckily, Kingston has that covered too. Our man has also been a champion with Evan Bourne, R-Truth, and CM Punk, making him one of the few people to work with Punk who he hasn't turned on yet. In total, Kingston has been a tag team champion in WWE for 1,395 days. He has broken all sorts of records in that time and has always been entertaining. Nice job, Kofi. Have a pancake to celebrate. A great wrestling promo has the ability to entertain, inspire, and importantly, convince punters to fork over their hard-earned cash to see an event or match. A bad wrestling promo, on the other hand, can make you want to crawl inside yourself and stay there forever, lest you perish due to the outright awkwardness it makes you feel. There have been some pretty cringy promos over the years, whether due to an uneasy execution, errant slip of the tongue, or a premise that beggars belief. Want proof? Get ready to crawl inside yourself, dear viewer. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 cringiest pro wrestling promos ever. Join us. Number 10, The Big Dog and the Beanstalk. Amazing to think now, considering how his WWE career has turned out and the level he's currently operating on, but there was a time when a substantial percentage of wrestling fans would be more than happy if Roman Reigns was given a lifetime ban from speaking on the mic. WWE tried and failed in their attempts to make the big dog the new John Cena, and then tried and failed again a couple of more times just to be absolutely sure he wouldn't get over as the company's number one babyface. Just days after another notoriously awful promo, which we will get to later, Reigns regaled Big Show with the tale of Jack and the Beanstalk, magic beans and all, replacing Jack's name with his own. Excruciating in content and delivery, seeing Roman struggle struggle out there was like watching a career suffer a slow and painful death before your very eyes. Far from being a badass renegade, the former S.H.I.E.L.D. member was literally reciting fairy tales and hoping that the audience would do anything other than heckle him. Apologies for speaking Carney, but this was the absolute shiz its, and on this evidence, Reigns deserved his reception at the Royal Rumble two weeks later. Number 9. Wrong Line, Brother for all his many, 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 many faults, it cannot be denied that Hulk Hogan in his prime was a master of the microphone whose overflowing charisma meant that just about everything he said was compelling, even if beneath the surface much of it was absolute nonsense. The Hulkster's gift of the gab has failed him on occasion, however, including an infamous segment during his 2003 feud with Mr. McMahon. Whilst verbally going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the WWE chairman, Hogan got all flustered and flubbed his lines four times. In essence, he was supposed to say that if Vince thought he was successful just because he was the right guy in the right place at the right time, then he was a delusional bastard. However, Hulk first said he was the right guy at the right place at the wrong time before calling himself the right gay at the right place at the right time, and then erroneously claimed that he had wrestled McMahon at No Way Out when it was actually The Rock who he called A-Rock. This actually never made it to air properly since SmackDown was a taped show, but some absolute legend hacked the satellite feed, then uploaded it for us all to enjoy and chuckle at. Number 8. Good Lucha Things Former WWE star Kalisto is a spectacular performer in many ways. He has an eye-catching mask and costume collection, can perform incredible feats inside the ring, and was absolute dynamite on the stick. Actually, that last part isn't true. Kalisto was not dynamite on the stick. In fact, he usually looked at the microphone absolutely terrified as if it were a stick of dynamite. On one of the rare occasions he was permitted to talk, the luchador uttered three words that ensure he will now live in infamy as a meme. Asked how he felt about being drafted to SmackDown in the 2016 draft, the former United States champion vowed to shock the world and take on Baron Corbin before losing his train of thought and ending the interview by saying he would make a good, a, 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 a good luch, a, a good lucha thing. Instantly realizing that he just pooped the bed and this was live and not a pre-tape, you can hear the mortified high flyer say, God damn it, as he luches himself out of the camera's view. That fancy mask couldn't quite hide the look of sheer embarrassment. 
Number 7. Titus Word Slide Titus O'Neil may have gifted us one of the most unintentionally hilarious moments of all time with his infamous entrance at the Greatest Royal Rumble, but it was a lot less fun watching him trip over his feet, metaphorically speaking, while cutting a promo on his former primetime player's partner, Darren Young. Sent out to drown in front of a feverish Brooklyn crowd on the August 22, 2016 episode of Raw, Titus tried and failed miserably to actually scrap that i'm not entirely sure what he was trying to do out there because for the better part of five agonizing minutes o'neill mixed up phrases said the wrong words left thoughts unfinished and just generally baffled an audience that had no clue what he was talking about bob backlin titus's words not mine finally came out to end the torture but really the wwe hall of famer should have been sent to the ring a good three minutes earlier if damage limitation was to be achieved o'neill is a great guy and is actually an eloquent public speaker, but on this night at the Barclays Center, I'm sure he would have taken flying headfirst under the ring over delivering this interminable spiel. Number 6. Half the Brain Sid Vicious gets his share of flack from certain fans for a variety of reasons. And while, yes, he would flake out as soon as softball season started and wasn't exactly the man you would watch if you wanted to see a great match, there is no doubt that the master and ruler of the world had it and was a big star during his heyday. Sid has a presence and natural charisma, but he wasn't necessarily a wordsmith and his brain could sometimes let him down with the lights on bright. Well, his half a brain anyway, because that's all vicious in his own bungled words had in his head. Addressing Kevin Nash on the November 15th, 1999 episode of WCW Nitro, Sid informed Big Sexy that you are only half the man that I am and that I only have half the brain that you do. Oh, Sidney. Nash was the last person he should have done this in front of, with the situation made even worse by his ball-busting buddy Scott Hall being in the ring with him. Also making it worse was Sid then complaining about Kev continually trying to make him look like a jackass. Did that to yourself, mate. Number 5. The Genesis of McGillicutty The original reality show formats for NXT take 10 supposed rookies, partner them with their WWE star pros, and then have them compete in challenges and matches with a weekly elimination felt at times like it was designed to humiliate the contestants. Poor Michael McGillicutty, the future Curtis Axel of course, didn't need any assistance in making himself look like a prat when he was handed a live mic following Caval's season 2 triumph. Now, to be fair to Mr. McGillicutty, you can see a slither of a coherent promo in there, but his delivery is so confused and he obviously gets his wires crossed when trying to hit the bullet points. The third generation performer perhaps wasn't expecting to be asked his thoughts after losing a competition he believed he would win, but that doesn't excuse the short but certainly not sweet would-be concession speech that he gave. Despite its brevity, it still contained several awkward pauses as he tried to get to the moment from this moment on, from now, this'll be the moment. Just get to the moment, Michael, please! Immediately buried by Michael Cole on commentary, McGillicutty had to contemplate his genesis on the long and lonely walk backstage, where I'm sure his co-workers were struggling to contain their sniggers. Number 4. An Honest Miz Take Nowadays, if you threw the Miz out on live television on zero notice with no notes and asked him to cut a promo on why he, I don't know, doesn't like mushroom flavoured soup, I guarantee the A-lister would knock it out of the park. Two decades of sports entertainment experience and a natural confidence have helped mould the two-time WWE champion into one of the most dependable talkers in the business. However, it wasn't always this way. Back in 2006, poor Mike Mazanin was fed to the wolves on WWE's flagship show as the host of that year's Diva Search. In his first appearance on Raw, the Tough Enough runner-up's brain seemed to melt when it came time to explain the rules of the contest and voting system to the audience at home. Miz later recalled how a cold sweat came over his entire body as his mind went blank and he forgot everything he was supposed to say. He sweated so much that the telephone number he had written on his wrist rubbed off and he made such a hash of trying to salvage the segment that he was sure that he was going to get fired when he got back to Gorilla. 
Fortunately, he was spared a pink slip and ended up marrying diva search entrant Maurice Mind, so don't feel too bad for him. Number three, Eli Cottonwood's Mustache Madness. Back to the original incarnation of NXT now, and another greenhorn not named Michael McGillicutty having an absolute mare during season two. For a segment called Talk the Talk, the contestants were given a one-word topic, 10 seconds of thinking time, and then asked to wax lyrical about it for half a minute. Percy Watson did just fine with glasses, and Caval gave a good account of himself with chicken, but then upstepped the massive Eli Cottonwood. When a promo's opening line is, what is a moustache, you know you are in for a hell of a ride, and the seven-footer did not disappoint. After informing the fans, who must have been on the edge of their seats, that it was the hair that formed on the upper lip, Eli then seemingly misremembered his own face and said that he himself didn't have one. He then said that none of the other NXT hopefuls had one, but that he had the best one, completely contradicting his previous incorrect point. The buzzer could not come soon enough, while Cottonwood's pro John Morrison tried to shield himself from the secondhand shame by hiding behind his clipboard. Number two, suffering succotash. When you look at Roman Reigns today, you see an ultra confident performer who is 100% sure of who and what he is. When he's talking, which these days he does a lot more than actual wrestling, the Tribal Chief grabs the attention of a WWE universe that has no choice but to acknowledge him. As we've already seen on our countdown, Roman wasn't always so commanding on the microphone, and a lot of his issues had to do with WWE's clunky verbiage. And is there anything clunkier than, you are a sniveling little suck-up sellout full of suffering succotash, son? A line Reigns was actually scripted to say to Seth Rollins, this one atrocious, toe-curling piece of dialogue was essentially emblematic of the company's issues when it came to their presentation of their supposed conquering babyface hero. After admitting that it was not easy to say, Romans then turned the cringe factor up to 11 by looking into the camera and winking. The head of the table is obviously awesome and is currently at the top of his game, but when you revisit moments like his Sylvester the Cat impersonation, it really is no surprise surprise that fans pushed back against him so vehemently. Number one, Jumpin' Jeff Farmer. Yep. Imagine a professional wrestler with the intensity of Stone Cold Steve Austin, the charisma of The Rock, and the larger-than-life presence of superstar Billy Graham. Well, dear viewer, imagine no more, because he's real and his name is Jumpin' Jeff Farmer. With a place guaranteed on the Mount Rushmore of terrible wrestling promos, the IPW jobber's response to a match with another no-hoper called Motley Cruz is so bad, it's actually brilliant. Starting off with the commanding cry of, yep, Farmer follows it up by letting everyone know that he don't like it when things aren't my, aren't going my way, and lambasting Cruz for turning the tables on him in a wrong way. And it just gets better from there, with Jumpin' Jeff scolding his foe for backstabbing him one way or another as he tries in vain to look angry before signing off with the immortal line of, this time, I am going full force. Making the whole thing even funnier is the recorded earlier sign at the bottom of the screen. They did 20 takes and that was the best one. Yep. There might not be an off-season in professional wrestling, but sometimes wrestlers do need to take time off. They could need to rehab an injury, serve a suspension, or simply need to go away because they've been overexposed and have to leave so they can come back fresh. There are many ways to write a performer off television, simple, time-tested ways, but why go for those when you can get creative with stabbings, explosions, and good old-fashioned kidnappings? I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 bizarre ways wrestlers have been written off TV. Join us. Number 10, Stabbed in a Nightclub. Toward the end of 2004, it was becoming plainly obvious that John Cena was the next major wrestling star on the cusp of breaking out. WWE sensed it, which is why they made Cena United States Champion and selected him to head up their first WWE Studios vehicle, the Marine. Since the Marine was being filmed in Australia, Cena needed to not only drop his title, but be excused from storylines for about a month or so. He did the honors 
close to a debut in Carlito, and then afterwards it was announced that the Doctor of Thugonomics had been stabbed while out in a Boston area nightclub. Can you imagine trying to explain to the young, impressionable members of the C Nation what a stabbing is, or a nightclub, or Boston? A week later, SmackDown general manager Teddy Long told the rest of the assembled roster that Cena had been stabbed in the kidney and that it was unknown how long he would be out for. Until the rap party down under is my guess. Carlito's bodyguard Jesus was accused of doing the dirty deed and Cena duly came back for revenge with nary a scar on his body. Number 9. Delayed by Janice. When it comes to wacky ways to write wrestlers off TV, perhaps no company quite compares to TNA slash Impact. Right at the top of the list, well, in at number nine here, but you get my point, is the logic-defying way that Rob Van Dam was excused from duty in the summer of 2010. The whole flipping show was feuding with the deranged Abyss, who, at that time, had taken to carrying around a massive plank covered in nails, which he affectionately named Janice. It was a ludicrous weapon that really should have never been near television, don't get me wrong, I'm so glad it was, but TNA Creative put the thing to use by having the monster actually use it on RVD on the August 12th, 2010 edition of Impact. Abyss dragged Van Damme backstage during the show-closing brawl, and when the camera cut to them shortly after, the champ was lying singlet-torn in a pool of his own blood while Abyss stood over him, cradling his toy. Now, I'm no mathematician, but putting two and two together here equals attempted murder. This grow grotesque angle was deemed necessary since RVD's contract called for a bunch more money if TNA exceeded his set number of yearly dates and they were close to reaching that figure. He was stripped of the TNA title while he took a six-week vacation, with TNA claiming he had suffered spinal trauma and possible brain damage during the attack. And honestly, I feel like I also suffered possible brain damage from watching this silly angle unfold. Number 8. Destination OVW The Spirit Squad stable was WWE's way of calling up five prospects from Feeder Farm OVW at the same time. The quintet of green-clad greenhorns were thrust into the spotlight as the annoying male cheerleaders who initially did dance routines and then somehow found themselves in major storylines and in possession of Raw's World Tag Team titles. The art of falling upwards, eh? In mixing with the McMahons, D-Generation X, and other top stars, the group's members must have felt like they were made men. Hell, they even got a pay-per-view main event out of their association with Vince, Shane, Hunter, and Sean, even if they were trounced and then humiliated in the five-on-two handicap match at Vengeance. Unfortunately for them, that wasn't the end of their humbling at the hands of the game and the heartbreak kid. After losing a five-on-three handicap match to DX and Ric Flair on the November 27th 2006 episode of Raw, Mikey, Johnny, Kenny, Nikki, and Mitch were bundled into a crate labeled Destination OVW Louisville, Kentucky, letting fans know that they were literally being shipped back to developmental. A funny in-joke to those in the know, I'm willing to bet that the reference went over the collective heads of the casual fan. Number 7. Thrown in front of a train More madness from TNA now as we look at the way that Mickey James was written off television on the June 3rd, 2015 episode of Impact. The former Knockouts champion had no more dates left on her contract, so TNA devised a way to get her off their screens while they further negotiated. And what better way to do that than by having James Storm try to kill her at a train station. The cowboy took this step after James turned down an invitation to Storm's revolution stable, walking the seemingly clueless Mickey to her demise by taking her to the station and bumping her off the platform. Because of the camera angles and the quality of the CCTV-style footage, it was hard to tell whether she fell six feet, six inches, or what, but the diabolical Storm's monologue indicated that she was lying a long way down. So, did the next episode of Impact begin with Mickey's funeral or the arrest of James Storm? Nope, life simply continued as normal until she returned less than a month later to confront Storm and challenge him to an intergender tag match. Personally, I would be more concerned with pressing charges, but each to their own. Number 6. Kidnapped by Ninjas Samoa Joe wasn't injured or in the middle of contract talks or, well, anything when TNA decided to write him off television in February of 2010. The new management, Hogan, Bischoff and the lads, simply wanted him to take a vacation so that he 
make a comeback repackaged as a vicious, psychopathic heel. The great idea they had to take him away from the impact zone was by having him lose a match to Orlando Jordan, great start, and then have him be attacked and kidnapped by a mysterious group of ninjas. Even better ending. In the grand scheme of things, being attacked and bundled into a white van by ninjas isn't the weirdest thing TNA have ever done or would ever do, but bear in mind this was one of their top stars and a former world heavyweight champion. Also, the so-called ninjas were wearing shorts. The brainchild of Bischoff or Vince Russo or whoever you want to blame, personally I just blame both because it's easier and they're both guilty as sin as far as I'm concerned, the kidnapping wasn't explained or even really referenced again when the Samoan submission machine simply returned due to the roster being thin on the babyface front. Cool swerve, bro! Number 5. Buried Alive in Cement At the 2003 Survivor Series, The Undertaker was written out of storylines by being buried alive by Kane so that he could heal up from injuries and grow his hair out in anticipation of returning months later with his revived dead man persona. Fans were pleasantly surprised to see Paul Bearer by the Phenom side when he re-emerged at WrestleMania 20 since it was the first time in about four years that Taker's kayfabe father had been spotted in a WWE ring. During his absence, William Moody had battled health issues related to obesity and depression. As part of his signing bonus, WWE agreed to pay for gastric bypass surgery, enabling him to become an on-screen character once more. Regrettably, Moody developed gallstones and needed gallbladder surgery not too long after his return, with WWE opting to write Paul Bearer out of storylines. After being kidnapped by the Dudley Boys at the behest of Blue Brand GM Paul Heyman, Bearer's fate was sealed at the Great American Bash when he was submerged in cement at the end of the Concrete Crypt main event. It was later clarified that Bearer was simply gravely ill rather than actually deceased. No need to panic then, eh? Number 4. Sleeping with the Fishes One situation that forces WWE's hand and typically requires someone being written out of storylines is when a superstar falls afoul of the company's wellness policy. When a wrestler, particularly a top-level talent, is forced to sit out for 30 or 60 days, WWE need to come up with some kayfabe reason for them being MIA. Typically, they will shoot an injury angle, although sometimes they will come up with something a bit juicier, like when Ken Kennedy was suspended in the storyline for impersonating a McMahon. NXT's Troy Two Dimes Donovan was one of the unlucky few who have been outright fired after getting popped with a wellness policy violation. Because he was part of the storyline at the time as a member of Tony D'Angelo's family, WWE felt the need to explain his disappearance. After an off-screen betrayal, Tony and his associate Stax were shown standing on a bridge when a splash was heard. Then Donovan's watch was thrown into the water and it was said that the released star was probably sleeping with the fishes. Now I've heard some rumours about what those perverts get up to in Orlando, but that really takes some… oh wait a minute, it just means he got whacked off. Sorry, I mean whacked. Or did I? Number 3. Fired and then kicked in the balls by Linda McMahon Furious after the entire McMahon family were hit with Stone Cold Stunners at 2005's Big Raw Homecoming, Patriarch Vince promised the following week that someone would be fired in the fallout. While Vince claimed that he and Shane could take care of themselves, he blamed the announced team of Jonathan Coachman, Jerry Lawler and Jim Ross for not taking action and preventing his wife and daughter from being assaulted. Coach and King were let off the hook after a apologising, but good old JR was not so lucky. He was forced to say sorry to Stephanie and Linda personally, but evidently it wasn't good enough because he was fired by Linda who turned heel, yes Linda McMahon turned heel and kicked the commentator in the government mules for good measure. It was an odd segment, no doubt, positioned in the main event slot no less, and a bizarre way to write Ross off of television. The man in the black hat needed to take time off for colon surgery and WWE had genuine designs on replacing him in the booth full time. In their minds, this was actually the Hall of Famer's send-off. Well, until next week and Dr. Heine, that is. Number 2. Suspended for insulting the big boss man's mother We have seen some gosh darned low-down tactics employed by WWE heels over the years, from mocking genuine tragedies to good old-fashioned attempted murders and everything in between. But insulting a man's mother? Well, I'm sorry, that's just taking things too 
far. Former on-screen WWE president Jack Tunney evidently agrees because he indefinitely suspended Rick Rude and further punished his manager Bobby Heenan after they incessantly took shots at the big boss man's big mama. I mean, his name is Rick Rude. It's not Rick Nice or even Rick Respectful for that matter. Coming abruptly in the middle of their feud, ravishing Rick's suspension was done because the former Intercontinental Champion had in fact up and quit the promotion. Tired with his position and pay, Rude handed in his notice. WWE fully intended to hold him to the terms of his contract, however, thus the indefinite suspension, which could have easily been lifted if slash when he returned. Rude didn't return, though, and so Tunney's statement basically wrote him off until he returned as a member of DX almost seven years later. Number 1. Limo Explosion Though he was an ever-present as a television character for the best part of 25 years, Vince McMahon man would periodically decide to write himself off his own shows, either because he thought that he was too old to be on the box, or because he wanted the attention and emphasis to be placed on others. As with anything Vince related, the ways in which he was written off were typically far from normal. He's had the million dollar mania stage collapse on him, he's been beaten up inside Hell in a Cell before having his face shoved in Big Show's backside, and so on and so forth. That said, none of these quite measure up to when he was literally blown up after closing the door of his limo on the Mr. McMahon Appreciation Night episode of Raw in June 2007. The genetic jackhammer's mental faculties had recently been questioned in kayfabe, wink wink, and he had been acting oddly the whole show based on a bad feeling before he went kaboom. This was supposedly going to lead to a long and twist-laden investigation to find out the culprit before real-life tragedy forced Vince to drop the act and claim that he had faked his own demise. WWE Dream Matches should, in theory, be reserved for television or pay-per-view. If fans are dreaming about it, they are likely to tune in or stump up the funds in order to watch it, and if built up properly, Dream Matches can end up setting records. On occasion, however, WWE books such matches when cameras aren't rolling, either at a non-televised live event or in a dark match following a TV taping. Great for the fans that were there on the night, sure, but also bitterly disappointing for jealous fools like me who weren't there but would love to have seen these mouth-watering contests. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling and these are 10 WWE Dream Matches that weren't televised. Join us! Number 10. Randy Savage vs. The Undertaker By rights, Randy Savage and The Undertaker should have had at least one televised match in 1991, with the Macho Man seeking revenge on the dead man for his part in crashing Randy and Miss Elizabeth's wedding reception at SummerSlam. The two Hall of Famers never clashed on television, but they did meet in a trio of singles matches, all three of them taking place before Taker and Jake Roberts decided to ruin the best day of Savage's life. The first was a bonus non televised dark match at the end of the July 30th primetime wrestling television taping, with Randy going over to send the crowd home happy. A few clips from this match have been released by WWE for their Five Things series, but the full thing remains unseen. The other two bouts were house show headliners just days later on August 1st and 2nd in New Brunswick, Canada and Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The Phenom won the first outing and Savage prevailed in the second. WWE surely must have at least considered a program between the two larger-than-life personalities, but it never came to be. Number 9. Batista and Shawn Michaels vs Ric Flair and Triple H When Batista beat former mentor Triple H to capture the World Heavyweight title in the main event of WrestleMania 21, he was expected to pull the wagon going forward, representing the Raw brand and, by extension, the company as THE guy. That meant headlining the traditional post-WrestleMania tour of Europe, though he wouldn't have to carry the load all by himself. While a few nights of the tour had the animal go over on the game and Ric Flair in two-on-one handicap matches, the rest of them saw Big Dave team up with Shawn Michaels to take on H and H in a blockbuster tag match. That is a pay-per-view quality doubles bout right there, and fans in Aberdeen, Newcastle and Nottingham must have been thrilled to get it. One of the matches from my adopted home of the tune, How A The Lads, has surfaced in fan cam form and shows the four superstars putting in a real shift for close to 30 minutes before the babyfaces triumph. WWE never booked the bout stateside or bothered to put it in front of the cameras. The fools. 
Number 8. Brock Lesnar vs Kevin Owens Some things just look cool on a marquee. The Beast Incarnate vs The Prize Fighter would certainly fall into that category, though WWE have thus far failed to book the match on television or pay-per-view. Despite being a big show player, Brock Lesnar has been known to work select house shows since his 2012 return. Feeling the need to beef up their card for their Madison Square Garden stop on the road to WrestleMania 33, WWE put Brock in the ring with Kevin Owens on March 12, 2017. It was a combination befitting the world's most famous arena, even if the match didn't go on last. That honor went to Bray Wyatt defending his WWE title against John Cena in a no DQ match. And even though KO had only lost the Universal title to Goldberg a week prior and was considered a main eventer at the time, Lesnar characteristically ate him up in just a couple of minutes with the usual German suplexes followed by an F5. You can watch the match via fan-filmed footage on YouTube, but WWE really ought to run this one back one day, preferably with cameras rolling and a more substantial runtime. Number 7. Bret Hart vs Owen Hart in an Iron Man match Brothers Bret and Owen had one of the top rivalries of 1994, which included having two of the best matches of the year on pay-per-view. Their opener at WrestleMania 10 was a technical classic with a surprise finish, while their WWE title cage match at SummerSlam was a blue bar masterpiece. The Hitman and The Rocket were just so good together, I could have watched them go at it for an hour. And if I had been in one of a handful of house shows in the summer of 1994, I would have, because WWE booked the warring siblings in Iron Man match main events with Bret's title at stake. WWE had yet to televise an Iron Man match at that point, the first one coming when the excellence of execution took on HBK in the WrestleMania 12 headliner. Prior to Bret's Iron Man duels with Owen, he had gone the distance with the 60-minute man himself, Ric Flair, in early 1993. Bret retained his title in all four of his matches with Owen, winning two of them three falls to two and the others two falls to one. One of them is out there in the wild in fan cam form, for those of you who are into that sort of thing. Thing, which I hope is everyone watching this video. Number 6. Steve Austin vs Eddie Guerrero Steve Austin's infamous June 2002 walkout of WWE robbed us of seeing him go one-on-one -on -one with Eddie Guerrero at the King of the Ring pay-per-view. Stone Cold and Latino Heat were on a collision course when Austin decided to take his ball and go home, leaving Eddie to wrestle Ric Flair instead. I mean, as far as consolation prizes go, I've heard of worse. The Texas Rattlesnake had personally requested to work with the freshly returned Guerrero at the events because he felt that he needed an in-ring boost after experiencing a bit of a lull. As is often the case, WWE gave them time to work out the kinks in the run-up to it, and Austin vs. Eddie headlined four house shows. Incredibly, some fans who got to see it in Winnipeg were reportedly upset because the originally advertised main event had been Austin vs. Undertaker in a cage, taking ended up beating Van Damme in a cage instead. I've always said you can never trust someone from Winnipeg, you idiots. Anyway, Austin won all of their matches and gave Eddie and an interfering flair multiple stunners before drinking a few cold cans of alcoholic lager beer. Oh, heck yes! Number 5. John Cena vs Samoa Joe John Cena and Samoa Joe pretty much broke into the business together, training and wrestling at the California-based UPW promotion in the early 2000s. UPW acted as a WWE feeder farm of sorts, and both men were on the company's radar, though only Cena was signed to a developmental deal, while the Samoan submission machine made his name on the indies in Japan and for TNA before making the transition to WWE via NXT in 2015. Joe and Cena carry with them a big fight feel due to their style and legacy, so a match between the two on a WWE stage was an appealing prospect indeed. We have been teased with it a couple of times, in a tag scrap featuring Roman Reigns and The Miz on Raw, and in the 2017 men's traditional Survivor Series elimination match where Cena eliminated Joe, but the only singles matches between them went down on house shows in Illinois and Arkansas. Cena won both, duh, of what were said to be very hard-hitting matches. With Joe now in AEW and Cena wrestling once in a blue moon, the chances of this match happening again are about as good as you catching me in the next man's sweater. Number 4. Rey Mysterio, Kane and The Undertaker vs Edge, Eddie Guerrero and Kurt Angle 
thrilled by the response they received when they taped Raw and SmackDown from the Saitama Super Arena in February of 2005, WWE returned to the location for a pair of back-to-back -back non televised super shows in July. Showcasing the best of both rosters, WWE presented some major matches for fans in the land of the rising sun, like Shawn Michaels vs Chris Jericho and Batista defending the World Heavyweight title against Triple H in a street fight. The biggest of the bunch, at least from a star power perspective, was an interbrand six-man from Night 2. Rey Mysterio teamed with the Brothers of Destruction to take on the dastardly trio of Eddie Guerrero, Edge and Kurt Angle, who were accompanied by Lita just to add another Hall of Famer into the mix there. Going for just shy of 25 minutes, the match ended when Taker and Kane hit simultaneous choke slams on Edge and Angle, while Mysterio nailed his nemesis with a splash for a triple pin after giving all three heels a 619, according to reports. If anyone from the WWE Network is watching this video, and why wouldn't they be, please scour the archives to see if any footage of this exists post haste. Number 3 Brock Lesnar vs Mr Perfect Prior to being called up to WWE's main roster, Brock Lesnar worked plenty of non-televised live events and dark matches to get him ready for the big stage. For a few of these, the next big thing got to tangle with his Minnesota running buddy, Mr. Perfect, Kurt Hennig, who had returned to the company in the 2002 Royal Rumble. In fact, some of Hennig's first matches back were against the impressive rookie, including one dark match at a TV taping and two house show bouts. In their respective primes, this would have been a genuine dream match and an interesting styles clash of technique and guile versus power and brute force. Their dark match has cropped up online and does basically follow that formula for the five minutes it lasts, with the crafty Kurt putting him away with the perfect flex. Hennig actually won the other two matches as well, giving him a perfect record against Brock Lesnar. That said, Brock reportedly won the unscheduled rematch at 30,000 feet during a notorious plane ride from hell, for which Hennig was fired after, so I reckon they called it even. Number 2 Jake Roberts vs Hulk Hogan on paper, a feud and resultant big money matches between Hulk Hogan and Jake Roberts in their 1980s heydays is a total no-brainer. The Hulkster was the consummate hero, while the Snake was one of the most despicable villains in the business. Their characters were clearly well-defined, and the idea of them squaring off would have been intriguing and certainly drawn interest, and therefore money. So, why didn't it happen? Well, legend is that a proper Hogan Roberts program was planned, but Hulk got cold feet after a snake pit segment where Jake hit him with a DDT and some fans actually cheered the result. The segment was shelved from its intended broadcast and remains locked in a vault somewhere, as was a major match or series of matches between Jake and Hulk. The match did take place on some house shows in late 1986 and early 87, however, with Hogan retaining his his WWE title twice in Providence and once in Winnipeg, but Vince McMahon refused to book it anymore, much to the chagrin of Roberts, who wanted in on that red and yellow payday, brother. One final Jake Roberts vs Hulk Hogan match took place in Springfield, Massachusetts in January of 1992. Number 1 The Undertaker vs Eddie Guerrero the aforementioned star-studded six-man from Japan was one of only a handful of occasions that Eddie Guerrero and The Undertaker met in the squared circle. The only time they significantly interacted on camera was during the four-way WWE title main event of Armageddon 2004. Their exchanges were the best thing about the match, and the whole show for that matter, and hinted that a singles outing would be well worth watching. Regrettably, WWE failed to book the match before Latino Heat passed away, or at at least they failed to book it for television or pay-per-view, that is. But bang in the middle of Eddie's summer 2005 feud with Rey Mysterio, he took a break from losing to Little Ray Ray to put over the dead man in four consecutive house shows. Two of them were main events, while the other two were in the semi-main position and, unsurprisingly, Taker won the lot. One of the few to witness at least one of the meetings was former SmackDown head writer Alex Greenfield, who put it over as a tour de force that revolved around Guerrero trying to remove his opponent's eye. 
It's said that everyone was over like Rover during WWE's Attitude Era, so fervent were fans for the product at the time. While that may be true to an extent, not every gimmick was a winner, and some performers traded in perfectly decent ones for rotten offshoots, flat out duds, and sometimes potential career killers. Lame, offensive, or otherwise totally nonsensical, why WWE, or in fact the wrestlers themselves, thought that they needed to go in the these odd directions remains puzzling. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 terrible WWE Attitude Era gimmick changes. And if you're not down with that, I got two words for you. Like and subscribe. Wait, that's three. Number 10, Chainsaw Charlie. Terry Funk is one of the true legends of the professional wrestling industry, a beloved, timeless icon who doesn't need to be anything other than Terry Funk. The Funker was in the autumn of his in-ring career in the late 90s, but had established his worth during solid stints with WCW and ECW earlier in the decade before agreeing to join WWE in order to team up with his old hardcore running buddy Mick Foley. The day of his planned Raw debut, Funk was instructed that he would be coming out of a box as a mystery reveal. When informed of these creative plans, the man from the Double Cross Ranch requested that he be rechristened Chainsaw Charlie and he could cut his way out of the wood like Leatherface, as you do. Add a red shirt, a pair of Levi's, some women's pantyhose and baby powder, and hey presto, you have one of the most pointless and confusing gimmick changes ever. The former NWA heavyweight champion admitted himself that the idea was a dud in his autobiography, and thankfully Chainsaw Charlie was only a brief distraction. Number 9. The Sultan Rikishi was one of the Attitude Era's true success stories as the big man's career hit the stratosphere thanks to some blonde hair dye, revealing ring attire, choreographed dance moves, and an, um, cracking finisher that fans just lapped up. Though thankfully not literally. It took Keish a while to get there, of course, with a few subpar gimmicks before he found the one that made him a star. His spell as a head shrinker was fine, though obviously had a ceiling. Make a difference, Fatu, was a nice idea, though unfortunately let down by cheesy execution. But the Sultan? Oh, just dreadful. Insultan, more like, if you ask me. Unable to speak after supposedly having his tongue cut out, the Sultan had Iron Sheik and Bob Backlund do his talking for him. And that is never a good thing, is it? Amazingly, the Sultan found himself in the Intercontinental title mix and clashed with fellow Samoan Rocky Maivia at WrestleMania 13, but fans didn't buy the act and the big man was sent to develop mental before being fitted for a thong. Number 8. Rockabilly WWE famously tried to get Billy Gunn over as a single star on several occasions, pushing him strong as Mr. Ass and The One. Even though these attempts didn't really take, the effort was commendable nonetheless. If only they knew about scissoring back then. The first try at getting Billy Gunn over, on the other hand, was a totally fruitless endeavor. After splitting from Kayfabe Brother and smoking Gunn's tag partner Bart, Billy went solo in his spectacular accomplishments like, um, beating Flash Funk on the WrestleMania 13 pre-show, caught the attention of the Honky Tonk Man who decided to manage him. Gunn was repackaged as Rockabilly, given some new NAF entrance music and a rhinestone emblazoned jacket. Far from being cool, cocky, and bad, he was just plain bad and he and everyone else knew it. The push that came with the gimmick change was as half-hearted as Gunn's performances as Rockabilly, with WWE smartly changing tack by throwing him together with another no-hoper, the roadie, and forcing them to sink or swim. They swam like a couple of mega over-kippers, all right, quickly making their former guises feel like distant memories. Number 7. Golga John Tenter was actually in rival World Championship Wrestling when the Attitude Era was starting to kick off, wrestling as Avalanche, then The Shark, and then under his real name over the course of a so-so three years. The ex-Earthquake returned to WWE right as the Monday Night Wars were starting to swing in McMahon's favor, though he was now considered too thin to accurately portray the character that made him famous. The solution, apparently, was Golga. And no, that's not the name of some dodgy mouthwash you would find in B&Ms, but Tenter his new gimmick as a member of the oddities. Clearly, the days of headlining against Hogan were well in the rear view as he fumbled about in sweatpants, a brown mask, and an Eric Cartman t-shirt. And really, that was about all the gimmick was, an oddball with a South Park obsession, which, to be fair, must have been very relatable to many at the time. You don't have to say anything. 
I know how it is. I'm no longer the cool kid. His time tagging with Giant Silver and Co. wasn't a career highlight, but at least Tenta, universally regarded as one of wrestling's kindest souls, got a year-long spell during one of WWE's hottest periods. Number 6. The Real Man's Man William Regal's blue-blooded British snob gimmick fits him to a T and really helped him stand out during his time in WCW. The Blackpool brawler was as rough and tough as they come, but he was more than happy to ham it up and play things a bit stereotypical in order to get the desired reaction as a heel. It worked again when Regal came back to WWE in 2000, but his first stint in 1998 was a write-off. He wasn't a sniffling, stiff upper lip snob, but the real man's man. And what do real men do exactly? Why, they squeeze their own orange juice, chop their own wood, and shave with a straight razor, damn it! Oh, and they always wear a hard hat, flannel shirt, and jean shorts, obviously. Phew, just look at him. Doesn't it all make you want to eat a steak or pour some cement or just bash your head against a wall until you pass out from the pain? Regrettably, Regal was deep in the mire of addiction during this time and has stated that he doesn't remember too much of this short, ill-fated run. Actually, perhaps that's not so regrettable after all. Number 5. The Good Father Charles Wright was another WWE star who needed to go through several gimmicks before finding the one that suited him best. Papa Shango and Karma the Supreme Fighting Machine were not it, and while his time in the Nation of Domination as simply Karma was well spent, it wasn't exactly his ticket to the Hall of Fame. The Godfather, on the other hand, was a clear winner. Playing off his extracurricular activities as a strip club manager, Wright connected with the horny boys in the audience by bringing out scantily clad ladies for them to gawp at while imploring them all to light up a fatty. Unfortunately, when the Parents' Television Council grew tired of the half-naked women and naughty references and started pressuring the networks and WWE's advertisers to get rid, Vince McMahon turned the Godfather into the Good Father, the newest self-righteous member of the PTC parody group Right to Censor. Fans didn't like it, Wright didn't like it, and the change practically put an end to his WWE career. Number 4. Beaver Cleavage when your tag team partner gets put out of commission with an injury or an international arrest or something, you can either, I don't know, get a new partner, or try to make it on your own by changing into one of the most unpleasant, offensive, and downright awful gimmicks of all time. Headbanger Mosh chose the latter, or had the latter chosen for him, when Thrasher got crocked, transforming from alternative cone bra wearing misfit to incestuous leave it to beaver send up beaver cleavage. Introduced via a series of pain Painfully unfunny vignettes, Beaver Cleavage was shown to be an overgrown man-child still fawning after mother's milk. Seemingly impossibly, the saga turned even worse when Beaver broke character and it was revealed that Mrs. Cleavage was in fact Chaz Warrington's girlfriend, who then tried to frame him for domestic violence. Unsurprisingly, this lamentable episode came from the poisoned pen of one Vince Russo. Thankfully, it ended when Thrasher returned and proved that the wicked woman was a no good liar, bro, reforming the headbangers in the process. Number 3. Lowdown the fun wasn't over for Chaz Warrington with Beaver Cleavage, mind! Though the headbangers may have reformed, they had split once again in mid-2000 and the would-be mosh would be joined by poor D'Lo Brown for a new tag team gimmick. The former Eurocontinental champion was floundering following the tragic accident that saw Droz become paralysed, his subsequent tag team with the Godfather not exactly firing on all cylinders. That team looked like the bloody Road Warriors next to Lowdown, however, the doomed alliance between Chaz and D'Lo. Low. Taking on Tiger Ali Singh as their manager, Lowdown started dressing in Sikh attire and, like Tiger, spent most of their time complaining about the many injustices they were supposedly victims of. I mean, in fairness, they were replaced in the Royal Rumble by Drew frickin' Carey, so perhaps they had a point. Spending most of their time on weekend shows like Jacked, Metal, and Heat, Lowdown didn't light the world of sports entertainment on fire and quickly flamed out. But what can you really do when you're competing with the star power and charisma of our our man Drew. Number 2. Sexual Chocolate Vince McMahon went all in on Mark Henry when he signed him to a 10-year big money deal in 1996. 
Presented as a major star from the get-go, the world's strongest man made his in-ring debut on pay-per-view and was then put under the learning tree of Ron Simmons in the Nation of Domination. After his spell in the nation, however, things went about south for Henry, and by south I mean directly south to his roaming willy as he blossomed into sexual chocolate, bedroom deviant and romancer of the elderly. Was the tawdry direction change a rib? Were the creative powers that be upset with Henry's seemingly slow progress as a worker? Did Vince McMahon just wake up one morning and decide to ruin his investments career on a whim? None of the above, as it turns out, because Henry created the ladies' man character and coined the new name himself. Smooth-talking Lothario, who attracts beautiful women like a muscular magnet, is one thing, but I somehow doubt Henry foresaw just where this gimmick would go, including classic segments like his date with China's friend Sammy or his aging fiancé giving birth to a fake hand. Number 1. Naked Midian you pull one seemingly harmless rib for your co-worker and all of a sudden you're wrestling on pay-per-view in just a fanny pack, g-string and a pair of boots. Is it just me or do the boots seem superfluous in this situation? Dennis Knight, who had been pig farmer Phineas Godwin as well as Ministry of Darkness member Midian, sealed his fate when he stripped down and walked into a hallway after some WWE officials hastily asked the locker room to gather for a meet and greet. When word got back to Vince McMahon, he was aghast. Not that Knight had pulled such a stunt, but that millions of people around the world hadn't got to witness it. Starting off as a skit during dark segments, Naked Midian then began appearing on television, streaking to the ring and targeting in particular then-European champion William Regal. It was never explained why Midian suddenly wanted to get his kit off all the time, and the one-note joke got stale very quickly. Though to be fair, who knows how much money WWE made selling Naked Midian 8x10s. I know I've got one. Here's a bit of advice for you. Don't wrestle whilst drunk. You can have that one for free. Wrestling takes so much coordination to pull off safely. The last thing anybody needs is a performer with reduced awareness getting in the ring and putting everyone's safety at risk. So naturally, wrestling history is full of examples of people turning up to work absolutely sozzled. I'm Adam Pacisi from Cultaholic Wrestling and here are 10 times wrestlers performed whilst drunk. Join us. Number 10, Alicia Fox. Usually, WWE house shows or live events are like their own little pocket universes where wrestlers can faff about without any consequences and Chris Jericho can get in massive trouble for desecrating the Brazilian flag. However, in early 2019, something happened at an untelevised event that had major ramifications for one particular member of WWE staff. According to reports, Alicia Fox showed up to a live event in no condition to perform. Despite being intoxicated, she was given the all clear to wrestle. As we already mentioned, this is a stupid idea. Just because the cameras aren't rolling, that doesn't mean that people can't get hurt. However, the only person who really suffered as a result of this oversight was Arn Anderson. The former horseman had been one of the agents that night and was the one who said that Fox could compete in her compromised state. Vince was apparently furious and the enforcer was duly fired. Number 9. JBL John Bradshaw Layfield has many loves in life. The state of Texas, money, the soapy feel of his fellow wrestler naked in a shower. He also really enjoys beating the jelly out of ECW wrestlers, as this infamous moment from 2005 proves. At the first one night stand, JBL was one of the more vocal members of the anti ECW crusaders that were in attendance. The night ended with a massive brawl between the land of the extreme and the combined forces of Raw and SmackDown. And you all know what happened next. JBL went to town on the blue meanie, beating him to a bloody pulp in front of everybody. This was perhaps partly driven by his hatred for that brand, but alcohol also played its part because the former acolyte was absolutely wasted on that night in the Hammerstein Ballroom. You can hear the full extent of his drunken ramblings on the show's DVD extras, but we will let you discover them for yourselves rather than risk our channel being taken down. Number 8. Scott Hall Scott Hall's substance abuse issues started long before he decided to get into the wrestling business when a shocking incident in his mid-twenties left him suffering from PTSD. Turning to booze and pills and whatever else would help him forget the tragic night he ended up killing a man in 
self-defense, the bad guy's problems started to get really bad during his WCW days and was so pronounced that the company made the regrettable decision to turn his struggles into a storyline. After that, the former Intercontinental Champion continued to go down a dark path. Things seemed to be near their darkest when Hall showed up at a Top Rope Promotions event in April of 2011 and decided on getting physical despite barely being able to stand up without stumbling and falling over. Moving as if in slow motion, he looked worryingly frail and needed a small entourage just to get him from the ring to behind the curtain. A stark reminder, as if it were needed, of the daily battle the bad guy fought. Number 7. Jeff Jarrett Jeff Jarrett is one of the wrestling industry's greatest survivors, managing to reinvent himself and stay in the game for, what is it, coming up nearly 40 years now? While Double J's ability to adapt and stay relevant ought to be applauded and perhaps studied by scientists, there have, of course, been some bumps in the road. In the mid-2010s, when Jarrett was on the outs with TNA and attempting to start up his Global Force wrestling venture, it became apparent that the former NWA World's Champion was fulfilling some of his bookings after stopping off the bar first. He and wife Karen were accused of being drunk and disorderly at an IWA Mid-South show in 2014, and it was then alleged that Jeff was plastered at 2016's WrestleCon Super Show in Dallas. Things came to a head in October of 2017, when a video emerged of Jarrett wrestling while drunk at a Canadian indie show. The promoter claimed that the chosen one turned up late and drank until he passed out backstage before waking up and deciding to give it the old college try. Jarrett subsequently boarded a plane and headed for WWE-sponsored rehab. Number 6. Shawn Michaels Shawn Michaels definitely let fame and fortune go to his head and spent most of his run in the 90s drinking, smoking, or otherwise ingesting things that his grandmother would not have been pleased with. The showstopper's issues with bad stuff have been discussed in depth, and the man himself has even spoken about them at great length. In an interview with Sports Illustrated in 2017, Michaels admitted that he got into the ring after a heavy, heavy sesh. According to The Heartbreak Kid, he was so naturally talented that he could perform at a high level without being fully with it. If this was anyone else but HBK, we would call BS, but come on, the guy could get five stars if he was wrestling in a morph suit. The Texas native didn't go into any detail on which matches he wrestled drunk, and clearly he couldn't have ever been that bad as nobody has ever said anything. But just because you can wrestle drunk, Sean, doesn't mean you should. I'm not angry, I'm just disappointed. It's enough to make a man lose his smile, I tell ya. Number 5. Road Warrior Hawk WCW might have used Scott Hall alcoholism as part of their on-screen product, but at least they never pretended to kill the guy by shoving him off a titantron. At least that, eh? This is what happened during an infamous segment on Raw when Road Warrior Hawk fell off the big screen after weeks of drunken antics. Well, I say fell, but we all know it was Droz who pushed him. Whilst all this stuff was within storyline, there was another instance of the H-Man turning up to an event in less than stellar condition. SummerSlam 1992, Wembley Stadium. That kid who said Bulldog was going to win whether he wanted to or not. What a time to be alive. However, there would have been no use asking Hawk about this night, as he was so tanked up for the LOD's match against Money Inc. that there's no way he could have remembered any of it. Ted DiBiase and IRS apparently complained about Hawk's behavior, but he was never properly punished for his unprofessionalism. Number 4. William Regal Blackpool's greatest son will be the first to tell you that his career in life was severely hampered by a dependency on booze and pills. William Regal had serious issues with the stuff and even had to check into rehab in 1999 to help sort out his addictions. The following unfortunate incident on Raw took place before he had a chance to clean himself up. Under the name Stephen Regal and with the so bad it's amazing real man's man gimmick on his side, his lordship was set to face gold dust on the November 2nd 1998 edition of WWE's flagship show. From the moment he steps out, you can tell that something is up. He trips up slightly walking to the ring before delivering a slurred promo that's genuinely quite hard to sit through. How he remembers all of his words is a minor miracle, but there is no hiding the fact that he is royally pissed up here. Furthermore, he then goes on to have his match. The guy could barely walk down to the ring in a straight line, and here he was trying to apply chin locks. Thank the Lord that those days are now behind him. Number 3. The Sandman How are we only now speaking about the original ECW? The house that 
Heyman built was notorious for having no rules, a policy that seemingly extended to the real world for those who called it home. Whilst there's been plenty of rumors surrounding the culture of the ECW locker room, there is no getting around the fact that Sandman would quite often wrestle whilst drunk. I mean, he literally downed beer as part of his entrance. It's not like he was trying to hide it. At the same one night stand event that JBL got smashed and then smashed up Blue Meanie, Sandman was also completely blotto. You can see this when Stone Cold Steve Austin attempts to deliver the show closing promo, but gets routinely distracted by Sandman getting right up in his face. Just look at those eyes, he's not even on this planet anymore. Plenty of stories about old Sandy persist to this day, like the one about him dropping acid right before a ladder match with Sabu, but clearly he was comfortable enough with wrestling drunk to do it so often. Number 2. Jake Roberts Alongside Scott Hall, Jake the Snake Roberts is probably the wrestler most closely associated with a career hampered by substance abuse. One of the most popular performers of the late 80s and early 90s, Jake's predilections cost him many years of his career and might have cost him his life had DDP not stepped in. When it comes to drunken wrestlers, few events are as infamous as 1999's Heroes of Wrestling from Las Vegas. What was supposed to be a celebration of a bygone era turned into a stark reminder that all of your childhood favorites were not what they used to be. Roberts was meant to wrestle Jim Neidhart one-on-one -on -one at the event, but got so drunk that the promoter made the match a tag team bout instead. This did little to fix things, as Roberts was still clearly out of it. We're not sure what's worse, his backstage promo, him rubbing himself on a member of the crowd, or him pretending that his snake was his willy. You decide. The Hall of Famer is fortunately doing a lot better now, but there was a time where things did not look good for the master of the DDT. Number 1. Andre the Giant If there is one thing we know about Andre the Giant, it is that he could drink. Well, and also that he was a giant. Clues in the name, innit? There are countless myths and legends surrounding the big man's tolerance, including that he once put away 156 beers in a single sitting. One of the most talked about incidents regarding Andre's drinking interfering with his work came in 1986 when he took on a Japanese wrestler named Akira Maeda. The match was a total mess as Akira got so angry at his opponent's drunkenness that he started attacking him for real. After 30 agonizing minutes, and Antonio Inoki came down to the ring and demanded that the match be stopped. And when Inoki told you to do something, you did it. Rumor has it that the New Japan founder sent a tanked up Andre into battle on purpose to teach the unruly Akira a lesson. While TNA has long been a place where stars from other promotions can go to prolong or even save their careers, it's also true that some TNA performers truly kick on when they themselves leave to go elsewhere. They might not have been the lowliest loser in the impact zone or anything, hell, some of them are highly decorated and considered legends of the promotion, but these TNA wrestlers found out that a scenery change did them the world of good and only enhanced their legacies. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 TNA wrestlers who reinvented themselves after leaving. Join us! Number 10. Lance Hoyt After a few years working the Texas Indies, Lance Hoyt rocked up in TNA as Dallas, the bodyguard come partner of Kid Cash. After the Techy Cash left to go to WWE, Hoyt floundered for a while before being repackaged as a member of the Rock and Rave Infection. Alongside Jimmy Rave and Christy Hemi, at least the big man had a role on TV, even if their faux rock band shtick was strictly mid-card material. Hoyt left TNA and signed with WWE. WWE in 2009, with many predicting the 6 foot 8, 270 pounder would fare well in the supposed land of the giants. Unfortunately, he didn't, with WWE doing their utmost to make Vance Archer as generic as possible. His team with Kurt Hawkins may have had some potential, but it went unrealized until Archer was inevitably future endeavored. Landing on his feet in New Japan, it was in the Far East that Archer finally started to display what he was truly capable of doing. His strong work in the land of strong style also got him noticed by AEW, and these days his time twatting about the Impact Zone with a Guitar Hero controller feels several lifetimes ago.
Number 9. Kazuchika Okada In Japanese wrestling culture, it's traditional for a rookie to go on a learning excursion abroad where they will gain experience before returning to their home promotion. It's a tried and tested system that exposes future stars to new training methods, wrestling styles, and other important things that will aid in their progression and prepare them for a push down the line. Unfortunately for Kazuchika Okada, part of his learning excursion meant being sent to TNA during the Hogan and Bischoff era. That that meant in frequent matches for the prospect, and when he did get booked on shows, usually the low priority explosion, he did jobs for the likes of Stevie Richards, Doug Williams, and Rob Terry. Given a makeover in early 2011, Okada became Okato, a character based on Kato from the Green Hornet series. Just look at him in that stupid mask. Doesn't exactly scream future IWGP champion, does it? However, that's exactly what our man quickly became once he left Orlando and went back to his home country. The Rainmaker has since become one of the very top professional wrestlers on the planet, while Impact Wrestling officials reportedly felt compelled to apologize to both the performer and New Japan for his past treatment treatment under a previous regime. Number 8. Ekmo Fatu Following a series of regrettable inside and outside the ring incidents, three-minute warning member Jamal was let go by WWE in June of 2003. Luckily for him, TNA had somehow managed to stay in business for the past year, providing him with a gig to fall back on. Aligning himself with Sonny Siaki, Ekmo Fatu looked set to be a player in the TNA tag team division as they enjoyed something of a decent push and victories over America's Most Wanted and Danny Doring and Roadkill. It's hard to say just how far the agile super heavyweight would have gone during the Nashville Fairgrounds years, but ECMO didn't stick around to find out. That's because he took a more secure and better paying job with All Japan Pro Wrestling. He wrestled his last TNA match in August of 2004, putting over Alex Shelley, but his work in the Land of the Rising Sun had convinced WWE he was worth another shot. They rehired him, repackaged him as Umaga, and after epic matches with John Cena and his party participation in the Battle of the Billionaires, nobody was going to wax nostalgic about TNA's ECMO Fatu, were they? Number 7. Consequences Creed Austin Creed's TNA debut was certainly auspicious as he was drafted in by Ron Killings as the replacement for controversial NFL star Adam Pacman Jones at Bound for Glory 2007. Consequences Creed teamed with Ron Killings, losing the TNA tag team titles to Styles and Tomko on the show. Good job, newbie. He may have dropped the gold on his first night in, but Creed clearly impressed TNA management, securing a contract and becoming something of a utility player in the tag and X divisions for the next couple of years. Shortly after his release, Creed signed a WWE developmental deal, paid his dues in Florida Championship Wrestling and then NXT before receiving his call-up. Must have felt like deja vu all over again, because his first assignment was teaming with his former TNA partner, who was now going by the name R-Truth. That act didn't go very far, but the New Day certainly has. Xavier Woods, along with Kofi Kingston and Big E, are one of the most beloved groups in WWE history, while Woods himself has a litany of accolades to his name, including umpteen tag title runs and a King of the Ring tournament triumph. He should bring back the Apollo Creed gear, mind. Number 6. Rosita Less than a year after making her in-ring debut, Thea Trinidad was discovered by Tommy Dreamer and, following a successful tryout, out, inked a deal with TNA. Introduced as the kayfabe cousin of Sarita, Trinidad was rechristened Rosita and given an early push in the company's knockouts division. Sarita and Rosita won the knockouts tag team titles after just a couple of months of teaming together and would go on to hold the belts for a not too shabby 121 days. From there, Rosita joined Mexican America, which was basically just a diluted version of LAX. She became a bit part player from then on and her TNA run essentially fizzled out out and her contract expired. The next few years were spent gaining valuable experience until she signed a WWE developmental contract. Paired with Andrade Cien Almas, Zelina Vega shone on the microphone and during his matches, where she would toss in the occasional Hurricane Rana to spice things up a little. Since she and Andrade have parted ways, Zelina has become queen of the ring and a member of the rebooted LWO. Truly, she has a knack for maximizing her minutes and improving with every single appearance. 
appearance. Number five, Bobby Roode. Don't get me wrong, Bobby Roode's TNA wrestling run was pretty damn great, but it wasn't quite glorious, was it? Joining the promotion in 2004 as a member of Team Canada, Roode stuck around for over a decade and became a respected star in the company, a member of the much-loved Beer Money Inc., and finally, a well-deserved world champion. A little over a week after departing TNA, Robert Roode was shown front row at NXT TakeOver Dallas. For the next year, he would be a valuable asset to the black and gold brand, thriving on the bigger stage with a little help from one of the most infectious entrance themes in the biz. He was much, much more than a meme, of course, having become one of the most solid and consistent workers in the world during his 20 or so years in professional wrestling. And that's one reason why WWE were more than happy to garnish him with the United States and tag team titles despite his advancing age. Now doing his work behind the scenes following neck surgery, Rude is very much a member of the WWE family. Number 4. Judas Macias Puerto Rican journeyman Ricky Banderas was brought into TNA in 2007 for the promotion's own spin on The Undertaker and Kane saga. As the monstrous Judas Macias, Banderas was positioned as the brother of Abyss and the son of Father James Mitchell. He began his TNA career by attacking his sibling before a back issue forced him to take some time off. They rekindled their rivalry once he had recovered and Macias was given some dominant victories ahead of defeating Abyss in their first singles encounter. Their second, a barbed wire massacre, was to be the feud's blow-off as Banderas left TNA when he refused to sign a contract after realizing he could continue making more money elsewhere. He would return to TNA for two matches in 2013, but the following year, Banderas reinvented himself as Mil Muertes in Lucha Underground. The second ever Lucha Underground champion and Muertes held the title for 217 days and impressed viewers with his performances in great matches opposite the likes of Phoenix and Prince Puma. His brief TNA run is now but a mere footnote. Number 3. Jay Lethal After some standout performances in Ring of Honor, Jay Lethal attracted the attention of TNA and signed with Dixie Carter's promotion in early 2006. After a while wrestling in the X Division under his real name, Lethal was given a makeover and transformed into the Rand Andy Savage tribute Black Machismo. Impersonating the Macho Man awarded Jay greater storyline opportunities and got him screen time in memorable segments with legends like Ric Flair and Hulk Hogan, but the character always had a ceiling. He exited TNA in April of 2011 and went right back to his old stomping ground Ring of Honor. Far from a bit part player there, Lethal set about winning everything there was to win in the company, putting on some tremendous matches in the process. The peak of Lethal's renaissance came when, as reigning television champion, he won his first Ring of Honor world title. Holding the belt for a lengthy 427 days, Jay Lethal was the top dog in Ring of Honor, and across his two reigns with the title, he holds the record with a mammoth 707 combined days as Ring of Honor world champ. Number 2. AJ Styles A TNA original, AJ Styles was involved in the very first televised match in the promotion's history and became the inaugural X Division champion on their second ever show. That was simply the tip of the iceberg for the Phenomenal One, who across a 12-year run wrestled everybody, won everything, and did just about all there was to do in a TNA ring. He was the company's MVP for an age and did everything he could to put them and himself on the map. Which is why it's curious that TNA pretty much just let him leave in 2014 by offering him a much lower contract. Not that AJ stood around crying about it. On the contrary, he went ahead and reminded everyone just why he's considered one of the very best in the world. Runs in Ring of Honor, New Japan and elsewhere were gold laden and opened the door to WWE. Some fans questioned the idea of Styles continuing his success under Vince McMahon's watch, but it didn't take long for those people to look foolish now, did it? Amazingly, AJ has actually wrestled more matches for WWE than he did for TNA and likely has a job there for life, not to mention a place in their Hall of Fame. Number 1. Eli Drake An overnight success 20 years in the making, the man now widely known as WWE superstar LA Knight had a long road to reach the Sports Entertainment Summit. Debuting all the way back in 2003, Sean Ricker worked for various independent leagues before receiving 
receiving a WWE developmental deal in 2013. He never actually wrestled on NXT TV, however, and Slate Randall was released after a year of relative inactivity. Landing in TNA, soon to be renamed Global Force Wrestling and then Impact, Ricker as Eli Drake really put himself on the map by winning major titles and feuding with top stars. He held the company's world title for a commendable 146 days, but his role notably decreased once he dropped it. Scheduled to wrestle Tessa Blanchard at United We Stand 2019, Drake was fired by Impact after refusing to go through with the booking and criticizing intergender wrestling in general. After a couple of years with the NWA, Ricker re-signed with WWE. It hasn't always been plain sailing, Max Dupree anyone, but the Red Hot LA Knight currently has got the wrestling world by the balls. Yeah! Why on earth would anyone want to be a WWE announcer? Not only is Vince McMahon constantly yelling in your ear to shill whatever corporate sponsor the company shacked up with that week, but there's also a very real risk that your workspace could be destroyed by a bunch of rampaging wrestlers. In the long history of muscular dudes and dudettes getting chucked through a desk made out of exploding cardboard, a few instances stand out above the rest. And wouldn't you know it, we've got them right here. Lucky you. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 greatest announced table spots in WWE history. Join us! Number 10. Hart's Mold Breaker Bret Hart was an innovator in many ways during his career, helping to bring technical wrestling to WWE's main event, pioneering realistic selling in the company, and being the first person in recorded history to look good while wearing wraparound shades. You can also add first person to go through a WWE commentary desk to that list, as that is precisely what happened when he took on Diesel at the 1995 Survivor Series. As the hitman struggled to get back inside the ring from the apron, Big Daddy Cool pounced and shoved his opponent backwards, sending him crashing through the announce table, which in those days was a regular table with some cloth on it. Not only was this moment historic, but it still looks great. The way Hart slams clumsily through the wood adds an air of realism and spontaneity to the moment, making it seem as if something has gone wrong. Also, that guy falling off his chair is just classic. What a plonker. This is the table bump against which all others are measured, and it still stands out after all these years. Cheers, Brett. Hope you didn't have to pull too many splinters out your back. Number 9. The Big Dog Showstopper After being upstaged by Seth Rollins' cash-in at WrestleMania 31, Roman Reigns needed a new opponent who could help him find his footing by putting on athletic matches that… Oh wait, he's just got into a few with the Big Show. Show was put into a last man standing match with the Big Dog at Extreme Rules 2015, with all the conversation surrounding how he was going to keep such a gigantic opponent down for the 10 count. This despite the fact that the world's largest athlete had lost several last man standing matches in the past, including one to Shane McMahon of all people. One highlight of what turned out to be a pretty decent little battle came when Reigns ran up a set of stairs to charge into Show, who was standing atop the announcer's desk. This sent both participants crashing through the other table, leaving them both in a crumpled heap. This kind of spot had been done before, but seeing two men of such substantial girth go flying through the air like this was a sight to behold. Number 8. AJ's Phenomenal Flight Almost exactly a year after his clash with The Big Show, Reigns was now the defending WWE Champion, and his challenger was the complete opposite of Paul White. AJ Styles had stepped up to challenge the former Shield member, with their first title match set for Payback, a pay-per-view famous for… well, nothing really. Despite such an underwhelming stage, both men pulled out all the stops, lending some much-needed credibility to Reigns as the top guy. The most spectacular moment of the match came when Roman was stood outside the ring and Styles was inside of it, with some fiendish thoughts going through that soccer mum head of his. With the sort of reckless abandon only afforded to people who think the earth is flat, Styles launched himself at his target with a phenomenal forearm, landing right on the money and sending Reigns splattering through the table in a thoroughly satisfying visual. 
Massive props to both men for being willing to take such a risky spot on. Styles would bust it out again during his feud with Shinsuke Nakamura, but talking about that would just remind everyone of how bad that episode turned out, so let's move on. Number 7. Rock's Double Finisher Whilst Backlash 2000 might be best remembered for that insane pop Stone Cold Steve Austin got when he came out during the main event, it turns out there was an entire Rock vs Triple H match that happened before that. Who knew? Before he got some assistance from the Texas Rattlesnake, Rocky was in dire straits as the evil McMahon Helmsley gang had stacked the deck against him. Shane McMahon was the match's referee and was doing everything in his power to keep the WWE title around his brother-in-law's waist. Unfortunately for the boy wonder, things didn't go quite to plan. The Great One had the game in position for a rock bottom on top of the announce table when Shane attempted to intervene. This led to the boss's son getting put in the same position before both he and Trips were driven through the table with a jumbo-sized finisher. Cue an all-time great reaction shot from Vince, just look at his face. As entirely unrealistic as this moment was, it was awe-inspiring to watch three men crash through one table, sending pieces of it flying around ringside. Number 6. Shane's Texas-Sized Plummet When he's not being beaten up by movie stars, Shane McMahon likes to relax by reading books, playing with his kids, and jumping off the top of very high things. Shane has taken some pretty intense leaps of faith over the years, but perhaps the most famous or infamous was that time he tried to murder The Undertaker at WrestleMania 32. Even though the build to this match was all over the place, who remembers the lockbox and the majority of the action was about what you would expect from two middle-aged men who weren't full-time wrestlers, one moment in this Hell in a Cell encounter will ensure that it lives on forever. With Taker splayed out across the announce table, Shane scaled the satanic structure before flinging himself towards his prone victim. Sadly, the dead man wasn't as dead as he appeared, so got out of the way just before McMahon's body splattered into the desk like he was in a Looney Tunes cartoon. Nobody expected Shane to do something like this in his first match in seven years, as the sight of him falling to his doom reminded everyone what made him such a special performer in the first place. Number 5. Undertaker's Flying Chokeslam Our trilogy of Shane O'Mac getting his ass kicked concludes with this truly beautiful spot from the insane main event of King of the Ring 2000. World Champion Triple H was teaming with Shane and Vince to take on The Rock and the Brothers of Destruction in a match where he could lose the title without being pinned. What began as a fairly structured six-man soon broke down, with Shane about to hit Rock with a top rope move before Taker caught him. The maneuver that followed couldn't have gone any better. The American badass leapt off the apron, flinging Shane over his head and planting him through the announce desk with one of the gnarliest looking choke slams you will ever see. He even managed to land on his feet. Everything about this spot had to be perfect, otherwise it could have gone so badly wrong. Instead, everyone was on their A-game, resulting in one of the sweetest table breaks of all time. Number 4. Hardy Super Swanton Perhaps no wrestler in history has made a career out of crazy high spots quite like Jeffrey Nero Hardy. The face-painted warrior has thrown caution to the wind so many times that I'm amazed he's got any of it left, hitting a who's who of opponents with dangerous moves from the top rope, off various bits of the arena, and of course, from the top of a ladder. One of Hardy's most terrifying ladder dives, which is really saying something, came during his excellent SummerSlam main event with CM Punk in 2009. With a straight-edge superstar laid out across the announce table, the charismatic Enigma slowly climbed up a gigantic ladder as people in the crowd quickly realized what they were about to witness. With all the grace of a gazelle with a death wish, Hardy casually fell from the top, shifting his body at the very last second to deliver the Swanton Bomb to end all Swanton Bombs. Everything about this spot is just stunning. The height of the ladder, the nonchalant nature of the dive, both men selling it like they'd been hit by a train. Pure wrestling insanity at its very finest. Number 3. Orton and Batista Slay the Dragon Imagine if either Randy Orton or Batista had won the main event of WrestleMania 30 instead of Daniel Bryan. There wouldn't be a New Orleans anymore, fans would have raised it to the ground. Thankfully for the state of Louisiana, that didn't happen, but Bryan was very nearly taken out of action ahead of his legendary title win. 
The former evolution buddies decided to work together to take the bearded goat out of the equation, setting him up for a brutal finisher combo on the announce tables. With Batista on one table, he hurled Brian with a Batista bomb straight into the waiting arms of the Viper, who hit a picture-perfect RKO on his opponent through the second broadcast desk. Seeing that both men would go to such extremes to knock Brian out showed just how much of a threat they thought he was and only served to make his comeback later on in the match even more triumphant. Spare a thought for Randy's lower back during this spot, by the way, as you can clearly see him landing right on top of a monitor and then writhing around in pain afterwards. Not ideal, that. Number 2. Triple H's Dead Man Destroyer You know what sucks? Most of WrestleMania 27. You know what doesn't suck? That night's no-holds-barred match between Triple H and The Undertaker. Set up by an awesome silent segment on Raw and fueled by Taker's retirement of Shawn Michaels the year before, both of these icons went hell for leather, possibly because of the heated nature of the match, but almost certainly because they knew they needed to save this stinker of a pay-per-view. Amongst the litany of great moments, one stands out for its impact, choreography, and originality. Hunter was on jelly legs on the ring steps just in front of the announcer's area, so the Phenom decided to charge at his opponent with full force. The Cerebral Assassin was ready though, catching Taker in a gorgeous spine buster that drove both men through the desk behind them as the crowd went bonkers. This happened like 8 minutes into the match, which is nuts when you consider that they wrestled for almost half an hour. A sudden strike that was executed to perfection and caught everyone off guard, this spinebuster was easily the move of the night, which admittedly isn't saying much. Number 1. Foley's Famous Fall we debated not including this, as it's more of a hell in a cell spot than a table spot, but then we remembered that without the table being involved, Mick Foley probably wouldn't be above ground today. I mean, do we really need to go over what happened at King of the Ring 1998? Taker and Mankind climb the cell, Taker throws Mankind off the cell, good god almighty, home in time for tea. It is one of the greatest wrestling moments of all time, even if I did just sum it up in a couple of stupid lines. The fact that Mick took this fall through the announce desk is lost on most viewers who are probably concerned with the spectacle of the moment, but Foley's choice of landing spot went a long way to reducing some of the damage from this terrifying tumble. Obviously that was undone when he got chokeslammed through the cell itself, but still, watching the table disintegrate on impact gives a sense of just how dangerous this stunt was, and seeing Mick crushed beneath the wreckage only adds to the drama. The cell might get all the glory when it comes to this spot, but without the trusty announce table, it wouldn't be what it is today. While the wrestlers are obviously pretty damn important to WWE, it is world wrestling entertainment after all, it is also the job of the non-wrestling contingent of on-air personalities to provide some of the entertainment value. Or in the case of these guys and gals, maybe not. Because for every announcer, interviewer, reporter, or play-by-play -play commentator who carves out a niche for themselves or even becomes irreplaceable, there are plenty more who leave little, if any, lasting impressions. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 WWE non-wrestlers you don't remember. Join us. Number 10, Rio Rogers. You look like Rio Rogers. You act like Rio Rogers. Your name is Rio Rogers, but I got wise. You're Bruce Pritchard in disguise. Yes, you're not fooling me, Brucey P, because I know that's you under the fake Fu Manchu moustache. While Vince McMahon's right-hand man may have found success as the unspeakably annoying but very effective brother love, he wasn't so lucky when it came to Rio Rogers. The two-week tenure of Rio Rogers began when Jerry Lawler had to take some time off to deal with, um, personal business. Pritchard was roped in because he made people in the office, particularly Jerry Jarrett, laugh with his dead-on Dusty Rhodes impression. Bruce didn't believe a whole act based around his affectionate mimicry would work, and you know something? He was right. Against Pritchard's reservations, Vince threw the character on air after Pritchard had received the American Dream's blessing, with Rogers providing commentary on superstars and even getting his own one-shot talk show segment called Rio's Roundup. After a fortnight, the character was axed at the behest of WWE production chief Kevin Dunn and much to the delight of Brucey e. P. Number 9. Ken Resnick 
Killer Ken Resnick may not have actually killed anyone that we know about, but he did show up on WWE television in the mid-80s. Resnick had worked as a sports reporter prior to getting a gig with Vern Gagne's American Wrestling Association in 1983, replacing the outgoing Gene Okerlund as an interviewer. After leaving the AWA, Ken's pal Blackjack Lanza convinced him to audition for a job with WWE and he was duly hired on. Interviewing many of the biggest stars of the day, as well as hyping upcoming cards in major markets, Resnick was perfectly serviceable in his role and it felt like he at least did his prep work before going on air. His WWE run was not a long one, however, as he left the company after less than a year. Post WWE, Resnick did some work for other organizations like the Ladies Professional Wrestling Association and the American Wrestling Federation. WWE themselves flirted with the idea of bringing Ken back into the fold during the 90s, but it never quite panned out. Number 8. Steve Romero Of all the announcers WWE have had throughout the decades, Steve Romero was definitely one of them. Romero wore many hats, figuratively speaking that is, I never saw him wear an actual one, though for someone who showed up seemingly here, there and everywhere, you would be hard pressed to pick him out of a lineup. Joining WWE in December of 2004, our man Steve arrived with a mightily impressive resume, having spent 15 years in the sports broadcasting field. He had covered Super Bowls and Stanley Cups, but he wouldn't quite make it to WrestleMania, instead being assigned to commentate the lowly weekend shows Velocity and Heat. Romero also acted as a host of WWE 24-7, was the co-host of Bite This for a time, and worked briefly as a backstage interviewer on both Raw and SmackDown. Oh, I should also note that Steve was his working name, and that his real-life name was Todd, but I guess Mr. Grisham already laid claim to that moniker? In any event, Romero quietly left WWE in 2007 when WWE neglected to renew his contract. The streets will never forget. Number 7. Stephanie Wyand I suppose when you're being introduced as Todd Pettingill's Christmas present, things can only get better from there? Brought in to quote-unquote replace Randy Savage, Stephanie Wyand made her debut on the December 12, 1994 episode of WWF Mania. Not quite the larger-than-life ultra-charismatic presence of the macho man, Stephanie at least stood out as she was one of very few women in the company at the time. She and Pettingill were a, let's say, acquired taste, however, and never quite got their patter down to an exact science. Or, to put it more plainly, they were positively excruciating together on screen. Stephanie was involved in a few memorable moments, mind, co-hosting the 94 Slammy Awards as well as the first In Your House pay-per-view, where she and Todd memorably gave away an actual house. WWE may have been happy to gift some fan a roof over their head gratis, but they were actually going through some dark times financially, and Stephanie was let go in the summer of 1995 as part of sweeping budget cuts. Number 6. Joe Fowler SummerSlam 1993 is remembered for many things. Ted DiBiase's final WWE match, The Undertaker taking on Giant Gonzalez in a rematch at least six people wanted to see, Lex Luger celebrating his count-out victory over WWE Champion Yokozuna as if he just won the lottery. For me though, SummerSlam 93 will linger forever in my memory due to the debut of backstage interviewer Joe Fowler. A successful sportscaster who also dabbled in acting, Fowler popped up at the biggest party of the summer to get the thoughts and feelings of various WWE stars. That was about as good as it got for our man, who also did some work introducing matches on All American Wrestling before he was let go after just a few months. After leaving WWE, Fowler became well known as a pitchman in infomercials. Which means he's actually better at selling than most of the WWE roster at the time. Zing! With all due respect to Ludwig Borger, of course. I would encourage any of my fellow Fowler maniacs to check out his work playing a reporter in Cobra, The Mighty Ducks, and Independence Day. Hey, you can even come round my house for a VHS triple bill. Number 5. Bonnie Blackstone a lifelong fan of the business, Bonnie Blackstone used her genuine passion and abundant knowledge to secure a job as a presenter for the syndicated superstars of wrestling show between 1986 and 1992. Treated seriously in an era where females were typically dismissed, Bonnie later followed her husband, Joe Pedicino, for a short stint in his newly launched Global Wrestling Federation before taking a break from the industry. 
She tried to get back into it by sending an audition tape to WCW, but never heard back. WWE were interested, however, and hired her in the spring of 93. Blackstone could be spied holding a microphone on shows like Superstars, All-American Wrestling, and Wrestling Challenge during the summer. Her time in WWE didn't last long, though, and she would be gone come November. WWE were making cutbacks, and she, along with ring announcer Mike McGurk, were deemed surplus to requirements. In her prime, Bonnie was sort of like Renee Young in that she was enthusiastic, credible, and had an inherently likability about her. Had she come along during a different era, her WWE career may well have ended up being more notable. Number 4. Rue de Bonner I was going to use this opportunity to look at former interviewer and WWE home video host Craig DeGeorge until I realized that nobody would care. So instead, I'm going to use this opportunity to look at former on-air personality Rue de Bonner, mainly because her surname sounds a bit like a German person saying the Boner, and that's quite funny to me, certainly funnier than DeGeorge anyway. Having appeared on Star Search when she was just 13 years old and with a CV that boasted credits in shows like The Sopranos and some major advertising campaigns, DeBonna was welcomed to Team WWE in September of 2003 after an extensive hiring process. She didn't have any product knowledge, but she did have a pretty face and a lovely singing voice. She had had a hit single a decade earlier as a member of the group Boy Crazy, which was enough to convince WWE to give her a shot. Unfortunately, her lack of sports entertainment know-how or passion for the stuff shone through and the company gave up on her fairly quickly. Released in the summer of 2004, DeBonna would subsequently marry and then divorce her Afterburn co-host Josh Matthews. Number 3. Charlie Min Following in the nerdy footsteps of that loser dork Jameson, Charlie Min was a so-called superfan who somehow secured a position as a roving reporter. Sure, put Charlie Min on the payroll, but when I show up at Titan Towers offering to act as Mojo Rawley's manager for nothing more than a van full of expired Ico Pro, you call security and have me escorted off the premises? Anyway, always far too excited to interact with a WWE superstar, Min gave all us filthy marks a bad name with his constant screaming and fawning. As well as acting like a dweeb in front of the boys, Min also provided live event news updates. According to Jim Ross, Charlie thought that he was hot stuff and let everybody know about it, so he got ribbed a lot and it's no real shocker that his WWE career was of the fleeting variety. Brought in because he was young and fit in with the company's new generation drive to attract a more youthful audience, I would wager that Min's hyperactive delivery likely had the opposite effect as intended. Number 2. Barbara Bush Getting into the business via the time-honored tradition of being scouted at a Hooters restaurant, Kathy Dingman spent a few years on the indies before trying her luck by sending tapes to WWE and was hired in 1999. Originally set to portray a nurse named Connie Lingus, Vince Russo I swear to god, she was instead tasked with playing an EMT named Barbara Bush or BB for short. Ostensibly there to attend to the medical needs of WWE-stricken stars, BB was mainly used as eye candy in bikini contests and clothes shedding matches. Kathy supposedly would have preferred to actually wrestle and manage as she had done on the indies, but accepted her lot and tried to make the best of it. She did get involved physically now and then and was one of the women put through a table by those damn Dudleys. But while she was still picking splinters out of her spine, BB was released by WWE much to the annoyance of her then-boyfriend, Bob Hardcore Holly. Or perhaps he was elated. It can be hard to tell with old Sparky Plug. Number 1. Max Bretos Max Bretos was covering football in the early to mid-2000s when he landed a job with WWE. A longtime fan of the business, Bretos was hired on to act as a backstage interviewer. As far as I can tell, he showed up a few times on Raw in early 2007 and then made just a handful of appearances on SmackDown during the summer. Bretos pretty much flew under the radar and was just sort of there as a guy to hold the stick and ask the big questions like, could I have your thoughts on your match later and 
Well, that's about it, to be honest. That said, Max reportedly got high marks from people backstage for his professionalism and for, you know, actually knowing about the product. Bretos would leave WWE for unknown reasons, though he did work closely with another former WWE announcer, Jonathan Coachman, at ESPN. I don't really know much about ESPN broadcasters, but I can only assume, based on charisma and star power alone, that they were that channel's version of the Mega Powers. For much of its 20 plus year existence, TNA slash Impact Wrestling has been a good option for pro wrestlers looking to earn a living in the business. Many sports entertainers have had solid careers with the resilient promotion, some across multiple spells. Others, however, were gone before you could say, hey Dixie, should I be worried about this check bouncing? I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 wrestlers who only had one TNA match. Join us. Number 10, Canyon. It's often said that Chris Canyon never got a fair shake of the stick during his WWE run. The former WCW United States Champion was pummeled by the Brothers of Destruction, suffered a major knee injury, and then, when he came back, was pummeled by The Undertaker some more before essentially being jobbed out on the way to his inevitable release. TNA seemed like a good fit for the innovator of offense to pick up the pieces and remind the world just what he was capable of. Originally earmarked as Raven's opponent for 2005's Genesis pay-per-view, Canyon was instead replaced by PJ Palacco, aka Just Incredible, and his debut was pushed back a month due to what TNA felt were unreasonable monetary demands. When he did come in for Turning Point, there was a battle over what name he would use, with the two sides settling on the exceptionally creative Chris K. Where do they come up with this stuff? In any event, the match was short and unmemorable, and was essentially there to continue the ongoing story between Raven and Larry Zabisco, with Canyon, unfortunately, rendered an afterthought. Number 9. Lex Luger 2003 was not a good time in the life of Lex Luger. The total package had not wrestled much at all following the sale of WCW to WWE as his personal demons took hold of him. The nadir for Lex was the accidental overdose death of his girlfriend Elizabeth Hewlett aka Miss Elizabeth in the townhouse the couple shared on May 1st of that year. In his first match since Liz's death, Luger worked the main event of TNA's 70th weekly pay-per-view. The opportunity came about thanks to Sting, Lex's longtime friend and traveling partner. It was the face-painted icon that requested Luger be brought in for the match, which saw Lex tag with Jeff Jarrett in a losing effort against Sting and AJ Styles. Sting wanted Luger in so badly that he arranged his flight from Los Angeles to Atlanta instead of Nashville so he could pick Luger up and drive him to the show. Regrettably, a few wrestlers were reportedly pulled from the show due to the expense of bringing the former WCW world champion in. Though he never wrestled for TNA again, Luger got some revenge on the phenomenal one by putting him through a table a few months later. Number 8. Bob Holly By the time he was released by WWE in January of 2009, Bob Holly was one of the most tenured members of the roster. The former tag team champion had been there for 15 years, evolving from a sparky stock car racer to a grizzled veteran and locker room gatekeeper. Post WWE, Holly opted to work for select US indies and a few international outfits. He didn't resurface on mainstream television until he showed up at TNA's Hardcore Justice 2 page view in July of 2013, though the event was actually taped in March. Brought in because he was, you know, hardcore and the show was, you know, hardcore, the then 50-year-old was the surprise partner of James Storm and Magnus in a six-man elimination tag match against the Aces and Ace trio of Nux, DOC, and Wes Briscoe. His squad may have been victorious, but Holly was the first member of the team eliminated after he himself had eliminated Nux. It was a one-shot deal for Bob Corr, who later professed to be a fan of the TNA product and praised Magnus as someone with a great mind for the business and a bright future ahead of him. Number 7. Charlie Haas When Charlie Haas was released by WWE in the summer of 2005, the general assumption was that he would make TNA his new home. He had made it well known in the aftermath of being let go that he wanted to work there eventually, going so far as to name-check Christopher Daniels and AJ Styles as talents that he wanted to wrestle. 
It didn't end up happening, and Haas would in fact return to WWE within the year, even if Charlie's then-wife Jackie did join Dixie Carter's company. Charlie would get there in the end too, mind, just a lot later than he probably thought. In January of 2022, Haas made his Impact Wrestling debut, challenging his fellow amateur standout Josh Alexander. The next week, Haas wrestled his first televised match in an age and put forth a good showing against his younger opponents, demonstrating that he hadn't really missed a beat in his time away from the business despite suffering a concussion during the contest. Charlie praised Alexander after and endorsed him as the real deal while expressing his desire to work with Impact again either as an in-ring performer or behind-the-scenes agent. Number 6. Test Test's second run in WWE was sadly less than memorable as he bounced around on the company's version of ECW for a few months before failing a wellness policy test and getting wished well in his future endeavors soon after. About six months after leaving WWE, Test, as the Punisher Andrew Martin, strode into the impact zone, looking somehow even more massive and aligned himself with Sting and Abyss by helping them defeat AJ Styles and Christian Cage in a ladder match. Ten days later, at the Hard Justice pay-per-view, Martin teamed with the monster and the icon to beat Styles, Cage, and Tomko in the humdrum Doomsday Chamber of Blood match. And that's, as they say, was that, as Andrew Martin once again disappeared from public view. His TNA appearances would be his last major ones before his untimely death in March of 2009. As an aside, the former Intercontinental Champion had only been drafted in by TNA when Rikishi's asking price had proved to be too high. Ten grand per stink face, or so they tell me. <laughs> Number 5. China when China left WWE in 2001, there weren't many, or really any, alternative companies for her to work for, and Joni Laura seemed more interested in pursuing acting and modeling work anyway. When she did decide to re-enter the squared circle in the fall of 2002, it wasn't for TNA, but rather New Japan Pro Wrestling, where the ninth wonder of the world had an unlikely run filled with uncommon intergender matches. When her dalliance with the King of Sports came to an end, so too did China professional wrestling run. Well, for almost a decade anyway, during which time she battled various well-documented personal issues. Then, seemingly out of the blue in May of 2011, TNA brought her in as part of the ongoing rivalry between Kurt Angle, his ex-wife Karen, and her new fella, Jeff Jarrett. At Sacrifice, China teamed with the Olympic hero to defeat the Jarretts in a mixed tag match. It was her first match for TNA, and as it turned out, her last match ever as she got to end her career with her head held high and the spotlight shining on her. Number 4. Jim Neidhart and Tatonka The cocky young upstart challenges and beats various industry legends is a professional wrestling storyline we've seen many times over the years. It helped launch Randy Orton into the stratosphere, it helped keep Rob Conway employed for a little while longer, and it helped Jay Lethal look like a giant dork for a brief period in late 2009. And that's simply because, rather than call out and then defeat faces from the past, Black Machismo actually did the honours for Jim Neidhart and then to Tonga. The anvil, who looked like he had swallowed one on the way to the ring, looked really ropey for the short time he was out there before putting Lethal away with a power slam. Tatonka took a little longer to get the job done, but also managed to pin Jay after hitting him with a papoose to go. Alright, his Samoan drop was actually called the end of the trail or something, but if I'm going to get an opportunity to use one of Bobby Heenan's old jokes, then you know I'm going to take it. Also, notice how Jake Roberts, Kamala, and Coco Beware didn't answer Lethal's open challenge? That's because they were guests at his 2008 wedding to SoCal Val. It's called good storytelling, folks. Number 3. The Heartthrobs You remember the Heartthrobs, don't you? That ripped WWE tag team who covered themselves in baby oil and danced like Chippendales on the way to the ring? Now, please don't get confused with the dicks. Chad and James were members of the SmackDown roster, while Antonio and Romeo were on Raw. I guess each brand had to have one of whatever they were. Anyway, the Heartthrobs naturally looked to TNA for viable employment once they'd been pink-slipped by WWE. After showing up back Backstage at Final Resolution 2007 and subsequently working a tryout match, the Heartthrobs were given their big shot at Destination X. Introduced by Christy Hemi as the rebadged Heartbreakers, the team attempted to take down the chauvinistic Voodoo Kin Mafia on her behalf. 
They failed, naturally, and what's worse is they failed to make an impression on anyone with their performance as the match was positively rotten and seemed solely to exist for spots involving Christy and Kip James. Classic spots like, you know, the I'll pull my cup out and rub it in your face spots. It's kind of telling that the Basham brothers, Christy's next hand-picked opponents, were viewed as a major upgrade on this pair of throbbers. Number 2. Bart Gunn Contrary to popular belief, Bart Gunn did in fact have a successful professional wrestling career after he was butter-beamed into oblivion at WrestleMania 15. Rebuilding his reputation overseas, Gunn, under the name Mike Barton, became a foreign star for All Japan and then New Japan. One of the former WWE Tag Team Champions' few matches back on home soil took place in the Tennessee State Fairgrounds in Nashville for TNA. On April 9th, 2003, Barton worked the company's 40th pay-per-view, taking on Perry Saturn in a battle of the legit hard cases. Built up with a post-match angle the week prior, this battle of the New Japan Gaijin was surprisingly brutal and bloody. Pounding each other with stiff strikes and surly suplexes, Big Pez and the Brawl for All champions and simply went ham in a match that very much felt like it had been inspired by the Japanese strong style. In the end, Saturn got the win by submission after Barton sold like he had broken his hand due to the repeated punches. If his commitments in the Far East didn't take priority, you would think that Barton would have been good value as a TNA regular in this era based on his performance here. Number 1. Randy Savage in TNA's earlier years, they were constantly looking for that star or group of stars that would give them immediate credibility with the wider viewing public. That's partly why they went after the larger-than-life likes of Goldberg, Brock Lesnar, and The Ultimate Warrior. None of those would make the jump, but the Jarretts did manage to convince the reclusive, ostensibly retired Randy Savage to come in for a series of matches. Unfortunately, the macho man's heart, not to mention the rest of his battered body, was no longer in it, and Savage Savage only managed the one match for TNA, and just barely at that. In Randy's last ever in-ring appearance, he teamed with Jeff Hardy and AJ Styles to take on the Kings of Wrestling, Double J and the jumpsuit-wearing Kevin Nash and Scott Hall at Turning Point 2004. Appearing only at the conclusion of the contest, Savage could only really muster a so-called hot tag, cleaning house and applying a sleeper before blocking a sunset flip and pinning the then NWA World's Heavyweight Champion with a punch to the face. A singles pay-per-view main event over the title failed to materialize as Randy simply called it a day and retreated from public life. Where would professional wrestling be without championships? If you're gonna have people pretend to fight each other, then they may as well be doing it for a pretend title belt. These shiny pants holder-uppers have been the focal point of some of the industry's greatest moments, as well as shifting millions of dollars worth of merch. WWE currently has 14 active championships if you include NXT, but its past is filled with titles that have come and gone. Today, we will be looking at the ones that came and went in the shortest amount of time. Just a note, we are counting a title's lifespan from when it was first won to when it was officially deactivated. We are also including its entire history, rather than just the time it was in WWE, so no WCW or ECW title on here. Got all that? Good, because I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 shortest lived championships in WWE history. Join us! Number 10, the NXT United Kingdom Championship, 5 years, 8 months, and 20 days. In January of 2017, British wrestling fans were given a right old treat when WWE put on its first ever United Kingdom Championship tournament. This two-night event ended with Tyler Bate defeating Pete Dunne to become the company's first ever UK champ. At the age of 19 years old, by the way. Disgusting behavior, honestly. Sadly, what started out as brightly as the Blackpool illuminations fizzled out faster than you could say, hey up Chuck. Bate and Dunn had a great rematch at NXT TakeOver Chicago, but after Dunn won the title, the belt just sort of disappeared. The Bruiserweight was champion for a mammoth 685 days before dropping the belt to Volta, who held it for an even more impressive 870 days. Yet in all that time, the title got about as much exposure as we Brits get to sunlight. It didn't help that NXT UK didn't start up until over a year after the belt was formed, and even when it did exist, 
hardly anybody actually watched it. In the end, two-time champion Bates lost a unification match to Bron Breaker in 2022 to retire the title after less than six years in existence. A sad end for this most royal and beautiful of championships. Number 9. The WWF European Championship – 5 years, 4 months and 26 days the fact that the WWE UK title lasted four months longer than the WWE European title will no doubt give some Brexiteers a great deal of joy. On February 26, 1997, the British Bulldog defeated Owen Hart in a tournament final to be crowned WWE's first ever European champion. Over the next five plus years, the title became something for lower mid-carders to fight over when they had nothing else to do. Though the likes of Shawn Michaels and Triple H held it, the title is most famously associated with people such as D'Lo Brown, X-Pac, Shane McMahon and Midian who won the title by finding it in a bag. How prestigious. The championship eventually bit the dust on the July 22, 2002 edition of Raw when Rob Van Dam beat Jeff Hardy in a ladder match to unify it with his own intercontinental belt. It was a nice idea while it lasted, but this was definitely a championship with a limited shelf life. Also, only two of its holders were actually European, so yeah, kind of failed the mission statement there. Number 8. The NXT Cruiserweight Championship – 5 years, 3 months and 22 days Another short-lived title, another tournament started by Triple H. Sensing a theme here? The Cruiserweight Classic was a fantastic summer-long series of matches that enthralled indie wrestling nerds like myself in 2016. WWE presented us with some of the greatest performers under £205 from across the globe, including the likes of Zack Sabre Jr., Kota Ibushi, and everyone's favourite, Kenneth Johnson! A hero to us all. TJ Perkins won the whole thing, and the newly minted WWE Cruiserweight title. This was a different belt to the old Cruiserweight Championship before you come at us in the comments. After a disastrous attempt to get the division over on Raw, the Cruiserweights were eventually shunted down to NXT. Then, after flailing around down there for a bit, the belt was unified with Carmelo Hayes' North American title when he beat Roderick Strong at New Year's Evil 2022. Despite only existing for the lifespan of your average hamster, the belt was held by some pretty big names. You had Neville, Rich Swan, Kushida, Enzo and Mo Loads of big names! Brian Kendrick! Oh, this title was held by some big names! Number 7. The NXT UK Women's Championship – 4 Years and 9 Days Many sources state that this title came into existence on June 18th, 2018. But this is wrong. That is the date it was announced, not the date it was first won. That, dear viewers, was the episode of NXT UK taped on the 26th August 2018, when Rhea Ripley beat Tony Storm to win a tournament. Ah yes, Rhea Ripley and Tony Storm, those two famously British wrestlers. In fact, only one of the four women to hold the NXT UK Women's Championship was actually born in Blighty. You heard me right, only four different people officially held this belt. Ripley lost it to Storm at TakeOver Blackpool, who lost it to Kaylee Ray, now Alba Fire, at TakeOver Cardiff, who lost it to Mako Satamora during the time vortex known as the Pandemic. And that is it. Mandy Rose unifying the titles at Worlds Collide 2022 does not count as her holding the belt. Four different champions, four years. Sadly, this title suffered from a lack of exposure. Whilst its male counterpart was featured on the American NXT a few times, this one resided solely on NXT UK. And let's face it, you could count the number of viewers that show had on one hand. Post amputation. Number 6. The WWF Hardcore Championship 3 Years, 9 Months, and 25 Days. Of all the championships on this list, few, if any, are as fondly remembered as the Hardcore title. Gifted to Mick Foley as a thank you for knocking his brains out in the service of entertainment, the Hardcore title would then bounce around between the likes of Al Snow, Big Boss Man, and Hardcore Holly. It wasn't until Bob Corr's cousin Crash got the belt in February of 2000 that its most famous famous caveat was introduced, the 24-7 rule. This meant that the championship could now be defended at any time and in any place that had a referee present, which led to some of the funniest moments in WWE history.
victory. Crash defending the title in a bull pit, Mighty Molly winning it off the Hurricane by thwacking him with a frying pan, Gerald Briscoe pinning a sleeping Crash to win the gold. WWE don't always do comedy right, but when they do, it's fantastic. And this was. After 240 reigns shared between 52 wrestlers, the beloved belt said its last goodbye after Rob Van Dam beat Tommy Dreamer on an August 2002 episode of Raw. If you're playing along at home, that's two championships that RVD has killed now. Cool, as he would say. Number five, the NXT UK Tag Team Championships. Three years, seven months, and 28 days. On the same night that the NXT UK Women's Championship went down the toilet, the brand's tag team titles also went the way of the dodo. Champions Brooks Jensen and Josh Briggs were competing in a fatal four-way for both the NXT and NXT UK tag straps. That match was won by Pretty Deadly, who became the NXT Tag Team Champions and retired the UK versions in the process. Yes, boys. The British tag belts were first won by the grizzled young veterans at NXT UK TakeOver Blackpool in January of 2019. Despite existing for three months less than the NXT UK women's title, these championships had almost double the number of holders and even managed to fit a vacancy in there too. Mustache Mountain, Gallus, the aforementioned Pretty Deadly, they all held the belts until time was called on the NXT UK experiment. These titles suffered from the same lack of prominence that plagued NXT UK, despite plenty of excellent wrestlers competing for them in plenty of excellent matches. Maybe their lineage will be revived when NXT Europe gets off the ground if it gets off the ground. Number four, the WWE 24-7 Championship. Three years, five months, and 20 days. You ever see those DVDs in supermarkets that are clearly meant to look like popular films, even though they're just a cheap ripoff? That is what the 24-7 Championship was to the hardcore title. The Chop Kick Panda to the Hardcore's Kung Fu Panda, the 24-7 title was introduced by Mick Foley on the May 20th, 2019 edition of Raw. After Titus O'Neil of all people became the first champion, the belt fell into the hands of its most famous owner, R-Truth. Truth held the hideous olive green wart for a combined total of 423 days across a maddening 53 different reigns. By the way, that technically gives the former K-Quick more title reigns than anyone else in WWE history. Fair play, much deserved. Whilst a good idea to begin with, the 24-7 title became more of a hindrance to WWE programming over time. The company ran out of good ideas very quickly, despite occasionally great input from the likes of Truth, Akira Tozawa, and Drake Maverick. The title was binned by Nikki Cross almost as soon as Triple H took over creative. Well, it was nearly binned. Number three, the WWF North American Heavyweight Championship. Two years, one month, and eight days. The first of our old-timey oddity championships now, and one very few modern wrestling fans will have heard of. Before he was accused of defrauding the state of Mississippi, Ted DiBiase was a respected name in the world of pro wrestling. The nickname Million Dollar Man has a whole different meaning now, doesn't it? DiBiase first signed for WWE back in 1979 and was immediately given a title belt upon his arrival. This was the WWF North American Heavyweight Championship and Ted would carry it for 126 days before losing it to Pat Patterson thanks to some brass knuckles. Patterson in turn lost it to Japanese wrestler Seiji Sakaguchi who held it for 532 days before the company completely gave up on the belt in 1981. It may have only existed for a little over two years, but this championship is actually pivotal to the history of WWE. Whilst holding the belt, Pat Patterson won a fictional tournament in Rio de Janeiro to unify it with the equally made up South American Heavyweight Championship. And thus, the Intercontinental Championship was born. Number two, the WWF Intercontinental Tag Team Championships, five months and 25 days. A sloth's pregnancy cycle is roughly six months long. Why am I mentioning this? Well, A, because I love sloths, who doesn't? And B, because that means a baby sloth is gestating for longer than the WWF Intercontinental Tag Team Championships were a thing. Information about these belts 
is scarce, but WWE's official website does have a small piece on them. According to WWE.com, the championships were never defended in the United States. Instead, they were created as part of a working relationship between the company and Japanese promotion, the Universal Wrestling Federation. In January of 1991, the gold was handed over to Mexican performer Pero Aguayo and Japanese wrestler Gran Hamada. However, these two would become the only holders of the titles as the partnership between the WWF and UWF ended later that year. Number 1. The WWF Canadian Championship, 5 Months and 5 Days Though he's more famous now for probably being whacked by the mob, Canadian wrestler Dino Bravo was quite the sensation back in the day. To capitalize on his popularity, WWE awarded Dino the Canadian Championship in August of 1985. Details on how often the championship was actually defended are spotty to say the least, but we do know that the belt was vacated after just five months and five days when Bravo left the company in early 1986. When the strongman returned later that year, the title did not return with him. That makes our boy Dino the first, last, and only person to hold this fabled piece of WWE history. Wrestling might seem like the Wild West now, but it was off the scale in the 80s. Stuff happened all the time, and nobody was really there to properly document it, so all sorts of wacky titles could have been created and uncreated in the space of a week. However, we have to go with what we know, so please join me in awarding the WWF Canadian Championship with the shortest-lived championship championship. And let us never speak of it again. In conventional storytelling, the inciting incident is the thing that sets the plot in motion. Luke Skywalker's aunt and uncle getting burnt alive, the destruction of Krypton in the Superman stories, Hulk Hogan's character getting amnesia in the cinematic masterpiece that was Santa with muscles. Classic examples one and all. Sadly, these wrestlers could only wish for an inciting incident that good, as their feuds all got underway in the dumbest way possible. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 times WWE stars feuded for stupid reasons. Join us. Number 10, Chris Jericho and Fandango not saying someone's name correctly. When the former Johnny Curtis made his WWE main roster debut in 2013, fans were slightly surprised at the direction the company had gone with for one of their brightest developmental stars. Now he was Fandango, an arrogant ballroom dancer who shimmied and rumbled far more than he actually wrestled. Dango kept himself out of the ring by refusing to compete in a match until somebody said his name right. Something to do with him not getting respect? I don't know, it was a stupid idea. After weeks of shutting down potential challengers, Twinkletoes was confronted by Chris Jericho, who loves this silly name more than almost any other person on the planet. Y2J would continually mock Fandango until the dancer could stand no more and challenged him to a match at WrestleMania 29? This was the build to a match at WrestleMania? In another shocking turn of events, Fandango actually beats Jericho on the grandest stage of them all, setting in motion a glittering career filled with memorable moments, championship wins, and that time he cured the common cold live on SmackDown. What a guy. Number 9. A whole bunch of women over Playboy magazine. Whilst it might be a little bit cheeky to clump several different feuds into one segment, it is mind-blowing just how many times WWE have used Playboy magazine as a plot device. Sable was the first star to drop cloth for Hugh Hefner, and her appearance in the magazine was one of the main factors that turned her heel in 1999. It also played into her match with Tori at WrestleMania 15, the first of many times the publication would make its presence known at the Showcase of the Immortals. Christy Hemi's appearance in Playboy drew the ire of Trish Stratus, setting up their match at Mania 21. Also, Ashley Mazzaro's shoot led to the Playboy Bunny Mania Lumberjill match at 24, a sentence that just made me be a little bit sick in my mouth. Considering they were basically parading women around in a similar fashion at around the same time, it is no surprise that WWE and Playboy had such a strong working relationship. Whilst I'm sure this did absolute gangbusters for both businesses' bank accounts, did fans really enjoy sitting through decades of wrestlers feuding over nudie photos? Well, I'm sure some did, but we don't talk about them. Number 8. Jeff Jarrett and the Roadie over a country song 
Forget his catchphrases, forget his guitar shots, forget the entirety of TNA. Jeff Jarrett's greatest contribution to wrestling is the song With My Baby Tonight. Seriously, this thing has absolutely no right to be as good as it is. During his country singer phase, Double J introduced this smooth ballad about wanting to get home to your girl after a hard day's work, and it went over like a treat. That was until a feud erupted over who was actually singing on the record. Despite Jarrett claiming it was his voice on the track, his sidekick, the roadie, aka the future road dog, made the shocking revelation that it was him. As we would learn later on from the song Rowdy, Road Dog has some serious musical chops, so this checks out. At least this is how things would have gone had Jarrett not left WWE in early 1996. The pair would actually feud in the USWA, but sadly without mention of this amazing tune. Although this story never got the payoff it deserved, just imagine how crackers it would have been to have seen a full-blown wrestling feud over a country song. Even one that is as good as With My Baby Tonight. Number 7. Perry Sasson and Raven Over a Mop on one hand, it's tragic that many fans only know Perry Saturn for his on-screen relationship with a cleaning utensil. Then again, on the other hand, it's also really funny. The Radicals member was punished for injuring enhancement talent Mike Bell on TV by getting smacked over the head in storyline, sending him into a deranged state that ultimately saw him fall in love with a mop. This was a problem for Saturn's human girlfriend, Terry Runnels, who demanded that he pick either her or Moppy. Bad idea, Terry. Never come between a man and his mop. Understandably quite upset that she had been dumped for a literal mop, Terry sought the services of Saturn's longtime rival, Raven. Rather than focus on their history together in ECW and WCW, WWE escalated this rivalry by having Raven kidnap Moppy and feed her into a wood chipper. Oh, the humanity! This nonsensical plot actually led to a match on pay-per-view when Saturn defeated his lover's killer at Unforgiven 2001. Weirdly, this didn't lead to any more big matches between the two, and the amnesiac gimmick was dropped. Thankfully, though, Saturn didn't then end up courting a leaf blower on the rebound. Number 6. Bret Hart and Jean-Pierre Lafitte over a jacket in terms of legitimate reasons for beefing with fellow wrestlers, Bret Hart has had some all-time great ones. He fought with Mr. Perfect over the prestige of being a pure wrestler, with Stone Cold Steve Austin over the respect of the fans, and with Shawn Michaels because he absolutely pissing hated the bloke. And then there's the time he feuded with somebody because they nicked his clothes. Jean-Pierre Lafitte, formerly of the Quebecers tag team, first snatched the famous wraparound sunglasses that Brett would hand out to fans during his entrance. Then he took things a step further when he stole the leather jacket that Brett would wear to the ring. What a ruddy bloody monster. The two men feuded for three whole months over this and even got a match at In Your House 3 out of it. And you know what? It wasn't a bad match at all. In fact, it was probably the best one on the show. The only thing that would make this whole scenario weirder is if Lafitte were to, oh, I don't know, have a career renaissance in his 50s and win the Ring of Honor World Championship. Number 5. Randy Savage and the Repo Man over a hat what do you do when you drop out of one of the most successful tag teams of the era? Why, you wear a black mask over your face and repossess people's things, of course. This is what happened to Demolition Smash when he was rebranded as the Repo Man in 1991. With his trusty rope in hand, Repo Man would go around stealing other people's things whilst claiming that they hadn't been properly paid for. Repo set his sights on the wrong target when he went after Macho Man Randy Savage in January 1993. The bandit got on Savage's bad side when he repossessed his beloved shiny hat on an episode of Raw. Before you laugh, just imagine how big the down payment must have been on that thing. This is serious stuff, viewer. The pair engaged in a mini rivalry that saw the former world champion defeat the former tag team champion on Raw and then eliminate him from the 93 Royal Rumble. Savage clearly taught Repo a lesson as he left the company shortly after. Number 4. Kane and Chris Jericho over coffee you think this is about coffee? Well, yes, Kane, we do, because it is. We've all had that awkward moment when we've bumped into somebody in the pub and spilled a bit of our drink on them. 
Most of the time they're nice about it, sometimes they're a bit grumpy, and every so often they're a seven foot tall demon who then tries to choke slam you through the pool table. On the October 23rd, 2000 edition of Raw, Y2J turned around at the wrong time and accidentally splashed the big red machine with his cup of joe. A perfectly innocent mistake that Jericho apologized for, although he did make the mistake of bringing up burns to a man who was hideously disfigured in a fire. This case of wrong place, wrong time led to multiple pay-per-view matches between the pair, including a chaotic last man standing fight at Armageddon. Jericho ended up winning that match, championing the cause of people who consume caffeine? Seriously, what was this all about? WWE tried to turn it into Kane being angry at how normal Jericho looked, but come on, we all know that this was just about coffee. Number three, Dawn Marie and Tori Wilson over Tori's dad. Stepmothers get a lot of bad press. We have the brothers Grimm to thank for a lot of that. Nice job, guys. WWE also didn't do the demographic any favors when they booked this utterly bonkers storyline between Dawn Marie and Tori Wilson. Things got awkward between the two women when Dawn started developing the hots for Wilson's father, Al. Was it a ruthless ploy to get under the skin of her rival? Did Dawn just have a thing for old men? Whatever the reason, this was happening and it was really, really weird. Weird. The story continued to get mental when the couple got engaged in late 2002, leading to their infamous wedding on the January 2nd, 2003 episode of SmackDown. It was infamous because everybody was in their pants for some reason. Al's involvement in the storyline reached an end when his character Kayfabe died after having too much of a good time with Dawn on their honeymoon. I guess you could say he went out with a bang. <laughs> What, too soon? As ridiculous as this whole thing was, nobody can say that it wasn't thoroughly entertaining. You know, if you completely switched off all of your intelligent brain functions. Number two, Booker T and Edge over a fake shampoo commercial. Chris Jericho and Fandango may have feuded over a mispronunciation at WrestleMania, but at least Fandango's name was real, sort of. The object of this match between Booker T and Edge from Mania 18 was completely fictional. The two future Hall of Famers were tangling over who would get to appear in a Japanese shampoo commercial after Booker got jealous at Edge's casting in the role. However, as we've already said, this commercial was entirely fake. There was no Japanese shampoo to be sold, so this whole thing was actually over nothing. Right, wrestling is fake, spoiler alert, so you could argue that inventing a fake hair care advert is just the same thing as inventing a fake championship or trophy. However, at least those have a place in wrestling history and can be used to tell stories. This was just a way to get these two men on the card, which they didn't even really need to do because it was freaking Edge and Booker T. The rated R superstar won on the day, in case anybody cared, and was free to pursue his dream of selling soap suds in the land of the rising sun. Number one, Rey Mysterio and Eddie Guerrero over the custody of Dominic. Mops, hats, jackets, cosmetics, even an old man, but feuding over an actual real life human boy, that really takes the cake. Rey Mysterio and Eddie Guerrero's interactions started long before 2005. From their days in WCW to their time in the SmackDown 6, the pair had always been linked and had always made magic together. Guerrero had snapped on his former partner after months of feeling inferior to him, which led to a match at the Great American Bash. If Eddie won, then he would reveal a dark secret about Ray's family. However, the masked man picked up the win, but guess what? Eddie lied! In a twist so soap opera it would shock even Pat Butcher, Eddie revealed that Ray's son Dominic was actually biologically his. Eddie was his pappy. No wonder the poor kid has so many parental issues today. This led to an all-time so bad it's good match stipulation at SummerSlam where Eddie and Ray fought in a ladder match with Dominic's custody papers suspended above the ring. Can it ever get more insane than two grown men fighting over the guardianship of a small child? Well, if anyone can top it, WWE can. No WWE superstar ever wants to get injured, but suffering one at the biggest show of the year must be an especially painful pill to swallow. They want their WrestleMania memories to be positive ones, not clouded because of an unfortunate accident that just happened to occur at the worst possible time. 
Nonetheless, it is a fate that has befallen an unlucky few. From broken bones and brutal burns to memory-wiping concussions and terrible tendon tears, the following stars were all incapacitated on the grandest stage. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 worst WWE WrestleMania injuries. Join us! Number 10. Triple H in 2013 Hunter Hearst Helmsley is no stranger to suffering in-ring injuries at major events, having experienced a pair of quad tears on TV and pay-per-view. Those, along with the general wear and tear and other minor surgeries that come with the territory, were why the game typically went to the ring so heavily taped and padded up. Trips was taking no chances in the squared circle, but he didn't count on one thing, did he? He didn't consider that his stomach may get burned by dry ice during his WrestleMania 29 entrance, the silly goose. In a rare and costly production gaffe, Hunter was blasted with the cold stuff from close range as he made his way down to face Brock Lesnar. That's just what you need before going to war with the Beast Incarnate, isn't it? The Cerebral Assassin got through the match, which he actually won, but received second-degree burns to his torso and arms. He decided to play it safer for his entrance a year later and just had a trio of beautiful ladies disrobe him instead. Safer until Steph finds out about it anyway. Number 9. The Miz in 2011 One of the most unlikely WrestleMania main eventers ever, The Miz found himself headlining the granddaddy of them all against WWE's top star in 2011. How the former real-world star went from being exiled from the locker room to WWE champion and in the most coveted spot in sports entertainment is really quite a story on its own, but the match itself remains one of the weakest Mania main events of all time. Really just a backdrop for Cena's burgeoning rivalry with The Rock, Miz might have gotten a sweet video package before the match, but when the bell rung, it was nothing to write home about. And then the champ himself got his bell rung when Big Match John tackled him off the ringside barricade to the concrete floor below. After that, the lights might have been on, but nobody was home as Miz took advantage of a rock bottom to pin Cena and retain the belt. Adding insult to, well, injury, Miz didn't even remember the biggest match of his career when he got back through the curtain. He was then greeted and taken care of by future wife Maurice, to be fair. Every cloud. Number 8. The Undertaker in 2014 While The Miz got knocked out right towards the end of the biggest match of his career, The Undertaker was knocked loopy right at the start of what may be the most significant match of his. When tangling with a beast like Brock Lesnar, there is always the very good chance you're going to come out a little more sore than you went in, but the dead man likely didn't bank on getting a severe concussion just a few minutes into WrestleMania 30's now infamous streak-ending contest. The two were fighting at ringside when the next big thing grabbed Taker's right leg and simply dumped him backwards onto the back of his head. It was a sickening thud and the phenom was in noticeable pain afterwards. Mark Calloway doesn't remember anything that happened after that, though he managed to get through a long and punishing match before losing for the first time on the grandest stage. When he got backstage, however, he very quickly collapsed and had to be rushed to a local hospital. In an unprecedented move, Vince McMahon abandoned his post and left WrestleMania in order to be by his long-serving soldier's side. Number 7. Ronda Rousey in 2019 WrestleMania 35 was a historic night for WWE's female performers, as for the very first time ever, they were set to headline the show. Ronda Rousey, Charlotte Flair and Becky Lynch collided in a triple threat match with both the Raw and SmackDown women's titles on the line. It was the culmination of so much hard work and a deserved honor for three of the company's most bankable stars. It was certainly a big night for Rowdy Ronda, who had only made her in-ring debut at the previous year's WrestleMania, the former UFC sensation having taken the wrestling world by storm. Mania 35 was also notable for Rousey because it was the first time she would taste defeat. Well, in wrestling anyway. As well as the confusing, flat finish, the baddest woman on the planet had to be miffed when she got to the locker room and realized that she had broken her hand. Rousey was no stranger to the injury and barely registered it, but it did ultimately require surgery to fix and she wasn't allowed to punch anything for a while. 
Number 6. Rick Boogs in 2022 You have to really feel for Rick Boogs, who got an injury at the very worst time. And I don't just mean in the opener of the first night of WrestleMania 38 either, but just when the talented and charismatic muscle man was really starting to catch on. Teaming with Shinsuke Nakamura against SmackDown Tag Team Champions The Usos, the match was going swimmingly and Boogs was enjoying his first WrestleMania experience when disaster struck. Attempting to pick up both Jimmy and Jay in a fireman's carry position, his leg gave out and it was immediately very clear that he was in a lot of pain. The match was hastily wrapped up and Boogs was helped to the back. Posting about the injury after, the Axeman explained that the doctor told him his quad muscle was too strong and flexing so hard that it ripped his quad and patella tendon fully off the bone. See, stuff like this is why I don't want to get too buff, you know what I mean? Anyway, it took Big Rick 10 months to heal up and come back. His punishment was a feud with The Miz. Sorry, I meant reward. Totally meant reward. Number 5. Shane McMahon in 2023 it looked for all the world like Shane McMahon's in-ring WWE career would end in infamy after his reported shenanigans backstage at the 2022 Royal Rumble. Showing up supposedly eager to book himself like Superman, Shane irked not only his colleagues but his own father, who allegedly promised that his son would never experience another pop as long as he lived. Well, Shane experienced a pop when he made a surprise return at WrestleMania 39. Two of them, actually. The first was the reaction to him showing up unadvertised for the first time in over a year, and then the second was the sound of his quad exploding. After leapfrogging Mania host The Miz and the opening exchange of their impromptu match, Shane landed awkwardly and did not get back up. Incredibly, WWE Hall of Famer Snoop Dogg was on hand to save the day and spark out Miz before hitting a crowd-pleasing people's elbow to end the segment. He is hoping McMahon heals up quick from his torn quad and is back in time to fulfill his dream and win the 2024 Royal Rumble. Though perhaps I shouldn't mention McMahon, Torn Quad, and Royal Rumble in the same sentence, you know? Number 4. Kurt Angle in 2004 Kurt Angle famously walked into his first WrestleMania main event knowing that he may not walk out of it at all. Breaking his neck in the run-up to wrestling Brock Lesnar at Mania 19, the Olympic hero believed that their WWE title match might just be his very last. Fortunately, Angle was able to continue wrestling after undergoing an experimental procedure, but his neck issues would persist for many years to come. Still, the minimally invasive surgery got him to another major WrestleMania title match against Eddie Guerrero at Mania 20. Regrettably, Kurt broke his neck yet again during the exceptional encounter. It wasn't too long after that that he began experiencing those all too familiar feelings of numbness in his hands and fingers. Angle genuinely feared his career would be over since it was his fourth neck break in total and the doctor had already performed surgery on him twice within the previous year, ruling out a third operation. WWE decided to keep Kurt on TV as the SmackDown general manager, which gave him some time away from the ring to heal up, but it really felt as though he was on borrowed time after. After. Number 3. Brock Lesnar in 2003 Going back to WrestleMania 19, Kurt Angle wasn't the only one to come out of that show banged up, with his opponent Brock Lesnar's promising career coming within mere inches of meeting a premature end. Convinced to perform a shooting star press for the finish of his first Mania outing, Lesnar misjudged the distance and almost ended up going headfirst through the ring in a very scary moment. The next big thing had performed the move seamlessly on dozens of occasions before, including in WWE Developmental Territory OVW and in dark matches at WWE TV tapings. On that night in Seattle, however, something went wrong and Brock came up short of his intended target. He would later claim that he didn't feel comfortable executing the shooting star press on the day and thanked the late Kurt Hennig for talking him out of using the move altogether before he made the main roster. But he was pressured into doing it by upper WWE management as it would be the perfect WrestleMania moment. It was a WrestleMania moment alright, but not the kind that Lesnar, who suffered a nasty concussion, wanted. Number 2. Jimmy Uso in 2020 WrestleMania 36 really was a WrestleMania like no other. 
The world may have shut down due to the COVID-19 pandemic, but WWE forged ahead in their bid to entertain everyone living in lockdown. Spread out over two nights, the matches were mostly pre-taped in a sanitized performance center, with a couple of them notably being of the cinematic persuasion. In some ways, this gave WWE a lot more control over Mania's presentation, but one thing they couldn't control was injuries. Not only did The Undertaker knack his arm while punching glass filming his last ride swan song, but Jimmy Uso completely blew out his ACL just a minute into his ladder match with John Morrison and Kofi Kingston. You wouldn't expect that Jimmy hurt himself by jumping four feet off a ladder and landing on his feet, but he did. Amazingly, Jimmy then went on to perform many dangerous moves and stunts in the near 20-minute encounter. Jimmy himself couldn't believe that he hurt himself on something so relatively simple, or that he pulled everything else off while wrestling essentially on just one leg. It would take him almost 14 months to return to active competition. Number 1. The Rock in 2013 If you're wondering why The Rock hasn't stepped back into the ring besides that six-second squash of Eric Rowan since losing to John Cena at WrestleMania 29, all you have to do is look at… well, all you have to do is look at his headline match with John Cena at WrestleMania 29. While dropping the WWE title to Big Match John at the Showcase of the Immortals, the most electrifying man in all of entertainment tore… Everything, pretty much. According to Dwayne Johnson, he tore the top of his quad off his pelvis, which caused a chain reaction, causing a tear to his abdominal and abductor muscles, as well as giving him a hernia. Despite no doubt being in absolute agony, he managed to make it through a match that went a not insubstantial 24 minutes. Not only did the injury result in triple hernia surgery, but it also caused the production of Hercules to be rescheduled to accommodate the star's recovery. But it gets worse too, because the injury also robbed the people's champion of his perfect set of abs, leaving him with a rather pathetic five and a half pack. Love you, Dwayne. Main eventing a WWE pay-per-view is something most wrestlers can only dream of. A select few are lucky to have done it several times, while some have only managed this remarkable feat once in their careers. For this list, we are looking at proper WWE pay-per-views or premium live events only. No network specials or NXT shows on here, I'm afraid. Also, we are not counting Royal Rumble appearances as a main event, otherwise we would have to put Johnny Knoxville and Drew Carey on here, and I'm simply not prepared to do that. Anyway, I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 wrestlers who main evented just one WWE pay-per-view. Join us! Number 10. Scott Steiner Towards the tail end of WCW's existence, one of their biggest stars, figuratively and in terms of sheer muscle mass, was Big Popper Pump Scott Steiner. After breaking away from his brother and joining the NWO in 1998, Steiner completely changed up his look and attitude, leading to the nonsense spewing, chainmail wearing lunatic we all know and love today. From 1991 to 2001, Scott main evented nine different WCW pay per views. These included all three in 2001, the final year of the company's existence. As for his time in WWE, uh, yeah, that didn't go quite as well. Steiner arrived in a big way at Survivor Series 2002, taking out Matt Hardy and Christopher Nowinski with the help of an effing mic. He then had two pay-per-view world title matches against Triple H, which you would think would have earned him the final spot on the card. Sadly not though, although considering how bad those matches were, maybe this was actually a good thing? Freakzilla's one and only headline appearance was alongside brother Rick way back at the 1993 Survivor Series, where he was part of Lex Luger's All-Americans win over Yokozuna and his foreign fanatics. Number 9. Carlito had it not been for the actions of a certain rated R superstar, then Carlito would not have made it onto this list. Mr. Caribbean Cool was part of the scheduled main event of New Year's Revolution 2006, an Elimination Chamber match for John Cena's WWE title. Alongside tag team partner Chris Masters, Carlito made it all the way to the final three before foolishly taking out the masterpiece. Why would you do that, Carlito? You know you're no good without him. This point was proven when Carlito got 
pinned by Cena moments later, costing him his shot at the big one. However, Cena didn't leave the arena with the belt either, as Edge then came down to cash in his Money in the Bank briefcase. This technically made Edge versus Cena the main event, costing our boy that honor. His one true show closer came just two months earlier, when he and Masters were part of Team Raw in their Survivor Series elimination match with Team SmackDown. He was also unsuccessful in that endeavor as a clothesline from hell from JBL eliminated the Puerto Rican and helped Randy Orton win the whole thing for the blue team. Definitely not cool. Number 8. Bailey. Rounding off our trilogy of Survivor Series appearances, we have that time NXT finally had enough of being ignored and stormed the main roster with pitchforks and torches. Possibly because most of the roster was stuck in Saudi Arabia, forces from the black and gold brand made their presence felt on the November 1st, 2019 episode of SmackDown. This led to a three-way battle for brand supremacy, desperately shaking up what had become a drab and dreary Survivor Series formula. The night was home to multiple inter-brand matches, including several traditional elimination bouts. The battle that closed out the show was a three-way between Raw Women's Champion Becky Lynch, NXT Women's Champion Shayna Baszler, and SmackDown Women's Champion Bayley. Lynch has closed out a few WWE shows, including WrestleMania 35, while Baszler has been part of three different pay-per-view main events in her time. As for Bayley, this is her only one. Despite being one of the most popular female performers in recent memory, the former hugger has only headlined one other WWE-branded event, NXT TakeOver Respect against Sasha Banks, which we are of course not counting here. Number 7. Diamond Dallas Page and Rhino we are lumping these two legends together because they were both part of the Invasion pay-per-view's final match, the inaugural brawl. Try saying that five times fast. Diamond Dallas Page rose through the WCW ranks from lowly manager to bona fide superstar. His first main event there was against Randy Savage at Spring Stampede 1997, and he would also be in the finale of the company's last ever major show against Scott Steiner. As for Rhino, he was portrayed as one of the toughest guys in all of ECW, which is truly saying something. He also closed out several of their supercards, mostly in the year 2000. Sadly, after helping the Alliance thwart Team WWF at Invasion, neither man reached this coveted position ever again. Rhino would come close at the aforementioned TakeOver Respect when he and Baron Corbin competed in the finals of the Dusty Rhodes Tag Team Classic. As for DDP, well, we all know how his WWE career turned out. A lot has been said about how badly WWE fumbled the Invasion, and the fact that neither of these massive stars from other companies were ever given a fair shake of the stick is another piece of evidence to support that. Number 6. The New Age Outlaws Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children, all right, that's enough. We're not doing the whole thing, not even once. The road dog Jesse James and the badass Billy Gunn both escaped some truly terrible gimmicks to become one of the most over tag teams of all time. Gunn and the D-O-double-G came together in 1997 and gained a huge boost when they joined Triple H's version of D-Generation X in 1998. Before they were officially members, they teamed with the group in their only main event match at no way out of Texas in your house. This was supposed to be DX vs Stone Cold Steve Austin ahead of his and Shawn Michaels world title match at WrestleMania 14. Unfortunately, HBK was suffering with an injury, so he was subbed out for the natural replacement. Savio Vega? I'm sorry, what? How the hell did you get from Shawn Michaels to the guy that used to play Quang? What is the connection there? Oh yeah, anyway, the match. Austin and his team won, with the Outlaws playing their parts as punching bags rather well. But now seriously, Savio Vega? Number 5. Ahmed Johnson Ahmed Johnson's career in wrestling is a huge what if. What if he had become WWE Champion like he was rumored to be? What if he didn't suffer so many injuries? What if he had never joined WCW and become Big T? Maybe climate change wouldn't have happened or something. Despite being primed for the big time, Johnson only ever closed out a single major WWE event, and even that was an In Your House. The ninth edition of this sub-series was nicknamed International Incident, presumably because it took place in Canada and not because anybody actually violated 
international law on the night. Although this was WWE in 1996, so don't rule it out. Johnson, who was Intercontinental Champion at the time, teamed up with world champ Shawn Michaels and Psycho Sid to take on Camp Cornette's Vader, Owen Hart, and the British Bulldog. Fun fact, the Ultimate Warrior was supposed to be in Sid's position, but he left the company after no-showing a bunch of events. The Pearl River native came up short in his one and only main event match as Vader pinned Michaels to give Corny & Co. the W. Number 4. The Iron Sheik the late great Iron Sheik played a huge role in shaping WWE's golden age. After beating Bob Backlund for the world title in late 1983, Sheik dropped the gold to none other than Hulk Hogan so that the Hulkster could begin his first mammoth run with the belt. Despite being a major player during the company's first foray into pay-per-view, it wasn't until 1991 that the Hall of Famer finally went on last. And even then, it was under a dumb gimmick. At SummerSlam 1991, Hogan and the Ultimate Warrior teamed up to face Slaughter and his two henchmen in a handicap match. One of them was General Adnan, who was legitimately in his 50s at the time, and the other was Colonel Mustafa, aka the Iron Sheik. Even though this was the final proper match of the night, you could argue that the actual main event of SummerSlam 91 was the wedding of Randy Savage and Miss Elizabeth. But come on, are you really going to try and take this away from Sheiky Baby? Rest in peace, Bubba. Number 3. Jerry Lawler It is safe to say that Jerry Lawler has main evented a lot of shows down in Memphis. The King was treated like a demigod in his hometown, drawing huge crowds for promotions like the Continental Wrestling Association and the USWA. When WWE signed him in 1992, his best in-ring days were behind him, but that didn't mean he wasn't still a draw. Lawler's sharp tongue and quickness on the mic made him a hated heel in the promotion, both as a broadcaster and as an occasional wrestler. He famously brawled with Bret Hart during the early days of his run, but it would be against another Canadian Canadian legend that he would have his one and only pay-per-view main event. At King of the Ring 1994, Lawler faced off against Rowdy Roddy Piper on a show that also included Diesel vs. Bret Hart. Unfortunately, this turned out to be the wrong decision as Lawler vs. Piper was a steaming pile of garbage. Unfortunately, neither man was in their prime and had no real right to be main eventing this show against the alternative. That said, if they hadn't, that would have meant that Lawler had never main evented a WWE pay-per-view, which just doesn't feel right. Number 2. Sting from Halloween Havoc 1989 to the Germany-exclusive Millennium Final event in 2000, the man called Sting main evented 32 different pay-per-views for World Championship Wrestling. As a surfer or a crow cosplay, Sting could always be relied upon to deliver a big main event performance. Then, instead of jumping to WWE like pretty much everybody else, he went to TNA and became a main eventer there too. In fact, the Stinger main evented 34 different TNA DNA shows from 2003 to 2013. Finally, after years of ducking Vince McMahon, Sting finally showed his black and white face in WWE at Survivor Series 2014. He would go on to have just two pay-per-view matches for the company, both of which he lost because screw you billionaire Ted, the war goes on forever in my mind, pal. His final ever WWE match took place at Night of Champions 2015, when he closed out proceedings in a WWE Championship match against Seth Rollins. Rollins had already fought John Cena for the United States Championship, but was still able to overcome his foe to retain the belt. He did this by buckle-bombing the icon so hard that he had to temporarily retire. Goddamn Sting's WWE career was rough. Number 1. Ric Flair it doesn't feel like it's true, but trust me, it is. Across both of his runs in WWE, the Nature Boy Ric Flair only ever main evented a single pay-per-view. And you know what? It was the first ever bloody Taboo Tuesday. At the 2004 edition of the fan-controlled show, Flair took on Randy Orton in a steel cage match to round off the evening. It lasted just 10 minutes and the Viper won, meaning that one of the greatest of all time has a 0% record in WWE pay-per-view main events. What the hell? The best chance Flair had at closing out another show was at WrestleMania 8, where he should have faced Hulk Hogan for the WWE Championship in an era-defining dream match. Instead, Flair got to face Randy 
Savage in the middle of the card, whilst Hogan main evented with Sid Justice instead. More like Sid Injustice, am I right? Even though he competed in the main event of many an NWA and WCW show, the fact that Flair only managed to do this once for the biggest wrestling company in the world is as insane as the man himself. An entertaining storyline may be WWE's bread and butter, but that doesn't always mean the creative minds figuring out how to get their spandex warriors from A to Z don't sometimes burn the toast, then burn their fingers on the burnt toast, which falls to the ground where the dog scoffs it up. Analogies are my superpower. Look, my point is that sometimes a WWE storyline has clear promise either in its very concept or based on the first few interviews, angles and matches, only for it to suddenly falter, usually never to recover. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 promising WWE storylines that went downhill fast. Join us! Number 10. Randy Orton Gets Kicked Out of Evolution When Randy Orton started getting babyface reactions in the summer of 2004, it seemed inevitable that he would leave Evolution and go up against villainous group leader Triple H. Most assumed the split would happen somewhere on the road to WrestleMania 21, with the big world heavyweight title match itself happening at the Showcase of the Immortals, not, you know, the very night after the legend killer bagged the gold at SummerSlam. Talk about hot shotting. While Randy's ejection from Evolution was initially well handled, the saga soon went south. For a start, Randy kept basically running away from his former teammates, which isn't exactly the MO of a heroic champion. Then, just a few weeks after Orton was 86th from Evolution, the game beat him in their first singles meeting at Unforgiven. Randy's response was to jump out of a giant cake the next night on Raw, spoiling Hunter's celebration party. You scoundrel Randy, everyone knows Helmsley's love of frosting. It was clear that Orton wasn't connecting in the way that had probably been hoped, and he never ended up regaining the title before turning heel again, while the spot originally earmarked for him ultimately went to Batista. Number 9. The Viper and the Fiend Sticking with our man Randy for a minute, let's take a look at when he renewed his rivalry with Bray Wyatt in late 2020. There wasn't much to shout about during the pandemic, but a large segment of WWE's fan base seemed hooked on Orton's run-ins with The Fiend and Alexa Bliss. Their psychological warfare gripped viewers as WWE used the unique circumstance of filming in an empty Thunderdome to flex their creative muscles. And get weird. Get very, very weird. After Orton ostensibly put an end to The Fiend in their Inferno match at TLC, Little Miss Bliss tried to resurrect him with the power of voodoo, made Randy vomit some black goo, and even threw a fireball in the 14-time world champion's face. Oh, you better believe we crossed over into WrestleCrap territory, baby. The still smouldering Fiend would eventually re-emerge and help Alexa pin Orton at Fastlane, leading to the big blow-off at WrestleMania 37, where Wyatt, for all his supernatural abilities, succumbed to a single RKO in about six measly minutes. Given the way the storyline had completely gone off the rails long before, unfortunately it's hard to say it deserved any better of an ending. Number 8. The Nexus Run Rampant The first season of NXT The Game Show was something of a credibility killer for the supposed rookies who were just looking for a foot in the door at WWE. Any memory of the asinine challenges or Michael Cole's derogatory commentary dissipated when the Nexus debuted during the main event of the June 7, 2010 edition of Raw. Laying waste to John Cena, CM Punk, the crew, and even the ring itself, the Eight Strong Squad sent out the message that they were not going to be objects of ridicule any longer. That message was hammered home in the weeks that followed as the Nexus took out Bret Hart, Vince McMahon, and a group of legends including Ricky Steamboat, Arn Anderson, and Jerry Lawler. They were a genuine force to be reckoned with, heading into their showdown with a team of established WWE superstars at SummerSlam. Common sense would dictate the Nexus should go over in that match, but WWE had other ideas and instead booked Super Cena to survive a DDT on the concrete floor before putting Justin Gabriel and Wade Barrett away with relative ease. It was at this very moment that the credibility of the Nexus was caught and compromised to a permanent end. Number 7. Flair vs Foley 
The 2006 rivalry between Ric Flair and Mick Foley was a natural one rooted in reality. Mick and Rick had both taken shots at each other in their respective autobiographies, fanned the flames of tension during public interviews, and even had a physical altercation backstage at the December 13th, 2004 episode of Raw. Agreeing to parlay their tension into a money-making endeavor, the creative pretty much wrote itself. The initial promos and segments building up the feud were, by and large, impassioned and gripping. Then it all got a little muddled when the hardcore legend tried to get under the Nature Boy's skin by threatening to tank their two out of three falls match at Vengeance by putting in a purposefully lousy performance. Um, alright then. Things got even weirder when Foley had his real-life buddy Melina awkwardly shoehorned into the equation. I mean, I'm all for trying something new, but this just came out of nowhere and didn't fit the story, plus Melina had a thing going with Johnny Nitro at the time. She also played directly into the puzzling finish of Flair and Foley's barbaric SummerSlam I Quit match, with Mick taking the L to protect his lady friend. Number 6. Hardcore Holly's Revenge Hardcore Holly having his neck broken by Brock Lesnar during their match at the September 10th, 2000. 2002 SmackDown taping was obviously not a good thing. The one positive, however, was that it gave the Alabama Slammer a ready-made program upon his return. After almost 14 months on the shelf, Holly returned and went straight for the then WWE Champion, vowing to break his neck and take his title. But mostly break his neck. Fans were rather into Holly's pursuit of vengeance to begin with, as he looked every bit a man possessed, but their interest only stretched so far. The decision to have old Sparky Plug try to use the antiquated Full Nelson to accomplish his task, as well as having him in marquee busting main events like Hardcore Holly and Shannon Moore vs. A-Train and Matt Morgan, didn't do him any favors. Quite a bit of the storyline was Bobcore trying to attack Brock, only to get restrained, which got old after the umpteenth attempt. A street fight victory over Big Show in his home state was too little too late, because by the time Holly finally fell to Lesnar at the 2004 Royal Rumble, fans were over it, and it felt like WWE management was too. Number 5. Psycho Kane as if Triple H hadn't tormented him enough with the whole Katie Vick thing, the Cerebral Assassin then went and took Kane's mask away from him when he defeated the Big Red Machine in a mask versus title match on the June 23rd, 2003 episode of Raw. His ugly mug now exposed, Kane reverted to his formerly evil ways after a couple of years playing a babyface. And boy, did WWE hammer home just how evil he was. He turned on tag partner Rob Van Dam, chokeslammed Eric Bischoff off the stage, tombstoned Linda on the stage, left Steve Austin laying, and turned Jim Ross into a human barbecue. Kane may have been a pathological hell demon capable of committing atrocities, but he was never gonna be any match for a double tough street fighter like Shane McMahon, was he? Yes, the introduction of Shano quickly derailed the momentum Kane had built up, with WWE veering into full-on slasher film territory with the character's creative direction, turning him from a would-be world title contender into a testicle-torturing sideshow. Not that I'm strictly against Shane McMahon having his knackers zapped with jumper cables, but still. Number 4. Hart vs. McMahon Well, this one just about sold itself, didn't it? Bret Hart's triumphant return to WWE on the January 4th, 2010 episode of Raw began with him publicly burying the hatchet with Shawn Michaels and ended with him getting kicked square in the nuts by Vince McMahon. Ah, life. Thus began a storyline that really had been stewing since the 1997 Survivor Series. The Hitman was MIA for a month after getting Rochambeau'd, with McMahon doing the heavy lifting by cutting promos on his foe in his absence. When Brett returned, their bitter disputes rapidly lost steam, as WWE title rivals Batista and John Cena got involved and Brett's leg was injured in a tragic car accident, which came after a segment where he said goodbye to the WWE Universe, despite the fact his former boss had just spat in his face the week before. The creative was needlessly convoluted, and the excellence of execution continued to be portrayed as a feeble old man, until he revealed that it was all a ruse and he wasn't hurt at all. Turns out, Brett and Cena just went to great lengths to film something to make it look like he was Crocs. The latest twist in a tale that had been badly mishandled and wouldn't get any better before the end. Number 3. Antonio Cesaro, Paul Heyman Guy 
WrestleMania 30 was a historic night for a number of reasons, but it was also a big night for Cesaro, who looked like he had body slammed Big Show through his own personal glass ceiling by winning the inaugural Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal to a thunderous ovation. The good news continued the following night on Raw, when the Swiss Superman dumped Zeb Coulter in favor of Paul Heyman. Another popular decision with fans who believed this was Cesaro's ticket to the main event. Not so fast, you dumb bunch of marks. Because while the idea may have been a winner in theory, it didn't quite pan out that way in practice. For a start, Heyman spent most of his promo time blathering on about how Brock Lesnar had defeated The Undertaker rather than putting over his new client. After Cesaro failed in his pursuit of the Intercontinental and the United States titles, his association with Heyman was nixed after only a few very underwhelming months. Both men have since been open with their disappointment with how it all played out. Number 2. The Invasion When Vince McMahon announced that the WWF had purchased rivals WCW, fans immediately began salivating over the prospect of interpromotional dream matches becoming a reality. Hogan vs Austin, The Rock vs Sting, Perry Saturn vs Mike Sanders. Finally, we would get to see what we had long fantasized about. Sadly, we wouldn't get most of the biggest stars due to lucrative contracts they had with WCW parent company Time Warner, but the so-called invasion was a hot storyline regardless and only got hotter when wrestlers from ECW were thrown into the mix too. Punters were clearly intrigued because the invasion pay-per-view drew a phenomenal 775,000 buys. Regrettably, it was on the show that things started to go a little fuzzy. After Steve Austin turned heel and joined the Alliance, the whole invasion basically started to revolve around Stone Cold and The Rock. With the majority of the WCW and ECW wrestlers duly put in their places, it was readily apparent that the invasion was essentially just WWF guys battling WWF guys with a couple of extras like Rob Van Dam and Booker T included for variety's sake. What had the potential to be the biggest money-drawing storyline in wrestling history rapidly turned out to be the biggest missed opportunity. Number 1. NWO Redux The Fed had the opportunity to right some of the wrongs from the invasion when they signed Hulk Hogan, Kevin Nash and Scott Hall just a couple of months after the storyline finished up. Seeing the founding members of the New World Order return to the company where they made their names was certainly very exciting. That excitement didn't last long. As the Hulkster prepared for a dream match with the Brahma Bull, Big Sexy and the Bad Guy provoked the ire of the Texas Rattlesnake. Neither feud was exceptional, truth be told, as WWE only had a month to get them up for WrestleMania. Rock vs Hogan was obviously a surefire winner that didn't even really need much of a storyline to set the Sky Dome on fire. After the nostalgia fueled crowd reaction to the icon persuaded WWE to hastily turn Hulk babyface and push him to the top, the NWO were left looking even more watered down than they had been. The additions of the likes of X-Pac, The Big Show, Booker T and even Shawn Michaels couldn't resuscitate the once mighty group. From too sweet to just sour, WWE's version of the New World Order turned out to be a lethal dose of nothing. Wrestling history is full of very audacious ideas that didn't quite work out in real life. Jeff Hardy attempting to walk across three ladders at WrestleMania X7, for example. That's probably too, too many ladders for even you, Jeff. Sometimes, though, luck shines down on certain performers, and sequences that could have gone disastrously wrong end up getting pulled off without a hitch. Let's revel in their artistry, shall we? I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 highly ambitious wrestling spots that somehow worked. Join us! Number 10. Ripley's Apron Slip The Royal Rumble has been home to some truly spectacular spots over the years, but sadly there have been some mistakes. Steve Austin famously slipped over the top rope, eliminating himself too early in 1996. The ending to the 2000 match was botched when The Rock's feet clearly hit the ground first. Hashtag justice for Big Show. And let's not talk about those times Kofi Kingston failed to save himself. That'll just make me sad. Instead, let's focus on the times things did go as planned. Shawn Michaels managed to save himself on just one foot in 1995. Kofi has made plenty of happy memories at the Rumble, but the 2023 women's match gave us this high-risk, high-reward moment. Rhea Ripley and Liv Morgan were the final two entrants and were both out on the apron. Morgan hit Ripley with a codebreaker, causing the Aussie to stumble backwards, then slip up on the apron while holding on for dear life. 
Considering that the Judgment Day member had been in since the very start and was likely in need of a sip of Fosters, this moment could have gone horribly wrong. Instead, Ripley held on and eliminated Morgan to win the whole thing. Well done, Mummy. Number 9. Taker's Super Choke Slam. For someone who was never a proper wrestler, Shane McMahon sure did a hell of a lot of crazy things. The King of the Ring pay per view in 2000 was headlined by The Rock and the Brothers of Destruction taking on the McMahon Helmsley faction of Triple H, Vince, and Shane. Predictably, this six man tag broke down into an all out war, with bodies flying everywhere and no small amount of brain damage being dealt out. The most memorable moment from this battle came when The Undertaker decided decided to try out for the Olympic shot put team with some help from old Shane O'Mac. Shane O was up on the top rope when Taker caught him by the neck. Then, in one swift motion, Taker leapt off the apron, catapulting Shane through the air and slamming him through the announce table. Both men needed to be totally in sync here, otherwise this move would have looked terrible. The dead man actually maintained his grip on Shane the whole way and even landed on his feet on impact. Sadly, the pair would not repeat this skill many years later, when Shane tried to hit Taker with an elbow through the table and completely whiffed it. He's still the greatest pro wrestler in the world, though. Number 8. Eddie's Mask Theft If you asked me what the greatest match in WCW history was, I would say Hulk Hogan vs The Ultimate Warrior at Halloween Havoc 1998. If you asked me that same question on a day where I hadn't taken crack, then I would probably say Eddie Guerrero vs Rey Mysterio from the year before. This much lauded Cruiserweight Championship vs Mask match is easily one of the greatest ever displays of high-flying wrestling. Also, look how cool Rey looks. Purple is definitely his colour. In the build-up to this epic encounter, Mysterio fought Dean Malenko on an episode of Nitro. He looked to have the match in the bag when that dastardly Latino heat made his presence known. As Rey had Malenko in a pinning predicament, Guerrero slid into the ring and in one smooth motion snatched the mask from the luchador's head. Rey had to cover his face, allowing Dean to roll through and put him in the Texas Cloverleaf. Imagine how badly this could have gone if Eddie had stumbled or if the mask hadn't come off in one go. In the hands of such talented pros, however, it was as smooth as Guerrero's mullet. Number 7. Rock's Nightstick Catch As the old saying goes, the great ones make it look easy. This brings us nicely on to none other than the great one himself. Survivor Series 1998 was structured around the night-long Deadly Game Tournament to crown a new world champion. In the quarterfinals, the corporation's Ken Shamrock was set to do battle with the people's champion, The Rock. Except, Kenny wasn't alone. Big Boss Man, who had been running interference all night, came down to the ring to try and help his fellow McMahon employee. With the referee distracted, Boss Man threw his trademark nightstick to the world's most dangerous man, only for Rocky to intercept it mid-air with just one hand and use it for himself. For such a simple spot, so much could have gone tits up. Boss Man could have thrown the stick too short, Rock could have fumbled the catch, but instead we got one of the slickest finishes to any Attitude Era outing. As an aside, catching stuff one-handed is clearly a Samoan trait, as Rock's cousin Roman Reigns did exactly the same thing with a microphone at SummerSlam 2022. Number 6. Skipper's Cage Walk If you look up wasted potential in the dictionary, just below the picture of me, you will see one of the total non-stop action wrestling logo. The promotion currently known as Impact Wrestling had so much hype and goodwill behind it during its early days before a combination of bad business, bad booking and bad Hulk Hogan drove it into the ground. One of the most memorable moments from its initial run came at the first ever Turning Point pay-per-view in 2004. The main event was a steel cage match pitting Triple X, that's Christopher Daniels and Elix Skipper, against America's Most Wanted of James Storm and Chris Harris. Whilst Harris was sat atop the six sides of steel, Skipper climbed up to another corner of the cage. Then, with incredible balance, he walked along the top of the structure and hit Harris with an unbelievable Hurricane Rana. So, what was his reward for this feat of superhuman ability? Well, he and Daniels lost the match and had to disband forever. Well, at least they went out with a high. Spot. <laughs> Number 5. Cole's Moonsault Superkick Wrestling isn't always as easy as just putting two talented workers in a ring together. <laughs> AJ Styles and Shinsuke Nakamura at WrestleMania. <laughs> Sometimes, though, that is all you need. Adam Cole was defending his North American Championship against Ricochet at the fourth edition of NXT TakeOver Brooklyn in a match that would have given your average PWG fan a coronary about three years earlier. 
both men left it all in the ring to give the New York crowd something to remember. In the end, the challenger captured the title to a huge ovation, but this match will forever be defined by one moment that defied the laws of physics. Because he can't help but add a flip to everything he does, Ricochet went to hit a springboard moonsault on his upright opponent. Then, whilst almost completely upside down, Cole lashed out with a pinpoint accurate super kick to cut Rick off mid-flight. Even in the multiple slow motion replays of the spot, you can see just how perfectly timed this move was. Considering that all manner of things could have gone wrong here, there's a reason this is remembered so fondly. Number 4. Pentagon's Destroyer Through a Table AEW got underway in 2019 with a series of great shows. Their last ever event before their television debut was the first ever All Out, home to one of the most mental ladder matches you will ever see. The Young Bucks and the Lucha Brothers had already gone to war at Double or Nothing, but somebody thought it would be a good idea to introduce a bunch of ladders into the mix. Before anyone could stop them, Pentagon Jr. had Matt Jackson on the top of a ladder with a table set up underneath. Uh oh. In a moment straight out of a video game, the masked man hit his opponent with a Canadian destroyer off the ladder and through the table below. How neither man got seriously hurt during this insane maneuver is simply incredible, and it just goes to show just how much trust there is between opponents to land moves like this safely. Number 3. Benjamin's Ladder Run We're all very much used to it now, but money in the bank is a bit of a weird concept. So there's a briefcase with a contract inside it, but we never actually get to see the contract. Also, the winner can hand the briefcase over and have a world title match whenever they want. I love it, but you have to admit that is all a bit odd. The first ladder match of its kind needed a big memorable moment to get fans on board with this new stipulation. On hand to provide said moment was none other than the gold standard. Shelton Benjamin would soon make a name for himself doing crazy things, but this was one of the first. As Chris Jericho stood atop one ladder, Benjamin ran up another ladder that had been laid against it, knocking Y2J off the top with a scintillating clothesline. How one of Benjamin's feet didn't slip through the rungs is a total mystery, and how he was able to perfectly catch Jericho with the move after all of that is an even bigger one. With talent like that, you would have thought that Shelton was a shoe in to win money in the bank further down the line. Unfortunately, you'd be wrong. I'm still bitter. Number 2. Zayn's Last Minute Save Hey, it's Shane McMahon again! Only this time he's 17 years older, got grey hair and sweats about 2 litres just climbing up the ring steps. That didn't stop the boss's son from challenging Kevin Owens to a Hell in a Cell match at the titular pay-per-view in 2017. The big demonic box had become something of a Shane speciality since his return to the company, as demonstrated by his death-defying leap against The Undertaker at Mania 32. The best part of an otherwise pretty dreadful match. Shane tried tried this stunt again against Owens, laying him out on an announce table before plummeting from the top of the cell. However, lying in wait was Sami Zayn, who rescued his former enemy by pulling him out of the way at the last second. If you watch the slow-mo, you will see that Owens is barely off the table when McMahon goes through it. Our man Sami literally left it to the last possible moment to make the save, making it even more shocking when he did so. Seriously, if he had been just a fraction of a second late, Owens and McMahon would have been fused together like cat and dog. Number 1. Orton Stomp into RKO We could have given this spot to Randy Orton hitting the RKO on Evan Bourne mid-shooting Star Press, which required Orton to be flawless when executing the move. However, we tossed a coin and decided to go for this one. Sorry, Evan. Prior to winning the title with the heist of the century, Seth Rollins battled the Viper one-on-one -on -one at WrestleMania 31. Rollins thought he had the match won when he went to hit a stomp on Orton, but the Apex Predator instead flung his opponent up in the air with his shoulder before catching him in a perfect RKO. If either Seth or Randy had been just a centimeter out of position, this wouldn't have worked. And considering that this spot was the finish of the match, it would have been quite the bummer if this spot had ended with both men lying in a crumpled heap on the map, their handsome faces covered with egg. However, the wrestling gods were smiling down on us that day. About bloody time they pulled their finger out. Years before Donald Trump or Alan Sugar made the phrase famous, Vince McMahon was yelling, YOU'RE FIRED! on an almost weekly basis. 
The chairman's catchphrase got seriously over as Vince handed out kayfabe pink slips with an evil glee. Unfortunately, though, it wasn't just on screen that he did this. McMahon has fired many, many people in his life, and he let the following 10 performers go without a moment's hesitation. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 WWE wrestlers Vince McMahon fired on the spot. Join us. Number 10, Serena Deeb. Before she was a champion in the NWA or the professor in AEW, Serena Deeb was a member of a cult. Serena, no last name, was part of CM Punk's Straight Edge Society in 2010. Alongside Luke Gallows and Joey Mercury, she was converted by Punk to follow in his no drinking, no drug taking ways as the group attempted to assert their dominance on SmackDown. Emphasis on the word attempted there. Much like the group itself, Serena's potential was squandered during this storyline and her her underwhelming firing from WWE reflected that. She was let go from her contract after being spotted out drinking and partying with her friends, which was not in line with her character's straight edge values. Um, guys, you do realize wrestling isn't real, right? What, did you expect Edge and Christian to drink blood whilst they were in the brood? Or Duke Grossi to actually collect people's garbage? Anyway, Deeb was released and the entire stable collapsed quickly thereafter. And all because she had the nerve to enjoy herself when she was off the clock. How dare she? Number 9, Dawn Marie. Getting her start managing Lance Storm in ECW, Dawn Marie is probably best known to wrestling fans as the woman who bonked Al Wilson to death in 2003. You probably remember it because A, it's hilarious, and B, that feud with Tori dragged on for ages. Dawn was fired from WWE in 2005, shortly after reuniting with Storm to manage him at ECW One Night Stand. So why was she let go? Did she hit somebody with a flaming barbed wire bat? Did she impale another wrestler on a bed of nails. Did she rip someone's head clean off? No, nope, she got pregnant. Almost instantly after learning that Dawn Marie was with child, WWE cut bait. I'm sure you can put yourself into the twisted mind of Vince McMahon to understand why he thought a pregnant Dawn would be useless to his business, but we wouldn't recommend doing that if you ever want to look yourself in the mirror again. As you can imagine, this caused Dawn unimaginable stress and she ended up taking the company to court over it. The two parties reached a settlement in 2007 and Dawn Marie has been persona non grata ever since. Number 8. Finley We all know that Fit Finley loves to fight, but did you know he also loves to get in massive trouble backstage over incidents at house shows? Well, now you do. After retiring from the ring, the Belfast brawler took up a job as an agent. This gave him more say in what happened in front of a crowd, but also meant increased responsibility if things went wrong. At a 2011 live event, Finley greenlit a segment in which The Miz would interrupt the US national anthem. He thought this was a good idea, as Miz was WWE champion at the time and needed some heat heading into his WrestleMania 27 main event. However, he forgot the golden rule of America, never mess with anything even remotely patriotic. People got very upset, including several members of the National Guard who were in attendance that night. Finley was blamed for the faux pas and was fired shortly thereafter. He was eventually rehired by WWE, but only after he learnt the entire Pledge of Allegiance backwards and got a tattoo of George Washington Washington on his left butt cheek. God bless America. Number 7, Emma. The former Tennille Dashwood must hold the record for the quickest firing and rehiring in WWE history, which all stemmed from a simple misunderstanding that took place in 2014. Whilst doing some shopping at Walmart, Emma was using a self-service checkout when she accidentally forgot to scan an iPad case worth just over $20. This led to the Australian getting arrested and having to appear at a local community court the following day. Believing that one of their independent contractors was a shoplifter, WWE decided that this was bad publicity and released Emma from her contract. Over a $20 iPad case, he's serious. Naturally, this decision got the internet very riled up, which doesn't take much to be fair. After a few hours of being bombarded online, the company relented and Emma was reinstated. For her simple honest mistake, the wrestler had to attend an online course, do a day's community service, and almost lost her job. Well, actually, I guess she did for a bit. Should have just distracted the police by dancing and then made a run for it. Number 6, Brad Maddox. Former Raw General Manager 
manager Brad Maddox had one of the most infamous debuts in WWE history as well as one of the most infamous firings. His first major appearance was as the crooked referee for CM Punk and Ryback's Hell in a Cell match at the 2012 pay-per-view. He then proceeded to get the tar kicked out of him by more famous wrestlers before moving into a mostly non-wrestling role on TV. Maddox continued to perform in dark matches though, including one for the November 24th, 2015 edition of Main Event. Ahead of battling R-Truth, Brad cut a promo on the crowd in which he called them cocky pricks. As a result of this spicy language, Brad was sent packing from WWE never to return. He wrestled one match on the indies in 2016 and hasn't come back to the ring since. What he said was a bit stronger than the company's normal output, granted, but it's not like Maddox was cursing up a storm on TV or anything. To make things worse, Vince McMahon then went on Raw a few months later and said that he was going to give Shane an effing beating. Did he get fired? Like bollocks, did he? Number 5. Gangrel Despite being extremely popular in the Attitude Era and having some absolutely banging theme music, Gangrel never won a single championship during his time with WWE. Not even the hardcore title for like 5 minutes. This hasn't got anything to do with what we're talking about, I just think it's weird. Now, where was I? After The Brood came to an end in 1999, Gangrel lost direction and floated around the midcard until 2001. The vampire also hurt his leg, which caused him to gain weight. During a match where where his shirt got ripped off, Vince McMahon was apparently disgusted by Gangrel's physique. And this is allegedly what led to him getting let go from the company. McMahon's preference for large muscular men is famous, but it's not like everyone who walked through his door was an Adonis. I mean, he made Yokozuna WWE Champion twice for goodness sake. Despite his acrimonious firing, Gangrel did return to WWE in 2004 as one of JBL's henchmen. Presumably this was after a promise to Vince that he would only drink diet plasma from now now on. Number 4. Nails Let me tell you about one of the few men to ever dare put his hands on Vince McMahon outside of a wrestling ring. Nails debuted for WWE in 1992, playing an ex-convict who alleged that he had been abused by the big boss man whilst in jail. Despite Bai at this point in his career having the athleticism of a tree that had been recently struck by lightning, the giant man was pushed relatively strongly, getting featured matches at SummerSlam and Survivor Series. This all changed in December when Nails confronted McMahon over a financial dispute. Bret Hart spoke about this night in his book, claiming that he could hear clashes from down the hall as the behemoth choked McMahon in his own office. As well as a series of lawsuits between the two parties, this led to Nails being shown the door. I mean, of course it did. He literally attacked his boss. Hey, maybe if he had driven a truck to Vince's office and sprayed him with beer instead, he'd have been all right. Number three, Daniel Bryan. Do I have to talk about the Nexus? You know that every time I do, I start crying and come out in that weird rash? Oh, fine. Wade Barrett and the rest of the rookies from the first season of NXT made their presence known on the main roster during the June 7th, 2010 edition of Raw. All eight men lay waste to the ring, attacking wrestlers, commentators, and even ring announcer Justin Roberts. Not the dapper yapper! It was this assault that ended up costing one Nexus member his job. Daniel Bryan choked Roberts out with his own tie, which was considered too violent for WWE's PG product. Claiming that they had sponsors to answer to, WWE instantly let Bryan go. Of course, it all worked out fine in the end as D-Bry was brought back in time to join John Cena's team to face the Nexus at SummerSlam. To be honest, leaving the group was probably one of the best things that ever happened to him professionally as the once promising act quickly crashed and burned after a string of maddening booking decisions. Now where's that E45 cream? I feel the tears coming on. Number 2. The Ultimate Warrior SummerSlam 1991 hosted two huge spectacles. One was the match made in heaven, the on-screen wedding of Randy Savage and Miss Elizabeth. Let's just brush over the fact that they would get divorced in real life the next year, shall we? The other was the match made in hell, a three-on-two handicap match pitting a pair of American heroes against some dastardly foreign heels. Sergeant Slaughter, General Adnan, and Colonel Mustafa were set to square off against WWE Champion Hulk Hogan and former champ The Ultimate Warrior. Fans were thrilled to see the two good guys win, not knowing that one of them was about to get cut. Warrior had allegedly threatened to no-show if he was not paid a large sum of money for appearing at WrestleMania 7. Vince coughed up but then gave Warrior his marching orders immediately after the match was done. This is one of those stories in wrestling where 
where nobody really knows the complete truth. There are multiple accounts of who asked for what, but the end result was the same. Warrior was gone. Well, for about eight months at least. There was no way WWE were going to miss out on that sweet, sweet wrestling buddy money. Number one, Jeff Jarrett. He might have let people go for accidentally stealing iPad cases and being out of shape, but at least Vince McMahon never fired anyone for real on live TV. Until now. March 26, 2001 was a historic night for pro wrestling. Now owned by McMahon, WCW was broadcasting the final episode of Nitro as part of a simulcast with WWE's Raw. This meant that Vinny Mac cropped up numerous times across both shows and he had some very choice words for the chosen one, Jeff Jarrett. After watching him backstage on a monitor, McMahon stated that Jarrett's contract wasn't going to be picked up as part of the buyout. Or, in his words, he was capital G, double O, double N, double E, gone. Many have speculated that this rough exit was down to Jarrett allegedly holding Vince up for money in 1999, but whatever the reason, this was absolutely brutal. Of course, the funny thing about it was that Vince couldn't actually fire Double J since he had a guaranteed contract with A. AOL Time Warner. Fortunately, years later, Jarrett did manage to mend fences and return to WWE, which included a Hall of Fame induction in 2018. Fire that, slap nuts. Part of being a WWE fan is accepting the danger that other people will mock you for your chosen hobby. To be honest, sometimes we can't blame them. This is a company that has produced Katie Vick, an old woman giving birth to a hand, and a match between John Cena and Kevin Federline, where Britney Spears' ex-husband actually actually won. Sometimes though, a moment is so embarrassing that you can feel people making fun of you who aren't even there. These 10 instances all serve as a stark reminder that, for the longest time, WWE was overseen by an out-of-touch billionaire who wouldn't know good taste if it slapped him in the face. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 biggest WWE cringe moments. Join us. Number 10. Vince and Steph Draw Numbers There was a time where Vince McMahon was easily one of the best on-mic performers in the entire business. But by the time WWE's PG era had rolled around, Vince wasn't the verbose, eloquent talker that he once was. An obvious pick for Vince's cringiest moment would be the ill-fated Million Dollar Mania from 2008. But in the spirit of variety, let's take a look at this overlooked car wreck from 2016 instead. During his feud with Roman Reigns, McMahon made the big dog defend his WWE title in the 2016 Royal Rumble match. To stack the odds even further, McMahon rigged it so that Reigns would enter the match at number one. Vince and daughter Stephanie made a big song and dance of drawing names from a tumbler to decide who would enter the match first. They pulled out one ball with Reigns' name on it. Then they did it again to prove it wasn't bad luck. Then they did it again and again and again. This painfully unfunny segment dragged on for what felt like hours, all to achieve something we all knew was coming anyway. Let's just say the genetic jackhammer's Life Sucks promo felt a very long way away. Number 9. Brodus Clay's WrestleMania Dance Before he became the greatest NWA World's Heavyweight Champion of all time, Tyrus was performing in WWE as the Funkasaurus Brodus Clay. The big man would come down to the ring to Ernest the Cat Miller's old music, Somebody Call My Mama, strutting his stuff alongside the Funkadactyls, Cameron and Naomi. That sentence just made me feel slightly ill. WWE took Clay's theme to its logical extreme at WrestleMania 28, when the dancing dino instructed everyone to get their phones out and actually call their mothers. No thank you, I would like her to remain proud of me. Who am I kidding? Clay called his mother and discovered that she was actually at the stadium. This led to a woman in very obvious prosthetics and grey wig coming out on stage and dancing to the song. She wiggled, she jiggled, she waved her enormous fake bottom around for all to see. Somewhere in heaven, Andre the Giant was watching this and thinking, this is what me and Hogan at WrestleMania 3 led to. It was embarrassing, it was unnecessary, and it wasted valuable minutes at the biggest show of the year. Funk might have been on a roll, but this segment definitely wasn't. Number 8. Natalia's Flatulence Natalia is WWE's longest serving female performer ever, which is remarkable when you consider some of the utter rubbish they've put her through over the years. The daughter of WWE Hall of Famer Jim the Anvil Neidhart once got saddled with a gimmick so embarrassing I'm surprised she ever 
showed her face in public again, yet alone kept turning up for work. In 2012, the Queen of Hearts was given the character of Person Who Farts A Lot. Now you could argue that that isn't a character, and guess what, you'd be right. She would be backstage talking with someone or competing in a match, and then she would break wind and everyone around her would have to act like someone had just opened one of those cans of pickled herring. You know, the ones that are really famous for smelling bad. You know the ones we mean. Delicious. We're not focusing on one specific moment from this arc, as the entire thing was one great big cringe from start to finish. If anyone were to ever doubt just how much Natalia loves this business, then show them this and tell them that she stayed employed for another decade plus. Number 7. Cena Embarrasses Cole After subtly turning to the dark side on NXT, Michael Cole went full-blown heel on the main roster in late 2010, and it was bloody insufferable. Having a heel colour commentator is one thing, but a heel lead announcer seemingly out to sabotage the show? The voice that's supposed to welcome you to the show, guide you through all the matches, and serve as an all-round reassuring presence. That is a bad idea 10 times out of 10. Whether he was fanboying for The Miz, chastising Jerry Lawler, or just being a general prick, Heel Cole was completely unbearable. That said, in this moment, he was somehow the sympathetic figure. On the June 4th, 2012 episode of Raw, Cole was put into a match with none other than John Cena. The future peacemaker utterly humiliated the announcer, stripping him down to his undies and covering him in barbecue sauce. This was supposed to be cathartic. Cathartic, the annoying bad guy getting his comeuppance, but it just looked like bullying. Here was a professional athlete beating the snot out of an untrained civilian who people only really hated because he was given bad material. As irritating as Michael Cole the character was, Michael Cole the man did not deserve this. Or maybe he did. What am I, his parole officer? Number 6. Good Lucha Things Anyone remember when Kalisto did that insane Salida del Sol off the top of a ladder? Not ringing any bells. Anyone remember when Kalisto totally fluffed his lines in a backstage promo? Of course you do! When WWE re-split itself into two distinct rosters in 2016, the former United States and NXT tag team champion found a new home on the blue brand. The company must have thought that Kalisto would have something good to say about this. They thought wrong. The masked star was approached backstage and asked to give his feelings on the move. Over the next 30 seconds, Kalisto muttered his way through several disconnected sentences, stumbling over his words before running off in the other direction with a half-hearted woohoo! Now is not the time for woohoos, young man. The most iconic part of this shambles is when he says that he wants to make good lucha things. Over a century of proud Mexican wrestling history downgraded to good lucha things. A fitting tribute. Watching Kalisto fall apart before our very eyes was skin crawling, but I will be damned if it isn't one of the funniest lucha things I've ever seen. Number 5. The Old Day Big E, Kofi Kingston and Xavier Woods cemented themselves as one of the greatest factions in WWE history during their mammoth 483 day reign as WWE's Raw Tag Team Champs. One moment from that run they won't be in any rush to relive is this disastrous segment from the September 6th, 2016 edition of Raw. In the build-up to their title match with the New Day at Clash of Champions, Luke Gallows and Carl Anderson declared that they were going to retire the group as champions. But don't worry, they said, we'll look after you once you step away from the ring. Enter the old day. Three men dressed up as an elderly version of the trio slowly made their way down to the ring on an assortment of mobility scooters, crutches, and walkers. Cue an agonizingly unfunny array of old people jokes playing out to a crowd stunned to silence. Everybody involved deserved way better than this rubbish, which had us all feeling like pensioners by the time it finally came to an end. Number 4. Ambrose's Bum Shots when Roman Reigns announced that he was stepping away from wrestling to battle his returning leukemia, it was one of the most heartfelt and genuine moments WWE has ever seen. So how did the company follow this up? Well, by having his former buddy Dean Ambrose turn into a germaphobe. Obviously. After turning heel on Seth Rollins on the same night as Roman's announcement, Ambrose's character went from conflicted friend to man who wears gas mask because he thinks the crowd stinks. The absolute worst part of this gimmick, if you even want to call it that, was when he cut a promo on the audience whilst getting vaccinated. In the bum. 
He was getting vaccinated in the bum. Just imagine going up to the modern day John Moxley and telling him he was doing a segment that involved him pulling his trousers down and taking a needle to the jacksy on live TV. He would legitimately try and kill you and then probably start bleeding everywhere. The cringiest part of this segment comes not from the absurd premise, but also the fact it was so closely linked to such a tender moment. Number three, suffering succotash. Before he was the ultra-suave, super-cool tribal chief, Roman Reigns was a bland babyface to many that WWE tried to force down our throats like we were a baby who wouldn't eat our dinner. Here comes the arrow, Reigns! WWE's heavy-handed promotion of Roman was one thing that put people off, but they also didn't help him by giving him some truly awful lines of dialogue. He once referred to Sheamus' genitals as tater tots with all the panache and sophistication of an eight-year-old shoving crayons up their nose. But nothing will ever top the time he quoted Sylvester the Cat during a promo duel with Seth Rollins. On the January 9th, 2015 edition of SmackDown, Rain said to the man who stabbed him in the back and broke up the shield that he was a sniveling little sellout full of suffering succotash, son. I honestly don't even know what to say, but it definitely wouldn't be that. To so many fans, this was the point of no return for Reigns. Any credibility he had left from his days as a heavy hitter evaporated faster than you could say Looney Tunes and a piece of every single grown adult watching that day shriveled up and died. Number two, The Miz searches for his lines. Say what you want about The Miz, but we can all agree that he is a pretty damn decent talker. I mean, you don't get to star in a movie like Christmas Bounty without having a way with words. However, it took a long time for the A-lister to get to where he is today, as evidenced by this moment from his early days on WWE TV. In between competing on Tough Enough and wrestling full-time, Miz was the host of the Diva Search. Part of his duties included turning up on Raw to let people know how to vote, which soon turned into one of the worst nights of young Mr. Mizanin's life. After initially stumbling over his words, he then completely pooped the bed and forgot everything he was supposed to say. He frantically switched between telling the audience where to call, how to text, how to vote online, never actually finishing any of his sentences. All the while, the restless crowd booed this poor little dyed blonde deer in the headlights. It's truly painful to watch Miz go through this, but he did meet his wife through the diva search, so don't feel too bad for him. Number one, Trish barks like a dog. Some of these moments have been funny, all of them have been cringe inducing, but none have been as outright offensive as what went down on the March 5th, 2001 episode of Raw. At the time, Trish Stratus was the on-air mistress of Vince McMahon, and I must stress on-air for legal reasons. After growing tired of his much younger lover, again in storyline that is, Vince decided to humiliate poor Trish in front of a paying crowd. He commanded the future women's champion to strip down to her underwear before instructing her to get on all fours and bark like a dog. In terms of its mission statement to generate nuclear heat on McMahon, this worked a treat. But it was also horribly uncomfortable to watch and sent a very disturbing message. Yes, Trish may have gotten her revenge at WrestleMania, but was it really worth all this? Was it really worth a 25-year-old woman being degraded for an audience of millions? The answer is obviously no, and we could have all told you that when we were forced to sit through this horrifying moment. You can see why they left this bit out of a Hall of Fame video package, eh? Is there anything better in life than seeing your favorite wrestler hit their signature finishing move in a match? Not that I can think of, but I'm a very sad man. Like everything in the business, some finishes are good and some are not so good, but there is a story to tell behind each and every one of them. We've rounded up 10 of the best tales of move invention for your viewing pleasure and education. Just don't try any of them on any unsuspecting family members, all right? We don't want to get sued. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling. And these are 10 origin stories behind famous wrestling finishers. Join us! Number 10. Tight Trouser Turmoil Let's start with a story that's been told quite a fair bit in recent years, but it's worth repeating because of how damn funny it is. Prior to his current run with WWE, Drew McIntyre was a young superstar with big dreams and about half the overall muscle mass he has now. Those dreams came to an end when he was let go from the promotion in 2014, but not before he joined a little stable called 3MB. 
Alongside Heath Slater and Jinder Mahal, McIntyre would prance around pretending to be a rock star, all whilst wearing some very fetching leather trousers. These threads would end up changing the Scotsman's career when they inadvertently created the most over move in his arsenal. When attempting to go for a big boot whilst in costume, McIntyre realized that if he completed the move, his skin-tight trousers would split. To avoid showing his haggis and two veg off to the crowd, he kicked the other leg up and transitioned into a variation of the running drop kick. And thus, the Claymore was born, with McIntyre quickly incorporating it into his moveset as his trademark finishing blow. Number 9. Orton's Too Tall Unlike a certain kilt-wearing sword swinger, John Moxley was all too eager to leave WWE and never come back. The current AEW star famously worked for the Fed under the name Dean Ambrose, where he was part of The Shield, a former WWE champion, and may or may not have got an injection into his bum on live TV. His finishing move there was called Dirty Deeds, a double underhook DDT that would become known as the Death Rider or Paradigm Shift once he left. However, this was not the first technique he used to put people away. As Ambrose, Moxley originally used a headlock driver as his finisher, still calling it Dirty Deeds. This was his move for a while until he came up against a certain apex predator. In Moxley's own words, taken from an interview he did with Fightful, he said, I think I gave it to Randy Orton one time, who was someone with a significant height advantage on me. It was just awkward. I was like, that's it, I'm switching this up. After the match, backstage producer Joey Mercury suggested he use the double arm variation, and that was was that. Number 8. Pilford Party Trick Love him or hate him, you cannot deny that Santino Morella was bloody hilarious. Actually, some people would deny that, so ignore everything I just said. Idiots. Part of Santino's comedic shtick was a finishing move called the Cobra, which involved putting a green sock that looked like a snake over his arm and then hitting people in the neck with it. This move, which was somehow only ever kicked out of once, came about when Anthony Corelli, the man behind the character, was out on the town one night. He saw someone at a bar do a trick where he could turn his arm into a snake-like puppet, which Corelli was very taken by. He got the man to show him how to do it and stored that information until a house show about five years later. I said, you know what? I'm going to try something in my comeback. Santino told the stories with Briscoe and Bradshaw podcast in 2022. And that something was the Cobra, and it got a great reaction from the fans in attendance. I mean, Santino would go on to nearly win the Royal Rumble with this move, lest we forget. Number 7. Trampoline! Trampoline! Few moves in wrestling are as unique and spectacular looking as AJ Styles' Styles Clash. The phenomenal one picks his opponents up so they're upside down, steps over their arms with his legs, and then slams them into the mat full force. It is a sight for sore eyes, and, well, sore everything to be honest. I can think of about a thousand other moves I would rather take than this one. Styles can trace the lineage of his most famous weapon back to his childhood days, and to something we all did as wrestling crazy kids pretending to fight your friends on the trampoline. My little brother was trying to powerbomb his buddy on the trampoline, he told ITN Wrestling in 2021. He's dangling upside down and I go, oh, and I walked over there and my little brother took the first ever Styles Clash on a trampoline. The move has been with Styles ever since and has appeared during most of his greatest matches and moments in the squared circle. Number 6. Manga Come to Life the Shooting Star Press has been used by many different wrestlers over the years in various different forms. Matt Seidel used it to great effect when he was in WWE as Evan Bourne, Pac added a little twist onto his to make the Black Arrow, and Billy Kidman invented a variation where he almost killed himself every single time he did it. The stunning aerial moves origins lie in Japan, and with one of the country's greatest ever talents, Jushin Thunder Liger, who started using it before he even took that name on, with his first recorded appearance happening in 1987. How he wasn't burned as a witch, I do not know. Kaichi Yamada, the man under the iconic mask, came up with the move when he was flicking through a copy of a manga called Fist of the North Star. Yamada saw the unique offense of the book's heroes and decided to try and replicate it in real life. I would tell you which character he was emulating, but since I'm not a smelly nerd and I don't read comic books, I can't. No offense, Mr. Liger. Love your work. Number 5. Killer Inspiration Few moves are as tied to one wrestler as the pedigree is to Hunter Hearst Helmsley. 
The finisher's name is a throwback to Triple H's time as a snooty aristocrat who would brag that his heritage was vastly superior to anyone else's. The pedigree quickly got over as a destroyer, not least because people used to take it without putting their hands up, which must have sucked a high heaven. The game told Fox Sports in 2019 that his patented big move owed a debt to the man who trained him, the mighty Killer Kowalski. Kowalski used to do a spot where he would put a guy's head between his knees and would jump up and kind of just jar their neck, he said. I thought, well, if you held the guy's arms, it would very clearly be a pile driver, so it started out as that. Had Tripps not borrowed this from his mentor, then his career might have looked very different, especially when you consider that his initial WWE finishing move was something not too dissimilar to the RKO. Hey, maybe in an alternative timeline it was actually Randy Orton who married Stephanie McMahon? Number four, Les baiting. This may shock you considering today he's more squeaky clean than a germaphobic rubber duck, but back in the early days of his career, John Cena was a bit of a naughty boy. The Doctor of Thugonomics, as he was known at the time, was more of a tweener in his rookie years, making rude comments about his fellow wrestlers that would not be acceptable for the voice of Ferdinand the Bull these days. Cena's first pay-per-view world title match was against Brock Lesnar at Backlash 2003, and as was the style at the time, the Beast came under fire from John and his wicked tongue. He took Lesnar's F5 finisher and made it his own, calling his version of the fireman's carry slam the F.U. <gasps> That's nearly a swear. How's he allowed to say that? Even after his feud with Lesnar was over, Cena's F.U. stuck around, even during his rise to the top of the card. When WWE went PG in 2008, they decided that they probably shouldn't have their top star using a move that alluded to a curse word, and so the finisher's name was changed to the Attitude Adjustment. Adjustments. Number 3. Who did it first? In the 1990s, you had two options when it came to submission finisher-based wrestlers, Sting in WCW or Bret Hart in WWE. Okay, there were obviously way more than two people using submissions at the time, but these are the only two relevant to this list. Both Hall of Famers utilized the exact same finishing hold, an alteration to the Boston Crab known as the Scorpion Deathlock or the Sharpshooter, depending on who was doing it. If WWE lore is to be believed, Hart was taught the move by his father, Stu, but in reality, it was Conan who showed the hitman how to do it in the dressing room before a show. Sting had actually been using the finisher before the pink and black attack, so he must have been the one to invent it, right? Wrong! The answer to who did it first is actually neither of them, as the lock was innovated in Japan by the legendary Riki Choshu. Choshu named the move the Sasori Gatami, and as Sasori is Japanese for scorpion, this is where its western name came from. So there you have it, this argument has been solved once and for all, you're welcome. Number two, it started with a rib. The Rock was so gifted as a performer that it really didn't matter that much what he did in the ring. It got over because the man simply pissed charisma. This is reflected in the fact that one of his finishing moves was a running elbow drop where he stopped running before he hit the other person. I mean, what's the point in building up all that momentum if you're just going to stop Rocky? Makes no sense. It should come as no surprise that a move so ridiculous started out life as a prank between the Brahma Bull and the rest of the locker room. He began using the ludicrous spot to try and make his opponents break character, with a particular focus on The Undertaker. But then, as Rock started to get more and more over, so too did the move. Over time, the people's elbow graduated from silly house show touch to signature setup to match ending move. This is how the Great One ended the year plus world title reign of CM Punk in 2013 and it started off as a gag. Despite looking as effective as a pair of scissors made out of candy floss, the people's elbow is the most electrifying move in sports entertainment. If you smell la 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 Number one, a happy accident. It's sometimes a bit hard to think of a DDT as a finisher these days, considering everyone and their mum does it multiple times a match without getting the win, but back in the day, it was feared and protected. This cranium-crushing crescendo was the brainchild of one of the all-time greats, Jake the Snake Roberts, who got it over to a huge degree during his time in the World Wrestling Federation. So I guess Roberts used his famous intellect to come up with such a popular move, eh? Nope. 
It came about because he fell over one day. According to the man himself, Roberts was grappling with another wrestler when he caught the guy in a front face lock. The snake's opponent accidentally stepped on his foot, causing both men to tumble to the floor with the face lock still applied. In a total fluke of a moment, the DDT had just been invented. Whether this story is 100% true or not, it's nice to think that such an iconic part of the wrestling language came about completely by mistake. So there you go, just because something was an accident doesn't mean that it can't be useful. If only my parents said the same about me. It's always awkward when you don't get on with your colleagues, isn't it? I mean, there's one member of the Cultaholic staff I really can't stand. I won't say who it is, but his name rhymes with Bandrew Bodkinson. This can be especially uneasy when your job is to punch and kick each other, as these 10 pairs of wrestlers found out. Backstage fights, on-air blow-ups, friendships ruined in an instant. These workplace disagreements have them all, yet some also end up producing riveting television. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 wrestlers who hated working together. Join us! Number 10, Alberto Del Rio and Sin Cara. For as long as the company has been around, WWE has longed for a Latin American star to capture the Hispanic market. Pedro Morales, Tito Santana, Rey Mysterio, Eddie Guerrero, WWE have put in a lot of hard work to win over this crowd, only to then do something stupid like sending Brock Lesnar out in a sombrero. Two more modern attempts to appeal to those south of the border were Alberto Del Rio and the original Sin Cara. Neither of them are with the company anymore, so guess how that went. It didn't help that these two men didn't really like each other, stemming back to several incidents in their native Mexico. Whilst in WWE, the pair clashed both on air and behind the scenes multiple times. The most famous incident between these two took place on the August 19th, 2013 edition of Monday Night Raw. The masked man actually called off his match with Del Rio because he had dislocated his finger within the first minute, which Del Rio felt was hardly worth throwing the X up for. The botch artist left WWE shortly after, whereas Alberto, well, you know. Number 9. Dean Ambrose and Brock Lesnar In early 2016, Dean Ambrose had the world in the palm of his hand. He had almost won the Royal Rumble, fought Triple H for the WWE Championship, and was set to compete in a brutal no-holds-barred contest at WrestleMania. His opponent, the meatiest man of all, Brock Lesnar. The idea of seeing Crazy Dean take on Scary Brock in a match with no rules was positively mouth-watering. Unfortunately, one of the participants in this much-hyped matchup couldn't give any less of a toss if he tried, which he wouldn't because trying would be too much effort. As has been recounted many times, including by Dean himself on the Stone Cold podcast, Brock had little to no interest in putting together an engaging match with Ambrose. Instead, the Beast just chucked the lunatic fringe around for a bit before pinning him after an F5 to overwhelming indifference. This would be the last time these two men would work together, and it's only thanks to a feud with Chris Jericho that Ambrose was able to stay relevant. Hey, he's doing pretty alright for himself now, eh? Number 6. CM Punk and Ryback Another real-life rivalry that was documented on a podcast now, only Dean Ambrose didn't get taken to court over what he said to Old Stone Cold. In late 2012, WWE Champion CM Punk was feuding with the up-and-coming mega-monster Ryback. The two collided at Hell in a Cell, and Punk handed the big guy his first-ever loss. No, Skip Sheffield doesn't count. Grow up. The two then feuded as part of the Best in the World's rivalry with Paul Heyman in 2013 before Punk left the promotion in 2014 and was never heard from again. In reality, as you should all know, Punk took several shots at the company in the months after his departure. He also didn't hold back with his thoughts on Ryback, whom he called an unsafe worker in so many words. The two have continued to beef over the decade that followed their initial program together to the point where you still can't mention the big guy online without starting a conversation about the straight edge superstar. I guess feed me more also applies to trolley comments on Twitter. Number 7 Alexa Bliss and Sasha Banks. Whilst they didn't ever have a really memorable singles feud, Alexa Bliss and Sasha Banks crossed paths multiple times throughout their respective WWE careers. They fought a few times down in NXT, battled at SummerSlam 2017, and were the final two in the first ever all female Elimination Chamber match. To be honest, this is hardly surprising, as WWE's women's division has been considered shallow at best and a child's paddling pool with a hole in it at worst. 
this was a problem, as according to multiple sources, Bliss and Banks really didn't get on behind the scenes, and we've seen hints of this animosity creep into WWE programming. The boss fired shots at the goddess on an episode of Raw Talk, claiming that she deserved Alexa's spot more than she did. Thankfully, this was on Raw Talk, so only about 10 people saw it. The two continued to take subtle digs at one another across the years, reminding us all that they were not the best of friends. Although, due to the promotion's lackluster booking of their feuds, at least this real-life rivalry doesn't impact any memories of any meaningful storylines. Every cloud, eh? Number 6. John Cena and Alex Riley you would be forgiven for forgetting who Alex Riley even is, let alone the fact that he was once involved in a storyline with John Cena. As protege slash heavy for The Miz, Riley was part of the Awesome One's time as Mr. Money in the Bank and subsequent WWE title reign. This involved him tangling with Cena in the build-up to WrestleMania 27, where Miz defended the top prize against the face that ran the place. Things started going downhill for a Rye in the 2011 Royal Rumble. He was supposed to score a huge elimination by chucking Cena out of the ring, but accidentally got eliminated himself before this spot could go down. This only made his and Cena's already frosty relationship even worse. According to Riley, this backstage heat with Big Match John was one of the main reasons his big push was cancelled, which contributed to him plummeting down the card. Of course, this could all just be a sore loser taking shots at a big name, but maybe these stories are true and Riley's career did suffer at Cena's hands. More like hustle, loyalty, and disrespect, am I right? Number 5. Booker T and Batista the heat between Booker T and Batista from 2006 is just as melodramatic as any soap opera storyline WWE has ever run. As well as being perceived as an arrogant newcomer who didn't respect the business, Batista also caught flack for allegedly engaging in an affair with John Morrison's then-girlfriend, Melina. Melina was taken to wrestler's court over her backstage attitude, something that the animal didn't take kindly to. Booker, who was on the prosecution team, didn't take kindly to Dave not taking kindly to this. Are you following so far? This pressure cooker finally exploded during a photo shoot for that year's SummerSlam, where Booker and Batista were set to face off for the World Heavyweight Championship. After a war of words, the two men apparently got into an actual fist fight, with the Booker man reputedly coming out on top. Somehow, these two got over coming to blows and worked together without incident for the rest of the year. Fair play to the chaps for working through their actual dislike for one another, and also, if it's true, then fair play to Booker T for winning a fight with Batista. It's like winning a fight with a grizzly bear that knows karate. Number 4. Charlotte Flair and Becky Lynch October 22nd, 2021 the main event of SmackDown is a title exchange ceremony between Raw Women's Champion Charlotte Flair and SmackDown Women's Champion Becky Lynch. Supposedly, Lynch was supposed to snatch the red belt away from Flair to briefly be Becky two belts again before handing the blue strap over to her fellow horsewoman. This would be to build some heat for the upcoming Champion vs. Champion match at Survivor Series. However, according to Lynch during an episode of the Broken Skull Sessions, Flair thought that this made her look like a total chump. In retaliation, she went off script, dropping the belt at Becky's feet before the man could grab it. Understandably, this made everyone rather cross backstage. However, because WWE does not care for your stupid human feelings, they made the two women fight at Survivor Series anyway. All of this is such a shame because Becky and Charlotte used to be best friends. They came up in NXT together and were both responsible for changing the face of women's wrestling in the company. They even did that thing where they pretended to drink tea. You remember that? Kind of weird, wasn't it? Number 3. Chris Jericho and China Luckily for us dweebs who really like to get into the nitty-gritty of pro wrestling history, Chris Jericho has written plenty of books on the subject across his long and storied career. He has released three autobiographies so far and one self-help style title. These all contain juicy little tidbits from his time working in Japan, Smoky Mountain, ECW, WCW and WWE, including what he thought about working with the ninth wonder of the world, China. The founding member of DX was one of Jericho's first major rivals when he joined the Fed in 1999. Y2J won his first title from her, pinning her for the Intercontinental Championship at Armageddon. Their careers continued to intertwine in 2000, when the pair were named co-IC title holders. Jericho has gone on record saying how difficult he found working with China to be, going so far as to describe her as terrible in one interview. As detailed in one of his books, he also got into major trouble from her then-boyfriend Triple H for allegedly stiffing her during a match. 
I mean, yeah, that can't have helped their relationship either. Number two, Hulk Hogan and Randy Savage. This one almost didn't make the grade because there's so much conflicting information out there about when the Hulkster and Macho Man were friends and when they were enemies. One thing we do know for sure, though, is that at some points, these two hated each other. Savage even made a diss track on his rap album about it. Yeah, Randy Savage released a rap album, and... The real-life bad blood between the two icons came from something that was actually exploited in storyline ahead of WrestleMania V, Hogan's supposed lust for Miss Elizabeth. Savage was allegedly a very jealous man and made assumptions that his wife Liz was getting overly friendly with Terrible Terry. To be fair, it is on record in a court of law that Hogan likes to sleep with other people's wives, so maybe he was onto something there? What had once been a strong friendship completely unraveled once Randy and Liz got divorced and the Hogans allegedly harbored the ex-Mrs. Macho Man, but that didn't stop the Mega Powers from working together after the fact in WCW. They might have hated each other, but they loved money just that little bit more. Number one, Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels. I mean, could it really have been anybody else? Much has been said about who started it, who did what to who, and who was the bigger douchebag in the entire situation, but really both men should have known better than to antagonize each other so frequently. HBK yelled at the hitman at WrestleMania 12, Hart said that Michaels was a poor role model, the showstopper accused Brett of having an affair with Sonny, it was honestly like watching two primary school children bicker, except one kid knew how to do a sharpshooter. Of course you cannot talk about Brett and Sean without at least venturing that Canadian city beginning with M. You know the one. Moose Jaw. Yeah, that's a real place in Canada. You guys aren't helping yourself with the stereotypes. What happened in Moose Jaw, sorry, I mean Montreal, was the cherry on top of a particularly toxic cake and was thankfully the last interaction these two would have for many years. It might be one of the greatest pro wrestling rivalries of all time, but the toll Hart vs. Michael took on each man's personal life makes you wonder if it was all worth it. Everyone comes back to WWE in the end, right? Sue them, leave them for the competition, disparage them for years in interviews. If the star is big enough and there's money to be made, you can bet your sweet hiney they will be back. Well, most of the time anyway, because there are a select few former stars who separated entirely from WWE when they left the organization. I'm talking no nostalgia run, one-off appearance, or even a blink and you'll miss it guest spot on a WWE network show or DVD. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 former WWE WWE stars who never returned. Join us. Number 10, Christy Hemi. The WWE career of Christy Hemi may have been short, but it certainly was spectacular in its own way. The fiery redhead won the 2004 Diva Search, bagged the cover of Playboy magazine, and even challenged Trish Stratus for the women's title at WrestleMania 21. Popular with fans and reportedly enthusiastic to improve, Christy was getting stuck in at developmental school OVW when she was shockingly released on December 5th, 2005, a little over a year after inking her WWE deal. It was a murky exit, with the company citing budget cuts and creative having nothing for Hemi as rumors swirled as to the true reason for her departure. Christy landed on her feet by signing with TNA, where she spent a solid decade in various roles. She's never been back to WWE, however, save attending the 2017 Hall of Fame to support inductee Beth Phoenix. Hemi did give birth to Quadruplets in 2016, so it's not like she she hasn't been busy, but it is a little strange that she's not even so much appeared as a documentary talking head or been invited for a table for three in the near two decades since she left. Number 9, Bam Bam Bigelow. A big star everywhere he worked, Bam Bam Bigelow's professional wrestling career arguably peaked when he main evented WrestleMania 11. The Beast from the East was lauded for carrying NFL star Lawrence Taylor to a respectable showing, and you would think such a performance would be rewarded with further opportunities in the main events, but Bigelow instead negotiated an early release from his contract and left following Survivor Series just five months after headlining the show of shows. Bam Bam was reportedly unhappy with the clique's backstage influence and frustrated with his plateauing push. He went on to work for ECW and then WCW, but refused a contract buyout and thus wasn't around for the invasion. After his WCW contract finally expired, there wasn't much interest in him on WWE's end, and Bigelow's declining physical health and advancing age likely meant he wouldn't have been able to contribute too much anyway. That's 
said, it was still surprising not to see him show up at either the first or second One Night Stand events, but Bigelow's personal life was spiraling at the time, and he ended up passing away of an accidental drug overdose on January 9th, 2007. Number 8. Ken Shamrock Did Ken Shamrock get caught pouring sugar into the gas tank of Vince McMahon's car when he left in late 1999, or what? The world's most dangerous man must have done something to anger the WWE chairman on his way out, because he has been persona non grata ever since. The former UFC fighter was a prominent part of the Attitude Era, bagging the Intercontinental and Tag Team titles, winning King of the Ring, and having prominent feuds and matches with the likes of The Rock and Shawn Michaels. After a couple of busy years on the road, he became disillusioned with his creative direction and yearned to compete in the Octagon once again, prompting his decision to hand in his notice. Since then, he's fought for various MMA organizations and notably wrestled for New Japan and TNA, but outside of a 2013 Where Are They Now feature for their website, WWE haven't been in touch. And it's not like Kenny doesn't want back in, since he's been publicly angling for a Hall of Fame induction and seems keen to do some Something with a company he's had nothing to do with for almost a quarter of a century. Number 7. Mark Merrow WWE had very high hopes when they signed Mark Merrow to a then unheard of guaranteed contract in 1996, as Vince McMahon believed the former Johnny B. Bad had all the tools to become a main events player. It never quite happened, though he had a run with the Intercontinental title and was a featured player on TV. Upstaged by his real-life wife Sable, Mark took a backseat to her meteoric rise and ended up leaving the company with his spouse in 1999. It was a bitter split, with WWE officials accusing Marvelous Mark of meddling in Sable's career. She would, of course, return to WWE in 2003, with the multi-million dollar lawsuit she filed after walking out of the company viewed as water under the bridge. Mero, meanwhile, hasn't been seen on anything WWE related in close to 25 years. Not only were the company irritated with how protective he was of his wife, how dare he, they also weren't happy with him doing the media rounds and speaking ill of the business in the wake of the Benoit family tragedy. With his now ex-wife currently married to a certain Brock Lesnar, the born-again motivational speaker isn't likely to get an invite anytime soon. Number 6. Val Venus Val Venus was one of the most tenured members of the WWE roster when he received his release on January 9th, 2009, ending a decade-plus run that had seen many different highs and lows. A former tag team, European and intercontinental champion, the Big Val Boski's big push seemingly died along with the Attitude Era, with Venus subsequently becoming a useful utility player who could be plugged into any storyline, put in a tag team, used to get other acts over as an enhancement talent, or what have you. A short, forgettable stint in TNA was pretty much Val's last contribution to the business, and he has since focused his energies on being a far-right, conspiracy-spreading lunatic whose main reason for existing existing seems to be based on his Twitter account, sharing his hateful views and asking restaurants to accept cryptocurrency as payments. Looking nothing like he did in his prime, Venus really has no value to the company and they will do well to stay away from him. Had he taken better care of himself physically and mentally, you would reckon he would have been good for a surprise appearance here or there, but as it stands, it's goodbye, ladies. Number 5. Nails If you want a foolproof way to get fired by WWE, may I suggest viciously attacking Vince McMahon backstage? I have no idea what Nails thought would happen when he physically confronted Vince McMahon over what he felt was an unfair payoff for his SummerSlam 1992 match with Virgil, but he was 86th quicker than you could say justice for the big boss man. Fences naturally weren't mended when our man showed up in WCW, was copyright pushing the prisoner, sued McMahon for wrongful termination, and then testified against his former boss during the 1994 steroid trials. His run as Nails lasted less than a year, and his storylines and matches weren't exactly all-timers, but you would have to think that he may have been called for, say, the gimmick battle royal at WrestleMania X7 had his WWE career not ended in such acrimony. Nails retired from the business in 2001 and then just about disappeared from public view to live a private life selling trailers in Minnesota before resurfacing in 2022, presumably to get the rest of what he felt he was owed for that Virgil match. 
Number four, Dawn Marie. We've established that physically attacking Vince McMahon over a payoff is a good way to get canned and subsequently blackballed, but how about getting pregnant and then successfully suing the company for wrongful termination? Dawn Marie was let go while on maternity leave in the summer of 2005 and filed a complaint against WWE with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission in early 2006. The case was settled a year later and Dawn hasn't been seen anywhere near WWE since. It's understandable that there may be hard feelings due to the litigation, but there have been many other people who have taken WWE to court and been welcomed back into the fold after the fact. Post WWE, Marie has enjoyed a quiet, normal life as a wife and mother while working as a nurse, so it is possible that she's more than happy to get on with things and doesn't need to make a cameo or give her two cents on a WWE Network show. Dawn was not just a memorable character in the Ruthless Aggression era, but also an ECW mainstay, and it speaks to the heat that she's yet to crop up almost 20 years after her dismissal. Number 3. China WWE voluntarily letting China go in 2001 proved that no star was bigger than the company and that a harmonious working environment must be maintained at all costs. The ninth wonder of the world's steep contract demands, coupled with Triple H leaving her for Stephanie McMahon, caused WWE to cut bait and move on, despite the former Intercontinental Champion being one of their most popular performers. Joni Laura's professional and personal life sadly and very publicly went off the rails following her WWE departure as she became more well known for her appearances on reality TV shows and in adult films as opposed to any in-ring exploits. Suffering from addiction issues and with her mental health declining, WWE wanted nothing to do with the former D-Generation X member and went to great lengths to distance themselves from her, with Triple H noting the complexities of her ever receiving a Hall of Fame induction. She eventually got one when she was inducted alongside the rest of DX in 2019, three years after her untimely passing at the age of 45. There's certainly an argument to be made that WWE could have reached out rather than pushed away when she clearly needed help. Number 2. Perry Saturn Perry Saturn's WWE career may have been relatively brief, but it was certainly far from unremarkable. Jumping from the sinking ship that was WCW in January of 2000, Big Pez served as a member of the Radicals and instantly enjoyed the greener grass of Vince McMahon's organization. A former hardcore and European champion, Saturn is perhaps best remembered for the infamous match in which he roughed up enhancement talent Mike Bell after a spot gone wrong, and of course the Moppy storyline that was given to him ostensibly as a punishment. Perry left WWE about a year after that angle had run its course while on the injured list and having pretty much been relegated to being a bit part player and did the indies, TNA and Japan before vanishing from the face of the earth. For about five years, Saturn was unreachable as he was in the throes of a serious drug addiction and resultant homelessness. He managed to rebound and get his life back together, but no WWE appearances materialized besides some non-publicized work helping out at the Performance Center in 2013. Number 1. Randy Savage Every major star who left WWE on less than favorable terms invariably came back in some form or fashion. The old mantra of never say never applied to everyone from Bret Hart and Bruno Sammartino to Hulk Hogan and the Ultimate Warrior, but it didn't apply to the Macho Man. Randy Savage left WWE in 1994 and resurfaced in rival WCW. Supposedly irked about being put out to pasture as a commentator and company ambassador, Randy wanted to prove that he had more to give as a main event in ring performer. Which he certainly did for the Ted Turner owned organization, though WWE remained unmoved when it came to using Savage in any shape, form, or fashion. Rumors persisted as to just why the Macho Man and Vince McMahon were at odds, ranging from the chairman being upset by Randy choosing to leave and taking a lucrative Slim Jim sponsorship with him to, well, you know what. The best we got was a 2003 WWE magazine interview and a quick video game promo, but he never appeared on WWE programming prior to passing away in 2011. Posthumously inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame in 2015, the real reason or reasons why such an industry icon remained on the outs may never be fully known.
To be considered truly great, a WWE tag team needs to have good matches, engage in memorable feuds, and, you know, win titles and all that sort of business, typically over a long period of time so that they can properly establish themselves and cement their legacies. Some other lesser known tag teams, however, have been instantly and occasionally retroactively impressive based solely on the stature of the two individuals in question. Throughout the years, WWE have teased us with some truly incredible pairings only to cruelly leave us wanting more by having them compete in just a single match as a team. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 epic WWE tag teams that only lasted one night. Join us! Number 10. Brock Lesnar and Eddie Guerrero Brock Lesnar and Eddie Guerrero's names will always be attached to each other due to Latino Heat's unlikely WWE title triumph over the next big thing in the main event of No Way Out 2004. Less than two years before that, though, Brock Lesnar and Eddie Guerrero found themselves on the same team during the June 3rd, 2002 episode of Raw. At the time, Lesnar was the impressive rookie who had put fans and wrestlers alike on notice in the few explosive months that he had been a member of the main roster. Veteran Guerrero, meanwhile, was in the process of re-establishing himself, having returned to the company a week after Brock's debut. Their opponents on the night were Rob Van Dam and Bubba Ray Dudley. RVD had beaten Guerrero in a brutal ladder match to recapture the Intercontinental title on the previous week's show, while Lesnar had brushed past Bubba to qualify for the King of the Ring tournament on the same broadcast. In their one tag outing, Brock and Eddie beat the ECW icons in a customarily decent match thanks to an F5 and a frog splash, as well as a timely assist from Paul Heyman. Cheeky bastard. Number 9. The Rock and John Cena WWE gave themselves a year to build up the rivalry between John Cena and The Rock, but only got serious about reminding people of their future WrestleMania main event around the time of Survivor Series 2011. A couple of months before the pay-per-view, WWE announced that Rock and Cena would be on the same side for a traditional Survivor Series 10-man tag, but changed their minds about a month later and booked the People's Champ and Big Match John in a standard tag bout against Awesome Truth. Main eventing the 25th annual event in front of an expectant Madison Square Garden crowd, Dwayne Johnson did not disappoint in his first match for over seven and a half years. Despite Miz and Truth being booked as the most dangerous heels on the roster at the time, no, seriously, stop laughing, it was a foregone conclusion that two of the biggest stars in the industry would be going over. But could they coexist? Well, long enough for the great one to put away Miz with a people's elbow, after which he delivered a rock bottom to his own partner. Number 8. Mr. Perfect and Randy Savage one of the featured matches at the 1992 Survivor Series was to see Ric Flair and Razor Ramon go up against the Ultimate Maniacs. That's the Coke dealer's dream team of Randy Savage and the Ultimate Warrior. Unfortunately, Jim Helwig went and spoiled it all by doing something stupid like failing a drug test for human growth hormone use, which earned him a pink slip due to the company being embroiled in a steroid scandal at the time. So the face-painted muscle head was out, but Macho Man had the perfect replacement. Literally, it was Mr. Perfect. You already knew that, said it about 30 seconds ago. Turning babyface, Kurt Hennig's alter ego left the Nature Boy's side and accepted Randy's offer to team with him against his former client and the bad guy. Gelling instantly, Savage and Perfect proved themselves a formidable duo in their attempts to counteract the cheating antics of their nefarious foes. It wasn't an all-timer or anything, but it was a damn good match, and it was lovely to see Perfect back in the ring for the first time since dropping the the IC title to Bret Hart. His one-night-only team with Savage won the match too, albeit by disqualification. Number 7. Shawn Michaels and The Undertaker The rivalry between Shawn Michaels and The Undertaker was long and legendary. Two of the greatest of all time had some of the best matches in WWE history, notably at Bad Blood 1997 in the first ever Hell in a Cell match, and then in back-to-back -back WrestleManias many years and conversions to Christianity later. They've also wrestled casket matches and teamed up against one another to, um, mixed results. The Heartbreak Kid and the Phenom have also, on one specific occasion, joined forces. Well, one time on television, that is, because Michaels and Taker did tag on some house shows and 
signed for some TV taping dark matches during the mid-90s. The one time their union was captured on film, Sean and Taker, let's call them the dead sexy boys, battled JBL and Vladimir Kozlov. Kicking off the March 16th, 2009 episode of Raw, the dead sexy boys looked to beat the wrestling god and the um, big scary Russian bloke, knowing that they would be standing opposite one another on the grandest stage in just under three weeks' time. Sean got to play some mind games at the end, too, tagging himself in as Taker was about to hit a choke slam and stealing the win for himself following some sweet chin music before hitting his partner with a super kick as well. Number 6. Triple H and CM Punk the first time Triple H and CM Punk found themselves on the same side was at the 2006 Survivor Series. Back then, the Straight Edge Superstar was a burgeoning cult hero on the ECW brand and probably just happy to be tagging with DX and the Hardys on a Big Four pay-per-view. The game must have been silently fuming as Punk was, on the night, the most popular member of the Fivesome and received the biggest pop of the show with fans continuing to chant his name as his team scored a clean sweep victory. Perhaps that was why almost five years later, Hunter tried to put the skinny fat indie guy in his place by inexplicably beating him in a no disqualification match at Night of Champions 2011. The two egomaniacs then momentarily let bygones be bygones and combined their powers to take down R-Truth and The Miz, who had interfered and attacked both men at Night of Champions. Punk took another L tagging with the cerebral assassin at Vengeance after Kevin Nash neutralized his click buddy and Awesome Truth, who remember were being booked as the most dangerous hero heels on the roster at this time, stop laughing, hit a combo on poor Phil for the pin. Number 5. AJ Styles and John Cena while John Cena was establishing himself as WWE's new major star, AJ Styles was solidifying himself as TNA's MVP. What was once an interpromotional dream match finally became a reality when the Phenomenal One signed with WWE in 2016 and subsequently had a series of barn burners with the Doctor of Thugonomics. They displayed enviable chemistry as opponents and had genuine classics at major shows like SummerSlam and Royal Rumble, but people may be slower to recall the one and only time the two put their rivalry aside to team up, on television that is, because they did band together for one non-televised dark match. Hoping to upset them in the main event of the July 11th, 2017 episode of SmackDown were Kevin Owens and Rusev. This was one of those tag matches that are done to promote two forthcoming singles matches, in this case a flag match between Cena and Rusev, and a US title bout between Styles and Owens, both at Battleground. The heels would not be successful, duh, with KO falling victim to a Pele kick, followed by an FU. Number 4. Rob Van Dam and Stone Cold Steve Austin Several months into the invasion, tensions began to rise inside the camp of the Alliance as group leader and then WWE champion Steve Austin's paranoia came to the fore. Stone Cold started butting heads with Rob Van Dam, the increasingly popular hardcore champion whose laid-back persona was at odds with Austin's high-strung ways. The two clashed in a singles match on the September 4th, 2001 episode of SmackDown, with RVD picking up an unlikely victory. And friction was still evident when they teamed up in the main event of Raw two weeks later to take on WWE's Chris Jericho and Kurt Angle. Not only was this a way to further the alliance infighting between the Texas Rattlesnake and the whole flipping show, but also a means to preview two matches at Unforgiven in six days' time, Austin vs Angle for the WWE title and Van Damme's hardcore title defense against Chris Jericho. The all-action contest was won by Y2J and the Olympic Hero, but it sure was cool to see ECW's finest on the same side as WWE's main man for this one occasion. No word on whether they smoked a naughty cigarette or drank a can of adult beverage in the locker room after. Number 3. Hulk Hogan and Ricky Steamboat if you were a heel in WWE from the mid-80s to the early 90s, you wanted to be programmed opposite Hulk Hogan. And if you were a babyface during that time frame, you wanted to be the Hulkster's friend, advisor, tag partner, manager, or personal driver. Hell, whatever it took to ride the coattails of the Golden Goose. Isn't that right, Mr. Beefcake? Ricky Steamboat was one of the good guys who periodically enjoyed the Hogan rub. Not in the Heather Clem sense, let me be clear. The two men tagging together on six different occasions, though only one was televised. The others took place at non-televised events or to send the crowd home happy after a TV taping. Teaming together on March 30th, 1986 for an event that was for Philadelphia cable channel Prism, the Dragon and Terrible Terry defied the odds and bested Johnny Valiant, Don Morocco and Mr. Fuji in a 3-on-2 
two handicap match. Steamboat hit a crossbody off Hogan's mighty shoulders, allowing Hulk to hit the big leg on Fuji for the win. Number two, The Undertaker vs. Roman Reigns. At WrestleMania 33, Roman Reigns became just the second person in WWE history to defeat The Undertaker at the Showcase of the Immortals. Regrettably though, the Big Dog's win was marred by the Phenom's poor performance. As recounted years later in the Last Ride documentary, Taker simply shouldn't have been out there that night as he was seriously hampered by injury and unable to go at the standard that fans had come to expect, especially when it comes to WrestleMania. Thankfully, the next time Roman Reigns and The Undertaker shared the ring would be an occasion to celebrate. Over two years later, at Extreme Rules 2019, the Tribal Chief and the Deadman teamed up against Drew McIntyre and Shane McMahon in a no-holds-barred match. His aches and pains evidently alleviated thanks to surgery and rehabilitation in the interim, Taker looked so much better than he had in a long time, doing his damnedest to eradicate the memory of his previous two matches. It was also super cool seeing Roman get to team with the Hall of Famer in what was for all intents and purposes, Mark Calloway's final proper match. Number 1. John Cena and Sting Sting's WWE run was, disappointingly, a little bit of a washout. After waiting so many years to see the icon in a WWE setting, what fans are bound to recall from it more than anything is him doing the job for Triple H at WrestleMania 31, and then suffering a serious injury en route to another loss, this time to Seth Rollins, six months later. It's worth remembering that his WWE run did yield some highlights, however, such as the big debut, that statue reveal, and the time he tagged with John Cena on the Night of Champions 2015 Go Home Edition of Raw. It started as a singles match, with Sting taking on old WCW foe The Big Show before Rollins interfered and caused a premature DQ. The face that runs the place then evened up the odds, leading to an impromptu tag match. And wouldn't you know it, the Stinger actually got to taste victory in a WWE ring, making the architect submit to the Scorpion Deathlock. Did anyone else think that all wrestlers sang their own entrance music when they were younger? I mean, who else was disappointed to find out that it wasn't Christian's voice screaming, you just close your eyes? A hard truth to find out. It turns out, though, that we weren't entirely incorrect, as plenty of wrestlers have contributed to their own themes over the years. Whether they sang or played some instruments too, these 10 grapplers all got to show off their musical chops. I'm Adam Pashiti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 wrestlers who performed their own entrance music. Join us. Number 10, Coco Beware. Hulkamania-era star Coco Beware is famous for a number of things. He famously lost to Yokozuna in the first match in Monday Night Raw history, he famously carried a macaw named Frankie down to the ring with him, and he famously made a lot of people strangely upset when he got inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame in 2009. Weirdos. Coco was also a pretty decent singer, though, lending his smooth vocals to the title track on Piledriver The Wrestling Album 2. After the success of the first wrestling album in 1985, a second one was produced two years later, featuring even more quote-unquote performances from everyone's favourite wrestlers. Hillbilly Jim, Strike Force, Slick, they are all here! Pile Driver, which would eventually become Ware's entrance music, is a tormented ballad all about how love can feel like taking a wrestling move sometimes. It's even got its own music video, featuring various superstars working on a construction site in one of the most lovingly homoerotic things I've ever seen. And trust me, that covers a lot of ground. Number 9, Enzo Amore. Enzo's chemistry with partner Big Cass, combined with his red-hot mic skills, made the duo one of the most overacts in NXT, despite the fact that they never won their tag team titles. And then they got called up to the main roster and didn't win any titles there either. Then things got messy, to say the least. Anyway, at points, Enzo and Cass were so over that you could barely hear their theme song over the top of the crowd cheering for them. If you listened very closely, you would have heard Enzo's own distinctive voice spitting the lyrics. Their song, Soft is a Sin, featured Amore rapping about how tough he is, how not tough you are, and so on and so forth. Whilst this entrance music was good, this unfortunately gave him the confidence to release his own rap track, Phoenix, which contains the phrase, My Consensual Penis. I don't even... Anyway, number 8, The Usos. 
Before they were feuding with their cousin Roman Reigns or even teaming with him in the bloodline, the Usos were a pair of happy-go-lucky babyfaces who just loved to entertain the fans. They were also something else, actually, but I can't quite remember what. Oh yeah, bland. That changed when they turned heel in 2016, adopting the tougher attitude and look that is still with them to this very day. They also got rid of their old entrance theme, So Close Now, which featured lyrics from New Zealand rapper David Dallas. Their new song, Done With That, was also more hard-hitting and in-your-face. Dallas was gone too, replaced by Jimmy and Jay themselves, singing about how they've been down since day one-ish. Whatever that means. The song doesn't actually have many lyrics. In fact, the Usos are mostly just speaking over the top of the beat, shouting things like, yeah, and okay. Whilst they're not going to win a Grammy anytime soon, the Usos' performance on this song helped contribute to their image change when they desperately needed one. Number 7. Naomi It's not just Jimmy Uso with the musical talent, his wife is also a whiz behind the mic. Although she's currently wrestling for Impact under her real first name, Trinity Fatu is obviously best known for her 13-year stint in WWE as Naomi. In that time, she was part of Brodus Clay's Funkadactyls, won two SmackDown Women's Championships, and starred in multi-award-winning cinematic classic The Marine 5 Battleground. Clearly a career highlight. Similar to her husband, Naomi also started singing her own entrance theme when she swapped to the dark side. Following a heel turn in 2015, the star started entering to a song called Amazing, in which she sang about how she was, well, amazing. When she returned from injury in 2016, she debuted a more upbeat remix of the song to go with her new babyface character. This also included an elaborate new entrance, complete with a very impressive dance routine. Honestly, I'm out of breath just watching her. Outside of wrestling, Naomi released an actual song called Dance All Night back in 2014. Number 6. Jeff Hardy Outside of wrestling, Jeff Hardy has a great many interests. He's an avid artist, a keen motocross rider, and also really enjoys mowing his grass, once claiming that if he wasn't a wrestler, he would own his own landscaping business. I mean, well, his brother has experience, doesn't he? Another of Jeff's passion is music. He formed his own band, Perox Y Gen, which is a really, really terrible name, that at one point also featured fellow wrestler Shannon Moore. They have released three albums to date, with Hardy acting as the lead singer. Their song Modest was used by Jeff as his first theme song in TNA. Over the years, the charismatic Enigma came out to several more of his own songs for the promotion, as himself and under his various weird gimmicks. Yes, I'm looking at you, Willow. He never got to use any of his homemade entrance themes in WWE, only ever the Hardy Boys music or his solo theme, No More Words. Were WWE worried about copyright? Or could they just not bring themselves to say the stupid name of his band? I have my theories. Number 5. Mickey James on top of being a talented and innovative wrestler, as well as being the apparent discoverer of the Fountain of Youth, Mickey James is also a very gifted country singer. She's released two albums up to this point and a bevy of unattached singles, the most recent one coming in 2022. She also made an appearance on a song called Is Everybody Doing Okay by a guy called Cowboy Troy in 2014. If there isn't also a wrestler out there called Cowboy Troy, then I will eat my Stetson. Since she was making her own music anyway, James decided to use one of her songs for her entrance music in TNA. The track Hardcore Country, sorry that should be HARDCORE COUNTRY, was taken from her first album and has soundtracked many of her impact appearances as well as her various stints on the indies. Unlike Jeff Hardy, James managed to get her own music to appear on WWE programming. The song played when Mickey entered the 2022 Royal Rumble while still under contract with Impact, marking its one and only appearance in the promotion. Number 4. The Honky Tonk Man The longest or second longest reigning Intercontinental Champion of all time, depending on when this video goes out, the Honky Tonk Man was a staple of WWE's mid-card during the golden years of the 1980s. Whether he was on his own with the Colonel Jimmy Hart or forcing Greg Valentine to dye his hair and wear sequins, the Honkster could always be relied upon to entertain a crowd with his theatrical performances and cowardly demeanour. Because his whole gimmick was that of an Elvis impersonator, it's only natural that Honky performed his own entrance music in the style of the King. That's the King of Rock and Roll, by the way, not Jerry Lawler, who, weirdly enough, is Honky's cousin. 
Cool, cocky, and bad is one of the silliest wrestling themes of all time, and it's up against some stiff competition. It even features the star calling out Elvis himself, saying that he couldn't carry a tune if it had a handle on it. I'm willing to bet Mr. Presley couldn't work a 15-minute match with zero bumps and a guitar shot finish either. Number 3. Chris Jericho in terms of modern wrestlers with musical side projects, perhaps nobody is as famous or prolific as Chris Jericho. Y2J has been a member of the band Fozzy since 1999 after he met guitarist Rich Ward at a wrestling show. They released their first album one year later and have been recording and touring ever since, with occasional breaks to allow for the man formerly known as Mongoose McQueen to make good on his wrestling commitments. Fozzie and their music have appeared on WWE programming a few times over the years. They were part of Jericho's 2005 feud with another musical wrestler who we will get to a bit later on, and their songs have been used as the themes for various WWE pay-per-views over the years. However, it was when the Ayatollah of Rock and Roller signed for AEW that things really got going. Jericho has used the Fozzie song Judas as his AEW entrance theme since day one. It famously gets quite the response from the crowd, who sing along with it even after it's stopped playing over the loudspeakers. That means AEW fans can enjoy such deep and meaningful lyrics as I am cold like December snow. Whoa. Number 2. Shawn Michaels when Shawn Michaels walked out at WrestleMania 26 to face The Undertaker in a highly emotional career versus streak match, he did so to a song called Sexy Boy. We're all used to the song, I know, but it's still mental. So even though it's inherently ridiculous, Sexy Boy was Shawn's singles theme for pretty much his entire career. It was initially performed by his valet, Sensational Sherry, and a version sung by Vince McMahon himself also exists, but HBK would eventually take over on lead vocals. In his trademark gravelly tones, Michaels croons about how he thinks he's cute, how he makes people's knees go weak, and how he is definitely not your boy toy. That part's very important. Sexy Boy has soundtracked some of the greatest moments and matches in wrestling history. His battles with Bret Hart, Triple H, Ric Flair, Kurt Angle, every single one of them has featured this cheesy synth fest in one form or another. It is a testament to how bloody good the showstopper was inside the ropes that everybody just sort of got used to it over the years. And you know what? It's a testament to its timelessness that he can still get away with it while looking like a run over dog. Number 1. John Cena Record-breaking world champion, Hollywood megastar, make-a-wish grantor extraordinaire, John Cena can call himself many things, including Big Shot Rapper. Cena's love for hip-hop got him over in the first place, as his white boy rap gimmick helped lift him out of lower card obscurity. It was only a matter of time before Cena recorded his own entrance music, which appeared in the form of 2004's Basic Thugonomics. The song appeared on the album WWE Originals and led Cena down to the ring for a number of years, that was, until he got an upgrade. The Time As Now has not only been Big Match John's entrance song since 2006, but it also served as the lead single from his album You Can't See Me. This is an album that somehow went to number 15 in the US charts. Check out the song Bad Bad Man by the way, it slaps as the youth say. Cena is one of those annoying people who seems to be good at just about everything he does. Whether it's wrestling, acting, or indeed music, the big guy knocks it out of the park every single time. He simply cannot turn the swell off. Injuries are an expected part of a WWE star's life, with only a very lucky few managing to avoid any sort of operation or time on the shelf recovering from them. There are all different kinds of injuries, and every athlete will react to them differently. Some are minor and can be worked through, while others immediately end careers. Some injuries don't immediately end careers, but reduce what were once exceptional performers into much lesser versions of themselves. Whether they're headlining hall of famers, trailblazing innovators, or promising rookies, it's never a nice thing to see. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 WWE stars who were never the same after an injury. Join us! Number 10. Brian Pillman 
Brian Pillman had the wrestling world by the balls in the mid-90s, his controversial loose cannon character making him a hot property and bagging him a lucrative contract with WWE. Before he could officially start with Vince McMahon's organization, however, Pillman's in-ring career almost came to a screeching halt when he was involved in a car wreck that shattered his ankle. In his prime, Flying Brian had been one of the most dynamic and exciting performers in the industry, an early pioneer of a risk-taking hybrid style that would soon be in vogue. After his accident, however, Pillman was lucky to walk, let alone run, jump, or bump, with doctors having to fuse his ankle into a fixed position. The former WCW Tag Team Champion signed with WWE anyway and attempted to downplay the severity of his situation. But anyone who saw him try to battle through the pain could tell that Pillman wasn't even close to his best. Every single movement appeared to cause him great agony, and it was depressing witnessing the decline in real time just months before his untimely passing at the age of just 35. Number 9. Paul Orndorff in an era filled with larger-than-life physiques, Paul Orndorff stood out as one of the most impressive. His bulging biceps were matched by his talent between the ropes, an uncanny ability to generate crowd heat which made him the perfect antagonist for Hulk Hogan in the mid-1980s. Mr. Wonderful and the Hulkster did record business taking their feud on the road, but making those big paydays came at a physical price for Orndorff. Opting against properly rehabbing an arm injury sustained during a weightlifting act Accident, Orndorff continued to work and see out his program with Terrible Terry. The upshot was the untreated injury got worse and Orndorff's arm atrophied, causing him to enter semi-retirement. He returned to the squared circle for WCW after a long layoff, but he was not the same man who had sold out stadiums with Hogan. Don't get me wrong, he still looked great and he could still legitimately kick most of the other wrestlers' asses while wearing flip-flops, just ask Vader, but he was far from the awesome performer he once was and didn't get higher than the mid-card. A neck injury suffered in 1990 finally took him out of the ring for good. Number 8. Candice Michelle Candice Michelle deserves a lot of credit for how hard she worked to not only become a competent professional wrestler, but a believable women's champion in just a couple of short years. The Diva Search cast-off went from Go Daddy Girl and Vince's Devil to title holder after rapidly improving her skills in the ring. After beating Melina to bag the gold, Candice began a competitive feud with Beth Phoenix. Against the Glamazon, on, Michelle looked better than ever and appeared to set her game up another notch. However, during a two out of three falls match with Phoenix on the October 22nd, 2007 episode of Raw, Candice's career came crashing down, off the top rope and onto her head. It was a scary accident that stopped the match and put her out of action for several months as she nursed a nasty concussion and broken collarbone. Sadly, Michelle re-injured herself by tearing the scar tissue over her previous injury during her very first match back. Having to undergo surgery for this one, Candice missed out on a WrestleMania match and when she did come back, her career was never quite the same and she was unfortunately gone within a year. Number 7. Terry Gordy Though Terry Bam Bam Gordy made his name and reputation in other territories such as world class and overseas in Japan, he did have a brief ill-fated run in WWE as a member of the fabulous Freebirds in the mid-80s. That run ended after the Hellraisers missed a show and turned up late and drunk to other ones, but Gordy was given a second bite of the WWE cherry over a decade later as the Executioner. And there was a good reason Terry came back not under his own name but with a new masked gimmick. A few years prior, Gordy overdosed on a plane trip to Japan and slipped into a five-day coma. Sustaining permanent brain damage as a result, he had to learn how to talk, walk, and ultimately wrestle all over again. While once one of the most impressive big men in the business, Gordy was now a shell of his former self and couldn't perform anywhere close to the top level. Hired in part as a favor to fellow Freebird Michael Hayes, Gordy's run as the executioner was fleeting and sad to watch. It was his last high-profile gig prior to passing away in 2000. Number 6. Sid Vicious One of the few bright spots during the dying days of WCW was Sid. The master and ruler of the world was at the top of his game after returning to Turner Town in 1999 as the Millennium Man. Immensely popular and seemingly motivated to do the work, Sid was involved in some very entertaining storylines as well as a few cracking matches. It was no surprise to see the company 
make him their world heavyweight champion, nor to have him stay in the mix when he wasn't in possession of the belt. It was while trying to reclaim the big gold belt that Sid suffered one of the most horrific injuries ever seen in a pro wrestling ring. During the main event of the Sin pay-per-view in January of 2001, Sid jumped off the second rope and attempted to deliver a big boot to Scott Steiner. Upon landing, his standing leg practically snapped in half. Needless to say, Sid's days as a major league main event star were instantly over, and since that fateful night, he's only wrestled less than 25 matches, mostly on smaller indie shows. On the bright side, less time wrestling meant more time playing softball. Every cloud? Number 5. The Dynamite Kid If you look up the word innovative in the dictionary, you will find adjective, featuring new methods, advanced and original. But if it were up to me, there would just be a picture of the Dynamite Kid there instead. Tom Billington was light years ahead of his time and did things in the ring that nobody else could even conceive of in the late 1970s and early 80s, his battles with the original Tiger Mask still holding up decades later, despite the bar having been raised considerably when it comes to the general standard of athleticism in the business. But the years of hurling himself about with reckless abandon and performing high-risk moves in those stiff rings took a toll on Dynamite, and his body began to break down before he turned 30. During a house show tag match in December of 1986, Kidd suffered a freak back injury while jumping over Bob Orton Jr., who had dropped down to his stomach in a routine spot. He may have continued to wrestle on and off over the next decade, but it was the beginning of the end for Billington, his physical condition deteriorating and ultimately leaving him unable to walk. Number 4. The British Bulldog Much like his British Bulldog's tag team partner, Davy Boy Smith, who also suffered a freak back injury that began a painful decline. Smith was teaming with Jim Neidhart in the opening match of WCW's 1998 Fall Brawl pay-per-view when he took a backdrop from Alex Wright and landed awkwardly on the mat. Well, it wasn't the ring itself that he actually landed on, was it? No, it was part of the ring that contained the hidden trap door for the Ultimate Warrior to make his big entrance during the main event. Davy Boy was not in a good way, and his state only worsened until doctors finally discovered a staph infection that had worked its way into his spine. Bulldog was hospitalized for about a year and a half and almost lost his life, but returned to WWE in September of 1999 after being FedEx fired by the always sympathetic WCW. Put plainly, he shouldn't have been allowed to wrestle and only got by because he masked his agony with morphine. WWE initially pushed Smith as a WWE title caliber star, but it didn't take long to see that he wasn't up to it and he was eventually let go, pretty much ending his career in the process. Number 3. Steve Austin It says something about Steve Austin that he was able to become the hottest thing in the business after suffering an injury that could have called time on his in-ring career. The Texas Rattlesnake was red hot and only getting hotter when Owen Hart spiked him with a sit-out tombstone pile driver in their match at SummerSlam 1997. Austin was able to come back after a few months of rest and rehab, but that was not the end of the story as far as his knackered neck was concerned. Changing up his style to incorporate more brawling and less bumping, Stone Cold was able to delay the inevitable and enjoy a record-setting run before being forced to go under the knife in late 99. The fusion surgery kept him out of action for the best part of a year, and when he returned it was like nothing ever happened, but things caught up to him in the end and the bionic neck eventually put put an end to his full-time in-ring career. Austin was such a good worker that he was able to work around his limitations, but there is a big difference between his style pre- and post-injury. Number 2. Christopher Nowinski Christopher Nowinski came close to winning the very first season of Tough Enough, placing in the final three, but got a shot at WWE stardom anyway when the company offered him a developmental deal. With his athletic background, Harvard education, and notoriety from WWE's smash hit MTV show, he had every chance of becoming a success. That WWE debuted him on main roster television after less than a year in their farm system spoke to his obvious potential and how quickly he was picking the business up. It also didn't take Nowinski long to find out about some of the pitfalls that come with being a WWE star, particularly when it comes to injuries. He suffered a series of concussions in those first months on the road, the worst of which occurred in the 2003 Royal Rumble, when Edge and Rey Mysterio mistimed a double missile dropkick and the rated R superstar's body landed right on Nowinski's face. 
He tried to hide his pain and soldier on as best he could, but would be forced to retire after a full year of suffering post-concussion symptoms. Post-WWE, he has dedicated his life to researching and promoting awareness of concussion-related issues. Number 1. Scott Steiner Scott Steiner's return to WWE in late 2002 was highly anticipated. Big Popper Pump was very different from his first spell with the company, having changed up his look, style, and attitude during the tail end of WCW. The former World Heavyweight Champion didn't come over for the invasion, and it took him a full year after his guaranteed AOL Time Warner contract expired before he decided to put pen to paper with WWE. There was a good reason for that, though. Steiner was far from 100% healthy. About six months before his return, it was reported that the big bad booty daddy had been diagnosed with drop foot syndrome, essentially rendering his left foot useless. Steiner had been banged up throughout his long career, of course, but this injury was much harder to work around. It was plain for all to see during his disastrous series of matches with World Heavyweight Champion Triple H, which killed off any hope of him becoming a serious player moving forward. The genetic freak's performances were eventually deemed so poor that WWE ended up paying him to sit at home rather than use him, and the condition only got better with surgery after he had been released. Creative Control Are there two words more feared in all of pro wrestling? Well, maybe Vince McMahon, but that's a whole different story. Giving a wrestler control over their own destiny can sometimes be a good thing, but it's often associated with big stars flexing their big egos to make everything worse for everybody involved. Hey, sometimes in wrestling, free will isn't always the best thing. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 times a wrestler exercised a creative control clause. Join us. Number 10. Lesnar Turns Down Wyatt Starting with a recent example, we turn to a man who's done things on his own terms for the vast majority of his career. Since his return to WWE in 2012, Brock Lesnar has been presented as a special attraction and one of the biggest stars in the company. As a result of this superstar status, Lesnar has been afforded a certain amount of say in who he works with. Or, in this case, who he doesn't work with. According to reports, Lesnar was offered a chance to do a program with Bray Wyatt that would culminate at WrestleMania 39. This could have been a nice way to right the wrongs of Mania 32, where the two men were supposedly meant to fight before Wyatt got injured. However, for one reason or another, Lesnar pulled the plug and plans were changed. Maybe we'll never fully know for sure why the Beast declined an opportunity to face the Eater of Worlds, or maybe he just wanted to have his five-star classic with Omos instead. Number 9. It's not Vader time The late great Big Van Vader was one of the most unique wrestlers to ever grace the planet. His freakish combination of size, power, and agility made him a main event player wherever he went. Well, almost everywhere, that is. The Mastodon was brought into WWE in 1996, and by SummerSlam of that year, he was fighting for the world title against golden boy Shawn Michaels. Oh dear, Shawn Michaels in the mid-90s in a list about backstage meddling. Not going to end well, this, is it? The plan was for the two men to have a multi-month program over the belt. Sean would defend at SummerSlam, drop the title at Survivor Series, and then win it back at Royal Rumble in his hometown of San Antonio. Sounds good, eh? Well, too bad, because it never happened. Instead, HBK used his backstage pull and got the series cut down to the one SummerSlam match. This was one of the last times Vader was ever taken seriously as a main eventer. It's unclear whether Sean made this call before or after he stomped Vader's head in for real, but either way, dick move. Number 8. The Warrior Stays Good SummerSlam 1992 remains the greatest thing to happen in the United Kingdom since the introduction of Greg's. The match most talked about at SummerSlam 1992 is, of course, Bret Hart versus the British Bulldog for the Intercontinental title. And so it should, it is a classic, but there was another pretty decent title match further down the card. Randy Savage defended his WWE Championship against the Ultimate Warrior, with Ric Flair and Mr. Perfect looming over the entire thing. It was speculated that one of the two good guys would join up with the baddies, turning evil in the process. Allegedly, though, Warrior outright refused to turn heel. 
In fact, Jim Helwig never portrayed a villain in his entire WWE career. And that's a shame, because if fans knew how much of a knob he was behind the scenes, they'd have booed him like crazy. Hey, maybe Vince should have asked that little kid to tell Warrior he was turning heel. That way, he would have done so whether he wanted to or not. Number 7. Keeping it out of the family Let's move over to WCW now, a place that could politely be described as the inmates running the asylum. The company became famous for its wackiest storylines in its later years, thanks in no small part to the acquisition of Vince Russo as head writer. Listing all of Russo's weirdest ideas would take far too long, plus he would probably come after me on Twitter, and I just don't have the energy. That said, one of his masterpieces, heavy sarcasm there, was the mystery surrounding the father of Stacy Keebler's baby. We were all led to believe it was David Flair, Stacy's on-air squeeze at the time. But before you could say swerve, bro, the pregnancy was revealed to be fake. Was this the plan all along? Of course not. This was WCW in 2000. One of the original ideas was to reveal David's father Rick as Stacy's baby daddy, but the Nature Boy refused to do the storyline as he considered it in bad taste. And seriously, when Ric Flair says you've gone too far, then you've really gone too far. So, who was the other candidate? Vince Russo himself, obviously. Number 6. Jericho Doesn't Make the List Sticking with WCW now and a feud that took place behind the scenes but not in front of the cameras. In 1998, both Bill Goldberg and Chris Jericho were making big names for themselves. Goldberg was the undefeated world heavyweight champion, whilst Jericho was the slick-talking, cowardly villain of the cruiserweight division. A feud between the two began in which Jericho would continually mock Big Bill. He even stole his entrance one week, which may or may not have inspired the character of Gilberg. Although Jericho didn't use any sparklers, the hack, so maybe it didn't. Anyway, Y2J held up his end of the bargain and put in some great work, but Deman wanted nothing to do with him. He didn't see Jericho as a legitimate challenger, so refused to participate in the feud. Hmm, this sounds like the sort of thing management should have worked out before going with the storyline, you know? This led to legitimate bad blood between the pair, resulting in a real-life scuffle when they were both signed to WWE. A scuffle that Jericho reportedly won, by the way. Guess we know now why Goldberg was ducking him for so long. Number 5. Cena Buries the Nexus Surely the guy who's granted more Make-A-Wish wishes than anyone else in the world hasn't misused his backstage sway? Surely not our Johnny? Well, prepare to have your heart broken. Big Match John has famously halted the rise of some young wrestlers, and perhaps the worst example of this came at SummerSlam 2010. Cena was leading his team of WWE loyalists against the Nexus, seven of the rookies from the original season of NXT. Instead of giving the exciting new faction a big win on pay-per-view, Cena overcame a DDT on the concrete floor to beat both Justin Gabriel and Wade Barrett and score the win for his team. Not hard to see where the whole Super Cena thing comes from, is it? Allegedly, the 16-time world champion was the one who lobbied for him to take the DDT on the concrete and then make a comeback. Whilst he may not have been solely responsible for the Nexus losing, this spot completely took everyone out of the match and made the group look even weaker than they already did. Number 4. That's the bottom line When you are one of the biggest and most important wrestlers of all time, chances are you're going to be afforded a lot more backstage power than most. Stone Cold Steve Austin challenged creative decisions plenty of times in his career. He apparently reneged on plans to turn WrestleMania 15's main event into a triple threat, but that may have been because Shawn Michaels got in his ear. He famously walked out after he was told to lose to Brock Lesnar on free TV. Sorry, I mean, he took his ball and went home. Gotta use that WWE branded verbiage, pal. He also outright refused to work with people, including a certain pseudo-country singer in 1999. Jeff Jarrett had returned to the Federation two years earlier, and WWE had plans to push him into a feud with the Texas Rattlesnake. However, this was cancelled because the two were far from friends in real life. Double J had called out the Austin 316 promo as blasphemous, and Stone Cold had been unhappy with the way he was treated whilst working for Jeff's father in his rookie days. As a result, the bionic redneck vetoed working with Jarrett, and that was that. Tough luck, slapnuts. Number 3. Anyone but Sean 
Ah, the Montreal screw job. We meet again, old friend. Many commentators, including us, have spoken at great length about what happened at Survivor Series 97. There's been much debate over who was in the wrong and what could have been done to prevent it, but it's important to remember that Bret Hart's stubbornness did play a part in the events. The hitman was on his way to WCW after the company revealed that they couldn't afford to honor his existing contract. Problem was, he was WWE champion at the time, and he absolutely absolutely despised the man who was supposed to take it off him. Once again, many words have been spoken about how much Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels hated each other. What made things worse in Hart's eyes was that he was being asked to lose in his home country, where he was treated as a minor deity. In the end, Hart refused to lose to Michaels on the night, which set in motion the entire chain of events that we are still discussing all these years later. Why couldn't you have just agreed, Brett? Oh yeah, because HBK was a prick and told the hitman that he wouldn't lose to him first. Let's move on. Number two, one night only. Speaking of Shawn Michaels being a prick, the one night only pay-per-view from 1997 was another event emanating from the good old U of K. Like with SummerSlam 92, Davey Boy Smith once again found himself in the main event of a show in his home country. This time, he was defending the European Championship against... Oh no, Shawn Michaels. Not only did the showstopper manage to wrangle the main event spot over Bret Hart vs. The Undertaker, but he also got the booking team to change the result and have him go over Davey instead of the other way around. This after the Bulldog had already dedicated his upcoming match to his cancer-stricken sister. Wow. And what did Michaels do with the belt he had politicked so hard for? He literally laid down for Triple H so he could win the title instead. Seriously, Sean, it's not hard to see why people really didn't like you back in the day. He may have been one of the worst when it came to playing the old creative control card, but there is one very obvious name who has old Sean beats. Number one, that doesn't work for me, brother. How else could we finish a list about worming out of things without talking about King Worm himself, Hulk Hogan? The Hulkster was reportedly responsible for dozens of squashed pushes, changed finishes, and general career derailments throughout his time in the industry. We don't have the time to mention all of them here, so let's focus on one example from both WWE and WCW. In Ted Turner's house, Hogan used his status to refuse to lose to Sting at Starcade 97. This is according to Eric Bischoff, who admittedly also said that this was the only time in the promotion that Hogan used his creative control. Sure thing, Eric. As for his time in WWE, let's talk about the time he went one-on-one with the Showstopper. A planned three-match series between the two was replaced by a single bout at SummerSlam 2005 after Hogan decided he didn't want to lose. In the end, Michaels got the last laugh, though. You know what I'm talking about. 